As the youngest of five children, all boys, and the son of the seventh daughter, of the seventh daughter, of the seventh daughter, supernatural followers will know that means a white witch. I've seen many strange things. I and my brothers grew up in what would be described as a haunted house. At a very young age, I loved to play in my parents' bedroom, which overlooked the landing, first two steps, and small landing at the top of the stairs. On an almost daily basis, I saw shadows walking along the landing. They were not ordinary shadows. These were floating. They were not cast on the wall, but were in midair, but I could see through them. As I got older, they seemed to happen less frequently. I still see these shadows occasionally, out of the corner of my eye. In the early 80s, my brothers discovered the Ouija board method of entertainment, which heralded some very interesting results. On one such session on the Ouija board, the spirit known to us as Paragon, put us in touch with a chap called Ray with a message for my father. I can't remember the surname that we were given, but we passed the message on to my father, who accused us of conspiring with my mother to try to persuade him that Ouija board works. Of course, this was simply not the case. It turned out that his friend Ray had committed suicide while my eldest brother was very young. Therefore, it would be impossible for us to know anything about it unless we were told by someone. We simply had no knowledge prior to the session of events that had taken place so many years before. On another occasion when I was 11 or 12, we had a very strange encounter. My mother and father were out for the evening and my brothers were left to look after me. The session took place in the dining room which had one exit into the kitchen. From the kitchen, you could exit to the hall towards the front door or a door latched with one bolt lock to the back garden and side entrance to the property. There was a window looking into the garden that the strange phenomena took place in. It was a strange session that seemed to pick up an angry persona. All of a sudden, there was a bluish glowing light out the back of the house and the window started to shake violently. As we made a mad dash for the kitchen, the door to the back garden also started to shake violently. We all ran for our lives out the front door and scattered in all directions up and down the road. There was snow on the ground and I was dressed in PJs and no shoes. It was almost half an hour and much deliberation before we returned to the house and went in. There were no signs of any strange happenings. We used playing cards with letters drawn on the back and yes and no written on separate cards and numbers in the middle of the table in a row and some excellent shaped wine glasses that were virtually impossible to push. In an early experiment, the glass zoomed round and round with great speed. All of a sudden, it left the table lifting up to the top corner of the room and smashing it to small pieces. Even the stem and base broke into pieces, the biggest the size of your little fingernail. Anyone who has ever broken a wine glass will know it takes a tremendous force to break the stem and base to that extent. In 1985 at the age of 15, I was walking home to the family home around 10pm from a friend's house. It was a wet and windy night and I walked with a collar up on my coat with my chin tucked into the top of my zip, only looking up every now and then to see where I was going. There is a small village in the outskirts of the city, just down the road from the family home. I was walking towards the village, where I would have to turn right to go in the right direction to get home. Approximately a thousand yards before the road I was walking along came to an end. There is a ten-story block of flats, and next to that, a retirement home. As you get nearer to the end of the road, approximately 500 yards from the end, there was a row of attendant bungalow flats going along the road I was approaching and intending to turn right towards home. To the left was a large grass area between them and the main road. I passed the end bungalow flat heading to the T-junction with the grass area to my left and approximately 100 yards of space all around me to the nearest object, some small bushes. All of a sudden, I saw a pair of brown shoes come into view a couple of steps in front of me, startled. I looked up to see an elderly gentleman in front of me. I took a step sideways and went around him. Something struck me as strange and after a few more steps, I turned around to see nobody behind me. There was absolutely no way that the old man walking slowly with a walking stick could possibly have moved quick enough to get behind something to obscure him from my view in such a short time. In fact, the distance between me and the nearest object was too great for Ben Johnson at his prime to reach before I turned around. It wasn't until I thought about it while walking home that it struck me what it was that was so strange about the gentleman when I first laid eyes on him. Despite being quite persistent, rain and strong wind driving the rain, the man was dry and there were no drops hitting him. 
He was all dressed in brown. Brown shoes, suit, and flat cap. I can't remember the color of his shirt or if he was wearing a tie, but I will never forget his face as he smiled a gentle smile and thanks as he moved out of his way. His features were very clear. I've never seen him since. This village was quite a friendly community where most people knew everyone else, but I did not recognize this gentleman. There were many strange things that happened in the family home, from power cuts that were localized to just our house in the whole street. We had electricity meters that took coins to pay for the electricity supply. If the electricity went out, it should need to be topped up by popping a coin in the slot. Even after putting money in the meter, the electricity would not work. It would be found to have been switched off, and in those days, there were no such things as circuit breakers that would trip the switch. When my father knocked out the dining room window to put in a patio door, we found three patio negatives of an old gypsy man. The first of him, out the front of his caravan. Another of him stood on the caravan steps and the last of him laid out dead. We intended to have them developed. They were missing from the place we put them. We assumed they fell down behind the kitchen cabinet where they were left. When the kitchen was remodeled, there was no sign to them and other things we assumed had fallen down behind the cabinets. On many occasions, I have told certain people to answer the phone because it was for them and it was. The problem was the phone had not actually rung until after I had told them but within a few seconds. I can't explain it, but it still happens. It was in October of 2004, around 3.30 in the morning. I was slowly waking and was in the state where I could hear the TV, but wasn't quite awake. I remember having this eerie, scared feeling, and in my sleep started singing Jesus Loves Me, the old childhood Sunday school song. Anyways, I remember feeling a presence in my legs, real heavy, and I felt something was watching me. I snapped awake and moved, and the thing made a swooshing noise, and my cat even looked up in the air where this went over my head and out the door. I was on the couch and the front door was behind me. My cat was acting funny even before this, and at times, I would come home and feel a nervous, scared feeling like someone was in the house. That's when I saw it. It was the silhouette of the hat man. I looked petrified, and I couldn't just shake the feeling. It was almost inside my head like it was screaming voices at me. The voices released from the hat man into my head were all mumbled, so I couldn't really understand any of them. A split second later, there is silence, and the hat man slowly fades into the abyss, actually fading into the TV screen once and for all. I don't know if this has anything to do with the paranormal, or if I'm just losing my mind. Was it sleep paralysis? Was the hat man real? Or was it just all in my imagination? I have no idea, but I'm kind of hoping and praying to God and Jesus that this doesn't even exist and that I'm all hallucinating this just to make myself feel better. As I previously stated, my cat has even noticed weird things that have occurred in this house, and I'm just not sure what to trust anymore. Are my senses going crazy? Am I just in touch with the paranormal? Am I opening up another portal to the paranormal dimension in which beings and spirits, including the hat man, come to greet me with demonic images and voices in my head? I don't know, but I'm just hoping that I will never find out the true answer to this mystery. Thank you so much for reading. I know it's short, but thank you. In my life, my family and I had numerous paranormal incidents. There were always heavy footsteps, sounding like a person in boots upstairs in the attic. Sometimes I heard them coming down the stairs or on the front porch at night, but oftentimes I had trouble keeping them. They said the TV kept going off and on. One said she saw a man in the attic through the window. My boys were afraid to sleep in their room alone sometimes because they saw people in the backyard. There were two very strange occurrences that happened in the winter of 1991. I was married at the time to a man who was abusive to my children and myself when he drank. One night, I smelled something burning in the bedroom and the bed was smoldering. I woke up my husband and he pulled the mattress off the bed. There was a burning area right in the bottom of the top mattress. He had not been smoking in bed and wouldn't have been there anyway. Another night, I took the kids to get ice cream. When I got back, the doors were all dead bolted and windows locked to where I couldn't get in. I looked through a crack in a curtain and saw my husband lying unconscious on the floor and the heavy dining room table was turned over. The phone was dangling from the wall. I pried open a window and climbed in. I called for an ambulance and called the police. My husband was taken to the hospital and the police detective was totally baffled. 
Later, my husband said that he was talking on the phone to his mother when he was hit hard from behind and knocked out. His mother called to check in on what had happened, saying they had been talking, she heard noises, and he was no longer there. I felt like maybe we had a ghost that was protective towards us, but angry with my husband for his actions. I usually felt safe in the house, but on occasions, I was very frightened. After my husband and I divorced, I felt the need to move. While checking out the history of the house later, I found that it was originally owned by a doctor who kept his ill patients in his home with him. This was in the early 1900s, around 1907. After he left, there was a terrible train wreck just outside of town where some Mexican immigrants and a couple of local workers were killed in a train collision. Their bodies were badly burnt and thrown into a massive grave, which turned out to be in the back acre of our yard. I feel certain that we had multiple spirits, though before this time, I never believed in ghosts. I was visiting California on a school trip. My friends and I were hanging out in the hotel's hot tub. We were playing truth or dare. I was dared to leave the hot tub and dive into the cold pool, then run back to the hot tub. I got out and went to the edge of the pool. Looking at the clear water, I dove in. Next thing I knew, I was face to face with a dead body. He was face down at the bottom of the pool. It was like it was slow motion. He turned to me with his eyes closed. He slowly opened his eyes and stared into my eyes. He was missing his left eye. I was scared. I breathed in to scream and breathed in water. I pushed through the dead man on accident and in my struggle to get to the top, I was thrashing around quite a bit. A friend came and helped me out, panting. I said I didn't feel like playing anymore. Me and my two friends went back to our hotel room. One friend was taking a shower and my other friend was watching TV. We noticed their phone blinking. We checked the messages. We had 362 messages. We were only out for an hour. We had no way to trace the calls. No one even knew our hotel phone number. We listened to the first few messages. They seemed like they were all blank. Finally, we heard something. One word, hell. This freaked me out. I haven't told about the man at the bottom of the pool. I tried to downplay the message. Later that night, we went to sleep. I don't recall any of this next part, but my friend said that at 3 a.m. I got up, turned on the curling iron, and turned on the faucet. I then hit my head really hard on the headboard of the bed and went back to sleep. I woke up that morning with nothing but an eerie feeling, which was soon forgotten since the next day we went to Disneyland. A week later, we drove home. The thought of this man still terrified me. I just pushed it to the back of my mind and continued on. I did not believe he wanted to harm or scare me though. Weeks went by. I remember doing chores around the house. I was putting laundry away in my mother's room. Her dresser has a huge mirror. After placing the clothes in the drawer, I looked up into the mirror. Standing behind me in the back of the room was this man. I could see him very clearly. He was young, long blondish hair. His skin was grayed and almost green, waterlogged, and a little wet looking. His good eye was brown, and where his other eye should have been was just a hole. It seemed to go on forever. It was almost hypnotizing. I noticed this all in an instant, because when I turned around, this young man turned and walked away. I sensed that his name was William. I didn't see William for a very long time, although I felt him following me. Our house began to change. Radios would turn on when they weren't even plugged in. A music box would start to play randomly. Shells would fall off the wall. Everyone noticed it. Everyone was afraid. I wasn't. Years went by. I started to feel a difference over me. At night, I would wake up to voices in my room, like a crowded room where you could hear only a few words that made sense. I tried to ignore the voices. Sometimes, I would wake up with a single voice in my ear talking to me. They seemed to never make sense. It was like the end of a sentence or the beginning. I remember waking up one night. I felt scared for the rest of the time. It was very late at night. I knew no one was awake. A blue light was outside and a closed door. My door began to shake very violently, but the beads on my door didn't even sway. I kept all of this to myself. Who wanted to tell their friends and family they heard voices in their head and see people in swimming pools? I don't think so.
Later that year, I moved out and started going to college. My family said that since I left, the strange happenings seemed to have moved out when I did. Strangely, my roommate said that since I moved in, strange things started happening. Pictures falling off the walls, TVs turning on, shadows, and the feeling of being watched. I still heard voices at night, but never anything scary. I learned to live with it all. Now, in 2009, I'm married. I still hear voices at night, but they're making more sense now. Sometimes the voices say things to me like, get out, I'm not kidding, get out, and laughing followed. Evil laughing. I tried to go back to sleep. One night, a few weeks ago, I woke up feeling like someone was in the room with me, a different energy than my husband's. I looked up and saw a dark figure standing over me. My dog started barking and growling like crazy. The dark figure turned his head and walked out the closed door. I went back to sleep and woke up to a voice telling me, your destiny will be at the Valley of Thunder, then all the voices shall be heard. I haven't ignored that one. Sometimes, I will go to Yosemite National Park, the Valley of Thunder, and see what my destiny is. It just doesn't seem right yet. Two nights ago, I had a dream. William came to me. He didn't say anything but I sensed he was telling me it was okay, not to be afraid of him. I feel as if since I've met William, I've become sensitive to spirits and energies. I've met other spirits beside William. I feel as if now I have the ability to read energies and sense thoughts. I almost regard William as a friend. As an avid EVP researcher and long haul truck driver, I've had many opportunities to get EVP recordings from all over the country. My research has revealed some startling results lately. On the 20th of January this year, an EVP has attached itself to me somehow. Now, no matter where I am or where I go, this EVP named Desmond Heathers is in every recording I make on my Olympus digital voice recorder. Even when I'm traveling down the road at 65 miles per hour, Desmond is there ready to talk when I turn on my recorder. I know a lot about them and where he is now. One startling development occurred when I asked Desmond if he knew anyone that I knew. He said, yes, Joe. I said, Joe, my brother? He said, no, Joe, who is with me. I asked him if Joe was with us now, and he said, he is in you now. So I asked, Joe, are you there? And I got this voice in the recording that was very deep and gruff sounding. I can only say it sounded like Mr. T from the TV show The A-Team. Joe said, go away, leave me alone. Well, I don't communicate with those who don't want to, so I just do what I always do with the ones I get who I don't think deserve my attention. I just ignore them. Here's where the story takes a strange turn. The week after that, I was talking to my doctor about a fatigue problem I've been having lately. Nothing serious, just tired during the times of the day. I don't think I should be. He asked if I was sleeping okay, and I said I tend to wake up several times during the night. He recommended I get a sleep study done. After finding the only sleep research center within 100 miles of where I live, I was told the study would cost an excess of $1,600 for one night. Well, I thought this was ridiculous, so I figured I would do it myself. I was on the road the night I decided to do my sleep study and set up my digital voice recorder and DV camera on the sleeper of my big rig. I fell asleep within 15 minutes. When I reviewed the recordings the next morning, I was so startled at what I had recorded, I could hardly listen to it. The recording revealed that I snore rather loudly. What was startling though, was the EVP Joe was using my snoring sound to speak to me in my sleep. With every rattling snore he formed words. He said things like, don't you know you love me? Don't leave me. Don't wake up. I'm not done yet. Don't you remember me from the Navy? You know you're listening to me. You know you love me. How did I get in here? What happened to me? I need you. I'm just jealous of you, Tony. Tony, please help me. Not just that night either. Every night I've recorded, he's talking to me in my sleep. It concerns me because I don't know if there may be some subliminal influence with him talking in my sleep like that every night. I think I know him. I vaguely recall a friend I had in the Navy named Joe back in 1980. I remember feeling sorry for the guy because of his drinking problem and was always trying to help him when he got in trouble. 
I used to buy him gifts for his birthday and Christmas because his family wanted nothing to do with him. Other than that, I can't recall very much about him. When I asked him how long he has known Desmond, he said about five years. That's how long Desmond told me he's been dead. Actually, Desmond didn't even know he was dead until I convinced him he was. He kept trying to tell me he was alive. So I asked what it looked like where he was and what did he see around him. He said nothing but a faint amber and turquoise colored light that was all around him. He desperately wants out of there. He says he can see me sometimes. One day, when I was sitting at my office desk at home, I asked him if he could see me and he said he could. So I reached in my pocket and pulled out a $20 bill and asked if he could see what I had in my hand. He said a dollar. Thinking it was just a lucky guess on his part, I dropped the bill and picked up a Bic lighter. I then asked again, what am I holding in my hand right now? And he said, a light. I reached in my desk for it and had my hand closed around it so I couldn't even see it. How did he know? Many times Desmond will ask if I can see him. I've never been able to do so, so I got on my digital camera and asked if he would let me take pictures of him. He said, I will try. I told him where to be in my living room at home while I snapped a few dozen pictures. Nothing showed up on review, so I asked if he would mind trying something else. I explained what white noise was to him, and he was already familiar with it. He helps me to adjust the levels and spectrums of white noise to be able to hear him better. I explained that I could generate a different type of noise that is not audible but that I might be able to see him with. So I set up my DV camera to form a video feedback loop with my Sony Trenton 32 inch TV, manually adjusting the focus in such a way that the feedback picture was focused on the pixels on the screen as it oscillated slightly due to some technical reason I can't explain now. After talking with Desmond during the setup and adjustment period, I told him where I thought he could best try to show himself. Desmond appeared to me only once for about two seconds in the video. He had very plain symmetrical features and was shown from the waist up. He seemed to be in his mid-30s with dark sunken eyes. He was wearing a bowler hat and a 1940s type jacket with wide rounded lapels with an open shirt that had no collar. Further research with Desmond shows he can see me and some things around me when his energy level is high. For example, I can give him instructions on how to travel somewhere. One time I showed him a map on my Microsoft streets and tips and showed him the same roads and satellite photos taken from Google Earth. With this information, I am able to ask him to get a specific place and get information I desire. One time I sent him to the Powerball Lottery Drawing Headquarters located at Urbandale Drive in Urbandale, Iowa to see if he could see the Powerball numbers being drawn six hours before the draw. I have reason to believe he is not bound by time as we know it and thought he could travel through different threads of time and different timelines. While well, I asked him to go and do this one for me, after about an hour of instruction on what to look for and how to get there. Then, when I asked if he was ready, he said I'll try. Then, I'll be right back. He returned in approximately 30 minutes and gave me some numbers. I was all excited and purchased our ticket. Later the next day I went to check the ticket and realized I had sent him on the wrong day. I explained to Desmond how sorry I was for the mistake and how much time and energy we wasted. I asked him what the numbers were he gave me because he was there 24 hours too early to see the actual drawing and realized he must have witnessed one of the practice draws they do to check out the machines. Lately, I've been having some other problems. I injured my back seriously at work and have not had the desire to record anymore due to my pain and medication. I've been recovering well and expect my research to continue. My new job doesn't offer me as much travel and time to do the things I'd like. I just hope when I start recording again, Desmond and Joe will let some other people talk to me. I wanted to share my experience with you guys. I'm not sure what it means or anything, but if you do make it to the end of the story, you can decide for yourself and let me know what you think. One night when I was 13, I couldn't sleep, so I tried to turn the other way, on my side, to try to get myself comfy. As I turned around, I saw a figure of a woman against the wall in front of me. She was kind of a black figure, and she seemed to have a hunchback and a hump on her back from the way she was standing. This, of course, freaked me out, especially since I was only 13 at the time. I lay in shock and not knowing what to do, and after like two seconds, 
I put my head under the covers and called for my mom. She came in and I was really afraid to tell her in case she thought I was crazy, so I just told her that I had a really bad dream. I was definitely not asleep. I couldn't sleep for a few nights as it freaked me out so much. This kind of went away after a few weeks and I was gradually able to sleep again. However, a few weeks after this had happened, I was getting pains in my back and I went to the doctors to get scans and things. I then found out I had sclerosis, curvature of the spine. I eventually started getting a slight hump in my back because of this. It has been 10 years since I saw this woman, but I can never get it out of my mind. I've since told my mom about this and she seemed freaked out about it as well. I'm not sure what this means or if it was a ghost or spirit trying to tell me something. I have no idea, but it really did freak me out. This is just a short experience I had at about 17. A group of four friends and I were sitting at my house, bored out of our minds. My buddy Joey, not his real name, was literally banging his head against the wall out of boredom. Tommy, also not his real name, was reading a book he brought. His sister Alexis, of course, not a real name either, was teasing my dog with a flashlight. Henry, had his earbuds blaring. Finally, my friend Annie was on my laptop looking for something that might be fun. Annie came across a story a few guys had posted on a ghost website about an abandoned local farm. They posted how they went exploring the farm and got the hell scared out of them by a black figure. Annie is into the paranormal and asked if we wanted to investigate it. I said sure, better than sitting around waiting for my dog to bite Alexis for teasing him. The others agreed, so we hopped into my truck. It's a single cab with three seats. The girls rode in the cab with me while Henry, Joey, and Tommy rode in the truck bed. I didn't believe in ghosts. If someone told me they saw a ghost, I would have to say stop watching Scooby-Doo and return to reality. Annie told me how to get there with the directions the guys posted on the ghost site. When we arrived, we all hopped out and walked up to the gate. We hopped the gate and started talking about where to go. We agreed to split up. Tommy and Joey were with Alexis. They went to the old barn. While Annie was with Henry and I, we went into the two-story farmhouse. I looked in the upstairs window. All the glass looked like it had been smashed out of the windows. The house looked wrecked. It looked like whoever lived there had been a hoarder. While Henry and I were exploring, we heard what sounded like footsteps upstairs. We were intrigued, so we took off upstairs. When we got to the second floor, it was empty. While walking down the stairs, I felt like someone had been pushing me. I was mad. My right shoulder was cut thanks to the old wooden steps I had twisted my ankle on. I asked Annie and Henry, what the hell are you guys trying to do? Are you trying to kill me? Annie said she and Henry were in the bedroom to the right, looking through some of the old junk when they heard me scream and they came running. Henry held me up and we were about to leave when we heard something slam hard in the kitchen. We went in and saw a toolbox we had seen on the table on the floor with various tools around it. Henry said no way in hell that toolbox had a damn padlock on it. We all looked around the lock. It was on the table now, besides where the toolbox used to be. Henry tried to get in the toolbox earlier, but the lock prevented him. We heard footsteps upstairs again. Annie said screw this and ran outside along Henry while I hobbled out. The jerks left me behind. When we were out of the house, we saw Alexis, Tommy, and Joey. They were panting out of breath and looked terrified. We asked what happened. Alexis said that they saw a black figure with red eyes and it charged at them. We all heard a loud snarl like a big dog and we took off towards my truck on the way there and said, look, in one of the upstairs windows, we saw two glowing eyes go from the middle of the window to the top. Then they separated. One went left and one went right. We all hopped the fence and peeled out of there as fast as everyone could. I am not currently experiencing any hauntings, but I do have a tale of a spiritual encounter. I will begin by prefecting story with the events leading up to the event. My grandfather passed away in hospice care in July 2000. I spent his last night on earth with him, holding his hand and reading the Bible to him, which was his favorite literature. He was an artist and a carpenter, and spent his last remaining years up in his home carving beautiful artwork out of wood. 
He loved his simple life and carved because he wanted to, never once selling his museum quality work. He would only give it away to anyone who truly appreciated it. At 88, he was about 80% deaf and completely blind in one eye, and nearly blind in the other. After a stroke six months earlier, his health declined quickly and he simply gave up on life. As he lay in the bed, I sang to him, although he probably could not hear me or even knew that I was there, and he was in a coma-like state with his eyes open. He had stopped eating and he was severely underweight, and it was hard for me to see him like that, knowing how much he loved life and living. Many times he cried in his last few years, saying that he loved his life and didn't want to die. During his last living moments with me, I looked down into his distant foggy eyes, knowing he couldn't hear or see me, and told him that the baby goose that he held at my house the last time he visited had grown up now and had four babies of her own. His eyes filled up with tears and turned red, and his mouth began to quiver as if he was trying to say something. He hadn't spoken in nearly two weeks. His love for animals and nature transcended through his limitations that night. I knew he would probably die that night, so I sat next to him with my hand on his chest, feeling his every breath and heartbeat. He didn't pass away until the next day, after I left. He was alone, which is what I didn't want. I didn't want his spirit to leave his body and to look down at an empty room. That bothered me for a long time. In an attempt to comfort ourselves, we turned to his Bible. He was much more dedicated to the word than we were ever, but knowing that it was so close to his heart, we thought it would ease our minds. My mother said to read something that he had underlined or highlighted, which is something his Bible was full of. I read the first thing I opened that was underlined. You do not have to understand the Bible to feel the power behind these words, which read, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord, where there comfort one another with these words. We all felt a chill run through us. At his wake, I waited until everyone left, and I cut a small lock of his beautiful thick white hair and placed it in an envelope. As myself and my friend walked to the vehicle to leave, I opened the door and a mourning dove flew into me as if trying to enter the truck with me. It injured its wings and I brought it home. I rescue and rehabilitate small animals all the time, so I mended its wing and let it go about a week later. I took that as a sign for my grandfather, as we had that bond of loving all creatures great and small. A couple of weeks later, in August, my best friend was at my house, and I was showing her videotapes of Papa, that is what I called him, because she had never met him. I wanted to share with her the kind of person he was. For nearly two hours we watched him talk about God, Leonardo da Vinci, his childhood, his 24 brothers and sisters, his beloved mother, and we saw him play his guitar and sing old, sad songs about homeless children and hobos, songs that made grown men cry, including himself. After the tape was finished, I got up to go to the kitchen for something to drink, and my friend went to the restroom. At that moment, we both heard a loud musical tone that sounded like a doorbell. Since I do not have a doorbell, we both said, what the heck is that? We both re-entered the living room where we had been watching the tape and searched everywhere where the sound had come from. My heart sank as I realized what it was. About two years earlier, I had one of those cheap doorbells that you plug into the wall, using a battery operated button at your front door to operate the sound. I became so irritated by all the neighborhood kids ringing it that I just took the button off and put it in my piano stool. The battery had gone bad anyway. I never unplugged the part that rings. I had forgotten it was there because it was hidden behind a chair. That was eerie enough, but what really got me thinking was when I explained to my friend 
that I had the ringer set to only ring one long tone. To change it to the traditional two-tone ding-dong, you had to take the back off of the unit and set the switches according to the manual. Needless to say, it did ring in the ding-dong fashion. Oddly enough, it was my friend who said, maybe it was your grandfather saying hi. It hadn't even occurred to me. Shortly after that, I was explaining what happened to my mother on the phone, and it happened again. She could hear it, and we both fell silent. He was letting me know that his fears of leaving his family behind were pointless, and that he was with the rest of his family in heaven. I believe he was thanking me for being there for him when no one else could. It has been three years since his own death, and the doorbell has not rang since. Hey, my name is Maddie. Today, me and my best friend Summer had a strange encounter with a malevolent spirit. Let me explain what happened. A few months ago, me and one of my other friends, Alicia, met an eight-year-old spirit named Reese through a Ouija board. She seemed like a very sweet and innocent girl. She told us at her own will, and I repeat her own will, how she met her death. She apparently got beaten to death by her abusive father. Then a few weeks went by, and I introduced Reese to my now best friend Summer. They got along very well. It didn't seem like she had any sorts of problem with her or anyone she met. The next day we were playing when we got a call from my friend Amy. Long story short, she had an encounter with a spirit named Sarah. She claimed that Sarah was a very stubborn spirit. It took her hours just to get her to say goodbye. Amy also stated that Sarah seemed like a very lonely and clingy spirit who did not want to let her go. Then we made an attempt to contact Sarah through the board. It was a success. After we talked to Sarah for a bit, we asked her if she knew Reese. Sarah suddenly stopped moving to Planchet. We asked her if she was all right. She answered no. She also said that Reese isn't Reese. She said that Reese is actually a man named Roger. Sarah also told us that Roger was the one who killed her at the age of 27. The final thing she said about Roger was that if we ever told him that she was the one who told, that he would send her straight to the gates of hell. We tried to contact Reese, Roger, on December 10th, 2016, around 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time. We successfully contacted Reese. At that period of time, he didn't know that we knew who he really was. Then, we did something that we both regret. We asked if she was hiding anything from us. He responded this in his own words. Fine, you fucking caught me. Then right after that he said, Who told you two idiots? We simply responded to the internet in hopes to keep Sarah safe. Then Roger responded by saying, You are a liar. Then the planchet started the circle around the alphabet counterclockwise, excluding the letter M. It did not touch the corners whatsoever. Summer and I started to panic, wondering what it was trying to do. I thought he simply lost control over the planchets, but Summer thought it was something more because at that time, it was spinning around continuously for about 30 seconds. So I suggested that if we put pressure on it, it might stop it. It just kept going even with pressure, but just slower. But after we lifted the pressure, it continued to spin and got even faster. After a while, it just randomly landed on Dubai. Maybe it just got tired or got sick of us panicking. I really need to know your thoughts on this, and if this occurrence was really legitimately something evil, because I don't know what to explain it for. Thank you for reading. I didn't believe in the Ouija board because they sell them at Toys R Us, so I didn't think they would sell something dangerous to kids and adults. I've read stories about the Ouija board, but I don't know if it's true. People do make up stories, so it's hard to tell if it's true or not. Some people say the Ouija board is just a game. Others say it's not just a game, 
and some say it's dangerous. I had to find out for myself that the Ouija board is really dangerous. On Sunday, I decided to go to Toys R Us to buy the board. I drove my car in the morning to Toys R Us and I was just looking around at first for about an hour. After looking around, I went to the game section and I purchased the Ouija board. I drove back to my apartment and put the board in the closet. The same day about 10pm, I decided to try it out. I took it out of the box and put it on my bed. I didn't have any candles so I just dimmed the light. I put the board on my lap and the planchet on the board. I put my fingers on the planchet and I started around in circles for about a minute. I stopped and I started saying, is anybody out there? I kept saying it for about 15 to 20 minutes and then all of a sudden I felt a strange presence right above me. I was so scared that I ran out of my room and I threw the board in the garbage. I was very shaken. I went back to my room and turned the lights on and I didn't sleep at all. And that's why I don't mess with Ouija boards. I have had several experiences, but I will tell you two of my most frightening. A friend and I had started playing with the Ouija board and it ended up turning our lives upside down for the span of around two years. One night, my friend Judy, her husband Luke, Loma, and myself were watching a movie called Witchboard right in the middle of a winter storm. All footprints had been covered at this time and the streets were empty. About halfway through the movie, the front door blew open and we heard running footsteps come into the house, up the stairs, down the hall, and into the bedroom where Judy's two-year-old lay sleeping. We were all just sitting there frozen in shock and fright when we heard a loud slam, which turned out to be the bedroom door, and the poor little boy started screaming, monster, monster. Luke took off up the stairs, only to find a very upset little boy and nothing or no one else. As things started to calm down, Judy and I went to shut the front door and there were still no footprints in the snow. The only snow that had come into the house was blowing from the wind. It was around March now and one day, as I lay down for a nap, I felt the bed start to shake under me. I was uncertain if I had really felt what I thought I had, so I was not frightened but I got up anyway. That was only the beginning. Not long after that, it became a constant thing every time I tried to lay in my bed. The shaking started to get more violent and it also felt as if someone was punching up at the mattress from beneath. I complained several times and no one believed me. It was now to the point where I was afraid to go to bed. I began sleeping at my friend Loma's house because her bed didn't shake. After staying at her house for two weeks, my mom said it was time to come home and I did agree, but not until she promised to spend the first night sleeping in bed with me. That night, we had only been in bed for about 10 minutes before the bed started its usual shaking. It was very minor at first, so my mom started to make excuses for why it was happening. By the time five minutes had passed, it was now undeniable and I could tell my mother was getting scared but was trying to stay calm for my sake. The last straw for my mother was when the punching started. It was harder than I had ever felt before. We laid there for a moment while my mother mustered up the courage to peek under the bed. Of course, she didn't find anything and we promptly left the room and set ourselves up in the living room for the remainder of the night. My bed continued to shake and punch for some time thereafter, but it eventually quit. However, once in a while it will start, to this day, and I just get up or ignore it and it stops. This encounter involved a Ouija board and possibly my guardian angel. Years ago, a friend and I were goofing around with a Ouija board. Being a bit ignorant of the unknown, I mistakenly asked it how old I would be when I died and how. It replied that I would be 16 and that I would die in a car accident. A month or two after I turned 16, I was asked if I wanted to go out with my parents the next day to run errands. 
I said yes. That next morning, I woke up to discover that my parents left without me. I was annoyed. An hour after I woke up, my mother called me from the hospital. They had been hit by a transport truck an hour before. When I asked why they had left without me, my mom replied that her and my dad had tried for a half hour to get me up, and then they gave up. What makes it so scary is where the truck had hit. My one brother has to sit behind my mom and my dad does not wear a seatbelt. Had I been in that car, I would have been sitting behind my dad with the seatbelt on. The transport truck hit the car on the driver's side, almost imploding on the driver's and left backseat side. That's where I would have been sitting. Guardian Angel, I think so. I was celebrating Halloween around my best mate Felicity's house. We usually have a laugh and a joke, but neither of us had played with a Ouija board before. So, we gathered about seven friends from the neighborhood. First, we lit candles, one black, one red, one green, and one clear. Fliss had purchased the board from an old shop in the Stoke Town Center. We sat down in her dining room and placed the board right in the middle of the dining room table. We all placed our fingers on the gold planchet. I was the reader, so I asked the questions. At first, we did not get any response, so we all giggled and made fun of the silly people who got themselves worked up about these silly boards. About five seconds after we stopped giggling, we heard a massive bang on the floor. I thought it was one of the boys playing a trick, so I suggested that we all sit legs crossed on the chairs. I made sure we were all cross-legged, and I said, If it was a ghost that made the bang on the floor, can you please do it again? And it did. I spoke again. We will now try to communicate using the board. So we started to use the board again, and I again asked if anybody was present who wanted to communicate with us. The planchet moved to yes. I asked for a name, and it replied, I am unclean. Fliss's uncle had passed on, so I inquired if we were talking with her uncle Ian. The response was no. Again, the planchet moved to the following letters, I am unclean. We had made contact with an apparent demon. We decided to say sorry for disturbing, and we thanked the spirit for its presence. However, it did not go. The spirit of demon flung Fliss back into the wall. Then it came for me. I had a vision of hell itself at that moment, and I remain grateful to this day that it did not hurt me. In telling the story, let me assure the reader that it was passed to me by my grandmother, Eileen. Eileen is in failing health, but her memory is untouched, and her ability to spin a tail is uncanny. This particular story is about her father, Joe, his first wife, and a house that will never be forgotten. My grandmother is a devout Christian, but she believes these tales of the unexplained to be completely true. Judge for yourself. In the late 1800s to early 1900s, it was common practice in the coal fields of Kentucky and West Virginia for a miner to spend the majority of the week at the mines while leaving his wife at home alone. This is exactly what Joe, my great-grandfather, did during his first marriage. After a hasty marriage, Joe bought a small, quaint home for himself and his new wife, Sue. Sue quickly alerted her husband to a potential problem. The house was directly across the road from the local cemetery. Joe, being a firm disbeliever in such superstitious nonsense like ghosts and spooks, had a good laugh when Sue begged him not to make her stay alone in a house so close to a graveyard and told her to get used to it. When Monday morning arrived, he left her alone and laughed as she sobbed on the porch, that night, after completing her tours, she settled down in the bed for a good night's rest and doused the lamps. As soon as she had climbed into bed, a strange noise became apparent outside. As she pulled the covers up around her head, she could hear something like barrels rolling or horses galloping around the house. She tried to sleep and eventually, as the sunrise drove the mysterious sounds away, found some comforting slumber. Every night, the noises started getting louder and louder, seeming to get closer to the house, and, on Friday night, Sue heard three knocks on the door. 
In a terrified fit, she screamed, leave me alone, and suddenly, the noises faded. The next morning brought Joe's return, and the first thing Sue did was beg him to let her leave the house, telling him of the haunted noises. He laughed unsympathetically and told her to get over this stupidity. In desperation, she bitterly screamed, Joe, I hope to God it gets you. Joe wasn't in the least bit frightened and told her that it was Cheryl's local men playing tricks on her. Later that night, Sue slept well in Joe's arms, but some subtle suspicion began to eat at the unbeliever. As he drifted into a shallow sleep, he was startled at a loud crack coming from the fireplace that startled him, and as he sat upright in the bed, he saw the apparition of an elderly woman staring at him from the rocking chair at the foot of the bed. My grandmother says that Joe knew exactly who the woman was, but he took the knowledge of her identity to his grave because simply, she had been dead for six months before they moved into the house. Joe shut her with fear in her bony, cold hand, stretched to clutch his ankles as she latched onto his foot and began pulling him towards her in the footboard of the bed. Joe fainted with fright as he felt his foot slide down to the foot of the bed in the dead hand of the spirit. The next morning, Sue roused her pale husband and sat up in the bed as he opened his eyes and screamed with terror. The footbed of the bed was broken and the rocking chair had been toppled during the night. Joe immediately promised his frightened wife that not another night would be passed in this restless house, simply telling her, Sue, whatever it was, it got me. Thank you for reading my grandmother's story. I hope you found it entertaining because, well, I thought it was pretty frightening. See you later. I have told this story to people who are not there to witness the actual event, and some look at me as if I am just telling a story to get a good laugh, but I find nothing funny about it. Everything I am about to relate is true, and I guess in some bizarre way, I feel that by retelling this story to anyone who is willing to listen to it will bring me some comfort. On July 6, 1990, a high school friend shot himself in the head with a rifle in a nearby local baseball dugout. The act shocked and saddened everyone, especially his parents, of course, who did not want to believe their only son would take his own life. The days that followed his death were happening, for me, as if in a dream. Fearing this act would spark some sort of chain reaction, school's counselors were sent in to help the students grieve and discuss their feelings of loss. Days went by, and there seemed to be a cloud of despair and confusion hanging over our entire high school class. If he had lived, my friend would have graduated from high school the rest of us that same year. When he died, he was two months away from his 18th birthday. About a week after his suicide, I was visiting my best friend at the time, we'll call her Anne, in her home. We were both still very affected by the death of our friend, and we began to talk late into the night about his possible reasons for taking his own life and how crazy and unexpected it was. We had been discussing the whole chain of events and basically trying to make sense of something we couldn't even imagine when I suddenly became very uncomfortable talking about our deceased friend. I was sitting at the time in a desk chair across from Anne who was sitting comfortably on her bed facing me. She was looking directly at me and she could see the discomfort on my face. She assumed I was just overreacting and our discussion had gotten to me, so she stood up and moved towards the door of her bedroom and gestured in a sweeping motion with her arm for me to follow her into the kitchen down the hall. There was a single small desk light on behind me when she made this motion with her arm so that when she moved, her body created a shadow on the wall. This is going to sound ridiculous, and I'm no physics expert, but when Anne swept her arm up into the air, gesturing me to follow her, her shadow did not follow her arm. Instead, there was a strange kind of delay, and I saw her arm move, and about 5-10 to 10 seconds later, the shadow of an arm moved, mimicking the same gesture she had just made. I, of course, thought my eyes were playing tricks on me and ignored the shadow, and I would have kept it to myself if only Anne had not turned to me and asked, did you just see that? I answered yes, of course, and we fled out of the room and into the kitchen. Anne's house was large, and our frightened voices bounced off the columned walls, but nothing ever occurred after that. My friend Anne and I no longer speak, and I am sure that if she knew I was relaying this story to strangers, she would think I was crazy, but I remember the death of her high school friend as if it were yesterday, and I can't help wishing that the shadow we saw was indeed a sign from our friend, but I will never be too sure. 
I write this story in his memory and in the hope that he is in a place where his problems have been all taken away. Thanks for reading. This story I'm about to tell you has been talked about in my family for years. Now it has been passed down to my own daughter who tells it to her friends at slumber parties. It begins with the first time I ever saw anything when I was around the age of seven. It happened in a house that we lived in years ago in western New York. I shared a room with my sister. We both had the feeling something was always watching us, but being so young, we never really worried all that much about it until one night while I was trying to sleep. My bed was up against one wall and my sister's bed faced the other. I turned so I was facing the wall. When I opened my eyes, after getting that feeling of being watched again, there, standing in the wall was a woman. She was a young woman, dressed all in black, high white lace collar, wearing a cameo, and hair pulled up neatly in a bun. She stood there with her hands folded in front of her, smiling sweetly at me. Now mind you, I was 7 years old, so I pulled the covers up over my head and then down again to take a peek just to see if she was still there, which she was, and this time with a bigger smile. I got so scared I jumped from my bed and ran across the room to my sister's bed. I landed right on top of her, waking her up of course. I told her there was a lady in my wall, but when we looked again, the woman was gone. The next day I told my mom about it. She said it must have been just my guardian angel and left it at that. She refused to talk about it any further or even years later. Then recently, my brother and I got to talking about that house. He said, don't you remember what the neighborhood kids used to say about our house? And of course, I didn't remember a thing. He told me that apparently a couple had died there years ago. Then he asked me if I remembered the time that he and I were in the backyard and we saw the old man in the attic window. And all of a sudden it rushed back. Bam. Right when he told me about the old man in the attic window, I had a major flashback and remembered it like it was yesterday. I don't even have to tell you even after all these years it scared me. Well, many years have passed since we lived there, but I still have dreams about that house and I wish the dreams would stop. I have many other scary stories to tell, but I freaked myself out telling this one so the others will have to wait. This incident happened about two years ago. I was 17 at the time working at a restaurant motel in Old Saybrook, Connecticut called The Castle. The scariest thing about this place, besides the low pay, was the old story of what happened to one of its original owners. From almost my first day working there, I was told that one of the members of the family who built the house had killed himself on the grounds. The story was that one night, the son had discovered that his fiancée was cheating on him with one of his close friends. Deep in depression, the son climbed to the tallest tower of the castle, tied a rope to some type of pole on the roof, and hanged himself. The next morning as the parents were leaving the home, they saw him hanging. They immediately sold the mansion and it has been a hotel ever since. Many employees said that they had heard and seen things, yet I, as most people believe at first, didn't believe the stories. That is, until one night, I was working the late late shift with a friend of mine named Katie. We were cleaning up the dining room after closing when we heard the kitchen door slam shut. I had popped them open, but... As the wind off Long Island sound is pretty strong, I figured they had been blown shut. Katie yelled at me to get over there and look at the kitchen. When I arrived, I saw a weird green light pouring through the round window of the door and flooding out the crack at the bottom. Still unconvinced of any supernatural going on, I tried to open the door, but it was not happening. I thought someone was in there and I knew if the place got trashed I would get fired, so I reared back and tried to put my shoulder through the door. At the time, I was about 6'2", 200 pounds, played football and lifted a lot of weights. The door should have popped right open, but not this time. Katie and I peered into the window, and there, plain as day, was a man dressed in antiqued clothes with a noose around his neck looking right back at us. He walked by and the green light left us. We instantly figured, forget the boss, it's quitting time. We ran outside and could barely light our cigarettes. Our hands were shaking so badly. From then on, I was a believer and I knew I would never, ever doubt ghosts ever again.
My aunt and uncle had a passion for restoring old country houses, the last of which had been at an end at the turn of the century. The house sits on 50 acres at the top of a hill, next to a historic old church with an equally historic old graveyard. I can't claim to recall for certain, but I think the church was used as a field hospital during the Civil War. My uncle would tell us the stories about the months after they moved into the house. Their bedroom was on the second of three floors, near the large, almost spiral staircase that emptied into the foyer to two sitting areas. Late in the evening, while they were in bed, my aunt and uncle would hear what sounded like a distant crowd of people in conversation. Living in quiet country houses most of their lives made them fairly light sleepers. The local volunteer fire department changed that over time. I'll get to that. My uncle would get up to check out the noise and find nothing, but since it was an old house with a boiler, and that it was more or less near town, there were many possible rational explanations for the noise. Still, over the course of a few months, the noises grew louder and louder until it sounded like a party was being thrown in their own house and my aunt and uncle weren't invited. This had grown so gradually that my uncle was much more annoyed than fearful. One night, he went to the stairs and shouted for them to shut up so he can get some sleep. That seemed to scale back the noise enough to satisfy him, although it didn't go away completely. The next weekend, he took a walk for the first time through the local graveyard and noticed many of the stones were overturned and some of the plots were neglected. He righted the headstones and cleaned up some of the plots that weekend and never again heard the noises in the house. My uncle passed away in that house one year ago this October. Subsequently, I spent a great deal more time there last winter than I had before taking care of a few things for my aunt. I slept on the top floor across from the game room. Many nights an air raid siren would go off, summoning the local volunteer firefighters to the station house. I never did get used to sleeping through that. Then one night, the siren wailed at about 2am, and I was having a hard time going back to sleep. I was wide awake when I heard something. It lasted only an instant and seemed to me to be a crowd in the distance that had just been told the punchline to a very funny joke. Whatever it was, it reminded me of one of my uncle's stories. As an epilogue, I should mention that my aunt is trying to sell the house. So far, the most likely buyer is the local funeral home. While sitting around looking at photo albums with my grandmother, we came across some newspaper clippings. The clippings were from a newspaper in Indiana. They were about an old brick house being torn down. Since we live in Mississippi, I found it strange that my grandmother would have these clippings, so I questioned her about them. She then told me one of the eeriest stories I have ever heard. In 1946, my grandmother lived in Nobile, Indiana with her husband and their child. They lived in an old brick house that was built before the Civil War and stood on the outskirts of town. It was a large house with very high ceilings and wooden floors. In the master bedroom was a closet with a heavy wooden door that did not have a knob, only a wooden latch to keep the door closed. My grandmother would shut and latch the closet. When she would leave the room and return the closet door would be standing wide open. She would shut the door again and go about her chores. When she returned, the door would be open. She did this several times a day. She said the door stayed open more than she could keep it closed. She was more annoyed than scared by this strange event. About eight months later, she and her husband divorced and she moved to Mississippi with my grandfather. The house she had lived in did not cross her mind until 10 years later when her aunt Bonnie wrote her a letter and sent her the newspaper clippings. The clippings talked about her old house and reported that it had been torn down. While they were tearing down the house, a hole was discovered under the closet floor. They had found the remains of a man in the hole. It was believed to be the body of a soldier from the Civil War. After lurking around here for ages reading everyone else's story, I finally got up the nerve to post one of my own. My story isn't as dramatic or interesting as some of the other stories posted here, but I feel confident enough to post it because three other people have had experience in this particular house, so here it goes. This happened a few months ago while I was visiting a friend's house one evening. I'll refer to my friend as G. A mutual friend of ours, J, was also present. This was my first and only visit to the house and no one else was home at the time apart from the three of us. 
The house in question is an old wood villa, which would be, at a guess, 80 to 100 years old. It's a rather large one-level structure with two long and connected hallways, one that leads from the front door to the back of the house and another that spans across the back of the house. Together, the hallways form the shape of a T. While eating dinner in the kitchen, dining room area located in the back portion of the house, something drew my attention to the right, so I glanced down to the top section of the hallway. As I watched, a dark shadow moved across very quickly from right to left, as though it just moved up the other long hall, through the center of the house, then straight ahead crossing the top hallway. I didn't say anything at the time, although I was curious about what I had seen. I have to say that while I definitely believe in ghosts, I didn't want to get too excited about something which could have a very logical explanation for it. After dinner, G invited us on a tour of the house, and while exploring the rooms off the back hallway, I carefully checked to see if there were any windows that could have let car headlights in to cause the shadow I'd seen, but I couldn't find anything to explain it. Sometime later, G left the lounge to make coffee and, while she was out of the room, I whispered to Jay that I had seen a shadow cross the back hall. She surprised me by telling me that she too had seen a ghost moving from right to left in the same exact place, only she's seen it twice before in broad daylight. We were intrigued and quite excited about this, but didn't say anything to G as we didn't want to frighten her. Interestingly enough, G approached Jay recently to ask her opinion about ghosts because a young woman who also lives in the house claimed to see a shadow move up the hallway. She was concerned because she too would be spending several weeks alone there, and understandably, she was frightened. G explained that while she hadn't seen anything herself, there was one occasion when she was walking up the hallway and she felt like she accidentally pushed someone out of the way, even though she couldn't see anyone there. I've been in various places before where I've been able to sense unseen presences. I've had one experience where I used to get a feeling of overwhelming fear every time I went into one particular room in a house my parents owned. With the shadow that Jay and I saw, we didn't feel any strong feelings or emotions connected with it. At this moment in time, I haven't heard any more events in that house. When I was about 12 years old, my brother, sister, and I moved into my grandparents' house. Ever since, we could remember we heard stories about the house being haunted. Nothing too big, but strange things happened a lot. Rumor had it that there used to be a horse track room stable where my grandparents built their house and a little boy had been trampled in there. We have never actually checked into this story, but it is what we heard. At least, it is what we were told. Anyway. All of us grandkids were petrified of going upstairs. It was always so cold up there and just freaky, but that was where all the bedrooms were, so when we moved in, we had no choice. Actually, I had no choice. My little brother and sister had beds set up downstairs, and I slept upstairs. When I was about four, I had taken up smoking cigarettes, but no one knew about it. I used to turn off my bedroom light and smoke cigarettes. I turned off my light just in case my grandparents happened to come up the stairs. They always turned on the hall light to help their way up the stairs. This way, I would know how to put out my cigarette and spray air freshener. One night, I was upstairs alone smoking when I heard someone coming up the stairs. It was late and everyone had been in bed. The hallway light never came on, but all the same time, I butted out my cigarette and waited, but no one ever came up. This happened quite a few times and I just got used to it. This house is about 50 or 60 years old. The doors are the old latch type and made of nothing but wood. They are solid. To close the door, you have to lift the hook and latch it onto the other part of the door. To open the door, you have to lift the handle and pull the door open. On my bedroom door, I also had an eye hook lock to keep my room locked and my little brother out. I would be laying in bed at night watching TV and my bedroom door would just pop open, but it would never open all the way because of the lock on my door. I never thought anything of it. I just thought it was a breeze until my brother and I started sharing stories about what was happening in that room in the house. I have since moved out and my brother moved into my old room. We have all grown up and started sleeping upstairs and we have gotten over our fears pretty much. There were four bedrooms upstairs and they were set up weird. The house was square, two bedrooms on each side of the house with a staircase up the middle. 
To get to the two rooms, you have to walk through the main two ones. When my little sister finally decided to move upstairs, she moved into the room behind mine. She swears to hearing a little boy crying in her room at night. Recently, I bought a Ouija board and have been using it at my new house. One night, my cousin, brother, sister, and boyfriend were using it when my cousin and I started talking about how we used to use the board when we were younger at my grandparents' house. My cousin remembers talking to a little boy who died at this location, and she remembers the little boy telling us his vision of the story of what happened to him. He told us his name was Brandon, and his father beat him in the tack room, and that unlike the story being passed around, he hadn't been trampled at all. Which story is true, I don't know, and I guess we'll never know. My little brother is the only one of us left living with my grandparents, and he is now living in my old bedroom. He has heard the footsteps coming up the stairs when he was doing something he wasn't supposed to be doing. He has heard whimpering, and he has talked to this little boy. Not literally talking, but questions will pop into his head that he already knows the answers to, like, what year is it? And he will answer out loud. He will not even be thinking about a certain thing, and then all of a sudden, he'll have a question. The door pops open on him, but he doesn't have the latch, so it pops open and closes again. Now, here's the last we have heard from the spirits in our grandparents' house. He was sitting in his room talking to his girlfriend on the phone when he heard someone coming up the stairs. The footsteps stopped at the top of the stairs. He hung up with his girlfriend and went into the hallway, but nobody was there. Now, what happens next makes us believe that the little boy was beaten to death and not trampled as everyone had been told. The footsteps were heavy ones, definitely not of those of a child. When my brother realized no one was there, he just assumed that it was the father because of the heavy footsteps. He told the father that if he didn't leave Brandon, the little boy, alone, that he was going to kill himself and haunt his butt down. He would then beat him to a fine pulp, then come back to life, yeah right, dig up his grave, and burn his mangy hide. My brother has become attached to Brandon and has not heard anything from him about his father or heard his father around the house. I'm here to tell you about the strange occurrences that happened to my mother at the Lawrence Family Mansion on Teddington Park Avenue in Toronto. The first thing you need to know is that my mom is a down-to-earth, no-nonsense type, and she believes that the house was, as all its tenants have believed in the past, that it is haunted. My mom lived in an apartment, dirt cheap because it was haunted, at the top of the mansion. It was, she says, extremely beautiful. High vaulted ceilings, many rooms, and spacious too. In the kitchen, there was a mirror called a talking mirror. This was because anybody who stayed in the kitchen long enough started randomly talking to themselves in the mirror. My mother says no matter who passed it, they started to babble. My mom even talked to herself without realizing it, until something brought her attention back to where she was and what she was doing, making her realize that she had been talking to herself. On the bottom floor, a German man named Hans, I don't know how to spell it, he was the most serious man my mom had ever known. My mom visited him sometimes, and oftentimes she would go into this bathroom that was there, and just study the CLW-footed top that dated back to the 1930s. She got the most creepy feeling looking at it, like she could almost see a body lying in it. She compared it to the portrait of Murder of Merit, which is a painting of a man with his throat and wrist slit. She told the man, and he said that he heard noises coming from it at night, and that he knew it must have been haunted because he said you could almost see the outline of a body in it. They looked into the history of the home, and sure enough, somebody had hurt themselves in the tub around the 1950s. Another thing near the bathroom was a hall, where people would say they felt a deep desire to run to get down it, and that before going down it, you had to stop and brace yourself, getting up your courage, like there was a wall there stopping you from going there you had to get through. Another place in the house was a great living room. It was in the apartment of a policeman and his girlfriend. They always argued, mostly in that room. 
one night, the girlfriend took the man's gun and held it to his head as they argued. People always reported that happy couples would always go into that room and just start arguing. Old spots were numerous in the house. I could tell you many other stories about various spots, but I have to get going. My mom says the house is sold for over $5 million and that she suspects that someone tore the house down to get rid of the hauntings and built a replica. My name is Lindsay. I've lived with my family in this home for four years now, and ever since we've lived here, we've experienced some things. It seems though that most things have happened in my bedroom, and I often thought my parents did not believe the things I had told them about. The first month of living in my home, my mother awoke in the morning to find a painting of a woman. This painting was lying on the floor in the closet. It appeared overnight. She had questioned all of us in the home, and nobody had seen it before. The music boxes would play randomly in the middle of the night. Doorknobs, turning seconds before turning them yourself. My bedroom door always sounded like it was opening by itself, when it was really shut. It wasn't for a while when I actually started to see people, or should I say ghosts, in my room while I was sleeping. I have seen a translucent woman wearing brown rags several times. The first I'd ever seen her, she was standing at the foot of my bed with her mouth wide open, as if she was screaming, but I never heard a sound. It felt as though my heart had stopped. I was frozen with fear. I had rolled over and told myself it wasn't actually there and that I was seeing things. Then about a month later, the same lady sat in my chair in my room, just watching me. I then covered my face with my pillow and went back to sleep. In the morning, I told my mother about both times this lady being in my room and she just mocked me. She just kind of laughed and joked about it. She told me that the first time that the lady was there, it was because her teeth hurt, because I'm planning on becoming a dentist after schooling. I didn't think my mom believed me at all. Sometime after that, a tall man stood next to the head of my bed, once again, just staring at me. When I awoke, I started screaming, and my mother came running into my room. She told me it was just a dream, and to go back to bed, but I knew it wasn't. She was just saying what parents would say, just to make me feel better. It was strange how my room was the only room I'd ever seen them in. My family would just make fun of me, and would make stupid jokes about the ghost in my room. Later one night, my sister was across the hall from me sleeping when she woke to a flash that lit up the room at one in the morning. This was when she was 20. She then ran into my room and slept next to me. She was not sure that it was a flash from a camera since we were upstairs and everyone was sleeping. We never figured what the flash was. When my mother was away on vacation, and I was the only one home, I was sleeping, and when I woke in the middle of the night, I found myself eye to eye with a young girl who had to have been at least 10. She had a wound in her head where I had been. Terrifyingly, there was a hole through her head. It was the right eye that had been gone. This was the most frightening thing I'd ever seen. I once again couldn't do anything. I was the only one home, so I laid there and went back to sleep. Once again, I see the woman lady, except this time, I find myself fighting her in my dream. The weird thing was, a mobile that was hanging above me on my ceiling had fallen and hit me in the stomach while I was sleeping. 
I still found that my parents didn't believe me until one night. My dad went downstairs for a drink at one in the morning. That's when he heard some girl humming a song. He thought it was me until he realized that he and my mom were the only ones home that night. Later the same night at three in the morning, my mother awoke and had to use the restroom. While she was walking down the hall, she heard a lady talking. My parents told me about this when I arrived home the next morning, and now they believe me. We don't know about who these ghosts are, but we are trying to find some history about our house, as it was built in 1890. Maybe the history will reveal who these ghosts are, and why they are there. I grew up in a typical Maribyrish small southern town in southeast Tennessee. Our home was less than 80 feet from the Norfolk Southern Railroad line. The tracks were on a rise in the hill, and from the second story window of our home, you would be parallel with the tracks. The town I grew up in was once a coal mining camp, and then grew to be a coal mining town. Point of fact, the town's name came from the original proprietor of the first train depot. It was called Daisy, after his only daughter. From my house, the original train depot was situated just about a mile north, and the area of the train tracks in between was often referred to as Black Track because there were several curves in the railway, and coal was often spilled in these curves leaving the soil covered in the black, chalky coal residue. It is purportedly haunted, and there are several ghastly and ghostly tales attributed to that area of track. What I'm able to gather, one story is that a female slave was once accused of leading other slaves to freedom via the train tracks, and when her trajectory was discovered by her owner, she was tied to the tracks until a train came through, chopping off both of her feet. Once this was done, she was carried to the slave quarters as an example of what would happen to all others who attempted escape, or assisted others in escaping. Slowly she bled to death, despite the other slave's best effort. I know several people who have laid their hands on the Bible today, and testify seeing her feetless body in the area. Other stories about a train wreck that happened about 15 yards from the back door of my old home. In southern Tennessee, we do not get much snow, but we can get quite a bit of rain, apparently in the late 30s. A weather front came through, bringing a lot of rain and flash flooding to the area. One night after the rain had slowed to a drizzle, a fully loaded train was slowing to stop at the depot not knowing that the ground below was giving way under its weight. During the initial wreck, several railroad workers and hobos were trapped in the rubble. Many of the rescuers were local farmers and residents who perished as the mud shifted under the weight of the debris, and ultimately, a large land and debris slide halted all rescue efforts. As many as 50 people perished, and the old timers would say that, they could hear people moaning and screaming for help for days after the wreck, and how help never came. Some people swear that they could hear the sorrowful screams and moans of the trapped, unbright, still nights. Lastly, another story about the area of tracks has to do with teenage hormones and stupidity. Along the section of track is an old paved road that weaves back and forth across the tracks. In the 50s and 60s, this area of road was used by teenagers to prove the muscle in their machines and the guts in their drivers. More than one person has perished in their efforts to outrun the train. Many people say that those untimely deaths are the culprits of strange flashes of light that are often seen in that area. 
I am new to this site, and I've read many of the stories posted. I wanted to share my experiences. For the past five years, myself, my son who is turning six and my daughter who will be two this fall, lived in a small cottage style house with a full basement. The first weekend that I moved in, I of course had a party. My son stayed with my parents for the night. I also had a roommate for the first two months that I moved into the home. She had a cordless phone in the basement, and I had a regular phone upstairs. After our guests left for the evening, I took the cordless phone upstairs to make some calls. When I went to bed, I left the phone on the floor in my room. The next morning, I heard someone walking up the basement stairs. My bed was on the other side of the wall that led to the basement. I heard the footsteps walk through the kitchen, small dining room, and into the living room. I had my bedroom door shut, and I tried to call out to my roommate to tell her to come in. I thought that she was looking for the phone. It was then that I realized that I couldn't open my eyes move or even speak i heard the footsteps pass through my doorway the door never opened i noticed that the closer they got to my bed that the floor appeared to be shaking hence the shaking ghost the only auditory comparison i can give is it sounded like when my dad would do laundry and try to cram 20 pairs of jeans in a washer that had five the whole machine would shake, and you could hear it all over the house. The bathroom floor would even vibrate. That is what it felt like to me. I realized that whatever it was, was standing over me, and soon, I felt a hand resting on my hip. It was just a gentle pressure. I think that he was trying to see who was in the house. At that moment, I was extremely terrified and still couldn't move, speak, or even open my eyes. There was a banging on my window. The noise stopped, and whatever had touched me let go. I jumped out of bed, and there was nothing in the room. Apparently, my dad had been standing outside for 10 minutes banging on the door. I never heard him pull into the driveway, which is right outside my window or knock on the door. He also said that he tried to call us, and I'd never heard the phone ring. I never had this happen again, until just two nights ago. My daughter and I share a room, and around two in the morning, she woke up. I could hear her cry out, Mama, and I tried to get up. I was paralyzed. I couldn't move anything but to lift my head off the pillow briefly. I realized that the floor was shaking again. I tried to open my eyes to look at it, and I couldn't. I believe that I was looking to the crib at my daughter. I didn't feel anything evil, but I don't think it wanted me to see it. After about five minutes, the shaking stopped, and my daughter was back asleep. It all happened so strange that I even considered that I was maybe dreaming it all. When I checked the crib, my daughter seemed fine, and nothing was out of place. Some other just normal haunting things I've experienced are footsteps and cabinets open when I know that I left them closed. The ghost seems to like my kids, and likes to check up on them. I smoke, so during the winter when it is cold, I go down into the basement and smoke by the back cellar steps. I have often heard footsteps go from one bedroom to another, but they never go back out of the last room they entered. Also, when my daughter was in her baby swing, any time I went downstairs, I would hear footsteps walk over to the swing and stop. They are always too heavy and slow to be my sons. Also, whenever I hear them and go back upstairs, he is soundly asleep in his room, so I know that it was never my son. There have been a few times though, that I felt that I was unwelcome in the basement. I feel like I'm being watched in there, 
and that something doesn't like me to be there. I have also felt that feeling walking past my kitchen at night. It's like something is standing there watching me, and this thing seems very cold. I have never been harmed or felt completely threatened by anything. My son has complained of being scared, but if he has seen or heard anything, he doesn't tell me. I just wanted to share my story. We are moving in a month, so it will be interesting to see if the people that end up renting my house have any experiences too. When I was about six or seven, I woke up in the middle of the night for a strange reason. I had a loft bed. I had looked down in my closet. As I was looking, I saw my bead curtains that were hanging over my closet starting to sway. I then felt something brush the side of my arm. I flipped out and almost ran to my parents' room, about halfway to my parents' room. I came to the realization that maybe my fan was on. When I went back to my room, I noticed that my fan had been unplugged the whole time. I knew then that my curtains were definitely moving on their own. I didn't even own any pets, so I had no logical explanation for what had happened. I remember always seeing someone in the corner of my eye. I would turn to see who it was. When I did, no one was there. Things would disappear such as homework and school supplies. Then they would reappear on the kitchen counter and on my dresser. I would always feel someone is watching me. Then I turned around to see that no one was there. I remember one time in particular, I had a friend sleep over. We were up in my tree fort and it was dark out and we were hiding inside. We had dared each other to turn off our flashlights so that it was pitch black. We were getting ready to open the side door when a pair of red eyes appeared on the door window. We rushed inside and started to shake from fright. I have moved from that house five weeks ago and have lived in that house for seven years. I'm glad not to be in that house anymore. I feel a presence here but I don't know if it's good or bad. When I was a teenager, around the age of 16, I found a Ouija board at a yard sale and bought it for 25 cents. Skeptical of the Ouija, I devised the experiment deemed a test of simply a matter of self-suggestion. I was going to ask what pet would die next and think to myself fish. We had several adult cats, dogs, and guinea pigs who were not elderly in very good health, but I had a tank of tropical fish, several of which were getting on in fish years. I was trying to trick the board by seeing if it would give me the answer I was thinking, which would be a logical conclusion. I tried the Ouija board with my mother, a skeptic of all things supernatural. After setting it up, I asked my question. We put our fingertips on the planchet and waited. After five seconds of no response, mom tired of wasting her time and decided that she was going to bed and left the room. I put the board away and didn't think about it for a few days. Later that same week, I was talking to a male friend of mine on the phone. I was telling him my disbelief and attempt at experimentation with the board. I just told him the question that I was going to ask him. What pet would be the next to die? I took a breath and told him, and the answer I was looking for was, when all of a sudden, the books on the shelf behind me tipped over. They knocked into a figurine and sent it to the floor, where it shattered. The figurine was of a ceramic fish. These books had never tipped over before and were securely in place. I have not seen them fall in such manner since this time period, almost 13 years later. The timing of the fall was too eerie. It was exactly at the point where I would have said fish. My friend said that he heard the noise and that I sounded stunned. Though it was a long distance call, I ended it hastily, went and got the Ouija board out of my closet and put it in the garage. I would not touch it again. My mother had to get rid of it without my knowledge, as I so feared it. I think that was a warning sign for me. I've taken Ouija boards seriously since then. If they do not channel the dead, then they certainly set up a psychological premise which I don't think should be tampered with. I feel like it is opening up the door to a stranger, either an earthbound or entity. I don't know. But thanks for reading. 
When I was about eight or nine years old, we moved into a house which had a scary history as it turns out. My mom and dad took my youngest brother to dinner. Linda, my sister and I, didn't want to go. We were instructed to bring the boxes of books in the garage upstairs to the library. While we were doing this, we found an old Ouija board and started playing with it. I thought for sure it was my sister pushing it as it told me I was going to be hit by a car and die by the time I was 10, which obviously 25 years later, I'm still here. It also said that there were five spirits in the house and its name was Jax, boring, and we put it away. That was when we started hearing footsteps in other parts of the house running, lights going on and off, radios blaring that we knew we had turned off, door slamming, knocking, and rapping in the wood, boxes being moved about in the attic, etc. We lived there for five years, and I can tell you that. I have nightmares to this day. Now this house was on a road which was formerly known as the Santa Fe Trail. A couple of miles up the road was where the Santa Fe Trail and the Pikes Peak Trail met. There were Indian encampments, settlements, and a bad stagecoach accident and fire all in the general vicinity. I don't know if Linda and I had visited into the house, or it was there to begin with. My family are Sears, so I suppose I should get used to it, but I've never been free of haunting since then. Thanks for reading. I went to a friend's house to stay for the weekend. My friend and I always loved ghost stories, magic, psychics, and anything else mysterious. Those things would just get us going when we were bored. Well, I decided to bring my Ouija board, which we used many times and usually wait until midnight to use it. This particular night, it was midnight and we were playing with it, just regular, everyday things, when all of a sudden it said, don't be alarmed, in the next few hours you're going to get a cold chill running through your bodies. We asked it, what do you mean don't be alarmed? Well, the board replied that I and all the people around me will notice something in the next hour. Well, right after I said that, my friend's little brother came into the room with us, and it just started to hit us. This is what it were telling us were going to happen. My friend's brother is terrified of ghosts, so we all decided to just put the board up and wait to see what, if anything, happened. My friend said he had an idea. I got a string out that attaches to a crystal. He said it's kind of like a mini Ouija board, and you can ask it yes and no questions. Well, we said for yes, move it vertically, and for no, move it horizontally. We also requested that the responses cause the crystal to move fast and big, so we can detect when a spirit is present. We hung this crystal on a string from a lamp and waited. It was about a half an hour to an hour later, when all of a sudden, we heard a big ting-ting sound coming from the lamp. We flipped on the light, and the crystal was swinging violently. I mean, it was starting to really scare me and my friend. I can only imagine how my friend's little brother would have reacted if he witnessed this. We turned the lights off and got real calm and quiet. The atmosphere in the room seemed to change. It got eerily quiet, and it felt as if something were about to jump out at us at any minute. It also got really hot, really fast. My friend remarked that he thought something big was about to happen. Right when he said that, we heard the door creak open. It wasn't much, but it was like someone was trying to sneak by us. Then suddenly, it got real cold, and I mean so cold that we were shivering and covering up. All of a sudden, you could see a light blue or white colored light getting brighter as it got closer. Then just as quickly as it appeared, it was gone. Then it appeared again, only this time it got real bright and was coming from the middle of the closet. While we were focusing on that, my friend's little brother said look over there, and when we turned to look in that direction, you could see a shadow like someone were walking by. Next thing we knew, the crystal was reacting to it, and it just fell off the lamp. This shadow appeared to wave, as if to tell us, yeah, I'm here, but I won't hurt you. The wind blew outside, and right when the wind blew, the shadow was vanished. Thanks for reading. One boring summer night, my neighbor suggested we give the Ouija board a try. Everyone in our apartment complex were fully aware we're haunted, so I agreed. I wanted to get my baby to sleep first. As I rocked my baby to sleep, I asked my neighbor how she came to have this Ouija board because she had never mentioned it before. She said that the lady on the other side of her was carrying it out to the dump the day before, so she asked her why she was throwing it away because it seemed to be in good condition. The other neighbor said that she was throwing it away because ever since she had it in her apartment, 
Things were falling off the walls and breaking. My neighbor said, well, if you don't mind, I would like to have it. That's how she got it. Now that my daughter was in good deep sleep, I made a pallet for her upstairs in my neighbor's bedroom. I put her on the floor because I didn't want her falling off the bed and getting hurt. I also didn't want her in the same room as we toyed around with the Ouija board. Some more friends came over, so all together, there were the four of us. The spirit contact said no when we asked him if we were a man. It also said no when we were asked if it were a woman. At this point, I took my hands off the board. One of the other people there told me that that was a bad idea because that was the opening of circle we had formed. I immediately put my hands back on the board, but my friend said it was too late, that it was already let out. Right after he said this, we heard a big bang in the room upstairs where my baby was. My baby started to cry. When we went to check, nothing was moved, and my baby seemed to be only startled by the noise. After that, I decided I wanted nothing more to do with the Ouija board. Thanks for reading. Recently, my friend Aaron lost control of his motorcycle and died. Prior to the accident, Aaron, myself, and a few friends, Brutus, Megan, and Alex, decided to play with the Ouija board. We played for a while, when all of a sudden, the planchet just froze. We couldn't move it for anything. Next thing we knew, the planchet just started moving on its own. We sat on the floor in amazement, watching this board acting on its own free will. All of a sudden, the planchet turned in Aaron's direction and scooted forward about an inch or so. Right about that moment, Aaron's cell phone rang. He picked up his phone, expecting it would be someone he knew calling him. Only whoever it was, or whatever it were on the other line, hung up. That's when we decided we'd pick up the board. Not long following this incident is when Aaron had his accident. After Aaron's accident, my friend Megan and I decided we'd try and contact him using the Ouija board. We were in the living room with only candles for lighting. We had a picture of Aaron sitting across from us. We asked, is Aaron there? The board replied, yes. I then asked, how are you doing? The board responded, great. Then before we could ask any further questions, the planchet said stop. We asked stopped what? The board said all. We then asked all of what? Then Megan asked, do you want us to leave you alone? The board replied, yes. We both looked at each other and Megan said, he wants to rest in peace. I agreed, and then we said bye. It then said bye, Brett. Megan said, I love you, Aaron, and the planchet spelled out, I love you too, Megan. We took our hands off the planchet and it moved on to its own by saying goodbye. Needless to say, we both were pretty teary-eyed after that. Thanks for reading. When I was about 17 or 18, I was at a friend's house, a friend who swears to this day her house is haunted. She claims that her and other family members would hear all kinds of sounds, especially when they were alone or if it were an exceptionally quiet night. Something even tried to get in one of the doors once, but when they looked out the window to see who was there, they found nothing, no one. Anyway, this particular night, my friends and I decided to play with a Ouija board. I've never personally ever used one before, and after this incident, will never participate in using one again. The planchet began moving on its own free will, as if that weren't bad enough. We didn't properly close the session, and I swear something evil followed me home that night. I tried to tell my parents about it, but I don't think they believed me. There were nights when I would hear what sounded like a stick being tapped on the walls, circling the whole parameter of my bedroom. I feel that's where this evil entity dwelt because the rest of the house was uneventful. I began having terrible dreams. I would wake up and try to get out of my room as fast as I could, always with some sort of interference preventing me. I woke up once and felt as if I couldn't get out of bed. It was pitch dark, blacker than black that night. I threw my blanket off and tried to find my way to the door. It took me about 10 minutes before I finally found the door handle and light switch. It was as if they had just vanished from my room for that period of time. When I finally got a hold of the handle to the door, for some reason, I couldn't get that door to open for anything. I had to pop my window out and crawl out of the room that way. I had left home for a while. I returned to find my bedroom door wide open and just fine. One night, I also heard something fall in the bathroom next to where I was at. It was very loud. After I finally moved out and in with my boyfriend, who is now my husband, it didn't seem to follow me. 
It continued to stick to only that room of my parents' home. My brother moved into my bedroom after I left, and he too reported unusual occurrences in that room as well, but he seemed to experience more than I did. He was so disturbed by the things happening in his room that he ended up putting all sorts of crosses, religious practices, and even a wooden statue of Christ he got from our pastor all over his room for protection. One day, I went into his room and discovered the top of a statue appeared to be burned. That's when he told me about the weird occurrences happening in his room, including the statue appeared to have smoke coming out of it. Another disturbing thing that happened was that the cross had flipped in an upside down position in the middle of the night. He also claimed he felt as if he were being choked at different times. The same sounds I heard when I stayed in this room, he heard as well. Eventually, a family bought the place for my parents. They had two young girls, ages 11 and 12. I was talking with a friend of mine, and they told me that the new owners swear one of the rooms is haunted. I can only guess what room they were referring to. I have no doubt that whatever we did that night with the Ouija board, whatever was moving that planchet came home with me, and to this day, still dwells in that one room of our old home. Two summers ago, I started working at a camp, a haunted camp. No one has ever shared these stories outside of the camp, and fear might scare campers away. During staff week, I heard talk of ghosts and spirits at the camp, but being a skeptic, I just blew them off. The more I listened, the more real it became. Senior staff members, even the camp director, told stories that chilled me to the bone. On the fourth night of staff week, I was invited to use the Ouija board in the chapel. I'd used one as a child, but assumed it was always just people moving it around. This time was different. You can tell if the Ouija pointer, Planchet, is working, because it floats. If someone is moving it, the pointer will scrape, but it was floating and making no noise. When we asked who it was, it gave three initials. We asked what it did before it died, and it said logging. We took this as logging. The camp used to be used for logging, and a lumberjack was not likely to know how to spell correctly. We asked a few more uninteresting questions that I cannot recall, because I was preoccupied with the rustling I heard nearby. It was the unmistakable sound of footsteps. After about three minutes of hearing footsteps that sounded like they were walking around the chapel and gradually getting louder, oh yeah, the chapel is outside, and it just has a roof and foundation. It is not an enclosed building. We took the message to heed and beat foot out of there. This is my own personal account of a Ouija board experience, but according to another staff member's mother who decided to join me one night, she was shaken back and forth by a spirit and the Ouija board flipped itself over. The last incident of my second summer was in the chapel again. We were playing with the Ouija board again, but this time, we didn't get such a nice spirit. It said nasty things to us, like, kill you and die. It said go or die, so we decided to take the first option and we left. As we were walking away, I looked back and saw a face in the window of the small room connected to the chapel. It was glowing silver. I was about 50 yards away, and I could not make out much except an outline, but my friend saw it too, and it was enough to make us run. Thanks for reading. When I was about 12 years old, I went to my friend's family Halloween party. We were bored, so we went to the garage to see what we could find to do. We found an old Ouija board sitting on the game rack and asked her aunt if we could take it back to my friend's house. She said we could, so we did. When we got there, we went to her room, and shut all the lights off, except a little lamp. We were talking to someone, and I didn't believe that it was moving on its own, and blamed it on my friend. She asked the board to give us a sign that something was there. About two minutes later, her dresser and bed started shaking really hard. It scared us so bad, we put it away. We went to bed an hour later, and put the board under her bed neatly. When we woke up, it wasn't there any longer. We haven't seen the board since. When I was 17, I moved into a two-bedroom unit. Me and my mates made a Ouija board and used it. I feel like it must have opened a gateway for a bad entity. When I moved in the house, it made no noises, but after that, you could feel a bad presence. Wherever this entity would go, the walls and ceiling around it would creak. At night, I would be lying in bed, and I could hear it creaking in the lounge room, and then start to move into my bedroom. 
I would then feel pressure in my bed and a feeling as though something was pushing me down on the bed. It would also turn on things like the fan over the stove and the heater, which was gas. You could physically see the dial move. Also, my mood started to change while I was there. It got to the point where I was too scared to sleep there, so I stayed up at my mom's a lot. She got sick of it, so she took her psychic circle there. My mom has been talking to a spirit called Wayne for years. She talked to the spirit, and it said it didn't want to leave, but with the assistance of the spirit named Wayne, he made it leave. When I returned home, I could feel the entity had gone. Thank you for reading this story. I know it's short, but I hope you appreciate it. First off, I want to say that I've been brought up with stories of ghosts and haunted houses. I live in the South, Louisiana to be exact and tales of the supernatural are nothing new to this area. I have many stories I can share, but the better ones all include my grandma's house. The house is located in a small town called Swords, and my mom would tell me stories of when she was a kid growing up with a ghost that lived there in the house with her and her siblings. The ghost does not have a name. She is only known as the White Lady, since she wears a white dress. My mom told me stories of seeing this white lady many times as a child, but she never was scared of the white lady. She told me she felt as if the ghost was watching over her and her sisters, and that they never felt threatened. She told me she would see the ghost at night, walking in the hallway or on the staircase. Other times she just felt the presence of the ghost. She would be in her room after school doing homework, and she knew someone was in the room watching her. When I was a kid... Going to grandma's was always something special because I would look for this ghost. I remember very well the first time I saw the white lady. I was 14 and my friend Chad was with me in my grandma's. We had just gotten home from school and I had the key to grandma's because that's where I went after school until my mom picked me up when she got off work. Grandma was not there, so Chad and I made ourselves at home. He knew of the stories about the house and was very skeptical. We made some snacks and went into the den to sit and watch TV. The staircase is in full view from the den, and as we watched TV, I felt a presence. Chad felt it too. He claimed it got really cold. I thought it was a draft, so we went into the hallway and checked to see if any windows were open. As we were going to the living room, my eye caught something. I stopped and grabbed Chad's arm. There. At the bottom of the staircase was a figure of a woman. At that moment, she looked at us, and that cold chill went right through me. She proceeded to go up the stairs. I watched her details. Her hand was on the banister, but you could see right through it. She was transparent all the way through her figure, and she looked up as she walked, as if looking for something. Chad and I were literally paralyzed. We watched her not knowing what was going to happen. For a second there, the figure paused, glanced back at us, and then continued walking up, but she never made it to the top. She vanished on the fourth step just before the landing. When she disappeared, Chad ran up the steps. I guess he wanted to catch her? Idiot. He said the spot where she disappeared was so cold. At that point, I wanted to get out of the house. We both grabbed our book bags and ran outside and stayed out on the front porch until my mom came. We told her what happened and she told us not to be scared. This being our first time seeing the spirit, hell yeah we were scared. But mom came in the house with us and we felt better with her there. The second time I saw the white lady was Thanksgiving, 1997. I had not been to grandma's much before then. Things at my house got complicated and I had to take care of things, so there was not much time left for visits. But then, Thanksgiving did roll around, and all of my family came to Grandma's. My mom has ten siblings, so it was quite the event. Grandma has a huge dining room table that seats 24 in the main room of her house. We were all sitting down at dinner, having a good time. I was between my Uncle Kevin and my cousin Joseph. We call him Shacks. People were coming and going through the doors that led to the kitchen and clean out of nowhere. I looked up and I saw a lady wearing white come in from the door on the right and walk from there to the left side of the room, then disappear into the wall. I jumped up, 
I was startled. She had passed right by everyone and right through my Uncle Patrick who was standing by the wine cart. He didn't even flinch. I looked over to my mom. She saw her too, but she put her finger on her mouth, mentioning me to keep quiet. I didn't say anything, but Shags was nudging me under the table. I turned to him, and he whispered to me, Did you see that? I told him yes. After dinner, I was helping Grandma with the dishes, and I told her what I saw. She saw her too, but she said it did not surprise her at all. The white lady likes to show up when there are a lot of people at the dinner table. All she does is walk from one side of the room to the other, then disappear into the wall. But not everyone sees her. That's what I find odd. I told her how she just walked through Pat, and he didn't notice anything. Weird. A number of days later, I found out that only four other people saw her that day in the dining room. My Aunt Jen, my cousin Brad, his girlfriend Ashley, and my aunt's husband Mark. Grandma told me that they phoned her and told her about the white lady. I haven't seen the white lady since that Thanksgiving day. Grandma says she's still around. She had company over this past September. Some friends had come from Florida and stayed the night there. They witnessed the white lady on the staircase disappearing, but something else occurred. Grandma and others are now hearing footsteps and laughter in the upstairs bedroom that is used as a drawing room. I'll have to do some investigating on that one. Thanks for reading. When I was about 13, my father was a professor at a college in California. The campus was built during the 1600s and was originally a Catholic boys' home. There are catacombs where the boys would hide when people came to persecute them. The story goes that one particular night, a well-known Christian hater came to kill the boys. They all went down into the tunnels. One eight-year-old boy got lost and was so scared he hung himself. His body was never recovered. Anyway, back to my personal story. We lived on campus and my father was also a night guard. He had a tendency to get preoccupied with different things and he often didn't get home until an hour after his shift was over. On one particular night he was later than usual. My mother sent me to go check on where he was. The other guard said he was still on the rounds, so I rode my bike around looking for him. I saw a light on in the library. So I parked my bike and went in. The staircase to the aforementioned tunnels, or catacombs, is in the back of the library, off to the left, and there's a cemetery under the staircase. I looked all through the library, and suddenly, the light turned off. A little boy, about eight years old, came running through the door of the staircase, right where another certain eight-year-old's body was rumored to be. Needless to say, I hauled out of there, and I have not gone back in the library since. The first thing I must explain is that I lived in a place where there was a horrible fire in the late 1800s. Across from my house was a cemetery where all of the 800 people that perished in that fire were buried. My best friend had come over, and we were wanting to be alone, so we scampered up to our room. Shortly after that, we began to hear strange noises, like footsteps running up and down our spiral staircase. We yelled to my sister to stop bothering us, but she was nowhere in sight. We closed the door and backed up our trunks against it. While we sat there, a pattern knocking sound began on the wall. An eerie feeling came over us, and we no longer felt safe there. We rushed out of the door, and the room was filled with blue smoke. I never ventured up there alone again. It's strange that everything weird that ever happened, happened in my bedroom, because there was another night I remember vividly. The night I saw a figure dressed in a red and blue checkered smock standing there. She smiled and waved, but then, when I went to touch her, she disappeared. Thank you for letting me share my experience. My friend would love you for it. It's important to be able to share these experiences. I don't think their ghosts were unfriendly, but they sure scared the living daylights out of me. Thanks for reading. This is a story that my mom told me about when my grandma worked as a maid for a rich family in England. The house she worked in was haunted, 
and some really weird things happened there. The most interesting was whenever someone cooked bread in the oven, it would come out smeared with blood. So after that happened several times, they blocked off the kitchen with a wall. Another neat thing happening occurred there. When my grandma woke up in the middle of the night and heard the table being set, but then she found out that no one was up and it was the middle of the night. To make things even more creepier, whenever she was cleaning the third floor and she knew that no one was up there with her, she got the strangest feeling she wasn't alone. One night, a thunderstorm was so loud it woke her up, yet her room was the only one that had the thunder that could be heard. Another night she woke up and her bed was rocking. In the morning, she asked the people who owned the house about it, and they said that her room was once the room of a young boy who became very sick, and every night, his mother would rock him to sleep. Interesting story, and thank you for reading. The story I'm about to tell happened when I was about 15. For the last month or so, when we talked on the telephone, my friend had been telling me that during the middle of the night, when he was in bed, he could hear rocks bouncing off the roof, and this would go on for hours every single night. His parents also heard this and would go outside during the middle in the dark night to find nothing. Needless to say, it kept happening night after night. As time went by, the events got worse. Mr. Knock Knock, as they called him, started knocking on the door in the middle of the night and also during the day, which of course, when they would go to look, nobody was there. At this point, I didn't know if I believed him or not. One time, when I was talking to him on the telephone, I heard a really big boom and he told me, Oh my God, Mr. Knock Knock just knocked the door open. Of course, he went and looked, but as always, nobody was there. This got me excited. I said to him I want to stay over and hear Mr. Knock Knock. Now, I don't know if it was that night, but I did stay over. It was late in the afternoon, and we were in the kitchen, and I made the remark that I wanted to hear Mr. Knock Knock. Right after I said that, boom, on the door. We went outside and found nothing. Finally, they had the police install cameras around the whole house, mostly in the trees, but they never recorded anything. They say that a man many years before hung himself in the shed. The same events went on for a period of time, then they just stopped. I think it was the man who hung himself many years ago. I know it was some spirit, but what it wanted, I don't know. I hope you all enjoyed the story though. Thanks for reading. The following incident is significant because it put me on the path where I am today and it will be important to know when I submit my other stories. On Saturday, Halloween Day, 1992, my friend Debbie and I decided to go to a neighborhooding park in St. Louis, bordering on South Grand and Arsenal for those who hail from there. We'd stop at our favorite donut shop, then went to a little lake we knew of to sit and gossip. There happened to be a wedding photo group there at the same time, so we sat on a bench nearby and critiqued the dresses, etc. I wasn't paying attention to my surroundings, and Debbie and I chattered for about 15 minutes before she got an odd look on her face and whispered to me, What is this? A rumble? I cautiously glanced around and saw several youths drawing up to the lake on various sides. Debbie said, I think it's time we leave. Walk slowly and don't look back at them. We got up and began walking to my car. Some 300 yards off, we got about halfway there when we heard a pop, pop, pop. Being a city girl, it didn't register in my brain what it was at the moment. It sounded like firecrackers. Needless to say, that's not what it was. Get down, she screamed. Before I could react, Debbie had thrown me down on the ground as she was going down herself. I know we were both praying as this occurred. Suddenly, the shooting got louder, and we both realized that there was a gunman firing about three feet behind me, over our heads. The way we were lying on the ground, Debbie could see behind me, and I could see behind her. She told me not to look, so I just kept my head down, 
We heard clicking and cursing. The guy's gun jammed. He ran off. As suddenly as it began, it was over, and all the gang members were running their separate ways. Badly shaken but not hurt, we took off running to my car, jumping in and flooring it to her house a few blocks away. When we were safely inside and slightly more calm than we had been, Debbie said, I just can't believe it. I can't believe it. I was warned about this and I didn't listen. I asked what she meant. She said her father appeared to her in a dream the night before. I don't remember the details exactly, but it was in the kitchen with the back door open. In the dream, he was warning her about some danger and wanted her to be careful. Debbie's father died when she was a teenager. At the time of the occurrence, she was in her late 20s. A weird, though not really scary, closure. At the time of this occurrence, Debbie and I worked together at a local newspaper and our office was based in the basement of City Hall, sharing a room with the office attached to a recorder of deeds. Four ladies worked for the city there and we knew them pretty well. On Monday morning, one of them described how her daughter had come to her on a previous Saturday afternoon and told her of the horrific shootout that occurred at her friend's wedding party in the park near the lake. No one was hurt, but the limo took two slugs in the door and fender. Prior to the shooting, both Deb and I would have long discussions about the afterlife, ghosts, and etc. And we are both believers in the power of the mind and spirit. But this experience set me on a path of dealing with spirits that I still encounter today. These will be submitted for your approval at a later date. Back in 1986, when my daughter was three years old, she was playing in her bedroom and I was watching all my children on television when all of a sudden she came out of her room asking me to tell the man to leave her alone. Startled because she and I were the only ones in the house at the time, I said what man? She said the man in my room, he keeps talking to me. So I got up and went into the room and looked for this man. In fact, I decided to look all over the house for this man and could not even find him. I then made sure all the doors and windows were locked, and I told my daughter that there is no man in the house, so she went back to play. About 10 minutes later, she came back into the living room and announced, tell the man to leave me alone. This time I freaked out and told her, Dana, there is no man in the house. I looked everywhere for him. I do not see anyone here. And she replied to me, he's right here. I asked, where? and she pointed to the hallway, and she acted like she was holding someone's hand. I asked, what are you doing? She replied, he just wants to say hi to you. Incredulous and open mouth, I asked, me? What happened next sent chills down my spine. My three-year-old daughter walked with this man to the wall as if she was still holding his hand. I asked her, what does this man want from you? She said, he says he loves you. I asked her for the man's name, and she simply replied, Monk. Almost in shock, I got out, what did you say? She looked up at this man and said, as if to the air, what did you say your name was? And then she once again looked back at me and said, Monk. I asked her several times if the man's name was Monk, and every time she said yes. But then I was freaking out because my grandfather's nickname was Monk. Still not believing, I told her this isn't funny and she said, he just wanted me to tell you he loves you and he wanted to say hi. I asked her to describe him and then he described my grandfather to a T. You see, my grandfather died in 1969 in Illinois when I was four years old. It was so long ago, there is no way my three-year-old could possibly have known this. He couldn't have even seen what he looked like because he did not have any pictures of him until 1991. That was the only time my child had an encounter, but what encounter it was. And I'm left to scratch my head thinking if it was actually my grandpa or not. I'd like to think it was, but at the time, it was so terrifying not knowing who this person was at the moment. Wasn't it a intruder? Was it someone else? But no, it was my grandfather checking in on me to see if I was okay. 
what a man he was. A former associate and friend told me this once. Her parents once lived in Lee Master, a little hollow in Buchanan County. While they lived there, they could hear a baby crying outside. When they went out on the porch, it would stop. But as soon as they went back in, it would start again. This went on for a long time, until one day, a bunch of young boys were digging in the dirt, playing with their trucks and such, when they happened upon an old buried jar. After further inspection by the children and my friend's father, they found it contained the remains of a baby submerged in alcohol to keep it in good condition. Turns out, a young girl had once lived in the area and had a miscarriage. Instead of having a proper funeral, she put it in the alcohol and buried it afterwards. After the discovery by the children, the crying stopped, the baby found peace, and all was quiet again. Thanks for the short read. I was 10 years old at the time, now 27, and my mother, sister, who was 8 at the time, and I had just moved into a basement level apartment. The place was very dark and gloomy, as most basements are, I imagine. It had only two bedrooms, a small eating kitchen that adjoined the living area, a small hallway that led to the bedrooms and bath. I can still remember the fact that it only had three windows and one set of sliding glass doors in the dining area that allowed any natural light in. One window was in the living room, one in the room that my sister and I shared, and one small window in our mom's room. Like I said, very dark and gloomy. We had only lived there a few weeks when at first, only my sister was noticing weird things. Since our mother worked full time, and I was bused across town to a different school than my sister, she would arrive at the apartment first in the afternoons. She would later tell me about the noises she heard and the strange channel she saw darting around the corner of her eyes. I clearly remember one afternoon when I arrived home, which was about an hour after she did, only to discover my sister huddled up on the top of the steps that led down to our front door. She had her arms wrapped around her drawn-up legs, her head lowered to her knees, and she was shaking and rocking back and forth. It was obvious that she was terrified. I asked her what was wrong, and all she did was point down the stairs. Curiously, I walked down and started towards our door. I noticed absolutely nothing out of the ordinary. I marched back up the steps to ask her what was wrong with her, Finally, she related this to me. When she came home from school, she walked down to our door, only to find it standing wide open. She knew I wasn't home yet, and neither was her mom. She would have seen her car out front. She walked slowly to the open doorway and peered into the living room, at which time she says the chairs in the dining room table all flew away from it simultaneously, and what sounded like all the kitchen cabinets and drawers slammed shut, their contents rattling from the force. She said she saw the chairs move, but nobody was in the apartment. She then said she was so scared that she dropped her books, let the door standing wide open, and ran up the stairs and sat there until I arrived. I explained that she must have imagined it all, as the door was closed and I saw no books in the hallway. She swore it happened exactly like she said, but I was still skeptical. So me, being the older, wiser, and therefore fearless one, I pressured her into going back down there with me. I mean, we had to go in sooner or later, right? I unlocked the door and slowly opened it, while my sister hid behind me, clinging to me like a cheap sweater. Lo and behold, gasp, everything was as it should be, with the exception of my sister's school books, all piled neatly on the coffee table. The chairs were where they should be, and nothing was amiss in the kitchen. Needless to say, I didn't believe a word my sister told me. That was until I saw the shadow man. A few weeks after finding my sister cowering on the steps, I bought a Walkman radio and some cassettes. We're talking early 80s here, to go with it. That night, I decided to listen to my Walkman after my sister and mom went to bed. I believe it was around 11 p.m. when I started getting the distinct feeling that I was being watched from the open doorway to our room. I don't know why, but I was instantly afraid. I just knew it wasn't my mom. So, since I was lying on my back, 
All I had to do was turn my head in the direction of the doorway and find out if anyone was there or not. I turned the Walkman off and waited, lying stiff as a board and holding my breath, just waiting to hear anything unusual. I was still getting the impression that someone was in the doorway staring at me, but I was too terrified to look. I just knew that I wouldn't like seeing who was there, and now I was certain that there was somebody there. Finally, I got the nerve to slowly turn my head towards the door. To my absolute horror, there was a man standing there. I had never been so scared in all my life. I didn't dare to move or make a sound, or even breathe for that matter. I just kept my eyes glued to the doorway. That's when I noticed that I could see right through it. Before I could really panic, it occurred to me that it must be a shadow of someone that was standing out at street level. I rationalized that the street lights were casting the shadow into the hallway, through the window that was in our room. I was starting to calm myself down and decided to prove my theory by turning around and looking at the window that was behind me. As soon as I did, panic assailed me all over again. There was no shadow on the sheer curtains, nothing but the soft glow of the street light in the parking lot. I immediately looked back to the doorway, hoping and praying desperately that the figure would be gone. It was still there, only now it appeared darker, but I could still make up the thermostat for the heating and the air on the wall through it. It also seemed to be projecting a seriously negative feeling. I don't understand why I felt that, but I did, and I was definitely terrified. It made no movement whatsoever, and I was able to really look at it. It appeared to be a man wearing a long trench coat and a fedora-style hat. It reminded me of a Dick Tracy kind of character, if you know what I mean. All this was in outline with no other distinguishing features. No face, hands, or feet for that matter, and it seemed to hover in one spot. I didn't know what to do at this point, and it seemed an eternity had passed since I noticed its presence. It occurred to me then that I didn't hear my sister snoring, which was a usual thing for her to be doing, hence the reason I had bought the Walkman. I figured she had to be awake, so I whispered her name. Imagine my disbelief when she responded, and I could tell she was terrified too. I couldn't blame her one bit. After all, the foot of her bed was only three feet from the doorway and it. I whispered to her, do you see it? Yes, she hissed and then started whimpering. We have to get out of here. On the count of three, we run as fast as we can to mom's room. So much for me being the fearless one. She didn't want to, but I wasn't staying, that was for sure. Our escape would mean running through the thing, but at that point, I didn't see any other options. I counted the three, bounded off the bed, grabbed my sister from her bed, and we were both screaming and running hellbent for leather from my mom's room down the hall. We jumped into the bed with her. She was already sitting up, having heard us screaming. I don't recall what she said, or what we even told her. It seems I just passed out from the fright. My mom didn't ask us about what had happened the next day, and my sister, nor myself, brought it up then. Maybe my mom didn't need to ask. Who knows? We never saw the shadow man after that, thank God. As it happened, we moved out shortly thereafter. I don't think it was a coincidence either. Our lease wasn't up until six more months. I didn't complain, and neither did my sister. We never spoke of it until I brought it up to her during a phone conversation in 1996 when I was telling her about my new haunted house. I'll send some of those stories later. We were both surprised that the other remembered the incident so clearly. After all those years, the details of that night were still very clear to the both of us. This was my very first ghostly encounter. I hope you enjoyed it. It's exactly how I remember it. And of course, I could never forget the Shadow Man. This event happened while I was back in Pine Ridge, visiting family. In Pine Ridge, there is no rhyme or reason to where cemeteries are placed. There are numerous little cemeteries on hilltops and mixed in with the various homes. Then there is a main cemetery behind Red Cloud School where lots of weird stuff happens there as well. I don't go back to visit very often, 
And because of this, I'm not nearly as superstitious as the locals when it comes to hanging around cemeteries. One of the superstitions which I found out the hard way is the real deal, is to never go around a graveyard at dusk and be careful who you talk to or see in the cemetery. By my cousin's house is a cemetery within walking distance, on a small hill that looks over the street that she lives on. I don't actually know anybody buried in the cemetery, since all of my family is buried in either Red Cloud Cemetery or St. Anne Cemetery. At the time of this story, my cousins both had small daughters, and they would come by and visit often. My cousin had mentioned that he had gone up to the cemetery on the hill one evening to clean the area up a little, and while he was there, he saw an old woman dressed in black, standing by an older grave, crying. He didn't recognize her and walked up closer to see if she was alright. He approached her, and when she turned around, she only had eyes but no face. My cousin was very scared and hightailed it out of there. What he didn't realize was he brought a visitor back with him. After this happened, my aunt started hearing things in the house, and small objects would be moved around. They figured someone had come down from the cemetery. My aunt is a kind of new ager, so she didn't find this to be upsetting. She just accepted it. While I was there one day during broad daylight, I was sitting in the living room and I saw a little girl walking down the hall and she walked into the bedroom. I'd been there only a couple of days, so I thought it was one of my two cousins' little daughters. I wondered if my cousins had pulled up and she had come into the house. So I called out and then got up and looked Nobody was there. I went to my aunt and asked if my cousins and their kids were there. She said no. I then told her, well, some kid just walked down the hallway. Turns out, it was the little dead girl from the graveyard. I was really freaked out because after that, she started making her presence more known. For instance, I would wake up in the middle of the night and the bedroom light would be on. The door would be open. I would shut it and it would open up back again. Weird stuff like that. Needless to say, I didn't sleep well until I left. This story happened when I was 18 years old. My friend Chris had just moved to Reno, Nevada, about 30 miles north of Carson City, into her first apartment. This apartment was a regular run-of-the-mill one-bedroom apartment. Nothing special and within the budget of someone just getting out of high school. When Chris was moving in with the help of a boyfriend and some other friends, there was still some junk in the apartment from the previous tenant. You know when you first move into a place, there are little scraps of paper, pins, buttons, etc. Especially in the closets and stuff? Well, while they were cleaning up, they found a driver's license. It was a guy's license, and he was over 21. We all know where this is headed, right? Anyway, Chris's then boyfriend, who was under 21, figured this was a real lucky find. He could use it to go out and get into the clubs and go drinking in the casinos. We all had false IDs back then, but having an unaltered license was the best. Chris got moved into the apartment, and initially, everything was going great. But then she started to notice some odd things happening in and around her apartment. For starters... Whenever she would come home, the light in the walk-in closet would be on. At first, she just thought that she had left it on when she was getting dressed. But after a few more times, when she was sure that she had turned it off, and then it was on, she started getting a little freaked out about it. After this had gone on a while, the window in her bedroom would also be found open. She even went so far as to lock and nail it shut. Sure enough, she got back from work, and it was open. Small things also began to be misplaced and then show up somewhere else in the apartment. Finally, one night Chris, her boyfriend, and a group of friends went out to a club called the Premier Club in Reno. When they were standing at the door, waiting to get in, the bouncer was of course doing the prequisite ID checks. When the bouncer got to Chris's boyfriend who had used this ID already numerous times before, he took a look, stopped, and then got really angry. He kept saying over and over, this isn't you, this is not you. And of course, Chris's boyfriend started to sweat the load, 
because he thought for sure he had somehow been found out. He tried to bluff, saying yes it was him, but the bouncer only stared back at him and said, I know this guy, and repeated, this isn't you. As it turns out, the young man who the ID did belong to was the one that was found in Chris's closet. Not long before, he had hung himself in that same very closet and was found dead there. Needless to say, Chris moved out of the apartment pronto. Anyone who has ever served in the Navy has certainly heard a ghost story or two. Although deaths in peacetime on board naval ships is rare, it does occasionally happen, usually due to mishaps or suicide. And, although rare, murders occur as well. This particular ship was a destroyer, and this destroyer was haze gray and underway most times. When a ship is underway, one must perform their usual duties, plus collateral duties, and stand various watches. The watches that can be the longest are when you are standing out on the ship, somewhere at night in the middle of the ocean. There had been various rumors aboard this particular ship that people saw someone walking around the ship in places that they didn't belong and when challenged would simply disappear. One night, a friend of mine had the watch. It was around 1am or so and he was standing out by the fantail after having walked around and was having a smoke. He was of course still looking around, but in the middle of the night, there isn't anyone to see. Suddenly, he saw a shape that was darker than the rest of the dark, standing silhouetted by the tower area of the ship. This was an area that a person wouldn't have any business being in at that time of night. So my friend D yelled out, Hey, you up there! He expected for someone to yell back down. Instead, the person ran straight up the side of the tower and onto the radar equipment. There is no way that a real person could have done this. It had the outline of a man and was the same size as a shipmate would be. Once he reached the top of the tower, he just vanished. My friend D came back down after his watch and started talking about the weird crap he just saw. And of course, that's when the other story started rolling in. Turns out, at times, sound-powered phones through the ship would ring, even if they weren't in use at the time. Even the phones on board the ship, which are usually out of service when the ship is underway, would ring. If someone picked the phone up, they would just hear static and silence. Other men reported that they had seen a man walking around corners and disappearing from the passageways before anyone could catch up with them. Others had also seen the sailor out on various parts of the ship at night. But did someone die on board? Chances are, somewhere along the line someone has. But who was this? No one ever did find out. The first story I told you about my house in Spur was the first time that anything strange had ever happened there, but it sure wasn't the last. First, I think I should give you a little background information. When I lived in Spur, I was married to a guy named Gary. He died of a major heart attack in November of 1991. I lived in the house until June of 1992. During those eight months, my house became what I would like to call very lively. This story isn't really scary, but it does prove that not all ghosts have to be terrifying. When my husband died, I was devastated. For the first time in my life, I wasn't sure if I could go on or if I even wanted to. I cried constantly. Everything I saw or heard always seemed to remind me of him. About two weeks after he died, I sent my daughter Trina to my mother's house for the night. I hadn't been alone even once since Gary's death and I felt that I needed the time alone. I knew I would most likely spend most of the evening crying again and I knew my poor daughter needed a break from my crying. I had to get my grief under control for my daughter's sake, and I hoped that by being alone, I might be able to come to terms with my feelings and so on. I watched TV for a while, cleaned the house, and ate a small luncheon for supper. It had been three hours and I still didn't cry. I was proud of myself for that. I started to get tired, so I turned off all the lights and laid on the couch. I tried hard to resist it, but the tears came anyways. 
I was crying harder then than ever before. It hurt so bad that I began to imagine a way to make it stop hurting. I thought if I could go to sleep and never wake up, I could be with him again. Suddenly, a cool breeze, not a cold one, just a cool one, seemed to drift across my face, and with it came the scent of Gary's favorite cologne. I sat up on the couch and scanned the room, thinking that it was going to appear, and all of this had just been a terrible nightmare. I saw nothing, but I could smell his cologne even stronger. My heart began to race, and I knew that it was there with me. Then I noticed that it felt like somebody had just sat down next to me because the couch springs seemed to groan a little, and I knew it wasn't me because I hadn't moved. The funny thing was, I wasn't scared. For the first time since his death, I felt safe, and I knew I would be okay. I leaned back against the couch and just let what I knew was Gary comfort me with his presence. I cried, and I told him how much I loved him and missed him. I remember thinking how wonderful it would be to be in his arms once more. Incredibly enough, I felt what seemed like someone putting their arms around me very gently. I can remember feeling so happy and contented. I closed my eyes and fell asleep in my husband's arms. When I awoke the next morning, I faced the day with new hope and a happiness inside that I hadn't felt in a long time. I knew he wanted me to go on for my daughter's sake. I remember telling him that I would survive for our child. I finally felt like I could let him go, and I told him that before I went to pick up Trina, the only thing was, Gary never really left. Many other things happened that I knew was him, but I didn't mind. It was comforting to know that he was always there with me. Not all the things that happened in the house were good, though. Some were downright mean and cruel. I know that Gary would never be so mean and cruel, so I can only assume that there was another presence there in my house. But that's another story. As a child, I had a very creative mind and have grown up to be a fairly competent artist. However, even an endless imagination couldn't have prepared me for the encounters I had at 8 years old, and the events had been burned into my mind. It was 1974, and my family had just moved from Quantico, Virginia. My dad was a Marine officer to Camp Pendleton Marine Corps based in California into a two-story duplex. Just about the time it got settled in, my paternal grandfather was murdered. A few months later, my mom's parents visited. Since we had a big family, a few of us kids were delighted to give up our beds for visiting family. Pappy got my bed, and I was relocated to my brother's bunk bed. Mark and I didn't get along, so I slept on the bottom with Daniel, with my head at the foot of the bed. At about 4 a.m., the first night, something awakened me. I didn't think anything about it and started to sleep again. However, I felt as if someone was watching me. Then I could hear very heavy breathing and felt a downward draft on my face. Scared out of my mind, I squinted my eyes and saw a hulking black figure looking like the Grim Reaper without bones, hovering over me as if staring into my eyes. I tried to ignore it, but it wouldn't go away. I even snored, but it still didn't leave. Thinking that a little movement might disrupt the nightmare, I moved towards the center of the bed, but I didn't wake up, and the tormentor continued to breathe on my face, moving around the bed and laying down beside me. Immediately, I leapt from the bed and screamed at the top of my lungs, It's got me! It's got me! Everyone in the family came running to see what had happened, commenting that a dark figure had disappeared in the hallway to the bedroom. Needless to say, I didn't sleep the rest of the night. What's worse, that black fiend and his lot continued to haunt me, the family, and the neighbors for years. I resorted to sleeping with an adult very close by, as often as I was allowed, Otherwise, encounters like the following were a nightly ritual. If I ever turned my head from the hallway light, which was left on for my security, the fiend shadow would appear and he would start panting like he'd just run a 26-mile race. Sometimes, he'd hide behind the door or in a closet. 
Sometimes, the whole family would hear chains dragging across the floor or glass breaking downstairs. One night it sounded as if plungers were being walked up and down the stairs. By this time, I had mustered enough courage to investigate the sounds and saw nothing in the stairwell. Perhaps the scariest moment was the night I heard the hideous, angry laughter. As usual, something had awakened me, and I sat there wondering what to expect. Suddenly, I heard a commotion from downstairs, followed by laughter that could have come from the movie Sybil or The Exorcist. First it was one voice, then it was two, as if they were running around the first floor. Then they stopped. Suddenly, the first one started again, and I could hear it coming from up the stairs. It entered the hallway, ran to the bedroom, and brushed up against me, passing into the wall. Then the second voice started, but I didn't lie in bed waiting for it. I ran straight to my parents' room. Another time, one of our cousins came to visit, and it was decided that he and I would share a bed. Sometime that night, I was awakened to see the outline of a goat's head on my mom's wardrobe. It was kept in my room, with a bright ring in its nose and spiraling, fiery horns. As I screamed, it went away. Finally, one night, I'd had enough of the crap from whatever was haunting me. He had decided to inhabit the corner behind my bedroom door, just staring and breathing towards me. I sat up and said, in the name of Jesus, leave me alone. Guess what? It stopped. I've never seen that thing again. And every day, I thank God for the relief. However, all the haunting hadn't stopped. As recently as 1988, I've been harassed by a paranormal phenomenon. Even though we moved across the country, at times, I would wake up being dragged by my feet off the bed. I also asked my parents if they had noticed my old bunk bed, the one from California, would sometimes shake and squeak as if a couple were going at it. My dad confided that, when I was young, the bed would often make lots of noise, sometimes when I was asleep on it, which would explain why I was often awake in the middle of the night. He bolted out of his room, swearing someone was harming one of his boys, only to find us all sleeping soundly. He also said the neighbors in California, the Martins, shared similar experiences to what I'd had. The past 11 years have been pretty uneventful, paranormally, and I hope it stays that way. A few nights before the big production at my high school, the director was staying after school to work on the set's final touches. She was alone on stage when suddenly a single long blonde hair fell from above. She thought to herself, hmm, must have been Stephanie's. Yeah, it must have stuck in the light fixture when she was working on it. Still, Miss Holton couldn't shake the somewhat eerie feeling that crept around her neck. She'd had this feeling ever since the beginning of rehearsals. The next day, Miss Holton went to visit a friend in hers in the school. Elizabeth, I had the strangest thing happen last night. I was staying after, and when I was on stage, when this long piece of hair from the ceiling fell. Was it long blonde? Asked Elizabeth. Yes, why? It must have been Julie's, Elizabeth said in an eerie tone. Who's Julie? You mean you haven't heard of Julie before? Back in 1974, the drama department decided to put Romeo and Juliet for the spring production. Julie was a tall, beautiful blonde senior who was talented in every way. She was determined to get the part of Juliet. Auditions came around. And sadly, Julie didn't make the cut. She was outraged. She told the director... If he didn't give her the part, she would die. Simply die. If I don't get the part, Julie told him, I'll kill myself. Of course, no one took her seriously. And a few months later, Romeo and Juliet opened up. The first night, Julie was there, sitting directly in the middle of the house, staring angrily at Juliet. She didn't laugh or cry. When the play was over, she got up and left. 
Juliet went to the house manager and told him. My God, Julie was giving me the creeps. She just kept staring at me. Her friend comforted her and told her not to worry about it. No, she's just jealous, that's all. She won't come back the next night. But Julie came back again. She sat in the center of the house, neither laughing or crying, just glaring at Juliet. Once again, Juliet went to the house manager and told him, She was here again, Jared. She just kept staring at me. Now, I mean it. If she comes tomorrow, give her a different seat. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Sure I will. Whatever you say. Sunday was the final night, and sure enough, Julie showed up. Somehow, she got the same seat and glared at poor Juliet. When the show was over, she got up and left. The house closed, and the teachers began to knock down the set. They left a ladder center stage and a rope hanging from one of the pipes. Sometime in the middle of the night, Julie broke into the theater and climbed the ladder. She hitched a rope around her neck and hung herself. On Monday morning, she was found by a teacher. She was dead and bloated. And that is Julie's story. Elizabeth completed the story and asked, What play were you originally going to do anyway? Miss Holton gulped. Romeo and Juliet. Juliet's haunted our theater since the night of her untimely death. Sometimes she makes props disappear. Other times she makes the noise of a chair being thrown down. Of course, no one will find the invisible person whose pranks, or are they warnings, scare them. Her footsteps simply ring in the empty halls. One thing is for certain, though. We know Julie had come to visit. It all started when I was about eight years old. My family and I moved into a rented house in Haltom City, Fort Worth, Texas. This house was not really all that old. Maybe built in the 50s. That's a guess. Anyway, moving in, I was outside in the front yard playing, and two neighbor boys came out and started talking to me. Eventually, I went to the house to visit and got to know these prospective new friends. While inside, I was standing in a particular spot in their kitchen when one of the boys looked at the other and then at me and says, I wouldn't stay in there if I were you. Curious, I asked, why not? And the boy replied, because there was a ghost in that very spot one time. Needless to say, I jumped right off that spot and went outside. Then I was curious. I started asking these guys about their ghost, and they told me that their aunt and little cousin had come to visit them, and while they were in the kitchen talking and catching up, the little boy was running around in the house playing. A little bit later, the little boy walked into the kitchen and stood next to his mom. His mom, noticing him out of the corner of her eye, went to place her hand on his shoulder, and her hand passed right through him. She jumped back aghast and looked at the little boy. The kid just looked up at her, and then all the other adults in the kitchen, one by one, then vanished. And about that time, the little boy came running down the hall, screaming like something was chasing him. As a kid, that story frightened me quite a bit. But then they proceeded to tell me that they would be sitting watching TV, and the channel would change, or the volume would go up full blast all of a sudden. And sometimes, their front door will swing wide open with the deadbolt still poking out, as if it passed right through the door or something. The boys I was chatting with had an older sister. She was about 17 or 18 years old. And one night, she was asleep, and she distinctly felt someone grab her by her arms firmly and lift her into the air and start banging her into the window like it was trying to toss her out. Of course, she woke up terrified and started screaming at the top of her lungs. When her parents burst into her room and turned the light on, it dropped her and disappeared. It was never visible, but left right then. The next day, I saw the bruise marks on her arms that were shaped like someone with large hands had been squeezing them very hard. At the time, I was too scared to ever go into the house, but at the same time, I felt like they may be pulling my leg and making up these stories. That is, 
until one day, my parents were outside talking to these boys' parents, and they told my folks the same stories that they told me. To top it off, they said to my parents, some very strange things have happened in your house too, but we'd rather not talk about that. And they never told my folks what happened in our house. I'll send in another story soon. I don't know why, but I've always had experiences ever since I can remember. The experiences have been from ghostly encounters too. Well, I'd rather let you decide what the others are. I guess the reason why I draw these things towards me and others around me is that my awareness is higher than most people or that I'm just lucky. All my life, I felt things that I cannot explain. I'll visit a new place with my family or go on a school field trip and things will happen, or they just happen at my home. I've had very pleasant experiences, and then there were the scariest kinds. I'll tell you a few of the scary ones. Massachusetts is a very old state, with a lot of very old homes, and that's why haunted tales are not unusual. But no matter how many experiences people have or tell, no one seems to believe them. I will say that all of my stories are true, Believe them or not, that's your choice. By the summer before my 8th grade in junior high, my family, mom, grandmother, and myself moved into a new house. Ever since I can remember, things would move around on my bedroom dresser. I have crystal vases, boxes, etc. I would go downstairs and realize that I forgot something and all the things on my dresser would have been moved completely to the other side of the dresser. Since I was the only child at the time, my grandmother was downstairs and my mother would be at work. I knew it was a ghost. However, it wasn't threatening, so I didn't think about it too much. I just let it do what it wanted to. About three years later, I experienced something very scary. I had a friend from school sleep over my house, and that evening, I saw someone in my room. I awoke from sleeping. I was on the floor in a sleeping bag, and my friend was in my bed. I thought my grandmother was in my room. I saw a figure pacing back and forth in front of my bed. Again, I thought it was my grandmother, so I called out to her. I thought she was just checking to make sure we had enough blankets, etc. But when it finally turned to look at me, I realized it wasn't her. It was a medium-sized man, dressed in black, with a long black cape and a hood over his head, and the whitest face I had ever seen. And one more thing, I swear that he had a mark on his face in black, similar to the letter Z. After I saw this, I turned to my friend and started yelling at my friend to wake up. When she finally did, I told her to look, and of course he wasn't there. She told me that I was imagining it and to go back to sleep. The next morning, we both went downstairs and I told my family what I had seen. They all laughed at me, but I was serious and my mother told me she believed me. About a week later, I was on the phone with another friend of mine, Shelly. We were talking about what we had been up to. She told me that last weekend... She and some of our friends went out at the end of the evening for a drive to a nearby cemetery. She said the three of them got out to walk around the graveyard, but she stayed behind in the car to wait. She said that when she was waiting for the others to come back, she saw this man coming towards the car at her. She then proceeded to tell me that she was never so scared in her life. She started to freak out. She quickly leaned over all of the seats of the car to make sure the car door was locked, and when she looked up, the man was still walking towards her in the car. She then described the man to me on the phone, and she described him to the T as the man that I saw in my room that same weekend. I was speechless on the phone and just listened to her story. I didn't tell her about my visit from the man, who I called the Z-Man. About a month passed after that, and I finally told her my story. She was shocked and thought I was making it up. I told her I wanted to tell her that night she called me, but I was so scared that I just couldn't. Two months passed towards the end of the summer. Shelly and I and some of our friends went to the drive-in theater. She and I had to go to the restroom. 
As we waited in line, we turned to look on the wall and saw, written black, was the Z-Man is coming. We then both looked at each other and ran out of there as fast as we could. All I know is that it was evil, and I didn't want to find out if he or it was coming again or not. I haven't saw this man since 1989, or at least not that I can remember, but nor do I want to. Then again, I live in Florida now, and maybe that could be a reason why he hasn't made an appearance. Thanks for reading. It all happened when I was at my old house, which was a rather smallish farmhouse. There I lived with my mother, father, and 17-year-old brother. I was always a little suspicious, but not greatly into anything like ghosts in any big way or manner. Little things would always happen around the house, things like books falling off shelves, vases, etc. But no one really took any particular notice. Everyone else in my family simply blamed it on the old house's feeble foundation. But me being a little sus, I always came to the same conclusion, that it had to be a ghost and that the house was truly and purely haunted, especially since someone died in the old place about 10 years before we moved in. And well, that would give you the creeps, right? Well, it did a righteous turn for me, I assure you. I'm not quite sure how the person died. No one ever talked about it. Anyway, my brother used to love attempting to scare me. He would jump out at me all the time and go running past my door and screaming boo, Stupid, immature things like that. But one day, I was in my room, lying on my bed, just glancing at my door that was wide open. My brother was in his bedroom, right next to mine. I could tell this because his music was turned right up. My father was at work and my mother was, well, I didn't have a clue as to where she was. I thought she was in the kitchen. So, I was staring at my door in the middle of the day, when suddenly, a shadow whisked past my door. It appeared about the half the size of a human being and seemed to almost float. I thought it was just my brother playing tricks on me, as if he had just ran past my door and was squatting to make himself look short. So I called out to him, very funny ads, very funny. I looked at the door again, and once again, the thing ran past my door in the opposite direction heading towards my parents' room to the back of the house. This time, I was freaked, but I still believed, or wanted to believe, that it was my brother fooling around. So I ran into his room to find it unbelievably empty. So, I ran back into my room and looked out my window. And there, out the front of our five-acre block, was my mother and brother doing some gardening. I ran out the front and accused my brother of being stupid, and he had no idea whatsoever what was going on. My mother became suspicious, and we all went back into the house together. We searched the house from front to back, finding absolutely nothing to blame. Strange things kept happening around the house. We soon moved, thank God. Now that we've moved house into town, we only just found out that one of the houses around the corner where we used to live was also supposed to be haunted. Apparently, once a whole bookshelf fell over, almost crushing the owner of the house for no apparent reason. The world is weird, but we definitely are not alone. When my husband and I were first married, some 29 years ago, he took me to Columbus, Ohio to meet his family. His mother lived on West 2nd Avenue, and his sister and her family lived across the street from her. Tootie, my husband's sister, was a nice, friendly person, and we got along great from day one. She and her family lived in a big old house that, like many other old houses, had been divided into two apartments, one upstairs and one down. Tootie and her family lived in the downstairs apartment. My husband and I were staying with his mother, but we visited Tootie and her family every day. Several times during the visits, I heard the front door open. The two apartments shared a common front door and foyer, then each had their own individual doors to the apartments, footsteps going up the stairs to the other apartment, and then what sounded like people moving around up there. I found nothing strange about this, as I was not familiar with the house or its occupants. 
Then one night, Tootie, her three children and I were alone in her apartment. She was in the kitchen fixing supper while I kept an eye on the kids who were watching TV in the living room. Again, I heard the outside door open, someone going up the stairs and the door to the other apartment open and close. About that time, Tootie called the kids and me to supper. During the course of conversation over supper, I asked her who lived in the upstairs apartment. No one, she said. That apartment has been empty since we moved here three years ago. I felt the blood draining from my face because I knew that someone had been going up there all week and was, in fact, up there at the moment we were talking. My first thought was that someone was up to no good and that they were using the empty apartment as a base. Tootie was looking at me strangely. Someone is up there, I said. I heard them go up there a while ago. That's impossible, Tootie replied. The only other person with a key to that apartment besides myself. The landlord had given her a key so she could check on the other apartment from time to time. Is the landlord, and he's out of town this week. At that moment, we all heard heavy footsteps plodding down the hallway upstairs. The hallway led down a block flight of stairs, which ended at a door, which was kept locked at all times, that opened into Tootie's apartment. The footsteps were headed for that door. Badly frightened, we all jumped up from the table. Call the police, I screamed. I'll call Ted's, her husband's brother, she said. He lives just two houses down the street and can get here before the police. Tootie's brother-in-law and a friend that happened to be visiting him arrived within minutes of her frantic call. Tootie gave them the key to the apartment, and they just went upstairs with flashlights. There was no electricity on in the upstairs apartment to check things out. Tootie, the kids, and I sat huddled in the kitchen, expecting the man to yell, call the police at any moment, but nothing happened. Then, we heard footsteps coming down the stairs to the door that led into the kitchen. There they stopped. We thought it was Tootie's brother-in-law and his friend, and Tootie called out to him. There was no answer. A few minutes later, Tootie's brother-in-law and his friend came down the stairs via the door in the kitchen and called for Tootie to let them in. They had seen or heard nothing, they said, and had been through the whole apartment. They probably thought we were two hysterical women who had spooked each other, but we knew what we had heard. Tootie said that after that night, the footsteps and banging doors in the upstairs apartment got so bad that she eventually moved out, even though her apartment was a really nice place. She moved across the street to the house where her mother had lived and stayed there for the next 10 years. People moved in and out of the downstairs apartment in her old house at an alarming rate, and no one ever stayed long. Strangely enough, no one ever rented the upstairs apartment, even though it was a nice place. About 10 years after this incident, a strange odor started permeating the air on West 2nd Avenue. It smelled like something dead. Everyone up and down the street assumed that some large animal, a dog maybe, had crawled into the basement of a house and died. Eventually, they decided the odor was coming from the house that Tootie had lived in. The police were called to investigate, and they found the body of Tootie's former landlord, you guessed it, in the upstairs apartment. One has to wonder if the entity that haunted the place had anything to do with the old man's death. I certainly hope not. I hope he died a peaceful death, but the police said a pure look of terror was frozen on his face when they found his decomposing body in that awful apartment. Thanks for reading. Last year in the month of June, my twin sister Kelly decided that she didn't want to be on this earth anymore. We were both 20 years old, and I knew at that time she was going through a depressed state. Being her closest sister, I could sense her depression first off before anyone, but just thought it was friends, or maybe that she wasn't feeling well. Her mood swings were affecting mom and dad, and they were concerned if she was sick or worried about anything that she could tell them, but she didn't let anyone know her reasons for being moody. Two months before she died, she started writing in a journal. It wasn't a daily journal, but she entered things in it that were occurring in her life, or about how she was feeling. One of her entries captured my attention. She wrote about a 22-year-old man by the name of David and his visits to her. At first, I thought it was someone she was seeing that none of us knew about. But as I read on, she mentioned that David was a ghost, but he didn't scare her. 
She went on about how she came to visit her when she was alone in her room and when she was asleep. His presence was always willed because he would touch her lightly on her hair or on her shoulder, and it would be a very cold feeling. Kelly went on to say that this only happened in her room. At first when I read the story, I was a little frightened that this was happening in our house, but then Kelly wrote that David was a gentle spirit that kept her company, and she became very attached to him after some time. Then her depression set in. She didn't want to live anymore and go through the hassles of being an adult with all the responsibilities involved. I always knew she wanted life to be handed to her on a silver platter and that she was never one to be realistic. She just ignored the important things in life and went on. She entered into her journal that life was boring and that she didn't have the same direction or goals that I had. We were identical twins but had totally different personalities. I cried when I read that because... I would have always tried to help her if she was sad. I wish I had been a better sister to her during her depressed time, and I get mad at myself for not being persistent enough to have helped her. Kelly's last entry was two weeks before she died, and it said that life with David would be more happier for her. She would plan her departure to be with David soon, and she hoped that everyone would understand what she was going through and that this is what she wanted to do. I've never understood why she killed herself, and neither has anyone else. The reason why she died is just too bizarre to understand. On December 10th, at about 11pm, I was closing all the windows and locking the doors in our house before I went to bed. Mom and Dad had gone away for a couple of days for a break from work, and Mom still had not gotten over Kelly's death, so I was the only one at home as I was securing the house when I heard the sounds of someone running up the stairs in laughter. My heart started pounding as I knew no one was in the house except for me. I wasn't sure what to do, so I grabbed one of mom's kitchen knives and started up the stairs. Then the running footsteps vanished into Kelly's old room and the laughter continued. Now my stomach was churning and I was scared to even look. I just thought to myself that this can't be happening and gripped the knife tightly as I neared the entrance of the room. As I edged closer, I heard the sounds of two people, but could understand what they were saying. I could only hear the voice of a male and a female. I asked who was there, but no one replied, so I stormed into Kelly's bedroom. It was empty. I opened the wardrobe door to see if anyone was hiding in there, and that was also empty. But oddly, her bedroom window was open, and a cool breeze was entering the room. As I turned around... I was startled to see a hazy figure standing at the bedroom doorway. My heart felt like it was going to be ripped out as it was beating so fast. I stood in shock and stared in amazement. Even though I felt silly for asking, I asked if she was Kelly. I could tell by the shape of the figure that it was a female and then she started to come towards me. I backed off a bit and then she became familiar with me. She was wearing faded blue jeans and a blue top. Tears were streaming down my face. These were the same clothes Kelly had worn when she had hung herself. Even though her face was not clear to me, I knew that she was smiling. She blew me a kiss and walked out of the room and into the hallway. I ran after her, but she had disappeared quicker than a blink of an eye. After that experience, I've always had a feeling that Kelly is watching me. It's a scary memory I have of her visit, but I do feel comforted that she is not sad. I miss her deeply and have not seen her spirit since. I hope she is finally at rest. Before I moved to Las Vegas, I used to visit a lot. My family and I enjoyed staying at the various hotels. About three years ago, we stayed at one of the original older hotel casinos on the Strip in Las Vegas. At the time, this hotel casino was experiencing difficulties with the union. Our room was 179. When we got to the door, I put in the key card. The little green light went on, and I tried to open the door. It was impossible to open. It took me and my dad to open it. At the time, we thought it was some kind of vacuum or the hinges on the door needed to be fixed. Of course, five minutes later, we forgot all about it. A few minutes after I put my clothes in the drawers, I searched around the room to check for any dropped casino chips from past guests. To my dismay, I found nothing. After that, I looked for the Bible in the room. There was none. Now that was odd. They are always in hotel rooms. 
Someone must have taken it. Later that day, we all went out to the strip. My mom got tired around 11 o'clock, so she went back to the room. Me and my dad stayed out till 1 o'clock in the morning. When we got back, I was really tired. I slept on the couch and my parents slept on the bed. We had a suite. The next morning, my dad was almost crying. He said that he had seen a ghost. I thought he was joking because he had always said that there was no such things. He said he saw it around 4.45 in the morning. According to him, he felt something at the foot of the bed. He turned over, sat up, and opened his eyes. Standing before him was a woman dressed in a white dress. He said it looked like something from the 40s or 50s. The lady had her arms folded across her chest. He could see all the wrinkles in her dress. She just stood there and didn't make a sound, but he did not see a face or hands, just whiteness. When he saw her, he yelled at my mom to wake up. My mom didn't wake up right away. He shook her a few times to wake up. When she did, my dad looked at the woman at the foot of the bed. Then, she just dissipated from the outside in. They didn't want to wake me until 8 a.m. They said they didn't want to keep me awake. I really don't know what to think. So, being the smart ass that I am, I lit a match and said, Ghost, you are no longer welcome here. Get out of your room. But then I said, Oh, never mind. You can just stay over in that corner if you don't bother us. My parents were apprehensive about staying another night. I convinced them that we should stay another night because I thought it would be cool and so they agreed. That night, I fell asleep around 12.30. At about 4 in the morning, I felt something in the room. I was afraid to look. I put my head in my blankets for about 15 minutes. I was breathing pretty hard. I decided to stick my head out of the blankets and when I did, I was scared out of my pajamas. There, in the corner that I told the ghost to go, was the ghost, white dress and all. Immediately, I put my head under the covers. Tears were coming down my face. I hoped to God that the ghost didn't come over to me. I stayed awake and didn't move until I heard my parents were awake. When I had told them what had happened, they decided that we would never return to this hotel ever again. We packed up all of our stuff and headed out, and when we got to the door, the maid was there. My dad asked her, what was that we saw in the room? The maid's eyes got big, and she asked us if we had seen the ghost. We all answered yes in unison. She said that she would not clean the room, handed off the towels to us, and ran off crying. When we checked out, we didn't ask anyone about the ghost because we didn't want to cause a scene. When we got home, I told all my friends about it. They all said cool. I don't think it was cool at all. At work, my dad asked if anybody knew any ghost stories about the place we had stayed at. One of his coworker girlfriends who had been a cocktail waitress there and said that in the 50s, a country western singer had stayed there. He was cheating on his wife with his mistress. His wife visited him while he was in bed with the mistress and shot her, the mistress. That's all of the story I heard. The mistress of the man may or may not be the ghost in room 179, but all I know is that there is a ghost in that room, and I'll never go there ever again. My teen years were turbulent and not very pleasant. I won't go into too much detail, but a little background is necessary in order to fully explain the story I have to tell. My family, being military, traveled often. This made us very dependent on one another. However, in 1985, my father retired to a small, miserable town called Lebanon in the cornfields of Illinois. Being a small town, it was chock full of every small town cliche imaginable. My sister, being two years older than I, found the prospect of not being uprooted suddenly very pleasing and made many friends very easily. I, on the other hand, couldn't stay in the bumpkins we lived among and quickly became the town outcast. My father, hating retirement, found a local job and was gone from the house a lot. My mother and I were never close, and she soon became lost in my sister's popularity and forgot about me. None of this bothered me, after all. I knew one day I would leave. Nonetheless, I found myself alone a lot. Our house was a clone of the typical 1950s two-story white house. 
We even had the white picket fence in the backyard. There had only been one previous owner of our abode, a nice old couple that had retired to Florida. They did not smoke, and no one in my family did at that time. However, shortly after moving in, we would smell cigarette smoke in various areas of the house. It was so strong, it would make one's eyes water. Then it would be gone. My father was never a believer, still isn't, so this was easily dismissed by him. However, my mother soon named the smoke the work of Fred. Once Fred became named, he made himself very believable. The footsteps, the lights, so on were all par for the cause. However, Fred's favorite activity would be rearranging the food in the fridge. We would come to breakfast in the morning, and all the food would be alphabetized or arranged according to color, size, so on. Once he even crammed all the food onto one shelf, my mother yelled, Oh, Fred, don't you ever do that again. Now clean this up. The next time the door was opened, it was cleaned, although my father would say it was a half ass effort. But it was when I was alone that I could feel Fred more closely. He would be there so strongly. I would talk to him out loud, never getting an answer but feeling better. In our basement was a makeshift hobby room the previous owner had constructed. We kept our tools in this room as well as our empty luggage. When I would enter this room, I would feel like I was intruding. It always felt cold, and as soon as I found what I was looking for, the feeling to get out would be even stronger. Nothing bad ever happened, just the urgency to get out. I asked Fred if he wanted me to stay out of his room. The lights began to flicker, and I took that as a yes. I moved the tools and luggage and never went in there again. This continued for three years until one day, I was viciously attacked. Gotta love those small towns. Once I returned home and slept in my bed again, I felt someone sit down next to me. I thought it was my sister, but when I looked, I saw only a butt print, no body. I cried and talked to Fred all night about what had happened, and from that point on, he slept with me every night. I could sometimes feel him sit next to me on the couch or on the front porch swing, he was very comforting. I graduated from high school in 1990 and got the hell out of Dodge. The last night I was to sleep at home, I told Fred I was leaving. I heard a very heavy sigh explode next to me. I promised I would visit, and I did. Each time I would visit, he would sit next to me and I would fill him in on my life. Then in 1995, my parents moved to Alabama and sold the house. On the last day that I would ever be in the house, I had to say goodbye to Fred. I went into my now empty room and told Fred the news. I heard the sigh again, then footsteps as he walked away from me, down the stairs and then into the basement. I cried all the way home. Someone else lives in the house now. I drove by it yesterday, the first time in almost four years. It looked well taken care of. I wonder if Fred is still there, if he likes the new people. I wonder if they like him. I miss him, my friend, and think of him often. I lived in Savannah, Georgia for almost three years. It is the most haunted city in the U.S. I feel, and I have several stories to prove it, perhaps some other time. Thank you for letting me tell my story. I was at a friend's house on the new year of 1999, and she has a giant picture window in her dining room. I was spending the night, and we were the only ones awake. Her parents were asleep in the room, pretty much right next to us, and her brother and sister were asleep on the floor in the living room. We went over to the picture window to try and see the fireworks. We were trying to see them when we heard a clatter right above us. We look up at the ceiling while hoping it was only rats. We ignored it and continued searching for the sky for fireworks. After about a minute, we heard heavy footsteps. They were horrible. After that night, she still comes to me with outrageous stories from the night before. One of them was not too long ago. She told me that she heard a voice one night while she was having trouble sleeping. She walked out of her room, looked down the stairs, and saw a dark figure standing at the end of the stairs. She thought it was her mom and started saying something to her, but it wasn't her mom. Not at all. She looked down the stairs closer, and then it opened its eyes. She says they were a bright glowing green. When she told me this, a bolt of pure, unspeakable terror shot down my spine. She also says 
that after she claimed she was in her room and she looked out her window, she saw in her little sister's room a blood red man looking right at her. She always has terrifying stories, and yet she is never scared or fazed by them herself. I remember in the third grade, I was at her house every morning because I had seen strange figures in my hallway. Every morning, my mom would take me in and I'd lay on the couch. As I watched her headlights dance across the wall and then disappear, the room would lower to an agonizing freezing cold. I guess I could chalk that up to coincidence, but knowing all the experiences I had previously and the ones that I just mentioned, I kind of doubt that. But I know that there is a presence in my house. Thanks for reading. My name is Ian, and I recently just spent two weeks in Italy. I live in LA, and was told of the many, musty locations in the area of Tuscany, but the one that most appealed to me was the torture museum in the famous city of San Ginanamo. On the ninth and last day in Tuscany, before I took my long drive home to Rome, we decided to stop in San Ginanamo. My father told me to leave me in the torture museum aka the criminal museum, while he went off with my sisters. The criminal museum was originally a torture chamber, built during the time of the Spanish and Italian Inquisition. I bought my ticket at around 5.30pm, and proceeded to the bottom part of the torture chamber. As I entered the deepest part of the chamber, I got really scared. I was all alone, except for a German man and his children. The chamber was quite odd, and in some places, it was really cold, and I would go back to that same place, and it would not be cold anymore. Light gusts of wind would come out of nowhere, and there were no windows, doors, and it was underground. I began proceeding through the chamber, until I stopped by a ghostly figure, standing right behind an iron maiden. It was a shade of white that I had never seen before. I could barely make it out, but there were depressions where the mouth, eyes, and nose were. I stood frozen for what felt like 10 minutes. It then darted straight across the room in the direction of the opposite wall. I could even hear its feet going across the floor. I ran like a bat out of hell and nearly cleared 20 stairs but fell and slid down the 10 other. I later spoke to the man in the reception room. He asked me where I saw it and I said in the chamber. He told me that there are hundreds of ghosts in there and many seem to be insane. I will never forget what happened to me in Italy, and I hope others will enjoy my story. My name is Julie, and I'm 32, mother of a wonderful four-year-old son, which I would give my life for, married to a wonderful, incredible man. We live in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. When I was about eight, I believe. I had my first terrifying experience with the dead. My great grandma had passed away a few days earlier, although I can't really recall the event all that well. One night, a few days after her death, I woke up in the middle of the night, needing to go to the bathroom. The bathroom was just in front of my bedroom, separated by a long hallway that went basically across the part of the first and only floor. Beside my bedroom was my parents' bedroom. My bedroom to the bathroom was only like three feet to walk across the hallway. As I walked towards the bathroom, for some reason, I looked into my parents' bedroom. What I saw terrified me. Across my parents' bed, I saw my great-grandma lying on her side, holding her head with her left arm looking at me with these black, see-through eyes. I will never forget. Very young and innocent, I didn't really ever think that ghosts really existed. That made me aware of another world that we were not taught about in our upbringing. When I got a little older, we had bought a house in Hawkesbury, Ontario, that we stayed into for I would say five to six years. I was about 16 at the time. We had just purchased the house, and while my father was renovating the upstairs, the whole family would be sleeping in the basement. One night, as we were spending a little time together, we heard this funny noise upstairs, we thought someone, for some reason, had entered our home, so my father went up to see what was going on. To all of our surprise, all four rings of her ceiling light 
had just fallen on the floor. Not one at a time, but all four. We could hear footsteps in the house, and when I was alone, the front doorknob would turn, and nobody was even there. I was so terrified. I did not know what to make of these events. At night, I would hear someone open the fridge door and close, open pantry doors, and close loud. I would constantly feel a presence. I would barely have any sleep in the house. Sometimes, I would go and sleep with my brother. It is a terrible feeling as a child to be afraid like this. It's not okay. I don't think in any way that this is a funny thing. When you're a child, you get confused and don't understand the logic of these things. Actually, because there is no logic. When I got older in my early 20s, my grandmother passed away. God, I adored her. She was my best friend. And to this day, I miss her like crazy. Not long after she had died, Maybe a few nights after, she appeared to me while sitting on the side of my bed late one night. She appeared right next to me. She had her arm around my neck, and she looked at me saying, Julie, don't be sad. You know that I'm not really gone. And she disappeared into thin air. I felt such a relief that she felt my sadness and that she loved me enough to come and comfort me. I will never forget that precious moment. For you, Grandma, I love you, Julie. To start my story, my father and I pretty much had a decent relationship most of my life. Of course, when I was a teenager, I did the usual teenage crap, a rebelled, and we grew apart. I had moved out and ended up with an abusive boyfriend. I ended up moving back home and Dad and I renewed our relationship. Those nine months before my dad's death were great. We actually got a chance to really talk, and I think my dad knew his time was short. He kept telling me that I would find the right guy eventually, and I would make a good mom someday. On February 11th, 1997, Dad passed away after a long illness that we would discover later was periodontis. Things didn't start happening right away, it started after I met the man who would be my husband later, and I became pregnant with our son. About four months into my pregnancy, we started noticing little things around the house, mostly having to do with noises and objects that had belonged to my father. After my son was born, and he was about a month old, my husband and I were watching television in the living room, and the baby was asleep. My mother's room. We were staying with her, due to after dad died, she couldn't pay the bills on her own was right off the living room. She had went to bed, and after about a half hour, she said she had seen a white orb about the size of a softball traveling between the bedroom door and her vanity mirror. No light source constant. Her room was pitch black because she kept tinfoil and trash bags over her windows to keep the light out. Then, when we were getting things ready for the wedding, it seemed like all hell broke loose. Objects being thrown Kitchen drawers opening and shutting by themselves. Strange noises. You name it. We had it. Then, the wedding day came. I wasn't nervous, because I knew Dad was there. I wore his turquoise ring I gave him for a Father's Day present, for something blue. Everyone at the wedding and the reception said they could feel him. Even some of the pictures taken at the reception were questionable. A couple have what appears to have a mist in them. My son is in most of those photographs. Then we didn't really have anything happen for a while, until my son started getting old enough to talk. Then in the evening, when only me and my son were at home, watching TV most times, he would get all excited, as if someone had just come home. He would run up to the baby gate, wave, and yell hi, and I would go up to the gate and look down the hall to see no one there, and I would ask him, who are you talking to? And he'll look up at me and smile and say, Grandpa, Mama, he never met my father. My son was born on 2100, and Dad died on 211, 97. After he did this for a couple of weeks, I invested in an EMF detector. After running a few test runs to get readings from the hallway on basic electrical outlets and whatnot, I waited for my son to say hi to Dad again. Sure enough, about a week later, it happened again. 
This time I ran into the hallway to see if I could get a reading. I did. A perfect circle about two feet in diameter, smack dab in the middle of the hallway. I knew it was dad. We have since moved, but my son still says hi on occasion to grandpa, and my sister and I can still sense his presence. I'm 19 now, and most of my experiences have happened recently, although I remember a few from when I was a child. I'm a student at a Big Ten university and stayed in the dorms my first year here. My roommate and I were soon to find out we had another roommate. One night, I was dreaming that I was lying in a bed across from another bed, and a girl was pacing in between. Well, my dream soon faded to reality. When I noticed myself blinking, we had lost, so the floor that was in my dream was now gone, but the girl was still pacing, about five feet in the air. I don't know what came over me, and I didn't mean to say anything, but I blurted out, what are you looking for? The girl stopped and looked at me. Her eyes were just dark holes, and then faded away. I wasn't scared of her. I just went back to sleep. During other nights, I would be startled awake. What sounded like heavy books being thrown to the floor, and in the morning, nothing would be out of place. Things would go missing, only to end up in the middle of the floor, days later. My first touching experience took place there also. I was taking a nap on the futon with my boyfriend, when I felt what I thought was my boyfriend's scruffy chin rub on my forehead. It woke me, but I didn't open my eyes. It happened again, and so I thought he was trying to get my attention. I looked up, expecting to see his face, and there was nothing there. He was about two feet away from me, with his back towards me, fast asleep. My roommate, however, had the creepiest experience. She rarely had any, but hers, I think, didn't happen to me. She came in the room from the shower, down the hall, and went to her mirror. When she noticed she had a drop of blood on the tip of her nose, she wiped it off onto her finger. Expecting to see a pop zit or something, but her nose was clear. She showed me the blood on her finger and told me what happened. So we checked her arms and legs everywhere to see if she had cut herself shaving. We checked her towel, robe, slippers, everything, and there was no blood anywhere else. We still do not know where it came from. Last night was my most recent experience, which made me want to read about stories online. It was at my parents' home, which we all think is haunted by some man. I was ready to fall asleep when I was startled awake by a loud pop in front of my face. Minutes later, I heard dripping water. That ghost mostly bothers my brother, whose bedroom is in the basement where most of the activity takes place. I would like to share my experiences with someone who doesn't think I'm crazy. When I was five years old, my mom, dad, and I moved to a house in Crownsville. It was about seven years old and had originally been built as a summer home only. My dad did a lot to the house over the years to renovate it. When I was about 10 years old, he finished the new bedroom on the front of the house and he and my mother moved in. I got their old bedroom at the back of the house. I'm not sure if this bedroom was in the house originally, because it was built on a concrete slab, and the rest of the house was over a basement. My mother claimed to see a ghost materialize from the heating vent into the room. We all laughed it off. Later on, I didn't think it was so funny anymore. My parents were very strict, and didn't leave me alone in the house until I was 13. After they left, I was really creeped out by the feeling in the house. I felt as though I was being watched. I wandered into the kitchen, and heard a really weird sound. Then I noticed that the cupboard doors were moving. It looked like they were vibrating. I recognized the noise as the glasses in the cabinets all vibrating against one another. I ran back to my room and stayed there till my parents got back. One time, I got this brilliant idea to bring a Ouija board into the house. My grandmother had lots of junk in her backyard, and as I dug around, I had found the board wedged between two small buildings. If I'd been a bit older and a bit smarter, I would have left the damn thing there. I shoved it into the back floorboard of my mother's car, 
underneath my jacket. Somehow, I snuck it inside later on, without being seen. It was just a board in the planchet, the Parker Brothers kind. I put it in my underwear drawer, all the way at the bottom, hoping to play with it later. I had failed school that year, so I had to go to summer school. I knew I would have to get up early, so I went to bed early. I was waking some time later, after my parents went to bed. I thought I heard a rattling. I listened for several minutes, heard nothing, and went back to sleep. I woke up again, a little while later. Again, I thought I heard rattling, and this time, I thought I had come from my dresser. I was slightly freaked out, but I heard nothing after a few intense minutes of listening, so I rolled over and went back to sleep. I woke up a third time. This time, I was angry. I still heard it when I woke all the way up, so I hurried and turned my light on. I saw the dresser drawer move for a few seconds, then it stopped. There was no more sleep for me to be had that night. The light stayed on, and I stayed sitting up in my bed, till dawn. Then I got into the dresser, snapped the board in pieces, and threw it out my back window. The last thing that happened while I lived in the house occurred when my best friend stayed the night. We were supposed to be sleeping in my bed, but being kids, we were up talking. We both shut up at once and looked out my bedroom door. It was the kind of house where all the doors line up. I could look out of my door and see clear to my parents' bedroom door, in between were my old room, the kitchen, and the living room. We both saw glowing orbs floating around in the living room. There were about five of them, and they were way brighter than any of the lamps we had. She and I stared in awe for a few minutes, and then they faded away. She and I are still friends, but we never have talked about the glowing balls floating around my living room. Thanks for listening. I have been able to explain what happened the night of the Ouija board rattlings. For all I know, it could be the workings of an overactive imagination, but it sure seemed to be real to me. The terror of that night never has faded. Hi, I've owned this large, three-story, late 1800s building for the past 25 years or so. The first floor is two storefronts, and the second and third originally had three apartments per floor. I converted two of the second floor apartments into one large apartment for myself. When I first bought the building, I had a great deal of work to do on it. My mother would occasionally visit, and she would ask me who was in the back room of the main store. There was no one there, but she would insist. I never thought much about this until later in life, but she now sees non-existent people nearly everywhere. Sometime after gutting the building and making it partly usable, I was working on the first floor and saw a young boy running through the store. Since the place was locked up tight and there were seven alarm systems and only one was off, it was impossible for the child to hide from me. No child was to be found. Over the years, I and many others have seen a child running through the store. I've seen the occasional person while looking in a mirror, although this doesn't happen often. Many years ago, my friend Scott shared the apartment and had a rear bedroom of his own. One evening, he came out to see me when I got home and complained that something had sexually assaulted him. He found the event very painful. I somewhat dismissed this as folly on his part, but never forgot it. A few years later, I rented that same room to another fellow, and he had a similar experience. He moved out the next day. I rented a room to a fellow who was gay. He never had problems until his friend came over to visit. They were alone in the bed at the time. They were in the bedroom when the bed lifted a few inches off the floor and fell down. Then the bed moved a couple of feet from its location. Finally, the tenant had a set of barbells sitting on the floor. They were tossed up in the air several times, hitting the floor with a bang. After this happened, I began to read up on getting rid of spirits in the building. I placed a pentagram with proper symbols in the room above the tenant's room and went through the ceremony. From that day forward, nothing else happened in the building. That is until the roof leaked above the room, and I bought up a tarp and bucket to catch the leak. The tarp covered the pentagram. 
Since then, people, including myself, see things in the building, mostly visions of people. Some people leave the building immediately when this happens. Over the years, nothing has ever happened to me physically, and my sightings of spirits are rare. I'd like to mention another place in Buffalo. It is on West Avenue, near Ferry. The location was originally Buffalo's hanging grounds, and now there are houses on it. My friend Paul owns the house. Occasionally, when no one is in the house, there will be loud screams coming from inside the house. Police have been summoned by neighbors on several occasions, but couldn't find anything out. Thanks for reading. I had a couple of strange experiences at a cemetery in Vancouver as a teenager about 15 years ago or so. Everyone I've told the story to over the years seems to get a chill run down their necks from hearing it, so I thought it would make a good addition to your website, which I enjoy reading through on occasion as I'm interested in hearing about other people's experiences with the unexplained. Back in the late 80s, I hung around with a group of friends who I'd hang around with and mostly get into trouble with. I guess looking back, we didn't really have any beliefs or interest in the supernatural or spirituality, and I suppose we were kind of like teenage nihilists in a way, getting into trouble with the police and partying a lot, not conscientious about school or the future, so what would happen at the cemetery would all seem the more strange. Well, anyways, one school night, we were out looking for something to do at around 10 or 11 at night, and we couldn't really think of anything as it was midweek, and most people our age only went out on the weekends. We ended up just driving around with no destination in mind, and at one point, someone suggested we go to a local cemetery just because we had nowhere else to go. This cemetery is cut into the forest on the side of a mountain and is basically just a giant field surrounded by trees and all the headstones are just flat plates on the ground so that if you didn't know it was a cemetery, it would just appear as a big empty field upon entering it. The point is, is that there's absolutely nothing to obstruct your view or cast strange shadows in the cemetery. To get into the cemetery, you have to drive through a 40 meter winding road that runs through trees and bushes, etc. And this road eventually branches out so that cars can access different parts of the cemetery. There were three of us in the car, with myself driving, a friend in the front seat and one in the back. As I pulled the car into the small entrance road, I slowed the car right down and put on the high beams and drove the car at a snail's pace towards the cemetery. As we made the last little bend in the road and entered the cemetery, the high beam suddenly illuminated the entire field, and it was at this point that I suddenly and finally jammed my foot on the brakes, because about 15 meters in front of us stood a group of about 30 to 40 people. I think I recall my friend sitting next to me, saying something to the effect of, what the hell is going on here? I don't know. I answered maybe some kind of midnight burial or something, and then cracking some joke that maybe they were druids. I remember my friend in the back seat suggesting that we back the car the way we came in so as not to disturb whatever was going on, which I declined to do in saying it would be a better idea to make the first turn and come around as it's a narrow road. At this time, probably about 20 to 30 seconds might have passed, and I took my foot off the brake and we proceeded forward. After the car had moved forward, maybe 15 feet, and I was staring intently at the group of the people the whole time. There strangely now seemed to be less of them, which confused me. Although I remember slight movement within the group, they didn't seem to be bothered by the headlights, and I don't recall any of them looking directly at us. Well, by the time the car had reached about half the distance to where they were standing, and this is the odd part, there was no one left standing there, just an empty field, and it was at this point when I hit the brakes again, I can remember the intense feeling of my scalp feeling like it was covered in goosebumps and shrinking because it was only at this point that it clicked into my mind that something ghostly and unnatural had occurred. I drove the car up to a spot alongside where the group was standing and rolled down the window to have a closer look, but there was no explanation for what we had seen. At this point, someone suggested that we get the heck out of there, and we did, quickly. I can think of no possible explanation for what happened, 
and even went up there a couple weeks later with the same car, but a different friend, to see if maybe we could duplicate the feat and try to come up with some explanation, but we were unsuccessful. Strange thing was, that all three of us saw the same thing from different vantage points, and there was nothing that the headlights could have refracted off to cause an illusion against the windshield. And anyways, the girls were clearly standing at a distance of 50 or so meters in three-dimensional space, so there's no way it could have been a reflection. When I tried to duplicate the experience in the same car, nothing happened. I suppose it was this experience that has caused me to have a belief in a greater reality than we see in our everyday lives. Something else happened at that cemetery months later. Not quite as strange, but strange nonetheless. But this email has turned out longer than I intended it to, so perhaps I'll submit it another time. I've had a family member was buried at the cemetery since that time, and the experience has helped me to believe that perhaps some of them is still with us in some way. I would like to share the experience we've had, my husband and I, with the ghost of a dead boy. We had some pretty scary moments. A few years ago, we moved into our new home. An old lady had lived there for years and had passed away two years before shortly after she moved into an old people's home. The house had been left empty since she moved out. We were the first ones to move in. It was the beginning of springtime, so it was a little cold inside. As we turned on the central heating system, we heard a noise as if a kettle was whistling. We thought it was just a little dry as it had not been used in the last two years. This was just the beginning. When you entered our house, you would see a hallway surrounded by the living room, bathroom, bedrooms, and closet with the central heating system inside. As time passed away, we did not take any notice of the heating system making noise. I must say, I felt kind of awkward when I passed the particular closet. Next thing happened was on our clock. The pendulum would stop at different times. I would give it a swing, and it would keep going for days. It happened many times, and looking back on it, our cats were always looking at things we weren't able to see, especially into the direction of the clock. Then our candles. We used to burn them every night at two places in our living room. We never had any problems with drafts, but suddenly, we noticed our candles were burning unsteadily. All these things happened in our living room and we never thought anything of it until one evening the pendulum stopped, the candles started flickering, and a cold chill went through the room. The temperature dropped instantly, and suddenly, the noise from the central heating system didn't sound like a whistling kettle anymore, but like a stream drain running right through our living room. We looked at the TV, and suddenly, we saw the display changing numbers, and the screen turned to snow. It looked like it was trying to find a channel to display something we did not want to see. My husband rushed to the thermostat to turn it down, so the central heating would stop making noise. The TV went back to the channel we had been watching before, and everything went back to normal. Except for the two of us, we were scared to death, and we realized that something was haunting us. As we thought back at all the times the pendulum stopped, the noises from the central heating the uncomfortable feeling we got from that closet and the candles. Something or someone was trying to scare us out of our home. I told my husband that it was time to take some action or things could get worse. As we decided to go to bed, the central heating started whistling again. And as I passed the closet, I yelled at it, Stop it and shut up. Believe it or not, it did stop. Believed as I was, I rushed into the bedroom to find the halogen lamp flickering heavily, and the whistling started again. I decided to take a run through the hallway, back into the living room, to turn the thermostat off, so the noise would stop. My husband was too scared to get out of bed, and I'll tell you, I wasn't happy either, but I managed to do so, and I was glad to return to bed, hiding under the sheets. The next day, I decided to call a psychic, called Jan who's well known for leading ghosts into another dimension with the help of his guide, Layla. Through Layla, he was told that a young man in his early 20s had been living here before we moved in. He had died, jumping or falling off a bridge in Rotterdam. 
who are never told his name, so we could not do any research on this guy. Layla led him into the woods, and all went quiet and peaceful. We moved out of the house a few years later, and we're glad we never encountered anything like this again. It still gives me the creeps just thinking about it. Kind regards, and good luck with your website. I'm not sure if you'll understand my English, since it's been a while since I studied it, so if you have any questions, let me know. It happened when I was in my early teens. I think first, I should describe my room to you. It's the very smallest room in the whole apartment. The bed was placed, facing the door, and the piano was on the left side of the door. That day, my sister was sleeping in the room, on the floor. I don't know exactly what time this incident happened. All I know is that it was scary. So, I woke up in the middle of the night, opened my eyes to see a grim reaper with a scythe just standing there. His face was hidden under the hood, but the face under the hood was glaring with a very weird greenish light. My body was paralyzed. The only parts of my body I still had control over were my eyes. Suddenly, he started laughing, but it was a silent laugh. The most unusual thing about this, though, was that I could still hear him laughing, even though it was silent. His laugh would be best described as something evil and demonic. It was just cruel. I closed my eyes because I couldn't look at it any longer, and if I did, my heart would have jumped out of my mouth. When I opened my eyes, he was gone, but I could still hear his laugh. It's weird that I fell asleep after that. After this incident, strange things started happening to me. I'd wake up in the middle of the night with my body stiff and be afraid of nothing, even if I was alone in the room. Or, I'd feel like something's trying to touch me. Having dreams about people I don't know, and they always tell me that they're dead. This happened some seven years ago, in 1996. The office building where I worked then used to be a hotel. I was told there were two ghosts in the building. One, on the seventh floor, was supposed to be the ghost of a murdered hotel maid, but no one could tell where or what the second one was supposed to be. I shared an office on the corner of the third floor, and my colleague and I would often look up from our work, expecting to see someone, but there was never anyone there. We both felt that someone had walked through the office door, which we kept open for ventilation. An old office building such as this one did not have air conditioning. We talked about this and discovered that we each had this experience on several occasions. Sometimes we were alone, sometimes we were both in the office. We eventually decided that we must be hearing someone walk along the corridor past the office, and after this, our imaginary visitor did not make their presence felt nearly so often. Then one morning, as I came back from the small area known as the tea bay, after making myself a coffee, I distinctly saw a man enter our office doorway. When I followed a few seconds later, there was only my colleague there. He insisted that no one had come through the door, and he said I must have been seeing someone going around the corner. I maintained that I had distinctly seen someone in the light coming from our doorway, and that the corridor beyond our office was dark at that time because the lighting was being replaced. A few weeks later, I saw the same man going into the tea bay, which is no more than an alcove with a water heater, refrigerator, and cleaning facilities. And when I got there, it was empty. There was no way he could have come out again without passing me. There was no other exit. I told my colleagues, and they said, I must have seen someone going into either the mess or the woman's toilets, which are on either side of the tea bay. I maintain that I saw someone going into the tea bay. If they had gone into the toilets, I would have heard the doors closing. There are none on the tea bay. Hello there. I've never thought of myself as being sensitive to paranormal things, but I've had too many experiences that I cannot explain easily. I would like to take this time and share two memorable experiences with you. 
Mind you, most of my experiences were feelings of not being alone, hairs on my neck rising, feelings of being watched, getting overwhelmed with sadness, hatred, and anger suddenly. I'm going to start off with my brush with the Martin House, listed in the Haunted Places Index under Panama City, Florida, at the age of 8 years. In 1978, it was owned by the paper mill company that was located across the street from the house. The Martin House sat on a huge amount of land, but was surrounded by trees with moss hanging from them. There was a waterway running past the right of the house, looking at the front porch. The paper mill would rent this house out to various groups for parties. At the time, my father was in the Air Force, and his maintenance group rented out the house several times. I kind of felt safe on the lower floor and around the house grounds. I always made sure that my sister, seven years old and I, stayed with a group of people at all times. For the most part, kids were running all over the lower section of the house, and we had plenty of places to explore. We were told from the beginning not to go upstairs because it was not safe. A group of us, me included, decided to explore the upstairs area after we ate some food. I led the way up after the first five steps and stopped. I was looking at the top of the stairs and had the feeling of being watched by someone very bad. I let the boy behind me go first. We all started up the stairs and I stopped again, feeling very uneasy, couldn't seem to catch my breath. I was pushed out of the way by the other kids who went up the stairs. I went back down a ways until I was in the light that was shining from below and waited there still uneasy. Then the kids started the screen and came running down the stairs with me in front and told their parents that a very scary man was staring at them. Our parents went up to look around and could not find anyone. We all got punished. Each time we went to find that house, I was always looking up at one set of windows, overlooking the waterway. I felt like I was being watched by something. Last, the ankle grabber. I was 23 years old and visiting my sister in Marietta, Georgia. She lived in a two-bedroom apartment. The two bedrooms were located on the left side of the hallway, with the bathroom right across the room. I would be staying in with my mom. This room had a faint, nasty odor that got stronger towards the closet. My first two nights there in the room, I felt uneasy, like I was being watched, and fell asleep watching the closet door. I had a restless sleep, and I always woke up looking at the closet door. The third day, I helped my sister get some extra boxes put away in the closet. It smelled like rotting flesh. It was extremely cold and unpleasant being in there. My sister said that she had tried everything to get the smell out, but nothing worked. That night, my mom decided to sleep out in the living room. I fell asleep the same way, eyes in the closet. I suddenly woke up to the feeling of someone rubbing their thumb down the length of my right foot very hard. It then went into spasms. I looked around the bed, thinking it might have been my sister. Nothing, but that closet door was slightly opened, and it was not how I left it before I went to bed. I wasn't able to go to bed the rest of the night and my daughter slept soundly. The next day was uneventful, except when my daughter was taking a nap. Strange sounds were coming from her baby monitor. I went down the hallway with a feeling of dread, and went into the room to look around. Nothing was out of place, and I even checked my daughter for marks. There were none, but I did take her out of the room to finish her nap in the living room. That night, I was hot, and decided to sleep on top of the covers. Again, my mom slept in the living room. I placed my daughter's playpen in a safer part of the room. I slept in the middle of the bed, with my right hand on the middle of the pillow. I woke up in terror when my ankle was grabbed and I was jerked six inches off of my pillow. My right leg was hanging off the end of the bed and my left leg was bent. I got up, picked up my daughter, and went to sleep in the living room. In the morning, I asked my mom about any unusual experiences in that room. She said she didn't have anything funny happen to her. Just then, my sister let me know that her former roommate had complained of hearing footsteps in the room when no one else was in there. The room, by the way, was carpeted, unusual sounds, bad smells, and being watched. I asked my sister to move out of her apartment. 
my daughter and I spent the rest of the visit sleeping in the living room. On the last day, I went into the room, threatened if it ever hurt my family members, I would be its worst nightmare when I died, and called it every dirty name in the book. I figured I'd take my chances and say it anyway, even if I sound ridiculous and yell at nothing. I would like to thank you for your time, and thank you most of all for allowing me to share my experiences with you. I know the paranormal can bring a lot of skepticism into this world, but I also know there are things you just can't explain. I believe in the paranormal. I believe in the things that go bump in the night, and I certainly won't dismiss something just because someone thinks it's something crazy that may not be existing. Keep an open mind. Don't be so dismissive, because you never know when something may lurk on you, and you never know when you're being watched. Here's kind of a creepy story. I go to school at Lala, and my school, mind you, it is a private school. There have been a few suicides and drownings. We are on a lake, and other things such like that. Well, many students here have seen the Lalu ghost, and apparently, we have more than one haunting. One of my friend's sisters was being followed around by it. In one part of the school, there are wooden steps, which makes lots of noise when you walk down them. She started to walk down them, and she heard loud footsteps behind her. She stopped. It stopped. She looked around. No one was there. So, she kept going, and the footstep kept going. That, from what I heard, was the last time I know that the ghosts have been sighted, until two weeks ago. It was a late Thursday afternoon, when my friends Kai, Clover, and Jess walked down to the Pine Room, which is basically our storage room in Lost and Found, to get a binder or something. When they went down there, Clover had stirred the feel of presence. Kai saw a flicker of light, and Jess saw the entire figure of what she could only explain as a ball of white light. All three of them just got what they needed and left, talking about this ghost. This is how I found out. I overheard them talking, and so did my friend, Jake. Jake is the most skeptical person I've ever met in my entire life. He doesn't even believe in luck. I had told Jake about this, and he basically laughed, and we went to go see Kai, who seems to be the resident expert on the occult here at Lalu, and find out what happened. Dave, who is also a skeptic, was laughing at her for saying this and wanted to see it himself. Kai told all three of us not to go down there. It will just make him mad, and I trusted her, mainly because I believe in ghosts and the supernatural and everything like that, and I stayed. Where Jake and Dave went down to the pine room to try to see it, they came back empty-handed and laughing. We talked a little bit more about the ghost and what it could potentially do to you if it was mad enough. Then, Jake and Adder decided to try again. By this time, about ten other people found out and wanted to see it too. Everyone went down, and everyone heard a loud bang, but nothing else. Then everyone went back up, but for some reason, Jake was called back downstairs. He was just inside of the door when he saw this ball of light light pass in front of him to the adjacent corner. Scared, he ran as fast as he could back up to where me and Kai were waiting. He told us of this story, and David overheard as well. So, being the idiot that he is, Dave went back down there and, yet again, didn't see anyone or anything. Dave then went to go see Clover, who was waiting in the stairwell down the hall to where we were at. We started to follow slower than him, and about a halfway, we all had the same feeling as Dave Giuliano did in his story. The hairs on her arms sticking up, and an uncomfortable constant shiver. At that time, in unison, we all asked, did you feel that? Then, the creepiest thing happened to me. A feeling of soft, very, very soft hands, almost like wind, only solid, ran across my arm, and later, I found out that every time that Jake had walked by that spot and that feeling happened, his legs started cramping up. 
We went to the stairwell and we talked with the two. Ty was shouting at Dave because it was challenging the ghost to its face. And then she moved over a little and both me and Jake saw it. We didn't see anything, really, but we knew it was there in its exact movements. Move over from the exact spot she was standing, right over to where Dave was squatting, and after David challenged the ghost again, we left. After all this, I found out from Kai that it was a different ghost, and that when Dave challenged it, she had saw it laughing. Within two days of this sighting, my friends Ben and Jamie were playing with the camera to use up the film, which only had three pictures left, and it was disposable. Benz had looked through the viewfinder and saw a ball light behind Jamie and took the picture. They developed the film and it was caught on film. Hi, I'm from Ireland and I haven't seen many stories from here. Well, my experience started in 1997. I was 15 when we moved to the house. We moved to a little village in Wexford. Our new house is over 150 years old, but has been done up and looks modern. Anyway, about two weeks after moving into our new house, I was trying to go to sleep one night when I heard someone calling the name Martin. I shared a room with my younger sister at the time, and she was fast asleep. I was wide awake, and whoever was calling the name called it about five or six times. The next day, when I woke up, I went down to my parents and asked who lived in the house before us. They told me don't be stupid, and that I know. Then, I asked who lived in the house before the people we bought the house off of, and I was told a man's name called Jimmy Martin and his wife. At first I thought this was a coincidence, and I never said what happened the night before. I soon started to feel someone was watching me all the time, especially in the sitting room. It is hard to explain, but even though I could not see anything, I could tell you there was an old lady standing in front of the sitting room door, and this is where she always stands. I was afraid to go to sleep some nights, as one night, when I was laying in my bed, something kept hitting me on the back of my head, as if to try and wake me up. Well, I was wide awake, but I was too scared to look, as I was afraid of what I could see. Another night... I was just dozing off when someone decided to sit on the edge of my bed. This frightened the life out of me. I had kept all these experiences to myself as I thought if I told anyone, they would think I was mad. I had an ensuite in my room, and one night, the toilet handle started going up and down by itself. Everything was getting to me, so after three years of keeping it all to myself, I started telling some of my friends what was happening to me. They thought it was scary and asked me what my parents thought. They couldn't understand why I wouldn't tell them, but I just said they would think I'm mad. Anyway, more stuff started happening, but nothing serious. I went out for a few drinks with my mom and one of their friends, and when the night was over, we all came back to my house and had a cup of tea and a chat. They got into the subjects of spirits and started talking about past experiences they had. I thought this would be a good opportunity for me to tell them about mine. I started with my sentence with, you're going to think I'm mad, but, and then I started to cry. I told them everything that was happening to me, and to my surprise, they had their own experiences. My dad was sitting in the sitting room one night, reading the newspaper, when a woman started whispering his name and started running her fingers down through his hair. My mom has heard them walk around upstairs, and she could hear them call her name sometimes. And when she was in bed one night, it was like someone was blowing cold air into her ear. My brother woke me up one night because there was an argument going on in his room. And to his surprise, there was five spirits in his room bickering at each other. His room is across from mine. My mom and dad were annoyed with me because I never told them what was happening to me. We have two bedrooms upstairs and two downstairs. Me and my sister used to share a room upstairs, but she has now moved out, and my brother, who has also slept upstairs, has moved out now, so I'm up there by myself, and some nights, I can feel there's someone there, 
and it would take me half the night to go to sleep, as I would be terrified, lying in my bed. I'm 21, and the eldest of four children. And now that my brother and one of my sisters have moved out, my little sister, 13, looks up to me and likes to do stuff together. She's often asked me about my experiences, which are still happening today, but I won't tell her too much, as it would frighten her. To end my story, I will tell you about a reading we held in our house. A man came to our house who could see spirits, and he gave about ten of us our readings. I was first to get mine done, and as I sat down, the kitchen door opened. As I got up to shut it, the man told me to wait a minute. He then told me that he is now, and that I should shut the door. This sent a shiver down my spine. He told my mother how I can sense spirits, and how a bad spirit entered the room with me. He said that he got rid of them, but there is a spirit that follows me around, but it's a good spirit, and this is the one that I can sense around me all the time. He said that there are a few spirits in my house, but they're good, well except the bad one he got rid of. Well, that's my story, and it's going on today. The good news is, I've just learned to live with it in the sleepless nights at times. Hopefully I'll be the next to move, because the terror drives me mad sometimes. Thank you. First off, I'm 19, and have believed in ghosts my entire life. Now, I don't have a sixth sense, but I find it fun to discuss ghosts in all sorts of unexplained occurrences. I'm a pretty athletic guy, and played football through high school, and am pretty strong too, I can bench 280. I'm not saying this to sound like I'm bragging, just to say I'm not afraid of that much, but what happened to me two summers ago left me pretty shaken. I was about 17 at the time and found out about a haunted church through my mother. She had gone when she was younger. Nothing happened, except she had a really weird feeling the whole time she was there. Well, finding ghosts fascinating, I wanted to go, but didn't want to go by myself. So I told my brother about it. We decided to go on a Saturday night. Maybe we'd have a story to tell at the parties. My brother at the time was 15, and he wanted to bring some friends along, so I agreed. Altogether, there were the five of us. Me, my brother, my brother's friend, and two girls they wanted to impress. The layout of the church goes like this. The church is in the middle of a field, surrounded by woods. All around the church in sort of a U pattern are graves. The graves start a little ahead of the church and meet in back, forming the U. There is no space between the graves and church for a few people to walk. In front of the church is a stone wall about three feet high and two sensor trigger lights on each side of the stone wall. We parked in a little dirt parking lot right in front of the church and got out. Me, being the oldest and assumed the bravest, Went over the wall first. As soon as my feet hit the ground, on the other side of the fence, I got a really bad feeling, and my hair stood on end. The first thing we did was go up to the front steps and hang out for the first couple of minutes. The thing that struck me was that there was no noise at all inside the wall, no crickets or anything, which is strange because it's surrounded by woods. Once we got bored of sitting around, we decided to go around back. That's when the really weird stuff started to happen. We were walking in a straight line, because none of the younger kids wanted to be last. It was me, my brother's friend, the two girls, and my brother. That was the order from left to right. We were walking so that I was closest to the grave, and my brother was closest to the church. About halfway down the length of the church, we all heard a whooshing sound. My brother's friend and I to the left, and my brother and the two girls to the right, like we were being surrounded. Everyone asked each other if they heard the sound, and we all answered yes. After that noise, Mike, my brother's friend, and the two girls wanted to leave, but my brother and I convinced them to stay. Not that I wasn't scared, I just wanted to see more. I forgot to mention that me and my brother both had flashlights, which gets important. As we made our way to the back of the church, we all heard a loud hum, kind of like electric wires, but no one were around. This sound kept getting louder. Also, this went on through the whole entire time we were there, 
and probably would have scared us enough, if not for what happened next. At about the same time, I heard a noise. I saw a black ink blot, like shape move from a grave to behind a bush. I tried to follow it with a flashlight, but it was too fast. However, Mike saw it move from that same bush to behind another tree. From that point, we would hear sounds and directions all around us, and when my flashlight or my brother's was aimed at the spot we heard the sound, we would just get a glimpse of a shape going back the way the light came to, too fast for us to follow it. Now, there had to be more than one of whatever they were, because as me and Mike were going through this on one side, my brother and the two girls were doing the same on the other side. All of a sudden, I heard my brother and the two girls scream. My brother is a pretty tough kid himself, and I never heard him scream like that in my entire life. Never mind the girls. When I turned to see what was wrong, the three were sprinting out of there at a very fast pace. When I heard them scream, I almost panicked, but got my nerves under control. Mike, however, took off like a world-class sprinter, leaving me by myself. Not wanting to be the only one there, I backpedaled as fast as I could, so I could see whatever it was, if it was coming after us. At this point, the humming was almost deafening, and that's when I got the impression that whatever was making the sound was coming closer at every very fast pace. At that same moment, my flashlight went dead, and then I did panic. I turned and ran faster than ever before in my life. When I reached the stone wall, I saw everyone else in the car waiting for me. I just jumped the stone wall. As soon as my feet landed, the flashlight went back on. The humming stopped, and I heard guess what? Crickets chirping. Also, all the feelings of fear I had disappeared, and everything was calm. I got in the car and asked what my brother and the girls had seen. They said it was the body of a little girl floating inside the second story window. At that time, the sensor lights went on meaning something was coming towards the gate. Remembering the humming sound, I took off as fast as possible. There have been other stories about how people have seen the little girl, or heard her playing the flute, but none to the extent of ours. After this happened, I did a little research, and this is what I found. In the 70s, a man raped and murdered five young women, and buried them in the back of the graveyard, behind the church, I don't know where the little girl comes into the picture, but that is what everyone sees. Later, when I asked my brother why a little girl scared them so much, he said the face looked mad, like it wanted us out, and he just got a bad feeling when he saw it. And this is the only ghostly experience, and hopefully the only bad one, I'll ever have, and this story is 100% true. Hi. Not sure if you are interested, but here's a couple of stories from the place I live in, in Tasmania, Australia. My boyfriend and I live in Daisy Cottage, an 1832 brick and stone house in Marquee Street, South Hobart, Tasmania, Australia. Daisy Cottage was originally built as a nine-room hotel by an Irish stonemason. He built an almost identical house right next door for himself which has been empty the entire time we have lived in Daisy Cottage. Legend has it that he witnessed the stabbing murder of the local policeman and testified against the killer in court. The killer was sentenced to lashings, followed by hanging death, and apparently it is he who haunts the house. Strange things have happened, but only one of us is in the house. The first thing happened to Chris, my boyfriend. He arrived home for work one day, and checked the mailbox for an important letter that he was expecting. He took it out of the mailbox, opened the front door, and headed upstairs to the bedroom to get changed. On the way, he started to open the letter. Once upstairs, he realized it was raining, so he put the partially open letter on the bed and went downstairs and out into the back courtyard to take the washing off the clothesline. Once he got back inside, he went back to open and read the letter, and it was not there. After about 30 minutes of searching, he called me out, out of frustration. I arrived home and helped him look for the letter, turning the house upside down. Eventually, I said, 
Are you sure you took it out of the letterbox? Maybe you should check. Sure enough, there it was, sitting in the letterbox, partially opened. Second strange thing happened two days ago. I was alone in the house, doing some painting. It was getting dark, so I turned on the hall, bathroom, dining room, and kitchen lights, and had not ventured upstairs at all. I finished, cleaned up, and started turning off all the lights, getting ready to leave, as we currently aren't staying there during the renovations. I got to the front door and realized that there were lights still on in the house. Every single light upstairs had been turned on. As I left, I noticed that there was a light on in the upstairs of the empty house next door. The one thing that really got me though, as I was looking towards that house, I noticed some kind of print, like a handprint there. When I say handprint, I mean a floating hand. It was very faded, and then it just disappeared. Well, I guess he needed some light in the house. Thanks for reading. I've submitted a story on the site before, but since then, I've had another experience. So here it goes. I'm in my late teens, and during the summer, I stay home alone. One day around 11 a.m., I used the computer, and out in the hallway out of the corner of my eye, I saw a completely black figure, about 6 foot 5 inches tall, and very skinny. When I glimpsed around to make sure no one was in the house, the figure was gone. It happened to me about 4 more times over the next 2 weeks. I started calling them the Shadow Man. Then one day, when I was in the kitchen, I saw another Shadow Man. But this time, when I looked around my shoulder, a can of soup fell onto the floor, and the window was closed, and the cat was in the basement. Another moment, I was with my friends in the woods. Keep in mind, these are small woods, and there are never any hunters or trappers there. We were talking about ghost stories, and I told them about the shadow men. A minute later, we heard a rustling in the bushes, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw a shadow man. Then when I turned to catch a glimpse of it, it was gone. I asked my friends if they saw that, and one of them said yes, and the rest looked at me like I was crazy. I'm not sure if these are spirits or just an overactive imagination, but I usually don't imagine things like that. Since the experience in the woods, I haven't seen a shadow man since, but you never know. I could see one again sometime. Thanks for listening. My name is Kara, and I have another story I would like to share. This encounter, or whatever it's called, took place in the kitchen. It was about midnight, or one in the morning. My mother was asleep. I was on the computer, playing brain teasers or something. And my dog, Susie, a collie, was lying next to me in my chair. As I was playing my game, Susie started to make a noise in between a bark and a growl. I looked to see what she was staring at, and she was looking into the kitchen. Our house is little, but it's cozy. I couldn't see anything, so I took it as attention seeking and hushed her. About ten minutes later, Susie was sitting in the corner directly across from where I sat, and she made a deep growling noise that was so unnatural to me, and she bared her teeth, not at me, but towards the kitchen. I didn't want to look for I admit fear. I thought I would see someone like a burglar of some sort. I looked out of the corner of my eye, and that's when I saw a very, very large white dog looked like a wolf dog to me because it was so large. It had eyes as blue as the sky and fur as white as snow. It didn't look threatening, but intimidating. It just laid there by the recycling bin and stared at me. Susie whimpered and caught my attention. I looked at the corner of my eye and the dog was gone. That night, everything was so still 
quiet, freaky, the way nothing seemed to be able to move. Like a pause button had been invented to freeze the noise after the dog had vanished. I went to my room to lay down, but my room was piled with clothes, books, etc. So I decided to go to my mother's room to sleep, since her bed was a king size and clean. The time passed by as I laid there. 1.30, 2.30, 3.30 a.m., all the way to 4.30 a.m. I just stared at the wall with the background of my mother's snores. I glanced at my mom's door for a second, and there, perched on the door, was a dark cat figure. It had evil green eyes, fur as though it had caught the dark glistening of nighttime. I stared at it for no more than ten minutes. I rubbed my eyes. It was gone. It seemed as though someone played the sound button again, like the mute button wouldn't work. I looked out the window, on my left, and I saw a cat crossing the street, and I decided to doze off. But something didn't seem right. It was like the temperature dropped 20 degrees in the room. I didn't like it, and neither did Susie. She sleeps at the foot of Mother's bed. She gave a very low growl and came over to lay next to me. I pet her for a minute and glanced at the hallway and saw what appeared to be an overgrown house cat. I fell asleep ten minutes after that. I still don't know the connection between the dark cat figures and the white dog, but if you happen to know, I'd like to hear from you. I've been reading through everyone's stories, and I decided that maybe I should go ahead and share one of my own. I'm 30 years old now. This happened when I was four years old. My parents and I were traveling to Oklahoma City to visit my mom's sister. Mind you, this is a short story, but definitely very eerie. Anyway, on the night before we arrived at my mom's home, we stayed the night at a hotel. My mother is not one to be inconvenienced, She needs her own space. So instead of staying in my aunt's house, she put in a stay at a cheap motel. My father obliged her. Now mind you, I did not know about what happened that night until I was about 15 because my mother was so freaked out about what happened that night that she did not tell me about it until then. Only then did it come out in conversation. She said that sometime during the night, While her and my father were asleep on one bed, and I was asleep on the other, at about 3 or 4 in the a.m., I sat straight up and proceeded to scream. She said that my father tried to console me, but I would not stop. And the worst thing about it was, was that I did not sound like a small girl. She said I sounded like a grown woman in agony. After a second or two of my father trying to speak to me, to calm me down, Nothing seemed to work, so he had no choice but to shake me violently. He said that I looked at them and laid back down like nothing even happened. Mom said her and her dad stayed up the rest of the night, and all was well. However, when we arrived at my aunt's house during dinner, my mother brought up the subject, and she explained to my aunt in detail what had happened. My mom said my aunt froze, and looked across at my uncle. That was when she proceeded to tell me about the trench coat man. My mom asked, who was the trench coat man? She said last night, while she was sleeping, and while that incident was occurring with her daughter, she was awakened by a trench coat man, a dark figure in a trench coat, of course. He was just staring at her. My aunt then described the eyes that she saw. This man had crystals in his eyes, as if his eyes were so cold, like he didn't care about anybody. So this dark trench coat man, blurred figure, with glowing glacial eyes, kept staring at her until he eventually disappeared, five seconds after. That was when my aunt screamed, and my uncle woke up, asking what was the matter. Of course, 
Bowels on my aunt went on to explain seeing the presence of this man. After thinking long and hard about the incident, I'm able to conclude that this was a paranormal incident that occurred telepathically. I must have detected that something was wrong with my aunt, and I guess I was trying to scream to let someone know that something was wrong at the moment. Even though I was not conscious, and I had no idea what was going on at the moment, the real question i really like to know is, who was that trench coat man? What was he doing talking to my aunt? Or what did he want from her? I know a lot of people are going to say this is a load of bull. And believe me, I really wish it was too. But the fact of the matter is, it actually happened. Ghosts are real. And you don't want to come face to face with them. This is just a collection of experiences I've had. And I don't know if they go together or make any sense at all. First was when I was about eight, and me and some of my friends were out in the backyard telling ghost stories. All of a sudden, we heard a deep voice slowly calling our names. It seemed to come from behind a shed in the backyard, and we all ran away from it. We ran into the house, and then calmed down, thinking it must have been my father. But then I realized my father was at work, and all of our neighbors were pretty up there in age, and I doubted they even knew our names. We were calming down in my room when I looked out the window, and about 200 feet away in an empty field, I saw the outline of what seemed to be a man, but was totally black. But it was in the middle of the day. I couldn't even speak. I finally yelled as it was walking away, and I think when I yelled, it turned and looked back at me. I never saw it again, and even writing about this, is bringing tears to my eyes. The other experiences I had were in the same room in my grandma's house. When I was young, I used to sometimes go to my grandmother's and stay for a weekend or a night. One night, I was sleeping, and I got up half asleep in some sort of confusion of hearing something in the hallway. I looked down the hall, and there seemed to be a shadow of a tall man against the curtains, with moonlight shining through them. I wasn't scared like the first time, but I actually felt like this man was watching over me. And for some reason, I had a weird feeling it was my great-grandfather. The other time, when I was about 16, I was actually living in that room because I had moved out of my parents' house temporarily. It was a typical night. I laid down to go to sleep, but was having some trouble. I finally started to get drowsy, and I rolled over onto my other side. And then out of nowhere, I hear my name whispered urgently into my ear. I even felt the air. I jumped up, and no one was there. I had the door closed. But my grandpa was somewhat of a jokester, so I thought maybe he was pulling a prank. So I got up and looked down the hall, and I saw him and my grandma in bed watching TV. He may be a prankster, but I doubt he can run that fast. I'm 18 now, and I haven't seen or heard anything weird since, but I also don't spend very much time at my grandma's house anymore. Thanks for reading. I've been pondering where to begin and which experiences to prioritize. I decided to begin at the beginning and submit separate accounts of my experiences chronologically. In other words, I've got many stories to share. I've read nearly half of the stories on this site, which is a really worthwhile form, and I hadn't realized that much of what I've brushed off, for whatever reason, is something that matters to others enough to write about it. My experiences are not earth-shattering compared to what many have endured, but I think they're worthy of reading about. When I was about seven years old, my mother became involved with her friend's Jehovah's Witness study group. Now that I look back on it, I might want to mention that this was in the mid-70s, and my parents and those friends, a couple, were classic long-haired hippies, and they did their share of the stoner scene. My mother and Grace, her friend, were in a study group with Grace's mother-in-law, 
and all older white-haired, straight-laced women. They eventually ended up at our house to study, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Theory is this. My mother, who was raised strictly Catholic, was going to become a nun, only to do as her grandmother, Granny, wished. They were very close, and my mother wanted to make Granny proud. That all went out the window when she met my father. She thinks that the opposing forces seemed very interested in having her on their side, kind of like vying for her soul. I know it sounds far out, but I kind of believe it, from witnessing and experiencing the darker aspects of it as a result. She also had many, many, many things happen to her all of her life that make my story seem lame. It is prevalent on the maternal side of my family to have had experiences with the otherworldly beings. Anyway, shortly after my mother started fraternalizing with the study group, something sickening started to happen in our house. We had the fold-up, pull-down type of chairs to the attic in our living room ceiling. There was a door at the top of them, but it wasn't at the head of the stairs, as this area was open. Instead, for some reason, it was opposite. If one were to walk around to the back of the attic, open this door, and proceed through it, they'd fall into the living room through the opening in the ceiling. Well, this door started to be slammed with a force that shook the entire house. It scared the living hell out of us. It was really that horribly violent. My parents pulled down the stairs, and this door was ajar. They shut it. It kept happening often. They somehow tied the door shut by the knob. It still happened. But worse, the windows literally shook. Pull the stairs down. It was still tied shut. One day, during the late summer, the group was over at our house, doing whatever prayer stuff they do. My father was at work, and my older brother, Grace's kids, and I, were playing outside. He heard screaming coming from inside the house. He ran inside to hear the attic door slamming beyond what any door should sound like, in this horrid, guttural growling noise coming from up there. It just sounded that awful, that no one can convince me that whatever it happened to be was ever human. Everyone ran screaming out of the house, to their cars, and they were telling my mother to get us too, and get out of that house. Well, we left for a little while, but my mother decided we couldn't be homeless, so we went home. Not my idea of a good time. It continued to happen, usually lasting five or so minutes. It happened at least once a night. Well, my mother had an experience shortly after we had gone back to school. She claims that when she was home alone in the living room, with the windows open, the air just went silent. No birds chirping, no chipmunks, no locusts buzzing, nothing. We all lived in the country, away from any other houses. She said she started hearing the sound like a vacuum cleaner. It got louder and louder and seemed to pulsate. It filled the room, and the walls looked as if they were buckling and waving. She smelled this horrid, rotting stench, and she kind of knew she was in for something pretty awful. She ran into her room. I'd have run the hell out of the house and jumped into her bed. She pulled the covers over her head. She said she heard something walking slowly across the living room towards her doorway, which was open. She was just praying, not daring to look. It sounded to her as if we were dragging a heavy cloak behind it and it was breathing extremely heavy. It was nearly at her bed, and she was just about dying of fear when apparently our school bus pulled up and it dissipated. She'd apparently had enough. She took any religious materials she had brought into the house from the group, not including her Bible that she had gotten from Granny, which she kept, and burned it in the fire pit out back. I remember being upset when she took both my brothers and my books, which I guess you could say was like kids' versions of Bibles. They were small, pink, hardcover books, and they had pictures and were easy to understand for me at that reading level. 
I absolutely loved to read, and it didn't matter what it was. I cried, but they got burned anyway. Well, I got over it soon, as nothing more of that nature ever happened at that house. It left as quickly as it came. It was evil. I strongly believed demonic, and it seemed like it was satisfied that my mother quit the group and burned the literature associated with it. It was not associated with the house. It came with a purpose, and left having achieved its goal. The only other thing I associate with this battle of good and evil of my mother happened when I was in 7th grade. I was trying to sleep, totally different house, but I swore my bed was shaking. I just figured I was being stupid, but it got worse. Still, I tried to dismiss it. It got bad enough to where I became scared crapless. I got up and went out to the living room. I startled my mother. She asked me what was wrong. I told her, and she got these big, weird-looking eyes, like she said she was spooked. She said, oh my god, I was just reading the Bible. She rarely opened it, for fear of bringing something on. Well, I was just fine with her not reading it. If it was going to target me to get to her, I just wanted to be left out of the whole thing. I know that probably sounds ignorant, but I truly felt it was demonic, and it scared me out of my mind. After what happened, I felt anything bad might just pop up at any time. Even though I'm not close to my mother, haven't spoken to my family in about 14 years. My heart does go out to her on whatever her spiritual fate is to be. She's not the best person, but she isn't inherently evil. Just a broken, miserable woman from years of abuse by both her father and my father. This experience added to my strength from any traditional religion. All I knew of Christianity was what my mother told us as kids and some of what I read in my pink Bible-like Bible book, and it wasn't much. I'd always had my own thoughts about the whole heaven and hell concept, but I was afraid of burning in this hell if I strayed from it. It just didn't sit right with me. It always scared me, including the concept of God. My concept of him was that he was very quick to punish anyone who had their own free thoughts and let people roast. At the drop of a hat, I always felt spirituality shouldn't be a frightening experience, but I didn't have the hair on my butt when I was young to explore my inner beliefs. I was never baptized, and I suppose I'm pagan, if anything. It's confusing, but as much as I don't adhere to the whole Bible concept, I can't dismiss it for others. To end this story... I just want to thank you for taking the time to glimpse into my reality. I also have to acknowledge that some of you may have thought that much of it was due to my parents' use of weed, but myself and all of the others didn't imagine something so wretched. Rest assured, ladies of the study group wouldn't have been altered. The very last noteworthy thing of my mentioning, in accordance to the subject, is that I did later independently, and most unwillingly, encountered another demon-like thing when I was 19. Yes, quite another story. Please tune in. I've experienced quite a bit throughout my life when it comes to the paranormal. And it all started at my old childhood house. It was a three-bedroom, one-bathroom home in Garden Grove, California. If you were to drive by and look at this house, it's cute, and it's a little home in a good environment. However, the things I've experienced sparked my interest and curiosity about the afterlife. Everything in every room in the house felt awkward whenever I walked into it. I shared the middle bedroom with my younger brother, who was only four at the time. Once a month... I would have a nightmare of a girl sitting on her picket fence with red eyes aglow, staring at me with such a playful expression. She didn't seem happy that her family was there. Nonetheless, us kids. The strange part about that was 
Whenever I would have these awful dreams, I would wake up to find my little brother crying as if someone had really hurt him. I never really took the nightmare seriously, though. We had an old, rusty swing set that we loved so much. I was only 10 at the time. During the daytime, everything would be fine and no strange feelings would occur. However, once nighttime falls, our backyard would be off limits. My mom wouldn't let us go to the back and play on summer nights, and she, well, never told us why. One night, my mom forgot to turn off the water hose, so she kindly asked me if I would do it for her. The idea of it was already bothering me, but I didn't take anything paranormal into consideration. So, I went down, straight to the back of the house, and the walk there felt like eternity itself. I had a strong, eerie feeling that I was being watched and even followed. I bent down to turn off the hose and had a fear so strong that it made me tear up. I ran into the house and swore never to do the favor for my mother again. What made this incident particularly eerie was the fact that I swear I heard a sobbing. It was like in my mind, but I swear it was outside. In another awkward time, my mom was taking a shower, and I was in my room watching TV with my little brother. I heard her call my name, so I came to see what she wanted. She asked if I could go to the towel cabinet and grab her one. When I did, I walked up to the door in pure darkness, and I swear I saw a ghostly hand, but it was still a woman's hand with red fingernails. I immediately thought it was my mom's hand at first. The strange thing was, it was translucent. Like I said, a ghostly hand. But I mean, you could see right through this person's hand. So, naive as I was, I thought I said mom, and instinctively handed her the towel. The towel dropped to the ground, and the hand disappeared. My mom then opened the door and looked at me, saying, Barbara, what are you doing, honey? That's when I told her I was giving you the towel you wanted. My mom looked at me with such confusion and said, You know I was in the kitchen, right? When I look back at that incident, I know it terrifies me now. But at that moment, I was simply not afraid. I just chalked it up to something non-paranormal, and maybe my eyes were just playing tricks on me. But at that moment, it was pretty obvious that I was both hearing and seeing things come to life. Paranormal things at that. There was much more that went on in that house. Such as, if you are sitting in the living room watching TV, at the corner of your eye, you will see a dark figure walking up to the front door. Immediately, you would assume someone was here. So, you trot over to the door to find that no one is there. It happens almost every week to everyone in my family. I love that house, but I didn't love being found or the feeling of being watched while taking a bath. After spending most of my childhood in that house, we moved to another city nearby. Now this house is quite dramatic. I'm 19 years old now, and I lived in Georgia for three years to finish up school. Coming back, strange activities started happening, especially in my new room. My grandfather passed away three years ago, and my room used to be his room. At night, Getting home from my boyfriend's house, I would hear the floor creaking. I just assumed there was someone walking around, but to find that no one was out there at all. I remember one night, laying on my bed with the lights out, and just the TV glaring. I fell asleep, and woke up to see a pair of transparent, veiny legs pointing in my direction. I knew immediately who they belonged to. Grandpa. Grandpa was watching over me, and that didn't, and still doesn't scare me. But there's another presence in the house. A girl, I assume. I came one night from staying at my boyfriend's the previous night. 
I left the door open because I was planning on changing and going to say hi to my parents. While changing, I have a habit of looking at the door to see if anyone will walk by and see me change. So, I looked a few times, and when I looked the last time, at the right side of my door, I swear I saw the apparition of a girl, her bright blue eyes, glowing and bulging right at me through the crack of the door. The eyes then disappeared. I trotted to the door, looked to my right, and nobody was there. Just then, it was my teenage cousin, Diane, but I looked towards the left, the left side of the hallway, and there she was. I was absolutely freaked out in that moment. Well, those were some documented instances of my family's paranormal history. I hope for future sake that I never have to experience any of this again, even though the first few incidences weren't that scary. And even my grandpa incident, yeah, I wasn't scared. However, if it were any kind of other ghost, like the one I was just talking about, I might be a little bit more frightened. I'd like to refer to this haunting as the haunting in Duxbury, Vermont. We bought the house from the niece of Leo Morse in the fall of 1999. Leo lived here his entire life. Shortly after we moved in, we heard strange footsteps on the second floor when we knew no one was up there. During one such incident, my husband, myself, my two children, and a couple friends heard someone walking across the floor in the upstairs bedroom as we all stood in the living room below. One night, when I was taking a bath, I was lying back in the tub with my eyes closed. I suddenly felt very uneasy, like someone was staring at me. I looked behind me to where the door was and saw this transparent mist, and it disappeared. Within a second, the door creaked open just an inch, and I screamed my head off. My son, while still in high school, had similar experiences of being watched by someone who couldn't be seen. Our television has also turned on by itself on more than one occasion. Our channels have changed, with the remote sitting out of everyone's reach. In the fall of 2007, my husband had just walked upstairs to go to our bedroom when I heard him hollering at someone and asking him what he wanted. We all ran upstairs to where my husband stood in the doorway to our bedroom. He was staring at the back wall of the other bedroom pointing to no one and yelling, tears in his eyes, for someone who no one else could see to get out. This lasted for several minutes until the man, who my husband said was in his early 30s, brown hair, clean-shaven with round, wire-framed glasses, dressed in a flannel shirt and blue jeans with the bottoms of the legs rolled into cuffs, disappeared. It was a very restless night that night. And my husband, who is not drunk or on drugs and isn't prone to hallucinations, doesn't like to talk about it much, but is very adamant that it truly happened. We haven't had any more sightings since then, but I still hear footsteps and unexplainable bangs and thumps coming from upstairs every morning after I get up. And I know my husband is still sound asleep in our room. My name is Andrea, I'm from New Mexico, and I'm 17. I've had numerous experiences throughout my life with the paranormal. I'll start from the beginning, I suppose. Before moving to Deming back in 2000, I lived in Hatch, which is about an hour away. We used to live in what was called the White Brick House, near the park, and not even a half mile from the schools. Hatch is very small. Anyway, living in the house was my mom, my very abusive dad, who I call Alex. I don't even call him dad. My two-year-old sisters, and my older brother, and me, the youngest. 
I don't remember the experiences in any specific order, but I remember them as if they happened yesterday. They are all very true. Believe if you want. We had a certain room called the back bedroom that no one really liked to go to, at least not alone. This room had an extremely strong presence in it, and it was only when you entered it you could feel its presence. You could stand in the doorway and look in the bedroom and feel nothing. But as soon as you stepped, that all changed. You feel like you're being watched by one great evil spirit or a great number of evil spirits. You would have to leave. It was so uncomfortable. We couldn't even get any of the dogs that we had throughout the time we lived there to enter that room. While there was that room, there was also other things that happened in the rest of the house. One night, my mom swears up and down this happened, and so does Alex. They were getting along. A rare occasion. I love these nights. My mom put all four of us to bed, so her and Alex had some alone time, and were relaxing together in the spa, talking one night. In the middle of their conversation, both my mom and Alex so the shadow of someone walked past the doorway of the spa room. My mom thought it was one of us that had gotten up in the night and went to check in on us, only to find us all snoring in bed. Her and Alex then asked us the next morning if we had gotten up, and none of us had. Another time, me and my oldest sister were playing in what we called the second kitchen that had a room off called the craft room. My mom paints ornaments in there. We suddenly smelled a strong perfume that didn't smell like any perfume made today. Then we heard a conversation between maybe four or five people. We looked in and saw five older upper class people in clothes from the early 1900s time. I remember one man specifically. He was bald with a brown beard and a looking glass eyepiece like the rich people will wear. Back in the day, he was wearing a black penguin-tailed suit with a white button up underneath. He looked somewhat pale, but not very transparent. He turned his head slowly and looked straight at me, not my sister, and nodded his head. Shortly after, he continued to speak with his company. I ran to my room and stayed there for the rest of the day. We had an organ in the living room along with a drum set and Alex's guitars. We're all musicians. Amps would turn on, even when they were unplugged. The organ played, as though a very experienced pianist were playing it. Piano was one thing none of us really learned how to play, so it was obvious none of us was playing it. There were times when the dogs would follow something we couldn't see, down the hallway to my room and Alex's room. My older brothers one night got up to get a drink of water in the second kitchen, and that's where the laundry room also was. He's 22 years old now, and still swears this is true. He saw a tall figure standing by the washer and dryer near the back bedroom, and he felt it as an evil being. It just stood there, glaring at him, but never moved, as if it was frozen, but with the evil expression looking at him. Wherever he moved, he figured it was Alex, he shouted out Alex's name, but didn't hear a response, so he figured he was mad and went back to bed. The next morning he asked Alex why he was so mad at him. Alex just looked at him and said he was at the bar. My other sister said she was walking by the back bedroom one night and swear she saw a black figure out of the corner of her eye standing straight up against the wall, and it tried to grab her with its arms, but couldn't reach, as if it was restrained. After Alex left, we moved out of the house and into a little apartment. There's only been one thing that has ever happened to me there. I got up in the middle of the night to get something to drink, and as I was going back to my room, I saw what looked like a little blue orb, glowing in intense blue. It moved around for a few minutes before ultimately dissipating into thin air. Aside from these apartments we lived in, we also moved into a trailer 
not too far from the white brick house. This house was always said to be haunted because the man who used to live there died of a heart attack in either the yard or the bathtub, and he had two dogs that died of mysterious causes after he did. It was almost as if they died of a broken heart. There would be nights when we could hear the clicking sounds of a dog's nail on the tiles. I was in my room reading one night when my whole dresser just fell over. No reason for it just to fall over. My friend and I, Rosario, and my sister were all in the living room one night when we heard a window shatter come from my room. We never found a single shard of broken glass in the house or even outside, even though the sound came from inside. Finally, I would always see the shadow of someone walk into the laundry room and no one would be there when I looked. All of these incidents were fairly alarming to all of us, and I'm convinced that they were being followed by the same evil spirit that resided in the red brick house. These days, I never experience any hauntings, and I'm very glad that this is all over. In the fall of 2001, my parents bought an old Victorian house in a quiet suburb. It was a huge relief for us because that year was a very tumultuous time for our family. We couldn't find a house that was affordable and nearly every house we found in the area was either in need of major repairs or super expensive. When we moved into this home, there had been mumblings around town that nobody wanted it due to its supposed hauntings. By the way, I'm 21. The house had a history of violence and death. The city is very safe now, but years ago, it was considered one of the worst cities to live in. It was said that a man who had lived his entire life as a loner took up residence in the house in the early 1920s. One night, he apparently hired a prostitute to stay the night with him. She was unaware that he had no money to pay her for her services. He led her into the kitchen, playing off that he had some spare cash lying around the house. He ultimately ended up strangling her to death and chopping up her body. She was apprehended months later and ended up dying in prison. When the cops questioned him, all he could say was that he needed love. In the first months, we had stereotypical noises that any house would make and dismissed it as nothing more than just noises. However, doors would open and close, lights would flicker on and off, and there was this funky odor that always seemed to linger throughout the house. It was very hard to describe, but it smelled a lot like rotten eggs on a very subtle level. The most terrifying thing that occurred was when I was in the kitchen in the middle of the night. It was about 11 p.m., and I had just come home from work and entered the front hallway of the house at first. That's when I heard whispers, which sounded like the word lonely. I figured I was just exhausted from a long day's labor, so I decided I needed to get to bed. But before I did, I fixed myself something to eat in the kitchen. I walked into the kitchen, but that's when I heard moaning sounds, almost like someone was struggling. As I sat on the chair by the kitchen table, I saw the transparent figure of a woman with an anguished look on her face. She appeared for a few moments, then disappeared. She looked like she was from another era and wore all black. Her face looked disfigured and beaten. It terrified the living hell out of me. So I ran upstairs to get my parents. I guess I just needed some comforting. And I found out they weren't home yet. There were other incidents that occurred in the house. My mom actually told me that she was in the laundry room. When she could distinctly hear the sounds of a growling man in the laundry room late at night. This was something that seemed to happen quite frequently around the same time. And always only in the laundry room nowhere else. It was never something really loud and startling. It was always faint, but insanely scary. There were times that we would see two shadows in the corner of our eyes, constantly walk back and forth 
from the kitchen to the living room. Again, this was subtle. When anybody would actually turn to directly look, these shadows would be gone. Most of the time, we always thought it was just our eyes playing tricks on us. And even after my incident, I still thought that. Anyway, that's my story. It might not be too exciting compared to others, but it is creepy and insane. I'm glad I don't live in that house anymore. Sadly, my parents still do, but it seemed that nothing happens anymore, besides the subtle doors creaking open slowly from time to time, and the continuation of lights flickering. Thanks for reading. My family and I took a trip to Tennessee in the summer of 08. We went all over the place, such as Jackson and Nashville, on our second to last day before we left to go home. My family decided to go to Franklin because we had picked up a brochure of haunted places in Tennessee, and so we went to humor me because I was interested in hauntings at the time. This city, not known to most people, is actually the site of the bloodiest battle of the Civil War, even worse than Gettysburg. There are two houses that were the main sites. One of them was the Carnton Plantation, which is the setting to my story. The plantation was creepy enough when we drove up to it without even knowing the history. When I got out of the car, I looked up at the house and noted how beautiful it was. Then my attention was averted to the balcony on the second floor. There, standing on it, was a man. He was clearly dressed in a Civil War uniform, though I quite can't remember which color, and I could clearly see that he had a beard covering his jawline. He stood there with his arms behind him, as if he was gazing out, overlooking troops. Of course, at the time, not knowing any of the history, I thought it was just the tour guide taking a break out on the balcony. I even hoped he was going to be my family's guide. Later, once we're on the tour, I noticed that none of the employees were dressed like 19th century citizens. Of course, then we got the history of the place, and I understood why this place was considered haunted. When the battle itself was both going on, and when it was over, injured soldiers were treated inside of the house. So many, in fact, that there are stains of blood inside of the house that will not come out of the floor. Many soldiers obviously died inside of the house. When we continued our tour upstairs, we entered a room with a door to the balcony. This is where I learned that no one was allowed out on the balcony. This confused me since I'd seen that man out there. When the guide took the group into the room across the hall and began talking, I couldn't pay attention. The closet in the other room kept grabbing my attention because it had a piece of black cloth in it. Finally, I tried to keep myself focused, and it was going well, until a gentleman in the group got bored and decided to go out into the hall. I watched him leave, thinking that it was very rude and should come back. For some reason, when he left, I noted that the sun was in a position that didn't cast a shadow of the man's head on the hallway wall. Once again, I turned my attention back to the guide, but the man in the hallway began to wander in the hall, and that distracted me. When I turned to watch the man, there was suddenly a very clear and defined silhouette of a man's head and shoulders with a bearded face that traveled across the wall, then just disappeared. It startled me at first, then I got excited because I thought I must have seen a ghost. Then I thought no. I have to be practical about this, because that man is out in the hallway. Once the tour guide was done talking, I went outside into the hallway way. The first thing I noticed was that any shadow from the tourists on the wall wasn't that dark or defined. Then I noticed that the way the sun was facing caused the shadows to be cast in a completely different wall. The silhouette I saw couldn't have been from anyone on the tour. Then I noticed that there was an upstairs where I thought maybe an employee could be working. That theory was completely dismissed when it appeared no one was up there. 
There wasn't any logical explanations for the silhouette. It wasn't until my family returned home a few days later that I decided to research what I had seen. After discovering that there was a frequent spirit there that was called the General, I made the connection. The details from past eyewitness accounts were identical to mine. He stands out on the porch, has a Civil War uniform on, and has a beard on his face. I was, and still am convinced, that I saw the General on that day. This took place shortly after I turned 16. My dad was working up in Oregon and Washington, but was based out of Rainier. I went up to live with him, I guess, just to do something different. I was used to being around the city type of atmosphere, and it wasn't too long before I grew bored. Not that the Oregon country girls in the area didn't stir my blood. It's just that they mainly wanted to waste their time getting high or drunk Tipping cows are shooting the passing ships going down the Columbia River, which I don't mind. I just miss the city lights or something. Anywho, I'd been out partying with a friend and drove off the side of a mountain. Another story, which would take a while to go through. And I thought my dad was probably going to kill me anyway, without benefit of blindfold and a last smoke. So I decided to hitchhike back to Oklahoma. Needless to say, I lacked understanding of just how far I was from Oklahoma. My newfound compadre decided to go along because he had gotten in recent trouble with his folks and wanted out of town too, so we took off. Somewhere between Portland and the Dells on I-84, which was only a two-lane at that spot, we were really tired and looking for a place to sleep. By this time, I'd found out that this hitchhiking thing wasn't for me, and it really should be called a lot of hiking and not enough hitching, or something similar. And what seemed weird was that out in the middle of nowhere, the fences were really well kept, and I didn't want to get cut up climbing one. No houses, no anything. It was simply just nice fences. Anyway, we found a rather peevish-looking fence about three-fourths of a mile before a bend in the road. The moon was out, and actually lit up the area pretty well. There was about three-fourths of a mile behind us from the last turn in the road, and like I said, about the same in front of us before the next one. We were in a valley or whatever they're called that the road went through, and it was really a beautiful sight. Just as we're fixing the jump the fence, a car came around the bend from in front. Of course it was too far off to see us when it rounded the bend, but we didn't want it to see us climbing the fence when it came abreast of us, like the owners of the land were out cruising in the middle of the night. The sides of the road in that area sloped down at a very sharp right and were gravel, at least on our side of the road, so we didn't have to go far to be below the grade of the road and out of sight of passing motorists. It went down probably 15 feet, though, well below the road. Come to think of it, I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like that since. Just as we were sliding down the slope out of sight, I caught sight of something way down the road, just the side of the curve. The lights of the oncoming car caught it, just as it was making the curve. Whatever it was went down the embankment on the opposite side of the road from us. I asked my friend if he saw it, and he said yes, he saw something. After the car passed, we peeked over the top of the road, and right when we started to climb back onto the roadway, because we decided we didn't want to sleep in that area anyway, we saw what appeared to be two guys pushing a motorbike climb up where we saw it go off before. This was still about three-fourths of a mile at least off, down the hill near the curve. We slid back down the slope, out of sight. I really don't know why. Then we kind of just looked at each other. A motorbike? We both looked at the incline behind us. If you pushed a motorbike off the side of the road down this embankment, you'd have a heck of a time stopping it before it went all the way down, and the river was on their side and even a harder time getting back up. 
I couldn't imagine trying to get it back up to the road, assuming it didn't go into the river. We both peeked over the top, breathing really quiet and shallow, watching for another couple of minutes, when all of a sudden, it stood up. It wasn't two guys pushing a motorbike. It was something that had been on all fours, and stood up, and it was huge, at least twice as tall as us, and by the way, we weren't midgets. I almost crapped myself. I started looking around, and the fence, by this time, was looking mighty small. Thinking really fast in that fight or flight mode, and the flight was definitely the way I was leaning towards, I realized that, thank God it had been his turn to carry the backpack, which would slow him down, and had the only food we had in it, and on top of that, I thought I could outrun him. Maybe it wouldn't want both of us. I looked at him, saw the panic in his eyes, and knew he was thinking along the same lines. I knew I couldn't run. I also knew that I had the senseless when it got directly across from us. I pulled out my little pocket knife. I knew that we're going to die. And all I could think of was, Lord, please let it be quick. I peeked over the top again and it was almost even with us. I might have whimpered, silently of course, but I also noticed that the wind was blowing in my face from his direction. There might be hope. We ducked back down, and we could hear it almost stop right across from us for a moment or two, then start on up the road again. It was almost the curve up the hill from us from the direction we had originally came from, when another car came around the bend downhill. I thought about jumping out in front of it and yelling for help, but if it didn't stop, then whatever that was would know that we were there. We waited, and it disappeared below the other side of the road, like before when the other car came. This time, it didn't come back up. I don't know how long we waited, but we finally climbed back up and continued down the hill and around the curve. We didn't say a word or breath, anything about a whisper, till we cleared that bend in the road and was a mile or two away. When we called the Dallas, we called our parents to come and get us. We'd had enough of the open road in Oregon. I don't know what that was, but I still think about it sometimes. I've had a few other things happen to me in my life, but that really scared me. My boyfriend and I saw the state park on our way from Arkansas to Illinois and thought we should check it out. We had never heard of this place or even seen it before. We parked in the parking area and got out of the car to explore the woods. Naturally, I had to use the restroom, so I went to the bathroom and once I got to the toilet, I had a terrible feeling of being watched and I truly felt like someone was in the bathroom with me, but obviously, I was the only one. The feeling of this presence was so unbearing and evil that I ran out of the bathroom the second I finished with my pants down. Once I got out of the bathroom, my boyfriend and I started down the path. Within 30 seconds of walking, and still within 30 feet of the bathroom, my boyfriend and I heard a loud footstep crunching the leaves, in fact, it was multiple footsteps. My boyfriend thought it was a bear or something because of the heftiness of the steps, so he was searching and searching for a bear or anything, but he couldn't find a thing. I didn't mention the bathroom to him, but after not too long, I insisted we continue. I know there is something terribly evil in that bathroom. For a while, nothing else ought occur and we continued on the path which goes down to level ground, with a large lake on one side. But soon after we got to this level ground area, the sun started settling, and that's when things got uneasy again. We both started to hear something large walking in the leaves again. Sean, my boyfriend, really wanted to see what it was, and at this point, I felt like we were really in danger, and that something else unnatural was there. So we barely started to move farther into the woods when Sean told me 
He saw a shadow. There's something farther in. Then, I was done. I told him we had to go, and I cannot be here any longer. So, I ran like hell back to the car, and Sean was close behind me. Once we got to the car, I was at the passenger door, ready for him to unlock it. And of course, he tells me that he hears that thing we've been hearing in the sparsely wooded area, directly in front of the parking lot, which is to the very right near the parking lot, and that he has to see what it is. So, I had him throw me the keys, and I got in the car. He got in within a minute, and I asked him if he saw anything, and he said he just saw that a dark shadow moved behind a tree, but nothing else. Needless to say, we booked it off that mountain, and it really seemed like a car was trying to chase us down the mountain, but we may have just been super spooked from the woods experience we just had, but I will note, we were driving at about 65 miles an hour, and the speed limit was way less. I forget now it was specifically, but I want to say between 30 and 40 max. Plus, it was a mountain road, and very windy, and frankly, difficult to traverse at 65. Also, during the time I was taking pictures, the whole time we were in the woods, nature shots, that was actually the entire reason we were there in the first place, and the pictures were neat. The day ones didn't have orbs, but the night ones all did, and I thought maybe it was from the lake reflection or something, but I took a picture out of the car window at the moon, right after we got in the car, and in that photo, there's the moon and like 30 orbs. It's amazing to me. I mean, I've never taken any orb photo ever before, and I took another photo of the moon out my window about 30 minutes after we left the mountain, and only the moon. I did some research to find anything on the area. It seems it was established in an old Indian burial ground, but few findings on much else, and I never found anything on cars chasing you out of this place. Be careful. During the day, the bathroom is really the worst part, and seemingly off the trail, but I just wouldn't go at night. And also, Sean didn't seem to have the feelings as intensely as I did, so if you're the right person, the feeling might not be too overwhelming. I was thinking about my dog last night, as he was put away a few years ago, and the immediate remembrance of a very weird experience me and my dog had in my home, in Tallahassee. This home, prior to any construction behind us, was all wooded landscape and ran into Lake Jackson. Within this wooden area were several Indian burial mounds. One day, shortly after I moved there for a new job, I took my dog for a walk, unleashed, back in the woods. I saw those mounds, but really did not know that they were Indian burial mounds. My dog and I both walked over these mounds just being adventurers. When I returned from our walk, my neighbor asked me jokingly if I let my dog run loose back there, and my response was yes. He then stated that I would see a black bird perched somewhere soon in a tree close by, and that this bird would be watching me. I laughingly asked why, and he said that if we walked over those mounds, we would have possibly wakened the spirits, and that the bird was their watchful eye on me. Well, of course I thought this man was crazy, but he was actually a very nice and intelligent man as I learned later. So only about two days later, I returned home from work, and I recall thinking about the black bird that he told me, so I peeked around the left side of the home to look into the wooded area, and lo and behold, there was a blackbird perched on a tree, staring at me. He would not take his eyes off either. Needless to say, that was creepy. So that very night, I was in my office, and my dog was usually laying in the living room by the fireplace. As I was doing my work in the office, my office chair was budged about two to three inches forward, with a force that felt like someone actually pushed the chair. I instinctively reached by, looking over my right side, 
expecting to see my dog. No dog. Nothing. So I quickly went into the living room, only to see my dog laying down facing the hallway entrance, which is where my office resided, as well as two other bedrooms. And he had his head between his paws, staring and growling at something in the hallway. Talk about getting freaked out. So I grabbed my dog by his collar and tried to lead him down into the hallway, and he resisted every attempt. He was scared, obviously, and he definitely saw or sensed something. I did not see anything at all. As I walked into each room through that hallway, I did not see or sense anything. Then I walked into the bathroom in the master bedroom to find that my candle, which was lit, went out. So that night, I kept all lights on. The following day, I came home and looked again for that weird bird. He was not there. So I took my dog outside to do his thing, but then noticed he was limping. Then he fell to his side with pain in the backyard. As I made the observation, I noticed that in his groin area, he had a large tumor-like bulge coming from this area. I immediately took him to the veterinarian, and I recall she had no explanation for it, but prescribed medication to reduce the swelling. Within two weeks or so, the swelling went away. Looking back at that, I really feel that the spirit, or whatever it was, made that happen, as my dog was still young and very healthy. After that week of weird occurrences, I never had anything further happen. I never told my neighbor what had happened, as I did not want to look silly or have rumors flying around. But for sure, I can tell you that I know in my own gut that what that neighbor told me came to life. Dogs can definitely sense or see these spirits, as we cannot apparently. Between the bird, the bump on my chair, my dog growling and acting scared, and the bulge in his groin area, all made sense that something was in that house. Never walked in those woods again. I no longer reside there either. This is a ghost entity, evil demon spirit, and whatever else was haunting our home, I can tell you, I will never forget what happened as long as I breathe air. We moved into this big house when I was 15. It had been empty for about 10 years. It had old, creaky wood floors and a ton of doors. Everywhere you turned in the house, there was a door. Don't ask, I still can't figure it out. It was a doctor's house. In the very back of the house is where he saw his patients. Yes, some died in the house in his office. Both my grandparents also died there. The very first thought we had activity, about 3 a.m. in the morning, there was someone banging on our front door. My grandfather would get up, and no one would be there. This happened all the time. We would drop our car keys in the glass bowl right when we walked in and they would be in a different part of the house. Things were always showing up all over the house. It likes to play tricks all the time. So many things happened, I can hardly recall them. All but this one, I will never forget in my life. I would love to forget it, but it just won't go away. I was 20 years old and just had a baby. I had my daughter in a bassinet beside my bed. I fell asleep watching Michael Jordan play basketball in the Olympics. My bed had a tall headboard that sat up against my bedroom window. I also had floor-to-ceiling curtains, very heavy curtains. The windows were shut, the curtains were shut too. I was sleeping on my back as I fell asleep to the TV. The TV was still on and the baby was fast asleep. All of a sudden, I felt a strong man's hand covering my whole face. He was trying to suffocate me. I was in panic mode. His grip on my face and nose was so tight that I couldn't breathe or scream. I was looking up at the ceiling thinking I'm going to die right there, right now. 
It seemed like an eternity, and I was losing my breath. Then, the phone beside my bed rang. It stopped. I jumped so far out of the bed across the room, and looked back thinking I was fighting off an intruder, and no one was there. I looked out the window. Nothing. I looked in the mirror, and I had a bright red handprint on my face. It was evil. It was an evil something. I was praying out loud for whatever it was to get the hell out of my house and leave me alone. I've never been that terrified in my life. Never. I looked out the window, and it was pitch black. I got the feeling like something was out there laughing at me or mocking me. The baby never woke up. It was her father on the phone. I told him what happened, but he thought it was a dream. I know from the start it was as real as I'm sitting here telling you today. Not long after that, my grandmother and grandfather died in the house on two separate occasions. I was left in this huge house all alone with my two children. They were one and just months old. The house was always freezing, no matter how high the heat was on. I would hear talking that I could never make out. Footsteps up and down the hallway, pinching, grabbing. The lights never worked. I changed the bulbs all the time. When I did the laundry where the old doctor's office used to be, I could feel a breath on my neck. I could see shadows of people out of the corner of my eye. It was a living nightmare. The energy was so thick and heavy, even on the brightest day. I was scared to death to be there alone and go home after work alone. I would just sit up with the TV on until I could fall asleep and pray to God that I didn't have to go to pee in the night. I was so scared to get up. The day I moved from that house was the happiest day of my life. I could have stayed there forever in that big house, but I wanted out. I still to this day 19 years later have vivid dreams of what happened. All the things I heard and all the things I saw. I've only told a few people this story. I've seen and felt both good and evil from a very, very young age. My nanny told me I had the gift of seeing and hearing spirits, like I was a light to them. I've had so many experiences I can't count. Most are very bad, but I have a couple that are good. I'm terrified of the afterlife. I pray that God carries me to heaven. If you don't believe, I'm telling you, there are things you can't see, but they can hurt you and make you so depressed you want to die. They can touch you, hurt you, and mock you, and laugh in your face. I know. Here's my story. It will be interesting to see what everyone else thinks of all this. I was at a friend's house listening to music tonight, Saturday, April 12th. He is a drinker, so he was feeling pretty good. He was at the computer with his back to me. I was on the couch directly in front of the TV, which was off. The only light on was right above the computer desk. To my right was the entryway, which was dark, pitch black actually, but I could see the reflection of the room and the TV. He was playing O oh Death from Brother Where Art Thou. Song itself gave me the creeps when suddenly I looked into the TV and saw a solid black figure of a tall man start to step out of the darkness of the entryway and into the living room. I didn't see anything like clothing or facial features, just tall and solid black. My friend at the same time swiveled his desk chair and pointed towards the entryway where he saw the figure. The figure stepped back into the dark as quickly as it appeared, as though it didn't want him to see it. I looked at him and said, Did you see that too? To which he replied, See what? He was only being animated during the song, but for sure didn't see anything. I've experienced several things at this house. He has not though and it upsets him. But what I experienced that evening was the most eerie 
and frightening thing for sure. I know it wasn't one of his friends, or someone goofing off. It isn't easy to walk into his house, through the front door, and not be heard. The floor is tile. We walked over, and turned on the light, and we both looked. There was no one there. I just went home. I couldn't stay there, and I begged him to come with me, but he wouldn't. A few days later when we talked, I asked him if he had ever had any seances or similar things in the house. He had first said no because it was his grandma's house, and he moved in about a year after she had passed. But then he paused, and then he said, well, remember when we cleaned out the attic? There was a Ouija board up there. Well, no, I didn't remember, and I told him to get his house cleansed, but he was just laughing at me. I've never been back to his house since that night. About two weeks later, he got an unintentional EVP, which is very eerie also. He has a voice-activated recorder, and was recording a couple of programs off the computer for a friend at work. He turned off the computer, and the TV isn't hooked up anyways, but when he woke up, there were three recordings instead of two on the recorder. I know he's pretty up on computers, but he didn't make this EVP himself. Actually, it scared him, and he said he wasn't going to listen to it anymore. Even though I'm not sure whether I do in fact believe in ghosts in the supernatural, I must be the ghost stories world's biggest fan and relentless reader, and have been a patron of your site for many, many years, at least a decade now. Like I said, not being totally sure whether I do actually believe in ghosts, I've never had a story of my own contribute to your website. However, over the past months, possibly years, certain things have happened in our current rented home. Occurrences in this house that made me think twice, maybe even three times about what I actually do and don't believe in. My husband Craig and I have been living in our rented home here in Melbourne, Australia for almost four years now. We rent privately and know very little about the house and its history, apart from the fact that we are private renters and the rent has always been almost ridiculously cheap. The house isn't that old, however. It would only be about 15 or 20 years old. We do know, however, that several of the last tenants that lived here, families with children, by the look of the wall drawings in the study and backyard, moved out fairly quick after moving in, which has always puzzled me, as the house isn't in that bad a shape. The neighborhood is okay, and the rent, like I said, has always been ridiculously cheap. Any questionable incident that has happened in this house has either taken place in the lounge room or the nursery. My daughter is now three months short of turning three. I remember one time when my daughter was tiny. She would have been six months old at the time. We put her to bed in her cot in her room. She's always been a fire alarm screamer. And on this particular day, after screaming for about 10 minutes, she quite suddenly stopped dead. Assuming that she had just fallen asleep, I walked outside into the backyard about 10 minutes later to feed the dog. I looked through her window subtly to make sure that all was calm in her room. When I noticed a very strange thing, my daughter did not look close to sleeping at all. She was in fact staring intently at the ceiling. I watched her eyes move from left to right and so forth, as if she was watching something very closely. But there was nothing there. Not thinking all that much of it, I went back inside and continued on with whatever I was doing, thinking that she was just boring herself off to sleep. A few weeks later, something very similar happened to this again, except this time, it was in the lounge room. Heidi was sitting with me on the couch. The family dog was also in the room, sitting by my feet, as Heidi all of a sudden started staring at the ceiling again with much the same intensity as before in our room. This time, the dog joined in, 
and was making much the same eye and head movements as Heidi was, as if they were both watching something on the ceiling move from side to side. The dog's hair then stood on the back of its neck, and he started growling, which frightened me, as he is one of the friendliest dogs in the world and wouldn't hurt a fly. Then, being a bit of a wimp, he got up and snuck into the next room and didn't come back for about a half an hour. This sort of thing has happened about three or four times since then, but nothing besides this has ever happened either. No apparitions or noises or banging. I've sometimes had the feeling, though, that we are not alone here. Nothing like this ever happens when my husband is at home, only when I am alone or with Heidi. A couple of days ago, it happened again. Heidi started off by staring at the ceiling, and then her gaze diverted to her toy basket in the corner of the room. She looked at me, smiled, looked back at the toy basket, pointed, and yelled, Baby! The word baby doesn't necessarily mean baby to Heidi. She calls newborns babies, as well as toddlers up to about her own age. I asked her where, Heidi? Where is the baby? There, she persisted. There, baby. I shrugged and looked away again and hoped to dear God that she would stop pointing and looking at that darn toy basket. She did, thankfully. After only about a minute or so this time. What do you honestly think about this? Fluke? Or something more than just imaginative child playfulness? This website has mentioned dark, powerful energies such as imps. And I noticed the creator of this website has seen what could be called imps. Imps are described as devil spirits, or demons in small in stature. I've had many experiences throughout my life like the one the web creator had growing up. I don't like talking about them so much and do my best to keep it dormant, but I did read their story, and I've had an experience with a small black figure that sounds like one of the imps described in that story. Me, my daughter, and my wife all used to sleep in the same bed, till our little girl was one and a half years old. Around the time my daughter was that age, I remember staying up till close to 1 or 2 a.m. watching a long movie. When I was finished, I went to the room and turned on the bathroom light to brush my teeth. Our room was well lit from the bathroom. Since around the age of three, I've had dealings with spirits as well. So... When I was about halfway through my brushing, I pretty much knew from that feeling I had that something was happening. I looked in the room where my daughter and wife were sleeping, and color from behind my daughter in a fetal position was a small black figure. It looked human, but it moved, behaved, and felt like it was something else. It looked towards me, got on all fours, and scurried across the bed lightning fast. I kind of jumped back, but it disappeared when it hit the floor. The strange thing was, after I got into bed, my daughter, eyes closed, still asleep, did the exact same thing the figure did before I went to bed, only my daughter stopped with her still sleeping face right in mine, then laid back down and was normal again. Some other things started happening after that, but I don't know if they're related. I hope my story helps you figure out what these things are. My story begins about three years ago. I was 27, and me and my husband were expecting our first child. We had been living with his mother, but since I had become pregnant, we needed a place of our own. My parents owned two houses, one in which they lived in, and the other right behind theirs. My oldest brother and wife and children used to live there, but he bought the house right next door to my parents. Always wanted to stay close to our family. We're very close. Now that the house behind my parents was unoccupied, my mother asked me to move in. 
my husband and I gladly accepted. We would have more room and a place of our own. Well, the very next day we moved in, I was about 41 weeks pregnant and needed to go to the hospital to be induced for labor. We had a healthy baby boy. After our stay in the hospital, we returned to our new home. About four to six weeks after we moved in, I started hearing a noise in the middle of the night coming from the closet in our bedroom. My husband worked graveyard shift most nights at the time, so I was alone at night with our son a lot. The noise was that of the closet door opening. I had put a long rectangular mirror on the closet door, those that are about one foot wide and four feet long. It had two hooks that went over the top of the door, so as to hang the mirror. So every time you opened it, it would screech very loudly, since the metal hooks rubbed against the door frame. Well, like I said, about four to six weeks after we moved in, I heard this very loud screech at about 2.30 to 3 a.m. I woke up and realized it was the closet door opening. It opened about four inches. We had two chinchillas that slept on the floor at the end of the bed, and I just rationalized it to one of them opening the door with their paw. But I know that would have to take some effort, since the metal hooks over the top of the door made it hard to open, and would make the door get stuck. I didn't really get scared. I just looked, then went back to sleep. About two weeks later, again, me asleep, alone, middle of the night. Then the screeching sound of the closet door opening. I woke up, and this time, sat up and looked at the closet door. What just happened? I checked on my baby in his bassinet next to my bed, and he was fast asleep. I looked at the chinchillas. They were awakened too, and looking at the closet door but had not moved. So again, I felt no fright and went back to sleep. Again a few weeks later, my husband had a day off, so he was home that night. And again, about 2 or 3 a.m., the screeching noise of this closet door being pushed open from the inside. My husband wakes up and just stares at the door. Now he saw firsthand what I had told him about. The last time this happened was some weeks after that. Again, I was alone at night. I heard the screeching sound of the door opening, only it sounded like it opened a little bit wider than just four inches this time. I sat up and looked at the door. The chihuahuas were staring at the closet door as well. This time, they stood up. Then the closet door started opening a little bit further still. That set the chihuahuas off. One was barking at the closet door like there was no tomorrow, and the other ran under the bed crying and howling. Their reaction is what scared me the most. My heart was racing. I put my head under the covers. The closet door didn't open further, but it took me forever to get back to sleep. After that night, I was scared of the closet. I told my husband, and he put a lock on the door. I closed it and locked it every night. I didn't open it again. Only one thing happened after that. About a year later, the closet door became increasingly harder to close. It would get stuck, and I would really have to push to close it completely. One Sunday night, about 7.30 p.m. this time, I again was home alone. My husband was working, and my son was with my parents in the house in front of ours. I was watching some TV, and I didn't like to leave the closet door open anymore. So I walked over to the closet door to try and close it completely. I was really pushing, and I started banging on the door with my fist to try and close it. It was almost closed. Then, while I was banging with my fist, right on the other side of the door there was a loud bang as if someone hit it with their fist. It was right on the spot I was hitting it. I could feel the vibration against me. I stepped away from the closet door. I tried to stay calm. I'll try to sit down and watch some TV, I told myself. I sat down, 
but could not keep my eyes off the closet door. After about 30 seconds, I decided I couldn't stay in the house any longer. I left my parents' house in front of mine and left the TV on. Why did that scare me so much? I was fine when the closet door would open in the middle of the night. Was it because I was so sleep deprived from having an infant son that it was so easy for me to go back to sleep? The fact that I heard the banging on either side of the closet unnerved me so much. Thinking back, I remembered when I was 14 and my brother first moved in the very same house with my then four month pregnant sister-in-law and her four month year old daughter from a previous marriage. I remember shortly after they moved in, her telling me she thought the house was haunted. I asked why, and she told me that at night, she would see the closet doorknob rattle and turn. Oh, it's just her imagination, I told her. Even at 14, I would rationalize everything. I guess it wasn't her imagination after all. I later asked my niece, now 21, if she ever saw anything. She told me she did, which I later write about. This is something completely different to my experience, and I think it had something to do with her, and not the house. She also used to tell me that the closet door used to open in front of my brother until he confronted it. Then it stopped. Thank you for taking the time to read my story. I live about 20 minutes from an old covered bridge in Mableton, Georgia. This is one of the places I've been to in the surrounding area and where I had the most happen. In 2004, we went on a last minute hunt to the bridge. I know you're supposed to be better prepared, but I kept most of my things in the car at all times, just in case. We of course had heard the local legends and wanted to see for ourselves. So we headed down after about midnight. Even then, the traffic on the road was just heavy enough that we were unable to try the chocolate thing with the car. So we parked up the road a ways away at the Comet Trail parking lot. We walked down and took our flashlights with us. On either side of the bridge are orange street lights, so the bridge is lit up all the way through. One in the group brought her cousin and I didn't realize at first that he had been drinking, or he would have stayed behind. He got up in one of the bridge's windows and peed into the creek below. After yelling at him to stop, I realized I could no longer see the lights on either side of the bridge. Our flashlights also stopped working, all of them. After the temperature dropped and it became dark the way it did, I told others it was time to leave. We then saw the streetlights turn on for a second, and then in the distance, at the other end of the bridge, two kids dressed in formal attire, standing and hand-holding. Had to be about 30 seconds, but we saw it. We froze, then started back to the car as we walked out of the bridge. We heard what sounded like little kids laughing, and they actually touched and poked at our backs, as we hurried as fast as we could, back up the hill. One of our group reported hearing a voice in his ear telling him to run. I have to say it was unsettling, and though I haven't been back to the bridge yet, it hasn't stopped me from going to other places. I've heard voices and gotten pics, and even had things happen at other sites. This one was one of the best ones, because I don't get physically touched by them often. I also believe nothing would have happened if he had not upset the spirits the way he did. I'm very much more careful about who I bring with now. Only one town over from our home stands one of the largest and most ornate railway stations in our state. The owners worked over 20 years bringing it back from neglect in a time gone by as their second love is antiques. They have decorated it with period pieces throughout, now opened it as an outstanding restaurant. My husband and I often bring friends there to enjoy not only the wonderful food, 
for the pleasure of watching them jump as the Amtrak fly by, only feet from the window. There is a very small organ that has been placed on a wall, not far from where we often sit. Several meals ago, our waitress entertained us by telling, some people have commented there is a ghost attached to this instrument. One said she saw a very small, frail old lady standing by it, saying, this isn't right, indicating dismay as to how her organ came to be sitting in an eatery. The waitress went on to say, they never like to work alone when closing up, as there's so many unexplained noises. We enjoyed a meal there today, and as always, our conversation turned into the many thousands of people now gone that passed through these massive arched doors. Out of nowhere, I smelled a very strong odor of ivory soap. Mind you, we are eating fish, no one is passing by, and the other tables haven't changed their patrons. I say nothing, but a moment later, my husband smells it and says how weird it is. Such an uncommon smell today. It lasted for about three minutes. There was no explaining the smell. As we finish, we wander through the hall looking at various rail-related antiques and move on to the outside. There's an Amtrak train on the track, but it is going slow. Strange, as they usually are speeding enough for an onlooker to feel their wind as they pass, heading for Boston. It comes to a complete stop at the station. A man in uniform gets out and looks at the front and then under. Turning to us, he says he thought he saw someone laying on the track. He walks about, making a full inspection. Then he gets in, and then starts going. We see the riders in their seats. But as we watch, he stops again, just down the track, and repeats the inspection again. Strange day. This place should be investigated. This is my second entry in story. This takes place in Rusk, Texas in the 70s. This story comes from an acquaintance of mine, who is really more of a good friend of mine, of my good friends. Mike and Katie were married and had two children. One was a nine-year-old boy, and the other was a five-year-old girl. They moved into a house that had a shotgun-style layout. In other words, you entered into the living room, and there was a straight hallway all the way to the back door, with all of the rooms off of this one main hallway. Mike and Katie took the first door on the right as their bedroom, while giving the children the last door on the left as their bedroom. One night, not long after the move, Mike and his wife were sound asleep when they were awakened by screams of Mommy and Daddy and turned on the nightstand lamp to find both their children wide awake and terrified. The children claimed to have seen a man with a hat on and a beard peering into their window. Mike immediately got his gun and ran around the back where he found an empty field and no sign of anyone having been there. At first, they were under the impression that this man had a ladder because the back of the house stood on a steep grade down and no one could be peering into one of the back windows without a ladder. But the occurrence repeated itself and finally, Mommy asked the kids to describe exactly what they had seen. Their stories were both told at different sessions and matched completely. What had woken the children was a strange light out the window and someone walking up and down on what sounded like wood boards. They said this man leaned over and looked down into the window and he had a shotgun in his hands. The couple moved the children to another room and Mike did some laborious digging into the history and county files in the house. Through newspapers and files, plus some additional info from some of the older townspeople, Mike learned that this house had once been at another location, and when it was moved, it was turned around so that what had been the front of the house was now the back of the house. He also learned that the man who had died at the house had been arrested and died in prison for shooting his wife and her lover in their bed with a shotgun.
I've sent in one other story about my mother's house in Illinois, but I have two more stories to share. I was raised by my grandparents. Their house has its share of odd occurrences, knocking sounds from within the walls, an apparition of my great-grandmother, and eerie feelings down the long hallway to the bedrooms. One night, I was around nine in 1989. I was lying in bed, trying to fall asleep. My bed was facing the doorway, and I could see into my grandparents' bedroom across the hall. The hall is only about four feet wide. The only light visible came from a small night light in the outlet at the center of the hall. As I was tossing and turning, trying to fall asleep, I looked out into the hallway and saw a young woman with curly hair, her body glowing faintly. She carried a candle in her cupped hands. She walked slowly and paused for a second and turned to look into my grandparents' room. Being the nervous child I was, I quickly pulled the covers over my head and ignored it, eventually falling asleep. Years passed, and I never saw another apparition. When I was 16, 1996, I was still living there. I grew up in that house, 13 years total, and had moved across the hall, having switched rooms with my grandparents. I decided I would try and experiment. I found a dress similar to the one I saw the apparition wearing, so I decided I would put it on and sort of relive that experience. I had half very curly hair, and it was the same length as the apparitions. I put on the dress, grabbed a short white candle, turned off the hall light, lit the candle, and took the path that I had witnessed the apparition take. I took the same route, made the slow walk, paused at my old bedroom door, looked in, and walked into what was now my bedroom. Was what I saw a ghost, or merely a glimpse into my future? Was I seeing myself on some other intersecting point of time? I'm still trying to figure that one out. Next story. This occurred in 1997, while I was at a Native American ceremony in the woods in Nebraska. We had been out in the woods for about a week, living in our tents and teepees, ceremonies going on throughout that time. I heard the stories of spirits who lived in the trees, and being as curious as I am about the supernatural, I was nervous and excited to see what might be out there. For the first few days, things were normal, and I went about my business working in the cook shack, making large quantities of food for the huge number of people there. One evening, after dinner, I was sitting at a table with an aider, talking about the name he had just given me, Star Woman, for my love of looking at the stars for hours on end, when my right hand suddenly went ice cold. My mother was sitting to my left, and I said, wow, my hand just went freezing cold. There was no wind, and it was July in Nebraska, pretty hot, even after the sun went down. She said, oh, don't worry, that's just the spirit touching you. I can't recall the name for them, so I'll just say spirit. I think it was Wayne Guy, but I'm not sure. Okay, no big deal. Our tent was set up along the perimeter of the tree line, with an outhouse about 50 feet to the right. On several occasions, while walking to the outhouse, I noticed black human forms in the trees. When I'd shine my flashlight on them, they were gone. I attributed this to my imagination. A few days later, a friend who I'd brought along for the trip was sitting in my tent with me, talking about the day. I was on the left side, leaning back on my arms, with my lantern flashlight next to my left hand, about 12 inches away. It was the kind where you could pull up the body of the flashlight to reveal a lantern. We were talking, and we noticed the light shifting in the tent. There were no other lights, aside from a bonfire on the side of the camp at about 300 feet. I looked at my flashlight, and it was standing on its edge. All we could do was sit and watch it. It stood on its edge for about two minutes. Then we decided to leave the tent for a while 
because we were a bit freaked out. The flashlight had a rounded head, not a square one. My hand did cause the tent floor to dent in slightly, but my flashlight was nowhere near my hand or the dent I made in the floor. The light was literally standing on one rounded edge. When I mentioned it to my mom the next day, she quipped, they were playing with you. They must like you. I wasn't really scared, just a bit nervous, considering we were out in the wilderness with no lights. I was intrigued more than anything, considering the nature of the ceremony we were attending. I'm certain the spirits were focused by our activity. I hope to return to that spot in the future. This occurred in Miami, Florida in 1980 when I was 15. I still don't know if this was a paranormal experience, but it was unsettling nevertheless. I was babysitting for the next door neighbors one evening. Their daughter was down for bed, and I was in the family room watching TV. They had a small anchor biter type dog, and it went to the double sliding glass doors that led out into the rear patio and pool area like it wanted to go to the bathroom. All of the homes in this area had a screened in patio pool enclosure, and when you open the sliding glass door to step out into the patio, immediately to your left was a screen door that led into the backyard. Unlike most of the homes in my neighborhood though, the backyard was surrounded by a chain link fence. So I go and open the sliding glass door, which was completely covered by trays for privacy, to let the dog out. The dog steps out, and I immediately hear the crunching of grass in the yard to my left, as though someone is walking in the backyard. Startled, I look to my left, and there is what appears to be a man, adult size, reaching out, as if to open the screen door. I immediately slammed the glass sliding door shut, scared out of my wits. I stood frozen in fear in the living room. Silence. After a few minutes, I cautiously peered through the curtain onto the patio. No one there, just a dog sniffing around. I let the dog in, and he did not appear agitated at the least. I never thought much about it after that until years later. If there was someone there, why didn't the dog bark? If it was supernatural, animals are known to get agitated, yet nothing. My imagination? Definitely not. Nothing like that ever occurred again in subsequent babysitting for that neighbor. Well, this all started when my mother and I moved into a new home. Well, not new, but new to us. Anyway, it wasn't that old, about 30 years old. This was back in 1987. We moved in with not a problem, but I started to notice things about this house. Things would go missing, only to be found days or months later in the same spot. I'd see darts of movement out of the corner of my eye, and when I was alone, it felt like I wasn't. I spent a lot of time alone in the house, which was fine, until dark came. Then the house would not feel so warm and inviting, as it was in the day but nothing ever came of it. Until many years later, when the footsteps started in the kitchen, they would come to the living room carpet and stop. As the time wore on, this came closer and closer, until one night, I was lying awake in bed, like most children do. They began to walk up my stairs to my room, and I know it wasn't my mom. I could hear her snoring downstairs. Now, don't say it was the house settling, because my stair made a very distinct squeak when someone walks up there. Anyway, once they reach the top of the stairs, I peek, being curious and all, and see a shadow standing at the door to my room. I froze, and a few seconds later, it turned around and it began its descent down the stairs. This happened once in a while, but only during stressful times in the house. The shadow itself looked like an average male, with nothing really standing out, but when he looked at me, it was a mixture of complete terror and a strange comfort like it wasn't there to hurt me or scare me. Like I said, I see him once in a while checking on me, but eventually, he became a part of my life. The one that did scare me lived in the basement. Again, it was a man as far as I could tell. 
he was very angry, and his feeling was felt through the basement air. You could actually feel it as he walked into the basement, that this was just the beginning of him. Mostly, he would just sit in the corner and glare at you, as he did whatever you had to do, and he always kept as far away from you as possible. It's weird because you would see him move as you move, which was at the time very scary. Even though I was a very brave child, I rarely finished my choir there, even in the daytime. Eventually, my mom refused to go down there anymore, after she was tripped by something and fell and broke a couple of toes. As time went on and on, the basement became less and less used, to the point in which the activity was too much that we couldn't even handle it. We were even too scared to even use the laundry. But after a while, we forgot about the guests downstairs. Until one night, when we heard a loud whoosh, we look at each other in terror as we knew something was wrong in the basement and we would have to see what it was. So, we braved the basement, see a water pipe had broken, which in itself wasn't weird, but it was the fact that old cherished family photos and items that had previously been on a shelf across the basement were under this pipe that broke. My grandfather soon came over to help fix the pipe and clean up the inches of water. Everything was ruined. The drywall, the shelves, not to mention all the priceless family photos. When we finally cleaned out everything, the last thing to go was the aforementioned shelf, behind which we found a drawn chalk, a pentagram of sorts, and various other strange drawings in a large wooden Ouija board, which again was strange because my mom had never owned one in her entire life, and I was too young to even think about that stuff. Anyway, fast forward 12 years to 2002. My mom had met a great guy, and had moved to another town to be with him, and I was moving out too, so I could live on my own. I was just staying in the house until my apartment was ready, which was two weeks away, and cleaning the house for the next owners. Our other housemates had stopped making his presence known many years ago, except for the glaring he did in the basement, and it was the furthest thing from my mind, and I was down to the last three boxes of stuff in the basement. In the basement, there was four lights. Every time I came back for a box, one light was burnt out. As I went to get the last box, and I see I'm down to one last light, I know what's coming, but I need that box. So, I grabbed the box, and stood up, and looked in horror, to see him standing in the darkness in his favorite spot. Two things I noticed this time. He was huge, standing around six foot four, in something I never noticed before. He had red eyes, and it seemed like he had a nasty smile on his face, but I wasn't sure. I stared at him for what seemed like an eternity, but he did the strangest thing ever. He waved to me, but I didn't stick around to say my goodbyes, and somehow, managed to shrink the rod, yelling some very colorful language as I stumbled out the door. I jumped in my car and sped off, and I looked in the rearview mirror to see him standing in the kitchen, glaring out the window at me. Well, needless to say, I never went back. An interesting side note, the previous owners had been avoiding the Ouija board player and said that they knew of the entity I had spoke of. He only identified himself as Jay, and never answered questions about who he was and what happened to him. They said he was fun to talk to until he moved in. Well, thanks for telling us now. This happened about four years ago, when I was 15. I was working at a farm in Connecticut at the time, and it was a habit for myself and my coworkers to have nighttime barbecues throughout the summer. On this particular occasion, we had killed three of the chickens we had and grilled them, nothing better than fresh chicken. As the night was winding down and we were getting ready to clean up, I noticed a very potent, sweet smell. To note, we were next to a sugar shack where maple syrup is made, and this smell was much stronger than the strongest syrup I've ever smelled. As I smelled it, I noticed my friend glance at me with a perplexed look on his face and suddenly, a very thick fog drifted in. He got up quickly and declared, we're leaving now. We of course left, leaving everything to be cleaned up the next day. We went into the farm office, and the fog was still there, along with the smell. 
It seemed to have followed us. I was a bit spooked, as I knew my friend was experiencing what I was, but the woman had no idea why we started acting strange, and was a bit confused at the sudden rush to leave. As we were leaving, it seemed as if the fog was thickening. However, when we reached the chain link fence, that is the border of the farm, the fog stopped abruptly. I looked out and saw that the fog followed the length of the fence, which was about 50 yards. We left and proceeded to the woman's house, and my friend told her to walk in her house backwards. My friend comes from Ghana in South America and is very superstitious. His grandfather had been a voodoo doctor of some sort. I heard numerous stories of him healing crazed people who talked in odd languages. Anyways, apparently, she did not walk in her house backwards, as we found out the next morning. However, when he told me to, when he dropped me off home, I did so, with no argument, knowing that sometimes you just don't ask why people tell you to do things. My friend picked me up from work the next morning, and I asked him, why did he even make me walk in backwards? He mentioned the smell in the fog, and said if it was a supernatural presence, it would not follow you to your house if you faced it, because it would think you knew it was there. We got to work, and the girl was there before us, and she looked very disheveled and tired. She immediately said she barely slept, because things in her house kept falling and waking her up all night. She even said her door opened twice that night. She then said how it was odd how she had smelled something sweet and seen the fog and then strange things happened to her. My friend and I had not said anything to her about the smell or the fog the previous night or yet that morning, so we both looked at each other in amazement. She noticed and told us to tell her what happened to us, but instead of telling her that we had the same experience, my friend just asked her, if she had walked in her house backwards, she said no. We can only guess why the strange happening went on in only her house and not ours. My name is Sherry and I live in Loves Park, Illinois. Loves Park is located right outside of Rockport. Well, about four months ago, I moved into an apartment with my boyfriend, which is located off of Perry Road. There are the three of us who live there, Bill, my boyfriend, Adrian, his son, and myself. All of us have the same encounters with some kind of presence. Adrian is 15 years old and has called us hysterical by things he has witnessed while he was home by himself. Adrian's experience. One day, while home alone in the apartment, Adrian was on the computer. He said that Bill and my bedroom door opened and closed by itself. All windows and doors were closed at the time, so there was not a draft moving through the rooms. About a week later, he was home alone again. There was a knock on the door. Adrian went to the door, and no one was there. He has also seen gray blurs run from the bedrooms to the laundry room. Noises have also come from the kitchen while he was by himself. Bill and Adrian's experiences. In August of 2003, we had family over. While sitting there, Adrian and Bill were staring off towards the bedroom. All of a sudden, they both looked at each other and said, Did you see that? They claimed they saw what looked like an old man or woman, hunched over, running, and looking towards them into the laundry room. My experiences. My experiences pretty much consisted of only hearing noises, like things in the kitchen opening and closing on their own, and blinds rustling with nobody around. That was until two nights ago. Two nights ago, my mom and younger brother came over to visit. We played Uno and watched some TV. After they left, I got online and Adrian and Bill went outside and took the go-kart and minibike for a ride to Rockcut State Park. I was just sitting at the computer looking at items on eBay when I started to feel like I was being watched. I looked around and didn't see anything. But I was uncomfortable, so I went and got my cell phone out of my purse. By the way, they all left at around 12.30 a.m. Anyway, I walked back over to the computer and set the phone next to me. I continued my search on eBay when I saw something out of the corner of my eye. I immediately looked over towards the hallway and standing between the bedrooms and the laundry room, 
I saw a grayish figure of a man. A shiver of ultimate fear shot down the back of my neck. I've never been that frightened in my entire life. He stood there for about two seconds and then disappeared into the laundry room. I grabbed my phone and bolted out the front door. I tried to call Bill on his phone, but he didn't answer. I remained in the front porch until he called me and said he was on his way home. When they got home, I told them what happened, and they said, Now do you believe us? I always believed, in a way. But now that I actually saw this thing, I know it's real, and it still frightens me. The ghost, however, has not harmed us in any way. He's just sharing our resonance. I'm not sure exactly where to start. All my life, I had feelings and happenings around me. Some I remember, and some are still a bit hazy to me. I have a couple of true stories that have happened to me that I would like to share with everyone. I grew up in a small city in California called Pico Rivera, but moved in 92 to Colorado. Growing up in Cali, I've had three sisters and my mom and dad. The house we lived at was on Maris Avenue. And from what I was told, it was originally the first church in Pico Rivera, but was torn down to make a home for an elderly couple who, I believe, the husband died of old age. Their house was torn down and ours was built. I was eight, I believe, when I really started to understand what I was experiencing. I remember that I would always see horrid faces on the wood paneling in the house. By that I mean, on the doors and the kitchen cupboards. I remember that my older sister and I would be the only ones who experience all the happenings. Her and I would have recurring nightmares. I would dream of trying to run away from what I believed to be the devil chasing me, but the more I ran, the closer he would get. My sister would dream of a young girl in a checkered red and white dress trying to kill her. Every night, I would hear the same things, stomping on a roof or a stampede of running feet right above my head. And just as fast as it would start, it would disappear. One day, I was alone in the house. My parents and sister had gone to the store, and my two older sisters were at work. I was peacefully watching TV and playing with our cat Midnight when a feeling of being watched came over me. Thinking absolutely nothing of it, I went on watching TV, but noticed that Midnight had run off somewhere. I thought it was odd that she had just run off. But I still didn't care. I just kept on watching my cartoons. My mom has a habit of putting this plastic rug thing on our carpets to keep the dirt off, and we had one, so if someone was walking on it, you could hear them. So, what I started to hear was what I thought the cat running back and forth, so I yelled out her name to get her kitty butt over to me and stop making all that noise when I heard her meow from behind the sofa. I found this strange wondering how she did that so fast. So I went behind the sofa to take a look. Sure enough, she was huddled in the corner, hissing and meowing with her eyes wide open. I of course tried to get her out, but she wouldn't even let me get near her. I left her alone and figured that she would come out when she's good and ready and went back to my TV. Then, all of a sudden, I heard the noise in the hall again. I put my TV on mute thinking that maybe it was the cartoon I was watching, and the noise stopped for a second, but then went back right to it. I started to listen really carefully, and what it sounded like was footsteps, heavy footsteps. With this, I decided to do the same my cat was doing, so I hid in a little tiny opening that was behind her sofa, and I listened very carefully. Then I noticed that whatever it was making, that noise stopped, as if it knew that I was aware it was there. I could feel my heart beat in my throat, and then it started up again, but this time it was faster, and then the doors and windows were opening and slamming shut. I really did not know what to do. I just remembered that I was concentrating on how close the passes were, and they were coming closer to me with every beat of my heart, until I couldn't hear it on the plastic anymore. My cat took off from behind the sofa, so I took it as a sign and did the same thing, and ran out my front door screaming, thinking that whatever it was would grab me from behind. I made it safely outside my home, and I sat on the sidewalk, waiting for someone to come home. 
I felt something burning a hole in the back of my neck. And when I turned back to my house, the front door slammed shut. Finally, my parents came home, and I was so happy to see them. My mom scolded me for being outside alone, and so I proceeded to tell them what had happened. My dad said that it was probably an aftershock or a small earthquake, but none of the neighbors experienced anything. My mom, on the other hand, said that I was being punished for being a naughty kid. A few days later, my older sister had come home from work to an empty house, and she experienced the same thing. Our home out here in Colorado has a strange feeling to it. I can't describe it. It's just something that always has been there. I remember one night. It was myself, my neighbor, and my twin sister were home alone. My parents had gone up to the hill for some gambling, so we decided to watch movies and just be the normal teenage kids. Well, my sister had gone in the shower, and my neighbor and I were just sitting around gossiping waiting for my sister to get out so we could watch a movie, when the phone rang. Of course, I ran to pick it up, and I said hello, but the other side was dead. So, I put it back down and went back to our business. When it rang again, I got up, ran to the phone, again, no one on the other end. I hate prank calls, and two is enough to get me agitated with, so I unplugged all the phones in the house, and left it at that. About five minutes later, there was a knock at our door. Now, I wasn't a stupid girl. I looked out the people, and there was no one there. So I looked out my window, and there wasn't even any footprint in the snow coming up to our door. Well, we both found this to be strange, and the feeling a bit uncomfortable. We went around the house, making sure everything was locked, and covered all our windows. We stood looking out the front window, making sure it wasn't one of our neighbors trying to play games, when my sister came out of the shower and had a confused look on her face. We asked her what was wrong, and she asked us if we had gone into the bathroom during the time she was in the shower. I told her no, there's no way for us to even get in if we wanted to, because there's no key for that lock. Again, we asked her what was wrong. And she proceeded to tell us that before she got in the water, she took off her rings and had placed them on top of the toilet seat cover so they wouldn't fall into the sink. But when she had gone out, they were on top of the toilet and the seat cover was up as if someone had removed them to use the restroom. At the same time, both the phone rang and there was another knock at the door. We looked out the peephole while my sister ran to the phone. Again, there were no footprints in the fresh snow and no one at the door. My sister came running and said that it was for me, so I started walking to the phone when I remembered that I unplugged all the phones, so I told my sister to hang it up. She said that it sounded important, but I told her to hang it up. Finally, she did. My neighbor and I both turned white, and my sister asked what was going on when I told her I unplugged them, so there is no way they could have rang, let alone anyone talk on the other end. We still talk about this to this day, and even in my own apartment, I wake up to hear my toilet flush on its own, or things vanish, and I find them in my cupboards. Crazy. Crazy. About two years ago, my first love was shot to death, and died instantly. I was devastated when it happened, but one night, he came to me in a dream and told me he loved me, and he didn't want to see me cry over him anymore, because it hurt him. It was really strange, because I woke up immediately after that, and I just started crying so hard. But I only cried for a few minutes because I remembered what he said, and I stopped. I didn't want to hurt him. I remember the dream feeling so real, that when he held and kissed me, I felt so safe and secure, like he was really there with me. I never really cried over him again after that day. Sure, a few tears here and there when I visit his grave, but I never cried uncontrollably again. I never forgot about him, but I moved on and tried to make happiness in my life without him. Then a few days ago, a really good friend of my mother's came to visit us for Thanksgiving. Now, I never knew this before, but she has the power to feel the presence of ghosts and spirits. She can talk to them, hear and see them. 
She was scared to tell my family about this gift because she thought we'd call her crazy. Finally, she just couldn't take it anymore because she said we had a ghost in the house that was influencing my thoughts when I would sleep. She said it was a man and he lived in my room and his favorite place was at the foot of my bed. I was a little skeptical at first because I had never had that sort of thing before. I asked if she could see and hear him, and she said yes. She told me that he had black hair, sharp brown eyes, olive skin, a mustache, and he was about 5 foot 8 inches. The way she described the man sounded exactly like Raymond, my deceased lover. She asked me who that was, and I told her the story. She got this freaked out look on her face, and then I asked her how long this man had been living in my room. She said that before I could even finish the question, he answered me, two years, and she repeated this answer to me. I then got goosebumps all over, and I said, he passed away in 2001. She asked me if I had any pictures of him, and I showed her one. She only glanced at it when she said, that's him. I still don't know if I believed it, but I was freaked out by the thought of a ghost living in my bedroom for two years. She said she had asked him what he was doing in my home, and he replied that he loved me and was there because of me. She then told me that since he was my ghost, I was the only one who could make him leave. She told me to light a white candle and tell him to go to the light and that God was waiting for him in heaven. I felt like a lunatic talking to myself, but I did as she said, and then I left my room with all the lights off and the door shut and nothing but the candlelight on. She went into my room about an hour later, and she saw him standing there. She then asked him, what are you still doing here? He told her that he couldn't go to heaven because he's done too much bad in his lifetime, and God will never forgive him. She assured him that wasn't true, and said that God loves all of us and will always forgive us, no matter what we do, as long as we ask for his forgiveness. She then told him to think about that because God is waiting for him, and she left the room. About an hour after that, I returned home, and we went to check if he was still there. Sure enough, he was there, at the foot of my bed. I told her that I wanted to talk to him, and asked him why I was there. Raymond was a gang member, and was killed by the cops for reasons unclear to me at the time. I just knew that he was too good of a person, and had too big of a heart to have done anything to deserve death. I never really had a sense of closure regarding his cause of death, and I felt the real story was being hidden, and no one would ever find out what really happened. Only the people who were there knew his death. Well, he started out talking about a teen named Joey that had gotten killed about a week before Raymond. He said that he wanted to know that he had never hurt Joey, but Joey had tried to hurt him with a blade of some sort. Raymond's uncle Eddie, who was a gang leader, ordered the gang to go after Joey, who was from a rival gang. They did, and they shot him to death. Raymond said he had nothing to do with Joey's death, but that Joey's ghost had come for Raymond to get revenge on his Uncle Eddie. Raymond said he was done wrong by his own family, because his Uncle Eddie and Aunt Christian knew that Raymond was going down, and they never warned him or said anything to anyone to help him out. They just let him die. I didn't really understand what he meant by this, since he said he was killed by the cops and not a rival gang member. But I knew it was really him, because of all the names he had said. I knew that my mom's friend could never have just known those names, or made them up, and for the most part, it made sense, except for the part about his aunt and uncle, knowing that it was going down. They were both present when he was killed though, so maybe that had something to do with what he said. He said that they had betrayed him and they were no longer his family, because family wouldn't have done that to him. He just wouldn't tell me exactly how they did him wrong, or what they knew that they never warned him about. He said he was very hurt to find out that two people he had cared so much for had done such a heartless thing to him. He said he just wanted to know this, so I would know that he didn't deserve to die, and he would never hurt anyone, or tried to hurt anyone, that he was set up by his own uncle and aunt, he also said that if his friend had known what was going on, he would have still been alive today. Leia, my mother's friend, 
couldn't make out the name of the friend he was talking about, so he said, the one with all the kids. Right then, I knew he was talking about my best friend Javier. He said he only told me all of this, so I would know the truth and would never think of him as a bad person. What he didn't know was that I never did think of him as a bad person, and I knew, deep down inside, that he didn't deserve to die the way he did, or at the time that he did. Before he passed away, we were going through a lot of problems because he had cheated on me with another woman. He told me that she really never meant a thing to him, but that she threw himself at him, and guys will be guys. He said that we were supposed to get back together and get a house together, and I was supposed to leave his son. He said he wasn't ready to go yet, and he had plans for us, and that was why he chose to stay with me all this time. He just felt comfortable with me there. Leia had told me that since he died so suddenly, he never knew he was dead, and therefore had not crossed over yet, and had been trapped here on Earth. He said that he never meant to hurt me in any way, and that I was his true love. What was really weird was about a year ago, 2002, I had a new boyfriend living with me, and he broke my heart. I still get sad about him and miss him occasionally, and Raymond knew this. One of the last things he had asked Leia to tell me was that the man I was so heartbroken over wasn't even worth my time or tears, and that he could just never be good enough for me, so not to hurt over him anymore. He said he didn't like that guy, and that he never deserved me. He was just no good. Well, he was so right about everything he had told me in that whole conversation. At the time, I didn't know it for sure, but I just felt it inside, and I knew he wouldn't stay around for two years just to tell me lies. After he told me all of that, he said he didn't want to talk anymore because I should be able to figure out everything from what he already said. Leia and I then asked him to go to light and go with God. I promised him I'd pray for him to be forgiven by God and led into heaven, but I already knew God would take him without my prayer. Just then, Leia's eyes moved across the room as if she was watching someone walking. He said one last time, please tell her that I never meant to hurt her and I'm so sorry. I said I forgave him a very long time ago. He then asked me to tell me that he loved me and would wait for me in heaven. Then Leia told me to watch the candle, and just at that moment, the flame grew very tall, and the blue of the flame disappeared, and it was all white. She told me he said goodbye, I love you, and he was gone. He just wanted to tell me those things, and wouldn't leave until he got the chance. I felt really happy after that, because I sent my love to heaven, where he belongs. This is a true story, and it was honestly, the best experience of my entire life, which isn't too long, since I'm only 19. Even though I couldn't see him or hear him, I knew for a fact that he was right there with me, just from what he said and all the names he mentioned. I know I will never experience anything like this again, so I feel very special that he chose me. It really was crazy to go through that, but once I knew it was him, I wasn't so scared anymore. I actually felt happy that he stayed all that time just to tell me how he felt and what really happened when he passed away. I felt even happier that I was the one who had sent him to heaven to be with God and be happy again. It may not make sense to you, but it did to me because he was my first love and I knew him so well. I tried to follow his case and dig to find something on what really happened when he was killed, but never could up until he told me. Soon after that experience, I spoke to his mother, and we put the whole thing together to find out that his family had betrayed him, just as he said. His uncle Eddie is now standing trial for the death of Joey, and he is looking at 25 to life with no chance of parole, but for what he did to Raymond, he deserves that. He actually deserves to be the one laying in that casket instead of Raymond, but I'm just glad Raymond is in a better place and away from this cruel world. He deserves to be happy for eternity. This happened over a span of time from June, my last visit on October 31st. 
when I first did a search in the Amity Hall Hotel in April 2003. I read about how back in the days of the PL Canal system, canal travelers used to stay there. Then in the Civil War days, it was used as a hospital. Then only internet, which I thought odd. I've looked on the internet many times for historical information on Amity Hall. The first time I went there was June. My friend had been telling me about it, so we went with a group. I brought my camcorder and was outside with a girl that was scared to go in. My battery went dead in about five minutes. I thought it was weird because a relative had put the battery in the charger while running the camera off of house electricity, but later the battery charged and now it's just fine. That night we saw, in the corner of the L-shaped building, very small bluish lights. They went inside, but reported nothing out of the ordinary. The first time I went into the house, one week later, was during the day. I'd wander around it many times, during both day and night, and the most creepy place on the outside is a door at the end of a hall, which is locked shut. We, me and that same friend, were walking around it, looking for a door that was open, and I went around front and was standing on the porch, looking at the door, It was completely shut, and suddenly, which seemed odd to me, I had the notion to try it. It seemed ridiculous, especially because it had always been previously been locked, but I reached for it, and it easily swung open, revealing to me the beauty within. There is a hall that runs down the middle of it, on either side, very large rooms. There is a bar on the left, and a kitchen beyond it. There are old fireplaces in the rooms. The L shape to this building comes from the attachment of the hallway of hotel rooms to what I assume is the residential part as well as the kitchen. Strangely, the worst in the house is upstairs, the trophy room. This room is filled with a giant feeling of get out of here. Nothing has ever been seen or heard in it by me, but I went in it once and I'll never go in it again. That is how strange the feeling is. I'm not sure if the anger felt in this room is some ghost. All the glass and mirrors are broken and you walk on a crystalline floor, about an inch thick. We were walking around and checking the doors. We opened the heavy metal black door and were lingering around in a small awkward room. I looked down the hall into an ominous darkness and said, I'm not going down that hallway. We kept checking other doors and came, not by my request, back to the door. When I looked down the hallway this time, it was well lit and I could see everything. There is a small rectangular window in front of the front door at the other end of the hall that let in a great deal of light, but before this could not be seen, before, I couldn't even see halfway down the hallway because it was so dark. We continued around checking doors because we didn't want to climb around the fallen antique soda machine that lays at an awkward angle, stuck between the steps themselves and the railing of the upper part of the staircase. It looks like it's ready to fall. We went to the door right in front of the stairs, which was locked before, and my friend, for whatever reason, reached out and opened it. She was also very determined to get into the hotel rooms, so we were climbing across the little porches, separated by railings, and after we already tried all the doors, she, without rhyme or reason, walked right up to the third one in and opened it with ease. Throughout the summer, we went back with equipment, trying to get footage, but nothing works correctly around it. I've seen, one night, the very faint white figure of what appeared to be a woman in the attic window facing the parking lot. I've seen white flashes of light in the attic windows facing the road. But the worst time ever, I'm getting goosebumps and watery eyes thinking about it, was October 11th. It wasn't that cold, but I remember wearing my winter jacket. Me, My best friend since childhood and my boyfriend went driving up. We talked all about it on the way there, and then we parked. We just couldn't bring ourselves to get out of the car. For some reason, we were all scared to death. That night, there seemed to be a battle going on of energies, good and evil. Because believe me, the place has both. You could, at time, actually see in the window the swirling of something that is hard for me to describe as anything other than something out of this world. There were faint glows fading in and out of the windows, as well as small, 
but somewhat bright points of light coming from the corner of the L shape. The driver, my best friend, got out of the car and basically was so scared, she just stood there and then quickly got back in. I'd heard of the hounds of hell, chasing people from sitting in the parking lot like we were. Maybe that's what she saw. I don't know. I was watching the house, but suddenly, my boyfriend in the passenger seat freaked out and pointed to the front left corner of the car. And just as he did, I was suddenly scared. I cried a scream that came straight from my soul. Go now. We spun out of the parking lot and parked on the other side of the road. Each time the car was still running. My boyfriend was talking about what he saw, which was a black figure, not the shape of a dog, but about the size of a dog lingering around the front bumper where the driver was standing. We were talking about how still, from this far away, the house felt creepy and strong. This may sound weird to some, but I don't care. I was sitting in the back seat on the right side, the side of the car that was facing the woods. Suddenly, I got this creepy feeling that something was outside the window. I knew it was watching me. In the front, my friends were talking, and just as I was turning to look out the window, in a split instant, my boyfriend, the passenger, started freaking out, screaming the driver's name, and to start driving. I was, somehow, too slow for this. The timing was just about right, that I never got to see with eyes what I already knew to be there, just outside the window, not just watching, but glaring at me. I hadn't even began to describe what I experienced when suddenly it started coming from my boyfriend's mouth. He was trembling and telling about how something was outside my window, looking in at me, and it wanted to hurt me. He said there was a woman outside his window, silently screaming at him, which is why he screamed. I started crying and going into near hysterics because what he was describing was what I felt, and at the height of my terror, he was the one who freaked out. It was one of the most horrific paranormal experiences I've ever had. He said he could clearly see her, and that it looked like the female was bleeding a lot, and that her clothes were from the 1800s. The last time I was there, October 31st, it seemed like respectful party people had taken up part-time residence in the house because furniture had been all moved to one room, and there was no further damage to the house. I later found out that several of my friends went later, and the house is now inhabited by a cult of some sort. They have told me that they spoke with someone. Whatever the case, I don't think I'll ever go back at night. There is something there that is anchored with me for some reason. I'm still looking for history to figure out who the woman and man were outside of my car. I would appreciate any ideas you might have for why the male gave off the feeling towards some and no one else in the car. My boyfriend is also wondering the same thing about the male. To be honest, I don't think I'll ever go ghost hunting anymore either, because I've been so frightened by the above events. Well, I know loads of people send in stories about graveyards, and they never sound true, but this one I encountered was so scary, I didn't want to go out of my house for five months. Basically, my two friends, Ursula, Nikita, and I, were sitting on the wall of this graveyard we used to hang out in when I decided to take a visit to my friend, who is dead, in the cremation garden and have a talk to her. Nikita and Ursula knew I liked to spend time on my own, so they left me to it. After all, they were still in view. Well, Asher, my dead friend's flowers were dying, so I went into the back of the graveyard to pick some flowers. Then... All of a sudden, I heard a voice. I thought nothing of it at first, just a hush cooing in the background. I presumed it was some mourner coming to visit a loved one, but it started to get louder and more distressed. The person sounded Latin. They were getting louder and louder until it hurt my ears, and I had to turn around and tell them to stop. But then, when I turned around, nothing was there. I strained my eyes, but all I could see was a graveyard and flowers. Quite startled by the experience, I decided to tell Urs and Keats about what just happened. Then I heard a scream. Things were getting stranger and stranger. I was scared now. I ran and ran, but my surroundings were unfamiliar. I hadn't a clue where I was, 
I couldn't find my way out of this whirling blur that I was trapped in, and the Latin voice was getting louder and louder. All of a sudden, I appeared to wake up. I was in the middle of the graveyard, in the pitch black. I panicked like you would. I was so utterly confused. I looked up to see a blurred figure, and I screamed. The figure was about my height and my size, but it had no face. It was nothing. It was just there. And as I stared at it, it came closer and closer until I was practically inside it. And it stopped. Stopped dead in front of me. And then the Latin voice came back. Quiet at first, but louder it grew. Louder and louder. I let it. The next thing I knew, the figure was fading and fading. Into nothing. Until... That's all it was. Just nothing. Eventually, police found me and rushed me to the hospital. They said it was just my anxiety hallucinating me, but I'm sure it was something more. Something that won't leave my head. You see, every night when I go to bed, I say a Latin prayer and hope that the figure I see will rest in peace. But that didn't stop it from scaring the hell out of me. Please make sure you don't wake up at exactly 3.12, because I do and I hate it. I see the figure at the foot of my bed, with a face and everything. She's a little girl, and she screams, silently, but she still does it, and it scares me. She hasn't hurt me yet, though. When I was 14, my family moved to Seattle, where my father was to do some teaching. We rented a beautiful old house. From the time we moved in, I was uncomfortable. I would turn quickly to think I saw someone move, just out of sight. I was placed in a downstairs room, which seemed to have the largest amount of activity. And each night, my dog would awake, barking, at what seemed to be nothing, and my cat would become very alert. I eventually moved myself upstairs, into my baby brother's room, and he was sleeping with my parents. One day, While my father was away on business, my mother and I heard what sounded like a large box drop. We all looked around the house and found nothing to have made the noise. Because I was so scared, I asked to spend the night with my mother. I was to sleep that night in my brother's bed, and my brother would sleep with my mom. My mother and I were facing each other, me, with my back to the closet. We said goodnight and turned out the light. A moment later, my mother bolted upright. Startled, I said, what is it? She told me to be quiet and reached into the nightstand for some mace. I turned to see what she was looking at. Out from the closet came light, as though someone had switched on a light. There was no light in the closet. We looked through the closet and through the house for two hours and found nothing. I remember my mom saying, don't worry, it's just a ghost. It won't hurt you. She was right. It never did. But I continued to feel uncomfortable and see what I think was a woman until we finally moved from the house. In another incident, in 1990, my grandfather was in a retirement home. He had several strokes and could no longer talk. His hearing was always bad, but had gotten to the point that he could no longer hear. He had recently come down with shingles and was not doing well. That night, as I was drifting off to sleep, I clearly hear my grandfather talking to me. He told me he loved me and then said goodbye. The following morning, I got a call saying he was dead. I already knew. There was another incident that has haunted me to this day. My husband, two kids, and myself took a trip to Alaska last summer. We made it to the border of Canada somewhere around 8 in the evening. We were told that the nearest town was a place called Hope, about 30 miles up the road. When we got to the town, we found that there was no place to stay. It seems it was a national holiday. A kind woman at a local hotel phoned the next town up the road to see about vacancies. She reserved a room for us, and off we went. We reached the Yale Hotel around 10 o'clock and checked into our room. I turned on the TV for the kids and they watched the family channel until we were ready for bed. We turned out the lights and went to sleep. Sometime later, the TV awakened me, 
and had turned on by itself. What was showing appeared to be a sitcom. What was being said was far from funny. It seemed as though the voice was dubbed. What was said did not even match the mouth movements. It was a man smiling and talking to his wife in a kitchen. What I heard was a man with a rough voice screaming. My husband had woke up with me and asked why I had turned on the television. When I told him I didn't, he asked that I turn it off. I accidentally switched channels, and when I turned the knob back, the show was gone. It was called Just Snow. It's funny, it didn't really dawn on me until the following day how very strange it was. I've never before since had a television turn on to what was the family channel and haven't spewed profanities at me, but I guess we all at first. In my last and final instance, my family and I moved into our house last October. My husband and I had been looking for houses for some time. When we found this house, we loved it from the start. It was a good warm feel, and it really was the best house we could ever have. Shortly after having moved in, my husband and I compared notes and admitted that we were both having strange feelings. Creepy was the word we agreed on. We were both finding the closet in our children's room open. The door would stay closed sometimes, and other times, you return to find it ajar or fully opened. My husband shared with me that he was outside, doing some digging on the French drain. He had set down a piece of chalk he had found. He turned around to pick it up, and it was gone. On another occasion, my family and I were sitting on the couch. My husband asked me to smell my son's hair, and it smelled intensely of perfume. Being that neither my husband nor myself wear any fragrance, we began looking around for something that may be curing the scent. To refresh his memory, he sniffed my son's hair again and asked me to do the same. The smell was completely gone. The oddness seemed to subside for months. Then, this year, around the same time, it seems to have started again. The closet door is again not staying closed. We are having trouble finding things again. The other night, I felt a cold breeze coming across my face as though the windows were open, but they were closed. I go up to find the back door unlocked, knowing that I had locked it the night before. A few nights ago, when I closed my eyes, I heard someone saying to me it's alright. After looking up the site and looking at the pictures, I decided to try my hand at photographing the potential presence. I went into the bedroom that has the closet door that doesn't close. I said out loud, though I'm not comfortable with the idea of having a presence in my home, I think I could deal with it better if I knew whether or not you exist, and since I have children, and they would be able to see you if you exist. I feel I need to be aware of that fact. So, I'm going to take pictures of the house, and if you are comfortable having me take your picture, you can get in front of the camera. If you're not comfortable, I can respect that. I'm guessing you're a good entity, because my cat seems to like you. Note, my cat is very insistent on spending time in this room. I must say, I felt a little silly talking to the air, but it seemed the right thing to do. So, I took pictures of the house. I frankly was hoping that nothing would be found, and that I would find my imagination had run away with itself. When I got the pictures back, I found that the photos taken in the bedroom and in the closet have what I understood to be a vortex. Needless to say, I'm pretty spooked. I'm planning on finding out the history of the house to see if I can figure out who our roommate is. Also, I'm hoping to contact some people that are knowledgeable on the subject of ghosts. If this entity needs my assistance, I hope to help. If it just wants to hang out with us, that's fine too, and if it's bad news, I need to know. I'm hoping that my initial feeling of my house is correct, and that what I believe is a ghost is of the non-threatening variety. I just keep telling myself that. The ghost has been very polite for the last year, and those that should be able to sense the presence seem not to mind it. The cats and my two children, whose room the ghost seems to live and spend time in. Thank you for your time, and I'm glad that you are able to read my story. I grew up in a small town in central New Hampshire. 
When I was 18, one of my friends took me to a grave, which is located on the side of a road. The grave lies off the road, about 10 feet. The grave is that of a young boy named Miles Tyler, who died in 1811. He then told me about some of the experiences he had. I was a little skeptical of the stories. He had said that sometimes you will hear leaves and branches moving, and there is no wind. Also, branches will crack and break. He had also mentioned that if you left food out, it would end up unwrapped and partially or completely eaten, even unopened cans of soda. The next day, I was over to a friend's house and told him of the story, and he also admitted of hearing this and being true. So, we planned a trip up there with a group of friends. One of these people was a girl who was into the ghost and spirit thing at that time. She was into the Ouija board and seance stuff. We arrived there about 11 at night, so this way, we wouldn't have any traffic or intrusions by passerbys. The girl and her friends started to try and communicate with the boy, who was buried at the grave, while the rest of us watched intensely. There was one person there who was mocking the whole thing, and definitely was a complete non-believer, and had no respect for the dead whatsoever. They had made contact with the boy within two or three minutes of trying. The spirits they were talking to was getting aggravated at the person who had been mocking him. I, at the time, didn't know what to believe. I just kept watching, my eyes glued on the ever-moving oracle. Soon, we all heard the leaves and limbs rustling in the woods around the grave. We all started to get nervous, while the person who had been mocking this whole event picked up his own pace. This just made things go completely out of control. Now, we could definitely hear the branches breaking, and it started to rain. Suddenly, the guy who had been mocking this whole event was staring at the headstone in complete fear. That's when we all noticed that it had moved and had tilted to the left at least two to three inches. That's when we all decided to leave. Me and two of my friends jumped in my truck to leave. It wouldn't start. I tried for what seemed like forever, still scared out of my mind. I jumped out of the truck and told my friend to get in the driver's seat. I got out and started pushing the truck down the road. Within 50 feet, the truck started and the rain stopped. So did the wind. We left and never looked back. I haven't been back since. We all stayed up until daylight and I dropped them off and went home. We were all shaking up by this and we didn't even talk about that after. That morning, I told my mom what had happened. Funny thing was, is that she did not say that she didn't believe me, but just chose to say, I hope you have learned your lesson and don't go back. I'm sorry for the lack of names, but didn't want to involve anyone without their permission. I now live out of state and have lost track of most of them. One summer, when I was about 11 or 12 years old, my parents, my little sister, Two of my older sisters and myself moved into this old gray house in northern Indiana. It had a cement sidewalk that went around to the back of the house, and at the back of the door, there was a date and two footprints and a handprint. The date was about 1812, if I remember correctly. It has been at least 10 years since this has happened. Anyway, right before we moved in, my two older sisters wanted to stay the night at the house, so they did. They felt real uneasy after being there for a while. They sat on the floor back to back, wishing they hadn't done this. All of a sudden, they heard a loud banging noise coming from the basement. They called the police from the neighbor's house. After the police checked everything out and found nothing, they left. Once again, my sisters, still scared of their minds, sat on the floor. They heard it again. So once again, they called the police. They showed up and stuck around a while to see if maybe they could hear it. About 15 minutes or so later, they heard it. One of the police officers told them that it was just an old furnace in the basement making noises. My sisters had a good laugh and finally drifted off to sleep. When we finally moved in and settled down, I wanted to really check the place out. In my room there was a walk-in closet about 12 feet in length. And on the left side inside the door was a smaller door that we assumed led to the attic. 
I felt very odd every time I had to go to the closet. One night, my little sister decided that she was going to sleep in my bed with me. Of course, being the brave sister I was, I picked up my little book of ghost stories and began to read a story entitled, Phone Calls from a Ghost. All of a sudden, the light in the hallway began to flicker. It was a light we were using to read the book by. We got scared, and I threw the book out my bedroom door. We laid there talking, wondering what caused that to happen, when we began to hear music and lots of voices coming from the attic. I could hear a child running around and laughing also, but my sister says she didn't hear that. We decided to go downstairs and sleep in her room that night. A few weeks go by, and one of my older sisters bought a Ouija board. My mom didn't like the idea of it being in her house because her mother always told her that they were of the devil. But, being a little curious herself, we all sat down and watched as my mother and older sister began to play the game. The spirit in the board said his name was Ghoul. I'm not sure how it would be pronounced, but I remember how it was spelled. We asked it some silly questions, and then my mom asked it a more serious question about if one of us was going to die, when, and how. The board told her something she wouldn't tell us. And then she got really mad at the spirit and began calling it names. The little device that you put your hands on began moving around the board really fast in a figure eight pattern no one was touching. Then it flew off the board and sailed across the front room into the dining room. My mom told my sister to get out of her house and never mention anything about what had happened. But she didn't take it out. She just put it in the closet in my room. One night, me and my little sister decided that we were going to be gypsies. So, we got our crystal ball, which was nothing more than an electric candle with a blue bulb, and sat in the playroom and turned off all the lights. My mom was the only one home, and she was downstairs. We sat next to the candle and began chanting, Oh spirits, if you are here, give us a sign. We want to know who you really are and why you're here. Over and over we chanted. Just then, I felt this cold chill. The windows were closed and it was midsummer. The bulb in the candle flashed and then went out and I heard someone whisper, I'm here. It sounded like a child's voice. Then, the hall light flashed twice and then stayed on for about 5 or 10 seconds and went out. My sister and I ran down the stairs, across the dining room and into the front room to where my mother was sitting, reading a book. We asked her if she flashed the lights just now, and she said no. See, my mom can't walk very well. She can't run or walk fast either, so she wouldn't have been able to get to the stairwell, flash the lights, and get back to her seat in time before we made it down the stairs. She didn't even notice the lights flash. Needless to say, we didn't go back upstairs. The next weekend... I stayed with my friend Robin. I didn't see anything about what was going on in our house. My mom and little sister were home alone. During the night, my sister woke up because she heard a woman scream. She ran to my mom's room and woke her up and told her. Mom called the police. They showed up, checked everything out. Nothing. After my mom got her calmed down and they both fell asleep, my sister heard the screaming again. So, once again, Mom called the police. They still didn't find anything. I wanted to find out why all this crazy stuff was happening, so I began to ask around. A few of the neighborhood kids got together and helped me find out. Of course, they thought my sister and I were crazy. Then my friend Aaron talked to a lady at the library. She told Aaron what happened, and then Aaron came home to my home to tell me we were standing outside the house, on the side where my room is below the window, in my walk-in closet. She told me that there was a mom, dad, and child who lived here a long time ago. One evening after school, the little boy was up in his room, which was the same room I had at the time. The mom was standing in the hallway, talking to him, when the dad came home. He was drunk and told him to come down. She looked at the boy and told him not to come down. He could hear his mom and dad yelling 
And then all of a sudden, he heard his mom scream, and she just kept screaming. He ran down the stairs and into the kitchen. There was blood everywhere, and his dad was still stabbing her in the chest and stomach. He turned to the boy, and he said, you're next. He ran up the stairs and locked himself in the attic. The dad took the mother's body and went down to the basement. In the basement, there was a little cubby hole in the wall. Inside that hole was another hole. He put her in the second cubby hole and went after the boy. He kicked the attic door open, and when he found the boy, he began stabbing him, little at a time, just enough to make him bleed a little bit. The neighbor heard the boy's screams and called the police. The dad took the boy, still screaming, and went down to the basement and climbed into the second little cubby hole and finished killing the boy. He then took his own life. After Aaron finished telling me the story, I looked up at my window and it was like I was looking at a family photo. I could see the mom, dad, and boy looking down at me. She was wearing a whitish sweater. The dad was wearing overalls and a plaid shirt, and the boy was wearing a pair of overalls and a plain t-shirt. They looked happy. Then I looked at Aaron, who didn't seem to notice them, and then I looked back, and they were gone. After everyone went home, and I could sit and tell my mom about it, who didn't believe me anyway, I began putting things together. The child's voice in the attic, the woman screaming, the banging in the basement. I know it could have been of the furnace. It was the middle of summer, and there wasn't a need for a furnace to be on, so it wasn't in use. I still had the visits from the family, but nothing as bad or as horrible as what they went through when they were alive. I want to start off by saying that this is a great site, and I love reading about everyone's ghostly experiences, even though I must admit I have a hard time believing them all. There's some stories that you can just tell. The person writing it is a kid with an overactive imagination. I only say this because even though I am a believer, I am a college educational rational individual, and I can also be the biggest skeptic you've ever met, which brings me to this incident that occurred while I was still in college. I just want to stress to everyone that's as skeptical as I am, that even though this experience sounds extremely unbelievable, that this is true and it really did happen. I know that this is long, but bear with me. I want to make sure I didn't leave anything out. This experience happened one late night in October in 1994. I was a junior in college at the time and had very little free time to do anything because besides class, I also worked part-time and was very active in my fraternity. Every year, we would have a big Halloween party at one of our fraternity brothers' houses and just have a completely wild, chaotic night, but nothing can compare to what we all experienced that night. I got to the party shortly after it started, got a beer, and noticed people coming out of the basement. I asked one of the people what was going on down there, and they told me that my friend Jeff had brought his Ouija board to the party and was down there, acting stupid. Apparently, these people didn't know Jeff very well. He took the Ouija very seriously. If anything, he was addicted to it. He constantly used it and kept people in close contact with a spirit named Jack that he contacted through the board. I'd come to learn that Jack was in the most pleasant spirit and was a pretty mean individual who had died in prison, but for some reason, Jeff liked conversing with him. I then proceeded down the stairs to see what was going on. There was about 10 people down in the basement. By the way, this was not a finished basement. This was the spooky concrete floors and dust everywhere basement. Jeff and a girl I knew named Lynn were using the board and talking to Jeff. Lynn began getting tired of it. She was just trying to have a good time, and she thought that Jeff was taking the whole thing way too seriously. Before she could get up to go back upstairs, a girl we knew named Dana came down the stairs. As soon as Dana came down into the basement, the board went absolutely nuts, moving around at a frenzied pace. Jeff said that this wasn't like Jack and asked the board what was wrong. The board spelled out that it wasn't Jack and it just kept spelling Dana's name over and over. Jeff asked the board if the spirit knew Dana and it said yes. At this point, everyone's kind of looking around confused and everything, 
and Dana was just looking at the board all weird. Chef then asked the board what its name was, as it spelled out the name Michael, and that he was six years old when he died. This is when Dana went ballistic. She just started crying uncontrollably and shouting, but we couldn't understand her because she was crying so much. She then ran upstairs and out the back door. A couple of us followed her to try and find out what was going on and to try and calm her down. We went outside and saw Dana crying on another girl's shoulder. This other girl looked both pissed off and scared to death at the same time. We asked her what was wrong and started yelling at us. How could you dare pull a mean trick like that? You should feel awful for doing this to her. We were clueless. We asked her what she was talking about. And then she told us that Dana had a younger brother named Michael that drowned when he was six years old. A chill immediately went down my spine. Once Dana calmed down a little bit, she told us that she'd been trying to contact Michael over the years, but was never able to. She then offered to buy Jeff's Ouija board from him so he could keep in touch with her brother. At this time, Jack came back, and it was like he and Michael were fighting over control of the board. Jack then told Jeff that if he burned the board that night before midnight, that his soul would be set free and he would be at peace. Jeff immediately wanted to set the board on fire because he said he developed some sort of relationship with Jack and wanted his soul to be at peace. Let's just say Dana didn't like that idea a bit, so they both got in a huge argument and the party became totally chaotic. By this time, everyone at the party, only about 50 people, knew what was going on and everyone started fighting and yelling, split down the middle, either on Jeff's side or Dana's. Eventually, Jeff snuck outside with a can of lighter fluid and set the board on fire with Dana standing over it and crying her eyes out. As you can guess, no one was really in the mood to party after that, and everyone ended up either staying at the house the party was at, or left for home to get their head back together. After that night, not one person I know that was at this party ever talked about that night again, not even once. I don't know how to explain what happened, but all I know is that there's no way that this was some sort of trick or joke that Jeff and Dana could have played on us. Being the skeptic that I am to this day, I tried to find out just how they could have pulled this over on us. Dana was just a friend of a friend of a friend that not very many of us knew that well. And that night at the party, none of us knew that she had a brother. Just that one friend of hers at a party that yelled at us knew anything about it. And then there's Jeff. He just takes the occult way too seriously, but would never use it as a basis for a joke. And if it was a trick, he's not the type to let it go. He'd make sure he knew it in our face about how much he scared us and what a great joke it was every chance he got. That's just how he is. To this day, anytime I tell anyone about this, when I get to the part that the spirit was her brother, I get a chill all over my body. Words simply can't describe what it is like being that night and what happened, but I'll never forget about it. I can remember it was just like it was yesterday. If anyone wants to write me about this or anything, feel free to. I'm a native of Hammond, which is very close to Maryville. I've been to Reader Road many times and actually know a different story of the road. The ones I saw on your site are new to me. My parents told me the story long ago, and although I've not experienced it for myself, I know others who claim to have. This may be more of a local story, but who knows? It's still something I'd like to share. Back in the 1950s, the road was often used by teens and young adults as a private makeout place. The story goes that a young lady and her boyfriend made a stop at the road. While they were parked, they heard a thumping on top of the car. They ignored it for a bit. But the girl started to become creeped out as the noise grew louder. The boyfriend decided he would get out and investigate. When he got out, the thumping stopped. After several minutes, the boyfriend had not returned and the thumping started again. The girl panicked and got out of the car. She found her boyfriend bloodied and hung from a tree in the thumping she was hearing 
was the sound of her boyfriend's feet hitting the top of the car as he hung there dead. Supposedly on warm summer nights, if you pull off into the road and park for a bit, you will hear the thumping, and if you get out to investigate, the thumping will stop, and you will find a letterman's jacket hanging from the tree above you. There is also an abandoned school out in Cedar Lake, where Hammond Baptist used to attend. The story goes that the pastor went crazy and removed some of the little ones from this world, if you know what I mean. I've personally have experienced strange happenings in the school, such as children's voices, windows that were shut on the way in open as we walked back out. Supposedly, it's supposed to be the little ones trying to escape. From what I understand a few years ago, part of the building caught fire inexplicably. I haven't been there in about five years. However, if you would like some directions to the place, it's a little tricky to get to, and I would be happy to share them with you if you are interested. Like I said, this is a story passed on to me by my parents, and others I know also know the story and claim to have witnessed it. I'm also aware of the satanic gatherings in the field, down the trail in the woods, usually occurring during the two equinox every year. This may explain some of the animal parts we found. Also, in this field, I've seen glowing orbs here and there, but never thought much of them since they were out far in the field. But you may be able to look into this more than I can. Oh, and the girl that jumped into the river and drowned. She is also part of this story. And Hammond, of course. She can be seen on Halloween night on Klein Avenue hitchhiking to get to her wedding. Supposedly, if you pick her up, she thanks you for the ride and then disappears into the night. My name is Gemma. I went to a primary school in a small village where I lived for a year or two. Then we had to move into a town nearby. It wasn't too far away from my friends so sometimes I would catch the bus there. One day, I went up to see my friend Holly. She told me that my old deputy head teacher had just died. I don't know how old he was, but apparently he got murdered. That night, Holly asked me to stay at her house for the night, so I did. We were only about 10 at the time. Her parents were downstairs, and her two little brothers were both asleep. We were the only people awake upstairs. Holly went downstairs to get something to eat for me and her, and left me alone. I decided to play a trick on her. I turned all the lights off, and hid under her bed in her room. I looked around. I was really scared, so I looked up and saw two eyes looking at me. They were glowing. At that point, I closed my eyes, thinking it was just my imagination. When I opened my eyes, they were still there. I stayed under the bed because I didn't want to move. Then, I heard Holly coming up the stairs. The eyes backed away into the darkness, and I backed away and hid again. When Holly came into the room, I jumped out and scared her. I told her about the eyes, and she believed me. Then she said, let's take a look inside the wardrobe. So we both opened it slowly and took a look inside. Funny enough, nothing was in there except for her clothes and stuff. So we both decided that it was me seeing things because it was dark. Later that night, Holly turned the lights off, and we both went to sleep. I couldn't get to sleep, and I kept on looking over at the wardrobe. I laid there with my eyes open, when suddenly, I saw the eyes again, looking over at me. I slid under my covers. When I looked out, 
and they had gone, but I could feel something in the room. I knew something was there. Suddenly, a black figure appeared in front of me. It laid down, and then I saw the eyes. It was staring right at me. I screamed, which woke Holly up, and she suddenly backed away against the wall. We could both see the black figure on the floor. Then it seemed to sink into the ground and disappear. We both went downstairs and stayed there for a couple of hours. We talked about the figure for ages. Then I said it reminded me of something. Holly said that as well. If we both realized that it looked like Mr. Baker. Why would he haunt us though? We'll never know. When I was younger, I had quite a few paranormal experiences, as did my mom. The most direct contact either of us had with spirits was with her father. He died at home and lived with us when I was about four. My mom was very close to him, and I was pretty close to him too for being so young. After he died, my mom would often be house cleaning and walk into his room where his old recliner sat and smell his unique scent, cigarette smoke mixed with cologne and whatnot. She never saw or heard him, but she would know he was there and would talk to him for a while. When I was six, we moved out of the house he died in and into the house where my mom still lives. I never had the type of encounters my mom had with them. But I was lucky enough to see him once. First, I need to explain the setup of our house. The front and back doors are directly parallel to each other, and both have glass panes in them. The front door opens into the dining room, and he can walk straight through to the kitchen, and then to the back door. You can look from the front porch all the way into the backyard through the glass in these doors. When I was about seven, I was standing in the kitchen, looking out the window of the back door, and I could see the reflection of the front door in the glass. Suddenly, I saw my grandfather walk by the front door in the reflection, as though he was walking across the front porch. He smiled and waved at me. The whole thing only lasted a split second but he was very deliberately contacting me. I believe he chose to do it in such an indirect way so as to not frighten me. Maybe he was saying goodbye since I was too young to understand when he actually died. What's really strange though is that I described him to my mom as looking younger than he did when he died. And when she showed me some pictures of him in his 40s, I told her that that's exactly how he appeared to me. She thinks he must have been happiest during that time of his life, and so chose to appear that way. I think it was a couple years after that when my mom had her final encounter with him. She was house cleaning again, when she smelled his familiar odor. She was in a hurry, and she told him I'm sorry, Dad. I can't really talk right now and left the room. When she came back in, the scent was gone, and she just knew that was the last time she would hear from him. She feels guilty that she didn't stop to talk to him, but I think she just realized that she was ready to move on, and that's why he didn't contact her again. We do believe that he stuck around for a while after that, because he would often lose a piece of jewelry or something small only to have it turn up right under our noses a few days later. I've had other experiences unrelated to my grandfather, but his was the only human spirit I ever actually saw. Not long after we moved into the new home, I had several experiences with feline spirits. I once saw the hind legs and tail of a cat disappearing into, not up, the top of the stairs from the landing. I know it could have been our own cat, because it was pure white, 
and our two cats were black. Another time, I was sitting at the kitchen table when I felt a cat rubbing against my legs. I reached down to pet it, but nothing was there. And when I looked under the table, there was no cat to be found. There were also a few incidents in my mom's house where electronics would do seemingly things on their own. The TV turned itself off at least twice that I could remember. But perhaps the weirdest instance was when I was in my bedroom listening to my stereo. It has one of those LED screens that flashes at things as music plays. And when you turn the volume knob, these bars show up on the screen that move up or down as you change the volume. I was listening to music one day. And I had my back to the stereo. When I realized the volume was getting lower, I turned around. And the volume display came up on the screen. And the bars were going down like the knob was being turned. I turned the volume back up. And nothing else happened after that. This has gotten long. But I only have one more experience to share. At another sleepover with my best friend, we decided to leave a tape recorder with a blank tape in an empty room while we hung out in the living room and record whatever there was to hear. No one went in the room while I was recording and the door was shut. When we played it back, we could very faintly hear ourselves in the living room for most of the tape and nothing else. But there was one spot on the tape where a high-pitched voice spoke in a loud, raspy whisper. It was obviously neither of us, because you could hear us in the background very softly behind it. We weren't sure what it said, but it sounded like shine the light. It didn't make any sense, but it did creep us out. That was the only unexplained voice on the tape, which unfortunately... I no longer have. That was the last experience I had that I'm certain had no physical explanation. This is a story about ghosts that I think is worth sharing. It's a little bizarre and not very detailed, but I think it would capture your interest. When I was young, I always heard ghost stories revolving around these red coat ghosts. These were entities that would often appear in our house. The home I lived in used to house British soldiers from Napoleon's time, so essentially the late 1700s. I remember one particular incident. It was late at night, and that's when I started to hear strange noises in my room. At first, I brushed them off, not thinking anything of it, because you can always explain these incidents away as nothing more than just normal noises. Then, I started to hear noises which were very peculiar. I would hear faded whispers, like a group of people whispering when I would open my door to investigate the sound. It wasn't anything loud, and didn't last for too long. Of course, I ended up going down that staircase to find a root cause of these whispers. What I saw next was actually quite interesting to me. Not scary, although a bit unbelievable. After going downstairs and into the living room, I saw two red coat soldiers for a second, just standing side by side as they quickly faded from the living room. They also had a foggy and faded quality to them to begin with, where you could barely tell a figure was there with the red colors. I'll never forget the moment the rest of my life. Growing up in Lakeland, Florida, my parents purchased a repossessed mobile home. One of the bedroom doors had a deadbolt lock but face so the child in the room could not get out. My elder sister had this room and reported a small girl 
about the age of five or six that would appear in a white nightgown, carrying a teddy bear. She would sit at the end of my sister's bed and just cry. In the closet of the bedroom in the same home, there were stickers and drawings in the wall where it appeared someone was punished and made to sit in the closet. There were also fingernail scratches on the wall in the same closet. In the third children's room of the same home, there was brown carpeting with a lime green shape on the floor that was the same shape of a clothes iron. If an iron fell into carpeting while it was hot, doesn't it make sense it would just burn the carpet hair instead of change the color to green? My aunt even had to come remove a spirit once that was following my little sister all the way to school and hiding behind things when she'd turn around to see who was following her. My little sister said it resembled a grim reaper type of shadow. In the same home, items would mysteriously be moved to another area. Things would then come up missing, then all of a sudden reappear one day. I truly believe that we are not living alone on this earth, and that spirits live among us. There are a lot of theories as to why this is, but to me, I believe that ghosts and spirits are almost other living forms trapped in another dimension. Even if we have loved ones who have passed and appeared to us, to me, it's like they are leaving this realm of existence to enter another one. And they behave much like we all do, often unaware of the world they just left. I believe that the ones that chose to bridge the gap between our world and theirs are messengers chosen by God to give us confirmation that we as human beings will not lose purpose once we have left this earth, and that our souls do live on. Even if you aren't a religious type, I do believe that if ghosts exist, then God must exist in some form. Otherwise, how do these souls still live on? And what power is allowing them to exist in the other universe? Anyway, my ghost experience comes at the time I was staying at my grandmother's. It was night, and I was 11 years old. I was watching TV in the living room when I heard what sounded like my grandfather who was a heavy set man, a tall, make his way through the home, noticeable footsteps, as if he were wearing boots, and they were walking across the hardwood floor. At the time, I immediately recognized it was probably my deceased grandpa, so I yelled out to Grandpa Bunky, please stop scaring me. I was hoping I would get confirmation of him leaving me alone because I'm a very anxious person, and even though I'm in tune with spirits, sometimes I just don't want to deal with it. I don't think my grandpa honestly meant any harm by it, but I think he felt that he wasn't getting enough attention, if that makes sense, and wanted his presence to really be known that day. He was always known as a loud, boisterous person in life, the kind of man that had to be the center of attention. Then, out of the corner of my eye, I could have swear I saw the shadow of my grandfather materialize. As soon as I got up to turn directly to where he was, he was gone and faded. So I rushed downstairs to where my grandma was. I really wanted to make sure that nobody else was upstairs. So I just asked grandma, if she was just up the stairs in the hall. She emphatically said no and asked me why I was so concerned. I told her that I saw Grandpa and she said that Grandpa is gone and that while you may miss him, we have to accept this. She didn't believe in the afterlife. Funny thing was, about a year before this all happened, my great uncle died of a disease in his lungs and kidneys. This was the exact same disease that my grandpa had died from. 
while that's not unusual, my older sister told me she witnessed the exact same thing that happened to me. One night, when I was at a friend's house sleeping over, she was about 17 at the time. So, I'm not entirely sure if it was my grandpa or great uncle exactly, but I still think my grandpa was the one to visit because he knew me better than my great uncle did. I also think that it had to be my grandpa because maybe he wanted my grandma to believe, but since she's closed off to this world because of her views, he was frustrated. Maybe he gave her signs and she ignored them. Are frustrated ghosts a thing? Anyway, hope you enjoyed my story. I have a crazy story to tell. I live in New Orleans. That's of course located in Louisiana, the deep south. One night, me and my girlfriend were at home, and I'm guessing it was around 5.30 in the morning. I'm assuming because that's when I got up to go to work, and I always sit by the window and wait for my ride. This morning was a bit unusual and different. I was sitting there, and all of a sudden, I felt this overwhelming chill brush past me, like an undeniable cold air. I asked my girlfriend if she was cold, and she said no. I don't know what it was, but something told me to tell her to sit in my chair to see if she felt what I was describing. It was a lingering cold that didn't go away and told me she could feel the cold chill as well. It gave us both goosebumps and within a few moments, the coldness quickly disappeared. The crazy part is, I think the chair is haunted. It was given to me as a present from generations in the family. I'm talking an early 1900 style rocking chair. I remember one of my uncles wanted to just sell it off eBay to get rid of it because he didn't want anything to do with it. So I ended up taking it off his hands because of the family history. The most interesting part of this chair is a lot of my family members have claimed to see a black figure in that chair rocking back and forth on numerous occasions. At times, it would be seen rocking on its own without anything being seen. I still have yet to witness anything like this, but ironically, a friend staying over our house actually did. It was later that night, and my girlfriend and I were in a separate room. Suddenly, my friend screams for us to come in because he just saw the rocking chair move on its own without any force. He didn't even know about the history of that chair and our family, so that made it even more terrifying, but intriguing in a way. My dad had stayed in our house once, and he said looking out the window, there was a tree outside our home, and late at night, he saw a faded man in overalls walk behind the tree and suddenly disappear. Again, none of these things have personally happened to me, but they seem to be happening to my family and friends. None of them are capable of lying. I don't see why anyone would anyway, since we're all older, mature adults, and we have no business lying for attention or any purpose, really. Now, just because I said I didn't experience anything, Besides the coldness in the chair, it doesn't mean my girlfriend has it. She told me one day when she was out on the front porch where you could see the tree. It was evening. It was getting pretty dark, but not so dark you couldn't see anything. She too thought she saw a very dark shadow move around the tree and then disappear. She said it was the weirdest thing because it was like a fog and you could easily see the contrast between the tree and this mysterious fog. I don't know if you've seen these type of videos before on YouTube where they show this type of stuff, but she said it was very similar to that. 
She's also seen the blinds from the window where the chair is positioned move from time to time without any explanation. Knocks on the walls and sometimes her name is whispered into her ear. Again, these are her experiences, so I can't tell you if it's real based on what she said. But again, my girlfriend wouldn't lie to me for no reason. As you know, New Orleans is a city with lots of history dating back hundreds of years. And with our old home, there's bound to be some entity, especially with the haunted chair. Do you believe in this? Because honestly, as crazy as it may seem, I do, even without having these experiences for my own to share. As an open-minded person, I'm not just going to hate on someone just because they have a ghost story to tell. I'll be open-minded. I'll consider their credibility and other things. If all those aspects of their personality check out, then yes, I'll have to believe them. This world is fascinating. It has a lot of mystery. I will not just ignore the spirit world. I just wish that I could experience it too. Just once. What everyone else has as well. I used to live in the Theta Chi fraternity house as a brother. There were stories talking about the house had a fire in the attic and all sorts of supernatural and paranormal happenings. I can confirm the fire in the attic was true, and strange things did happen too. Some even reported glowing eyes in the dark of the attic. However, one of the most common had to do with the lights. We had sensors installed to cut back on the brothers leaving the lights on. These sensors only react to the movement. These lights would go on and off all the time when nobody would be in the room. We would be several rooms away, far enough from the sensors that we wouldn't set them off, and they would suddenly go on and off. Also, there were times when we would be sleeping, and we would wake up to what sounded like a large social gathering downstairs. Several of us would go down there, thinking it was a group of brothers coming home from the bar, only to find the entire house empty and no one would be around. Also, I used to work at Have a Nice Day Cafe, and the upstairs was indeed haunted. I would have to go up there every night to take down a banner that was thrown over the exterior of the building. To do this, I would have to go to the roof via the upstairs. It is full of rooms, completely empty. There was this long hallway that stretched the length of the building. There was only one light that sat at the end of the hallway. As you walk down the hall, you would get the feeling that you were being watched. Several bouncers have claimed to see a man up there. Apparently, before it was Have a Nice Day Cafe, it was called Industry, and one night, a barback intentionally left the world upstairs, using a broken beer bottle, and when the bouncers would make their rounds before closing, they would have to go up there to make sure no one snuck up there. When they would flash their flashlights into the room in which the sad incident took place, the man ghost was seen crying and bleeding. He would get up and run towards you, as if asking for help. Many bouncers quit after they experienced it. I guess you could say they bounced after they saw that ghost. This is a true story of our family's experience at Theodorus' Bridge in Wichita, Kansas. I grew up in Sigwood, Kansas, a small town just north of the bridge's location. Since my family is American Indian, we always respected the legend and tales of the bridge. On May 12th, 1983, my own mother was killed in a car wreck within feet of the old bridge. The police couldn't explain what caused her to swerve sharply to the left. However, 
They agree that something must have been in the road right in front of her. What's odd is that no animal tracks were ever found, and it wasn't another car. I was young at the time, and I woke around midnight with a horrible dream. It had to do with being grossly removed from this life. Someone had chopped my head off with an axe. Later that morning, around 4.45 a.m., I was awakened again by someone pounding on my door. It was the police looking for me. Turns out, they found my driver's license in my mom's car. Thinking it was me who died, they came to inform my parents only to find me standing in the doorway. Several years later, I was helping my dad go through some papers and found my mom's death certificate. Only then did I find out that mom was thrown through the windshield with her head coming right off. Throughout the years, as family members and friends have drove by, the sight strange things have happened to them. Their cars would quit working for just a few moments or they see things, like my mom standing there looking at them and smiling. If anyone would like to email me, I'd be more than happy to talk to you about all the strange things I've occasionally seen. My name is Catherine. After the experiences me and my family have had, I know we have a ghost. It all started when I was seven. I couldn't get to sleep. I looked down from my bunk bed for a moment or two and saw in my bedroom closet, which had no door, what seemed to be a little girl sitting in there, staring at me. She wore a white dress and was underneath either a white blanket or a duvet cover. Once me, my mom and my sister were watching a film in the dark, and suddenly, on the shelf, my picture was slammed down. One time my sister had said that she had seen the ghost, one night when we had our normal beds. She saw her walk from the closet to the end of the bed, and just staring at her. Then she flew through the wall. The second time I saw her was when I was out in the kitchen. I saw her out the window, in the shadow window, smiling. But there would be two faces beside her this time. The scariest experience I've ever encountered was when I was watching TV. I was sitting down on one of the seats when I heard footsteps coming down the stairs. I got scared and turned off the TV to ask who was there. Then the door creaked open. Then there was a noise in the other seat, like someone was sitting down on it. I was so scared that I couldn't even move. Nothing else happened since then, but I know our house is haunted for sure. The girl just won't go away. Hi, my name is Kim. I'm 18 years old, and I have a few experiences I would like to share with you. Every summer, I used to go to my Nana's farm and help out. The last time I went was a few years ago. That was when I was 14, and something creepy happened that I've since tried to forget. I think it's about time I shared it with you all. It was a boiling hot July afternoon, and I was helping to clean out one of the barns. My Nana went on and on for about an hour, complaining that it was too hot for her liking, but I decided to stay to try and finish. About ten minutes after my Nana left, I began to hear tiny pitter-patter of the feet in the hayloft thinking that it was just mice or something. I got on with my work. I began sweeping when I heard laughter in two voices, one of a boy and the other of a girl, talking in hushed whispers. I peered up the stairs, feeling slightly scared, and called again, but nobody replied. As I turned to get back to my work, the voice of the girl called up, up here. I was quite spooked. Nobody should be up here, but yet, there I was, hearing a voice. Sometimes, though, 
the other kids in the village muck around, so maybe I thought it was one of them. Hey, you're not allowed up there, I shouted as I walked up the stairs. As I got up to the hayloft, I looked up to see two black shadows with hooks through their necks, almost hanging for a split second. This faded quickly. I completely freaked out and ran screaming to my Nana's house. My Nana later told me that two little people had died in that barn when they were playing around. My mom came to pick me up the next day, and as we drove away, I looked back at the barn and saw two little faces staring right back at me from the hayloft window. Needless to say, I never went back. In 1998, I had a ghost experience. My first, and I hope my last. I was living in the second floor of a college dormitory. My colleague that lived directly under me would ask me on occasion if I was moving furniture late in the night and early morning, between 12 midnight and 2 a.m. Absolutely not. I can recall that I moved my bed once in the middle of the day when I first moved in at the beginning of the semester. I thought maybe it was a ghost because it was common knowledge that our dormitory was an old TB hospital. The entire campus was located on an old military hospital site. Her cafeteria was where the morgue was, back in the Great First Conflict, or the Great Second Conflict. I never heard anything in my room. Then, early one Saturday morning, I got up and made myself coffee and left the dormitory on the second floor and headed down the old iron stairs. I made my way across the tennis courts to make a phone call. I could see my dormitory from where I stood. I dialed a number and was talking to a friend steadily watching the stairs to my dorm. That is, when I saw a smoky black figure flailing its arms around and staring straight at me. Then it went back into the locked closed doors of the second floor dorm. They lock behind each person that leaves, so I reported it to staff. That is when I started to hear many ghost stories from the night's guardsmen that patrolled the cafeteria and hallways. There are many dorm buildings on campus. Anyhow, I put it behind me and continued my life. Shortly after my brother died, due to a long illness, I returned to college but got my own apartment and shared it with a friend. It would get so cold in there, he turned on all the way up and the fireplace on, yet it was 70 degrees outside. I was still grieving, so I withdrew from college and took my truck on a long drive across the country in Nebraska while at a rest stop. My entire truck swarmed with flies. I'm very clean. And so was in my truck. I was eating, but still swarms of flies. I threw my food away and drove and drove crying and screaming, trying to get them out of my truck. I stopped to wash my truck, then got a motel and shower. I returned six months later to my old apartment to ask around to see if the new renters had any problem. The lady that opened the door was really nice and said that she had to hire someone from another state to come and clear the ghost. She said that it was so bad that the person they hired had to have a partner come and help. She mentioned the freezing cold room temperatures, the feelings that someone was following her up the stairs, like I had. They said they do a certain ceremony and burn certain herbs to clear away the spirit, because she didn't mind her ghost clearing work but it was too much for her. She said that the people she hired said that the bowl they used to burn herbs caught fire. The flames reached the ceiling. It was the worst ghost cleansing they had to do in a long time. Then the lady did a ceremony over me and the feeling that something hanging on my back just went away. Actually, I felt whatever it was kind of crawl up and out of me. 
and move my spine involuntarily. I've never had a problem since. Mabel Castle, located in Asherville, Scotland, was built many hundreds of years ago and is reputed to have its fair share of ghosts. There have been many sightings over the years, one of which may be the young lady Jane, who had been imprisoned in the turret for falling in love with a gypsy. I recently have been invited to participate in a sponsored ghost watch at the castle, but chicken out the last minute. Due to a recent visit by a ghost expert, who reported the presence of at least three ghosts, one of which was a crying child who had been tortured and tied in the basement. There was regular paranormal activity reported, as the castle is still being used as offices. Anyway, I'm sort of of two minds about losing my nerve, as the ghost watch had proved eventful. Crying had been heard from the basement. When the team left at 4 a.m., they made sure all the lights had been turned off. But in the car park, they looked back, and all the lights had been turned back on. When the cleaner came in the morning, the energy-conscious ghost had turned them off again. Of course, such paranormal happenings are not rare in Scotland. I can quote hundreds from friends and family. These are just a few. My sister and husband walked into a bookshop housed in a very old building with a bookshop straight off of one shelf, one after the other. My youngest sister lived for years in a haunted house, possibly the spirit of a young child. There were occasional temper tantrums. This is a tragic, but true tale. My youngest sister and her then-boyfriend, George, had friends over for the evening. Of course, the talk turned to ghost stories in general, when suddenly, the door of the sitting room flew open with such force, it crashed against the arm of the sofa and slammed shut again. George jumped up and pulled open the door, but nobody was there. Everyone was shaken by the violence of the event. Later, it was learned that at that precise moment in time, George's cousin and his friend had drowned in the River Irvin after a night of drinking and hijinks that went badly wrong. I remember reading about the drowning of these men in the local paper at the time, but did not learn of the connection to my sister's boyfriend until later. A friend heard the voice via baby monitor, which urged the baby to come. It was hard to be distinguished from the low guttural tone whether it was male or female. When they went to investigate, no one was in the room besides the baby. My name is Trisha, and I'm writing about one of the many few ghost experiences I've had in my life. I'm fortunate to have found the site to talk to many of those who have experiences with the supernatural. I moved to Bemis Point, New York from Woodbridge, Virginia on May 1st, 2004 into a house which as to this date, I still call my dream home because all my life, I always wanted to live in a home so big and so beautiful. This house had five bedrooms, one bath, a basement, in a beautiful yard. I want to explain why I've chosen to talk about this particular experience in this home in Bemis Point, New York. Of course, I wasn't the only person living in a five-bedroom home. It was me, my fiancé, and my four-year-old son. My fiancé's brother and father were going to live with us. However, that didn't really work out. So it was just the three of us for a while. Before we all actually moved into the home, my fiancé and my father went to the house to drop off some belongings of ours. My fiancé had videotaped every room of the home. The home was just so extraordinary to us, like something we had never seen before. As of this date, we still hold in possession the tape 
which had been recorded of that home. One of the bedrooms had been painted with artwork from a very artistic person. That artwork is believed to have been finger painted and very unusual. At the time I looked at the house before we had all moved in, I went to that room with the painting many times. I knelt down on my knees in front of the painting and touched it with my hands to get a full feel of its characterization. I will say, to this date, that the painting that was on the wall at that very moment had changed once we had moved into the home. First, it was a painting of a turkey, very unusual. There were many things in this house that were strange, only we didn't catch the unusual things about them until we had moved in. To this date, I only hope to find who had lived here before we had, and I will, in time, find my answers. Now you will know the beginning of this unusual experience. It started with that painting. After we had moved into the home, we began to refresh our minds a little bit of what we thought was strange. I was in the process of unpacking and settling into our new home. I went back into that room with the painting and was in shock from what I had seen. That painting was a woman and there was writing above the painting of that woman and it said earth, hater, everything. The painting of the woman was on the wall, right on the outlet corner where a television had been sitting. I will explain to you what description I'd seen in that painting. It was a woman whose face was intensely beaten with blood flowing from her hair down through her face and then to her arms. Her hair was hung up as if she had been in an electric shock. Her face was bruised badly and cut up with scars on the side of her face. Her eyes were open, and the smile on her face was extremely intense, as if she was angry. I looked around the room more thoroughly, and there on the other side of the wall were more paintings. One was of a butterfly, and a mushroom was the other. On the closet door was a poem written by the famous poet, Keats. I believe to this date, the same person who had written the poem on the door had to have been the same person who did the painting on the wall. I looked around the room closer and came upon some blood on the floor on the side of the room. It was not fresh blood because it looked like it had dried up and had been there for a long while. I closed the door behind me and left the room. I didn't go back to the room until later on through the next week. One of the rooms upstairs was right next to that room that we had turned into an office. Across the room was the bathroom. On the other side was another room we used for our bedroom. Of course, there was an attic located right across from the room with the painting. On the door that leads to the attic is a sign that says private. I always wondered who slept up there in that attic. In the attic, there were beds, two of them. The beds were built into the floor and the walls. Underneath the boards of the beds were pipes. I won't say what kind of pipes because I'm not sure. My only guess is that they are water pipes. The attic was made to be one of the five bedrooms in the entire house. This room, however, was among the most strangest thing I'd ever seen. The exception with the room being the painting. In this room, the attic was cross spaces large enough to fit almost 10 or more bodies depending on the size. In one of the cross spaces was another painting. This painting was put together with boards. It was handmade, and the colors of the painting were the exact same colors used in the painting of the other room. It seemed to be the painting of the devil. However, it was never confirmed of what the painting really was. There was a sofa left in the room with strands of brown hair, which seemed to be the color of my own hair, and I never even sat on the couch when we found it there, let alone had it belonged to me. Along with the sofa, there had been a brown recliner chair sitting next to the sofa. Underneath the recliner there had been a huge blood stain. 
in turn could have passed to be a huge stain of grease. The attic could have been turned into at least two rooms by the size of the cross spaces, and that's an example of how big they were. When I left the room of the attic to go back downstairs, I noticed as I walked down the stairs, there had been names engraved into the carpet of each step that I walked down. I could not make out the names, but I was indeed visible to the eye. It was very strange to me. I wanted to find out some information about the house because I began to get nervous and anxious of the situation. I turned to our next door neighbor for info and hoped to find out all I could. One side of the house was cut off by a wall where the next door neighbor had lived. It was indeed unfortunate to us because that wall was separated from the neighbor and had not been closed off to him as he had all entrances into our part of the house. No door on our side had locks to keep him coming through our side of the home. This made me very nervous, especially throughout the night. With an exact total of four rooms upstairs, in the bathroom, and only one bedroom downstairs. We had turned that room on the bottom level downstairs into my son's room. It was not safe enough to put my son upstairs due to the stairwell and the fact that I was afraid that he would get hurt. Therefore, the only room downstairs we had used for his room, just outside of my son's bedroom, was the basement door and another door that led to the next door neighbor's bathroom. We were told that the door that led to the neighbor's bathroom had not been used because the bathroom toilet was broken. To this date, I don't believe that theory which had been said to us. I noticed on the side where my son's bedroom was, each door had locks on them at the top, which made me nervous because I was concerned that someone could get locked in and would not be able to get out. However, the only door without a lock was the bathroom door to the neighbor's side of the home. That seemed a bit unusual to me, as if it was purposely set up that way so that the next door neighbors could have entrance into our side of the home whenever he wanted to come on our side. Another entrance that our next door neighbor had to our side of the house was in the kitchen right where the pantry closet is. In the process of unpacking, I had sat some pictures against the door until I got around to hang them up. Other entrances the neighbor had to our side of the home were upstairs and in the basement. There was a storage place located right between the office and the bathroom, which had two doors inside the storage space that the next door neighbor could use on our side of the home. On our side of the storage space were locks, therefore, we were fortunate for the matter. The doors to the storage space were made of glass, and therefore, it would have to take someone to break the glass or professionally remove the glass in order to enter on our side. As for the basement, the neighbor would have to break the chain on our side to come up the stairs on our side. Anyway, after having suspicions of what may have happened in this home or what could have happened, I had to talk to someone and find out something. That's when I started questioning the next door neighbor. One day, I ran into our neighbor outside, not literally, and asked him about the painting that was on the wall. I asked him if he had known of the tenants who used to live in the home before us, and possibly all he could tell me about the painting and who stayed in the home where the painting was. The neighbor claims that a girl by the name Anna stayed in that room at one time and told me that she was the one who did the painting. At that very moment, I felt that there was more that he had known, that I need to know now. With having a few supernatural experiences previously, the feeling that someone would lead me to some kind of answer cling to me, to ask him more about what he could tell me. He told me that Anna was about the same age as me, and knew that she had been involved in many serious circumstances with others dealing with gothic rituals practicing witchcraft, and had camped out with others in the back of the house at a campsite where most of the rituals were being performed. 
He offered to take me back to the campsite one day, although I never was able to get around to it. Thereafter, I insisted on letting him take a look at the painting himself, as well as the poem from Keats that was written on the door in the room. We also went to the attic to look at the stain that was on the floor. He could not agree with me that it looked like anything like a blood stain. I showed him the names engraved into the carpet on the stairs to the attic. He couldn't make a vision of what I had been seeing. Therefore, he wasn't able to discuss that matter with me. As far as the blood in the room on the floor of the room of the painting, he did in fact agree with me that it appeared to be blood stains. However, he could not give me any explanation of why or how it got in there. The neighbor explained that he rarely paid any attention to anything in the home and hadn't been in the home but a few times to do some work to it. I didn't agree with that theory at all. I knew there had to be a lot of info missing that he wouldn't tell me then. The neighbor insisted on finding someone to come look at the painting. I told him that it would be a good idea for someone to come out to take a look at everything I would seen and to examine the home in case there was any signs of supernatural crisis. When the neighbor left, I assumed that what he intended to do was not going to happen only because I felt that he knew more than he was willing to tell me at that time. I left the matter alone long enough for me to stumble across anything else that seemed unusual to me. The day after, my fiancé and I, along with our son, left the home to take care of some business, and when we had returned to the home that evening, we saw the neighbor coming out of our house with a cooking pot. It was quite unusual to us knowing that the home had been locked up and could not understand how he had gotten into the home without having a key. My fiancé and I got out of the car, and the neighbor walked over to us, explaining that he went into the house. He told us that we made him quite nervous about the discussion with the painting as well as everything else we talked about. Therefore, he decided to speak with his cousin on how to bless the home. The neighbor explained that he blessed the entire home using some ancient herbs that were given to him and told us that he was trying to help us out because he felt that it would resolve the situation. After his explanation, he continuously explained that he would not go back into the home without us knowing about it first. We left this incident alone, being as it was a first time offense, and he said he was trying to help. When we walked into the home after speaking with him, we could smell the scent of the herbs he used all through the home. It was a very strong and painful scent almost as if it was the smell of marijuana. The smell was in a long stretch throughout the home. I was more concerned for my son. We had to leave the house for a few hours more in order to escape the smell and painful irritation of our eyes. Finally, once we returned to the home, the smell settled and we could breathe again. I wasn't actually pleased for the matter that he had came into the home uninvited and blessed the home with no knowledge of what he was doing. Still, I left the matter alone, believing that he would not do it again. In order to concentrate on other things, I used my time trying to unpack my things and cleaning one room to the next. It wasn't until the next few days later, I had an incident of my own. It was in the middle of the night, we were all asleep, and I was awakened by a man who laid there on top of me with all his weight pushing on me, so tight that I couldn't breathe. I thought I had been having a nightmare, although my eyes were open, and the force I had been using to fight and pull to escape this man's weight, and the fear he had been pouring over me, was only a nightmare in my life, in reality. I looked beside me as I laid there fighting to escape the fear amongst the man's desire to hurt me, trying to wake my fiancé from a sleep to save me. 
My fiancé laid there in a deep sleep, as he could not hear a peep from my crying screams of what I had left to breathe. I had been played with that very night, if you know what I mean. Laying there in my own head, with my fiancé laying right next to me. With one heroic scream, I used all my weight to escape this man's arms and pushed him off of me. Frightening, all I could see was his brown hair and his back that turned to my face as he walked away with not even two seconds and disappeared. I sat up in my bed next to my fiancé, waiting there, holding my body, hoping he would be awake and hold me. I could not make sense of this. Not then, and not now. Even after, I knew it wasn't over. I couldn't even call the police, because let's face it, I wouldn't be able to explain to them of such an incident. Even so, they wouldn't be able to believe me. Amongst other things, they would turn it on my fiancé, and I would not take that route. Not then, and not now. After my fiancé had awakened, I told him about what happened. He just held me tight, and he was worried. I'm thankful he believed me. After a while, I was too angry to sit there and do nothing. I was determined to get my answers. Even then, why me? I know I'm not the only person in the entire world who has had this exact same incident. There are others. I know because I've read about them. I know that there are others out there who have been hurt multiple times in incidents like this. I've now moved out of that home and only lived two minutes away from there. I've not been back since we moved. There are others who I'm aware who live in that same house right now as I'm telling you this. Four of them I am aware of are girls. I fear for them. I worry for them. Even though this isn't the only incident that happened to me in that same home, they live in there as I speak. As there have been many incidents, not so much severe to this one, I worry for anyone who lives there. This will come back to me one day. In some form, some way, it will find me, and I will find my answers. I've had the experience of the supernatural ever since I was a young child around the age of seven years old. It has followed me. I'm 22 now. This house I lived in in Buma Point, New York was said to be over 100 years old. The supernatural experiences I've had are real. It may be some kind of gift that I've been given, but it's frightening at the same time. I only seek to understand it. Even so, it's frightening to know the answers I'm looking for. I can only do what I can to accept this the best way I find reasonable. I will tell you that the man who messed with me that night is in no way comparison to any person I've ever met or come across my entire life. This will be one of the many experiences I will never forget. I know that there are others out there who wonder just the same as I do. Why me? Is there ever really an answer to that question? And, if you ever wonder whatever happened to the painting, or the handmade artwork that was found in those rooms, I won't be able to explain that to you. All I can tell you is that, the neighbor that lived next door to me went into the house without telling us, carved that painting off the wall, literally, and told me that he burned it. As far as the handmade artwork made out of boards, I won't ever know. The neighbor took that too. To this date, that painting exists as well as the handmade artwork made of boards. Everything in this house exists to me, and as far as the girl I was told that did the painting on the wall, Anna, what does she know? Where is she today? My last question in regards to the land. John, do you always allow your son to go into the home whenever he wants to, especially when other tenants are renting the home from you? Trust me, one day it could end up being a big mistake for him. 
My guess is, is there something to hide? I live in Arlington, Washington. When I moved into my house, the fork started bending. Now when I'm there by myself, I can hear people walking upstairs. When I'm upstairs trying to sleep, I can hear people or things running up and down the stairs. If I get up and look down the stairs, I can't see anything, but I can still hear it. Soon after we started moving into this home, our pets started disappearing. One of our cats came back covered in what looked like blood. He was gone about an hour after he came back. All of our pets were inside pets. My aunt saw a little girl in my yard and in the house with blonde hair. Nobody I live with or live near has even blonde hair. When my mom lived with me, she saw her too. My sister loved to listen to her stereo. But then the stations started changing by themselves. We could actually watch the bar move back and forth across it. Recently, my dad's stereo started doing that too. I got an eyes on sticky film camera for my birthday one year. I took a picture and there was an orb in the corner of it. When I'm home alone, it can totally be silent. I'll be reading a book and my dog will start barking. I can get her to calm down, but as soon as I sit down again, she starts barking again. My cousin and I got really big chills right before we hear any of the noises upstairs. We look at our attic doors, but every morning the lock is unlocked and sometimes on the ground. Sometimes at night, I can even hear faint talking. I had a friend stay with me once and she tried to get out of bed, but she said she felt something heavy on her. There was nothing that I could see on her. My dad went into the kitchen in the middle of the night to get a glass of water, and the freezer was wide open. This all started in 88. My aunt even had someone come and bless the home. I guess it didn't work, because it is still happening. My name is Eric, and I have a couple of occurrences that are rather interesting. Nothing amazing, but definitely weird. I've always been interested by dark things. Like to dress in black, and I like to listen to extreme metal and such things like that. So I've always kept an open mind on such things. Well, anyways, when I was about six years old, me and some of my brothers slept in the floor of the living room for about a couple of years. Well, one night, I awoke for no real reason, I guess. I was still tired, so I didn't want to get up or open my eyes when I felt something unexplainable. It was the feeling that someone was near me that wanted to hurt me. I can't explain it. I just felt that. Well, being curious... I opened my eyes, and I saw an older woman crouching down next to me, and her face was right in front of mine, as if looking right at me. I closed my eyes again in sheer terror, but I was still curious to see if it was still there. So I looked, and the woman's face was still there. I didn't actually see her body, I just assumed she had a body or something. I closed and opened my eyes several times. And she was still there. I was more scared than heck. But somehow, I went back to sleep. It never happened again. And I never told anybody. Because I really thought it could have been my imagination. But I know what I felt. And I'll never forget that terrible feeling I got. Another interesting experience I had. Was the same year. A few months later. I woke up for no real reason. And when I opened my eyes, I saw an older looking woman standing on the base of my brother's feet that slept next to me. I didn't close my eyes because I wanted to see if it was real. At one moment, I felt that same threatening feeling 
but not for myself. But I actually feared the well-being of my brother. I went to sleep again, and it never happened again after. I never told anybody for the same reason as last time, because I'm skeptical. So I could have been either a real apparition, or just my stupid imagination. I guess I'll never know. Ever since I was a little girl, I've seen things or felt things. I haven't decided if I follow the feelings and spirits, or if they follow me. When I was seven, I lived in a huge farmhouse. I was awakened one night by a cold feeling on my cheek, almost like someone was placing their hand and just brushing it against my cheek. I sat up in bed and looked around, expecting it to be my sister trying to wake me up. Instead, I was greeted with an empty room. I tried to fall asleep all night and couldn't. For weeks, I refused to sleep on my own room and stayed with my parents. About a month later, I was back to sleeping in my room and was awakened again, but this time by the closing of the side door downstairs. I thought it was my father coming home late, so I walked into the hallway. What greeted me on the stairs still scares the daylights out of me today. When I got to the stairs, a lady that I had never seen before was walking up the stairs, or so I thought, but when I looked closer, I realized that the woman was floating up the stairs. She wore a dark brown skirt and a white blouse covered by a jacket. The white blouse had been stained in red in a few places. When I squinted my eyes to try and get a better look at the blurred image, I saw that the woman's face was battered and covered in blood. I was frozen in my tracks and unable to move. I just stood there. She didn't appear for too long until she ultimately faded away. But I'm convinced that the presence was a former owner of the farmhouse I used to live in. In my last antidote, I introduced you to my mother's family, the Sorensons, who lived in East London, South Africa, during the first half of the century. In fact, most of the family members remaining alive at this time are still living in East London, although a few have also moved to other cities in the country. Families were, in those days, much larger than they are nowadays. In my mother's family, which had 12 children, was not unusual. This story concerns one of my mother's brothers, Nigel, who was, for some reason, nicknamed Boy. I've always known this story for as long as I can remember, but two weeks ago, I formally interviewed my mother before I started the story proper. Let me give you just a little background on my family. My maternal grandmother's name was Mina, but I was, however, never fortunate enough to meet her as she died some years before I was born. She and my maternal grandfather, Chris, did, however, instill in all their sons and daughters a deep and abiding belief of all things spiritual and religious, and the whole family were staunch Catholics. My mother and her brothers and sisters believe in ghosts and spirits, and, in my mother's own words, firmly believe that spirits of those people that we are close to in life remain close to us after their deaths. It was not uncommon, in the days of the beginning of this century, for an above average number of babies to die when very young. In my mother's family, however, only the firstborn, a boy called Ivan, died in early childhood, and the remaining 11 were all healthy and thrived, until 1944 that is. My uncle boy, who was 30 years old at the time, came on one night after having a few beers, and as he did not want his mother to smell the alcohol on his breath, he decided to spend what remained of the night in his car that was parked outside their family house in Park Street. He did not have a peaceful night. However, 
as he was unfortunately brutally attacked and robbed. His attacker had on a pair of army boots and forcefully kicked my uncle on the head. So forcefully, in fact, that the boy later contracted and died from inflammation of the brain. He died in a hospital on July 2nd, 1944, and was buried by the family near the end of the month. The entire family was devastated, as he had been much loved. He had been the joker of the family, and always used to perform practical jokes on my mother and her older sisters, dressing up as Dracula and jumping out to frighten them and so on. He apparently had a very loving nature and a great sense of family. I had never married. On the day of the funeral, my grandmother, my mother and her sisters Lily, Chinetta and Edna, locked up the house in Park Street and prepared to walk to the church, which was just down the street. They had recently received a large arrangement of St. Joseph Lilies from a family friend in sympathy for Boy's death, and the flowers had been placed in a vase in the dining room before the ladies had left for church. No one was left in the house, and, furthermore, no one, other than my grandmother, had keys to the house. After the service was finished, they walked back to their house, and my grandmother unlocked the front door. The dogs were very excited to see them, most probably wanting company, after having been left alone for so long. My mother, being the youngest, rushed past the others and into the dining room. She stopped dead in the dining room doorway and turned around. That's when she noticed the apparition of Boy standing right there. He had a completely blank expression and simply just pointed in the corner of the dining room. That's when my mother looked to see what he was pointing at and was horrified. She saw what appeared to be a dark figure with robes on and a hood sitting on a rocking chair. A second later, Boy disappeared, and so did the mysterious hooded figure. The most interesting part of this whole story is my mom told me that the chair was still rocking by itself moments after the hooded figure disappeared. I know this all sounds a little hard to believe, but believe me, this was a real occurrence. Believe it or not, ghosts and spirits do exist. You just have to be open to seeing them. Oh, and by the way, those lilies that you saw earlier in the story, the ones I mentioned, yes, they were face down where the apparitions were, two of them. I worked in a movie theater that used to be a theater before, but not movie, but stage. As a matter of fact, the stage is still there, complete with all the vents, dressing rooms, and the overhead mechanisms to control curtains. It was a very happening place during its time. There was a dining place called the Kit Kat next door to the theater in a hotel on the other side. When the stage was closed, the place became a movie theater with one screen. It is still set up as a theater would have been in the area of segregation. It became a two screen movie theater recently and the balcony has been closed off. There have been some pretty weird things going on upstairs. I was talking to the manager one night about something that happened as I was leaving pretty late. It sounded like something upstairs in the old lobby fell, something big. I went up with a friend to check it out, but nothing could have fallen. After I'd gotten about half of my story out, the manager finished the story for me. He said that he experienced the same thing. We've both heard voices upstairs and footsteps on carpeted floors. No one ever really experienced anything, or they don't talk about it. Up until a few months ago, no one ever saw anybody. Well, that all stopped pretty recently. I've seen two men. I'm the only one who has seen anything. One of them was a shadow person. He was a very dark presence, so dark in fact, that he almost appeared to be a cloud floating around the room. In fact, that's what he had been doing when I saw him. By the way, you could still make out the outline of this figure. He was also wearing a top hat. 
The presence that I saw was upstairs in the balcony. The feeling I got off of him ranks up there with the feeling I got the one time I encountered the shadow person. This guy, however, looked like he was some sort of construction worker. The manager, which is my uncle, has been doing a little bit of research and has come up with very little information. I've written a narrative about the man upstairs. My fiance drew a picture of him without my knowledge, just from the description I had given him. I saw the picture one day in the backseat of his car, and it sent chills through my body. The city is wanting to tear down this building and put an even larger theater in its place. We do not know how long the owner of the building is going to hold out on selling it. Hi, I'm not sure if this is a ghost story or just me being nervous because of old fables, but I'll share it with you anyway, and I'm anxious to hear what you think. First of all, I'm from South Louisiana, where ghosts, voodoo, and haunted antebellum homes are a way of life, or at least, a big part of the history down there. About three miles from my parents' home, where I grew up, there's an old plantation house, which I believe was built in the 1800s. I know that I'm going to skip around because I feel like I have to explain everything, but please bear with me. While I was growing up, I always felt scared to be outside or even alone in my parents' house, but I don't think the house itself was haunted, but maybe the area because it was so close to this old house. I actually never even noticed the house until like only six or seven years ago when someone finally bought it and decided to refurbish it. The house was once known as the Stephanie Plantation, then as the Halfin House, and I believe that there was also one more name for it, but I can't think of it right now. The new owner put a lot of effort into doing research into the history of the house and how it looked, you know, pretty much to find out anything and everything about it. First of all, he was a friend of my father, so he got to see the house through many stages of its rebirth. The new owner took before and after photos of the house. The before photos really scared me. There were I believe five faces or bodies of ghosts in the pictures, but they were very clear. One looked like a man, maybe with a beard and very proper demeanor. Another was a lady in the ball gown. That was what the silhouette looked like and possibly a crown. Another looked like a small child looking out of the window and another just a blur, but one looked like a man screaming, and it seemed to have chains on his wrists. I don't know what exactly to say about these pictures, but I know what I saw, and I know how the house felt, and I believe them. I've always felt a type of sixth sense if you want to call it that. My dreams often come true. ESP is a frequent thing for me, and I always get these feelings. I'm not trying to say I'm psychic because I'm not sure exactly what this is, but I have come to try to use them more and more. Anyway, the house was very cold, even though it was the dead of summer, probably 100 degrees and humid. You know, the typical south. Anyway, it had this very eerie and unwelcoming and not very peaceful feeling to it. And as weird as it may seem, I kept getting like these glimpses or flashbacks they were very dark, but they were of this house. The new owner had tons of stories of hauntings by him and previous visitors, or just stories that were documented. I talked to this friend of my mother-in-law, who is really into this stuff, and she seems to think that for some reason, I have a connection with this house, that it isn't just me being a channel. I don't know what to think. I don't really want to know. Every time I visited this house, I would get the creeps, and always in the same places. There was a small closet looking space at the top, third floor, which was recorded to have been used as an infirmary in the war. I was standing near it, thinking, I was getting a funny feeling about it, and didn't notice my brother behind me. As a joke, he picked me up and pushed me inside of it, and I'll never forget the black flash, if that makes sense, that came to me. I'm not sure if I actually saw it or just remembered it, 
but it was one of the single most frightening events to date. It was like I could hear, just for that brief second, screaming and cries, and see so many people in that small space. I don't know, I guess I can't really explain it. Anyway, the room that was supposed to be the infirmary still has bloodstains on the floor, even though the original boards have been removed and replaced. I truly think something more happened up there. So then all of a sudden, this guy and his wife up and sold the house to my father's cousin, Curtis. He got a grant from the state to do further research on the house, and he actually tracked down many original pieces from the house. In the meantime of all of this, I get engaged, and one day, I woke up, and something told me that I should have my wedding pictures taken in the old Halfin house. So I called him up and asked if that would be okay. He was reluctant because he really didn't want any more pictures taken and of the house, but finally agreed. So I went back because I was so totally drawn to this house. Since Curtis has been restoring this house, there is a much more peaceful air in it, really. And anyway, as I was walking around, I prepared myself to be more open to anything. I walked in the ballroom and got this very clear vision of this lady with a beautiful gown and crown on, maybe the lady in the picture. And even though I already had my wedding dress picked out, I immediately went home and asked my mother to make the dress exactly as I told her, and she did, though she found it was very hard to understand me sometimes. Anyway, the dress turned out beautiful and exactly as I had envisioned it. And of course, I topped it off with a small crown. I went and took the pictures, and when I walked out of the room, dressed that way, I felt the most wonderful, peaceful, and almost happy vibe rush in and out of me. It was like just me looking that way brought peace to the house. The pictures went well, but there are a couple questionable ones which I want to send to you to examine when I received them back from my mother. They were taken on a dead tree, but where we believe someone, or more than one, was hung to death. In the tops of the trees there is a mist. I thought it was the sun, but some say no. I would just like to see what you think. Anyway, to thank Curtis, I sent him a blow up picture of the entire exterior of the house, with me standing on the balcony of the master room. He later came to tell my father that he can't explain it, but since that day, there has been a great peaceful feeling in the house. I'm anxious to hear what you think, and then again about the pictures. I hope I have not wasted too much of your time. Thank you. I've had several ghost experiences, but the one I'm writing happened when I was about 16. We lived in a very rural area, in a big tri-level house. The bedrooms and a bathroom were on the top floor, a small bedroom, a bathroom, the kitchen, and a huge living and dining room were on the second, and the bottom floor was a two-door garage. The master bedroom on the top floor had once its own deck, and still had the sliding door, which now leads to a 16-foot drop to the backyard. It is important to know this because we often would hear someone knocking on that door, even when we had the blinds open and could see there wasn't anyone there. The stairs from the second floor to the third went straight halfway to a landing, then turned right and went up the rest of the way. On the landing on your left, if you were going upstairs, was a picture window. I was standing at the top of the stairs one afternoon, calling my two younger brothers, the youngest, Lee came to the bottom of the stairs and asked what I wanted. He and Chris were getting a snack. I was going to answer him when I felt a hard shove against my shoulders. I fell down the stairs to the landing. My brother raced up the stairs to the landing, calling our other brother. I stood up with Lee's help. Since I was okay, I shrugged it off as an accident and forgot. Weeks later, my brother was in the house by himself. He was coming downstairs. I can see him through the window, and he tumbled down the stairs to the landing. He swore someone pushed him. 
but he and I were the only ones home, and he had been the only one inside. The next day, stupid kids that we were, we decided to test it. Lee stood at the bottom of the stairs, Chris stood outside, and watched through the window, and I, really stupid, okay, stood at the top. I felt something push me, and I started to fall again. I caught myself on the rail and was standing. Something I couldn't see was trying to pull my hands off the rail. I got up and ran down the stairs in record time. Chris said he couldn't see anything, but Lee swore he saw a shadow chase me from the landing down to the second floor. After that, none of us would go down the stairs alone, and we always ran. For some reason, they wouldn't tell our parents decided to move, only six months after we started living in the house. This is a true story that took place at Yokosuma, Japan. There is an American naval base there. When I first arrived in the spring of 81, there was a white building on the corner of the property that the naval hospital is located. Shortly after my arrival, Bulldozers demolished the building to make way for two high-rise apartment buildings that would house American servicemen and their families. My family and I would be housed in one of these buildings after its construction. The buildings were named Cuban and Jubin Towers, the Japanese words for 9 and 10. There were already eight of these towers on base. Immediately after construction was completed, my wife was notified that she was to move into an apartment in Cuban Towers. I was out at sea. She complied, and it wasn't long before she started noticing strange occurrences in the apartment. Minor things, like the lights being on, and she was sure she had turned them off. Months later, I returned home and was pleased that we had moved into such better housing on base, but... I was met with strange stories from my three-year-old son. He told me of a marine sentry who visited him each night in his room. I assured him that he was dreaming. My first night home, I tucked him into bed and turned off all the lights in the house. At 3 a.m., I was awakened by a presence at my side of the bed. It was my son, and all the lights were on in the apartment. I asked him what was going on and he said that the marine sentry was in his room and wanted the lights on. I, of course, checked out his story to make sure the house was safe. No one else was in the house beside my family and I. I tucked my son back into bed and turned off the lights. The next morning, I asked my son to describe the man who kept visiting him in his room. That three-year-old boy floored me when he described the infantry marine in full combat gear. This problem occurred for several weeks. One time, a buddy of mine suggested that I turn the lights out of the breaker box, which was out of my son's reach, and my son did not know where the box was. So I did. At 3 a.m., I awoke to the same scenario as always. So then my buddy agreed to spend the night in my son's room with him. At 3 a.m., I woke to an awful ruckus in my son's room. My son ran into my room to tell me that the mister was fighting with the marine sentry. When I arrived in my son's room, my buddy was sitting on the floor in the corner of the room. The bedroom looked as if a brawl had just occurred. My buddy told me that he woke up and seen a marine standing over him. He was wearing face paint to camouflage his appearance and was in full combat gear. The marine face looked as if he were in the jungle, and he had stumbled onto an enemy camp. It was clear that the marine was on a mission, but no marine was there. From that night on, no one in the house seen the marine again, but either he or one of his friends was still in the apartment, as we still experienced strange occurrences. We could be sitting at the dining room table eating, and all of a sudden, the TV would come on, and go to full audio, or the washing machine lid would open and close, and the washing machine would start up by itself. We put up with it, as it seemed more amusing 
then annoying. We were never awakened in the middle of the night again, though. Finally, during our last week in the apartment, it was obvious that the ghost wanted us to stay. Things began to disappear. In 1977, I was eight years old and lived with my parents and my younger brother in a big house in the northwest suburbs of Chicago. There, I had an experience that I remember like it was yesterday. One night, I was awoke feeling cold. I sat up in my bed to reach for an extra blanket that was folded at the foot of my bed. When I did so, I saw a ghost standing several feet from the foot of my bed. The figure I saw looked like that blue dot you see in your vision after looking to a flash from a camera, but it had the distinct shape of a person. After looking at this form for some time, I jumped from my bed and ran down the hall into the bathroom, turning on the lights and shutting the door. Eventually, I got the courage to look down the hall and turned on all the lights. The blue man had disappeared and I eventually went back to sleep with all the lights on. I told my mom, and only my mom, as I did not think anyone would believe me. The strangest thing about this is that a week or so later, my mom was talking to the neighbor who told my mom her son had told her almost the exact same story, describing the ghost in the same way. I never discussed my sighting with the neighbor kid or anyone other than my own mother for years. My mother still lives in the same house, and has had several strange experiences since then, but no more sightings of the blue man. Just wanted to share this experience my mother had while she was in Mercy General Hospital in Sacramento, California, recovering from a hysterectomy. One night mom woke up, and out of the corner of her eye, she saw a dark mass floating in the hallway. It floated between her door and the doorway across the hall where a very sick woman was a patient. It never entered the rooms. It just hovered there. When she tried to look straight at it, it disappeared. For three nights, she saw this black mass floating in the hallway. Then, on the fourth day, Mom heard Code Blue, Code Blue on the intercom and heard a loud commotion in the hallway as doctors and nurses hurried into the room across the hall, pulling their equipment behind them. The woman in that room died. Mom didn't see the dark mass that night, or any night after that, during the remainder of her stay. My name is Minsu, and I would like to share my supernatural experiences with you because no one is willing to believe or accept my encounters. It all started about three days ago, at about two in the morning. I woke up to hear some very loud and disturbing footsteps. This probably wouldn't have scared me so much, except that the footsteps came from the first roof of my house. I didn't know what to do, so I just lied there scared. But 10 seconds later, Whatever made the footsteps on the roof was breathing loudly at my window. At this point, I jumped out of my bed and ran into my mother's room. I looked out her window and saw absolutely nothing. The next day I told my mother what I had heard, and of course, she just snickered and thought nothing of it. Next night, I was determined to stay up and see what was going on. At 3.30 in the morning this time, I was startled by a loud thump in front of my window and quickly shot out of bed to see what it was. Again, I see nothing. At this point, I was scared and puzzled as to what this was. I climbed back into bed and continued to listen. The thumping went on, but as it did, I began to hear something different something in the background of all the noise. It was laughter, not normal funny laughter. It was hysterical, mad in a way. The thumping continued, 
and the laughter faded, and I began to slowly doze off. When I awoke this time, I immediately told my sister what I heard. Unfortunately, she was the only one who believed me. Although this thumping and laughter was very frightening, it may have had some connections to the encounter I experienced just a few weeks ago. I was in my sister's room, looking for a book I had lost. Under the bed, I was sure. When all of a sudden, I saw a woman dressed in blue standing over me. I let out a scream and ran downstairs to tell my mom. We went back upstairs to check things out. Nothing was there, but this time, my mom was considerably worried. She thought it maybe I've been a burglar and frantically checked under the bed and in the closet, but found nothing. These two experiences may be connected, but for now, they will remain a mystery. I was raised in Missouri City, Texas, which is a suburb of Houston. If you head south of Murphy Road, past Cartwright Road, on the left, you will come to El Dorado Drive. Travel down El Dorado until you cross the bridge and turn right at the first street. Drive down the street until you come to Hampton. There, you will see a very large fence covered in overgrowth. Through the fence, you can see a large home that backs itself to the golf course. This home is known by all who live in its vicinity as the Hampton House or the Cartwright House. The story begins about 40 years ago. Mr. Cartwright and his wife lived in the house and owned all of the property which Quail Valley is built upon today. Cartwright Road was actually named after him. All was well, until Mrs. Cartwright came down with a terminal illness of some sort. When Mr. Cartwright was no longer able to give his wife the care she demanded, he hired a live-in nurse. As his wife's condition worsened, Mr. Cartwright began fraternizing with the nurse. One day, when Mrs. Cartwright's calls went unanswered, she made her way into her wheelchair and into the living room catching her husband and the nurse in a moment of passion. Miss Cartwright died the next day. Mr. Cartwright and the nurse soon after moved away together and were married. He left all the furniture and some of his possessions in the house when he left. After his death, the property was left to his son, which would not live at the house, but hired security guards to keep looters out. My father was a Fort Bend County Sheriff Deputy for many years and has had friends work security at the house in the evening. He said that the guards were paid very well and were given a large cooler of food to take with them into the house. There has never been a security guard that has stayed in the house for more than three hours. They've reported the elevator going up and down on its own, sounds of a woman crying, an invisible wheelchair that travels up and down the hallway, leaving tracks in the carpet, and even books flying off the shelves at them. One of my father's good friends is from Ireland, and he says he had encounters with ghosts before, and is unafraid. He worked in the house and left after two hours. He said he has never seen anything like it. Well, the security guards have since stopped in the past ten years. The house has never been lived in since the Cartwrights. I've always wanted to sneak into it some Halloween night and see for myself, but since it would be breaking and entering, and hence illegal, I will not. I have never seen anything about the house listed anywhere, yet everyone in the area seems to know about it. I have several stories that I could tell, and I'll probably post another as time goes on, but this is the most recent. In March 1998, my stepdaughter was pregnant with her first child, and at the same time, her father-in-law was in the last stages of cancer and dying. Her husband spent about three weeks at a central Georgia hospital by his father's bedside. 
He died on March 23rd and was buried on March 25th. She had the baby on March 26th. It was a boy and it was named after his deceased grandfather. They kept a picture of the man that had died in the refrigerator and had told their son that this was Granddaddy Kenneth. When the child was about two and a half and talking, there were several times when they heard him talking to someone when no one was in the room with them. Each time, they would ask him who he was talking to and he would respond with, Granddaddy Kenneth. When they asked him who that was, he would say, that man on the refrigerator. When they asked him what they had talked about, his answers were always about things that the child would have no way of knowing had someone not told him of them and his parents never had. It has been a couple of months now since he's had conversations with his grandfather that they know of. I was stationed at O'Fort Air Base between 1999 and early 2003. During my time, I'd heard many stories and had been witness to something I can't explain. Most of the incidents I heard concerning the old Fort Crook section of the base, including the base lodging office where I worked at in Quarters 13, which was on General's Row and was used as distinguished visitors' quarters, I encountered something I can't explain at the lodging office one night. Me and the sergeant I was working with that night heard someone typing and moving around in the back offices, which were locked about six hours earlier. We both went in there, and there was no one there. Both doors were still locked. Neither of us could explain it, and both of us had heard it. Another night, we heard the same thing and heard a radio turn on. We both ran back there, and once again, nothing. We even looked at the clock that had turned on by itself, thinking maybe the alarm was time to go off at that time. But the alarm was turned off, and it was not even set up when we pressed the button. And it still flashed at 12 a.m., and it was about 2.30 in the morning, which didn't make sense. Quarters 13, which was our responsibility, since it was the DV suite, was even more troublesome. The people who stayed there were usually colonels and above, transiting through the base, very high-ranking people, people you normally wouldn't expect to hear anything about weird noises. One stands out quite a bit in my mind. A colonel kept calling the front desk, complaining of people walking around in the attic and making a lot of noise. I went over there to check it out, which is about a five-minute walk from the lodging office. The colonel was waiting on the porch, and we both went up to the attic to check it out. The door was locked, and after unlocking it, we both went inside. No one was in there, just some boxes. I got a weird feeling while we were up there that someone was watching me, but there was no one in there. I explained to the colonel that maybe it was a rat or something in a box or something that made those noises. He shrugged and went back to bed, and I'm sure he was as unconvinced as I was. I went back to the lodging office, and talking to my co-worker, she told me about the building and the stories about it. Apparently, whatever was in there had manifested itself to the housekeeping staff, as several of them refused to go in the attic. They would never say why, but they refused to go up there. And one of the rooms is also supposedly haunted. I heard this in the early part of 2000. In late 2002, a one-star colonel died of a heart attack in that same room. I don't know whether to believe what I heard or not, but I heard from several people that were in the room that he had died with his eyes open and a horrified look on his face. I've remained skeptical of hearing this, I figure even if this was true, it may have just been from the shock and realization he was dying. But then again, who knows? Other buildings on the base that I've heard that were haunted were the base gym and the old Martin Bomber building on the base 
where B-29s were built during the Second World Conflict. I worked at the gym for about two years while at OFET, and I saw something odd one day with my supervisor when we were doing our final checks of the building. The gym is an old aircraft hangar, and it's nearly a quarter of a mile long. We rode around in a golf cart for our checks. This is a one-fourth mile track inside the gym, and all the state flags hang from the ceiling around the track. While we were doing our checks, the flags began moving in front of us, like someone had been running by and jumped and hit it, except the flags hang nearly 40 feet up in the air, and there was no wind inside. Neither one of us could explain this, but I do know that someone had died of a heart attack while jogging a couple of years earlier. Could it have been him out for a run? I'm curious if you have heard any other stories about a Foot Air Base. I'm working on some research on the base, and I'm wondering if anyone else has experienced something here. I felt compelled to send in a few of my strange experiences that I had in my grandparents' former house. One evening, I was talking on the phone to a friend in the master bedroom. It was nearly two in the morning, and the room was pitch black, as I was going to get some sleep directly. As I chatted to my friend, suddenly, I saw what is best described as a black cloud about the shape, size, and position of where a person's head should be. It bobbed as if someone were walking by the foot of the bed for about three seconds, and then it was gone. I was doing some homework at the kitchen table one evening, when out of the corner of my eye, I again saw a black flash that looked to be the size of a small dog run across the hallway floor. When I commented on this, my grandfather, who was living in the room at the time, claimed to experience the same thing all the time. My grandparents' house is set up so that you walk in the front door and all the rooms are connected by a hallway that at one end leads to the kitchen and the dining room, living room, master bedroom, staircase to the second floor, bathroom, and back to the door. It was summertime and my mother and I were arguing. I was standing at the foot of the stairs and looking at her in the living room. I was making a fuss, saying that I wanted to sleep upstairs, which I had only recently conquered my fear of, and she was telling me that it was too hot up there to do so. Mid-sentence, I glanced up the staircase, and what I saw horrified me. Staring back down at me from the top of the steps was this hazy, cloud-like figure of a human, I believe it was a male. It was only the second time I was ever truly afraid. I was cleaning my room on the second floor one day, and it was very hot, being that it was summer and heat rises, so I opened one of the old weighted windows. It was not an easy task due to old paint, which had practically glued itself shut, and it only budged after I pried it with a screwdriver. I tried to pull it down to see if I needed to prop it, and it wouldn't move, so I carried on with my cleaning. I nearly jumped out of my skin when I heard the window shut with a loud bang behind me. Again, I opened the window, only this time I propped it open with a paint stir. After about two minutes, the window again banged shut behind me, this time so hard that the glass broke. The paintster was at least eight feet across the room. I said, you win, and ran downstairs. I was a staff assistant in my sophomore year at St. Michael's. What this meant was basically, I watched the doors coming into one of the dorms to make sure that the only people coming in were the residents. I sat at a desk from 11 p.m. to 4 a.m a couple of nights a week. One night, I was making the rounds from floor to floor to make sure all was relatively quiet. I got to the top floor of the building, and that is, of course, when the proverbial strange things started to happen. I began walking down the hall, 
and I heard the wind howling through the recycling room on the floor. It had been a quiet night weather-wise, so this was a little odd. I passed it off as some random New England weather patterns and continued to walk on. When I stepped in front of the first residence door, it started to rattle like someone was going to come out. I stopped and waited, but the door just kept rattling, so I moved on. Then, the next door on the other side of the hall started to rattle as I passed in front of it, and then another door started to rattle also. Now there were three doors all rattling away, and it only started when I walked in front of them. I hadn't done this earlier in the evening, and I was wide awake, so it wasn't my imagination. What really startled me was all of a sudden, in the midst of all this door action, I had a feeling that someone was right behind me. I turned around me, and from the distance, I could have sworn I saw the fading image of a priest in all black slowly fade, but the doors kept on shaking and the wind was screaming. So I ran the rest of the way down the hall and back downstairs to my desk. A check of the outside revealed that the weather was perfectly calm. I believe this is the oldest dorm on campus, so who knows what otherworldly beings reside there. The other thing that happened to me while I was there was sort of a strange religious experience, and I'm probably one of the last people something like this would happen to. I was driving home from my then boyfriend's, now husband's house, and heading back to my dorm at St. Mike's. I was at a stoplight, alone in the car, when I heard this deep, low, and gravelly male voice tell me that the second coming was going to happen soon. The voice filled me with dread and danger. It sounded like a lot like a voice that had been altered to sound lower, like when documentaries try to disguise voices of the people they interview. The light turned green, and I drove off. I then looked into the mirror without thinking, and I could have sworn I saw the same priest from the hall sitting in the back seat of the car. I stopped the car immediately, looked back, and nobody was there. I felt like I was going crazy because I knew I saw someone in the back seat of my car. About two minutes later, I started to think about what just happened and got very scared. I talked to one of the priests at school the next day, and he felt this was a normal experience within the realm of St. Michael's, partially because it was getting near Christmas time, and partially because he felt the campus was a center for both good and evil, the good being the chapel on campus, and the bad being the portal that was never shot in the boys' dormitory. He confirmed the story about the pentagram in my location discretion without me bringing it up. I've heard this godly voice once or twice since the original incident, but not to the degree that I heard that night. I once heard of an experience my boyfriend had in that same chapel. He told me that on one occasion he was alone. He walked into the chapel and under the huge statue, he saw two figures in cloaks praying silently under the statue. He's a complete skeptic when it comes to hauntings, and he insisted that there was nobody there at the time. When I was seven years old, my parents, my sister and I, lived in a home that was one-story house that sat way back from the street. My aunt used to babysit us when my parents were away at work. Anytime I got into trouble, my aunt would make me go into a little bedroom in the back of our house, and she would make me stay in there for hours at a time. I never knew why, but I was definitely afraid of that room, and the whole time I was in there, I would hide under the blankets too afraid to move until she came to let me out. One day, while I was playing in the yard, I found out why I was so afraid of that room. While I was outside playing with my toys, I suddenly got the feeling that I was being watched. I looked around me, 
but I didn't see anybody. I went back to playing, but I just couldn't shake that watched feeling. I turned to look at the house to see if maybe my aunt or sister was around, and I saw a woman in the bathroom window watching me. I know it wasn't my aunt or sister, because they both have very dark hair, and the woman in the window had very light colored hair. I don't know what to do. I was afraid to move. I stayed outside for the rest of the afternoon because I didn't want to go into the house. When my mom came home that day, I finally went inside. I didn't say anything to my mom or anyone about what I had seen. I was worried that they wouldn't believe me, so I kept quiet. My sister and I shared a bedroom, and that night, I woke up to the sounds of cupboards opening and closing, like someone was looking for something, and I heard glasses being moved around and the water being turned off and on. Well, being a little kid, I figured I was just imagining it, and as I lay there listening to this, I looked over at my sister, who was sleeping through this whole thing. The next morning, I asked my mom if she was up last night getting a drink, and she said no, but she looked at me kind of funny. That night, my mom had some friends over, and she sent my sister and I to bed early. My sister fell right to sleep, but I just kept thinking about what I saw in the window and what I had heard the night before. My mom and her friends started talking about a lady who had hung herself in the back bedroom of our house. I could not believe what I was hearing. My mom then went on to tell her friends that she hears noises in the kitchen at night. The next day, as I was playing in the yard, I saw the woman in the bathroom window again. I started to cry and my aunt got mad at me so she tried to lock me in the back room again. I was kicking and screaming that I did not want to go back in there, but she wouldn't listen to me. As I sat on the bed, under the covers, I heard the door swing open. I thought it was my aunt to come let me out, so I uncovered my head, but nobody was there. I then started to hear a squeaking noise, kind of like something heavy hanging from a window bar. It sounded like it was coming from the closet. The closet was a really big walk-in one. There was no way I was going to look in there. I just sat on the bed, listening to this noise, until my aunt came to get me. I later found out that the lady hung herself in the closet of that back room. I'm just wondering if anyone knows why she did this, and when it took place. Well... That's my story, and believe me, it is all completely true. I'm an identical twin, and often because of this, most people ask us if we share experiences. You know, they say, like on television. My answer is always the same, sometimes. It's true that twins, on occasion, may share certain emotions, even though they may be miles apart. This is what my brother and I have known for years. But everything changed when my brother and his wife and two children moved into my late grandfather's home in Norristown, Pennsylvania. The history of the house is nothing spectacular. The only event of any importance occurred when my grandfather, who had been diagnosed with colon cancer in 1987, decided to spend his final days at home before the cancer took him. He died in a hospital bed, which had been set up in the living room of his house later that year, and from that point forward, various members have lived in the house without any strange occurrences or bump in the night, until my brother Peter and his family moved in. The first week in their new home, my brother was excited as ever about living in such a large home compared to the meager apartment he and his family had been sharing for the past two years. Given the history of the house, i.e. 
my grandfather dying there it didn't bother him one bit, since he was the last person who believed in such tales. Then, about two months after moving in, he decided to clean out the basement to make room for his music equipment. He is a part-time musician, and a new washer and dryer my father had bought them as a Christmas present. While digging through the accumulated junk of a half a century, he happened upon a small Bible. Inside the front cover was an inscription denoting the Bible as a gift to my grandfather from my great-grandmother in 1906. He took it upstairs and laid it on one of the coffee tables so that other family members visiting could see it when they visited. Remember that I had yet to hear of this find, since it only had occurred that day, but that night I had one of the most terrifying nightmares I could ever remember. I dreamt I was standing on the landing, overlooking the living room of my brother's house in Norristown, Pennsylvania, but something was wrong. Having visited the house many times in the past, I vividly remember the layout of how it used to look when I was a child, but in my dream, I remember seeing an end table, which was never there before, on which a book was placed. I was drawn to it for some reason. I slowly descended the stairs, even now, recalling how hollow my footsteps sounded on the hardwood floor as I made my way towards the table. As I got there, I looked down and saw that it was, surprise, a small Bible. Upon opening it, I saw there was an inscription made out to my brother from our father. This is where things got really spooky. I remember hearing my brother's voice behind me say, this is mine, which dad gave me. Please give it back. I was too terrified to look around, because even though it sounded like my brother, there was something otherworldly about the whole thing. I finally succumbed to curiosity and turned around. This was, of course, when I woke up screaming something. I don't remember what. I startled my wife who was then yelling at me to keep it down. The neighbors will think we're fighting or something. Later that morning, I spoke to Peter to tell him the strange dream I had, and that's when he told me about what he had found and who it really belonged to. I was startled beyond words. I told him I would be down in an hour. I live in Park City, Pennsylvania approximately an hour north of Norristown, to see the book. Too late, he said. Why? I asked. It's gone, he replied. The conversation went on from there, about how he had placed it on the end table, an end table that he just picked up at a yard sale that day. But when he woke up, it was gone. I asked if his wife had taken it, but he said that it was impossible. They had flown back to Texas two days earlier to visit her folks and took the kids with her for the short vacation. After going around and around about what could have happened to it, as well as the strange dream I had and what the voice had said to me, in the end, we just didn't know what to say. I guess it was one of those things that will never really be explained. Two weeks later, his wife and two children arrived back home and were in the process of unpacking when she went down to the basement to see how the cleanup had gone. That's when she asked him about the small Bible. What Bible? He asked his wife. Oh, the one in the basement near the keyboard you put there. Looking confused, I'm sure, my brother ran down to the basement and sure enough, there it was on the door right where he had originally found it. Picking it up, he read the inside cover again, only this time there was no inscription at all. Did he imagine the writing to begin with? Did my weird dream that night have anything to do with it disappearing again? I don't know, neither does Peter.
but there's definitely activity in that basement. Because what I saw next, in the basement, a few days later, almost explained some things. Although it was incredibly scary, I had another bizarre dream. I ended up going back to the basement to retrieve the Bible, only this time, there was a red humanoid looking creature sitting on a chair reading a book. He had horns protruding from his head, and he looked like an ape crossed with Bigfoot, his face very human looking at the same time. Frozen in shock, I approached him. He pointed to the book, and there was an image of a car on fire. I woke up in a cold sweat and screamed. A few days later, I got a call from a guy who sounded like my grandfather. I kid you not, it sounded identical to him. All this man said to me on the phone was, Check on your father. Something's wrong with him. I later found out that my dad had been in a car wreck. The car caught on fire. He managed to escape alive. The most shocking thing, my twin brother had the exact same dream on the same night. Same exact creature. I guess they say twins are inseparable. When I was younger, I had a terrifying experience with a ghost. I was fast asleep, and then I suddenly woke up. Something told me to wake up, and I just did. I looked at the clock, and it said somewhere around 3.28 a.m. I turned my head slightly to the left, and I saw this girl. I would say that she was in her early teens. She looked very blurry, but she had a blue hue, and it clear at the same time. She was moving in slow motion. It seemed like she was underwater, or something. She had a long nightgown, and it was blowing very slowly. She was holding a short candlestick, and her hair was long reddish brown color. She looked at me, and then I looked back at her. I was surprisingly calm. I got up to tell my mom what I had seen. The next morning, I woke up and I asked my mom if she saw the lady. And she said, what lady? Could this have all been a dream? I'm not entirely sure. I've been deeply confused about this ever since. My house has always had extra company. It's been 13 years since we moved in here, and for a while, there were some really odd things happening. I was 10 years old when we moved in, and fell in love with the huge, empty attic upstairs. I would bring my toys and little sister up there to play with. She was around 8 at the time, so we had a lot of fun together. We brought our dollhouse up there, and would spend hours making up stories and having fun. I would go up there and read by myself a lot because I was quieter than the rest of the house. Nothing out of the ordinary ever happened while my sister and I played up there, and I felt very comfortable. In the far end of the room were little racks where clothing must have hung before. One day, I was up there alone playing, when I discovered this old-fashioned looking gold purse with a painting of a deer and a medal on it, and being a lover of old things, I was psyched. I brought it to my mother, and she said it looked like a pocketbook from the 1920s that her grandmother used to have, sort of a flapper type style. We hung the pocketbook in the back of the closet to keep it out of harm's way. About a year later, my father and a friend of his transformed my attic playroom into a bedroom for both me and my sister. My father had left a quarter of the room where the pocketbook had been found alone and put up a wall and a door separating the rest of the bedroom from that area. My sister did not like her bed being up against the wall of the back room. 
Then, what I felt next was unexpected and unbelievable. I was laying there with my eyes open, frozen with fear. I felt as if someone was watching me, but I was afraid to move. I'd never felt like this before. It was never afraid of the dark as a child. My sister said, can I please come over and sleep with you? Now, I usually said no to this and stopped being a baby, but I wanted her to come over, pretending to be reluctant. I said, all right, but don't hug me, even though I really wanted to be. She ran over and squeezed me, and I squeezed back, and she said, I'm scared, and I said, me too. And then boom, boom, boom. Four loud knocks right on the wall, which our heads were practically up against. I could actually feel the vibrations from the wall. Then my sister crying said, what was that? I made it up. I said, me. I said, don't worry. I was trying to tell myself that it was me when it happened again. Boom, boom, boom. We both jumped up and ran downstairs at this point into my parents' bedroom and my father went up to see if there was anyone hiding up there. No one was. However, my sister refused to go back up there and slept with my parents. I, however, went back up there scared but mad that my favorite place was trying to kick me out. I felt almost betrayed and hurt, so I stayed up there for the whole night, refusing to leave, but hoping it would not try to scare me. It didn't. My sister would make attempts to sleep up there later, but would always run downstairs at some point. I couldn't blame her, since most of the time, I really wanted to join her, but never would. Over the next several years, I often heard whispering and the doorknob being wiggled as if someone was trying to get in. At first, then it became a game. The doorknob would wiggle really fast and I would say, I'm trying to sleep and it would stop and then I got used to the weird noises. It's 13 years later and in that time, I've had many friends tell me that they heard whispering or tapping on the wall or someone breathing in their ear. To which I say, I told you there was a ghost in my house, but it sparked my interest in the paranormal in which I'm an avid believer because of my ghost buddy. I don't know if the purse actually belonged to the ghost, but the house was built in 1940 after the flapper times. But my mother did tell me that the old man who used to occupy the house had two wives who both passed on. Whether or not or either of them died in this house, I don't know. The purse may have belonged to one of them. Hello, my name is Kirk. I'm about to turn 18 and I live in New York State. I apologize in advance for the length of my story but I never get to talk to anyone about these things that happen. I'm looking for answers as to whether or not the house I live in is haunted. I don't talk to my friends about them because I always get the weirdest reactions when I mention them. You know, the kind of look someone makes when they think you're insane. Since I was a little kid, I'd always found the paranormal music. My mom believes in ghosts based on her own experiences, which I might say, are quite frightening. I have two older sisters and both have related their own personal experiences to me. So in a way, I suppose that was influenced into finding the supernatural interesting. I live in a two family house that my family owns. We used to rent the bottom apartment out to people back in the late 80s to early 90s. The tenants have said that the downstairs apartment is haunted and a psychic my mom brought over one time said that the apartment was indeed haunted. In one of the rooms downstairs, my great-grandfather passed away. 
The house has been in our family for a while. Also, my mom's nephew who came over from Ecuador was living with us when I was about seven or eight. Hard to remember. He died while living here in a car accident in Lake George. Is it possible he has unfinished business because his wife and daughter live in another country? Also, my mom's boyfriend of a long time ago. This is back in Ecuador, which was probably in the 60s. Died on a hiking trip. My mom loved him and always insists that he watches over her. That's just some background information because they could all be possible haunts. The experiences I'm remembering are all recent ones. We moved from our old house in the early 90s and moved to Salem, Massachusetts. After three years, we moved back to our house in New York. And after that time, it's the only experiences I remember. My older sister slept in our redone attic when they were teenagers. I was envious because they were on a whole different floor of the house. I used to think the attic was cool. Both my sisters have had stories about the attic. My sisters moved out long ago, which gave me the advantage of choosing a room up in the attic, being older and all. I chose the room which was my oldest sister's because of its size and location in the house. It was the last room and had stairs in the room going down and leading into the second floor apartment. The first night I slept up there, a good friend of 10 years stayed the night with me. He's the only one I talked to about my experiences with. It was about 2 a.m. and we were lying awake, starting to doze off. He had his disc man with him whilst playing a CD with the headphones off of his head so we could both hear the music. I was lying there when all of a sudden, I heard the distinct and startling noise of a marble rolling down the stairs that was in my room. It finally hit the bottom of the stairs, and I asked my friend if it was him that did that. I remember thinking, great, the first dang night I'm in here, and something weird has to happen. I definitely would have seen if my friend had thrown the marble down the stairs, but he didn't. By the way, this actually happened one more time before, not happening since. That story can probably be explained easily, but there are other weird ones. In the same room I was sleeping one night, I'm 95% sure I would have closed my closet all the way before I went to bed because a thing like that would bother the hell out of me and I wouldn't be able to sleep. I woke up suddenly in the middle of the night to a very strange noise. It was a quick and harsh boom mixed with a whoosh sound. I looked around my room to find the source and my eyes focused on my closet door. The door was open. I sort of stood up and chuckled because it was three in the morning. I closed the door and went back to sleep. I later analyzed the sound because I remembered when I woke up. What it sounded like was the closet door being pushed hard from the inside and rubbing on the carpet as it opened, which would account for the whoosh. I was never scared, just sort of curious as to whether or not it was insane. The next experience was definitely an odd one. It was the morning. Morning is like 12 noon to me, especially in the summer. And I'd woken up and was getting ready to take a shower. I made my way downstairs and was heading to my mom's room to get a towel. No one else was in the house at this time. My mom was working and so was her boyfriend. As I was passing through our dining room, I felt something cold hit my right earlobe. Within a couple seconds, my fingers were up to my ear to pinch whatever was on my ear because I thought it was a bug. I took my fingers away and realized that what hit my ear was a drop of some liquid. It didn't feel like water. It almost felt like oil. It had a strange smell to it, almost like a perfume oil smell. Very confused, I rubbed it in my fingers and looked around the ceiling for the source. 
But if you think about it, an earlobe is an awkward place for something like that to land on. If it was coming from above, it would have hit the top of my ear, right? But that's not the end. I shrugged it off, got my towel, and went into the bathroom. I took my shirt off and splopped. I felt a drop hit my chest. Now this was weird because I was totally in a different part of my house. And again, the chest is an odd place if the drop is falling from above. Before touching the spot I looked at it, it definitely splattered with some force because it was spread out a little. I touched it and smelled it and it was the same dang substance. Why is this relevant? One night, I awoke to hear a very disturbing noise coming from the bathroom. Nobody was up at the time and I heard a very distinct gurgling noise. I walked towards the bathroom to see what it was. When the lights turned on by themselves, and the shower curtain was moving. Remember, nobody was up, the lights were off, and they somehow managed to turn themselves on. Curiosity got the better of me, and I decided to inch closer to the shower curtain. I had to know if something was behind it. I moved the curtain, and to my relief, there was nobody there. But then the lights turned off once again. I start to get really freaked out and rush to turn on the light. I look across the hallway and I see what looks like an elderly man in a wheelchair with an oxygen mask on his face. He looked about as real as any living person would. Now, it wasn't like I saw this figure for a long time. I wasn't on meds and I'm a sober person. I wouldn't even say I was tired. The encounter lasted about 10 to 15 seconds. It was fast, but it was long enough that I could see this man. I honestly felt like the liquid that I felt came from this gurgly elderly man. I found that very interesting. And later, I told my mom about it. She thought I was joking and laughed it off. Then grew very concerned after I insisted that this was something I saw. She thought I was having hallucinations and wanted to take me to the doctor, but I urged her that I was of sound mind. Although she did later tell me that something similar happened to her, where she could have sworn she felt the presence of an elderly man, but she never saw anything. Lastly, there was an unexplained experience that happened in my room. One of my cats was sleeping on my bed and I was sitting in this love seat I have, watching TV. My lights were off, so I couldn't see anything clearly other than the TV. Something startled me when I heard something hit my wall, as if being thrown, like a hammer hitting a wall. I then started to notice that my cat uncharacteristically started hissing at the window and moaning. She's usually a very quiet cat, but something really seemed to bother her and she wouldn't keep quiet. She kept meowing for what seemed like five minutes. I didn't see anything in the window and the cat for the next week persisted to meow in terror before she just gave up. She never did that ever again and it was quite bizarre. It really started to scare me. On a separate day, I've heard cabinets opening and shutting. These things terrify me because I still have no explanation for them. Is my house haunted by a timid spirit who wants to know that it's there? Any comments or advice would be appreciated. Hope you found my story interesting. During the summer of 1976, my mom, older brother and I decided to accompany my aunt and her family to West Virginia and North Carolina to work in the tobacco fields. I was about 11 years old at the time. After a two day trip from Texas to West Virginia, we were assigned a house to stay in while we were settled into work. There were several of us, 10 in all, and we were tired from the trip 
So everyone just basically picked a spot in a place and readied ourselves for bed for that first night. It was not a restful night. At about 3 a.m., we're awakened by the sounds of a woman crying and wailing in the room with us. Looking around the room, we could see that everyone was accounted for and no one was crying. The sounds increased in intensity and lasted for about 10 minutes. When I say wailing, I mean just that. A horrible, low sound. Very similar to some of the sound effects heard in the old Scooby-Doo cartoon. I realize that sounds somewhat funny, but I swear it's true. I'm not sure if my eyes were just playing tricks on me, but in the darkness of the room, it really looked like there was a figure kneeling down. You could see it well enough in the dark to know that it was a gray outline of some figure. Interestingly enough, after the 10 minutes of sobbing, I noticed that this gray cloud ended up disappearing as well. Thankfully, we weren't to stay in that house for very long. Another house, with more room for 10 people, was assigned to us. That was not an improvement. The next house was a two-story one, located somewhere between Hendersonville, North Carolina, in a small town known as Soul City. It was situated about 200 yards off a road, with a long driveway and a set of railroad tracks that ran along the other side of the road. There was a large white house off to the north of our house, about another 300 yards away. The house had a large open field in front, and was surrounded by woods on the other three sides, and a shed, and an old open water well in back. Spooky enough setting during the day. At night, things would happen such as lights turning on by themselves, footsteps heard upstairs, when everyone was in plain sight downstairs, the sounds of something heavy being all dragged through the house late at night, after everyone had gone to bed, knocking on the walls, and my brother swears, he's seen what appeared to be a black hooded figure at the foot of his bed. I remember I had my window open once while asleep at night, and I could have sworn I heard the sounds of a horse running across the field outside. Nobody in our area owns any horses at all, and you could hear the sounds of neighs. I ended up looking outside and saw absolutely nothing, but there was definitely a horse that I heard. I swear to anyone reading this, these events really happened. I know people often make claims like that, which make it seem like it's fabricated, but I really want to put an emphasis on the validity of these stories. All I have is my word, but I'm telling you, these events are so real. I'm 36 now, an army veteran, college educated, and I have an interest in ghosts and the supernatural. If anyone has any clues about the house, the one near Soul City, North Carolina, its owners, or perhaps even its history, please email me. When I was in 8th grade, my mother, younger brother and I, moved into a rental home on Grace Drive in Wilson, North Carolina. I'd always been interested in ghosts, but never had any experience. This house would change that fact. As soon as we moved into the home, I had a very uneasy feeling, only in my room. I always felt like someone was watching me from my closet. Also, feeling uneasy, I could not sleep with my door closed and forbid my mother to close her door while we were sleeping. I also started sleeping with my pillow on top of my head in order to feel safe and secure in this room. On several occasions, I felt someone pushing the pillow down hard on my head as I was trying to go to sleep. It was not sleep paralysis, because I had just laid down. At first I thought it was my brother playing with me, to the point where I yelled out his name for him to stop, because the pushing hurt. However, when the pushing stopped, no one was in the room, 
and I was all alone. One evening around dusk, my mother and I were sitting on the front steps that were located between the bedroom and the home in the living room where my brother was alone watching TV. My bedroom was located on the front of the house with only one window. I had a lamp sitting on my bedstand in front of the window and beside the bed. I stood up in order to illustrate a point to my mother now facing the house with my bedroom window in sight. All of a sudden, I saw movement in my window. It was a shadow and act of sitting on my bed. Once it sat down, the shadow seemed to fade into the shadows of my bedroom. I stood there looking at my window and said to my mother that my brother was in my room and that he needs to get out. I immediately went into the house to find my brother still watching TV. I asked him what he was doing in my room, and he just stared at me like I was crazy, saying that he had not left the living room. Of course, I went to my room to find no one there. We lived in that house for about two years, and only when we moved into our new house was I able to sleep with my door closed, with my mother's door closed. However, this new house was where my mother saw her first ghost. This happened about two months after we moved into the house. She said that she was laying in bed one night, unable to sleep because the streetlights in the city were so bright. She said that she looked over to her window and saw an old man standing in her room in front of the window. The old man walked over to the bed and looked down at her and then backed away, only to disappear. She smartly did not tell me the story until I had been away at college for three years. We are assuming that the old man was Mr. Barnes, who we think may have died in the house and was just checking in on the new occupants. That was the first and last incident that occurred in that home. I'm 16 years old and live in a small town in Texas. It's about 28 miles south of San Antonio. When I was in third grade, my family decided to move down here from Corpus. We began living with my grandfather and soon decided to buy property of our own. My mom and dad bought the property located right next to my grandfather's, which just happened to be the entrance to a coal mine that was very active about the 1900s. We built our house right next to the entrance of the coal mine. Our back door opened right on top of the entrance. By the time the house was built, I was about 13 and finally had my own room. One night, I was struggling to sleep and heard footsteps. Of course I was frightened, but somehow I went to sleep. I kept telling myself it was nothing. While I was sleeping, and this part of the story doesn't make sense at all, I had a dream that I was part of a well-known Jewish family in Europe in the Great World Conflict. I saw soldiers take my husband and I to a ditch in the middle of nowhere where they got rid of my husband. In my dream, I understood German. Next, they got rid of me also. As I died in my dream, I woke up in real life. As I awoke, I heard more footsteps marching. They sounded like soldiers, Germans I assumed. They marched through my kitchen and some by my bedroom door, kind of like they were watching me. This is the first thing that happened to me. It didn't make sense because I thought they would be dead miners or something. About two years ago, I became very depressed, as many young people do, and I tried to off myself. My mother came home from work and found me passed out and throwing up in the kitchen sink. They rushed me to the nearest hospital, where they thought I was going to pass away. I saw my mom crying next to me and became relaxed. I was in total peace. I felt completely happy. Suddenly. 
felt two men walking around me talking. I tried to turn my head to see them, but couldn't. I heard them speaking to each other, and one sounded older than the other. They said, look, it's so sad she's so young. And the other one said, look at her mother. At this point, they quit talking and continued to walk around us staring. Then, the feeling of peace was gone and I heard two other voices. I kept saying, who is that? And I was scaring my mom to death. Right after that, I passed out. And when I woke up, I was in a hospital room. I didn't tell anyone exactly what it was I heard. I did tell my boyfriend at the time. I'm not sure he believed me. After that, I would hear voices at my house. People talking to me. There was no one there. I heard them almost everywhere I went, but I didn't tell anyone. After a while, I tried talking back, but never got a response. The voices were never really clear. There were many at one time. It just sounded mumbled. I tried not to tell people about my voices because I was afraid they would not talk to me anymore. I felt I had a gift. They have stopped talking now. I haven't heard them for about a year now. I know it all sounds weird, but it's true. I also live next to a graveyard, which is weird I know. It's where most of the dead miners are buried. I think they try to talk to me sometimes. There is also one last account I had more recently. I was trying to go to sleep one night in the house all by myself. I looked out into the living room and saw a solid black figure running around. He looked as if he were hiding. He ran behind furniture and walls and really just scared the heck out of me. It was the only time I saw him though. It was the last of all my encounters. Hi there. I believe that I had a true experience with a haunting. I used to live in apartment 205 in Kingswood Apartment in Fresno, California. A lot of weird stuff used to happen there while my family and I lived there. I am a homolog. My religion is not Christianity, although I do not doubt that there is a God. I do believe in Jesus Christ, but I was simply not raised that way. My family on both my father and my mother's sides are shaman. Many do not believe our customs and ways to be valid but you'd be surprised by how much sense it makes to us. I grew up around shaman all my life, listening to chants and stuff. It's awesome. Well, enough talk. Here's my story. When I was a little girl growing up in California and being in Homog family, I grew up with spirits and ghosts and hauntings all around me. I accept it, for it is real to me. Although, I've never experienced an actual haunting myself. Being around my family of shaman focused me to acknowledge the supernatural. But when I was nine, I did have an experiment on my own. Our apartment has always been rumored to be haunted. As a child, I never really paid too much attention to it. Weird things happen at night. Things go bump in the night. Dishes rattle and doors slam. I woke up every night from a nightmare I couldn't remember and crawled into bed with my parents. My sisters complain about seeing dark shadows moving across your walls. In our culture, hauntings happen because it is caused by some or something that is associated with the family or someone in the family. In our case, it was my mother. I remember one time, my mother was cleaning the tub and I was standing out in the hallway watching her. All of a sudden, the door slammed and the lights went out. I heard the lock in the door click in place and my mother screamed. I stood frozen in my spot, unable to comprehend what I just saw. I banged against the door and then it opened. The lights were back on and my mom was still in the tub. Naturally, she accused me of doing it. To this day, I still don't know what had happened. There was a time that something happened to me, not long afterwards, that scared me so bad, I forgot about it. 
until a couple of years ago. I remember it being around noon and I was off on summer vacation. I just finished the third grade. I was laying on my mother's bed reading a book given me by a former teacher. I started to have this funny feeling all over my body, more like an awareness that something was watching me or something was near me. All of a sudden, the bed started to shake. I felt something, hands maybe, holding me down on the bed, and I was unable to move or even say anything, not even a scream. The bed literally shook for a few seconds. It was over in a matter of minutes, but it scared me terribly. I jumped off the bed and ran into the living room. To this day, I've never told my family or hardly anyone. Those that I've told thought I was joking. Was I? Yet the memory is so vivid, and I remember that feeling of helplessness and fright. It was weird. I sort of forced myself to forget about it until a couple years later when my class was asked to write about an actual haunting that we know about. I don't know, but things are weird. My shaman grandfathers, both maternal and paternal, came to our house to bless our room. They performed their ritual in our room, on my mother's bed. I remember something about someone dying or committing suicide in our closet, but it was so long ago, I can't remember much about it. My mom has been having dreams about a little girl carrying a knife, chasing her through a rice field in Thailand. My grandfathers did this chant thing, and all this stuff, too much to explain, to capture this thing. They've locked her up in two bowls that have sealed and chained together. Part of the chain that was used to seal it was made into an anklet brace that my mother wears around her ankle at all times. The trap used to capture it was something that my grandfathers did. To this day, my mother is doing better. No more chucky like girls chasing her. The bulls were taken to my mom's father's altar and locked up. When he passed on, it was given to my mother to keep safe. So now, it's in our bathroom closet on the top shelf. Every time we open the door, there it is. Scary. I get the creepiest feelings when I look at it. So, you wonder, what exactly is going on? It what happened. I couldn't tell you, but something did happen, and I've never been able to forget it. Could it be some evil spirit or poltergeist? Who knows? Maybe one day, I'll find out eventually. Being a Catholic, I believe there is an afterlife, heaven, etc., and spirits occasionally visit people here on earth. One winter, my family and I, mom, dad, and two younger sisters, went to visit and help out my grandparents, who had recently cleared some land they owned on the Tennessee River, move into their new home. The land they bought had many legends accompanying it, including stories of gold, and ghosts. My sisters and I were very interested in exploring the 25 acres of wooded land that had an old Civil War home place on it. An old country store was located about a mile away, and this was the only neighbors my grandparents had. When we arrived, there was a 15-foot long, 15-foot high pile of cut-down trees that had been piled up to make room for the new house. This was a great jungle gym for my sisters and I to play and hide on, being as it was a long way from the house. One day, my mom took my youngest sister on a walk around the woods, while my other sister and I stayed on the wood pile looking into the woods. I saw this black, four foot high figure scrambling from tree to tree. At first I thought it was my youngest sister running around, so I called her name. She answered from the opposite direction of the figure that I saw. By that time, I was really frantic, in tears, and running home because I could still see the figure moving extremely fast. It was so fast, I would only see it for about two seconds at a time 
before it went behind another tree. When everyone was in the house, I told them, but my grandpa brushed it off as a bear, even though there aren't any bears in the area. So I felt better. About a week later, after my family and I left, more people were beginning to have experiences, I guess you could say. My grandpa had taken his dog out one night when he had heard a woman's voice faintly yell, help me. The dog began to bark, so my grandpa got in his truck and began to circle his property, looking in the ditches for an injured woman. He found no one and went home. About three months later, a lady was changing a sign outside the country store around closing time. Extremely scared and shook up, she quit her job because she had seen a quick, black, shadowy figure coming from my grandparents' woods. We still don't know what is living in my grandparents' woods, but other people have seen it, so I know it's not a figure of my imagination. Thanks for reading. One night, about 13 years ago, my brother and I were Christmas caroling with friends around our block. We were about 10 or 11 at the time. After ending the night, my brother and I said goodbye to the last of our friends who had turned in for the night. We were riding doubles on a bike that night, my brother pedaling. We approached the edge of the driveway when he suddenly stopped. We both looked across the street I said, do you see what I see? He replied, yeah. Happening very quickly across the street was a dark shadowy figure, void of prominent features, approximately seven feet tall. When it began to approach us, we threw the bikes down and we were able to slide under the electric garage door, still in process of closing. We were able to summon our friend's dad to investigate, but nothing. That night, we rode our fannies home, about eight houses down. Amazingly, we never mentioned it to our parents, who were waiting in the driveway to take us to the town's candy cane lane. We have since told them about everything, and to this day, when I visit home and happen to walk that corner of the block at night, I am constantly looking over my shoulder and feel as though I'm being watched. Akin SC East Pine Lock Road now houses Riley's Whitby Bull Restaurant. This house was in my wife's family from the late 1960s until it was sold to the present owners, operators of the named restaurant. My family and I moved there in 1993 and lived in the house for two years after we moved back here from Atlanta. This house was in my wife's family from the late 1960s until it was sold to the present owners, operators of the named restaurant. My family and I moved there in 1993 and lived in the house for two years after we moved back here from Atlanta. This house was built in the late 1800s, estimated from the style, and was remodeled in 1914 when indoor plumbing was installed and this date appears on the tax records, which would be correct. They use the latest remodeling date for effective date. Archaeologists from SC State Highway Department visited the site in the winter of 1994 when the road in front was being surveyed for widening. I took them under the house and they showed me where the curve marks and the big supporting beams evidenced that the original part of the house was either built before the war between the states or wood from that era which was recycled into the house. In any event, the home is an old, large, rambling affair of an old southern home that, like I said, is now a restaurant. It's unusual in that it is the second empire style with a mansard roof and a large wraparound porch with Doric columns. On to the story. We frequently heard footsteps when no one was there and had strange feelings that we were not alone. I could be in the front room, which I used as an office, and hear someone come down the stairs and stand at the large open pocket doors. When I turned from my computer, no one would be there. 
I got used to it. One day, I was relaxing in the upstairs bathroom in the old six long iron bathtub. It was in the middle of the day. I had some time to relax. My wife was away. The kids were in school. I had no pressing work, so I took a midday soaking bath. I was lying quietly in the hot sudsy water with water up to my neck, stretched out with a washcloth across my face. I heard someone coming down the hall. I slid the washcloth away, opened my eyes, and listened carefully, because I knew I was alone. The footsteps came slowly down the hall, towards the bathroom door, which was at the end of the hall. The footfall stopped at the door, and the old porcelain doorknob moved slightly like someone had it in their grip, then started to turn slowly in its big square lock housing. It was right near me, because the head of the tub was by the door. I watched over my left shoulder, and then spoke, Mary Ann? The turning stopped. I jumped up in a torrent of steamy water and snatched the door open. And there was no one there. No one down the hall. No sounds of anyone running or jumping down the stairs. Just the sounds of dripping bath water. I grabbed a towel and ran down the hall, down the big hallway stairs, and jumped to the landing. The front door was closed and locked. I could see down the hall to the old Victorian carved door leading out to the back porch. Nothing. I sprinted to the kitchen. Nothing. I looked out into the side drive in the circular drive out front. No car. Nothing. Doors were locked. There was no sign of anything out of the ordinary. I searched from room to room and found nothing. I never said anything that might spook the family. But nobody likes to be in the house alone anyway. Funny thing is, now that we live in a modern house, built in 1973, across the cotton field from 801 East Pine Lock, we still hear noises and footfalls when no one else is in the house. I've sensed a presence more than once, and a teenage friend of a family told us that he saw a kind-looking old man one night, dressed in white, standing in our foyer. It was late at night, and Tyler was in the library, and from where he was sitting, he could see out into the foyer. The man in white looked at him, smiled and nodded, and turning, went down the hall. He said it was really interesting, but not too scary. My grandparents died when I was four, and we moved into their house. They were the only people who ever lived in it. I ended up getting their room. When I was in fifth grade, I started experiencing things in my room. My TV would go on and off whenever I would think that I need to turn it on or off. I had to sleep with the hall light on. One night, I thought I saw my mom in my room standing by my closet. When I turned my light on, she wasn't there. Then I thought I saw my dad standing in the same spot, but that time I kept looking at him as I went into the hallway to see if he was still sleeping on the couch, and he was. I was looking at him in the living room, in my room, and when I turned my light on, he wasn't there, but still on the couch. It always felt like someone was watching me. Then, my last experience of seeing something was in the same spot, but just the head looking at me. He looked like he was from the 1700s. When I tried to tell my mom, she wouldn't believe me. I'd wake up at night not being able to breathe, and my sister would run in. Then my mom started to believe me when she'd hear heavy breathing in her room when it was just her in there. I'd be walking, and it would feel like someone was trying to trip me. So I told my mom's mom, and she gave me a cross to hang in my room. When I put it up, I didn't see anything after that, but it always felt like I wasn't alone in my room. Now, years later, I found out that the guy staring at me from the 1700s looked just like a picture in our living room. He was an old relative. When I still go by the house, it still feels like something evil there, but at our new house, it feels like a household. Now that I'm 21, 
I think that it was my parents' dad still in the room that I had. That's the only reason. A long time ago, about 20 years or so, there was a car crash in front of my driveway. At the time, I did not live there. At that matter, nobody did. In the car, there were six young boys, ranging from six to 20. They crashed because there were a couple of drunk drivers who hit them head on. All the young men died in the car. About 10 years later, me and my family moved in a double wide on the lot in front of where the men died. About one year later, there was an awful car crash at the exact same spot of where the young men died. The woman was not killed, but she was seriously injured. After a couple of years, I went down to get the mail. When I heard a strange noise, like a young boy crying. I was the only one at home at the time. I looked around and seen nobody. The crying became fainter and fainter until I could hear no more. The next day, I went back down to check the mail and I heard talking, two men, about 18 years of age. I looked around and saw nobody once again. I listened to the conversation and I couldn't make out anything they were saying, but I could hear the voices as clear as day. Soon after, the voices began to fade away. I talked to my grandmother, who lives just up the road. She told me that the accident happened about 20 years ago, and everyone in the car were killed. I asked her what time it was that they wrecked. She said it was about 5 to 10 p.m. Around 7 p.m., is when the young woman wrecked her car. A few years after the woman wrecked her car, another woman broke down on the bridge, several feet away from where the young man crashed. Another time, a couple were driving with a full tank of gas, when all of a sudden, their gas tank just went empty, right where everything was happening. There were several more breakdowns and accidents that happened over the years where the young man crashed, and more of my family members, have heard strange talking and crying below our driveway. After time, we have moved, and still, there have been breakdowns and accidents at the same location. We think that the bridge in the area around it is haunted by the ghost of the six young men. I want to post something that happened to my mother, Marie, my uncle, her brother David, and my aunt, her sister Gail. A little background first, please. Maria was living in Arkansas, David was living in Florida, and Gail was living in South Carolina. Many miles apart, these three siblings shared the same dream on the same night and called their mother within 24 hours of the dream to tell her of it. This dream occurred in 1989. The dream starts with the three siblings visiting an old farmhouse they lived in as children 30 years ago, with their other siblings and parents. The house was empty. Marie, David, and Gail all got out of the car and walked completely around the house, recalling climbing an old oak tree that held a tire swing, recalling the farm area and what used to stand there, etc., when the three returned to the front of the house, there on their steps sat their dear old dad. They had passed away in April of 1974. Shocked to see their father on the steps, they called out to him. Dad stood and stood at the three with a malevolent grin. He motioned for his kids to follow him into the house. They followed through the living room, past the kitchen, down the hall, until they reached their parents' old room. He turned and looked each one in the eye and put his fingers to his lips, as if to say, shh. He then motioned with his hands for them to follow. He opened the bedroom door, and they followed him inside. He walked to the closet and walked through the closet door. Now in each person's dream, they were the ones about to open the door. As each reached for the doorknob and slowly started turning the knob, their mother appeared from nowhere, screaming at them to not open that door. 
they instantly woke up from the dream. I was a teenager at the time this occurred, and I did not see the big deal about following their dad into the closet until we visited my grandmother. My grandmother was telling my mother of how David and Gail both called her after Marie did, saying they had the same exact dream as she had. My mother looked scared, and my grandmother told her they all needed to get into church because Satan himself was using their father's image to lure them into something evil. I asked dear old granny how she got that from a dream and grandpa going into a closet. She told me because her husband, their father, my granddad, was scared of closets. I thought she meant he was claustrophobic. She assured me he was terrified of closets. The whole time they were man and wife, she would have to get his clothing out of the closets and lay them out for him. She would have to put things into closets. She refused to open them or go into them. My grandmother believes that Satan used granddad's image to lure the three siblings down a path of evil. I know this isn't much, but I love to hear the story. Within my years, I've had many, many ghostly experiences, but the most recent experience seemed to scare me the most. Almost every night sitting in the downstairs of my home, I feel a strong presence each time at a different location within the dining room and the living room. First, you may want to know how my dining room and living room are set in my house. When you first walk into my home, you enter a little narrow hallway where you then have to go through another door to get into my living room. Then, to get to my dining room, we have a huge opening and there's my dining room and my steps to go to the second story in my home. The other night, I was sitting on my couch closest to the two living room windows, but something just kept telling me to look over at the window in the dining room. Sure enough, I saw black mist that looked as if a face was watching me, but then it disappeared. I passed it off if it were nothing, and that I was seeing things, because it was around 11.30pm, and I was quite tired. For some odd reason, my shades were semi-open for five blades, and then the rest were closed, so no one could see. I then moved my brother to the other couch, and we sat together and I just could not keep my eyes off the window in the hallway entrance. Within an hour, I was getting finally comfortable. My brother was sleeping. My mother and stepfather were sleeping, and my older brother was home upstairs, with his car parked outside. I gazed at the window, and the black mist was back, but this time, it was more clear and bigger. It seemed more like a body and a face, but turned to gaze out of my window. Then it sounded like someone was trying to open my front door. It's a big steel door, and when it's locked and somebody tries to open it, it sounds as if someone is pushing against it. It happened at least six times before it stopped. I held my little brother close to me. Within the next 15 minutes, it sounded like someone was walking in the hallway and jiggling keys. Well, that was enough for me. I woke my brother up and sent him into my room because I had my air conditioner on in my room. But the jingling sound seemed to follow us to right outside my bedroom door, then stop for the night. My mother recently saw the mist and told it to go back to wherever it came from. It then seemed to glide to my basement door and disappear. My home is about 150 years old, and back then, people couldn't afford to have a proper funeral, so they buried people in the walls in the basement or in the floor. We recently had a dirt basement floor and a cobblestone wall, but we had the floor cemented over. My grandfather, whom I can safely say is a ghost expert, senses something in the walls in my basement. Around my house, but mainly in my room. I know for a fact there is a ghost in my room, 
but she's a sweet woman, and she just seems to watch me until I fall asleep. There are several ghosts in my home, but recently, I feel as if more are residing here. Just the other night I was drifting to sleep in my room, and I heard the sound as if someone was breathing. I held my breath, and the sound was still there, so I turned the TV on. It seemed to just go away. I was scared and looked towards the mirror and saw a flash and then nothing happened. But I saw the woman and felt comfort. I feel as if she scared the other spirit away. In my grandmother's house, there is an attic, but it's hidden in the ceiling and you have to pull the straps down. During the war at her home, soldiers were hidden in the attic and rumor has it one night, the other people found them and killed everyone in the room. But the one young nurse was beaten and then murdered. I had a dream once about a place where there's a dangling light. And you have to walk on beams and then open a door. And there's a little room with blood stains. I told my grandmother. And she said I described her attic exactly. Even though I'd never been in the attic. The woman who was murdered was a beautiful woman, and she is often spotted around my grandmother's house, scrubbing floors and walking. My grandmother's house was remodeled after the war, and the woman comes down the steps and walks, straight turns, and goes out a door, which is now a window. But before there was a wall separating the rooms and a separate door. Recently, my grandma has seen a little boy petting her dogs, saying, come on doggy, come with me. She thought it was my little brother because he had spent the night, but he was downstairs sleeping and no one else in the house was awake. She knows he's a ghost and she is comfortable with him. Although I am severely frightened of her basement, which in 1947, a man was found hanging with a grin on his face and a woman shot in the head underneath him. There were people found suffocated in their beds, random strangers. My grandma says the boy was one of the children found, and the man is evil. She feels that he may harm me. She doesn't like anyone except for her in her basement. I have many more stories to tell you, but I'm sorry, I'm out of time. I'll contact you later with many more stories. Thank you. Feel free to email me, or if you just want to exchange experiences, thank you. Although this is a true tale, it's not one of your spine tinglers. Just something odd that cannot be explained. It was told to me several years ago by a colleague, and happened to her mom Jean and some friends. Although Jean lived in Romford, Essex, she regularly went to a keep fit class in a small school hall in Upminster. The class had finished and her and her friends had piled into her car and drove around the corner, parking near the chip shop and they all ordered fish and chips, like you do when you've just had a good workout. They were all sitting in the car quietly eating when one person noticed something odd and nudged the person next to them. Eventually, they were all mesmerized, mouths agape, chips forgotten as their attention was focused on the activities in the churchyard over the road. Quite clearly, they could see a silent nighttime funeral procession of a coffin being carried on the shoulders by six pallbearers, all decked out in long black-tailed coats. They silently watched the procession walk from one side of the church and disappear around the other side. St. Mary's Lane, for anyone who lives nearby. Of course, they all asked the other, did you see what I saw? Knowing full well they did. The next day Jean decided to visit the church as she just had to know what happened. Maybe someone was buried late last night. However, she got to the church and found the vicar. She worded the question carefully so as not to look like a complete idiot and was obviously stunned when the vicar told her that no funeral took place last night. She said that from the look on his face it was fairly obvious that he knew why she was asking. But being a vicar, he simply smiled and walked away. Spooky. I've been past the churchyard as my grandparents used to live just down the road, and it is quite a creepy-looking place. 
All the stones are really old and crumbly and covered in moss. None of the names or dates are readable. It's one of those graveyards where you can look at it for a little while, and then you kind of shudder and have to look away. I used to think it was my childish imagination. But even these days, the place still gives me the creeps, even in the middle of summer. My story has to do with things that happened to me as a child. When I was six years old, my parents bought a very old house, probably around 100 years old, and that was back in 1976. It was a very large house and some of the original wallpaper was still in it. I have always been kind of in tune with the supernatural, and I also have a psychic sense. I'm not saying I am psychic, but I just know things and I can't explain it. Well, anyway, I know that my sister was very afraid of this house. She is three years younger than me. She would either sleep with my parents or with me, and she would never cross the long hall that ran through the center of the house by herself. I know that one day I was sitting in the living room and I got this really weird feeling, like I wasn't the only one in the room. I felt like someone was staring at me. Now keep in mind that my mother and sister had gone to the store, so I was in the house alone. At this time, I was about nine years old. I was sitting on the floor and I just happened to look up. If you are familiar with old houses, you know that some have these glass windows at the top of each door that I guess people used for ventilation before air conditioning was invented. Well, the upstairs of this house had been added years after the original one story had been built, and the steps that led upstairs went even with the glass window above the door in the room I was in. There was also a small triangle of wood that was missing from the step, and that is where my eyes shifted to. There was something looking at me through that space. I was so scared that I grabbed my dog and ran to the front porch, just hoping my mother would drive up. I don't know what it was, but there was something there. People in the neighborhood were always asking if the house was haunted, and one time an old woman I had never seen before asked me if I knew of the girl that had been locked in her room, in my house, and she had died there. There is also another story that happened in this same house. My uncle was living with us. He was 70 years old, and I was about 10 at the time. One night I heard him calling my father. He was shouting, and that is what woke me up. My father went running into his room, and this was my uncle's reply. I know you're not going to believe this, and... I know I shouldn't be seeing this, but I do. There's a black woman standing in front of the fireplace holding a little girl's hand, and she's wearing a red coat and hat. Then my father said that my uncle's eyes followed something around the room, and then my uncle began to scream again, No! Go away! Don't come near me! Then they disappeared. My father said that he had never been so scared in his life, because his uncle was being rational about it. Like he knew he shouldn't be seeing something like that, but he did. I knew there was something in that house. Although we moved out when I was 14, I still drive by it to look, and I still get a creepy feeling about it, just from driving by. I feel it in my bones. What do you think? I would really appreciate your opinion. Thank you so much. In the summer of 1999, I bought a house in a small town in Washington State. I'm a California native, so as you can imagine, I had a difficult time adjusting to the calmer settings. It was almost too quiet for my liking. About three weeks after I moved into my new home, an old colonial-styled house, I decided and began looking for a roommate. Soon after I placed the ad, I got a phone call from a very willing young lady who said it sounded like the perfect location for her. I took her name down, and she said she would call me the next day to set up a time and place to meet. I waited all day for her phone call, but it never came. I figured she must have found some other place to stay, but I kept the spot vacant in case she called back. A few weeks later she did call again, and as before she told me she would call back the next day to set up a time and place to meet. I faithfully awaited her return call, but same as the first time, it never came. I began to get suspicious as to whether it was a prank caller or a real person of interest. I thought it was odd how she'd given me a name without a number. 
My attempts to find her in the phone book failed, so without any other place to turn, I gave up on the search. About three months later, I was up in the attic storing some Christmas decorations I wouldn't be needing for some time, when my eyes fell upon an old stack of newspapers in the corner. I was somehow intrigued by a particular paper lying on the top of the stack. As I thumbed through it, I was quite shocked to read an article printed about a young woman who died in her house, the house I was currently living in, at the age of 22. Even more shocking was the name of the woman. It was an identical match to the woman who called about sharing my home. I couldn't catch my breath. I went down to the local historical library and discovered that this woman did indeed live in the very house I now owned in the late 1800s. My visit to the library occurred close to six months ago. Since then, late at night, I've heard crying downstairs in my living room. My aunt and uncle used to live in an old log cabin. We think it was by an Indian burial ground, but it was definitely haunted, and the spirit there was not good at all. One night, my aunt and uncle woke up to find they couldn't move. They were being held down by something, but that's not my story. My three cousins all shared the same room. It was the only room on the second level. I hated going up there by myself. I never had to before, but this time I did. I was about six or seven. My sisters and I had been playing board games with our cousins up in their room. When we went downstairs to watch movies, I left my shoes up there. When the time came to go, I couldn't find my shoes. I looked everywhere. Then my sister reminded me I left them in my cousin's bedroom. I went upstairs and planned to run into the room, get my shoes, then run out and down the stairs as fast as I could. I ran into the room and picked up the shoes. But as I was turning around, I felt something behind me. I was so afraid to turn around, but at the same time, I wanted to run down the stairs, right out of the house and into the car. So I slowly turned around. There I saw a small little Indian girl, maybe about my age. She was surrounded by a blue and white light. I just stood there until she vanished. I ran out to the car where my parents were waiting. And until now, I have never told anyone my story except for my aunt, who also sees things. Later, I found out that my aunt and uncle would pray to the Indians to watch over them, to protect them from whatever was in that house. Maybe the little Indian girl was just watching over my cousins. My wife and I had moved to the naval station at Mare Island of Vallejo, California. I was attached to the personal support office. About four months after reporting, I was sent to the combat systems tech school's command to process new students. I hadn't heard about the school's past until my encounter. One day in the fall of 1993, I was typing up a report about 0730 before the other three civilians and one other sailor got there. The typewriter was next to the door to my office, so I didn't miss anyone coming or going. There also was just that one main entryway into the office cluster. No other exits except for a fire door with the alarm connected. Anyway, someone walked by my door and I thought it was my shipmate, so I asked how he was doing. I got no reply, so I thought he hadn't heard me and I decided to go bug him after I finished my report. I went to his office and found it locked. Then I noticed the light on down the hall. The light was moving ever so slowly and getting closer to me. It was then that I realized that it was actually a translucent figure of a sailor. It terrified me so much that I ended up passing out from a panic attack. One of the civilian computer programmers walked into the hallway at work, noticed I passed out and shook me awake. I told her I saw something in this hallway and she said that I probably was just overworking myself from stress. I also told her that I thought Brian had walked by. She looked at me and said that nobody had moved from their computers since she got there at about 15 minutes to 0700. She did tell me something fascinating though. She said that at times she could have sworn she heard a whistling and a crying sound coming from the hallway. It sounded a lot like a little girl. It was then that I learned that the school was a fleet hospital for the San Francisco Bay Area built back approximately 100 years ago. The night watch detail would find locked doors open and hear footsteps at night. There were stories told about people hearing sounds of a little ghost girl playing ball near the main staircase. I never had the chance to witness her, and the base is now closed. 
but it was very interesting. As for the sailor, I have absolutely no clue as to what the story behind this guy was. To spare myself the anxiety, I just revert to thinking it was only my imagination, although it felt as real as anything I could ever see. One other experience was shared by my wife, myself, and my mother-in-law at Hickam Air Force Base in Hawaii in 1995. My wife had been flown to Tripler Army Hospital due to complications with her first child. My mother-in-law arrived a day before I got there from my ship. Anyway, we were put up in the guest house at Hickam for a couple of nights before being moved temporarily to an officer's quarter in the corner of the base. It was a well-furnished room and had a pleasant air about it. That was until the night arrived. My wife was awoken that first night where she heard multiple whispers. She then went to get herself a cup of milk in the kitchen of the house when she saw the presence of two figures crouched down as if they were praying. They both wore brown robes like they were monks. This whole ordeal must have lasted 30 seconds and they faded away quickly. In the morning we both got up and discussed what we had felt that night. That's when she told me about what she witnessed. The crazy thing was, while she was experiencing that, I told her that I could have sworn I saw the face of an elderly man just staring back at me in the mirror when I used the bathroom. He had scars on his face and was balding. I'll never forget the sight of it. It was an extremely uncomfortable feeling. This is a story that will always live with me for the rest of my life. My mother and father used to always take lengthy trips over the weekends to visit my grandparents in Ohio when we had lived in Michigan. We would drive about four hours and we usually would get there by the evenings. My grandparents lived in a huge Victorian estate on top of a hill surrounded by woods all around. The house had six bedrooms and was extremely spacious, so whenever we slept over, I got a room to myself on the second floor. At the time, my dad suffered from terrible sleepwalking episodes, and they only seemed to trigger at this house. I can remember one night, I was sleeping in the room and had my window open. That was when I was awoken by soft sounds coming from outside of the window. It sounded like hymns and chanting, as if it was a lullaby. At first, I checked to see if the television from downstairs was accidentally left on, but it wasn't. I was starting to get really freaked out when I went back in my room, because I noticed my dad was walking towards the trail path into the woods. The house lights were shining bright enough so that I could see the woods well enough from the window. In a panic, I ran downstairs and outside as fast as I could and grabbed a flashlight, then chased after my dad into the woods. He had managed to walk so far into the path of the woods that we got to be a mile away, and the further I went into the woods, the darker it got. We just kept getting further and further away from the house, and it was really starting to get cold and scary. I started to call out for my dad shining the flashlight straight ahead in the now pitch black woods when I had lost him. For a split moment, I felt someone whisper my name in my ear and the rustling sounds of leaves behind me as if someone was walking right behind me. For some reason, I thought maybe my dad was behind me instead. So I turned and pointed my flashlight and there was nothing there. I kept going and continued to look for my dad. That was when I once again heard a voice, but this time in a low and guttural voice. I could have sworn I heard the voice say let's play. At this point, I actually thought my dad was playing a practical joke. So then I yelled out to my dad and told him this isn't funny and to show himself. Even though the voice sounded nothing like him, I just kind of assumed. Maybe to ease my mind in my panic state. Literally a split second later, I see a cloudy mist and what looked like an orb hovering from the distance of the woods and slowing going in my direction from afar. It then disappeared. I heard my dad's far off distance scream and I started running faster into the woods to try to locate him. 
when I finally found him, he had fallen into this well that none of the family had any idea had existed. I quickly helped my dad out of the well, and he had asked me what happened. I brought him back into the house and told him that he was sleepwalking and managed to wander into the woods. The creepiest part of this whole experience was this. He said that while he was sleepwalking, he had dreamt that a woman in pioneer clothing urged him to find her missing son in the woods. She told him to run to the well and he will find him. When my dad told me this, I told him about hearing some soft singing before I rushed into the woods to get him and that I heard voices and whispering into the woods. A couple days later, fascinated by the well that existed in the woods, we went to go see it in daylight. To my utter shock, we had made a gruesome discovery. We found what looked like human bones at the bottom of the well. We immediately called the police. They examined these bones, and we were able to confirm weeks later that they weren't animal remains, but human remains. We had the bones examined by a professional, and they believed that the bones belonged to a young boy who may have perished hundreds of years ago. My guess is in the early 1800s. I would like to state wholeheartedly that these events are in fact true, from my father sleepwalking to the dream he had and the bones uncovered. It may sound a bit far-fetched, but I guess you'll have to take my word for it. This event happened in the 1970s, and I'm 70 years old now. This all happened when I was 17. I have a rather bizarre ghost story, or maybe it just appears that way to me since I've never experienced ghosts before. It was many years ago when I was 14 years old and spending a few weeks at her lake home. One night my friend and I decided to spend the night in the den, rather than our bedroom. The den has a lonely view of the lake, and has a wall of windows. It is a very large room. As we were in our sleeping bags, I noticed what looked like a man sitting in the armchair. The apparition was black, you could not distinguish any features, but you could see a bowler hat, or a similar hat on his head. He just sat there and didn't move, his arms resting on the chair. I was paralyzed with fear. I eventually mentioned this to my friend, or maybe she mentioned it to me first. I just remember that after a long time, we started talking about our late night visitor. We compared notes on what we were seeing, and it became apparent that we're both seeing the same thing. A shadow? I think not. And if you read on, you will know why I'm so sure. My friend and I became so scared that we buried ourselves in our sleeping bags and held on to each other for dear life. We knew we had to get out of there, but we were too scared to move. Eventually, we got up our nerve and made a mad dash to the bathroom. Keep in mind, our lake house is quite large and the bathroom was not nearby. We huddled in the bathroom for some time and got up our nerve to make it to our bedroom. This time, for some reason, we didn't run. As we were making our way to the bedroom, we saw another apparition on the living room sofa. This was definitely no shadow. There were no windows in this room, therefore no light except the bathroom light. This apparition was easier to see. It was a woman from the turn of the century. She was dressed in a white dress, possibly a Victorian wedding gown, and lying in the pose of a deceased person. As you could imagine, we hightailed it to our bedroom. When in the bedroom, we sat up with the light on. I'm not sure how much time passed, but eventually, we heard what appeared to be a marching band playing. We looked at the clock and saw that it was after 3 a.m. and therefore highly unlikely that a marching band would be performing in this rather sleepy-like community. 
Had it not been for this, we would have considered it as teenage imaginations going wild. You can see things, but hearing them is an entirely different story. In the morning, we checked out the house to see if there was any way music could be played by itself in the house. We found an old radio down in the basement, but it wasn't plugged in. We then plugged in the radio, and it did not even work. We asked my grandparents if they had heard anything, and they said they had it. When we told them our stories, they just laughed, and almost everybody else we had told this to laughs also. If they don't laugh, they listen and nod their heads, but we can tell they are just being considerate and patronizing us. We are now both 30 years old, born a day apart, and live over a thousand miles apart. When we are together, we still talk about this and stand by our story and memory. We still agree about what we saw and heard. I have no explanation about this, but I will not sleep alone in this house. I don't even visit often, but when I do, I'm still scared to death. Seabrook, Toddville Road, the former Toddville Mansion, which has recently been torn down. The property turned into apartments or condos. Reports of a strange creature roaming the grounds, noises, feelings of being watched, shadowy figures. Actually, this mansion was the List Mansion. The story of this place was well known to the people of Seabrook, who lived there at the time. I lived near the List Mansion for many years. Several acres of land were bought by a Houston business owner in the late 70s to early 80s, right on Galveston Bay, near the intersection of Toddsville Road and East Meyer Road. Bill List was his name, and for the most part at first, no one knew who he was only that there was a major construction project going up near the bay. Bill List owned a trailer manufacturing business, and with the success of his business came great wealth. The mansion was a massive undertaking, built up on several feet of soil. The three-story brick structure dwarfed the modest home surrounding the property. The brick foundry, where Bill was buying the bricks for his mansion, was unable to keep up production of bricks for the mansion and bricks for other products. So Bill just bought the brick foundry so all the bricks made could go into his construction for project. Month by month, the mansion began to take shape. The stark brick structure was three stories tall, four if you count the massive garage on the ground level. All the windows on every floor featured wrought iron bars. It was divided into two separate sections, with a large glass and garden and pool. Catwalks on the second floor crossed from the front of the house to the back part. The rooms were arranged into two separate apartments, with kitchens, bathrooms, and living areas. The entire property was surrounded by a brick wall from Toddville Road. The List Mansion, as it was called, resembled a prison, which was not far from true. When construction was completed, me and some friends were in the Kroger parking lot in Seabrook when two guys a little older than us invited us to a big party to celebrate the opening of the List Mansion. We talked to them for a few minutes and then they left. We did not go to the party. For years after that, you rarely saw anyone coming or going from the mansion, even though several families could live there at the same time and never see each other. The guys we saw at Kroger that day never showed up anywhere in town. Then one day, Bill List was dead, murdered, and the whole story came out in the Daily Citizen, the Bay Area newspaper. The List Mansion was built like a prison, not to keep people out, but to keep people in. As it turns out, Bill List had a preference for younger men and would cruise the alleyways in parts of Houston where runaways would frequent. He would offer them a place to stay in drugs in return for his indulgence for the young men. Bill would keep them drugged and locked in the mansion, providing everything for them but freedom. Some would stay 
and others would eventually be let go. But it was the final group of guys who figured it all out. They decided that Bill List must die. So one day, they got a hold of a shotgun and waited for Bill to come home from work. Bill never made it up the stairs from the garage before he was shot and killed. The guys who killed him ransacked the mansion, stole Bill's credit cards, and left. Some were picked up on their way to Canada. Others were caught in the Houston area. For years after the death of Bill List, the mansion was up for sale, and yet no one would buy it. Caretakers were brought in to maintain the property, and eventually, a bunch of people at a rock and roll band rented it for a while. I moved from Seabrook in the early 90s. Eventually, the List Mansion was bought by a real estate land developer, and he tore down the List Mansion. In its place was built Suko condos with clay tile roofs. There is nothing left of the List Mansion except the sordid stories of the long residents of Seabrook. These are my memories of the List Mansion. I grew up in a small town, and for about a year, we lived in a haunted house when I was just two years old. In other words, I don't remember specific things, just feelings. It all started when my mother and father moved from South Carolina to Kentucky. They rented an old house with a huge basement. This was told to me by my mother. I don't remember much about the house. So this is all secondhand information. They had lived there only about a month when my mother and older sister started to notice things. They told me that I was the focus of the spirit as it would do things to me or around me. Here's a few of the things that happened to me when I was little. One time, my mother and sister was sitting in the living room watching TV. I had a little wooden rocking chair that I loved to sit in. My father was at work working a night shift in the coal mines. Mom said, all of a sudden, things got very cold and my little rocking chair started rocking very fast and the rocking tossed me out onto the floor. Then, the chair fell backwards against the wall with no one in it by the way and my mother and sister both heard a very dull laughing. My mother said, that the thing in the house would push me, and a few times when she was watching me play in the front porch, would pick me up and drop me down hard on the ground. My mother says that she was terrified to leave me alone. Then another time, my big sister and her best friend were playing with me in the front yard, and my mother said she heard them screaming for her. When she went out in the yard, my sister and her friend was holding on to me and crying. I was trying to go down the little hill, into a little field below our house, begging to go play with it. My sister to this day swears that she and her friend saw a big black figure hiding behind a tree and motioning for me to come to it. And what was scary was, was that I was going. My sister's friend refused to come visit her at her house after that episode. My mother told me that I told her its name. I won't repeat it here, for it makes me have anxiety attacks, and that I lived in a deep dark hole in the ground, down in the field below our house. My mother went looking for a hole in the ground, and she found an old well that had been boarded up, and the weeds grown over it pretty bad, so it was very difficult to see. She didn't tell me if she experienced anything there or not, but she wouldn't talk about it with me. She kept begging my father to move. My mother said it would laugh at her, and she was constantly scared. Finally, one night when my dad was home, something happened that made my dad rethink and take my mother seriously. My parents were in bed, and it was pretty late. My father looked up and noticed the shadow of someone staring at him in the darkness. My dad at first thought it was my sister, so he raised up and asked her what was wrong. The thing laughed, and my mother screamed that it wasn't my sister, because the shadow was too big to be my sister. When she screamed, my dad jumped up to turn on the lights, 
and it laughed again and disappeared. From then on, my dad took what my mother said seriously. After a while, my dad was able to buy a piece of land and we moved. And according to my mother, not a minute too soon. To this day, my mother refuses to talk about it. I didn't find out about this until years later when I was watching TV about 15 years old or so. I saw a commercial for cat food with the same name of the thing that had haunted us for years before. I had no idea about this because my mother didn't tell me about it until afterwards. As soon as I heard the commercial and some of the cat food, I had an anxiety attack. When I told my mother what happened, she turned very pale and told me some of the story, some history of the house after we moved out. There was a man and his daughter who moved into the house. He was a single father, so he had his mother move into the house with him to help him take care of his daughter while he worked. Within two years of them living there, the man went crazy and one night killed himself with a gun. The daughter and her grandmother moved out of the night of a suicide and moved away to another state. No one ever lived in the house again. It stood empty for years, and the house started falling apart. The owner had since died a long time ago, and everyone just sort of ignored the old house. My mother never told anyone of our experiences. Finally, about six or seven years ago, they tore down the house in the basement, and they built a community fire department on the property. That building isn't exactly where the house was. It stands about 30 or so feet from where the original house stood. Anyway, that is my story. I've had other experiences as an adult, but I will save those for another day. Thanks for listening. I live in a two-story town. It was the middle of July, and it was very hot in Kansas City. I was sleeping on the couch downstairs, as the upstairs is hot in the summer months. I was sleeping, and I remember a low, heavy, dark voice saying I must help Laura, my cousin, understand. I woke up startled by the deepness of the voice. You could even say a little bit scared. My dog, which hardly ever barks, was looking into the kitchen and growling, and then slowly he started to bark. He was watching something, and when I looked in the direction he was looking, of course I couldn't see anything. The light from the outside street lamp was beaming through the window, so it was somewhat light. He started to back away, and followed the presence into the den, and then to the wall that was straight across from me. He was watching something, but of course, I still couldn't see anything. But from the way I woke up, in a startled state, I was somewhat scared to move. Like an idiot, I just stayed still and watched my dog follow this presence that only he could sense. He then started to go to the door, located on the wall across from me, and which opens to my garage, growling at the door. He would back up and then move closer, and then he started to smell under the door. Still, I was too afraid to move. I just stayed there and watched. Within five to ten minutes of this, the presence seemed to have left. My dog stopped growling and was going from the kitchen to the wall, into the door again, and again, as if to look for something. Finally, he gave up and just curled up at my feet which have not moved an inch this whole time, and fell asleep. Feeling now that the presence had left the room, I went to the door, which led to my garage, and pushed on it to make sure the door was closed. Once again stating what an idiot I am, I did not dare to open the door. However, I didn't really have a choice, because that was when the door cracked open just enough that I could see the face in a body of a bloodied lady in a black robe. It appeared for 40 seconds, and I saw her long enough 
to make out that she had to be a nun. I just remember her face looking so badly bruised and beaten, as if she was hit with a bat or something damaging enough to give her a black eye. I turned away in fright, then opened the door completely to see that nobody was there anymore. It was like it appeared in a flash of lightning, then was gone. Just to give you some background on my house, the door that goes to my garage does not have a lock in it. Yes, this is dangerous, for if my garage door is open, anybody could just walk in, right into my house. Maybe this nun I saw was really a homeless person. Maybe it was someone who was trying to rob the house, but since they saw me, they fled. Nothing was stolen. Everything was in one piece. Feeling somewhat safe that the presence had left, I joined my dog and soon fell asleep. In the morning I awoke, went upstairs to take a shower, and dressed for work. When I came downstairs, I gathered up all my things and opened the door which leads to my garage and stood there in total amazement. My garage door was wide open. I left the door open all night and morning. I truly feel my spirit guy was trying to warn me and I was too stupid and too afraid to listen to him. As I drove to work, I thanked him for trying to warn me and I promised to try and listen more carefully next time. The reality sank in that I could have been robbed or beaten. Yes, today I'm buying a chain lock for that door and installing it right away. In hindsight, I wish I would have been more accepting of the events that were happening to me. If this has taught me anything, it's to stop, slow down, and listen to the ones who are trying to help me. As a youngster, I was playing with my toys in the lounge, and suddenly, I had this great feeling of feeling fright around me. So I went running into my mother, who was washing the dishes. She told me not to be frightened, as there was nothing to be frightened of. So she assured me, and took me back into the lounge, to carry on playing. But as she walked back to carry on washing, she saw a figure standing still in the hallway. It looked as though it appeared to be a monk in a brown habit, with his face covered by his hood. All you could see was his feet, which had sandals on. My mother walked towards it, and it disappeared into my mother's bedroom. But my mother always said how I must have sensed the presence of this ghost. Another time in the same house, it was nighttime, and I couldn't sleep. So I was just looking into space, when three squares appeared on the wall. I thought that it must have been some kind of light shining in from the window, knowing full well that no light normally shines through, as we had blinds and curtains up at the window. I kept on staring at the squares on the wall. They didn't move or anything, but I felt really frightened like in the other story. I must have fell asleep, thinking about the lights on the wall. In the morning, when I awoke, the first thing I did was get out of my bed and go straight to the wall, hoping in the back of my mind that there wouldn't be any kind of marks on the wall where the square was, but I was wrong. Where the squares were, there were deep lined marks, like holes that were pressed into the wall around where the shapes were. They looked almost like claw marks and definitely weren't there before. There is no logical explanation for this story, not that I can explain anyway. It was not possible for any light to come through the curtains, and there were no other kind of lights or anything on in the room or in the house. I've tried to come up with some sort of explanation, and I don't have one, and that happened about 23 years ago. I've had some strange and incredible experiences over the years. 
just posted one in the last batch. Some of them. I haven't sorted out how to share yet, but the following experiences are pretty strange. My roommate and I were living in a Seattle neighborhood called Capitol Hill. Our apartment building, the Ben Lamont, was built in 1910, and my apartment overlooked the little park area with a long retaining wall in the back. One night, I must have fallen into a deep sleep as soon as I went to bed. When I woke up the next day, I immediately told my roommate about a disturbing dream that a menacing, sinister black figure had climbed out of a hole in the ground, right against the retaining wall. He seemed full of rage and anger, and was coming closer and closer to our window, and meant real harm. It was a very real, fearful thing. After hearing my dream, my roommate said she tried to wake me up soon after I went to sleep, but I was out cold. She said she heard something like a gunshot outside in the park and walked through a darkened apartment to the living room's bay window to see if she could see anything. She said she saw a man who was built like a tank, but fitting the physical description of the man in my room to a T. He appeared to be staring up at her. For whatever reason, I don't understand why she did this, considering she thought she heard a gunshot, but she shined a flashlight on him. When she did, she could no longer see him. Although she saw everything else, the trees, the ground, bushes, everything where she was standing was illuminated, but he had vanished. When she covered the light, there he was again. I guess she did this a few times until he really vanished. Very, very strange. Another time I was staying in an artist's loft in San Francisco that was in a really creepy area on Market Street and 6th. I was in bed, just starting to get the semi-lucid feeling when I woke with a frightened gasp. The only way to describe it is a flash vision. I thought for sure my throat had been slashed with a deep long knife from left to right, and all this blood was pouring. I remember sitting up gasping, knowing it was fatal. Then on the news the next day, chills went up my spine when the anchor person said that someone's throat had been slashed at a hotel on 6th Street, right around the corner from where I was staying. Somehow. I must have picked up on the victim's fear, anxiety, and shock. Not really a ghost story, but still weird. Another time, a friend and I had an interconnecting dream. I dreamt one part, and she dreamt the other. They match perfectly, and since we both dreamt this right before we were waking up, we assumed we had these dreams at the same time. I think I was about seven when I first started seeing things in my house and around my neighborhood. The first time I saw something was when my sister and I were sharing a room. I knew that I always felt something in the room, but I never saw anything, so I really paid no mind. Then one day, while I was sitting in my room, I looked up and saw an image by my door. I don't know exactly what it was but I know that I was scared. Over the next couple of days, I would hear things in my room, like people walking, the doorknob would jiggle, and things would just tip over. When I talked to my mom about these things, she told me not to be scared of them, just tell them to go away. The next night, I was sitting on my bed, and I heard somebody walking around. I did what my mom told me, and told it to go away. It didn't work. The sound became closer, and an image began to appear. At first I was kind of scared, but when I saw what the image was, I wasn't so scared anymore. It was a little girl, about five years old, who was lost. She was just staring at me for a while, and then she just sat down on the bed next to me, 
She was sitting next to me for about two minutes, and then she was just gone. For a few years, I wouldn't see anything, just hear things. When my older sister moved out, my sister and I finally had our own rooms. I stayed in our original room, and my sister moved to my other sister's old room. For a couple of months, things were cool, and then my sister woke up in the middle of the night and asked if she could sleep with me. The next morning, when I asked her why she slept with me, she told me it was because she was hearing people talking from the closet. Me and her had to switch rooms because she wouldn't sleep in her room. The first night, nothing happened, but the second night was completely different. I was hearing whispering and footsteps. At first, I thought I was scaring myself, but when I heard someone ask why my sister and I switched rooms, I knew I wasn't imagining it. At first, everyone thought I was making it up, but when I told my grandma about it, she looked at me as if she were surprised. She told me that I wasn't the only one in the family to be able to hear and see things. It was something that actually ran in my family. After that, things started happening more. People would talk to me. I would feel them touch my arm, face, or even feet when I was sleeping. And sometimes, I could feel someone sitting at the end of my bed. I think when I really got scared was when I decided to sleep with my light on so nothing would bother me. But when someone said turn the light off, that was it. I ran to my mom's room and fell asleep on the edge of her bed. That was the last time anything happened to me for about a year. I thought it was just something I went through, but when I turned 14, it got bad. Not only was I seeing things at home, but I was seeing them outside occasionally. I learned not to say anything, because when I would, people would just laugh at me. My family and I became aware of a particular area of a supposed haunting in the Jamestown, North Carolina area. We were intrigued by the article and wanted to investigate, even though we are people of faith. The article, which made us aware of the haunting, was in a local magazine and caught my two sons' attention after my wife read the article in a restaurant. The article described the following. In the 1920s, there was an accident in Jamestown near a certain bridge underpass involving two high school students returning from the local prom. From time to time, locals have reported driving by the area where the accident occurred and spotting a young woman dressed nicely standing by the roadside, needing a lift. The stories tell of a young woman named Linda entering the car and describing where she needed to be dropped. Upon nearing the destination, she vanishes. Of course, my wife and I are skeptical, to say the least. So, unaware of any peril, or should I say for a lack of knowledge or fear, we thought we would investigate with our two young sons of five and eight years. We arrived at the location, which is off the main road into the woods, about a hundred yards. There is an old stone blocked railroad underpass located next to the now regularly used underpass. Both of the underpasses have been covered with graffiti in tribute to the stories of Lydia. The old underpass, however, has been overgrown with ivy and weeds and is relatively secluded to say the least. Nevertheless, we were determined to investigate despite the spooky nature of the claims. As we entered the underpass, the air became distinctly colder, which we all noticed. We all felt frightened and left after only a few moments. We got in our car and drove home. We thought nothing of the event until that evening. Strange things began to occur at about 2 a.m. Of all things, an old woody doll with a pole string began to speak in a toy box and would not stop. 
the electric van door opened and closed several times without any provocation. My boys thought someone was in their room. We thought we were frightened from our prior experiences and let our logical minds control. The house still seemed strange to me and I had difficulty sleeping, even though my male eagle would not let me admit my fear. Time went by, and although the supposed haunting events were less traumatic, they nevertheless continued for about a month. It came time for the van to have a regular tune-up, and we took it to the dealership. When my wife returned with the van, the trouble ceased. I don't know what we experienced exactly over that period in 2001, but it seemed real. My wife and I still questioned the validity of our haunting, but our youngest son still maintains that Megan, as he refers to her, often talked to him and was very nice. Anyway, it's a nice little story we often tell family members who don't think we're lost on cozy evenings. Hope you will enjoy. I used to work at this daycare center that only stayed in business for two years. The building that we worked in had many owners and many businesses, but never stayed in business for longer than two years. Usually, bankruptcy would follow. Anyway, I had worked there for about a year and had always been scared of the back of the building. There was a long dark corridor that always gave me the chills and I always felt like I was being watched. I had the early morning shift, so I had to be there at 6.30 and get ready for the kids to arrive. One morning, I had an infant who was only four months old and was asleep at the time of the incident. We were in our room and I was write out papers for the rest of the day when I saw a toy out of the corner of my eye being thrown across the room. I didn't think anything of it and played it off as my imagination until a week later when another coworker told me what happened to her. She was in the sleep room changing a child's diaper when she looked right and saw a little girl standing there staring at her. She looked back at the child she was changing and back and the little girl had vanished. There were no children besides the ones she was changing in the room with her. It freaked her out. And when she told me, it freaked me out. Because then I realized that the toy that I saw thrown across the room wasn't my imagination. Neither one of us had another experience. But those two were enough for us. The first time I had a supernatural experience... I was asleep in my room at my parents' house. Now, I knew this house was haunted because in the middle of the night, I would hear something banging on my walls or my doors, and our dog, who slept inside, would bark on and off during one night, and the next night be completely quiet. But on this particular night, I saw an angel. I later found out that there is an old refrigerator under our house. Ask me why, and I couldn't tell you. Anyway, about a month after we moved in, we bought a six-year-old Shih Tzu puppy. About two days after we bought her, my fiancé and I were sleeping when he woke me up and told me the dog was on the bed. This, of course, was impossible since she was only six weeks old had short legs, and her bed was tall with nothing around it for her to jump on. He told me that he felt something tugging at the covers around his neck and growling, and when he rolled over it, ran and jumped off the bed. I just passed it off as him dreaming. But about a week later, while he was at work, he works night shift. I was asleep, and I woke up because it felt like something was running from one end of the bed to the other and back and forth. When I rolled over, it stopped. That kind of freaked me out. Then about three months later, I woke up and saw a hand coming out of our closet door with what seemed to be a letter 
or a piece of paper in its fingers. The hand was small and white. When I gasped, it disappeared. Then, about a week after that, the bed would periodically shake while I was asleep. I later asked my fiance if he ever felt the bed shake, and he told me he did. And when he described how it felt, I knew we were both feeling the same thing. It's a subtle shaking as if we're an earthquake, except we live in Virginia where we don't have earthquakes, at least not the kind you can feel. It was almost as if there was a big dog on the bed, scratching furiously at a flea, and he also described it the way I would have, which is when you wake up, your first thought is, man, my heart beating that hard? And then you realize that it isn't your heart at all. And just last week, I saw a young woman with brown curly hair and brown eyes peering at me from a crack in the closet door. And last night, the downstairs bathroom door slammed by itself, and the bed shook with both of us on it. Usually, it only shakes with one of us on it. Anywho, that's my story. If you have any insight, please give it to me, and you can put the stories on your site. I've had the special gift of seeing those who passed on to the afterlife, often seeing those who have long departed Earth. It happens periodically, but when it happens, I have some pretty vivid and memorable experiences. This has been happening since I was 8 years old. One of the scariest ghost encounters I had was when I was 23. I was a teacher at that time. And when I first started teaching, it had gotten very late, and I was in school grading papers. I remember it started to violently storm for a few minutes, before it stopped after some time. At this point, it was so quiet. I was the only one in the school at the time. I had left the classroom door open, when I heard a loud banging on the school lockers right outside the door. It startled me so much, I flinched so hard. I wanted to make sure it wasn't a break-in, so I went outside in the hall to investigate. That's when I was floored. Standing all the way down the hall near the lockers was a man in blue overalls with a long beard. He was holding an umbrella in his hands and looked so deranged. He honestly looked like a homeless squatter to me. I told him not to move at all, and that I'd be calling the cops, that I was armed with weapons, so if he tried anything, I'd attack, which wasn't true at all. I was bluffing, but I needed to scare him anyway. The next thing I know, the man starts charging at me full speed. I run back into the classroom I was just in, slam the door, and hide under the desk. I remember hearing the most intense scream for a second coming from the hallway. The lights go out, and it's pitch black for a moment's time. I started to hear a couple footsteps, then silence. It wasn't until about two minutes later the lights went back on. I screamed out loud, I'm armed, you need to leave, you are trespassing, you don't belong here, etc. I waited a minute or so under the desk and eventually got out. Still quiet, quiet enough to hear mice, I opened the door and head out into the hallway. There was no sign of life, nobody was there, no deranged, homeless man, just nothing. The school is pretty small, it's one floor and about ten classrooms. There are, of course, two entryways to get into the school, the front and back. I went to check the doors, and to my utter surprise, they had been both locked the entire time. I thought to myself, how could anyone break in? The doors are locked, no windows are open, and all of them are locked as well. Was I hallucinating? No, not at all. 
because the man looked as real as any person I could see. So, I made sure to check all the classrooms, even opened the lockers, to make sure this man wasn't hiding in there. But there was no sight of this guy. I did end up calling the police. They checked out the school as well, and saw absolutely nothing. By morning, everyone was aware of what happened. I think they actually canceled school for the kids that day because they were worried that a maniac was on the loose. I think they made the right decision. To this day, I have no idea what it was exactly. Of course, since I'm gifted, I lean towards the idea that this was a ghost. If it wasn't, then I'm really lucky I was unharmed. It could have been a lot worse, and I'm honestly thankful that it was just me that evening. I should mention that the school does have a history of oddities and ghostly phenomena. Supposedly there was a rumor that years ago, in the indoor pool at the school, a teacher went mad and drowned a student right in front of everybody. Legend has it that you could hear the moans and cries of a young person in the pool from time to time. One of the school janitors once swore that they saw a blue figure hovering right above the pool. Unfortunately, nobody took him seriously. He actually lost his job and was put into a mental asylum because he had a mental breakdown after seeing that. Anywho, that's my story and the surrounding rumors of this haunted school. I hope this was thoroughly entertaining. I don't work there anymore. I moved to a different state and work as a teacher currently. After what happened to me, I honestly couldn't stay. Thanks for reading. I'm from Dublin, Ireland, and when I was a boy, I forget how old I was, maybe about 14 or 15. I was staying with my parents with my old aunt and my family's ancestral home. There's a very old church just up the road from the house. It's so close that you can take a shortcut across just one field and you're there. It used to be part of an old Francescan monastery. Anyway, I was in that church on my own one summer's afternoon. It was a hot day, and though the church was naturally cooler, it was only a degree or so cooler. I remember feeling a little uneasy. All of a sudden, the hackles on my neck rose. I thought my little sister had followed me in. But then the temperature literally nosedived from somewhere in the high 90s to the mid 40s in a matter of seconds. I sensed that someone or something was watching me from the choir balcony above and behind me. Something told me that as sure as hell wasn't human. I don't know how, but I knew. I slowly turned and looked up. Three seconds later, I was tearing down the road as fast as my legs could carry me. What I saw was the semi-transparent, cowled figure of a Franciscan monk regarding me from the balcony. He was barely there, yet details, the folds of his robe, the heavy cross about his neck, and the shaded outline of a face was visible, yet weirdly see-through. I'm now 20 and still refuse to enter that church alone. I've since asked the parish priest about it. He explained that he had seen an apparition a couple of times when he was alone in the church, or refused to comment or speculate further. I still feel funny talking about this because the only people that seem to believe me are the children around here. You describe some of the things that have happened in your number two list of types of ghosts, so maybe I'm not crazy. We moved to this 120-year-old farmhouse about four years ago. When we first moved here, my youngest son was three. He would ride his tricycle back and forth from the living room to the kitchen, which at the end was the basement door. He would ride his tricycle back and forth from the living room to the kitchen which at the end was the basement door. I was doing the dishes when he turned to me and asked me to stop laughing at him. 
I told him I didn't see anything, so he proceeded to go to the living room and back again. When he reached the basement door, he turned to me and said, Can you hear them, Mommy? They're laughing at me. I left it alone, but I never forgot it. As time went on, little things would happen that really got my attention, like the smell of perspiration when nobody was around. It would only last a minute or two, and it would only be in one spot of the room. I would go to other parts of the room, but could smell nothing until I went back to the original spot, and it would still be there. I would also smell it as if it were just passing by, in front of me, and then be gone. This continued for the next year, and then one day, I laid down with my son for a nap. It was about one in the afternoon. I would wait until he fell asleep, and then I would get up, but before I could move, our bed started shaking for no reason. It only lasted a couple minutes. After that, things happened a lot. My eight-year-old started to get smacked in the leg when he was asleep. He would always come downstairs afraid after it would happen. I started getting nudged on my leg at night, like someone was trying to wake me up. I am a very light sleeper, so I'd wake up immediately and look all around my bed in my room, but nobody was there. One night, when I was sleeping, I felt something lay across my legs. I tried to move, but it was so heavy, so I started to kick real hard and crazy, and it went away. Again, nothing was there. My son was five when he asked me if I could see the man's work boots standing in my dining room. He would see black things floating by and asked if I saw them. He would describe them like shadows, but the clincher was when we were all sleeping at four in the morning and my dresser started shaking so hard, I thought it was going to fall over. I spoke to my pastor's wife about it and she said they say a prayer every night that ask the Lord to protect them from any harm or evil. My children and I started including that in our prayers, but we added spirits also. We have never had another problem since, except I do still smell them from time to time. I do still hear footsteps across the ceiling when nobody is upstairs, but that's no problem I don't mind. My mother, brother, sister, and I moved into an old house in Cambridge, New York in 1995. They had the intentions of refinishing parts of the house to make it more modern. To give you an idea of the house, it was built in 1884, had four floors, which consisted of a basement, first floor, second floor, and a full attic. Above the attic, there was a window's peak. And access was through the attic by a flight of stairs. Strange things started happening that everyone just brushed off the first week. Every night at 7 p.m. on the dot, the house would fill with the smell of cigar smoke. Nobody in the house smoked cigars. We could hear voices of adults upstairs and people running around. When we went up, no one was there. We heard knocking on the walls all hours of the day. People were heard whispering. It would get so intensely cold in the kitchen, and appliances would randomly turn on and off. My sister was coming down the stairs when she looked to be pushed from behind, and luckily my mother was at the bottom and saw the whole thing. My mother was never bothered at all. It seemed to target only the children, which were my sister, 11, my brother, 13, and me who was 15. She did hear things, and she also felt things, but never scared out of her mind. One day, my mother came to me and said she had to show me something. She took me to the basement door and said, watch. She opened the door and turned the light switch off. Then she shut the door, waited for a few seconds, then opened the door, and the light was back on, and the switch was up. We then proceeded to do this over and over again 
and the same thing occurred, so we duct taped the switch off. We left that night to visit family friends, and when we returned, every light in the house was on, even the basement, where it looked like someone tore the duct tape from the wall. We left the light on from then on. Everyone in the house had seen shadows and felt presences, but my brother was the one who saw and felt the most. One day, he was home alone and said he saw three men in the backyard digging by the garden. He watched him for a few moments when one of them looked up at him and all three of them disappeared. He said the men looked as real as he did. He woke up one morning with three scratch marks down the front of his chest and he said he didn't feel it, nor did he wake up during the night. My closet doors in my bedroom one night rattled uncontrollably while I was trying to sleep. This creeped me out so bad I refused to sleep or even go into the room. The room became a used office and me and my sisters opted to share a room. My sister said she felt something watch her whenever she was in the bathroom, and on one occasion, she said the shower curtain whipped open. I do believe her, because she ran out of the shower screaming and straight onto the front porch. We found out that the house was part of the Underground Railroad. When research was done on the house, it was found that it was also an underground bar during Prohibition. Many. Many people lived in that house and also passed away in the house. A woman by the name of Ann Douglas hung herself in what was my bedroom. And we also know that there was also a shooting outside of the house, around where my brother saw the three men. There were so many incidences, but too long to tell all of them. We lived in the house for five months before selling it and moving out. We have heard that people have lived there a stayed a short time before moving out. The house is currently vacant. I wonder why. I had many paranormal experiences when I was young. As I grew older, I dismissed them as fantasy of the young mind. As I grew older, they became less, but too as an adult, stand out in my mind. One happened when I was in Germany, and the other didn't happen to me. The first time was when I was in Mittenfing, Germany. I was about 23 years old. I was new to the country, military, and looking for a place to rent. We, my ex, an atheist and I, found one. Our apartment was on the second floor. The landlord lived on the first, and there was an attic. The first night we stayed there, I had a dream about a person named Caleb. I could not see his face. All I could see was a shadow behind curtains. He was asking my ex to come with him, and I kept saying no. I had the dream several nights, but I never told my ex my dream. About one month after we moved in, I started experiencing phenomena. We had a bathroom with a skylight. I had this unnerving feeling that someone was looking at me while I bathed. Keep in mind that this was an old German house and showers are hard to come by. I also had the feeling of being watched when I went into the kitchen. Several months passed by and winter came. We had a lot of snow, and it was piling up. One day, I was in the living room when I heard this sound in the attic, like someone was dragging something across the attic. I dismissed it as snow piling up on the roof and falling. The only problem was, the snow really was falling north to south, roof pitch, and the sound I was hearing was from east to west. I ignored it for about two weeks, and the sound got so loud that I had to leave. My ex found me sitting on the landing one day and asked me what the problem was. I told him what I was hearing, and he laughed and told me it was the snow falling off the roof. I told myself, giggling, 
you're losing it. Several days went by, and I kept hearing the sound. I did ignore it, but one day, I tried to lay down on the couch. When I heard this sign next to me, I left the apartment again. But one night, we had a party, and my ex told people that I was hearing things. They laughed, and I was embarrassed, but I told them open the attic door, which was between the bathroom and kitchen, and see what was up there. They did, and everyone stopped laughing. I didn't really want to see what was up there, but then again, I did. My ex told me there was nothing up there but old rags. He tried to persuade me from looking, but I wanted to see for myself. So I climbed up the stairs and looked in the attic. What I saw took my breath away. There was an old black German baby buggy sitting up there. It was full of cobwebs and someone pushed it and I knew what that dragging sound was. It made a distinct sound that could be heard by everyone. I actually felt sick to my stomach. We stayed there for about another month and nothing happened. Then one night, we laid down to go to sleep when I heard this knocking on the wall above us. Three knocks. I asked my ex if we had heard that, and this is what he said. I'm going to tell you I didn't, but I did. Well, it was about two weeks after that when my ex told me we were moving. I didn't know it, but he was looking for another place. No explanations. We were just moving. As we were moving, I asked him why, and all he said was, let's leave this place. I asked him why, and he got really mad and told me we were just moving. Well, we moved, and about six months later I asked him why we moved, and he told me that he looked up to the kitchen window, and there was a man looking down at us. I know there was nobody left in there because I was the last person to leave. He also told me he was experiencing the same things I was, but wouldn't tell me because he was afraid to scare me. Keep in mind, my ex was an atheist. I felt chills go down my body. The next one didn't happen to me, it happened to my husband. Keep in mind that he is a Gulf War vet with over 20 years active duty military, Brook Army Medical Hospital in San Antonio, Texas. Where it stands now is not where it used to be. You actually have to go on post to see the real hospital. It was abandoned many years ago. It is barricaded off, but I would like to hear more about this building. My husband went for training last year. He's a reservist now. He stayed in a hotel across from the abandoned building. After a few days he was there, he called me and told me he couldn't sleep in this haunted hotel. He stated he woke up several times to find his stuff from his closet strewn across the floor. He also said his closet was extremely cold. He also told me that there were roaches as big as tanks. I laughed most of it off until I went there. He told me that several soldiers complained about things happening to them, but no one believes them. Well, I didn't believe him until he drove me by the old hospital and it looked like an abandoned building, barbed wire and chains with locks. After a few passes by the hospital, he told me I needed to see the hotel. He got me into the hotel pretending I was a soldier I felt more like a prostitute the way the CQ looked at me. I will tell you, this place looks as if you stepped into the 30s. I swear they haven't changed the wallpaper since then. He kept telling me that when he looked out his window, the hospital would have lights on and the windows would be open. Keep in mind, this is an abandoned building. He took me to the room he stayed in and yes, the whole room was cold. I could see the hospital from the window and no lights. When we left, I looked up at the hospital and I saw a room with lights on and a window open. 
I got the creeps. As we were leaving, he drove closer to it, and there was no way anyone could have gotten in there. Firstly, I guess I am what you call a sensitive. I regularly see things, hear things, and feel things that others don't. I'm usually the first one to point out when something doesn't feel right, and I've been like this all my life. During my first year at university, I stayed at Hillhead Halls, and I had the strangest experiences. For about the first month of being there, it was fine. One day, I was walking about the kitchen, and I felt a huge blast of cold and loud whispering, which really frightened me. Seeing strange things doesn't usually bother me, because it happens quite regularly, but this really bothered me, because it felt so, so bad. I asked my flatmate if she had heard anything, but she said that she hadn't. Just after the Christmas holiday, I came back to the worst time of my life. Firstly, there was a man walking around my flat. He was very tall, wearing all black, including a black hat or hood, and you could not see his face. I saw him outdoors and inside the flat. He frequently had a black dog with him, which often walked by my bedroom door. My flatmate got really scared of being alone in her room, as she felt there was someone watching her from her door. It was about a week after seeing this man that electrical appliances in my room started to go wrong. My electrical alarm clock, for example, would just start to beep much louder than anything had ever done before. It did not stop when I pulled the plug out. It has no battery backup. My printer would just print out random rubbish, even if it was not switched on, and light bulbs would blow if you looked at them for a long time. The electrical stuff would only happen in my room. Objects would disappear from my room, reappearing elsewhere in the flat. An example of this is that we lost a bread knife out in the kitchen, bearing in mind that I don't eat bread much, especially not in my bedroom. We found it on top of my wardrobe at the back, about three or four months after it got lost. At night was the worst. Me and my flatmate would drag our mattress through to my room and sleep there because we're too frightened to sleep in separate rooms. I would have the most horrendous nightmares which I never got before and have never got since. At night there would be constant bangings, tappings and scrapings which sounded like they were coming from the space between the walls. I think about the worst thing that I experienced while living there was getting up one morning and walking to the window at the end of the landing and looking out at the trees that are above the river dawn. On the larger branches, there were hanged people, as in dead, with a rope around their neck, swinging in the wind. They weren't dressed in modern clothing. I wanted to run away and stop seeing it, but maybe I was too frightened because my feet wouldn't move and I found it really difficult to breathe. After this, my flatmate found staying in our room, which overlooked the river dawn, unbearable, and moved into the room next to mine. As soon as that room was locked, everything was fine, until it came to the end of the year, and she moved out. She moved out about a fortnight earlier than me, but I was spending most of my time in the flat above mine. After her moving out, I came downstairs from upstairs to find her door open, and light shining through onto the landing carpet. Very bravely, I went to shut the door and switch the lights off, but just as I got there, the door slammed in my face and locked, and I heard the light switch off. I phoned my flatmate to make sure she was home, which she was. I then phoned the people from upstairs and asked them to come down, and when they got to my flat, the room wasn't locked again, but was totally empty and freezing cold. It was the summer, but you could see her breath was white. The next day when I got out of the shower, I found that the bathroom door was wide open, despite the fact that I'd locked the door and there is no way that the lock could open itself. 
Also, the bathroom door was very creaky, and I hadn't heard a creak. I went to my room and got dressed as quickly as possible, but I couldn't find the key to my room so I could lock up and leave. I'd left the key in the lock on the outside of the door, but it was gone. I found it in the bathroom sink. Finally, one night, I gave my key to one of the people living upstairs to go and get me a sweater for my flat, as I was too frightened to go down. This person, who was a complete skeptic, came back upstairs completely pale, sweating cold sweats, shaking, and totally out of breath. I don't know what happened, because this person won't talk about it, and has made us all promise never to bring it up in conversation. These all sound like really weird events, but I don't smoke, drink, or do any kind of drugs, and I didn't then, but I swear they are all true. I don't want to experience anything like that again as long as I live. Thanks for letting me share this with you. My friend and I went to Alabama during our senior year in high school to visit my grandparents. Now, my grandparents lived in the middle of nowhere. Little town. You blink. You miss it. Anyway, there wasn't much to do. So one day we went exploring. Down about a half mile from my grandparents' house, at the end of the road, was a huge pasture. It hadn't been inhabited or cared for for years. There was a large gate with a no trespassing sign. This made us curious to see what was hiding back there, in the middle of nowhere. We crawled under the gate and started walking. There was a gravel path and nothing else but trees, grass, and insects. We kept going for about a mile until we were in a fully wooded area. This is where the strangeness happened. First off, we stumbled across an old graveyard with only about three graves in it. it looked like a family. The tombstones were dated back to the early 1800s. I took photos that I can send at a later date if you'd like. Across from the graves was a waterfall. We decided to sit and take in the sight. While sitting there, we heard horse hooves galloping closely. We turned and saw nothing. A little while later, we heard what sounded like something being swung through the air near our heads. Nothing visible though. It spooked us and we decided then that we should probably head back to the house. On the way back, we heard the horse hooves again and this time we ran, got back to my grandparents' house, and replayed our story to my grandfather. This is where it gets spooky. He said that a while back, he stumbled across the waterfall too, and decided to sit and fish at the bank. He heard the horse too, and heard the swinging, which he described as a hatchet or something similar. Only he said that he turned and he saw a man on a white horse, carrying a machete and appeared to be clearing the fields, but it wasn't really there, like he and the horse were transparent. He said that's when he took off running too. The only thing I can think of is that at one time someone lived on that land, which is why they were buried there. I can tell you one thing, it spooked me then, but now I just realize that people just stayed there where their home was. I haven't had any opportunities to get back to that area, but if I do, I may go visit them. I moved to Indiana in 1986. I befriended a woman who sold real estate and said she knew of this huge house that was for rent in a small town called Lamb, Indiana. It sits directly across the river from Carrollton, Kentucky and is halfway between Vevey and Madison, Indiana. The house was absolutely fabulous, made of stone, and built circa 1800. It is told that the Native Americans taught a white man how to build the house. It became part of the Underground Railroad during the Civil War. There was a tunnel built from the Ohio River up to the basement wall, where they had knocked a hole in the wall for slaves to enter. My story starts in the fall of 1987 when my mother, my dog, and I 
We're on the first floor in the living room watching television. My little dog ran upstairs and was running around in circles. I could hear little toenails on the wooden planks. I felt a cold chill, like a burst of cold air, and became puzzled by it. There were no doors or windows open in the house. It was cold out, and we had built a fire in the wood stove. I went up to check on my little dog to see what she was doing, and there it was. My room had a door that led out to nothing. I assumed there was a balcony at one time, but at this time, there was no evidence of one, so the door stayed shut and locked. When I had gone upstairs, I noticed the air was more frigid, and it seemed windy. I went to my room and the door was standing open, and it looked as though a small child had breathed on the window of the door and wrote Amy's room on the window. I think the most interesting experience in this house also happened to be the most terrifying. One night, I had been sleeping in bed with the door open when I was awakened by what I thought was my dad. I remember the door squeaked open slowly and I heard a whisper. I couldn't hear it too clearly. All I knew was that it was some sort of talking. That's when I started to open my eyes slowly and saw what appeared to be a nun with an axe on her head, kneeling down and praying in front of my bed. I screamed. My parents rushed into the room, and I told them I saw something. My dad did his best to reassure me that everything was okay, and after I explained what had happened to me, I feel like he was just as creeped out as I was, even though he tried not to show it. Well, that even frightened my dad, to the point at which he told me he couldn't sleep the rest of the night. I ended up falling asleep, and my dad stayed up. He told me he went to the bathroom and turned on the light, when all of a sudden, it went out. Needing to use the bathroom, he grabbed one of the flashlights we had. When he shined the flashlights towards the mirror to wash his hands, he looked at the mirror for a second, only to notice the old man's face right behind him. He only saw this for a few seconds, but he couldn't forget the man's face. He had three large gashes on the side of his face, like he had been mauled by a tiger. Claw marks. He was a balding man, with gray hair only on the side of his face, and he looked about 70s. Of course, when the bathroom light came on, there was nothing there anymore. The basement had some creepy occurrences as well. You would hear a very young voice, often singing softly, not super loud, in fact, very faint, but a voice was there. When he'd get downstairs and into the basement, you wouldn't hear it anymore, but it was always something you heard whenever you were in other parts of the house. About a year or so later, we had some family staying with us for the weekend and my cousin set up a large tape recorder in the basement to see if there were any noises. My little nieces and three friends bedded down in the living room by the wood stove to stay warm, and we all went to bed. The next morning, one of the little girls thanked my dad for stalking the fire that night because it was getting kind of chilly. My dad hadn't been downstairs all night. My cousin went down to the basement to get the tape recorder, real to real by the way, brought it back upstairs, and played it back to us. You could vividly hear a little girl say mommy. My family lived in that house for almost 15 years. This is a wonderfully chilling and rather classic, if that can be said, Scottish Tale ghost experience. My mother, who was attending university in St. Andrews, Scotland, was walking home from a party. It was about 11 o'clock on a chilly November night. It should be noted beforehand that St. Andrews was, centuries ago, the religious capital of Scotland, and the ruins of the great cathedral still stand in the middle of the town. Anyhow, she decided to take a shortcut to the dorms, Instead of taking the road, 
she began to make her way through the soccer pitches. These were surrounded by spinnies of trees. As she crossed the fields, she noticed what appeared to be three policemen at the road at the end of the pitch where she was heading. Though not that close, she could see that they wore heavy cloaks, like the Scottish policemen's coats traditionally worn in the winter. She didn't want to be found by them at that late hour and went to the nearby trees to hide. To her chagrin, they began to move towards the center of the field, though not directly at her. She stayed put. As they came closer, she realized that they were walking on the air, about three feet above the ground. Furthermore, they were not policemen, but monks in clerical robes. Two of them were supporting a third in the middle, who seemed to be wounded. They passed only a few yards away from her, so that she saw them very clearly. Oddly, their feet moved very slowly, but they were moving through the air very quickly. When they came about parallel to her, my mother, mad with fear, ran as fast as she could back to the dorms, clearing a fence that was as high as her, with one leap on the way. A violent wind kicked up against her as she ran, as if trying to blow her back. The next day, she went back to where it happened. At the very spot where the three monks had passed near to her, she found three black cats eating the carcasses of a rabbit that they had just killed. In another note, the mystery as to why the apparitions were floating is easily solved. The ground was leveled in order to make a proper playing field. The monks were simply walking on their own terrain, as it would have been in medieval times, three feet higher than the leveled field. My family has had many paranormal experiences. When my mother was a child, they purchased a house near Martins Ferry, Ohio, that had some strange occurrences there. My uncle was in his room asleep and woke up in the middle of the night to find an old woman in a rocking chair sitting in the corner of his room. He said she told him to get out of her house. My uncle was so frightened, he literally dragged his mattress into my mother's room and refused to ever sleep in his room again. My mother and I also saw the woman and can vouch that she was real. My great-grandmother would also see a small black devil-like creature with glowing red eyes outside her window at night. None of my family's pets lived very long in that house either. Their fish were found dead in their tank one morning. All of them. Here's the thing though. The water was somehow boiling hot. My mother's hamster was found dead in its cage too. And I've been told it looked like something had maybe scared it to death from the expression on its face. Also, every night... My grandmother would dream that the house was on fire, and they couldn't get out. After living in the house for six months, they moved out. The day after they had moved out, the house caught fire and was almost burned to the ground. To this day, my aunt still has ghost experiences. At one of their old houses, they would turn out all the lights, lock the doors, and would come home to find that every light in the house was on. I never felt comfortable being alone in the house upstairs. I would feel like someone was watching me when there was no one else upstairs. And in the house they live in now, they were in bed one night when they heard a blood-curdling scream coming from their living room. They ran into the living room to find nobody there, and all the doors in the house were unlocked when they knew that they had been locked before they went to bed. Also, my aunt was in bed, and someone told her that her baby's daughter's face was covered by her blanket, but no one else was home. I swear this is absolutely the truth. I wanted to share my family's stories with other people, so they can know that maybe they are not alone out there. Hello, my name is Naomi, and I've had several paranormal stories to share. Ever since I was young, I've always been terrified of the paranormal, 
I have had terrifying, vivid dreams. As a child, I would frequently awake to see a dark, shadowy figure standing by the doorframe of my bedroom. I would feel a presence behind me when I would walk upstairs at night. At a slightly older age, I dismissed the possibility of ghosts because I figured it was impossible, but later I had a change of heart when I went to this haunted yard. I would heard many stories about a small yard where strange things had occurred. One night, I thought it might be interesting to go take a look at it and see what all the fuss was about. The yard is almost impossible to find, totally surrounded by trees. If you are able to find it, go there in winter. The snow is always perfect, not a single flaw. If it's a windy night, there will be no wind within the yard. The freaky part about it is, is that there is an old building which used to be an insane asylum, now abandoned. It's boarded up, but one night we opened it up and we heard a faint barking of dogs from within, but there were no dogs anywhere nearby. Next to it, there is a small trailer. No one lives in the trailer, but light and the TV are always on. There is an old swing on the yard. If you watch it for long enough, it will begin to swing slightly. The strangest part is that there are two old Native American tombstones. Every time you go back, they've been re-dug and moved to another location on the yard. I'm not sure if any of this is ghost related, but it certainly is freaky. An incident happened to me this evening as well. I was walking with some of my friends along the railroad tracks in my town. On the street next to the tracks, a hundred years ago, there was a man who went insane, killed his family, and was hanged in the courtyard. Anyway, tonight, as we were walking, we all of a sudden simultaneously stopped and looked at each other terrified. We all felt a strange presence brushing against our backs. Later, we were sharing stories about screams people frequently hear coming back from the park. We decided to sit out on the deck of my friend's house, who lives right by the park. We were just sitting around, talking when we hear the scream of a little girl as if she was being murdered coming from across the park. We randomly ran inside. Once inside, we began to share ghost stories. One of my friends believes his house is haunted. He always feels things in his room when he is sleeping. With one particular experience, back in winter, he would wake up in the morning with claw marks in his shirts and slight scratches on his back. This happened about six times. Another time, he woke up and all of his blankets were totally flipped upside down, but looked as though they had been untouched. He talked to his grandmother about it because she is able to communicate with the dead and she visited their house and told the spirits to leave. Since then, there have been no strange occurrences. I work in a nursing home and didn't believe in ghosts till I was offered a night shift position. One of the girls said that the home was pretty bad with spirits, but I thought because of my age, 19, she was just trying to scare me. I was walking alone after answering a buzzer past the dining room when someone touched my shoulder. I turned around and no one was there. I was convinced it was the other two girls, but they were in the lounge and couldn't have got there without me seeing them. Later, we were sitting talking when the door, which is a fire door and doesn't move, was slamming and opening for about a minute and abruptly stopped. We all got out of our seats, don't know why, and then a black figure appeared at the door and just stared at us for about a minute and walked off. The eldest girl went after it, so we followed and no one was there. We sat down to calm ourselves because we were pretty freaked out by that when the emergency buzzer started going off simultaneously from one room to 30, 
but there are patients who can't reach them and others on medication. So we went and turned them off and checked our residence. We went to one lady who was dying of cancer and I turned off the buzzer when my coworker said she was gone. We can only think this was her having a laugh because she was a great lady or she was trying to let us know she was gone. That also wasn't the first time someone passed away before we were aware of it. I had a coworker once who could have sworn she was talking to an old woman at the clinic that had been at the nursing home for nearly a decade. This coworker had gone on vacation and this was her first day back. There was a figure laying in bed in her room alone. She was facing away from my coworker and she had the door cracked over for a second to see if the woman wanted anything to eat. There was no response, so she figured the lady was just cranky and didn't want to be bothered. A few hours later, she went back to the room and nobody was there. My coworker asked another why the patient was missing. The other coworker looked puzzled. Did nobody tell you that Miss Noble passed away in her sleep? While you were on vacation? My other coworker said, Well, then why was there somebody in the room a few hours ago? She found out that nobody moved into the new room since Miss Noble passed away. They tried moving a patient in there for a couple of days, but we would hear him scream bloody murder for no explicable reason. But again, they took him out right away, and way before my coworker returned to work. My coworker insisted that she saw a figure in that room and that she wasn't tired or feeling unwell. This might end up kind of being long since I'm going to try to cover a lot of what I experienced in my life. I will start with the first thing that I remember. I was about four or five years old. I was sitting in my bedroom getting some coloring books. It was summer and the window was open. I heard this noise and at first I couldn't tell where it was coming from. I looked towards the window and the sound faded. It sounded sort of like a lawnmower. Well, I went back to what I was doing and the noise just got louder. I realized the noise wasn't coming from my window from the other side of my room where the closet was I looked over and saw this black orb hovering over the molding of the closet it was moving in the swaying motion and the noise I was hearing came from the black orb I screamed and curled up into a ball I continued to scream until my mom reached my bedroom she looked terrified and kept asking me what was wrong well, my little brain could only assume it was a black bee, which she didn't find amusing. She said she thought someone was trying to kill me because of how I was screaming. From that point on, I read everything I could get my hands on about ghosts. Nothing happened for many years after the first incident. My father was in the military, and we moved from Atlanta to Minot, North Dakota my sophomore year of high school. I'm not going to get into everything that happened down there, since it was a daily occurrence down there, no matter where in town I was. In brief, let's just say the blacker than black negative things. Everywhere. Luckily, the people that I normally hang out with saw them too, so I didn't feel like I was going crazy. They ranged in height from being one foot to over seven feet. There was one we nicknamed Split Toes. Keep in mind, there were more than one of them. I lived in Mano for just under one year, and I'll never step foot there again. On top of the shadows, there were many other things that happened ranging from smells to noises to the absolute feel of being chased, the fear. My sister even saw them. Though it traumatized her so badly, she shut down and now says she didn't. Now I know this sounds crazy, but I know there are other people out there 
that have experienced these things. I know that what happened down there was not an overactive imagination. We all from time to time will wake up with cuts we couldn't explain, or have them appear out of nowhere, sometimes singular, sometimes looking like a tiny clawed hand that hit us, and rarely, bite marks. We were told by a friend's mother to wear sage and little leather bags for protection. I still wear one, even though I'm back in Alaska. After Mano, things slowed down a lot. I had a few more experiences with the shadows. After a while, I had enough, though. I yelled at them and told them if they agreed to leave me alone, I would pretend they didn't exist, and it has been pretty much quiet ever since. The last time I had an experience like that was out in Cooper Landing, Alaska, just a few years ago. I left Mano almost eight years ago. My friend invited me and a few other people to her parents' cabin for the night. We drove out there from Anchorage at around 8 p.m. in the winter. I don't know if you're familiar with Alaska seasons and such, but in the winter, it's hardly ever light out. Maybe a couple hours a day during the time period we went out there. So anyways, we drive out to Cooper Landing in the dark on really icy roads. We finally get out there. And at first sight, this place made me nervous. I was determined to have a good time, so I forgot my initial feeling on the cabin. The night went well. The cabin was set up in a very open layout. There was a wall that went halfway across in the middle of the cabin, with the living room on one side and three sets of bunk beds on the other. Come to find out, it used to be her grandmother's cabin before she died. Well, we all decided to go to sleep. My friend and her boyfriend pulled out the futon in the living room and went to sleep. Me and my boyfriend were lying on the bunk bed where we could look into the side of the cabin where the living room was. We were just talking and then all of a sudden, we started to hear this noise. It started by the living room, but outside and worked its way around the cabin. But the noise would continue to come from everywhere it had already been. It was sort of like wailing. It reminded me of what a banshee might sound like. I was really freaking out and asking my boyfriend what the hell that was. He said it was a ghost crying. I looked out to where the living room was and this thing started to appear, starting at the top and kind of whirlwinding down. My boyfriend saw it and leapt to the bunk bed directly across and was freaking out. I started demanding he go and turn the light on and wouldn't stop until he did. Finally he did and the thing disappeared. My friend woke up and told us things like that always happen out there and we just needed to get used to it. I was really upset she didn't tell me. Neither me or my boyfriend could sleep till it got light outside. Nothing else happened that night, but I have no desire to try my luck again. Since then, I haven't had any encounters with anything that appeared as a shadow. I've seen ghosts that appear like people look, in color, and they don't scare me at all. I'm not sure what the black things are, and I'm not sure I want to know. I do know that as long as I don't think about them, I don't have any problems with them. Oh, I almost forgot. Aklunta is a really creepy place up there. Not the cemetery, but the village, or what's left of it. I only got to spend about 15 minutes out there, but that was more than enough to feel it out. Very bad vibes out there. And as we were leaving, I saw something back in the trees. As soon as I looked at it, it darted behind a tree. It was dark out, so I didn't know what it was, but it didn't look like a person. And when we were driving back to Anchorage, on the outbound side of the highway there was an accident, and this huge bull moose was on the side of the road dead, but none of the vehicles looked like they had hit it. A moose hitting your car would crumple it like a soda can. Well, 
that's all I have for this morning. Maybe sometime I'll go more in depth about my experience in Mano, but not yet. I don't like talking about it when it's dark outside. It all started when I was about five. There was a thunderstorm, and I hate storms, so I went to my parents' room across the hall. After the storm was over, I decided to go back to my room. When I got to the doorway, I saw two figures sitting in two of my chairs. I had a little table and tea set in the middle of my room, and they were just sitting there. One of them was facing me and it looked like a pitch black shadow. The other had its back to me. I wasn't sure if it was real, so I blinked my eyes very tight multiple times. The one whose back was facing me slowly turned around to look at me. It was white, kind of fuzzy looking, like the way your TV looks when it gets all snowy in the TV set, and had two black holes where the eye should be and an outline of the nose and mouth. I think the best way to call it is a static man. I got scared and ran and told my father what I saw. He told me that her grandfather tends to watch over us. He passed away years ago. He even said he saw this dark shadow hovering over his bed one night, although it was pretty dark, so he could barely make out anything. I later found out that an old couple originally lived in the house before my parents bought it in the 70s. The original house is small, two bedrooms, and a kitchen a small living room. It was only one story, and when my parents moved in, they said the old man died. They heard voices a few times, but didn't think anything of it. Then, when me and my brothers were born, they built a basement in second story where the bedrooms are. My bedroom and my parents' bedroom are right above the original part of the house. My room used to be the attic until we built the upstairs. I think the ghosts were my grandfather and the old man, but I keep seeing the same ghost when I go places. I'm never scared though. Also, we've had things fly across the room. Things shatter out of nowhere, hear noises, and I've had experiences where I felt a presence in the room, and then I saw a crease in the couch right next to where I was sitting. I'm not scared though, because I just have a feeling they don't intend on hurting me. It actually makes me feel safer at times. Hi. I've enjoyed your website and wish to share one of my experiences. This is all true, and if you have any comments about ghosts or questions, please feel free to email me, as I'd like to know what it might have been. When I was 12 or so, I had a strange experience. I was playing with my friend in the woods near the Quib and Abduct. This is in Wayland, Massachusetts. We had to take our neighbor's police dog on our adventure, looking for the Indian artifacts. On a hill that was gravely, I found what I believed to be an arrowhead. After showing it to my friend, I stuffed it into my pants pocket and moved to a new spot with the dog. He began to whine towards some bushes about 20 feet away. I looked into the direction the dog was looking and saw nothing. Figuring it was a rabbit or squirrel, I let the dog off his leash. He began barking and ran into the bushes. My friend joined me, and we called the dog back. He came right away, being well trained. He sat looking from us to the woods and panting. We put his leash back on, and both my friend and I had the feeling of being watched. I reached into my pants to see the arrowhead. But it was gone. I checked the other pockets. Nothing. Then we decided to go home. Both of us creeped out. On our way back, the dog stopped at the tree and looked up. And at least 30 feet up, we saw a piece of bloody fur stuck to the tree. We ran back to the neighbors 
and returned the dog, not wanting to get laughed at. We didn't tell him about the fur. My friend got her bike and went halfway to me to my house. When I got in the door, the phone rang. It was my friend. She asked if I was okay. I was fine. I told her. Then she'd explained she'd seen someone lurking in the bushes of the only empty house in my neighborhood, and they seemed to be following me. I dismissed it and ate dinner. That night, a storm came. The thunder and lightning woke me up. During a flash of light, I saw a tall, thin figure at the foot of my bed. I think it was a man. He wore all black, a long, odd jacket, and had very long arms. They reached his knees. On his head was a stovepipe hat that was too high and had a wide brim, so his face was shadowed. As I looked at him too terrified to scream, he raised his arms and pointed at me with the long finger. Another flash of light, and he was gone. In the morning at school before homeroom, I asked my friend to describe the person she had seen the day before in the bushes. She said he was thin and had a weird hat like Lincoln wore. Of course, I was freaked out. I don't know how much later, maybe a month or more, I was doing homework on my bed and heard scuffling in my closet, thinking it was the cat. I opened the door to scoot him out. The cat was not there. But the clothes were swaying side by side. I closed the door and left my room. The next and last time I saw the ghost was at summer camp. I had been put into a room alone, having had a panic attack over an incident in which I had a dream come true. I dreamt a kid got run over by a van, and a storm came in a cabin was hit by lightning, and kids burnt up. That day, we were teamed up and competing for ribbons. One event was a van pull. A team of kids were pulling a van. A kid fell under, and the van went over him. He was unhurt, but the license plate made a dirty mark on his back. I got scared, and then it began raining very hard. Everyone headed to their cabins. It began to lightning, and I lost my mind. I'd confided my dream to my friend that morning, and as she tried to tell the counselor, I was crying and trying to warn the people about the fire I believed to be about to happen. The counselor locked me in her room, alone. A blast of thunder and lightning hit and blew the outside door open. Rain poured in, and in the storm stood my ghost looking in at me. I screamed and slammed the door shut. Luckily, fire never happened. I never saw the ghost again. I often wonder about it, and as scary as it was, it never hurt me. Please note, I know the story sounds far-fetched, but it isn't. This really happened. Hi, Sam here. I've apparently spoke to a ghost when I was two years old. To cut a long story short, I moved to Invicta Road in Charnas, Kent when I was two years old, with my dad. A year or so before we moved in, a lonely pregnant woman lived there and offed herself by hanging. Because of the pregnancy in the back room, no one lived there until my dad and I. I slept in the back bedroom. My dad told me that he would often hear me talking to someone at nights in my room. My dad asked me who I was talking to. I said it was the gray lady who sits at the end of my bed. My dad then met my stepmom and she moved in with us at nights. Sometimes my stepmom and I would sit alone and she'd hear walking around upstairs and things being moved about. It was so bad. One night, that she went over to her parents' house to get them. They brought their dog over. The dog started growling and barking for no reason. My dad moved me out of the back bedroom to another bedroom when I started to get upset and not sleepiness. 
Dreams and anxiety are my main feelings I get. I can't walk through a graveyard without getting anxiety. And I also smell a really musty smell that no one else seems to notice. It's so intoxicating that it makes me feel like I'm suffocating and it makes me feel sick. Sometimes it makes me wonder whether I still have this woman following me. I was recently staying at a youth hostel in Cornwall, England. The manager warned me jovially when I arrived that there were three ghosts in the hostel, all linked to different areas in the building. He added with a mischievous grin that one of them had a particular dislike for the new computer that had been installed and seemed to keep switching it off. He chose to tell me this because the reason I was there was to do some work with that very computer. After an evening of unproductive work on the computer that obviously wasn't working properly, I retired to the small private room I had been given. I dropped off to sleep fairly quickly, but woke up after about an hour feeling cold, the reason for which became clear very quickly. The duvet for my bed was lying in a heap on the floor around my feet. I picked it up and covered myself, but then had trouble getting back to sleep as the couple in the next room were being very noisy. Eventually, they quieted down and I started to relax, but before I managed to fall asleep again, the duvet began to slowly slide down the bed as if pulled from the bottom. I let it move about six inches to see what was happening, then got hold and pulled back. Whatever was pulling gave up with relative ease, and I was soon covered again. At this stage, I can remember that rather than being frightened, I felt as if some silly game was going on, and I was almost giggling about the fact that some impish ghost had chosen me for an adversary in its little game. As a result, after a half hour or so, I had no trouble getting back to sleep. It seemed, however, that I hadn't taken things seriously enough and had managed to cause offense. The next time I woke up, it was with a startle, as the duvet began to quickly slide off the bed, again in the same direction towards my feet. This time, I decided that enough was enough and started to feel very afraid. You know what it's like in the dark at night. A simple duvet can seem to offer so much protection and security, and the potential lack of it made me feel very vulnerable. I think I managed to move about an inch before I found myself suddenly unable to move anymore. I couldn't actually feel any force or weight holding me or pressing down on me, but I was totally unable to move my arms or any part of my upper body except for my head. In fact, it felt like it was suddenly made from lead. I was then greeted by an old man's laugh. I had literally heard a very slow guttural sounding laugh and it sounded far from pleasant. I fought and fought and eventually managed to get my fingers to move slightly. As soon as I achieved this one small movement, everything was fine. The inability to move evaporated quickly and I was left back in full control of my body. I stood right side up, surveying the entire room and what I saw next terrified me. There were a pair of red eyes looking at me by the door for about 30 seconds before fading away. Just then, the door opened and there was a light mist that moved through the door and then evaporated. I screamed I'm not afraid of you and that tonight's rest will be a peaceful night's rest. I pulled the duvet back over myself and surprisingly, only felt any kind of fear for a few minutes and was soon relaxing again. Whatever the game was about, it seems that I had won and that my adversary had admitted defeat fairly gracefully. I slept peacefully well for the remaining few hours of the night and woke up perfectly refreshed in the morning.
Since I was a little girl, my sisters and I have had frightening experiences with spirits. When I was six, my family and I moved to a fairly new house, only eight years old at the time, in West Texas. As far back as I can remember, we had strange things going on in that house. First off at night, if you were to go through the hallway to get to my parents' room, you would always hear what sounded like a TV. You could hear voices and sometimes music. Most of the time, my parents' TV was off. If you left the room and stood in the hallway again, the sounds would be gone. Secondly, when I would try to go to sleep at night, I would always have that classic someone's watching me feeling. I always blamed it on me being a young child. The house was a very scary place to be at night. Wherever you went, someone was watching you. Friends who have spent the night rarely stayed twice. The areas of the house that scared everyone the worst were the hallway to my parents' room and my older sister's closet. The closet always had a feeling of hate radiating from it. I tried to spend a night in there with my scared sister, and it didn't last. I was sleeping on the floor with my head next to the closet, and that just wasn't a good feeling. I went back to my room after she fell asleep. A couple years after we moved in, my younger sister had a frightening experience. Her and I shared a bedroom with our beds parallel to each other, with a nightstand in between us. We were about three feet apart. One night, I woke up to her screaming my name. I woke up and asked what was wrong. She told me that, for no reason at all, she woke up and looked over at my bed. Laying at the foot of my bed was a light blue glowing figure of a woman. Her eyes were gone and her mouth hung open. My sister described her as looking dead. My sister also added that she couldn't see me anywhere on the bed. So she started screaming my name and closed her eyes when she opened them. I was awake, asking her what was wrong. She told me, and I looked down at the foot of my bed, and my huge stuffed animal that I had there every night was sparking like it had really bad static electricity. I took it off my bed and threw it in my bathroom sink and ran water over it. Being young, I thought it would help. Years later, my family and I moved to southern Louisiana and moved into a gated subdivision. One night, my two sisters were mad at me and left the house to go on a walk. I followed them without them knowing. I followed them up to the front gate of the subdivision and talked to them for a minute. They quickly left in a huff, being that they were still angry with me. For what, I don't remember now. I stayed by the gate for a couple of minutes afterwards and then decided to run to the end of the main street and hide behind some bushes that faced the gate. I waited for my sisters to walk by and when they did, Unaware where I was hiding, stopped remotely in front of the bushes. I heard a younger sister say, What is Jenny, me, doing, sitting on top of that stop sign? The stop sign is located next to the gate. After that, they walked on. I was a bit confused and was about to chase after them. But then, through the leaves... I saw a shadow of someone running past the bushes I was behind. I could also hear the sound of footsteps. I stood up quickly to see who was there. No one was in sight. After this, I ran to my sisters and told them what I had seen. They then told me that they saw me, or what looked like me, sitting on top of the stop sign. They said I had a very angry, disfiguring grin. After we traded stories, we ran home quickly. Later, my younger sister told me that the ghost she saw in my bed and the ghost she saw in the sign both looked exactly like me. It all began around the 1st of June this very year. 
The incident took place in my grandmother and grandfather's home. My grandfather had been diagnosed with cancer. In the summer of 1998, I didn't know that, that those last few months would be the last time I would ever see him alive. During that period of time, I had spent a whole lot of time with my grandparents, and it felt like I had actually gotten a little closer to them both, but particularly my grandfather. At the end of the summer, I left and went back home. Subsequently, about five months later, our family received a disturbing phone call. It was from my grandmother, informing us about the passing of our grandfather. He had passed away in the hospital, which was the very last place that our grandfather lived in before his passing. A month and a half after we had been staying there, I noticed that something just didn't feel right. The whole atmosphere had changed. I decided to take the guest room. For some reason, I always got the feeling that I was being watched in the guest room. Then, other little occurrences started to evolve. The very first was, I always felt like somebody was standing over my shoulder. I started to notice scars on my back after I would awake in the mornings. I would feel like touches on my back. My mom and brother both complained about the door handles being rattling and opening and closing really fast. Cabinet doors would fly open and the pots and pans would all fall out. My hair would get pulled in the night. Diminutive objects would fall from midair, such as paper, hair clips, and coins, and I would hear voices, one of which said wake up very loudly in my ear. I would see mists and rays of light shoot past me extremely fast. So fast, in fact I would hear a whoosh of air. I would notice some of my belongings missing, such as my CDs, jewelry, money to name a few, usually belongings that I would use around the house. I would feel my bed move, as if someone were to bump into it during the night, flickering lights, and last, but certainly not least, since animals can sometimes see things humans cannot see, my cat would turn her head really fast and just stare at something, which I would not be able to see for a significant amount of time. A little while later, about a month after being there, I saw the unthinkable. After I'd been sound asleep for about seven hours or so, I woke up suddenly to a spirit at the foot of my bed and it was my grandfather. I could not believe what I was seeing, but I will describe this to you in full detail. There was no doubt in my mind that this was actually a spirit. He was shadowy like, but his clothing was colored. He would always wave at me, and sure enough, he was waving my direction with a smile on his face. It was plain to see that he was trying to get my attention. He just wanted to see me. I was too afraid to move a muscle in fear that in spite of everything else that he would approach me. I'd never seen anything like this before in my entire life. I didn't want to tell this to anyone though. I thought that maybe nobody would believe me or listen. About a week later I was in the kitchen with my mom and she told me that the guest room was where our grandpa had stayed in before he died because he was too ill. That explains the reason why that very room felt like the most eerie room in the house. I almost fainted when I discovered that, but I knew that a spirit can travel anywhere in the home, even outside or in back of the house. But it wasn't until a month later that I decided to come out with the news. I first confided in my mom and my brother, and my mother believed me, because she said that before I brought up anything that I had said. Our grandmother had experienced the exact same thing, that he was at the foot of the bed watching over her and smiling. I had a phone conversation with her and I let her do all the talking first and everything that she told me measured up with my experience and it only happened to my grandmother and I, whom he was the closest with before he passed away. Everyone was wondering why I didn't scream or attempt to run out of the guest room as soon as I saw him, but I was too afraid. Whenever you're that close to something like that, 
It just takes your breath away completely. I was in my own little calm. It felt very uncomfortable. It wasn't until I started sleeping on the living room sofa that I felt appeased. Albeit, this has not been my first experience. Ever since the age of five, my family and I started traveling around a lot, and we would move here and there. I've went to nine different schools total. I'm 17 now. In previous homes, I've experienced a whole lot. I lived in a haunted house for a total of three years. Not only by all of the experiences that I've endured, I've been doing many researches involving the paranormal. I'm really good at picking up on things too, which I've found out. There was this one house that we went into that we were thinking about purchasing, but I felt like something was wrong. There were several rooms in the home that I could just not stop venturing off into. The main ones were the master bedroom and the study. After I left the house, I told my parents that someone from the house must have passed away. So my mom went to go look up the history of the house. And sure enough, the owner and his wife on a trip to California got killed in a car wreck. And they lived in the master bedroom and the owner spent most of his time in the study. After I was enlightened with that information, I was in disbelief. I still am to this day too. My mom told me that it goes back to her being Jewish and Indian. She said that she can pick up on and see things too. She claims that it's an Indian thing, but I don't know, maybe it is. Anyways, God bless everyone and thank you for your time. Great website, by the way. I'm a current visitor. When I was in high school, my family lived in a rented farmhouse in the country. I was 17 and dating a very nice gentleman who had come to visit me for the evening. My mother worked nights and usually got home around 11 p.m. or so. My boyfriend and I were sitting on the floor in the living room leaned up against the couch watching TV when the kitchen door opened and the light came on. We both heard a thump like my mother had put her purse on the table and then the bathroom door opened and closed. We both thought that was odd because usually my mother would not have turned on the light because my dad is a light sleeper and the light would have woke him up and my mother would have at least said hi to us anyway. My boyfriend noticed that it was getting late and he needed to get home. We had expected snow and he didn't want to be caught in a storm. I got his coat and we walked to the door together and stood on the back porch watching the snowfall. As my mother pulled in, my boyfriend made us both wait on the porch as he searched the house from one end to the other. No one was in there other than my sister upstairs asleep, and my dad, who was sound asleep in the back bedroom. Many other things happened there. One night, me and my boyfriend decided to play the Ouija board to summon the spirit that was residing in the house. I remember it was a blizzard that day, and my entire family except for me were in another state visiting my extended family. We were asking questions about the spirit, at first we asked its name. Nothing happened. Then we asked if we were bothering him. Still nothing. After nearly 20 minutes of continuously trying to get in touch with someone, my boyfriend angrily grabbed the planchet and Ouija board and threw it out of the window. He said he had enough of this make-believe and that he was really starting to get tested. I told him he shouldn't have done that, that he could really upset whatever was living in the house. My boyfriend mockingly says, Sure, why doesn't this stupid spirit just possess me if it even exists? Make some real noise. My boyfriend gets frustrated and ends up sleeping on the couch because he was tired of playing games. Later that night, around 3 a.m., I was awakened in the middle of the night to hear my telephone landline ringing. The only problem was, there was no landline telephone here. We all had our cell phones 
and they were on silent. Seconds later, I hear loud pounding on the door to my bedroom, and it's slightly opened. I yell out to my boyfriend, but there was no answer. I hear the phone ringing again, but I couldn't locate the sound. Then, everything fell silent. Not a second later, I hear a gargling noise coming from the living room, mixed with prayer. It was coming from my boyfriend's mouth. He was violently whispering in his sleep. What really got me though, is I went to see my boyfriend on the couch. There was this very dark cloud floating above him for a few seconds. It disappeared. And then I heard my boyfriend choking, so I ran towards him. He was literally pale in the face, almost as if he stopped breathing. That's when I realized he did seem to stop breathing. I frantically shaked him, yelling at him to wake up. I started getting scared, and I cried. This time, my phone went off, and someone was on the other line. All I heard was what sounded like a low voice saying call, and the phone call disconnected. This was on my cell phone. I then called the paramedics. They arrived. Paramedics were in my house, checking my boyfriend's pulse. That's when he wakes up, delirious, but confused. He asks me what's going on. After talking with the paramedics and my boyfriend, they were convinced that he had a panic attack in his sleep, and they ended up leaving. But he told me something very scary. He said that while he was asleep, he had this odd dream that someone was trying to get him to go to the afterlife with them. There was this hooded figure who said nothing to him. He was just motioning towards the sky, and then all of a sudden, he was in a cemetery and saw himself in a coffin dead. I told him, this all makes sense because you threaten the spirits. This is 100% true, and all I have is my word, but believe me, these events happened. I can't explain the mysterious phone call. I'm sure that my boyfriend challenged the spirits to make some noise because it certainly made some noise. And this is an incident that happened to me in the Pacific Northwest, Seattle, Washington state area long ago in the 1960s. As a young teenager, I was very impressionable. My parents were never active in my life and I always wanted to feel like I belonged to a group. It didn't matter who gave me the attention just as long as I got it from somebody. Feeling neglected, I ended up running away from home at the age of 19 so I could join a satanic cult. The cult was pretty serious. We would often meet up at this secluded building in the middle of the woods that was abandoned at night to gather around in circles, drawing pentagrams, and praying to evil. We did a lot of drugs and even sacrificed animals as part of our ritual. We would decapitate squirrels and place them inside the pentagram. In other times, we would cut ourselves and write our names on the walls with our blood. It was definitely not a good environment for me to say the least, but at the time, I was thinking of how much of a bond we all had together, the five of us. The building itself actually felt very haunted, but because I was a stone out of my mind, I wasn't sure if those hallucinations or legitimate spirit haunting this old building. I remember one night, we were injecting each other with needles, and we ended up passing out for a few hours. As I started to regain consciousness, everyone else was completely out, and I swear I saw the presence of an old man in a brown cloak, hood on with white eyes that glowed in the darkness of this building. He was there for about 30 seconds, then vanished. He was watching me from the stairs inside the building. We were all in the living room at the time, and there from the living room, you can see the stairs in front of you. The people I was with would sometimes hear voices, evil whispers and laughter so subtle, but quiet enough to hear. 
I vividly remember another night where we held our bloodied hands together after sacrificing a deer. I could have sworn after three minutes of chanting the devil as our leader, we heard the door from the upstairs of the building open and slam twice. We kept going, and I remember one of us blurted out, if the devil is here, please show yourself. Nothing happened, and we ended up doing drugs again and passed out. The next time, all four of us were awakened to one of the cult members convulsing and choking. I was very alarmed by this, panicked, and told the rest of them that we needed help. All of them angrily told me no, leave him be. I yelled at them to help him, that he needed medical help and he would die, and two of the cult members proceeded to tackle me and pin me down to the ground to prevent me from doing so. They told me that this is what our Lord wanted to happen, that this was natural, and if he loses his life, the devil will want a new companion. What happened next is something that will always haunt me. I watched this guy die in front of my face, and not one single person gave a crap, except me. They kept trying to tell me that it was natural, that this was supposed to happen. The next thing I knew, the three of them were tying me up to keep me from escaping. They told me that I wasn't a worthy member of this cult, and because of my reaction, they couldn't trust me. I told them that I was definitely worthy, that I wouldn't tell a soul, but it was like my words were being ignored. One of the member turns to the other and tells them, we'll keep him here for the entire night and figure out what to do with him in the morning. So, they ended up tying me up and leaving me alone for the rest of the night at this old abandoned building that looked like an asylum. They had left for the night. They ended up drugging me and I passed out until I ended up awakening. As I awoke, I was still reeling from the shock of everything that happened. I actually gagged a couple of times. They didn't even move the body. I was tied up in the hallway, and I was forced to look across at the body that was still there. The man's eyes were bulging open, wide, and lifeless. Now here's where the paranormal part kicks in. After a few minutes of being awake, I look across to where the body was, and I could see a group of hooded figures in a circle around the body cloaked apparitions. I blinked a few times, and they were gone. Was I hallucinating from the drugs? I'm not sure, but it gave me yet another thing to be afraid of. Anyway, not long after that, and I don't even know how this happened, but as I was trying to free myself from the rope that had my hands tied up against the banister of the stairs, I managed to somehow free myself. But that's when I heard voices getting closer to the building. It was the rest of the cult, and they were coming back. At this point, the sun was starting to rise, but it was still dark, so I did my best to flee, and I left out the window in the main room and ended up running through the woods. I just bolted and ran as fast as I could. I had never ran so fast before in my life. It must have been from the adrenaline. Eventually, I was able to pass through the woods until I ended up on the main road when I saw an auto dealership. I ran into the dealership, told the workers to call the cops, that I was abducted, and that there was a group of terrible people who let a man die at the abandoned building a few miles into the woods. They called the cops, and they eventually ran out to the building. The body was still there, and the group was arrested. They ended up going to jail for 15 years. The building itself was torn down not too long after, and I've never actually been back to the spot. I don't know why I would anyway. I ended up having PTSD for years after this incident, terrible trust issues, but after years of therapy, I ended up rehabilitating myself. This happened in the 1960s. I guess the reason why I wanted to write this story was to warn you that you should never be desperate enough to join a group of people 
who do terrible things. Never openly trust people without evidence that they are worth it. And of course, never join a satanic worshipping cult. I made my mistake and almost paid for it with my life. Nowadays, I have two kids and I tell them this story to remind them that there are bad people out there, but also that there are spirits that can be summoned and they can be very evil. Stay away from all of that. It's not a good lifestyle. What I'm about to tell you happened during the summer of 2015. The incident was at a Mayan jungle, two hours away from Cancun, Mexico. My friend John was moving for work and decided to drive a thousand miles from his home in Mexico City to Cancun. To an adventurous girl like me, it rang in my ears as a fascinating road trip. I offered to go with him as he'd be going through some of Mexico's most economic and breathtaking sights. In Cancun, with its beautiful coastline covered in powdery white sand and deep turquoise blue waters, was not only worth a thousand mile drive, but would be the perfect destination to complete my vacation before flying back home to California. Cancun is situated in the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico's southeast. The peninsula is a region covered in deep rainforest and jungles where the mines once erected their great empire. The first leg of the trip was as expected. Great sights, great food, great places, great music, great people. However, the rain and terrain soon started changing as we started going deeper into the jungle. Roads were less illuminated, towns and villages scarier. We had enjoyed the road so much, the next leg of the trip was going to be non-stop all the way to Cancun. The night hit us as we drove through one of the deepest parts of the jungle. The road started narrowing until it became a two-lane road, with the only light coming from the full moon ahead of us, and the dim headlights from the mid-90s hatchback John was driving. He estimated we would be in Cancun in about two hours. It was 2 a.m., and the moonlight could let you appreciate the thick vegetation on each side of the road. John was telling me some more folklore about the region and legends about the Mayans that once lived in the region, when suddenly, the car started slowing down. John would press on the gas, but the car would struggle to go. Shortly, the oil indicator lit up. Something was wrong, but to our relief, we saw lights up ahead and what seemed to be toll booths. We decided we would park by the booths and call roadside assistance. Our relief was short-lived when we realized the toll booths were under construction and they weren't functioning. There was nobody on duty, so we decided to keep going, but about 25 yards past the booths, the car completely stalled. Luckily. The road was well illuminated from the booths on, and the car stalled right next to a light pole. John gets out of the car to see what was going on. It was leaking a lot of oil. He calls roadside assistance to no avail due to bad signal. He decides to try to fix the car. He goes to the trunk, gets some tools and a bottle of oil, and gets to work. After many attempts, the car wouldn't start, so John decides to call roadside assistance and finally gets through. Unfortunately, they tell him it would take three hours to reach us. I told John we were less than two hours from Cancun. Isn't there anything they can do? He put his tools away and gets back in the car and tells me there's nothing we can do but wait to get some sleep and wait for roadside assistance. He then reclines his seat and goes to sleep. I get out of the car instead and start looking at the road, the vegetation, admire nature. A few minutes went by, something caught the corner of my eye. I look back at the booths and I can see the silhouette of a man peeking from one of them. 
I call John, but he doesn't respond. I look at him, and he is fast asleep. I look back at the booths, and the man leap from one booth to the other. I yell at John that there is a man at the booths. He wakes up and tells me not to talk nonsense. At this point, the man leaped from the last booth and stood in the middle of the road, dressed in a khaki long sleeve shirt and khaki pants. Pretty normal, but there was something weird about him. His stance was abnormal, arms wide open, but lowered with hands open, and that, when I felt a cold shiver down my spine, when I noticed his arms and fingers were too long for his body. I insist on John, and he decides to get out of the car and sees the man standing back there. He looks at me, then at the man again, and yells at him, hey. The man shook his shoulders, put his arms forward like a sleepwalker would, and started walking towards us slowly. John and I looked at each other in disbelief and asked me what's up with this dude. We turned back to the man, and he was now about 10 yards away. I could really see him now. He was of heavy build, about 6 feet tall, short black hair, light brown skin, but I couldn't see his face. It was like an empty space. As he drew closer, we saw in horror that he had no face, just flat plain skin with no nose, no eyes, no forehead. Nothing. At about five yards, he stopped with his arms still forward like a zombie. He had long arms and bony hands with long fingers. The area was well illuminated that we could see him clearly, that there was no mask, and we were no doubt in front of something paranormal or otherworldly. The faceless man tilted his head side to side, and that's when panic set in. I rushed into the car and told John to get in and let's go. He was in shock and took all my screaming to get him back. He rushes close to the hood of the car and I can see the faceless man walking towards us again. John was getting back in the car when I noticed the oil lamp on the car's hood and yelled at him to put it on. He pops the hood of the car and puts it on. The faceless man had taken two long steps it was now five feet from when John was rushing back in the car. He turned the engine to no avail. I could see the torso of the faceless man through the driver's side rear window. I was totally panicking. Then the car finally started, and we took off as fast as the car could. We look ahead at the road, and we hear what sounded like a hit on the rear bumper. I screamed at John that he is probably hanging off the bumper. John, short of breath, tells me he doesn't think so, as he would feel the weight on the car, and that I might have to get back to the back seat to check. I was about to, when I looked back, and see the faceless man standing back there in the middle of the road, fading with the distance as we speed away. In a couple very long hours of shock and silence, we reach Cancun city limits. We stopped at the gas station to collect ourselves had no face. John would repeat this over and over for a while. When we were calm and rested enough to keep going, John turns the car engine and the car does not turn on. We look at each other with horror, but then remembered we were safe away from the scene and we smiled slightly in relief. I want to express that we did not see Slenderman. That's an internet creepypasta. The body of the man was like a normal heavy built guy, just long arms with bony hands. He even had hair. This experience changed my view about risks and scary parts of being an adventurer, but I will continue to have adventures in the deserts, forests, and jungles of the world. I just hope I don't ever run into the faceless man again. I was reading through several stories today on your website, and one in particular sparked a memory of an experience I had 
when I was eight months pregnant with my daughter. I may not have shared this story with you once before, but I don't remember. I remember that night just like it was yesterday. An evening in early 1994, my husband and I were watching TV on the couch when I decided to go to bed. I blew out a candle I had burning on the kitchen table and then headed to the bedroom. It wasn't too long after I crawled into bed that it was abruptly taken over by this unseen force sitting on my belly. My daughter began to move very violently and I felt like I couldn't breathe. I looked out my bedroom door and could see this flickering light coming from the living room. I figured my husband fell asleep on the couch and forgot to turn off the halogen floor lamp we had sitting behind it. I began to scream as loud as I could for him, but nothing came out of my mouth. The harder I tried to scream for help, the harder the unseen force seemed to push down on me. I began to pray. I prayed like crazy, asking Jesus to protect me and my unborn child. I kept looking out the bedroom door, seeing that flickering light, and hoping to see my husband come running in, but he never came. The whole incident lasted for what seemed like forever, but when it was over, it was over, just like that. There was no more pain. I could breathe, and my daughter was at peace. That's not the end of the story, though. I got up from the bed and headed to the living room to tell my husband what had happened. No sooner than I left the bedroom, of course, I found him sleeping soundly on the couch. But the halogen light behind it wasn't on. The flickering light I kept seeing throughout the ordeal was the candle on the kitchen table. As I explained in the beginning, I blew this candle out before I went to bed, and I know I did because I have always been very cautious about burning candles. The candle had somehow rekindled itself and burned all the way down to the wick. Apparently, the glass votive had gotten so hot that it broke and sent flames from the wick onto the table and placemats. The entire top of the table was on fire, placemats and all. I started screaming at my husband to wake up. He jumped off the couch to find me trying to smother the flames out with a kitchen towel. The apartment started to quickly fill up with black smoke. He grabbed the fire extinguisher and put the fire out. After it was all said and done, we talked about what had just happened trying to make some sense of it all. I was certain the unseen force was trying to kill me and my baby. I thought it was holding me down so that when the fire spread through the apartment I would die from smoke inhalation or worse, burn to death. My husband thought that whatever it was, it was trying to warn me. That it was trying to wake me up so that I would discover the fire, but I swear I was not asleep. At some point I thought maybe it was all just a bad dream, but then it dawned on me. If it was just a dream, how was I able to see the flickering lights coming from the living room, which turned to be flames? What I do know is, had I not gotten up when I did, it wouldn't have been long before the whole apartment would have been filled with smoke and fire and we all would have perished. Guardian angel or evil spirit? I guess I will never know. These particular experiences occurred when I was around 8 or 9 years old and it happened to be my first encounter with the paranormal. I grew up in a very religious household and my parents were strict disciplinarians. Unfortunately, I was subjected to a lot of physical abuse at the hand of my stepmother. My biological mother died when I was only three months old and my father remarried a little while after. She was an absolute witch to me 
and to this day, I don't know why my dad even found her to be remotely compatible. She would call me a filthy animal, because I wasn't praying enough at times. The first experience I had with the paranormal was also toward the end of my dad's relationship with this woman. I can remember a moment I was crying because my dad had been working construction all night and didn't come home until late night. I'll never forget how she spat in my face, told me that real ladies don't cry about daddy working late nights. I told her specifically that I really wanted daddy, and she told me if I didn't calm down, she was going to throw me into the pantry closet and lock the door which was this huge empty space that could fit two adult-sized humans in. Naturally, as an eight-year-old kid, I revolted. She kept her word and threw me in there for an hour. This is where something creepily paranormal happened. After about 20 minutes in, I could hear a faint whispering of a female lady in my ear. I couldn't make it out, but I'll never forget what it sounded like. It was very soothing, and I felt very comforted. I then felt a breath on the back of my neck, and two cold hands touched my shoulder. The pantry closet got a lot cooler all of a sudden, and in my mind, all I was thinking about was the sound I heard from this voice. I ended up curling up on the floor of the pantry and started drifting off to sleep. As my eyes began to feel heavy, I squinted with limited visibility. I turned my head to the opposite side of the dark pantry when I saw a pair of glowing green eyes in the mouth of someone. The crazy thing was, whatever this thing was, it had razor sharp teeth, as if they were fangs. I could only see their eyes, and it almost looked like it was slowly opening its mouth as if it were going to devour me whole. I closed my eyes completely for a few seconds, opened them up again, and it was gone. I'm not sure what the second presence was, but it didn't seem very friendly at all. As for the female voice and the touching, I truly believe that it was my biological mother comforting me through tough times. Well, anyway, I remember I ended up staying in the closet for longer than I was supposed to, and when my dad came home, he had a talk with my stepmother. Thankfully, my dad saw through her lies, and he broke up with her not too long after this incident happened. From that day on, the pantry closet had a reputation for creepy ghostly activity. The door would randomly open slowly and shut at times. If there were items on the shelves, such as cans, they would sometimes fall on the ground. My dad told me one of the scariest things happened to him after he got home from work. It was another late night working. My sister, my brother, and my grandmother were all asleep at the time. My grandma had moved in shortly after my dad broke up with my stepmother to help take care of us. Right across from the pantry closet was the kitchen. My dad comes home and he ends up going into the kitchen to decompress for a moment after a hard day's work. Right then, the pantry closet opened slowly. And that's when he saw something. He swears to this day that thing he saw looked 100% real and he was not hallucinating. Standing in the pantry was a faceless man in a red tuxedo with horns on his head. My dad froze with fear, blinked his eyes twice, and the figure was gone. Later that night, he actually fell asleep and had a dream that he went to hell and saw his ex, former stepmother. The creepy thing is, the faceless man that he saw in the pantry was holding hands with my stepmom. My stepmom had cuts all over her face. I remember he woke up screaming and never saw the figure ever again in the pantry or had a dream about my stepmother either. Another experience. My stepmother, sister, brother, grandma, and I all slept in one room, different beds of course. It was a normal night and I just fell asleep as usual, hours later. 
I woke up for no reason and saw a person sitting in my grandmother's bed. I thought it was just my grandma praying since she would always pray, but then I started to realize that my grandma was sleeping and this person looked a bit younger. I just stared at whatever that thing was and noticed it was looking right back at me. This wasn't my mom because it looked like an entirely different woman. I've seen pictures of my mom and she was a ginger and had beautiful thick long hair. This figure I saw was bald headed and looked very distraught. After she looked at me she looked back at her hands and covered them with her face. I know for a fact that it was a woman because she had feminine features in her face. You could see it clearly in the body of a woman. Not only was she bald headed but her face was burned and disfigured. All I did was stare at her. Then, after all that, she suddenly got up, turned away from me and disappeared. Eventually I fell asleep again. I woke up the next morning and asked everybody if they were in the room last night. Then I asked my grandma if she had been praying that night. Everybody including my grandma said no. That was the first time I ever saw that lady, but from that day on, almost all my relatives that lived in that house have seen the very same woman I have. Only difference, they have been scared. Me on the other hand, though I was slightly afraid, I had a curiosity about this whole experience. I attended Harding University in Searcy, Arkansas not too long ago. During my senior year, I stayed a few months in a private dorm in the Patty Cobb Girl dormitories. Many people say that various parts of Harding campus are haunted by the ghost of Gertie, a girl who died by falling from a bell tower on campus back in the early 1900s. She has been known to haunt the old music building, the brick pathway that cuts across campus, and the bell tower, which has since been detached and placed on campus as a landmark. One other thing she is said to haunt happens to be the Patty Cobb dormitories. There is debate as to whether or not it's Gertie or a different ghost entirely, but either way, one thing is for certain. Patty Cobb is haunted. I'd heard about this prior to moving into the Patty Cobb dorms, but I was told a different story about how she only haunts the first floor dorms. I was given a dorm on the third floor. It was a private dorm that had no connecting suites to it. I had my own private bathroom and the room was not shared with a roommate. At first I was thrilled with not having to share a bathroom with anyone. Then I started having strange feelings at night. I would find that I would hear noises in the hallway at times. Of course, being a dorm, I passed it off as silly girls wandering the hallways at night. No biggie. But then I started having strange feelings in my room. There were times I would feel as though someone was sitting at the edge of my bed. Sometimes I felt as though someone was standing there staring at me. The doorknob would also jiggle at various points during the night. I normally tried to ignore it, thinking maybe it was an RA doing nightly dorm checks. The university has a strict curfew. But there would be times that it would happen at 3 in the morning, when any sane person would already be out of the hallways and in bed. The few times I opened the door upon hearing it jiggling, there would be nobody in the hallway. The most memorable experience I've ever had was in the middle of the night. I was soundly sleeping when all of a sudden I was awoken by a knock on my door. It scared me so much because it was a very authoritative and loud knock as if someone was trying to break into my room. I looked inside the keyhole and I see this old man standing in a security outfit outside of the door. The man looked oddly out of place. The outfit looked Victorian. I wasn't dressed, so I told him just a minute. After about three minutes, I opened the door and the security person was gone. I looked down the hallway at the other end and see a dark shadow floating down the hallway. 
I never saw that man again. Eventually, I moved out of that room and moved in with a girl a few doors down. While I still could hear the occasional freaky noises in the hallway at morning hours, the feeling of something being in the room and the doorknob jiggling seized in my new room. I found out later from an older friend of mine, however, that she had lived in the exact same dorm room that I had scary issues in. A few years earlier, she and a friend of hers were sitting around talking. She was sitting at her front desk and felt someone strangle her. She felt a pressure on her neck and even started choking. She turned around to see her friend staring at her with wide eyes. What happened, she asked. I just saw a pair of see-through hands behind you, her friend replied. To this day, she swears up and down that Gertie choked her in her dorm room, the exact dorm room that I had so many freaky encounters in, and people wonder why I get so paranoid being alone in the house at night. Earlier this night, I was rehashing past visits to a cemetery in my hometown in Nucatuck, Connecticut, called Guntown when I remembered a visit to Iowa when I was 17. So, back in 2000, I went to visit a friend and spent only a few days there. My friend, having been the 13 stairs, I just recently found out its real name, Pleasant Ridge, many times told me about it, and we decided to make a trip of it. There were four of us in total, three teens and an adult. My friend told me the story is about bodies being buried in the steps, about the graves being mostly young children, about possible Satanist activities, and the like, before we arrived, so I was prepared. We left a little after 11.30pm, arrived there shortly after midnight without any problems finding it. I think there was a gate, but it was open. We parked a few feet from the steps of the car facing them. The moon was out, but it was still fairly dark, so we brought flashlights. We went to check it out only to look around some and take some photographs. It was around winter, so it was cold and windy. We were the only ones there, no other cars in sight at least. We made our way up the stairs and into the cemetery. It was eerie. I kept getting those deep chills up and down my spine. They kind of make your body jerk in a definite feeling of being watched. I know my friends complain of the same and wanted to leave minutes after arriving. One claimed to have heard their name being called and being touched, like someone was tugging on their clothing and seeing shadows move around the tombstones. I didn't experience any of that myself, but I was weirded out all the same. We walked around a bit not too far from the stairs themselves, and took some photos of the graves. After about 30 minutes, and it being well after midnight, the others were ready to leave. This is where the freaky thing happened. To our knowledge, we were the only ones there. There weren't any other cars visible, nor people. After having a somewhat disappointing time, in my opinion, we made our way down the steps and towards the car. We had the flashlight on by then and lighting our way when my friend saw something black on the ground. We rushed back to the car and turned the headlights on and right at the bottom of the steps in the parking lot was a huge pentacle traced out in what looked like black paint. Look, I'm not crazy. I know it wasn't there before we climbed the steps. The car was parked so the headlights would light up the bottom of the steps so we could see them. There was nothing on the ground beforehand. By then, my friends were screaming and crying and pulling me into the car. I snapped a photo or two and then we sped off. I do recall the car stalling once before we left. I waited until I got back home to develop the film, only to find that there was nothing at all on the roll. It was a roll of 24, all of which were of the cemetery 
and the role was completely blank. That irked me. The pinnacle thing was crazy. We weren't drunk or high or anything stupid like that, and I know the four of us couldn't have imagined it, and it definitely was not there when we first arrived. I'm not saying Ghost did it either. For all I know, there could have been some kids there already and decided to mess with us. I heard it gets vandalized a lot. It's just what we experienced that night, and my friends who are from that area were horrified for a few days about what happened and mentioned some rubbish about going to hell. It's a little hard to believe, and I wouldn't have either if I wasn't there, but I thought it was interesting and felt like sharing. I'd love to go back one day. I'm not sure if this is a haunting or anything. More of a strange happening at a haunted place. Anyway, thanks for listening. I wonder if anyone else ever experienced that. I thought it was strange. I have a sister Janet who's dealt with paranormal experiences over her life. She sent this site to me via email. I in return thought that I would share my feelings and some of my encounters with you. Some of the stories I read from your site were very convincing, while others sounded a bit like a hoax. Although my experiences would sound like the latter to many people, I swear that I believe that all I've seen to be true, although inexplainable. As many of your stories, my experiences also started in childhood. Mine, I believe, may be a result of troubled years, reflecting child abuse and fears of daily trials. Perhaps my apparitions were given a portal because of the fears. I remember as far back as my early adolescence, living in a house that sent a chill in me and fear to go to the upstairs alone. Now, my very human predator used to always stalk me in the long narrow hallway around the wall from the stairway, which accounts for some of the fear. However, this person was not always present in my home. The feeling was always there. I remember at night I slept in an antique frame bed handed down through the family. I would lay very still, and that bed would shake like it had a vibrator attached. I heard sounds and footsteps. Once when I was a teenager, I was alone in the house. I wanted to wear a jacket that was stored in the third floor attic closet. I went up to the enclosed stairway to the top, thinking of nothing but retrieving my jacket. When I stepped onto the floor, an old wind-up antique Victoria record player started playing a very creepy song called Fernando's Hideaway. I've hated that song since I was a baby, and my brothers would play it to frighten me and make me cry. I ran out of my house frightened by the song in about 10 blocks to my best friend's house. When I got there, her mother, known as the Gypsy Lady, was having a seance in her kitchen. The table these people were standing around rose off the floor just about an inch. I bolted from there too. To this point, most of my experiences were sound and physical experiences. I had not seen any apparitions. During my second marriage in my late 20s, my husband and I bought an old log cabin, which was hand-built with logs and stone from land it stood on many years earlier. It was beside the Chilisee Creek on old Indian grounds. This is where I began to see apparitions, both frightening experiences and enlightening experiences. Many things occurred, an unseen force put a large dent in a metal cabinet in the laundry room, right before my eyes. My little three-year-old stepdaughter would not stay in her bed. She would crawl under the bed to sleep or hide in a closet. One night, I found her under clothes in a laundry basket in the laundry, just outside of her bedroom. The area of the house seemed to be the most affected. It was here that one afternoon while putting clothes into her washer that I felt a cold hand on my shoulder. I was alone in the house at the time. When I looked behind me, I saw a black hooded robed figure 
I do not remember a face, nor do I remember this figure being much taller than me, at 5 foot 4 height. I do remember getting very scared. I looked away, and then it was gone. A small bathroom was also off this room. I recall once while taking a morning shower, hearing animal growling and scratching at the bathroom door. These sounds disappeared when I began reciting the 23rd Palm. One night while I was sick with the flu and spending the night on the sofa, I remember awakening to an apparition copycat that looked exactly like my husband in his pajamas in the bedroom doorway, but he was transparent. This also disappeared after a brief encounter. Our life together in this house was rocky and I thought perhaps I was losing my mind. I didn't do drugs, and only drank socially. Everything that was happening was very real. One final memory I believe I have, which was as a result of my depression which I was falling into, I'd come to a point that I did not want to leave the house. I also knew in my heart that my husband was having an affair. One night after contemplating ending my life, I sought God through deep prayer and called the 700 Club to ask for the prayer line to pray for me. The same night while I lay in bed alone in my dark room, a light started to shine in the corner across from my bed. It grew brighter, and it was in the form of a bright light bulb that floated across the room and hovered at my bedside. I was not frightened and reached up to investigate. I felt a hand from out of the light take my hand and I heard a mental message saying that everything would be okay. The light then just went away. I was left feeling cleansed, happy, and pure as if touched by God himself. I wanted to tell the world that life goes on. I couldn't utter swear words and put down my cigarettes. The cleansing phenomenon unfortunately was temporary and I slid back into my old ways after a few weeks. The divorce occurred, we moved out of the house and my life went on. The okay part came a few years later when I became a mother of my own child for the first time. I went to school and became a registered nurse. I fell in love with the man that I am now married to. That was the last apparition I have seen, until my nursing career took me into some old nursing homes. I tend to always work the night shift, it fits into my lifestyle. One night, while working in a home in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, I saw a strange occurrence. A helium birthday balloon floated out of the residence room traveled down the center of a long corridor as if being held in the hand of a child. It bounced along, hitting the ceiling at times and floating down, but in a straight line, and moved down that hallway. The balloon took a turn at another residence room and went inside. This resident started screaming to get that out of her room. By the way, it was her birthday. The same nursing home was the place of violence, murder, and unfortunate dread. I have other stories, but this is enough for now. The Willard P. Hall Mansion on Hall Street in St. Joseph, Missouri is haunted. Willard P. Hall was the Lieutenant Governor of Missouri during the last part of the Civil War. When the governor died, Willard assumed the office of governor. With the Civil War raging, he moved the state house from Jefferson City to St. Joseph. I don't know why he did that, because St. Joseph was pretty well known to favor the South. After the mansion was used as a residence, it became a rectory for priests who served the St. Peter's and Paul Catholic Church parish next door. As parishes were closed in the Diocese of Kansas City, St. Joseph, one priest took over the St. Peter and Paul Church and the Immaculate Conception Church, a church immediately west, about three-quarter mile away. 
the pastor leased out the first floor of the house at that time to United Cerebral Palsy and allowed me to live upstairs to oversee the property so it would not be vandalized. Most of the walls throughout the house were solid brick and stone construction, yet sounds of large rats could be heard scrambling within those walls. The light switches in the old servants' quarters upstairs, where I lived, were not up and down switches, but to be rotated in a circular manner. Those switches were observed rotating, on their own, turning the lights on and off. Dark shadows frequently covered doorways, eliminating all light outside those particular rooms. Once, when that happened, a loud scream, like that of a wild cat, lion or tiger, could be heard, and it was ear-shattering. The room on the southwest corner upstairs that was my bedroom became so cold that ice actually formed thick in the corners of the room and the walls were frosty. Sounds of music, like a very soft harp, was heard on occasion by a number of people. One parish council meeting stopped suddenly when one of the councilwomen, who was wearing a shoulderless summer dress, felt an icy hand placed upon her shoulder, and no one was behind her. And finally, many times, when it was very late at night or very early morning, one could hear footsteps throughout the house, followed by a conversation that always turned into an argument, and then it was followed by the soft crying of a woman. The basement of the mansion appears to have been used by either slaves or prisoners, and there's a rumor that there's a cave entrance hidden somewhere in the basement that leads down to the Missouri River, a distance of about a mile and a half. I never found it. When I called the pastor once in the middle of the night and asked him to come over and experience some of the things going on, the icy room, a darkened doorway, and the sound of a screaming large cat, he told me no way. Do you think I'm nuts? I'll come over first thing in the morning. He never showed up, and I moved. The place is still standing, but I haven't been back. Hello. I live in Newton, North Carolina, and I'm addicted to this site. My story happened about five years ago. Me and my sister Melissa lived next door to one another at the time. The house that she lived in had been vacant for about 16 years. The previous owner was, according to the neighbors, a very mean old lady who had been sent to live in a nursing home and refused to allow her home to be sold. It stayed that way until her death. As soon as she died, her children put the house up for sale and my sister bought it. At first, it was just little things that happened. Melissa and my nephew, he was three at the time, were sitting in the living room with no TV on and he asked her who was there because he heard people talking on the stairs. They were alone in the house at the time. The stairs were a hot spot in the house. When she was pregnant with my niece, she fell or was pushed down three times. Her family had went on vacation for the week. So I was left to take care of the animals. Well, three days into their vacation, I went over to feed and water, and I heard a horrible commotion upstairs. It sounded like the house was falling apart. So I freaked out and left and didn't return. When they got home from vacation, I told them what happened, and my brother-in-law went to check, and in their bedroom, which was once the previous owner's and my sister's entire closet, was dumped out in the middle of the bedroom floor. Everything. My sister even remembers a very vivid encounter she once had when she was all alone. She walked upstairs and then walked back downstairs. There was an old rocking chair that she previously purchased and put into the living room after it was discovered that it was an antique. For whatever reason, she couldn't take her eyes off of it, ended up buying it, and it's a really old rocking chair. As she made her way towards the living room, from the distance, 
she could see a figure that was sitting in the rocking chair. The rocking chair was slowly moving back and forth, continuously without stop. The outline was light enough to make out, and it looked like a shadow, a gray mist, but it was definitely a figure that she could spot. She turned on the light, and it was like it was gone in an instant. Her eyes were not playing tricks on her. She literally saw something, and the rocking chair was still slowly moving back and forth. It eventually stopped, and that's when she heard a loud crash coming from upstairs. It completely startled her. She begrudgingly went upstairs to investigate, and as she went into the bathroom, she noticed that the mirror completely broke by itself. No logical explanation, just the mirror broken. Even though she was terrified, she ended up going to sleep anyway after she cleaned up the mess in the bathroom but she couldn't even get to sleep. Mainly, because her cat Smokey kept staring at the bathroom in the dark. Nothing but moans and groans. It was something completely uncharacteristic for him to do, as he never actually acted out in any way, shape, or form. But this night was particularly creepy for her, and the cat as well. Once, my sister was sleeping in one of the bedrooms and woke up to an old woman walking across her bedroom floor to the window. She described her, and my mother went to the library to pull old obituaries and showed the picture to my sister. She immediately broke down in tears because she was looking at the woman she had seen in her room. She immediately started packing and sold the home. The new owners now have similar things going on. Their daughter was pushed down the stairs, and their son has seen a man in one of the bedrooms on numerous occasions. And then he came home one day to find their cat dead at the foot of the stairs. My mom had about three years of on and off visitations. She would wake up around 11 at night with a start, to see different shapes of grayish white fog, which every time she would think it was smoke and her house was on fire. Sometimes the fog was in a blue arc by her dresser. Sometimes the whole room was filled up with this misty fog. Other times it was three big ovals by her TV. And even sometimes she had a big oval on all three sides of her bed. The one that really scared her was when she woke up to see the fog by the foot of her bed. Then it flew over her with such a force and went through a wall above her headboard. Mom even walked through the misty fog one night because again, she thought her house was on fire and she jumped up to get her robe. I asked her if it was cold when she went through it and she said that it wasn't and it didn't smell either. She did see one apparition of a boy of about 18 years old. He was standing next to her bed with his head down. Mom said he was grayish looking, and she did not talk to him, but she felt an awful sadness emanating from him. Shortly after that, we had somebody come and clear the house. The woman who cleared the house said that since Mom volunteered at a hospital, she was bringing all sorts of spirits and ghosts back home with her. They sort of attached themselves to her. After that, mom said the house felt very empty. It's been two years since her house has been cleared, and so far, so good. I think we also brought stuff in, because when we were kids, we used to play with the Ouija board in the 1960s. Now I know just how dangerous it is to use one of them, unless you really know what you're doing. But in the 1960s, you really didn't hear anything about the dangers of Ouija boards. It was just plain fun. When the person who cleared mom's home found a ghost of a man under the stairs in the workroom, it kind of explained why my dad and my sister always felt like they were being poked in their backs by an unseen finger. And us kids always had to go into the laundry room to get pop out of a fridge for supper. We would get the pop and run upstairs as fast as we could. 
all three of us kids did the same thing. We couldn't wait to get out of that room. I really think that spirit hung around since we dug him up in the 60s with the Ouija board. He's gone now though, and hopefully at peace. A few years back, I was in a car outside Worcestershire State Hospital in Worcestershire, Massachusetts. The building was all boarded up, and I had a vision. This was the first time this happened to me, and it scared the wits out of me. In reading your website terminology, I think it was a residual haunting. I heard blood-curdling screams and saw a man in a striped nightshirt, like the nightgown-type shirts worn in the 1800s and wearing a derby hat. He had dark hair and a mustache. He was levitating near the ceiling of a hallway. It seemed to happen quickly, but the screaming was heart-wrenching. After we left, I was quite shaken. Sometime after I discovered a website called Opacity.us, a photographer posts photos of haunted abandoned mental health hospitals and other old abandoned buildings. His pictures of Worcestershire State Hospital, including the boarded up building. I came across a picture of the hallway that I saw in my vision. What do you make of this? Was it a residual haunting? I've always experienced spirits or ghost type experiences, usually a friendly or mischievous spirit. I've also felt or connected with loved ones. Another odd experience involved myself and my three children. I woke up to one of my children screaming. I got up to check on him and it appeared he had screamed in his sleep. I went back to bed and when I did, I saw this creature that looked like one of the gremlins from the movie of the same name. It ran through the living room where my bed was and through the front door. A few years later, I mentioned this to a friend. My children said that they remember that night and also experienced this. While we talked about the experience, my younger son drew a picture of the exact same thing we all saw. I was floored as I had no idea that they had all seen this. I originally chalked it up to being half asleep and perhaps I had imagined it. I just wanted to share this with you. In 1957, my family moved to an old farmhouse in Mount Laurel, New Jersey. I was seven years old at the time, and as I went upstairs to my new bedroom with an armload of things, a terrible wave of fear swept over me when I reached the top of the stairs. From then on, I disliked that small area at the top of the stairs where it met the hallway. Unhappily, there was no way to avoid it. I had to walk through it to get into my bedroom. Other than that, nothing else happened that I know of until 1966. From my bed, I could see it out into the hallway to that small area on top of the stairs that had always frightened me. One night, towards the end of August, I woke up very, very slowly only to realize that there was a terrible stench in the bedroom. It was like a mix of rotten garlic, human waste, and rotting flesh. Then I noticed the room was icy cold. Remember, it was August, usually the hottest time of the year in New Jersey. I was lying on my side, facing the doorway, and when I opened my eyes, I saw that the bedroom door was wide open and a figure stood in the doorway, very close to the spot that had always spooked me. Since no lights were on, all I could make out was the silhouette of a tall dark figure that seemed to be wearing some kind of long robe with a hood. What truly petrified me was seeing this creature's eyes. They glowed red and stared straight at me. But before I could scream, somehow, the knowledge came to me from somewhere, my guardian angel, that if I acknowledged this creature's existence, I would be haunted for the rest of my life. 
so I pretended to be asleep, which was not easy. And after a while, I felt the cold room become warm again. The dreadful smell disappear, and the figure fade away. We moved out in 1967, and the house was torn down in 1972. I, for one, was not the least bit sorry to see it go. As a child living in our old cotton mill house, raised by my grandmother, great aunt, and her daughter, my cousin, I had many frightening paranormal experiences. I will elaborate on some of them as time goes on, but this story is a recap of many of the things I've experienced living in that house as a young child. I heard the classic footsteps, sounds of papers being crumbled, sounds of books falling, when nothing was out of place. Everybody in the family, including myself, heard our names called. Once, I woke up and heard a soft, echoey female voice say deep magic. By way of explanation, deep magic was a facial moisturizer. I once woke up to see a tiny pinpoint of light in my room, which expanded until the entire room was bright as day, and then faded quickly back to darkness. Once I crawled under my grandmother's bed while everybody was outside, something I was not allowed to do, and heard a gruff voice besides my ear say one word, gray. I had that, and still have no idea what that could have meant, but I got the heck out of there from under that bed, and never went back under there again. I had an encounter, a long conversation in the house with a strange unknown elderly woman who called herself Granny Grunt. I saw a little black imp, the shadow of a skeleton, and a handless arm which came up from between the bars of my iron bedspread and saw blood drip from the ceiling. When I was about four, I saw a shadowy figure that at the time, I thought was the Easter Bunny, walk through the living room and disappear into the wall. I now suspect there might have been some sort of gateway in my cousin's room, because much of the activity seems to come from or disappear in that direction. One night, I had gone to bed early and had a dream that a being, who look what UFOologists nowadays call an alien gray, was trying to force a full-sized apple down my throat. I awoke gasping for breath, crying and choking with that feeling still lingering in my throat of something big being forced down it. My grandmother had an old rocking chair with a woven cane bottom, which creaked loudly whenever you would sit down in it or get up. When my great aunt broke her hip and later died of cancer, for two nights in a row, I heard something sit down in that chair, squirm around a little bit, and then get up. I once heard the sound of the chair rocking in the night. Additionally, while my great aunt was in the hospital dying of cancer, I was awakened three nights in a row by something banging on the front door. Of course, nobody was there, but my great aunt died three days later. Later on, when I was in my twenties, still living in that house, I awoke to see a short woman with her hair in a bun and a white apron over an old-fashioned dress standing by my bed, who quickly vanished. I had many experiences of being in that half-awake and unable to move state, while hearing voices talking and people moving around in the house. Once, while I was in that state, I felt and heard something leap quickly into the bed beside me and lie there, growling menacingly. It vanished, of course, when I was able to fully wake up. I finally got married when I was 28 and moved away. After my cousin passed away, I inherited the house and my husband and I moved back into it. Strangely enough, I never heard or saw anything in those days we lived there together. The house was totally quiet and peaceful. My wife and I lived in Ringgold, Georgia, and have lived there for 25 years in the log home that we built ourselves, 
with a lot of help from friends and family. This was about 1983, about three or four years after we moved into our log home, some strange things began to happen. We would be watching TV when all of a sudden the TV would go off and when we found the problem, it was unplugged from the back of the TV. You have to turn the plug on the power cord to unplug the TV and it was lying on the floor behind the TV. After this happened, we started to hear Indian music and some very low volume chanting in the bedroom when my wife and I would be sleeping. I would see the outline of a body on the wall, like a shadow moving, and it looked if it was a stereotypical Native American. There was a moment where I went into the bathroom, in the mirror. I saw the presence of some dark face behind me. At times it would get very chilly in the house, even when it was warm outside, but only in one bedroom. We have a big wall clock hanging on the great room wall and has three chimes hanging down from it for the doorbells. When you push the doorbell button, the chime plays a short tune. At times, for no reason at all, the chimes would start to move and ring like someone had pushed the doorbell button, but there would be no one there. Our commodes would flush, and there would not be anyone out there to flush them. We have found human bones in Indian pottery, arrowheads, and lead bullets. We do know that a civil war battle was fought on our land, and we checked with a university in Alabama. They told us that this was an area that had a Cherokee Indian village back in the 1700s to 1800s. We reburied the bones in the pottery shards, and the strange happenings have not been as frequent as they were. We still live here and intend to stay, and the strange happenings have not been a threat or harmed anyone in any way. This is an account of events experienced by a close friend of mine. I've changed the names to protect the identities of the people involved. These events took place in Manchester, England. I met Charlotte some two and a half years ago when we both signed up for a course of ice skating lessons. We got on well from the start and stayed in touch afterwards. Charlotte's father had started to suffer from dementia and her mother was taking care of him at home. Unfortunately, her mother suffered a stroke in November 2008 and was unable to return home. Therefore, it fell on Charlotte to look after her father. Sadly, Charlotte's father died in his sleep in February 2010. This was a big shock as, although 89 years of age, he was very sprightingly and in good health. As you can imagine, Charlotte was devastated. One of Charlotte's sisters came up from down south to stay with her in the days afterwards, and while they were arranging the funeral, they both slept in their father's bed. A couple of days after he died, Charlotte had a very vivid dream. In it, she saw her father as a young man in rolled up shirt sleeves and a tank top. He was running down a hill and hot on his heels was a dog like they were having a race. She said her father looked very happy and full of life. She has never experienced anything like this before and felt it was her father's way of showing her where he was now. I asked her if she recognized the dog. She said her father used to talk about a dog he had when he was young, but she had never seen a picture of it. It was obviously a very profound experience because it eased her grief in that she'd felt he had gone to a better place. It is now March 2010. I saw Charlotte over the weekend, and she told me what else had been happening. Charlotte, her sister and her brother-in-law, had been in their father's house clearing it out and decorating. Charlotte was in one of the bedrooms and came across an organ her father bought her when she was 16. She plays the piano. Anyway, she sat down and started playing it. The moment she did this, the phone started ringing. Bear in mind, the phone was disconnected some weeks ago. Her sister answered it, but there was no one there. While the three of them were upstairs in separate areas, 
Charlotte's brother-in-law asked who was making a drink. Her sister replied that they were all busy and that he should make his own drink. Her brother-in-law said that was not what he meant and asked who was boiling the kettle. When Charlotte's sister went downstairs, the kettle had just boiled and switched itself off. No one had put it onto a boil. A day or so later, Charlotte began playing the organ and once again, as soon as she did, the phone rang just like before, still disconnected of course. Charlotte said that one night they were sat around talking about their father and the lights in the room started flickering. This has never happened before. As soon as they stopped talking, the flickering stopped. I told Charlotte that experiences like this are fairly common and it's her father letting her know that he is still around. The last time I saw her, she was in pieces. After these experiences, although still very upset, she seems very much calmer and accepting. It is wonderful when things like this happen. If only it could be that way for everyone. Hello. I wrote to you a while ago about the house I grew up in, but I had something happen to me back in 2005 that I could never explain. My husband and I were going through the immigration process back in 2005, and while our case was being reviewed by the INS, my husband had to stay in Mexico. This was a very stressful time, and we were facing a lot of uncertainty. So we packed up and moved to his family's house down in Samoa, Mishishowen. At the time, my oldest son was only two years old, and my mom had driven down with us to help with the INS appointments and to help us get settled into our new home. Well, so when we finally arrived to my husband's family home, we got unpacked and settled in to await our verdict. We would hear from the INS six months later. The house is basically two homes together. The building is L-shaped. It has the original house, and then you have to go outside into the courtyard to access the second house. This area had a bathroom and a store, and a supply room for the store, and above this was our apartment. This area had not anyone stay in it for maybe 10 years. This area was like a duplex attached by a door through the living rooms, so we took the left side and closed up the right side. Now, the side we took had an unusual feature. It had a huge bedroom that was divided by a wall and had an open doorway, so it was two bedrooms in one. We slept in one bedroom and my mom slept on the other side. Now, this is a huge home, especially by Mexico standards, but we only shared it with two other people my brother and sister-in-law, because the other family members moved about 10 years before. Nothing about this home seems scary or creepy, but I did learn that between the two houses, two of my husband's toddler sisters were buried. I didn't know this until months later, so a few days after we arrived, we were cleaning and unpacking. My husband was down in the store covering for his brother and my mom and I were upstairs cleaning the bedroom. She got tired and decided to go out on the balcony and sit. She took my son with her so I could continue cleaning. Well, I decided to sit down on the bed and I was faced towards the window looking out. Well, I could see the door leading to the living room out of the corner of my eye. It was halfway open. While I was sitting there, the door opened up and someone walked into the little bedroom. I heard the door move across the carpet and I saw out of the corner of my eye someone in a white shirt. I figured it was my mom and thought nothing of it, but then wondered where my son was and I started to worry why she had left him on the balcony alone. So I called out and no one answered. I got up and walked across the room and into the little bedroom. I was certain someone would be there because I had seen someone go in there. Well, 
I was completely surprised when I walked in there, and no one was in the room. This really startled me. So I walked out into the balcony, and there was my mom and son. I asked if she had went into the room, and mom just looked at me and said no. And no one but us and my husband were there that day. Another time. I was walking up our stairs to our apartment, and I had a vision flash in front of my face that completely terrified me. I still don't know what it was, or why it happened, but it was at night, and I looked to my right at the wall, and there was this horrible face like a gargoyle, just for a second, and then it was gone. The only place I felt really uncomfortable at was the downstairs store, storage area. I would run past the place. It had a weird feeling to it. Nothing ever happened around there other than that feeling. The other times involved my son. During this time, he developed an imaginary friend. He would call it the baby, or baby sometimes. He would be in the hallway of the kitchen playing and say, oh, come see the babies, or he would be talking and I asked him who he was talking to, and he would say the babies. I didn't think anything of it, until my husband told me about his sisters. Then I felt some kind of uncomfortable with it. One day, we were sitting in the living room, and he comes in crying and tells me that the babies are hiding under the bed. Well, I didn't want to look under the bed, but I did anyways, and of course, there wasn't anything there, but it still made the hair on the back of my neck rise up. The only other thing was one day, my husband and I were sitting on the couch and my son was playing on the rug, and we were just talking, and my son looks over into the corner and says, look at that man with the cowboy hat on. Well, we didn't see anything, so we just said, oh, is there, and he continues playing with his truck and we keep talking. Well, about 10 minutes later, my son looks up and says, oh, he's gone. I don't know. We have left six months later and were able to come back to the US and have just experienced all these stories that have occurred. It was weird to say the least. Later, I was talking to my sister-in-law, a different one who had grown up there and I told her about her experiences, and she got really defensive and didn't want to talk about it anymore. So who knows? Thanks for letting me share. I had recently moved from our old apartment. We were visited there by an unknown presence. A couple of years ago, I'd won some haunted dolls I had bidded on. One was a doll owned by a murdered teenager. The obituary article about her murder was included with the doll. This is the one that I think may have brought on much of the phenomena. My sister heard knocking on my bedroom door from the inside. We live in the same apartment. I didn't tell her that I had the haunted dolls until she told me that. Gave more credibility to it that way. I tried to debunk it by saying that I may have knocked on the door while I slept, but she said no. She heard me up, getting ready for work, getting my clothes on out of the drawers. I didn't hear it from the inside though. It happened one more time the next morning, but she asked the spirit to leave, and then it stopped. But other things started to happen. Our music box mysteriously came to life with a full wind, even though it was wound all the way down. It wasn't played for over a year. Then again, two hours later, again at full music without being wound. Kept playing for several minutes. Also, our kitchen faucet moved from the right to the left overnight. It is hard to move it by hand. If that weren't enough, we had a plug unplug out of the power strip, and neither her or I unplugged it. It isn't easy to unplug. It was kept plugged in for the pump for the inflatable bed, which had a leak in it and had to be pumped up every couple of hours, so we never unplugged it. Our visitor 
made sure to make itself known. I remember one night I had so much trouble sleeping. I'm an insomniac, so I often wake up many times during the night. I went to fetch myself a snack, so I got up. The living room leads to the kitchen, so I have to walk through there to get to the kitchen. As I'm walking through the living room, I hear a monstrous laughter up, a deep voice saying ha. It creeped me out for a second, then I brushed it off and proceeded to the kitchen. I'm now sitting down at the kitchen table and can see the living room from where I'm sitting. The only light I had on was the kitchen, but it was dim enough that I was able to see a dark shadow move from one end of the room to the other. It wasn't my sister because she was knocked out from rest, so I'm going back to my bedroom. As I'm heading past the living room, there was a window, and the curtains were moving by themselves. There was no wind or open windows, and no AC unit on, nothing that could have made the window curtains do this. A second after this, I feel a pain on my arm, and female laughter, once again this time. I check to see if my sister is up, but she is still asleep. I dismiss it and say it's just me and my imagination, so I finally get tired enough to sleep when I'm laying down and staring at the ceiling. That's when I see it, a face that looks like a witch, much like the witch from the Wizard of Oz. It appears only for a few seconds, but it really made me paranoid. For some reason, I was able to sleep. How I did so, I can't even say, but I did. When I awoke in the morning, I looked back at my arm, and there was a red imprint of a hand there, as if someone tried to twist my arm. I know it sounds crazy, but I wasn't too afraid, even after all that. I investigate places now and then for people, and I'm very much used to activity. My meter readings some nights were very high in some areas that are usually in the green area on the meter. Many times, I would ask for a sign that it was there, and then it would spike into the red zone. I sort of missed that activity after moving out, but perhaps someday it will return in the new place I moved into. I wanted to share a story with you about something that happened to somebody I knew when I was a young man in Minnesota that always sends chills down my spine. When I was about 12 years old, which would have been 1977, my brother Royce was working in a town named Worthington, Minnesota, about 30 miles from my hometown of Jackson, Minnesota. He worked at a lumber yard called UBC and had a friend that worked at a local grain elevator. The silos for grain elevators in that part of the country rise hundreds of feet into the air and have the capacity to store tons and tons of grain, whether that be corn or soybeans, whatever the silo is being used for at that time. Occasionally, the employees of the elevator climb a ladder on the outside of the silos and get into the silo via an access door at the very top in order to inspect the grain inside, making sure it's not too wet rotting, or whatever. Inside the access door, there is a catwalk that circles around the entire circumference of the silo. My brother's friend climbed the outside ladder, opened the access door, and lowered himself onto the catwalk that circled the inside of the silo. After walking halfway around the silo on the catwalk, my brother's friend, I don't even recall his name any longer, observed what he thought was an excessive amount of moisture on the surface of the corn, which was what the silo was being used for at the time. So, being an industrious young man, he jumped over the catwalk rail and walked out onto the surface of the corn to roughly the middle of the silo to take a closer look. After inspecting the corn, he decided to just continue his journey across the surface of the corn to get back to the catwalk on the other side of the silo. As the catwalk was a few feet higher than the level of the corn, he had to grab onto the catwalk rail and bounce to get his foot up to the catwalk platform and swing his leg over the rail. 
as he swung his foot over the rail, he heard a noise behind him. Balancing with one leg over the catwalk rail and one leg on the catwalk platform on the outside of the rail, he turned around to see what the noise was. Much to his horror, the corn that he had just walked across was falling straight down, hundreds of feet to the bottom of the silo, which was cement floor, and landed with a crash a few seconds later. Instead of walking on solid surface of corn, as he had assumed, he had actually walked across a crust of rotten corn that had formed on top of the silo when corn had previously stored in the silo. The remaining corn had been removed from the silo the previous week. He spent a few months sitting on the catwalk, staring down into the depths of the silo, and then silently got up, went out across the access door, made his way back down the ladder on the outside of the silo, and took the rest of the day off. Oh, and the creepiest part yet, when he was heading back to where he was going, he actually saw in the distance a farmer of some sort, but it definitely looked like an apparition. As he was getting closer and closer to the man who was standing there, almost as if he was lifelessly stoned out of his mind, he disappeared. His face looked so rugged, disfigured, and it looked like he was emanating pure evil. He later awoke in the evening in his own bed to a man choking him out in his sleep. He woke up immediately and the man was gone. The man, the same guy who he saw, the farmer in the fields. He was described as having the most bulgy red eyes he had ever seen in his life. In the face of evil, something was going on there and he couldn't quite place his finger on it but it was definitely demonic of some sort. That farmer was very protective of the cornfields it seemed that he may have raised himself. Although I'm not sure why he even appeared in the first place, in the field, or as a possible sleep paralysis or ghostly encounter at night. Nevertheless, it gave me nightmares for a long time. I've known about this ghost stories website for a long time, probably since the late 90s. I don't visit the site too often, probably three or four times a year, but when I visit it, I enjoy it. Anyway, I wanted to share a couple of stories that kind of dawned on me while reading the site today. While I was reading your site, I remembered some of the experience I had at Paris Island specifically in the rifle range area. Well, when I searched on the internet for Paris Island haunting, I came across this story. This same event in regards to fire which happened to a friend of mine. He was so spooked that he woke me up early for fire watch duty because he couldn't take it. He saw a figure in the mirror in the bathroom. The difference between his story and the story from the link is that he saw the figure in the mirror, but to him, it looked as if he was in the bathroom. The bathrooms were in the large area we called the squad bay. The drill instructor's office was typically there. My friend had me go in the bathroom, but I didn't see anything. I took over his shift and worked mine. I recall hearing sounds like someone was moving in the bathroom. I checked a few times, but I didn't see anything. If I'm being honest, I was hoping that I would, which is why I didn't mind taking a double shift. My second story is an interesting one, because it was an experience we all witnessed. Again, this was in the same barracks where we stayed for the rifle range. We had all entered the barracks after lunch, and we were all standing in front of our foot lockers as our drill instructor, Sergeant Minix, was yelling at us over something. He was standing right at the door that we always used to enter and exit the barracks. We are on the second floor of the three-floor unit. Well, while he was yelling, 
there were three distinct knocks on the door. It was the three knocks that all recruits had to do in order to approach the drill instructor at his office or when a recruit has to enter another squad bay. By knocks, there were not traditional knocks on the door, but more like hand slaps against the door. As soon as the third knock was heard, he flung the door open. Now, if someone was standing there, they would have had a door to the face. There was no one there, and there was absolutely no possibility that someone could have jumped out of the way or hid. They would have had to run up or down the stairs or jump over the railing and taken a very high and nasty fall and would have been obvious just hearing footsteps looked up and down the stairs and said, must have been a ghost. It was the time of day where all platoons would have returned to their barracks, so it wasn't some recruit falling behind or in drill instructor late. That just doesn't happen. Paris Island is very orderly in everything. Of all the ghost stories I've heard, I've never read or heard one where a room full of people experienced the same thing. I read many of the stories on your site and decided to tell one of my own. This is the scariest and most unexplainable thing that has ever happened to me. First, I'll give a little background information. I grew up on a farm in rural South Georgia and spent a great deal of my free time fishing, hunting, and exploring, and always doing this by myself, since there weren't a lot of other kids around and I only had a younger sister. I never really experienced any fear of anything, other than being late for dinner, all the years I was growing up, and I can't recall any paranormal experiences other than the one I'm about to share with you. I had a best friend from school that I started hanging out with after we became old enough to drive and got our trucks, which are required for country boys. For the next two years, we did most of our hunting and fishing and troublemaking together. After we graduated from high school, we even went to the same local college and continued to hang out. My granddaddy owned a farm in the same county that we lived in, and I would go deer hunting on his land sometimes, but I had never taken my friend there with me. Behind my grandparents' house were several barns, then several large fields, then a large pond with a swampy area, then a large pasture that stretched from one side of their property to the other, property line to property line. This wooded area was immediately behind the pasture and also encompassed the entire back side of the property. The woods were also enclosed on the back and on each side with a four-foot-tall fence, since cows were allowed into the pasture and wooded area at times. You will soon see why all this detail is important. On the three sides of the wooded area were large open fields belonging to the neighbors, with each field belonging to a different neighbor. Take note that there are no more trees or woods close by. During the fall of our first year in college, I had scouted these woods and put up two deer stands, one on each side of the property, on the property lines, but also very close to active deer trails and signs. These stands were no more than 100 yards apart, and about 150 yards into the woods from the pasture. I decided one weekend to treat my friend to a little hunting paradise, although I had yet to see anything other than squirrels all season long. We went to the woods about 4pm, with it being dark by 6. I took him to his stand and then proceeded across the woods to mine. Just after the sun went down, I heard my friend whistle loudly, obviously trying to get my attention. I whistled back. He whistled again as though he didn't hear me. Again, I whistled back, even louder this time. There was no response. About five minutes passed and then I heard him whistle again. But he was closer to me than he should have been, but still through the woods somewhere. I found this very strange since we were supposed to sit in our stands until after dark and then meet up in the pasture to walk back out to the house. He whistled again and was even closer and I could tell that he was almost running and he started calling out my name. He sounded panicked and was coming straight toward me, although there is no way he could know where the deer stand was since he had never been there before and I didn't respond to him until he called my name. I climbed down from the tree stand as he approached. And when I got on the ground, he ran up and said, We gotta get out of here. Something big is after me. Instead of joining him in the rush, I stood there looking and listening. Sure enough, in a few seconds, 
It sounded like a bulldozer was coming through the woods, but without the engine. I could hear trees breaking and large bushes being shaken and trampled, and it was coming right at me with the sound becoming deafening as though it were right on top of us. I started running down the fence headed for the pasture and realized that my friend had run ahead of me and stopped. When he saw me running, he took off running again. We ran as fast as we could through the woods with the sound of massive destruction right on our heels. As we broke out into the pasture and got about 50 feet from the edge of the woods, the sound stopped. We continued to run until we were halfway across the pasture and turned to look at each other as we ran, both realizing that either we were no longer being chased or there was just nothing to be torn and crushed in the pasture. We both stopped and turned around, dropping to the ground and shouldering our rifles, aiming to kill whatever was behind us. To our amazement, there was nothing there. The daylight was almost gone, causing the woods to appear as nothing more than a black blob. I told my friend to get up and run for the pond while I guarded the rear. Then he would stop and guard the rear while I ran to him. After meeting up again at the pond, we both walked in silence back to my grandparents' house. We got into our separate trucks and drove to our parents' houses, not mentioning the event until many years later. We still remained close friends then and even today, but we still don't know what happened in the woods that night. I did return to those woods a week later by myself, but in the middle of the day, I walked over the entire wooded area and never even saw one broken branch or bush. I walked in the fields around the wooded area and saw no large or unusual footprints. My friend never returned to those woods with me, even though I returned many times day and night and never again experienced any strange occurrences or sounds. I know there was nothing physical in the woods that night, but whatever it was, I obviously didn't want my friend there and he got the point loud and clear. My family and I took a trip to Tennessee in the summer of 08. We went all over the place, such as Jackson and Nashville, on our second to last day before we left to go home. My family decided to go to Franklin because we had picked up a brochure of haunted places in Tennessee, and so we went to humor me because I was interested in hauntings at the time. This city, not known to most people, is actually the site of the bloodiest battle of the Civil War, even worse than Gettysburg. There are two houses that were the main sites. One of them was the Carnton Plantation, which is the setting to my story. The plantation was creepy enough when we drove up to it without even knowing the history. When I got out of the car, I looked up at the house and noted how beautiful it was. Then my attention was averted to the balcony on the second floor. There, standing on it, was a man. He was clearly dressed in a Civil War uniform, though I quite can't remember which color, and I could clearly see that he had a beard covering his jawline. He stood there with his arms behind him, as if he was gazing out, overlooking troops. Of course, at the time, not knowing any of the history, I thought it was just the tour guide taking a break out on the balcony. I even hoped he was going to be my family's guide. Later, once we were on the tour, I noticed that none of the employees were dressed like 19th century citizens. Of course, then we got the history of the place, and I understood why this place was considered haunted. When the battle itself was both going on, and when it was over, Injured soldiers were treated inside of the house, so many in fact, that there are stains of blood inside of the house that will not come out of the floor. Many soldiers obviously died inside of the house. When we continued our tour upstairs, we entered a room with a door to the balcony. This is where I learned that no one was allowed out on the balcony. This confused me since I'd seen that man out there. When the guide took the group into the room across the hall and began talking, I couldn't pay attention. The closet in the other room kept grabbing my attention because it had a piece of black cloth in it. Finally, I tried to keep myself focused and it was going well until a gentleman in the group got bored and decided to go out into the hall. I watched him leave, thinking that it was very rude and should come back. For some reason, when he left, 
I noted that the sun was in a position that didn't cast a shadow of the man's head on the hallway wall. Once again, I turned my attention back to the guide, but the man in the hallway began to wander in the hall, and that distracted me. When I turned to watch the man, there was suddenly a very clear, and defined silhouette of a man's head and shoulders with a bearded face that traveled across the wall, then just disappeared. It startled me at first, then I got excited because I thought I must have seen a ghost. Then I thought, no, I have to be practical about this because that man is out in the hallway. Once the tour guide was done talking, I went outside into the hallway way. The first thing I noticed was that any shadow from the tourists on the wall wasn't that dark or defined. Then I noticed that the way the sun was facing caused the shadows to be cast in a completely different wall. The silhouette I saw couldn't have been from anyone on the tour. Then I noticed that there was an upstairs where I thought maybe an employee could be working. That theory was completely dismissed when it appeared no one was up there. There wasn't any logical explanations for the silhouette. It wasn't until my family returned home a few days later that I decided to research what I had seen. After discovering that there was a frequent spirit there that was called the General, I made the connection. The details from past eyewitness accounts were identical to mine. He stands out on the porch, has a Civil War uniform on, and has a beard on his face. I was, and still am convinced, that I saw the general on that day. This took place shortly after I turned 16. My dad was working up in Oregon and Washington, but was based out of Rainier. I went up to live with him I guess just to do something different. I was used to being around the city type of atmosphere and it wasn't too long before I grew bored. Not that the Oregon country girls in that area didn't stir my blood, it's just that they mainly wanted to waste their time getting high or drunk, tipping cows, or shooting the passing ships going down the Columbia River, which I don't mind. I just miss the city lights or something. Anywho, I'd been out partying with a friend and drove off the side of a mountain. Another story, which would take a while to go through, and I thought my dad was probably going to kill me anyway, without benefit of blindfold and a last smoke, so I decided to hitchhike back to Oklahoma. Needless to say, I lacked the understanding of just how far I was from Oklahoma. My newfound compadre decided to go along, because he had gotten in recent trouble with his folks and wanted out of town too, so we took off. Somewhere between Portland and the Dells, on I-84, which was only a two-lane at that spot, we were really tired and looking for a place to sleep. By this time, I would found out that this hitchhiking thing wasn't for me, and it really should be called a lot of hiking and not enough hitching, or something similar. And what seemed weird was that out in the middle of nowhere, the fences were really well kept, and I didn't want to get cut up climbing one. No houses, no anything. It was simply just nice fences. Anyway, we found a rather peevish looking fence about three fourths of a mile before a bend in the road. The moon was out and actually lit up the area pretty well. There was about three fourths of a mile behind us from the last turn in the road. And like I said, about the same in front of us before the next one. We were in a valley or whatever they're called that the road went through, and it was really a beautiful sight. Just as we were fixing the jump the fence, a car came around the bench from in front. Of course it was too far off to see us when it rounded the bend, but we didn't want it to see us climbing the fence when it came abreast of us, like the owners of the land were out cruising in the middle of the night. The sides of the road in that area sloped down at a very sharp right, and were gravel, at least on our side of the road, so he didn't have to go far to be below the grade of the road and out of sight of passing motorists. It went down probably 15 feet though, well below the road. Come to think of it, 
I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like that since. Just as we were sliding down the slope out of sight, I caught sight of something way down the road, just the side of the curve. The lights of the oncoming car caught it, just as it was making the curve. Whatever it was, went down the embankment on the opposite side of the road from us. I asked my friend if he saw it, and he said yes, he saw something. After the car passed, we peeked over the top of the road, and right when we started to climb back onto the roadway, because we decided we didn't want to sleep in that area anyway, we saw what appeared to be two guys pushing a motorbike climb up where we saw it go off before. This was still about three-fourths of a mile at least off, down the hill near the curve. We slid back down the slope, out of sight. I really don't know why. Then we kind of just looked at each other. A motorbike? We both looked at the incline behind us. If you pushed a motorbike off the side of the road down this embankment, you'd have a heck of a time stopping it before it went all the way down, and the river was on their side and even a harder time getting back up. I couldn't imagine trying to get it back up to the road, assuming it didn't go into the river. We both peeked over the top, breathing really quiet and shallow, watching for another couple of minutes, when all of a sudden, it stood up. It wasn't two guys pushing a motorbike. It was something that had been on all fours, and stood up, and it was huge at least twice as tall as us, and by the way, we weren't midgets. I almost crapped myself. I started looking around, and the fence, by this time, was looking mighty small. Thinking really fast in that fight or flight mode, and the flight was definitely the way I was leaning towards, I realized that, thank god it had been his turn to carry the backpack, which would slow him down, and had the only food we had in it. And on top of that, I thought I could outrun him. Maybe it wouldn't want both of us. I looked at him, saw the panic in his eyes, and knew he was thinking along the same lines. I knew I couldn't run. I also knew that I had the senses when it got directly across from us. I pulled out my little pocket knife. I knew that we're going to die. And all I could think of was, Lord, please let it be quick. I peeked over the top again, and it was almost even with us. I might have whimpered, silently of course, but I also noticed that the wind was blowing in my face from his direction. There might be hope. We ducked back down, and we could hear it almost stop right across from us for a moment or two, then start on up the road again. It was almost the curve up the hill from us from the direction we had originally came from. When another car came around the bend downhill, I thought about jumping out in front of it and yelling for help, but if it didn't stop, then whatever that was would know that we were there. We waited, and it disappeared below the other side of the road, like before when the other car came. This time, it didn't come back up. I don't know how long we waited, but we finally climbed back up and continued down the hill and around the curve. We didn't say a word or breath, anything about a whisper, till we cleared that bend in the road and was a mile or two away. When we called the Dallas, we called our parents to come and get us. We'd had enough of the open road in Oregon. I don't know what that was, but I still think about it sometimes. I've had a few other things happen to me in my life, but that really scared me. My boyfriend and I saw the state park on our way from Arkansas to Illinois and thought we should check it out. We had never heard of this place or even seen it before. We parked in the parking area and got out of the car to explore the woods. Naturally, I had to use the restroom, so I went to the bathroom and once I got to the toilet, I had a terrible feeling of being watched and I truly felt like someone was in the bathroom with me, but obviously, I was the only one. The feeling of this presence was so unbearing and evil that I ran out of the bathroom 
the second I finished with my pants down. Once I got out of the bathroom, my boyfriend and I started down the path. Within 30 seconds of walking, and still within 30 feet of the bathroom, my boyfriend and I heard a loud footstep crunching the leaves. In fact, it was multiple footsteps. My boyfriend thought it was a bear or something because of the heftiness of the steps, so he was searching and searching for a bear or anything, but he couldn't find a thing. I didn't mention the bathroom to him, but after not too long, I insisted we continue. I know there is something terribly evil in that bathroom. For a while, nothing else odd occurred, and we continued on the path which goes down to level ground with a large lake on one side. But soon after we got to this level ground area, the sun started settling, and that's when things got uneasy again. We both started to hear something large walking in the leaves again. Sean, my boyfriend, really wanted to see what it was, and at this point, I felt like we were really in danger, and that something else, unnatural, was there. So we barely started to move farther into the woods when Sean told me he saw a shadow or something farther in. Then, I was done. I told him we had to go, and I cannot be here any longer. So, I ran like hell back to the car, and Sean was close behind me. Once we got to the car, I was at the passenger door, ready for him to unlock it. And of course, he tells me that he hears that thing we've been hearing in the sparsely wooded area directly in front of the parking lot, which is to the very right near the parking lot, and that he has to see what it is. So, I had him throw me the keys, and I got in the car. He got in within a minute, and I asked him if he saw anything, and he said he just saw that a dark shadow move behind a tree, but nothing else. Needless to say, we booked it off that mountain, and it really seemed like a car was trying to chase us down the mountain, but we may have just been super spooked from the woods experience we just had, but I will note, we were driving at about 65 miles an hour, and the speed limit was way less. I forget now it was specifically, but I want to say between 30 and 40 max. Plus, it was a mountain road, and very windy, and frankly, difficult to traverse at 65. Also, during the time I was taking pictures, the whole time we were in the woods, nature shots, that was actually the entire reason we were there in the first place, and the pictures were neat. The day ones didn't have orbs, but the night ones all did, and I thought maybe it was from the lake reflection or something, but I took a picture out of the car window, at the moon, right after we got in the car, and in that photo, there's the moon and like 30 orbs. It's amazing to me. I mean, I've never taken any orb photo ever before, and I took another photo of the moon out my window about 30 minutes after we left the mountain, and only the moon. I did some research to find anything on the area. It seems it was established in an old Indian burial ground, but few findings on much else, and I never found anything on cars chasing you out of this place. Be careful, during the day the bathroom is really the worst part, and seemingly off the trail, but I just wouldn't go at night. And also, Sean didn't seem to have the feelings as intensely as I did, so if you're the right person, the feeling might not be too overwhelming. I was thinking about my dog last night, as he was put away a few years ago, and the immediate remembrance of a very weird experience me and my dog had in my home, in Tallahassee. This home, prior to any construction behind us, was all wooded landscape and ran into Lake Jackson. Within this wooden area were several Indian burial mounds. One day, shortly after I moved there for a new job, I took my dog for a walk, unleashed, back in the woods. I saw those mounds, but really did not know that they were Indian burial mounds. My dog and I both walked over these mounds just being adventurers. 
when I returned from our walk. My neighbor asked me jokingly if I let my dog run loose back there, and my response was yes. He then stated that I would see a black bird perched somewhere soon in a tree close by, and that this bird would be watching me. I laughingly asked why, and he said that if we walked over those mounds, we would have possibly wakened the spirits, and that the bird was their watchful eye on me. Well, of course I thought this man was crazy, but he was actually a very nice and intelligent man as I learned later. So only about two days later, I returned home from work, and I recall thinking about the black bird Betty told me. So I peeked around the left side of the home to look into the wooded area, and lo and behold, there was a blackbird perched on a tree, staring at me. He would not take his eyes off either. Needless to say, that was creepy. So that very night, I was in my office, and my dog was usually laying in the living room by the fireplace. As I was doing my work in the office, my office chair was budged about two to three inches forward with a force that felt like someone actually pushed the chair. I instinctively reached by, looking over my right side, expecting to see my dog. No dog, nothing. So I quickly went into the living room, only to see my dog laying down facing the hallway entrance, which is where my office resided, as well as two other bedrooms and he had his head between his paws, staring and growling at something in the hallway. Talk about getting freaked out. So I grabbed my dog by his collar and tried to lead him down into the hallway, and he resisted every attempt. He was scared, obviously, and he definitely saw or sensed something. I did not see anything at all. As I walked into each room through that hallway, I did not see or sense anything. Then I walked into the bathroom in the master bedroom to find that my candle, which was lit, went out. So that night, I kept all lights on. The following day I came home and looked again for that weird bird. He was not there. So I took my dog outside to do his thing, but then noticed he was limping. Then he fell to his side with pain in the backyard. As I made the observation, I noticed that in his groin area, he had a large tumor-like bulge coming from this area. I immediately took him to the veterinarian, and I recall she had no explanation for it, but prescribed medication to reduce the swelling. Within two weeks or so, the swelling went away. Looking back at that, I really feel that the spirit, or whatever it was, made that happen. As my dog was still young and very healthy. After that week of weird occurrences, I never had anything further happen. I never told my neighbor what had happened, as I did not want to look silly or have rumors flying around. But for sure, I can tell you that I know in my own gut that what that neighbor told me came to life. Dogs can definitely sense or see these spirits, as we cannot apparently. Between the birds, the bump on my chair, my dog growling and acting scared, and the bulge in his groin area, all made sense that something was in that house. Never walked in those woods again. I no longer reside there either. This is a ghost, entity, evil demon spirit, and whatever else was haunting our home I can tell you. I will never forget what happened as long as I breathe air. We moved into this big house when I was 15. It had been empty for about 10 years. It had old, creaky wood floors and a ton of doors. Everywhere you turned in the house, there was a door. Don't ask, I still can't figure it out. It was a doctor's house. In the very back of the house is where he saw his patients. Yes. Some died in the house in his office. Both my grandparents also died there. The very first thought we had activity, about 3 a.m. in the morning, there was someone banging on our front door. My grandfather would get up, and no one would be there. This happened all the time. 
we would drop our car keys in the glass bowl right when we walked in, and they would be in a different part of the house. Things were always showing up all over the house. It likes to play tricks all the time. So many things happened, I can hardly recall them. All but this one I will never forget in my life. I would love to forget it, but it just won't go away. I was 20 years old and just had a baby. I had my daughter in a bassinet beside my bed. I fell asleep watching Michael Jordan play basketball in the Olympics. My bed had a tall headboard that sat up against my bedroom window. I also had floor to ceiling curtains, very heavy curtains. The windows were shut, the curtains were shut too. I was sleeping on my back as I fell asleep to the TV. The TV was still on and the baby was fast asleep. All of a sudden, I felt a strong man's hand covering my whole face. He was trying to suffocate me. I was in panic mode. His grip on my face and nose was so tight that I couldn't breathe or scream. I was looking up at the ceiling thinking I'm gonna die, right there, right now. It seemed like an eternity and I was losing my breath. Then, the phone beside my bed rang. It stopped. I jumped so far out of the bed across the room and looked back thinking I was fighting off an intruder and no one was there. I looked out the window. Nothing. I looked in the mirror and I had a bright red handprint on my face. It was evil. It was an evil something. I was praying out loud for whatever it was to get the hell out of my house and leave me alone. I've never been that terrified in my life, never. I looked out the window and it was pitch black. I got the feeling like something was out there laughing at me or mocking me. The baby never woke up. It was her father on the phone. I told him what happened, but he thought it was a dream. I know from the start it was as real as I'm sitting here telling you today. Not long after that, my grandmother and grandfather died in the house on two separate occasions. I was left in this huge house all alone with my two children. They were one and just months old. The house was always freezing no matter how high the heat was on. I would hear talking that I could never make out. Footsteps up and down the hallway pinching, grabbing. The lights never worked. I changed the bulbs all the time. When I did the laundry where the old doctor's office used to be, I could feel a breath on my neck. I could see shadows of people out of the corner of my eye. It was a living nightmare. The energy was so thick and heavy, even on the brightest day. I was scared to death to be there alone and go home after work alone. I would just sit up with the TV on until I could fall asleep and pray to God that I didn't have to go to pee in the night. I was so scared to get up. The day I moved from that house was the happiest day of my life. I could have stayed there forever in that big house, but I wanted out. I still to this day 19 years later have vivid dreams of what happened, all the things I heard in all the things I saw. I've only told a few people this story. I've seen and felt both good and evil from a very, very young age. My nanny told me I had the gift of seeing and hearing spirits, like I was a light to them. I've had so many experiences I can't count. Most are very bad, but I have a couple that are good. I'm terrified of the afterlife. I pray that God carries me to heaven. If you don't believe, I'm telling you, there are things you can't see, but they can hurt you and make you so depressed you want to die. They can touch you, hurt you, and mock you, and laugh in your face. I know. Here's my story. It will be interesting to see what everyone else thinks of all this. I was at a friend's house listening to music tonight, Saturday, April 12th. He is a drinker 
so he was feeling pretty good. He was at the computer with his back to me. I was on the couch directly in front of the TV, which was off. The only light on was right above the computer desk. To my right was the entryway, which was dark, pitch black actually, but I could see the reflection of the room and the TV. He was playing O Death, from Brother Where Art Thou, song itself gave me the creeps, when suddenly, I looked into the TV, and saw a solid black figure of a tall man start to step out of the darkness of the entryway and into the living room. I didn't see anything like clothing or facial features, just tall and solid black. My friend at the same time swiveled his desk chair and pointed towards the entryway where he saw the figure. The figure stepped back into the dark as quickly as it appeared, as though it didn't want him to see it. I looked at him and said, did you see that too? To which he replied, see what? He was only being animated during the song, but for sure didn't see anything. I've experienced several things at this house. He has not though, and it upsets him. But what I experienced that evening was the most eerie and frightening thing for sure. I know it wasn't one of his friends or someone goofing off. It isn't easy to walk into his house through the front door and not be heard. The floor is tiled. We walked over and turned on the light, and we both looked. There was no one there. I just went home. I couldn't stay there, and I begged him to come with me, but he wouldn't. A few days later when we talked, I asked him if he had ever had any seances or similar things in the house. He at first said no because it was his grandma's house, and he moved in about a year after she had passed, but then he paused. And then he said, well, remember when we cleaned out the attic? There was a Ouija board up there. Well, no, I didn't remember. And I told him to get his house cleansed. But he was just laughing at me. I've never been back to his house since that night. About two weeks later, he got an unintentional EVP, which is very eerie also. He has a voice-activated recorder and was recording a couple of programs off the computer for a friend at work. He turned off the computer, and the TV isn't hooked up anyways, but when he woke up, there were three recordings instead of two on the recorder. I know he's pretty up on computers, but he didn't make this EVP himself. Actually, it scared him, and he said he wasn't going to listen to it anymore. Even though I'm not sure whether I do in fact believe in ghosts and the supernatural, I must be the ghost stories world's biggest fan and relentless reader, and have been a patron of your site for many, many years, at least a decade now. Like I said, not being totally sure whether I do actually believe in ghosts, I've never had a story of my own contribute to your website. However, over the past months, possibly years, Certain things have happened in our current rented home. Occurrences in this house that made me think twice, maybe even three times about what I actually do and don't believe in. My husband Craig and I have been living in our rented home here in Melbourne, Australia for almost four years now. We rent privately and know very little about the house and its history, apart from the fact that we are private renters and the rent has always been almost ridiculously cheap. The house isn't that old, however. It would only be about 15 or 20 years old. We do know, however, that several of the last tenants that lived here, families with children, by the look of the wall drawings in the study and backyard, moved out fairly quick after moving in, which has always puzzled me, as the house isn't in that bad a shape. The neighborhood is okay, and the rent, like I said, has always been ridiculously cheap. Any questionable incident that has happened in this house has either taken place in the lounge room or the nursery. My daughter is now three months short of turning three. I remember one time when my daughter was tiny. 
she would have been six months old at the time. We put her to bed in her cot in her room. She's always been a fire alarm screamer. And on this particular day, after screaming for about 10 minutes, she quite suddenly stopped dead. Assuming that she had just fallen asleep, I walked outside into the backyard about 10 minutes later to feed the dog. I looked through her window subtly to make sure that all was calm in her room. When I noticed a very strange thing, my daughter did not look close to sleeping at all. She was in fact staring intently at the ceiling. I watched her eyes move from left to right and so forth, as if she was watching something very closely. But there was nothing there. Not thinking all that much of it, I went back inside and continued on with whatever I was doing, thinking that she was just boring herself off to sleep. A few weeks later, something very similar happened to this again, except this time, it was in the lounge room. Heidi was sitting with me on the couch. The family dog was also in the room, sitting by my feet. As Heidi all of a sudden starts staring at the ceiling again, with much the same intensity as before in our room. This time, the dog joined in and was making much the same eye and head movements as Heidi was, as if they were both watching something on the ceiling move from side to side. The dog's hair then stood on the back of its neck and he started growling, which frightened me as he is one of the friendliest dogs in the world and wouldn't hurt a fly. Then, being a bit of a wimp, he got up and snuck into the next room and didn't come back for about a half an hour. This sort of thing has happened about three or four times since then, but nothing besides this has ever happened either. No apparitions or noises or banging. I've sometimes had the feeling though that we are not alone here. Nothing like this ever happens when my husband is at home. Only when I am alone, or with Heidi. A couple of days ago, it happened again. Heidi started off by staring at the ceiling, and then her gaze diverted to her toy basket in the corner of the room. She looked at me, smiled, looked back at the toy basket, pointed, and yelled, baby. The word baby doesn't necessarily mean baby to Heidi. She calls newborns babies as well as toddlers up to about her own age. I asked her where Heidi, where is the baby? There, she persisted, their baby. I shrugged and looked away again and hoped to dear God that she would stop pointing and looking at that darn toy basket. She did, thankfully, after only about a minute or so this time. What do you honestly think about this, fluke? or something more than just imaginative child playfulness. This website has mentioned dark, powerful energies such as imps, and I noticed the creator of this website has seen what could be called imps. Imps are described as devil spirits, who are demons, in small in stature. I've had many experiences throughout my life like the one the web creator had growing up. I don't like talking about them so much and do my best to keep it dormant, but I did read their story and I've had an experience with a small black figure that sounds like one of the imps described in that story. Me, my daughter and my wife all used to sleep in the same bed till our little girl was one and a half years old. Around the time my daughter was that age. I remember staying up till close to 1 or 2 a.m. watching a long movie. When I was finished, I went to the room and turned on the bathroom light to brush my teeth. Our room was well lit from the bathroom. Since around the age of three, I've had dealings with spirits as well. So, when I was about halfway through my brushing, I pretty much knew from that feeling I had that something was happening. I looked in the room where my daughter and wife were sleeping, and called from behind my daughter in a fetal position was a small black figure. It looked human, but it moved, behaved, and felt like it was something else. It looked towards me, got on all fours, 
and scurried across the bed lightning fast. I kind of jumped back, but it disappeared when it hit the floor. The strange thing was, after I got into bed, my daughter, eyes closed, still asleep, did the exact same thing the figure did before I went to bed, only my daughter stopped with her still sleeping face right in mine, then laid back down and was normal again. Some other things started happening after that, but I don't know if they're related. I hope my story helps you figure out what these things are. My story begins about three years ago. I was 27, and me and my husband were expecting our first child. We had been living with his mother, but since I had become pregnant, we needed a place of our own. My parents owned two houses, one in which they lived in, and the other right behind theirs. My oldest brother and wife and children used to live there but he bought the house right next door to my parents. Always wanted to stay close to our family. We're very close. Now that the house behind my parents was unoccupied, my mother asked me to move in. My husband and I gladly accepted. We would have more room and a place of our own. Well, the very next day we moved in, I was about 41 weeks pregnant and needed to go to the hospital to be induced for labor. We had a healthy baby boy. After our stay in the hospital, we returned to our new home. About four to six weeks after we moved in, I started hearing a noise in the middle of the night coming from the closet in our bedroom. My husband worked a graveyard shift most nights at the time, so I was alone at night with our son a lot. The noise was that of the closet door opening. I had put a long rectangular mirror on the closet door, those that are about one foot wide and four feet long. They had two hooks that went over the top of the door so as to hang the mirror. So every time you opened it, it would screech very loudly since the metal hooks rubbed against the door frame. Well, like I said, about four to six weeks after we moved in, I heard this very loud screech at about 2.30 to 3 a.m. I woke up and realized it was the closet door opening. It opened about four inches. We had two chinchillas that slept on the floor at the end of the bed, and I just rationalized it to one of them opening the door with their paw. But I know that would have to take some effort, since the metal hooks over the top of the door made it hard to open, and would make the door get stuck. I didn't really get scared, I just looked, then went back to sleep. About two weeks later, again, me asleep, alone, middle of the night, then the screeching sound of the closet door opening. I woke up, and this time, sat up and looked at the closet door. What just happened? I checked on my baby in his bassinet next to my bed, and he was fast asleep. I looked at the chinchillas, they were awakened too, and looking at the closet door, but had not moved. So again, I felt no fright and went back to sleep. Again a few weeks later my husband had a day off, so he was home that night, and again, about 2 or 3 am, the screeching noise of this closet door being pushed open from the inside. My husband wakes up and just stares at the door. Now he saw firsthand what I had told him about. The last time this happened was some weeks after that. Again, I was alone at night. I heard the screeching sound of the door opening, only it sounded like it opened a little bit wider than just four inches this time. I sat up and looked at the door. The chihuahuas were staring at the closet door as well. This time, they stood up. Then the closet door started opening a little bit further still. That set the chihuahuas off. One was barking at the closet door like there was no tomorrow, and the other ran under the bed crying and howling. Their reaction is what scared me the most. My heart was racing. I put my head under the covers. The closet door didn't open further, 
but it took me forever to get back to sleep. After that night, I was scared of the closet. I told my husband, and he put a lock on the door. I closed it and locked it every night. I didn't open it again. Only one thing happened after that. About a year later, the closet door became increasingly harder to close. It would get stuck, and I would really have to push to close it completely. One Sunday night, about 7.30pm this time, I again was home alone. My husband was working, and my son was with my parents in the house in front of ours. I was watching some TV, and I didn't like to leave the closet door open anymore. So I walked over to the closet door to try and close it completely. I was really pushing, and I started banging on the door with my fist to try and close it. It was almost closed. Then, while I was banging with my fist, right on the other side of the door there was a loud bang, as if someone hit it with their fist. It was right on the spot I was hitting it. I could feel the vibration against me. I stepped away from the closet door. I tried to stay calm. I'll try to sit down and watch some TV, I told myself. I sat down, but could not keep my eyes off the closet door. After about 30 seconds, I decided I couldn't stay in the house any longer. I left my parents' house in front of mine and left the TV on. Why did that scare me so much? I was fine when the closet door would open in the middle of the night. Was it because I was so sleep deprived from having an infant son that it was so easy for me to go back to sleep? The fact that I heard the banging on either side of the closet unnerved me so much. Thinking back, I remembered when I was 14 and my brother first moved in the very same house with my then 4 month pregnant sister-in-law and her 4 month year old daughter from a previous marriage. I remember shortly after they moved in, her telling me she thought the house was haunted. I asked why, and she told me that at night, she would see the closet doorknob rattle and turn. Oh, it's just her imagination, I told her. Even at 14, I would rationalize everything. I guess it wasn't her imagination after all. I later asked my niece, now 21, if she ever saw anything. She told me she did, which I later write about. This is something completely different to my experience, and I think it had something to do with her, and not the house. She also used to tell me that the closet door used to open in front of my brother until he confronted it. Then it stopped. Thank you for taking the time to read my story. I live about 20 minutes from an old cover bridge in Mableton, Georgia. This is one of the places I've been to in the surrounding area and where I had the most happen. In 2004, we went on a last minute hunt to the bridge. I know you're supposed to be better prepared, but I kept most of my things in the car at all times, just in case. We of course had heard the local legends and wanted to see for ourselves. So we headed down after about midnight. Even then, the traffic on the road was just heavy enough that we were unable to try the chocolate thing with the car. So we parked up the road a ways away at the Comet Trail parking lot. We walked down and took our flashlights with us. On either side of the bridge are orange street lights, so the bridge is lit up all the way through. One in the group brought her cousin and I didn't realize at first that he had been drinking, or he would have stayed behind. He got up in one of the bridge's windows and peed into the creek below. After yelling at him to stop, I realized I could no longer see the lights on either side of the bridge. Our flashlights also stopped working, all of them. After the temperature dropped and it became dark the way it did, I told others it was time to leave. We then saw the streetlights turn on for a second, and then in the distance, at the other end of the bridge, two kids dressed in formal attire, standing and hand-holding. Had to be about 30 seconds, but we saw it. We froze, 
then started back to the car. As we walked out of the bridge, we heard what sounded like little kids laughing, and they actually touched and poked at our backs as we hurried as fast as we could back up the hill. One of our group reported hearing a voice in his ear telling him to run. I have to say it was unsettling, and though I haven't been back to the bridge yet, it hasn't stopped me from going to other places. I've heard voices and gotten pics, and even had things happen at other sites. This one was one of the best ones, because I don't get physically touched by them often. I also believe nothing would have happened if he had not upset the spirits the way he did. I'm very much more careful about who I bring with now. Only one town over from our home stands one of the largest and most ornate railway stations in our state. The owners worked over 20 years bringing it back from neglect in a time gone by, as their second love is antiques. They have decorated it with period pieces throughout, now opened it as an outstanding restaurant. My husband and I often bring friends there to enjoy not only the wonderful food, but for the pleasure of watching them jump as the Amtrak fly by, only feet from the window. There is a very small organ that has been placed on a wall, not far from where we often sit. Several meals ago, our waitress entertained us by telling, some people have commented there is a ghost attached to this instrument. One said she saw a very small, frail old lady standing by it, saying, this isn't right, indicating dismay as to how our organ came to be sitting in an eatery. The waitress went on to say, they never like to work alone when closing up, as there's so many unexplained noises. We enjoyed a meal there today, and as always, our conversation turned into the many of thousands of people now gone that passed through these massive arched doors. Out of nowhere, I smelled a very strong odor of ivory soap. Mind you, we are eating fish, no one is passing by, and the other tables haven't changed their patrons. I say nothing, but a moment later, my husband smells it and says how weird it is. Such an uncommon smell today. It lasted for about three minutes. There was no explaining the smell. As we finish, we wander through the hall looking at various rail-related antiques and move on to the outside. There is an Amtrak train on the track, but it is going slow. Strange as they usually are speeding enough for an onlooker to feel their wind as they pass, heading for Boston. It comes to a complete stop at the station. A man in uniform gets out and looks at the front and then under. Turning to us, he says he thought he saw someone laying on the track. He walks about, making a full inspection. Then he gets in and then starts going. We see the riders in their seats. But as we watch, he stops again, just down the track, and repeats the inspection again. Strange day. This place should be investigated. This is my second entry in story. This takes place in Rusk, Texas in the 70s. This story comes from an acquaintance of mine, who is really more of a good friend of mine of my good friends. Mike and Katie were married and had two children. One was a nine-year-old boy and the other was a five-year-old girl. They moved into a house that had a shotgun-style layout. In other words, you entered into the living room and there was a straight hallway all the way to the back door with all of the rooms off of this one main hallway. Mike and Katie took the first door on the right as their bedroom while giving the children the last door on the left to their bedroom. One night, not long after the move, Mike and his wife were sound asleep when they were awakened by screams of mommy and daddy and turned on the nightstand lamp to find both their children wide awake and terrified. The children claimed to have seen a man with a hat on and a beard peering into their window. Mike immediately got his gun and ran around the back 
where I found an empty field and no sign of anyone having been there. At first, they were under the impression that this man had a ladder because the back of the house stood on a steep grade down and no one could be peering into one of the back windows without a ladder. But the occurrence repeated itself and finally, Mommy asked the kids to describe exactly what they had seen. Their stories were both told at different sessions and matched completely. What had woken the children was a strange light out the window and someone walking up and down on what sounded like wood boards. They said this man leaned over and looked down into the window and he had a shotgun in his hands. The couple moved the children to another room and Mike did some laborious digging into the history and county files in the house. Through newspapers and files, plus some additional info from some of the older townspeople, Mike learned that this house had once been at another location, and when it was moved, it was turned around so that what had been the front of the house was now the back of the house. He also learned that the man who had died at the house had been arrested and died in prison, for shooting his wife and her lover in their bed with a shotgun. I've sent in one other story about my mother's house in Illinois, but I have two more stories to share. I was raised by my grandparents. Their house has its share of odd occurrences, knocking sounds from within the walls, an apparition of my great-grandmother, and eerie feelings down the long hallway to the bedrooms. One night, I was around 9 in 1989. I was lying in bed, trying to fall asleep. My bed was facing the doorway, and I could see into my grandparents' bedroom across the hall. The hall is only about 4 feet wide. The only light visible came from a small night light in the outlet at the center of the hall. As I was tossing and turning, Trying to fall asleep, I looked out into the hallway and saw a young woman with curly hair, her body glowing faintly. She carried a candle in her cupped hands. She walked slowly and paused for a second and turned to look into my grandparents' room. Being the nervous child I was, I quickly pulled the covers over my head and ignored it, eventually falling asleep. Years passed and I never saw another apparition. When I was 16, 1996, I was still living there. I grew up in that house, 13 years total, and had moved across the hall, having switched rooms with my grandparents. I decided I would try an experiment. I found a dress similar to the one I saw the apparition wearing, so I decided I would put it on and sort of relive that experience. I had have very curly hair, and it was the same length as the apparitions. I put on the dress, grabbed a short white candle, turned off the hall light, lit the candle, and took the path that I had witnessed the apparition take. I took the same route, made the slow walk, paused at my old bedroom door, looked in, and walked into what was now my bedroom. Was what I saw a ghost? or merely a glimpse into my future? Was I seeing myself on some other intersecting point of time? I'm still trying to figure that one out. Next story. This occurred in 1997, while I was at a Native American ceremony in the woods in Nebraska. We had been out in the woods for about a week, living in our tents and teepees, ceremonies going on throughout that time. I heard the stories of spirits who lived in the trees, and being as curious as I am about the supernatural, I was nervous and excited to see what might be out there. For the first few days, things were normal, and I went about my business working in the cook shack, making large quantities of food for the huge number of people there. One evening, after dinner, I was sitting at a table with an aider, talking about the name he had just given me, Star Woman, for my love of looking at the stars for hours on end, when my right hand suddenly went ice cold. My mother was sitting to my left, and I said, wow, my hand just went freezing cold. There was no wind, 
and it was July in Nebraska, pretty hot, even after the sun went down. She said, oh, don't worry, that's just the spirit touching you. I can't recall the name for them, so I'll just say spirit. I think it was Wayne Guy, but I'm not sure. Okay, no big deal. Our tent was set up along the perimeter of the tree line, with an outhouse about 50 feet to the right. On several occasions, while walking to the outhouse, I noticed black human forms in the trees. When I'd shine my flashlight on them, they were gone. I attributed this to my imagination. A few days later, a friend who I'd brought along for the trip was sitting in my tent with me, talking about the day. I was on the left side, leaning back on my arms, with my lantern flashlight next to my left hand, about 12 inches away. It was the kind where you could pull up the body of the flashlight to reveal a lantern. We were talking, and we noticed the light shifting in the tent. There were no other lights, aside from a bonfire on the side of the camp at about 300 feet. I looked at my flashlight, and it was standing on its edge. All we could do was sit and watch it. It stood on its edge for about two minutes. Then we decided to leave the tent for a while because we were a bit freaked out. The flashlight had a rounded head, not a square one. My hand did cause the tent floor to dent in slightly, but my flashlight was nowhere near my hand or the dent I made in the floor. The light was literally standing on one rounded edge. When I mentioned it to my mom the next day, she quipped, they were playing with you, they must like you. I wasn't really scared, just a bit nervous, considering we were out in the wilderness with no lights. I was intrigued more than anything, considering the nature of the ceremony we were attending. I'm certain the spirits were focused by our activity. I hope to return to that spot in the future. This occurred in Miami, Florida in 1980 when I was 15. I still don't know if this was a paranormal experience, but it was unsettling nevertheless. I was babysitting for the next door neighbors one evening. Their daughter was down for bed, and I was in the family room watching TV. They had a small anchor biter type dog, and it went to the double sliding glass doors that led out into the rear patio and pool area like it wanted to go to the bathroom. All of the homes in this area had a screened in patio pool enclosure, and when you open the sliding glass door to step out into the patio, immediately to your left was a screen door that led into the backyard. Unlike most of the homes in my neighborhood though, the backyard was surrounded by a chain link fence. So I go and open the sliding glass door, which was completely covered by trays for privacy to let the dog out. The dog steps out, and I immediately hear the crunching of grass in the yard to my left, as though someone is walking in the backyard. Startled, I look to my left, and there is what appears to be a man, adult size, reaching out as if to open the screen door. I immediately slammed the glass sliding door shut, scared out of my wits. I stood frozen in fear in the living room, Silence. After a few minutes, I cautiously peered through the curtain onto the patio. No one there, just a dog sniffing around. I let the dog in, and he did not appear agitated at the least. I never thought much about it after that, until years later. If there was someone there, why didn't the dog bark? If it was supernatural, animals are known to get agitated, yet nothing. My imagination? Definitely not. Nothing like that ever occurred again in subsequent babysitting for that neighbor. When I was young, my grandmother owned a very old rustic country summer home in a small village about three hours away from the large city where I grew up. There was nothing particularly threatening about the outside of the house. To a casual onlooker, it just looked like an old quaint house, much like the majority of the houses in the village. During summer break from school, 
My parents would send me there, since my grandmother always took her vacations there, far away from the busy life in the big city where we all lived. Though I miss my parents a lot, and didn't get along well with my grandmother, I still, for the most part, enjoyed the large garden with its old apple trees, a berry orchard, and a large vegetable garden. The inside of the house had a very different feel to it. First of all, it was definitely very old and somewhat musty because it went unused for a large portion of the year. In one of the bedrooms where the wallpapers was peeling, you could see several layers of different color wallpaper, which makes me think that the house was owned by many people before my grandmother, though she had for many, many years. Though I had a sink, it did not have a toilet or a shower. Instead, there was an outhouse outside and an outside shower for summer use. There was one room in the house, which was added sometime after the original house was built. It was a slightly newer, open space with many windows, painted in a pleasant pastel color. It was located at the very back of the house. For some reason, my grandmother insisted that this particular room is where I would stay. If you were to simply look at it, you would find absolutely nothing threatening about this room. However, for some reason, I was terrified of staying there. My parents always remarked that unlike the other children, I was scared of nothing. I always slept with the lights off, never had any incidents where I was scared to be alone and never had any childlike fears such as a monster in the closet, etc. So, my parents found it highly unusual that being 8 or 9 years old, I was absolutely terrified of this room. I would beg my grandmother to let me sleep in the bedroom in the main part of the house, but she always told me that I was being silly and there was absolutely nothing wrong with the room. Yet at night, with the lights off, I couldn't help but hear unusual creaking sounds, knockings, and what sounded like footsteps after my grandmother had gone to bed. Having never been scared of anything, I would pull the blanket almost all the way over myself except for my eyes, out of which I could see faint black shadows moving along the corners of the room. I tried so hard to convince myself that I was just imagining things. The extreme uneasy feeling never let up. I felt like something in the room could physically hurt me if it chose to. I told my parents and kept asking my grandmother about the room, but my questions were sidestepped and I was always told that I'm just imagining things. And maybe it's because the room is sort of isolated from the rest of the house and that makes me nervous. And of course, I got the usual explanation of, it's just the house settling, etc. Since the house had no hot water, they couldn't blame the water heater. Things would go on like this every summer I was there. On a few occasions when I was allowed to sleep in the bedroom in the main part of the house, I felt much more at ease and was able to fall asleep much easier. In the other room, the uneasy feeling would keep me awake for hours, which was highly unusual for me since I never had trouble sleeping anywhere else. Yet, though significantly weaker, the effects of that negative energy permeated the entire house. To wash up before bed, we would heat water in the kitchen and put it in a basin. On numerous occasions, when I was washing my face or giving myself a sponge bath, since the only shower was outside. I had very strong feelings of being watched to the point where I would do what I needed to do as fast as possible and would turn to look behind me, expecting someone to be there. One particular occasion I remember very clearly. It was broad daylight and my grandmother went to the local market to buy food while leaving me at the house by myself. I was about to go outside to the garden when I heard a loud female voice clearly calling my name from the living room. 
utterly confused since I was supposed to be the only one in the house. I went to investigate. My grandmother was still out, and I confirmed that I was alone. Then I heard the same voice again, calling out to me urgently from another room. I was really freaked out and almost ran out of the house, but made myself go and see if anyone was there. I saw no one. When my grandmother got back from the market, I told her what happened, and she told me many people imagine someone calling their name when they are home by themselves. Even then, I thought it was an odd explanation since I never had an occurrence like that before, and actually, I haven't had an occurrence like that in the nearly 20 years since then. Sadly, since I was still a child, I never found out the history of the house before my grandmother finally sold it after she was too old to maintain it. I don't envy whoever owns it now though. Okay. One of my first experiences with ghosts was when I was about 5 or 6 years old. I was in Texas at my grandmother's house with my brother and cousin. We were sleeping in the living room and I heard kids playing in the background. Then I heard a man call my name. I thought everyone else was up and my grandma was waking me up. I stood up and opened my eyes and there was no one there. It was also silent. I thought it was a dream, but then I heard kids again, and a man's voice started to call my name again. I now knew that this wasn't a dream. I ran to my grandparents' room and told them there was a man calling my name and that there were kids playing. My grandma said I was having a nightmare and to go back to sleep. I got into bed with them and went to sleep. About an hour later, my cousin came into the room, saying that a man wouldn't stop calling his name. My grandma thought it was maybe a coincidence, and told us to go to sleep. Nothing ever happened to my brother. A few weeks later, we got a call from them, telling us that they were moving. My grandpa had gotten up about 1am to let the dog outside. And when he turned around, all of the dog's squeaky toys started squeaking, and there was a woman standing right in front of him, and it wasn't my grandma. They found a house and started moving as quickly as possible. We came down to help them. We lived in Oklahoma at the time, and my grandma told us that there was a family that lived in the house, and the dad and kids all died in the house fire. We never found out who the woman was though. Thank you for letting me submit my story to you. This is one of the scariest, but I have lots of them. For as long as I can remember, I've been able to feel and see spirits that no one else could. It took me many years to discover what this ability was, and that I wasn't alone. I don't remember my very first ghostly experience very well, but my mother does. She told me the story many times. I was three years old, and we were visiting my grandmother at her home in East Boston. I walked into the back bedroom, my grandmother's room, and then back into the dining room and asked my grandmother about the man in our room. She asked me to describe him, so I did. She turned to my mother and quietly said, she has a gift. She handed me a photo of her and my deceased grandfather and asked me if that was the man. I said yes, but he was skinnier now. My grandfather died of a brain aneurysm, a complication from a bout of meningitis in 1952, 34 years before my birth year. One year later, I was four. We moved into a new home, directly behind the house was the cemetery. We lived in that house for the next 14 years. There was a very heavy, eerie feeling that surrounded the stairs. Something watched you from the base of the stairs while you were in the living room, 
or at the top of the stairs. Every so often, there was footsteps and the sounds of someone falling down them. When he went to investigate, nothing was there. The basement was the worst place. It felt like something like a voice grip was squeezing your chest. I could never go down there. I was apparently the only one that felt it. My sister told me after she moved into her room down there that she never quite felt alone and she'd get this odd headache, then smell something really awful. My dad made sure everything was perfectly safe before she moved everything down. There was no explainable reason for her experiences. I've had experiences outside the house as well, in cemeteries, in other people's homes. Recently, I began to investigate haunted places in New England with my friends. Since moving into my current residence in 2005 though, I haven't had any experiences at my home. We lived in a small farmhouse with a huge backyard, and beyond the fence, an even larger pasture. I was 11 years old when we lived there, and we, the kids, would always explore the backyard, especially at night, and play hide and seek all of the time. One night, in this big backyard, I was alone and looking out at the pasture, when suddenly, I felt as though I was being watched and I turned my head to look at the house when I saw a transparent man looking at me and then he disappeared a few seconds later. My uncle had died when I was four, so I assumed it was him watching over me and ventured into the house and went to sleep. A few minutes went by with no strange happenings when I went over to a friend's house and spent the night with her. We had a little bit of a slumber party and ended up sleeping in the living room when she woke me up at about 3 a.m. in the morning, apparently scared out of her mind, and told me she had woken up to go to the bathroom that made her hair stand on end, then saw a shadowy tall figure of a man with a pressed suit on, no hands or feet, and some kind of burlap bag over his head with a rope tied twice around his neck. So naturally, I thought she was kidding around, trying to scare me, so I got up and ventured into the direction she was pointing. When I felt this strange sensation, and boom, like magic, he was there. I ran back and told her that I had too seen it, and she ran into her parents' room and got them out of bed, and naturally, they told us there were no such things as ghosts, and told us to go back to sleep. We lay in the living room a long time, just watching this thing pace back and forth and waiting for dawn so we could finally get some sleep. And about five in the morning, the visitor disappeared and we soon fell asleep. Never in a million years, if someone would have told me this would be the beginning of a 19 year old haunting would I have believed them. But that is exactly what happened. Not just to me, but to my friend also. It seemed that this ghost visited us every night at the same time for almost two years at first, just pacing the halls, then turning things off and on, changing TV channels and radio stations, swinging things in the walls, just little annoying things that at our age would scare the crap out of you. One of the scariest nights I can remember was one night at my house, we were sitting on the bed eating ice cream. When we both got that spooky feeling and fell silent and we smelled something burning for a second and then we heard the most guttural scary movie growl I've ever heard in my life. We threw our bowls and ran into the living room where I felt the need to spoil the beans to my parents. Of course, they told me we were crazy and that our imaginations were great. A few months later, I was still insisting to them that something evil was in the home and they kept telling me the same thing and began asking me if I needed help like counseling or something but I kept fighting with them about it. By this point, even my brothers thought I was insane. 
A few months later, my parents decided to move because I stuck to my story, and they were hoping that if they got me away from my friend, that my imagination would have worked overtime. We moved about 65 miles from that town to another farmhouse that was even older than the last one. The same thing was happening, only instead of pacing back and forth, the figure began to float to my bedside, lean its head to the side, and make noises like it wanted something from me. This was a nightly ordeal for a few months, and then it began to start touching me. I could never see its hands, but I could feel the icy cold prickle sensation that came with it, working its way up my bed, to my legs, up my body, and even surrounding my head. Most nights, I was too afraid to move and afraid to cry out, so I laid in my bed, silently weeping. This went on for quite some time too. Then it began to lay in the bed beside me and touch me off and on all night as though it was testing me to see if I was scared and trust me, I was terrified. But when 5 a.m. rolled around, proof he would vanish. After a few months of this, in a ton of lost sleep, I finally got the nerve up to throw a pillow at him and whisper yell at him, you know, things like what do you want from me, and he began to put his head to the side, even more, in grunt, as if he was replying what? Remember, the figure always had a pressed on pinstripe suit and some kind of burlap bag over his head, with a rope that showed to be strung around his neck at least two times. So, I never saw a face or even heard him speak, anything other than the grunts it was doing that night. But shortly after my temper tantrum, it left. Finally, a few nights of peaceful sleep, until I was awakened by heavy footsteps in the foyer, going through the kitchen, which was not like him at all, and then the burned smell again, and I was so afraid that I would hear the growl again, that I remember thinking, my parents would surely find me dead in the morning from a heart attack. To make a long story shorter, here's a list of things that happened. After that night, I never saw the burlap ghost again, but strange things and sounds and figures would keep me up all night. It was like an open portal in my bedroom. I would wake up scratched up, heavy breathing in my ears, pressure on my chest, Racing black silvery balls across the ceiling, red eyes racing through my room and disappearing, laughter, waking with my arms bruised as if someone had grabbed me, something cold that I always assumed to be a hand, because I felt something like a huge ring hit the bottom of my foot, grabbed me by the ankle, and almost slung me out of bed. A Bible was slung across the room and landed on my bed as I had taken to the habit of filling my room with religious items. In one night, so much activity in my room that my younger brother was awakened and came in only to turn white and started screaming. And to this day, he will not tell me what he saw. So on to the future. I turned 18, still struggling with this haunting or whatever you call it, and joined the military and it still followed me. Even being stationed in Iceland, it was still up to no good, and my best friend, who was also my roommate, would say things like something is not right, and it was doing all of its little tricks again, like turning things on and off. But she seemed fascinated with it, so I told her the entire story, and she didn't seem to mind. She had just wondered what I had done to have this happen to me. Finally, a few years of peace without one thing happening. I'm now 24 and live with my boyfriend in our three bedroom, two bath house. And nothing. Another year of peace when he tells me one morning that he felt like he was being choked in the middle of the night and he has some bruises on his arm. I say nothing because I don't want him to think I am crazy, but it keeps happening, and then I wake up, look at the clock, and it's 3am again, 
and something is breathing heavy in my ear. I got up and went into our guest bedroom in nothing. So I fall asleep for what seems like a few hours. But when I wake up, it is only 40 past 3. So I attempt to get up and I can't move. Something is strangling me and hitting me all over. I struggle to get up, but I can't move. I can't even scream. This went on for about 15 to 20 minutes and proof the struggle is over. This time, the attack is so severe that I consider calling a team of specialists out to see what it is, but I never did. Shortly after that, my boyfriend and I split up and I moved to Oklahoma to be with my family and nothing has happened since. Once in a while, I get a strange sensation, but I don't think about it twice and just keep doing what I'm doing. And it has now been about two years since anything out of the ordinary happened. There are many more things that happened during this trying period of my life, but for me to write it on here would take a year at least. For those of you who read this and think I'm crazy, I can only say that maybe someday, my little brother will tell me what he saw. My fiance had just died in our townhouse. This was in 2002. He had offed himself in the head. I went back later because I couldn't go back there for a while after he had died. Anyway, I went back and I kept feeling hand brush across my forehead. One night, I was in bed and was about to fall asleep when something grabbed my foot and was pulling it downward. I freaked out. I was the only one in the house. Then, I had a friend come over because I was afraid to be alone because of these things happening. My friend was downstairs and I was upstairs coming out of the bathroom and a dark floating figure floated right by me. It almost ran into me and would have had I not stepped back. It telepathically told me it was not here for me and that it had gotten what it wanted and also would not look directly at me. I somehow felt like I was being protected by God and the thing was actually afraid of me. I didn't feel scared. Later on in the month, I took a bunch of pictures of the townhouse because I wanted to remember the good times where my fiance had lived and been very happy together at one time. I was planning on moving because the memory of his death was just too much for me and I always had this creepy feeling there since he had died. After I got the pictures developed, there were 120 photos in all of several different rolls of film of different things and then the one that I had taken pictures of the inside of the town hall. Out of all these photos, I had taken three of the exact place where he had died, and only those three photos were what appeared to be flames right in the place where he had passed. It almost looked like the portal to hell. Seriously. To this day, I cannot explain those pictures. They were taken with a very expensive camera. No other photos I had developed before or after that had ever had those flames in them like that. Just the three that were the exact location of his body when he died. My name is Malin and I've just turned 21. I live in Sweden. In my parents' house, I've experienced some strange things that I really can't explain. My sister and I have always felt that there is a presence other than us. My parents don't believe in that kind of thing and have always told us that it's just our imagination. One of the first things I remember is that my father had gotten this stuffed animal that looked like E.T. He got it from his students as a present. I must have been about four years old and had recently seen the movie with my sister and for some reason I thought that E.T. was the most scary thing I've ever seen, so I didn't like this doll at all. In our basement, there are a lot of different rooms, and one of them 
We had a huge box filled with stuffed animals. Every time I went down there, I took the E.T. doll and put it in the bottom of the box under all the other stuffed animals. But the next time I went down there, the E.T. doll was lying on top of the others again. This happened repeatedly every time I went down there. It didn't matter if I waited two days or two minutes. I of course asked my sister and my parents about it, but they swore that they had nothing to do with it. Of course it could be so that they lied to me every time I asked them, but I find that hard to believe. Anyway, I solved the problem a couple years later by giving the E.T. doll to one of the guys in my class. I constantly heard, and still hear, cracks and other sounds in their house, footsteps, and sometimes voices. They've always been there, and I guess I got used to it, but it took a few years before the next big thing happened. I was 15, maybe 16, and had moved down to the bedroom downstairs. I didn't like sleeping downstairs, but it was either that or a tiny room upstairs. One day, I was sitting in my bed, writing in my diary, when I heard a knock on my door. I was surprised because I was alone in the house and hadn't heard either the car nor the door open. I said come in, but when no one entered, I got up and opened the door, but there was no one there. I thought it was strange, but went back to my diary. I had hardly any time to pick up my pen before I heard another knock. This happened a couple of times and really scared me, so I locked the door and crawled under the covers. Then I heard scratching outside and froze, just to hear meow, one of my cats. At first I thought it was my cat who had caused the knocking, but I've never met a cat that can actually knock that hard. Another time I was in the bathroom upstairs, I just finished washing my hands and was outside the bathroom when I remembered that I left my watch on the shell in front of the mirror. I turned to go get it and took a step into the room when a bottle of lotion literally flew off the windowsill and landed in front of my feet. The window was closed and there was no wind to speak of outside. If the bottle had fallen off the windowsill, because it was placed unstable. It would have fallen right down in the cat's litter box, but instead, it flew almost 13 feet. I calmly went out of there, closed the door, and got into my room and locked the door. I've also seen a boy in the basement, a teenager. He's not transparent at all. He looks as real as you and me. I've only gotten short glimpses of him, but I know he has brown hair and a green shirt. For some reason, I most often see him around Christmas and other holidays. I wonder why. Even though some of these things scare me, I've never felt threatened. So I guess whomever or whatever is present in my parents' house doesn't want to harm us. I'm one to be afraid of the dark, but there are feelings I get. Feelings that tell me to get out, almost a communication with my location. The basement has been home to incidents experienced by me and my slightly older sister. My experience is weird. I went downstairs to retrieve something for my mom, when just when I was near the stairs, an opaque dark shade of gray temporarily blinded me. Whilst running up the stairs and wiping my eyes, I swore I heard something. My sister heard something too. She was on the downstairs computer once. It had basic features. She swore she heard something whisper something close to her name. My sister sprinted upstairs as well. Finally, my parents' room. I come in on rare occasions like when the light and TV is on, or when my mom or dad are watching a good movie. My room is on the other end of the hall. I need to pass my parents' room, 
when I pass their room. I see strange things at the end of the bed. I see dark, almost impish figures. Once, I could have sworn I've seen red eyes. Now, for the sound, it is very creepy, yet inconclusive. I have no idea what the sound actually is. Once, when the family and I were in the living room, I heard a broom sweep in the back of the house. Weird part, there was no broom in the back of the house. Plus, just today, on 3-20-2008, I heard something in my room exhale. I know it wasn't me. That had freaked me out. The feeling. I think I may actually have been touched too. Once, when I was 8 or 9, I was watching a show on Urban Legends. I felt something run something gently down my back. It was around 10 or 11, but it got up anyway, and I went to the living room where I found my mom. I told her what happened, but she just said it was just a curtain. I lived in a home in North Salt Lake City that my children and myself had many experiences over the years that we never could explain other than the supernatural. My husband, myself and two children lived in this house for over 12 years. There's a family that now lives in the house and I do not want them to cause any problems by giving them out the address of the house. I will say that the house is located on 5th North my children attended Jackson Elementary School when they were young and graduated from West High School. My daughter was sleeping and thought she heard her name being called and when she opened her eyes, there was a man with a beard sitting in a rocking chair holding a hat in his lap. My daughter's bed was hung from the ceiling with chains and her bed was four feet from the floor. My daughter said the man turned his head towards her and grinned at her. She also said that her rocking chair was even with her bed and was four feet off the floor. She told me she pulled the covers over her head and when she peeked out over the covers, he was gone. My son told me of a man with a beard and a top hat sat on the end of the bed. My son heard his name called and when he even looked in the direction of the speaker, the man sitting on his bed, the man grinned at him. My son pulled the covers over his head, and when he looked out, the man was gone. I was alone in the house for a few days, and on two different nights, I was awoken to the sound of music, violin, and tinky sounding piano. The lights were on in the kitchen in the front room, as I entered the kitchen from my bedroom, the music stopped and the lights dimmed, and as I entered the front room, the lights dimmed, and I found myself standing in the middle of the front room in the dark. I heard footsteps in the stairwell, and when I got to the bottom of the stairs, the lights were on upstairs. I started walking up the stairs, and with each step, the light got dimmer. And about at the fifth step, it was now dark upstairs. I could write about many other things that happened at this house. We never felt anything evil with our experiences. And it was always our own fear that scared us. I believe the house I grew up in was haunted. My family all makes jokes about how it was just all my imagination. There were several different occurrences throughout my childhood, nothing on a regular basis, but frequent enough for me to believe that something paranormal was going on there. I lived in this house from birth until 18 years old. I am now much older, and I still believe what I saw and felt was real and inexplainable. As a child, I always woke up in the night to get a drink of water or a snack even sometimes. I wasn't overweight, but it was a running joke in my house that I always had to get up to get something to eat at night. On several of these occasions, I would walk out of my bedroom down the short hall and into the living room 
where we had one of those old TVs that when you turned them off, the colors would dance for a short while and then go out. My parents were early to bed, early to rise, so I know the TV couldn't just shut off, but I would go out and there would be a human face made from those colors that actually would just swim around when it was shut off. I watched the TV during the day and it shut off and always watched to see what the colors did, but they never made the face during the day, only at night after the TV had been off for hours. The second occurrence that freaked me out completely was on one night. I was standing at the refrigerator, which was on the same wall as the doorway that led down to a small landing, which is where the back door was, and the stairs to the basement were. I always felt watched downstairs and couldn't stand going down there at night, even with all the lights on. I could do it fine during the day, but at night, it freaked me out. Anyway, the night I'm speaking of, I turned my head to the doorway. The only illumination was the light from the refrigerator, and there was a fully formed person peering around the corner from the side that would have been coming up the stairs. The horrible thing about it was that at first, I thought it was my stepdad. But then I got a look at his face a little closer, and it was his face, but almost evil looking. I swear it had red eyes, but that could have been a misinterpretation of what I saw. I ran back down to see where all the bedrooms were, and I peeked in my parents' room, and he was still in bed. I've never found an explanation of why it could have been his likeness, but I know it was definitely scary. About two years ago, my boyfriend Luke and I were at our friend's house. He lived about a half an hour away from us in a small beachside suburb called Two Rocks. To get there from our house, we have to travel down a road called Winero Road. It's a very long winding road and has no street lights. Lining the side of the road are white gum trees. These stretch on for a few kilometers. A lot of people have crashed their cars on this road. Most end up as fatal crashes. There are quite a few crosses, especially in the white gum area. Anyway, it was about one in the morning when we decided to head back home as we were both really tired after a long day. We turned, as usual, onto a narrow road and were chatting to each other about what to do the next day when we reached a high-end death toll area. Luke always slowed down near here because there's so many windy sharp turns that you have to be careful. As we were driving, I looked out of the window and to my absolute astonishment, there was an old man walking down the road with a bag in his hand. I pointed this out to Luke, but he just thought it was some weirdo who had one too many to drink. About a minute later, Luke slammed on his brakes and we skidded around, doing a 180 degree turn. We had both just seen the same man, carrying the bag run out into the road waving his arms. We sat dead silent watching where he had come from, but nothing was there, just the trees and the butte men. Not far away from where we had stopped, there was a white cross where an old man had flipped his four-wheel drive and died instantly. On another occasion near the same spot, I saw a young girl, about 17, wearing blue jeans and standing next to a white gum tree. Luke didn't see her, but I can remember that she looked sad, almost lost. There have been a lot of claims from a lot of different people about the white gums on Winero Road, mainly about figures darting out trying to make their vehicles come off the road, or of an old man walking along carrying a bag. We don't travel down that road anymore. They've built up a new road that's more convenient for us. A few other things have happened to me in the past 18 months. I just bought a new kitten not too long ago. 
And she is always very alert when she is in my bedroom. Usually, she will cuddle up and purr or go to sleep. But in my bedroom, she can't settle down. A few weeks after we got her, Luke was working a night shift and I was home alone in bed because I'm not fond of being on my own in a dark house. I decided that my kitten would stay with me in my room until Luke got home. At about 11 p.m., I just finished watching a movie on the TV and grabbed the kitten and headed to bed to read a book. I was a few pages in when Lottie, my kitten, started trying to hide underneath my arm. At first I thought she was just getting comfortable, but that's when I noticed she was hiding. She then started to walk up onto me, looking up at the ceiling. Her pupils were huge, and her ears were back, and her tail was wagging angrily. I tried to settle her, but she started to follow something along the roof with her eyes. I looked up, but couldn't see anything, so went back to reading although I was very uneasy. Lottie kept following this invisible thing for about a half an hour. Then she eventually went to sleep under my blanket. From then on, when I'm alone in my room, I always feel uneasy, like I'm being watched. Okay. This isn't the first supernatural type thing that I think I may have experienced, but it is the only one that I know for sure was real. My best friend moved here to Kentucky when I was in kindergarten from Chicago and moved next door to me when I was about 10. After that, me and her were always together and always spending the night with each other, loved her parents to death. That particular night, she had spent the night with me, and it happened to be her other best friend's B-Day the next day. Well, maybe about 2 o'clock that day, we went over to her house to ask her dad if we could walk down there, as I was just down the road. Her mom was at work, by the way. I waited outside. When the door slammed open, and she was screaming, there's something wrong with my dad. I went in, and he just looked like he was sleeping. He had his arms crossed and everything. I'm glad he went peacefully. He was pale, and I touched his arm to wake him up, and he was cold. At that point, I knew he was gone. We ran to my paps, and he came over and called an ambulance. The rest is all just heartache and pain, like that comes with any death. I felt like it was important to tell you all that because it really is relevant to the rest of the story, or at least, in my opinion, it has some correlation. Okay, now on to the creepiest moments. I was spending the night with that same friend and I asked where the mouthwash was and this was probably about three or so months later. She said her dad had some in his dresser, so I went into his room. I stood there as she looked, and suddenly, we heard this rhythmic knocking all down the side of her house. It was really fast and complicated. We freaked out and ran to her room. I think he didn't want her going through his stuff. Well, that's all that happened for a very long time. The last experience, her dog is chained up in their fenced in yard and it was in heat and my male dog got in her yard and no one was home, so I rushed over there. They really didn't need any more puppies and opened her gate to get my dog that somehow got in there and I heard his voice again very meanly shout hey, so I freaked out and ran again. The main thing I'm wondering about is that knocking. It's really odd. I think about it sometimes, but I mean it shouldn't bother me anymore. But it does. If you have any ideas as to what this is, please speak up. I 
I live in a small residential neighborhood in Western Kentucky. My family has resided in our home for 37 years. We're the first home to ever be built on this property, as the same with several other homes in the area. Since day one upon moving into the house, we have been plagued with numerous experiences that quite frankly can't be explained. They are loud banging noises that echo from between the halls, strange odors ranging from the distinct smell of death to a light scent of lilies and roses. Strange shapes of a blackish gray smoke clinging to the baseboards, voices that echo through the entire house ranging from the intensity of a deafening shriek to the softest of whispers. Shadow people walk the house day and night. Strange bluish green bars of light extend from room to room. Balls of light that chase each other around the ceiling. Full body apparitions, plain as you and I. Things disappearing, sometimes returning in different parts of the home sometimes never reappearing. Cold breaths in your ear, an unmistakable touch that chills you to the bone. Several homes in our neighborhood have also stated similar events. Several of the people that have admitted strange occurrences in their homes have been very religious, God-fearing people, with no reason to lie about their situations. Something is happening here. Upon researching our area, it was discovered that back in the early 1700s, this area was an old Indian burial ground. In the mid-1800s, it was decided to put in a real cemetery. The old graves were destroyed and the remains were disposed of. A new cemetery was started in its place. However, in the 1960s, it was decided to move the cemetery once again due to flooding issues, and a new subdivision was to be put in its place. Being a contractor for our city, my father was offered a reasonable deal on one of the first homes to be put on the land, an offer too good to turn down. Our house was finished on June 14th, 1972. We moved in on June 21st, 1972. It wasn't until recently that my father told his children that he worked for the crew who removed the graveyard. Some of the graves are so damaged by water erosion that they could not be moved, so they were left, and the homes were built on top of them. Even as recently as 10 years ago, less than 5 miles from my home, a family was putting in a swimming pool while excavating the backyard. Several Indian bones were unearthed. The family sold a home and moved. Mysteriously, when several homeowners started asking for copies of our area's records, the records suddenly vanished without a trace. Here are two instances in which I experienced ghostly activity. They're not very long stories, but I think they're very interesting. So here goes. I really don't know if you keep up with your website, but if you do, back in 2004, a couple of buddies and I went to Thompson Creek Trail. We started down the trail. My friend and I were at the front of the group. We had flashlights and we were flashing them at all the really dark areas of the trail. We had passed an old looking house to our right at the beginning of the trail. Shortly after, there was a curve in the trail, and in the bend of the curve, there was a tree. It was really dark at the trunk of the tree, so I was kind of scared, and I shined my light on it. The image that had projected from my flashlight was of a very tall man and was standing very close to the tree, and a shadow was cast onto the tree trunk. It is a fact that no one was in front of me. My friend had also seen the huge shadow of a man. I've been to a lot of places on your website, and this was the only one where I'd actually seen something, and it scared the living crap out of me. 
on to my next paranormal experience. For me, I've always believed in the paranormal, though I've never had any experiences of my own until very recently, including the one I just told you about. I met a new friend at school, and he told me his house had spirits in it. He and his family had all something happen to them, i.e. seeing figures, hearing voices, unusual odors, and poltergeists. They even hired a priest to bless the house, and also a psychic. I never thought I would have something happen to me, but me and my mates were watching a movie in his room, and suddenly out of the corner of my eye, I swore to God that I saw a shadowy figure in his mirror, and when I turned my head, it kind of stepped out of view. I thought this was weird, because usually I can tell my eyes were playing tricks on me, but this time it just seemed different. Another experience I had was when I was on the computer alone, and my friend was downstairs. While I was on the computer, I thought I was hearing many voices, like the background noises you hear in a restaurant. I could hear very faintly. Now because of these experiences, I don't like being alone in this house. What I want to do next is to actually try to do ghost hunting in this house. So there you have it, my two experiences. I hope you thought they were interesting, because they scared and terrified me. I just moved back from Long Beach, California, from Vancouver, Washington. A longtime friend named Alan offered me one of his bedrooms, in which I could stay, until I got back on my feet. That night, I felt something sitting on my chest. I remember being too afraid to open my eyes. Whatever it was, it did not move. Then, I opened them and witnessed a flow of whitish looking vapor protruding out of my chest. It went up above the bed towards the ceiling in shape of stretched out rings. It looked similar to smoke from a cigarette. It just hovered over the bed in circles and then began to stretch and exit towards the kitchen, which was next door. I did not dare tell Alan about this experience because he is such a skeptic. I can predict his very words. Ernie, I don't have any idea what you're talking about. You must have dreamed it. He says there's no such thing as spirits, or even a god. The very next morning I told Jim, one of the tenants, what I experienced. I just had to get it out of my system. Will someone please hear me out? He had told me that a man named Ron had been staying in that very room and that, when he discovered that he had some type of incurable hepatitis, he hung himself from the refrigerator door in the kitchen. That really didn't make any sense to me, but he explained that Ron had somehow did this by tying his belt around his neck and then somehow sliding on the floor. According to Jim, Ron received a letter from UCLA about a month later, stating that he was to come to UCLA immediately because they now had a treatment for his type of hepatitis. If he'd only waited one more month, Jim told me that he believed Ron had tried to inherit my body when I was sleeping, as in, tried to possess me. This incident, however, never happened again. I do recall one time waking up at 1am in that house and hearing a repetitious sound coming from the garage. I looked out the window because the garage had a window, but it was dark. The next day Al was in the garage and I asked him what he was doing in the garage at 1am. He said, I wasn't in here. Why do you ask? I told him what I had heard, a repetitious sound from the night before. Then, something made me focus on a small machine that sat on a shelf. I asked Al what it was. He told me that his previous tenant named Ron used to do laboratory work and that the machine was for polishing rocks. There was still rocks in it. It had a handle that turned. 
When I turned it, I heard the same sound that I had heard in the morning. I told Al, but he said he must have been mistaken. No one was in the garage last night. It was locked at night, and only I have a key. I said no more. After my brother had died in his home, my family gave it to me to live in. It was an older mobile home. One day, while on my PC, which faced the same wall that my door was on, in fact, my desk was next to the door. My desk is huge, and a bigger desktop than most kitchen tables are. So sitting at my desk, I can see part of the hallway while reading, typing, or whatever on my PC. One day, I just happened to look up at the door, and there came a figure of a man. I could only see his shadow on the emergency door and wall outside my bedroom. He was either bald or had some very short hair. I just sat there and stared for what seemed like several minutes, waiting for him to either come into my room or say something. It finally turned and seemed to go into the bathroom, which was on the other side of the wall, or went in the wall towards the kitchen and living room area. They are both open, with no wall dividing them. I was there alone, except for my dog Chewy, who is very large, over 160 pounds. I got up to check it out, because from what I saw as a shadow, it didn't look like anyone I knew. I walked by the bathroom peering in, and he wasn't there, so I kept going. When I got into the kitchen, I saw Chewy on the couch, looking out the window at the kids who had just gotten off of the school bus and were walking home. He would have barked, even if he had known whoever the shadow was. He never made a sound. There was no one there, not even in my son's bedroom. I checked everywhere. If he had gone outside, I would have heard the door open and close. The only time my brother ever had short hair was when he was in the Marines. The only other person who had no hair or short hair was my father before he had died. The chemo and radiation treatments for cancer had done that, and both were dead for about four years, both dying about four months apart. So far, this has been my only encounter with a shadow person or ghost. I never really knew they could or would show up like this. This past year, my daughter who works in a nursing home was telling me they have seen shadow people there too. They seem to be only showing up in this one hall section. I believe she said it was where the patients who weren't doing so well stayed. One patient even complained about being there in that hall. He said they kept bothering him and wouldn't leave him alone. When they moved him to another hall, he quit complaining. He did eventually die several months later. I did see this happen on Ghost Hunters too, where they saw a man shadow like a figure on a locker. They've mentioned shadow people a few times on there too. Now, I suppose you're wondering if I were scared. For some odd reason, I wasn't at all. I just wish I knew who it was. I know dogs have a sixth sense too, and I still wonder why my dog didn't seem to know he was there. Chewie had never met my brother or my father. Even if he knew them, he would have barked at being excited. Someone came to visit. Hello. I want to submit two amazing experiences that I witnessed that involved children. Many people believe paranormal experiences by children are hard to explain away because they do not know about the supernatural and have no reason to lie or embellish their stories. The first one involved a friend's son who was about four at the time. My hubby had surgery at a very old Catholic hospital which dated back more than a hundred years and he had been placed in a private room with a private bathroom to recover. We were in the part of the hospital that dated back to the 1940s. My friend and her son dropped by to check up on my hobby. He 
He was sleeping off the amnesia and me, my friend and her son, were sitting in chairs next to the bed. I was chatting with my friend, and her son was looking across the room into the bathroom, and he started smiling, and he waved. We thought he was waving at my hubby, and his mom told him that Mr. Rob was sleeping and could not see him wave. What he said next stunned us. He said, Mommy, I'm not waving at him. I'm waving at the lady in the bathroom. The bathroom was empty. She told him no one was in the bathroom, and then he said, yes, there is, and again, looked over in the direction of the bathroom and smiled, and waved again, and said, her name is Karen. We were both creeped out, because he really looked like he was seeing someone, and considering that we were in an old hospital, there's no telling how many people died there. The second one involved my son. When he was about three and a half years old, he started seeing the babies, as he called them. It started one night when I tucked him into bed. As I started to walk out, he began to giggle and wave at the ceiling. I asked him what he was doing, and he said there were babies and he pointed to the ceiling. I asked what they were doing and he said they waved and smiled at him and made funny faces or played peekaboo with him at night. He didn't seem at all scared. In fact, he enjoyed it. I chalked it up to imaginary friends. However, over the course of time it became more real for him and for me. Many nights, he woke me up because he was laughing so loudly and even talking to the babies. He told me once that he never got scared at night, because when he felt scared, the babies came to help him go to sleep. In fact, he never cried at night, and never came to my room at night, asking to sleep with me. Those of you with children this age know this is amazing. He would sometimes insist that I lie down and watch the babies, and he would make me wave, and say hello to them. I would indulge him and do it, but again, I really thought they were imaginary. These visits continued for about a year, and finally one night, I wanted to push for more information, so I laid down with him and brought up the subject of the babies, and I asked him how many were there. His answer made me both very happy and sad. He said, there are four, and they said they know you, Mommy. The reason this was so shocking was that what my son did not know, of course, was that I had suffered four miscarriages before we adopted him. I was happy that the babies had come to let us know they were okay and happy, and that they liked their adopted little brother so much, and took care of him by comforting him when he was scared at night, sad. Two, because I could not see what they looked like, but I believe one day I will meet them. My son continued to see the babies for about another six months, and then one day, he told me as he was getting into bed that the babies were finished. I asked what he meant, and he explained they were finished because he was a big boy, and he could go to sleep by himself now. He has never even spoken of them again. When I was about 15 years old, my dad became the manager of a pub. I won't say the exact pub, as he does not run it anymore. The pub is located near Sheffield in England, and is on a county road. The pub is converted from a farmhouse and barn. To get to the pub, you come off the country road and follow a small track, only about a half a mile, until you reach the car park. The first night we stayed there, we all slept in rooms as the pub was also a small hotel, with about six rooms spread over two floors. The first night, I stayed in room number three. When we started to go to bed, the family dog wanted to come into my room, and I laid on the carpet, and would not move, 
Even when my dad was shouting at it to leave, the dog did eventually leave to go and sleep in the corridor. But soon after my dad closed his door, I opened mine again to let the dog in. Now, this dog is a Rottweiler with a head as big as a boulder, but the poor thing could not get any closer to me and really did not want to be on its own. I should mention that my parents divorced and at the time, I only saw my dad on the weekends. So the next time I went to stay there, I stayed in room number four, just to set the scene. If you come out of room number four, it's the right as an emergency exit with a push bar to open the door, which leads to the fire escape stairs, into the left, leads to a staircase, which leads to my dad's room, in a spare room that was not being used at the time for little more than storage. Eventually around 3 a.m. ish, I turned the TV off but kept the lights on. My dad started leaving the dog in the pub area downstairs and blocked the door leading up to the bedrooms. I think he didn't want the dogs in the bedrooms as he wanted to start letting guests stay in the rooms. I was not comfortable at all in the room. I did not want to turn the lights out and I tried to keep watching TV. Eventually, around 3 a.m. ish, I turned the TV off but kept the lights on. My dad had started leaving the dog in the pub area downstairs and blocked the door leading up to the bedrooms. I think he didn't want the dog in the bedrooms as he wanted to start letting guests stay in the rooms. Anyway, the dog was going crazy, barking non-stop. I was far too scared to go down and see what was up. I then started hearing the emergency exit bar and the door outside my room rattle as if someone was trying to open it, but they were not pushing hard enough to open it. Then I heard footsteps really loudly running down the stairs from my dad's room and I saw shadows pass under the door of my room. I felt relieved. I thought my dad had come down to go and see what the dog was barking at. The next day, I asked my dad what the dog was barking at last night when he went down, and what he said sent shivers down my spine. He said he had no idea, he had never heard the dog, and never went downstairs at all during the night. After some research, I found out that a woman many years ago had slipped down those stairs and fell down them, breaking her neck, and she died instantly. There was one instance when my dad's partner, her son and I came home, and the pub was in darkness. This actually frequently happened as well. The lights would go out all by themselves, and my dad, who previously was an electrical engineer, and more than capable of rewiring a house on his own, could not figure out why. Anyway, we come home. I can't remember why the pub was closed, but it was. We just had a quick scan around to check no one had broken in. Don't forget, the pub is in complete darkness, there's no light, and right at the back of the small restaurant area, we could see a man sat at one of the tables just staring at us. He was just solid black. Other things started to get lighter. The flowers on the table, for example, and the chairs, but this figure remained solid. We panicked and ran upstairs and stayed in one of the rooms till the lights came back on. It was not a burglar. The next morning, we checked everything and everything was still in its place and all the doors locked. The kitchen area of the pub was a big room, which was the old barn, and that was the worst room of the house. You could constantly feel like someone was watching you and walking past you. Whoever was watching felt angry, as if they were annoyed because you were there. No one wanted to be in this room alone. My dad had a few waitresses and bar staff leave because they felt very uncomfortable working in there. Again, after a bit of research, we found out that the farmer who lived in the farm hung himself in the barn, which is now the kitchen, and to be honest, I don't think he left. 
Objects would constantly go missing. Spoons would turn up again bent out of shape. And get this, the whole kitchen was cold. Even when we had cookers on, we still had to wear jumpers in there. My stepbrother and a family friend were staying in room number seven, the storage room I mentioned earlier. During the night, one of them, Neil, thought that the other, Jim, had gotten up and was leaning over him as if to check he was okay. And to make it a bit more confusing, Jim had thought that Neil had gotten up during the night and leaned over him. They both said that they were half asleep, but through their haze, could see a figure standing above them looking down. A few other things happened, such as a football came rolling down the length of the pub to where me and my stepbrother were sitting. It literally then stepped on the spot about a foot away from us. No one else was in the house. The back door to the pub was locked at night, but every morning we would find it open, but the lock was still in the locked position. The actual bar that locks into the socket was still sticking out. There is no way it would have opened. The lock was new and undamaged, but this kept happening. This happened about a month before my dad moved out. Anyway, my dad eventually gave the pub up. His partner didn't want to stay there. The dog was never the same. It became a very tame dog, but it did start to get a little better after my dad moved out. Okay, so I've always fancied myself as to be a little in tune with the paranormal. I had an experience this weekend which sort of confirmed this, as my daughter was with me and experienced the same thing at the same time, so I know I was not imagining this. A little history first. My grandfather's sister passed away at the age of 93. She still lived in the house that was purchased by their father, my great-grandfather, in 1903. It is on the historical registry in our town, a very old beautiful home which has been in the family since then. She was born and raised in this house, married and lived in this house until the time of her death about a week ago. Her father was killed in a train accident, and her mother also lived in the home until she died. After the memorial service, my daughter and I went over to the house to get the food ready for family, which was coming over after the funeral. We were alone when we walked into the house, and I immediately got a feeling of a presence with us. My hair stood up on my arms, and I really felt like somebody was in the room with us. My daughter looked at me and asked if I felt that. I said that I did and confirmed it when we both stopped talking and closed our eyes. You could really feel it. We got really spooked and I told my daughter that if it was someone with us, it was indeed family and that they would not hurt us. About that time, an overwhelming scent of lily of perfume permeated the air. It was the weirdest thing. My daughter smelled it, as did I, and we just looked at each other in disbelief. It lasted for about a minute or so, and then dissipated. At this point, I was totally freaked out. I called my aunt in Texas and told her what happened. She told me that was most definitely my great-grandmother, as she wore that type of perfume and was indeed a real lady who had tea on the porch every day at 2. It was about 2 when we entered the house. She also said it would make sense to her that she contacted me as I was the oldest female hire to the family name. I know now that there are things that cannot be explained, but this has really gotten me shaken up. It just makes me wonder what she was wanting to tell me. A side note is that her son has recently mortgaged the family to pay his mother's hospital bills and they could possibly lose the house. Do you think maybe she was trying to contact me for this reason? Guess I will never know. This happened to me while I was living north of Great Barrington, Massachusetts, somewhere between 1966 and 1969. 
We had moved there from the Midwest when my dad changed jobs. We were living in a very old house, close to an ancient cemetery. The house was three floors, not including the basement, enormous, and once had a vandral all the way around it. The attic was huge, dark and mysterious, all floored with rough floorboard. It had a tiny window near the chimney and a trapdoor in the ceiling leading out to the roof. My parents forbade me and my siblings from going up there and never told us why. My bedroom faced south, the front of the house. It was the only occupied room in that upstairs wing. At that age, I was between 12 or 14 years old. The old house gave me a galloping case of the creeps. Even on the brightest days, parts of the house could be dim and drafty. Winters are very cold and dark there. At that time, the house was heated with forced hot water that came up from the basement furnace. As the steaming hot water traveled its way all over the house through copper pipes and baseboard radiators, the noise was phenomenal. There were only four thermostats for the entire house, so at the far end of any hallway, there would be a sharp cracking, banging noise as the cold pipes and surrounding woodwork expanded with the inflow of heat. In the middle of a cold, dark, windy night in January, the sound could wake you out of a sound sleep, heart pounding and hair on end as it echoed all over the dark house and up the staircase. Their church down the street had an ancient clock tower that struck every hour, adding to the strangeness. Sometimes, I would awaken with the start in the middle of the night, feeling as though someone was watching me as I slept. It would be a long time before I could go back to sleep. It was on one of these nights that I had a dream about a little girl, standing at the foot of my bed, watching me as I slept. I say dream, because to this day, I'm not sure if I was awake or asleep, having fallen asleep before this happened. She looked to be only about eight years old, and had long, shoulder-length dark hair that was braided, plaited, and tied with ribbons in a hairstyle I had never seen before. She was wearing what looked to be a pale pink dress, so formal that it looked like some sort of party dress. It was pulled up at each side with large satin bows at her hips and all kinds of fancy laces, buttons, ribbons, and what looked like little puffy sleeves at the shoulders that went down to her wrists. The skirt stood far out, full on either side of her, and went past her knees. It looked as though she was wearing lacy pantaloons, white stockings, and old-fashioned little shoes like slippers. She held her hands folded, copped over the other on her waist. The overall effect would have been very beautiful for a little girl, but what struck me were her eyes. They were large, dark, and looked like she had circles under them. She was so thin, and her face didn't look at all healthy. I could see her cheekbones. She was not smiling. She was very serious and sad. She just stood there, watching me. I was too afraid to say anything. Then she slowly bowed and made a slow, graceful curtsy. It was a beautiful gesture, like something a ballerina would do. She slowly stood erect again, slowly walked to the closed door, turned its knob, and went silently out into the hallway outside my bedroom closing the door behind her. That's all I can remember. Long after this, I was outside the house, almost directly below my bedroom window, where that massive veranda had once been. There were low-growing conferious bushes of some kind. I was exploring around when I tripped and turned my ankle. I sat on the ground where I fell, rubbing my ankle and trying to find the rock I'd tripped over so I could dig it out and get rid of it. The rock was large. As I dug away at it with a stick and kept digging deeper, the rock kept going down 
and stopped about eight inches under the earth. I dug all around it and realized it was a tombstone about 18 inches long by about 10 inches across and maybe three inches thick. I was able to lift it up and check both sides of it. The surfaces were blank and laying face down under about four inches of soil. I left it alone. My parents said they didn't know anything about the tombstone, so I decided I wouldn't tell them about the little girl in my dream either. It was about this time I decided to try and figure out why they didn't want us up in the attic. I went up there when no one was around to try and see what I could find. There was absolutely nothing up there from what I could see by the dimness of the one bare light bulb that switched on with the pole chain just within my reach. I had also brought a flashlight so I could see into all the corners. Nothing was there. I was about to leave when I noticed something sticking up out of the insulation material that had been put there decades ago for the ceiling of the floor below. I dusted the layers of debris off of it and stifling a coughing fit, looked closely at what was in my dirty hand. It had once been a hat box covered in rich yellow silk. The remains of a crushed hat in what I now realized was a Victorian style was still inside. It had been richly covered in the same shade of yellow, almost golden silk flowers. It was designed to fit a little girl. I went farther into the corner and found nothing else but my foot scraped the heavy dust and uncovered something lying flat on the wooden floorboard. It was a round metal circle, with more round metal rings inside of it increasingly smaller diameter to the very center, which was open. It was an open space, about ten inches across. There must have been more than a dozen of these graduated metal rings, each separately covered in what had once been white cloth and sewn with four long pieces of heavy cloth tape from the outer ring to the smallest ring in a large X. I had no idea what it was. I put both things, the crushed hat and the hat box and the strange ring thing, back where I found them. Sometime after that discovery, my parents were at an antique store in Great Barrington to look at furniture. While they were occupied, I went to a lady who worked there and described to her what I had found in the attic beside the hat. She said the strange ring thing was a set of hoops for a little girl's hoop skirt and they were common in the mid-1800s. They would have been the era in which the house I was living in was built, I thought. So, something happened to a poor, sick, lonely little girl living in the house back then. No one would tell me about it, and I never learned anything more than what I mentioned here, but she had visited me late one night in my dream and evidently didn't want to be forgotten. We moved back to the Midwest in the summer of 1969 and never came back to Massachusetts. It's been 17 years, but it still happens to this day. It happened on a summer night on the back road connecting Mount Clare to West Milford, known to the locals as Alfie Hill. The area had very few houses at the time, and one house stood out, a brand new gorgeous home right at the crest of the dirt road. The man who lived there built it for his wife, and they had a daughter who was, I believe, around eight years old at the time. I remember traveling the road, more of a cow path really, and watching the home being constructed. Once it was finished, it always looked so pristine and happy, but one night, I was coming through this patch, black stretch of land, and saw the mother and daughter in the middle of the road, both in what looked like nightgowns in a mud puddle. I could see them standing there as I approached and the moon seemed to shine on them alone. When I got to them, they disappeared in front of me. I wasn't alone in the car, so I asked did anyone else just see that, and everyone just sat there, 
too scared to answer. By the light of day, early, early, I was crossing back across the hill and saw six, maybe seven police cruisers and an ambulance. Crime scene tape everywhere and one covered figure in the grass by the house and several officers crouched by the road beside where the mud puddle was the night before. Apparently the man had long suffered from depression and killed his wife and daughter before running to the house and killing himself. The officers said that they speculated he had committed the act the night prior to them being discovered. Still, on summer nights, you can see the girl and her mom looking down into the middle of the puddle in their nightgown. My husband Steve, brother and myself, were staying in a condo at Sunrise Village in Killington, Virginia to go skiing. It was in April of this year, and there was a special on the Fox News channel entitled, Does the Devil Really Exist? or something of that nature. It must have really affected me, as I later dreamt that my husband and I were before the devil, and he was going to decide which one of our souls to claim. I was making an argument to spare Steve and take me instead. I remember waking up as someone was grabbing my left calf and tugging on it. I looked around and saw my husband was just coming into the bedroom from the bathroom and he saw my distress as I was waking up and shouting for him to turn on the light as I was waving my hand around me to see if I could detect any cold spots. I enthusiastically read all I can on the paranormal. I vividly recall the hand, fingers and thumb wrapped around my left calf. It was a warm hand, and no without a doubt it wasn't my husband's. He was in the bathroom, or my sleeping brother on the living room couch. I was sleeping, tucked in with the sheets and blankets tucked under the mattress. I think whatever it was, was trying to wake me up from a horrible dream. Perhaps my father who passed away five years ago prior. Don't know. What I do know is that my husband believes it was a dream and he won't accept any other explanation. This infuriates me to no end. I know it was real. Thanks for listening and keep up the good work on your website. It's great. I've got another experience I thought you might find interesting. In October of 2006, I got orders to move from Arleson Air Force Base, Alaska, to Peterson Air Force Base, Colorado. My ex-wife and I decided to drive because we didn't want to get to the next station and not have a car. We spent the weekend with her relatives in Wasilla, then made the drive to Haines Junction and stayed the night. We really didn't sleep well that night. The room was rather uncomfortable. So we left at like 500 and began the trip to Canada. We took the Alcan, Alaska Canada Highway and pushed into the Yukon Territory, stopped and had a rather awful lunch. But my daughter, who was a year old, needed to get out of the car for a while. We pulled into White House around 1800 and decided to stop for the night. We chose the best Western hotel, mostly due to the military giving us a list of which hotels were best for us to stay in, and that was one. As we were checking in, I noticed a rather cold spot by a cartoony statue of a Canadian Mountie. Mind you, this was October and things were getting cooler, but not that cold. I believe we had a room on the sixth floor and let my ex-wife and my daughter get settled while I brought in the things we needed for the night. While I was making the trips to the car and back to the room, I learned that this Best Western was once a saloon and brothel. I'd mentioned the cold spot to my ex-wife and she had stated that once she had made the trip to Alaska in 02. This was two years before our marriage and I did not know her before 03 that she had stayed on the fourth floor and experienced similar cold spots and orbs. 
Well, we decide to have dinner, then turn in. We had been in the car for over 12 hours, and we sorely needed a seat after the awful night before. My ex-wife said she had forgotten something in the car, and for me to get it, as she was going to give our daughter a bath and put her to bed. I went out from the restaurant in the hotel, and as I was walking in the entrance to the hotel, I kept feeling cold spots in various places. I also felt like someone had brushed up against me, and like a hand on my shoulder. Of course, no one else was around except the front desk clerk. It got stranger as I came back in after getting what it was. I have since forgotten and got on the elevator again. I got this feeling like I was being watched or something was there with me. Now, I was the only one in the elevator, but for some reason, it stopped on the fourth floor and when the doors opened, an odor of tobacco filled the area. This is a non-smoking hotel and what can be best described as a wet dog smell filtered through the hallway. When I finally got back to the sixth floor, these cold spots seemed more spread out than before, and I swear I saw some floating orbs in the window overlooking Whitehorse. By this time, it was around 1930 to 2000 at night. Of course, when I looked again, nothing was there. I also heard something that sounded like someone banging pots and pans. Obviously, there was no one there and you weren't allowed to bring such things into the hotel. I got back to her room and told my ex-wife about it, and she said she had a similar experience in O2 without the pots and pans banging noise. We slept the rest of the night without any further disturbances and decided to head out at 6.30 while I was loading the car. It was still kind of dark outside. I swear, I saw what looked like a prospector from the latter part of the 1890s. Of course, when I looked up, he was gone. When I went back into the lobby near that cartoony Canadian Mountie statue, the cold spot really intensified, and when I got to the area where the elevator was, I saw someone out the window, and I thought nothing of it. But once I got closer to the elevator, I noticed that the person was wearing Victorian era clothing. He passed by the window and disappeared. Again I told my ex-wife, and she by now was picking up on animal spirits as she called them, and she was telling me it was time to get moving, but she noticed the intense cold spot by the statue as well, and like our trip to Rika's Roadhouse in Alaska back in 04. She was quick to get out of the hotel with our daughter and get to the car while I checked out and brought the bags out. Again, I felt something brush against me and something touch my shoulder. However, this time, the hand felt cold and clammy almost. Of course, I turn around and no one is there. Just that cartoony Mountie statue. We get out of there okay without any further strangeness, save for a feeling of sorrow. Then, of course, I found out it was a saloon and broth from the Alaskan Canadian Gold Rush of 1898, which could explain several things, but it was the first time I actually feared spirits and ghosts, and that was because of my daughter, who was a year old at the time. Again, my ex-wife and I would talk about this till our divorce. It was probably the first time I've ever felt animal spirits. This is a personal experience that happened to me two years ago in Charleston, South Carolina. I'm in the Navy and had just got off the swing shift on base, leaving at approximately 11.45 p.m. from the base. The base I was at is on an old plantation's land but I never thought anything of it. The part where I worked at was on the water of the nearby river, and the road back passed along the river for about a half mile before turning inland. 
Fog had a tendency to build up on the river in the fall, in winter months, and the fog had rolled across the road on this particular night. As I was driving along the road coming back from work, I saw a man running on the side of the road. This was nothing special on a military base. People run all the time to keep up physical condition, but this was almost at midnight, which I found strange, and he was wearing nothing reflective at all, seemingly wearing all dark clothing. As my car came up on him, he immediately darted out in front of the car at a speed I'd never seen before. I slammed on the brakes, but it was too late. I expected to hear and feel a massive thud as I hit this poor fellow, but as the car passed through him, he vanished without a trace. I got out of the car, brights on, searching with my flashlight for a person anywhere around my car, but I was the only one as far as I could see on this road. It scared the living daylights out of me, to the point at which I started searching inside of the car to ensure I did not have a hitchhiker with me now. After getting into the car, I drove as fast as I could, with interior lights on in the car, to the nearest well-lit area, locked the doors, left the lights on, and called my father to relate the incident. After some 20 minutes of consoling me, I finally got my wits about me to drive home. However, it did not end here. From this night on, something was different about my apartment. There was a presence in that place that I haven't felt the months before the incident. I began to review sitting in the living room alone altogether because of feeling like someone was watching me. Out of the corner of my eye, I would see the bathroom light on, clear as day, but when I looked over, it would be off again. It would feel like someone would sit down next to me on the couch, but I was the only one in the apartment. Finally, one week and my father came out to visit. Growing up with numerous ghostly and at sometimes demonic experiences, most of which he never talks about, he has become highly sensitive to the paranormal. The first day he arrived, he was the key I left him to get in while I was at work. When I got home, having said nothing of my experiences in the apartment to him, the first thing he asked me was if I ever got the feeling someone was in the kitchen area, peeking over the half wall at the television. I froze in my tracks at this. Over the course of his week-long visit, he said he also thought he saw the bathroom light turning itself on and off and felt someone else sit down on the couch next to him, as well as seeing a shadow of a man mainly around the kitchen area, who would periodically lean over the half wall like he was looking at what was on the television. But he said he never saw or felt anything or anyone in the bedrooms. I now had a reason for my seemingly unfounded paranoia of being in the living room alone. I continued living with this feeling from the night of the incident, driving home through the following few months until I received orders to leave Charleston and have not felt the presence of the running man since then. When I was little, about five or six, we lived in a big house which was originally two cottages, later joined together. Although myself and my sister were young at the time and had no personal experiences, my parents told us stories about what happened there when we moved house some years later. As well as the familiar cold spots, creaks and groans, some other stuff went on too. One day, my mom was in the downstairs bathroom when she heard a man's cough coming from outside the door. Thinking it was my dad going into the study room, which was opposite the bathroom, she thought nothing of it. When she came out of the bathroom, however, the study was empty and no one was outside. She went back to the kitchen and found my dad where she'd left him, sitting at the table. 
She asked him if he had come out the bathroom and coughed. He hadn't moved the whole time. Another time, my mom, my dad, and one of their friends were sitting at the kitchen table. When they all heard a massive crash come directly from upstairs where my bedroom was, my mom described it as the sound of a wardrobe falling over or a full-grown male adult being thrown to the floor. They rushed upstairs to find me fast asleep and nothing out of place in my room. We even had the fireplace in my room checked. In case a stone had fallen down the chimney, nothing was found and there was no explanation. Everyone in the house was accounted for. One night my parents were in bed, when they heard the sound of a woman gently humming and singing. The sound came from the end of the corridor and continued downstairs, then eventually stopped. Again, this could not be explained. Myself and my sister were asleep, and even if we did get up, we certainly would have walked down the corridor singing. My second story is based in my grandmother's house, a manor house which is around 200 years old. My grandmother has a story which even to this day she swears was true. She was walking upstairs when in front of her she saw a pair of women's shoes on the step above. She looked up to see a skirt, blouse, and before she could see the woman's face, she vanished. My dad's family all grew up in the house, and my uncle mentioned that from his bedroom, he used to hear the sound of gravel crunching outside, like someone walking towards the house. On several occasions, he even recounts seeing two big black dogs sitting by his bed. Although I like the house, I always get that feeling of being watched whenever I go over. If I'm sat in the kitchen, I always want to look into the parlor, which is next in the kitchen, with the door always open so you can see in, and I always feel like someone's sitting in there. Even to this day, I refuse to go upstairs by myself, as well as seeing a key moving in a locked door. From the inside, when no one was in there, myself and my sister had a weird experience. We were sat outside. The garden is kind of placed on a hill, very sloped, that you could reach by climbing some steps. From where we were sitting, we could just see into my grandmother's bedroom. She had gone out shopping and had left her two dogs on her bed. We were just watching them, talking, when suddenly, one of the dogs started barking at the corner of the room at something we couldn't see. She, the dog, then jumped onto the bed and started barking directly at us. Then, at the exact same time, we both saw a white mist, sort of in the form of a hand, move gently over the dog's head. He then stopped barking. My sister and I both looked at each other in surprise. We'd both seen it, but could not understand it. It was daylight, but not sunny, quite cloudyless. There was no reflections on the glass or anything like that because there was nothing to reflect, no trees or anything behind us, and we quite clearly seen the mist from the inside of the window. While serving at RAF, Middle and Hall with Yusaf, 1993-1994, I lived with a roommate from Santa Rosa named Greg. Santa Rosa is located in New Mexico. We both originally lived in the dorms on base, but got special permission from our first sergeants to move off base together. This was due to the fact that we did not drink alcohol, and drunken parties were a constant among our roommates, and in the dorms, in general, 24 hours daily as airmen worked three shifts. We were both practical-minded Air Force aircraft mechanics with serious responsibilities and not given a flight of fancy and had no previous interest or experience in the paranormal or occult. I simultaneously dated an Englishman I would later marry named Bill. 
The cottage only had a coal fireplace for heating. Greg did all he could to keep the coal stoked, but the house never warmed, and coal always died out quickly, despite large piles of coal Greg stoked well often. The phone rang at various hours day and night, with a loud, hissing static. There was a faint, but unmistakable sound of someone whispering loudly through the static, but the words were always unintelligible. Calls to the operator to discover where the calls came from were answered that we had not received any phone calls at all during these events as far as the phone company was concerned. The calls simply came from nowhere. Reg worked a night shift. I worked days. Every night, I heard heavy footsteps come up the stairs to the bedroom landing four square feet, and back downstairs after varying lengths of pause. When I was home at night, these heavy footsteps occasionally went into Greg's room. When he was at home, he heard the steps enter my room a few times. 500-year-old stairs creaked very loudly beneath thin carpet when no known humans were using them. The human footsteps could be heard anywhere in the cottage. These phantom footsteps were much, much louder and projected a foreboding emotion to the roommate at home when they occurred. The rocking chair in the living room near the fireplace rocked off of its own accord on a regular basis. Once, Greg and I were simultaneously TDY or assigned temporary duty to separate bases for a few months. We locked the cottage down tight as a drum. A friend agreed to check the place from time to time, but as all doors and windows remained locked, he never went inside. I returned before Craig did. Every object in the kitchen that could be moved, such as culture, dishes, pots and pans, bread bins, knickknacks, whatever, were taken by someone and all dumped in the middle of the living room floor. Nothing was missing. It was simply transported to the middle of the living room and unceremoniously dumped there. At other times I was TDY and Greg experienced occurrences more often and more intensely for him when I was gone. However, his worst experience happened unbeknownst to me while I was deep inside the cottage. One night, as Greg went out to his car to go on duty, he saw what are sometimes called a shadow figure, but in much more detail. Greg was not bothered by the unmistakable occurrences in the cottage until he met this thing. It was blacker than black, the outline of a large adult male, about six and a half feet tall, be his estimation. No facial or other features except glowing eyes that looked at Greg in such an evil way. Greg said he was scared to death. He claimed without hearing a sound that this thing was unmistakably evil and had ill intentions, to say the least. Greg got in his car, a true British yellow mini, and sped away as soon as he could. There is a broken down shed directly behind the house in the backyard. Both Craig and I looked into it from time to time but refused to enter until one day we agreed to go in together. We both experienced an unexplainable strong sense of being watched from up close, though no one else was on the property. The sensation we both agreed at the time was an evil one. We both thought we heard heavy breathing, but neither one of us wanted to jump to the conclusion and appeared to the other one to be easily duped by what we couldn't explain. There's a storage area on the side of the house that cannot be accessed from inside the house. Only by the door outside the storage area, attached to the side of the cottage. Craig and I both hardly dared to look inside after our first time inspecting the property. There were no electrical lights in the room. There was junk and building materials scattered around as if someone dumped everything from the ceiling and materials changed positions 
from time to time. Occasionally, the taps, faucets in the bathrooms upstairs, turned on and off on its own accord, yet both hot and cold tap levers were always in the off position. Every unexplained occurrence was of an extremely strongly sensed nature. It always got our attention, except for the static phone calls and the chair rocking itself. Most activity took place when there was only one roommate in the cottage. Neither Greg nor I had ever experienced anything paranormal before. At least, he had not anything to this degree. Of the photos taken inside and outside the cottage, there is nothing remarkable. No orbs, light streaks, vortices, apparitions, etc. The Englishman I was dating and later married was a complete skeptic, but strongly disliked being in this cottage. He would only state, something is wrong with this house, something is strange about it. For his degree of skepticism, that was quite a statement in itself. When a man with a young teenage girl moved into the other side of this duplex cottage, Greg and I decided to warn her, without giving anything specific away about the occurrences, so we weren't planting suggestions in her mind, knowing teenagers are very impressionable. We simply welcomed her, made chit chat, then told her when she was alone if she was ever uncomfortable or frightened, telling us she was in her bedroom alone when she audibly heard a voice call out for her. She had no history of hallucinations, swore she did not mistake it for a conversation she heard through the walls, which would not have occurred for that night Greg was on duty at the base, and that the voice was male, not matching Greg or myself. Shortly after this, I moved in with my fiancé in a nearby town, largely to get away from the occurrences, and soon lost touch with Greg entirely. The paranormal occurrences in the cottage were constant, in one form or another, and experienced intensely. It carried a heavy pull of fear or, at times, dread or terror everywhere in that cottage that never ever left. Never anything that could be called benign or benevolent. In the summer of 1996, I bought a large home in a nice, older neighborhood. My fiancé lived with her parents at the time she was still in college, and I was living with my parents since I'd just gotten out of the army. We were really looking forward to getting married and having our own private place. The first night in the house felt very strange to me, but I chalked it up to being a newlywed in a new home. As time went by, the strange feelings did not abate as they thought it would. I felt more and more apprehensive, especially when I was in the house alone. The house made very strange noises when I was there by myself that it didn't make while Sandy was home with me. Also, I asked Sandy if she heard any strange noises when she was there alone, and she said she didn't. I tried to ignore the noises and apprehension, but it was getting harder and harder from the upstairs. There were just the two of us in the house, and the bedrooms upstairs were only used for storage. The footsteps seemed to pace back and forth in the upstairs hallway. Sandy claimed she never heard any of the sounds, and was calling me paranoid and crazy. At first, the footsteps were confined to the upstairs, but eventually they came downstairs and into our bedroom. Whatever was making the footstep noise would come up to my side of our bed and stand there for several minutes before walking straight out of her room. I heard other strange noises in the house, like the sound of an animal growling and scratching noises in the walls. Someone or something knocked on our front door one morning at 3 a.m. so loud that I thought the door was going to come off the hinges. Of course, Sandy never heard anything and accused me of trying to scare her. I began to see small, 
black humanoid figures darting in and out of the corner of my vision. They would shoot behind furniture or duck into some rooms when I tried to lay my eyes directly on them. I saw them during the night and day and began to see them more often and often. I would often get this odd feeling that someone was behind me and if I quickly turned around, I could see one or more of those things run away. One day, when I turned around to try and see the little black things, I saw a large black thing at the other end of the hallway. It was about six feet tall, and though I could not make out any features, I could tell that it was a human shape under a cloak, and it did not run away. It just stood there for several seconds to let me get a good look at it, and then it slowly disappeared. I saw that apparition several more times over the next few months, always standing some distance away and just looking at me. I was really getting scared, and it came to the point that I did not want to go home at night. The experiences were taking a huge toll on our marriage. Sandy would blame me for scaring her with reports of things that were not happening in her mind just to cause trouble in our marriage. She would not begin to convince that I was truly scared and that something was really happening, even if she did not experience it. We stayed married for a total of 30 months before she moved out of the house and filed for a divorce. But here's where the story gets even stranger. The day she moved out of the house, the frequency and intensity of the experiences began to diminish. That night, the footsteps did not come downstairs like they always had in the past. I saw the large black apparition only one time after she moved out, and that time it was translucent, as opposed to being completely opaque as it had been before. It also did not stick around as before. Once I saw it, it vanished. Four months after she was gone, all the activity ceased. The house was quiet and still, and I no longer felt that apprehension I wrote about earlier. I've since remarried, and we live in the same house with our children. I thought that the experiences might return once I brought my new wife into the home, but they didn't. If they had, I would have sold the place. It had to be something associated with Sandy. Maybe she was into the occult or something. I spent plenty of nights with her in her parents' home when they were away, before we were married, and never experienced anything like what happened in the house. Perhaps it was the combination of her and the house that was the problem, but I hope not. If it were, then that means the same thing could happen again, and I don't want my family subjected to that. I'm writing to tell you my story. I was reading Dave's story, and it's so close to the experience that I had that it actually gave me chills. My first paranormal experience happened to me when I was four years old. All the experts say the things that happen to someone before the age of five is very hard to remember. The funny thing is, is that I can remember my experience like it was yesterday. My mother, sister, who's three years younger than me, and myself. I remember being asleep in my bed and waking up very suddenly. I looked at the doorway and I saw this full-bodied figure. The only thing is that it was completely white. I'm not talking like white, like a white wall. I'm talking white like energy. This figure to me was a child. The reason I believe this is actually because of its height. I mean, it did not have a face or anything like that. It walked towards me and got on my bed. I remember pulling the blanket up over my head because I was so scared but I actually felt it on the bed. At that point, I ran screaming and crying into my mom's room. Her boyfriend got up and walked me back to bed to show me there was nothing to be scared of. 
when we got there. It was gone. Now let's fast forward to the age of 17. By this time in my life, my mom had gotten married. Not the same guy from when I was four. And they had bought a house. It was a tri-level with a full finished basement and a sub-basement. From day one, something felt very odd in the house. Almost like a very heavy, unwelcome feeling. The sub-basement was probably the strangest. When you would walk in there, you could see spray paint all over the walls. I know that's not strange, but when you stood in the center of the room, you could see that the spray paint was actually covering up what looked like writing on the walls, and it was also on the floor, so that was kind of creepy. We had two dogs that both refused to go into my room and constantly would either stare at the wall and bark or would stand at the stairs and bark up to the second floor or down the stairs to the basement. The longer I lived in the house, the more I began to feel almost alone. It was like I was becoming isolated mentally from everything in my room. It would constantly feel as though I was being watched. I would hear loud bangs and things sounding like they were hitting the floor, but nothing would be around. All the motion sensor lights from the outside of the house would turn on all at once for no reason. I mean, I actually began to think I was going crazy. Finally, I broke down and told my stepdad everything that had been going on. He looked at me very seriously. I remember thinking, oh crap, he thinks I'm nuts. He began to tell me about how one night, after I'd gotten home from work, he worked second shift and didn't get home till around 1 a.m. We were sitting on the computer playing a game. At the time, our computer was in the front room and you could see right up to the stairs and onto the landing where the bedrooms were. He said he saw a man walk out of my room. The man he saw was a taller man in a pair of jeans and a flannel shirt. At first, he thought it was me because he only saw the man out of the corner of his eye. But then he asked how I was doing and looked up and realized the man wasn't me. The man turned and walked back into my room. My stepdad ran up the stairs and opened my door and I was the only one in there and I was asleep in a pair of boxers. After my stepdad told me this, I was convinced something was going on. One weekend, while my parents were out of town, I invited two of my friends over so we could try to catch stuff on film. Of course, we got absolutely nothing, that is, until we tried to go to sleep. We had all decided to sleep in the basement because there was more room there. We turned off the lights and started to go to sleep. My one friend, Chris, was already asleep and myself and Dave were talking. All of a sudden, the light to the sub-basement turned on and we could see what looked like a shadow under the door. You could actually hear what sounded like the work boots walking up the wooden stairs. We woke up Chris and we all stood at the door. We really thought someone had broken into the house. We opened up the door, prepared to beat the crap out of someone, and there was no one there. We walked downstairs and looked around. We checked the windows and everything. The windows were shut and looked like no one was there. There are a lot of things that happened, but it would be like writing a novel to tell them all. I just thought it was kind of creepy how similar my story is to Dave's. This experience happened when I was in my late 20s, back around late 1994 or early 95. I was laying in bed asleep. I felt something touch my face and I woke up. I was face to face with a smiling old man. He crawled backwards out of my bed and stood there smiling at me. He 
looked like he was Caucasian descent. In his 80s, at least, he had a glowing light all around him. He looked like he was at peace while staring at me. I have no idea who this was. Furthermore, I don't know why I wasn't afraid of him. He definitely looked scary to me, and I had roommates at the time. I don't know why I didn't go running down the hallway to get someone. I just stayed in bed and stared at him. Again, I wasn't afraid at all. It was almost peaceful. He faded away, and I looked at the clock in front of me. It was 3 a.m. in the morning. I stayed up a little while, and then went back to sleep. How do you talk about something like this? I didn't tell any of my roommates when it happened. I was fearful because I thought I would be outed as a crazy person. I did call my best friend, and thankfully she seemed to believe me. I gave her my rocking chair, and she wanted to make sure the spear was not standing next to it. So yes, I think she believed me. I've thought about it a lot over the years, trying to figure out who this could have been. I told my grandmother, she's Catholic, and thinks it was an angel. I've never met my father, and I have no pictures of him, so I don't know what he looked like. But perhaps, maybe this could have been my father? My mother is Spanish and French, and supposedly, my father was of Caucasian descent like the spirit of the old man. So again, maybe it was the father or grandfather that I never met. Who knows? Since then, I've now had a husband and children. I mentioned it once to my husband. He looked at me like I was crazy, and I'm not allowed to talk about it again. Anyway, thank you for reading my story. I know it sounds unbelievable, but it's the best I can do to tell you guys. These are two experiences that happened to me about five years ago. Here is the first story. My house is six years old and has never been lived in by anyone else. This started about two months ago. I am laying in my bed alone with the door to the hall and the door to the bathroom open. I swear I see the door open a little bit and then go back to where it was. I then see black figures with little or no shape appear in the doorway, then whoosh, they are gone. I also saw what looked like people I knew, who will stick their heads in the door and then turn and leave. Last night I was asleep when I felt something nudge me two times. I woke up to see this black form standing beside me. It stood there for about two seconds then vanished out the door. The most interesting aspect of this all is that these figures have no legs. They are just a black oval shape with no faces or arms, just a black form. Last night was the first time it really scared me. I felt like it was the Grim Reaper asking me to follow it. Now on to my next experience, which was even spookier I might add. I was working in a gym at a hotel in Moodsburn near Glasgow. One night, I was getting ready to leave for the night. The route I had to take was down a dark corridor to the main door. This was a walk I had made many times before and had never any problems. But this night, as I was going along, I felt like I was being watched. As I got to the end of the corridor, I turned to close the door when I saw what looked like a white shape running towards me. Needless to say, I closed and locked the door very quickly and sprinted to the bus stop outside the hotel. The next night, I was working again and decided to see what could have caused it. I went through every possibility I could have think of, from car headlights to interior lights. 
but nothing recreated what I had seen. About two days later, I was looking through the old accident book when I found an entry from three years before. A man was running on the treadmill and died of a heart attack whilst using it. What was interesting was, it was the same date and time of when I saw this incident myself of the running man. This happened to a friend and I back in the mid-1960s, when we were 12 or 13 years of age each, and we were camping with our church group, and while we had some free time, Alan and me, me as in Mark, decided to do exploring on our own, so we set off towards the perimeter of the park, where we found a fence that we could easily squeeze through, surrounding the park property and bordering some large open cow pasture land was a grove of trees right smack in the middle of it. We set off across the pasture land towards the grove of trees, and much to our delight, for it was a hot day, we found a meandering stream in the grove of trees that was about six feet deep and about six feet wide, and it wandered all throughout the grove. But to our dismay, Alan and I realized that we were wearing blue jean pants and a t-shirt and had not brought along our swimsuits since we were not planning on going swimming until later when the springs in the park was less crowded so we had nothing to wear to go swimming at that time but Alan convinced me that there was nobody around to see us and we could go swimming like they used to do in the old days by going swimming in the nude or skinny dipping and nobody could tell we had nothing on. Once we were in the water, and not wanting to be labeled a coward or chicken by my friend, I quickly got undressed, and we dove into the cool water. We swam around in the water for about 15 minutes, when we were startled to see a young boy, about our age, dressed in some dusty old fashioned looking overalls, and barefoot, staring at Alan and me from the bushes, and even though he probably saw we were both skinny dipping by our clothes hanging from the bushes, neither Alan or me felt embarrassed about it. After all, all of us were boys, and Alan got bold, but staying in the water, Alan said hi to him. The boy came out of the bushes, but didn't get near the banks, and he just stared at Alan and me for a solid 20 seconds. All we could think to do was ask him if he wanted to go swimming with us, but at this point, I don't think we realized it was a ghost at the moment. We just always thought it was a kid that always hung around this area, and just wanted to play because we were playing around. But then, it was like he had simply vanished again. Helen and I did not wear glasses, and our vision was perfect and we're looking straight at the boy as we climbed out of the stream. And like I said, the boy just disappeared before our very eyes, just kind of blinked out of sight. And Alan and I quickly got into our jeans and looked around for him, but he was nowhere to be found in the bushes. And if he wanted to play with us, why did he disappear? And if he had left the grove of trees, which he didn't, we would have seen him in the open pasture land, and afterwards, we talked about our experience between us, but Alan and I didn't tell anyone of this, knowing that no one would ever believe us. Alan and I both wondered if the boy might have fallen into the stream from the crumbling banks and drowned in that stream many years ago, and as the kids our age wouldn't be caught dead wearing old fashioned looking overalls. When all the kids we knew were wearing the latest looking fashions, was it even remotely possible that perhaps Alan and me saw a ghost that day? One who was lonely and just wanted to play. I worked at a place called Dowling as a janitor for a year. My shift was overnight, and for three months I worked that shift alone. I never saw a purple orb, but I did spend a lot of time outside. What I can tell you 
is that after the creepiness of being in a big building all alone wears off, there are still sounds and such that can't be explained by me. Every week, if not every night, doors would open and close by themselves. Me and the others would go chasing these noises, thinking there was someone in the building, but of course, there was no one there, or I wouldn't be writing to you. And the security company wouldn't call to say an external alarm went off, so there couldn't have been anyone there. Sometimes we'd be in the library, and we'd hear one of the counselor's doors open and close. The library was the same room, but divided by office walls from the counselor area. Sometimes the classroom doors would as well. At times, I'd be in the gym and would chase the sound of footsteps. The place does make a lot of building noises. It's difficult to report on anything I heard in the auditorium, the creepiest place in the school. Because the roof and heating systems would collaborate with the big empty space to make many mysterious noises that could be too easy to explain away. Plus, the auditorium was creepy because it was always dark until I would clean it, and there were so many access areas, such as backstage or the lighting area above the stage and the several doors that would really just make me paranoid. Having said all that, I did sometimes get transfixed on the idea that an emaciated naked woman was watching me. I only got that feeling in or around that particular room. It makes no sense to me, but I did avoid it. The band room was also a little creepy. I would sometimes take my lunch there so I could listen to the radio, and the doors within would make noises like they were opening and shutting. There was one definitive time that I also couldn't explain. I went into the library and locked the door behind me because I was hearing so many noises around that door that night. Then, I climbed over the wall to the counselor's area and unlocked that door so I could rush through it when I heard the noise. Sure enough, the library door tried to open because I heard the deadbolt hit the door frame. So I ran to the hall and listened for footsteps, but there were none. I ran to look down both north and south halls along the library there was nobody, and there was nowhere to hide. I didn't think someone could have gotten away like that, not in that manner anyway, without making enough noise for me to hear it. A similar thing happened one night, when all three of the overnight janitors were in there. We heard the noises in the counselor's area, so I climbed the wall, while the other guys went to the doors, but nobody was there. I want to assure you of two things, even though these aren't really the most impressive tales. First, I don't really believe in ghosts. I'm open enough to the idea, I guess, but anytime I heard a noise, I would go looking for somebody because I assumed it was an intruder. There were times we had intruders, and times people who had rights to the building were found. However, there were so many times they were sure there were noises, and so little chance for whoever was making them to escape, and we still found nothing, that I thought you might be interested to hear the story of Dowling from someone who was there for a long time. The building stopped creeping me out by itself about a week after I was working there alone. I heard voices and chased them, but the air unit, the building setting, and other normal noises stopped giving me the jitters by the time they became normal for me. I don't really believe in ghosts, but I saw the purple orb listed on the website after a night of chasing these noises, so I decided to write this to you, albeit two years after the fact. Last thing I want to say, there are two creepy stories about the place from a source that I'm not sure I trust, but I'll tell you anyway. One time, this guy saw people in robes walking into the woods west of the building. Another time, a girl was taken advantage of in the auditorium. A funny, unbelievable, but true story from the overnight shift. Ninjas attacked the school one night and put one of the soccer goals in the atrium. 
The kids did this for their overnight prank. They seriously climbed onto the roof of the school with two of the school's regulation sized soccer goals and dumped them into the atrium. I chased off a bunch of kids when they were trying to get on the roof a third time. They were all dressed like ninjas. My name is Carly, and I used to live in a hundred year old house on the eastern shore in Maryland. This house was on a street with about ten other houses, all closely related in shape and size, except my friends. She's my best friend, and the man who had built all the houses in our street lived in hers. They have never had any bad experiences in theirs, up until now. My friend's older sister came back for Thanksgiving, and she woke up in the middle of the night and saw the form of a giant man. The man closely resembled Andre the Giant, even though she thought it was her boyfriend. When she looked next to her, he was sleeping. She really didn't think too much more about it until the next day, where the rest of the family shared that they had been hearing and seeing things too. My house was only a few years younger than hers. My parents bought it at an auction because the whole thing had to be gutted and renewed. As my dad was working on it, he was putting in new windows one day and saw a man. He was crouched down with his face right up against the wall looking at the window he had just put in. The man saw my dad get up and disappeared. I've had my own experiences too. Like, we used to hear someone running up and down the halls at night. My room was right at the end and my bed looked out the door. When the person got to the end, you could hear them turn around and run back. That wasn't too bad though. I also remember going into my room and saw a crowd of people. They were all dark figures with the outline of a trench coat that were so long you couldn't see their feet. They slowly faded away and I didn't go back in the room for weeks. I would stay in the other guest bedroom. I had a great aunt and she was a psychic. I loved her. We had the strongest bond you could ever have with anyone. She died of cancer and it was terribly hard on me. I ended up with some things of hers, like her tarot cards, but most importantly, her angel cards. I had just gotten these, and I was up in my room playing with them when I pulled up one card that had a picture of a lady on it. This lady looked exactly like my aunt, and she was surrounded by animals. My aunt had a basement full of bunnies, birds, fish, she had five cats and five dogs. The message on the card said, a message from your loved one. I'm fine, very happy now. Don't worry about me and don't forget about me, but don't let me overtake your life. Then it said goodbye and I love you on it too. After I read that, I teared up and ran downstairs. I showed my mom and she couldn't even believe it. I couldn't believe it either, so I got scared and told my mom to take the cards out of my room, just in case. My mom put it on her dresser. They were there for about a week or two, and then they disappeared. My mom never moved them, and neither did anybody else. No one had touched them, and they had just vanished. I'm for sure that was her final message to me, maybe not forever, but just so I wouldn't worry. It was her proper goodbye. The week before Thanksgiving, my son and I were emptying out a house that was to be torn down and this new one brought in. We were standing by my pickup truck, which we were loading and he happened to look at a bright light in the sky and said, hey, look at that, is it a plane? I looked up and there were no flashing lights, just looked like a wide set of headlights, no other colored lights. I thought at first it was a plane, but no sound for as low as it seemed. It came over slow 
and headed east, and I thought it would disappear, like over the trees, like the planes that come over do, but instead, it went up, and did so very quickly, until it was a speck that disappeared. I still wonder what it was. Was it a paranormal entity, like an orb or some sort, or maybe something different, like even a UFO? It's hard to say, but back in 1990, my husband and I were talking outside and happened to look at the edge of our 40 acres. There, just above the trees, was a long cigar-shaped object that covered the entire line of the 40-acre parcel. It had flashing lights and looked like windows were along the side of it. It was reported in the newspaper as a lot of people saw it that same night, it made no sound at all. My son passed away in August 2008, and I've had my grandson say that he sees him in my bathroom. I find that strange. Last week he came to me and his mother and said that there was a man in my bathroom and he needed to put his clothes on. When I found my son, he was naked. My grandson didn't see him that way the way he passed away. He has told me many times that there are ghosts in my house. We have heard doors open and close, and sometimes the floors creaking. Like last fall, I'd gone in my bathroom to turn off the lights, the kids left on. I called out to him, thinking that maybe someone was still in the bathroom. Finally, I said loudly and impatiently, who is in here? I heard a voice distinctly said I am, very quietly and clear. I didn't recognize the voice and thought one of the kids were playing a joke on me, but no one was near the bathroom, which is just off my master bedroom. It didn't scare me. There are other strange things that happen in my house. We hear little kids outside talking. Most of the time, it is indirect and you can't make out what they say. And other times, something comes in clear. We just think the land is haunted. For a while now, my sister has lived in a house a few blocks away from my parents' house. I live with my parents. I would go over there to babysit my nephew when my sister had plans. Some nights I would sleep over there. Her house always had a creepy feeling to it a thick feeling to the air. My sister had just had knee surgery and wasn't able to take care of her son, so I was spending the weekend over there. The first couple of nights were fine, I didn't mind at all, but the last night I stayed there, I was in the living room watching TV when I caught something out of the corner of my eye. It looked like a shadow. Before I say any more, I better tell you the layout of my sister's house. When you walk in, you go to the left and down a hallway. The open doorway to the left leads to the kitchen. The kitchen has another entry as well. The first door on the left is my sister's bedroom. The only door on the right is the bathroom. And the door at the other end of the hallway belongs to my eldest sister. When she's there, that is. On the other side of the kitchen is a set of French glass doors and let out into a game room, an add-on to the house. The doors are always kept closed and locked at night. The only people in the house that night were myself, my sister, the one on the mat, and her son. So anyway, I saw a shadow. At first I thought maybe it was my sister getting up to ask me to get her something, but the shadow simply vanished before I could get a closer look at it. I shrugged it off as me being tired. I lay down to go to sleep. I woke up a couple minutes later. It was around five in the morning. I didn't know what had woken me. I was sweating badly and I felt like someone was sitting on my chest. I was propped up enough to see the French doors which were across the room from the sofa. What I saw that night is engraved into my brain. There was an old woman outside the doors. 
She had her hands pressed against two of the glass panels and her face against another. Her mouth was open in a scream. I was scared beyond belief because I couldn't move. I couldn't speak. I couldn't do nothing but lay there. And then the door began rattling. The woman was shaking it. A shadow came out of the kitchen and the woman vanished. The shadow vanished after that and I could breathe again. I don't know what the shadow was, but it did make the woman go away. I like to think it was my guardian angel. Who knows? That's my story. Anyway, and yeah, it is true. My mother was born in Austria-Hungary in 1908. When her parents immigrated to the US, they left their three children behind in the care of their grandparents. It was five years until her parents were able to return and bring the children to the US. In that five years, my mother became very close to her grandfather and went everywhere with him. She arrived in the US as a 13 year old, grew up and married my father. They were a young farm couple living in rural Ohio. One night, my mother awoke to see her grandfather standing at the foot of her bed. He was smiling at her, but did not speak. She relayed that she pulled the covers over her head and then looked again, and he was still there. She then tried to wake my father, but when he awoke, her grandfather disappeared. She had the overwhelming feeling that her grandfather had died. This happened in the mid-1920s, and at that time, international long distance was only a thing for wealthy folks. Her only contact with her grandparents was via mail, which would take a couple of weeks to arrive. Sure enough, two weeks later, she received a letter from her grandmother verifying that her grandfather had passed away on the same day and approximately the same time that he appeared in her bedroom. My father attested to the entire happening. This was always our family ghost story that no one ever had a reason to doubt. My parents live on a farm in Sugar Grove. My stepdad grew up here with his family as a child. On Christmas Eve in 1964, his dad went into town to pick up the grandma for the holiday. With him, he took a younger daughter and his younger son. On the way home, there was a terrible accident and everybody died except the daughter. Over the years, the farmhouse was used as rental property until my mom met her husband. They have lived here now for six years and have had many experiences with the spirits of this home. I too have had some of the same. There are many, many voices that we hear. Marbles rolling down the hallway upstairs. Foot noises walking up and down the stairway. Clouds of light and dark smoke throughout the entire house. Doors open and close. Things come up missing, then are returned within days. If you are alone in the house and stand by the sink, you will soon hear a voice that asks you to go away. It will repeat until you walk away from the sink. Standing outside, if you look up into the window upstairs, sometimes you will see a vision of a woman standing in the window. This is believed to be Grandma. I have an 11 year old daughter that has walked into the downstairs bathroom and ran out, stating there is a man standing at the bathroom sink. He will only turn his head and look at you and then turn back to the mirror. He hasn't spoken yet. When my parents first came here, they slept upstairs. They had to move to the downstairs room of the winter because no matter what room you are in up there, it is ice cold. We have used electric heat sources to try to generate heat, but it doesn't work. There are also apparitions of faces, white in color, etched into the door of the master bedroom. These appear darker at times and lighter at other times. 
they appear to be stuck in the wood of the door. It's believed by everyone here that the spirits and happenings of this house are all those family members that were killed in the crash. After all, they all did reside here, and I think they still do. My mother passed away a little over four years ago. Since then, we have seen her, usually in dreams, and my father has actually seen her many times in her home. My mother had been sick with a congestive heart failure that took a turn for the worst for about two years. My dad cared for her day and night. Finally, the last trip to the hospital was supposed to be a routine trip to remove excess fluid. On the way to the hospital, my mother made a prophetic statement to her that she would not be coming home again. When she was given the diagnosis that no further help was available to her and she would be sent home with hospice, she refused and decided to die in the hospital instead of at home because my father had to continue to live there and she did not want him to find it hard to stay at their home. Nine days of excruciating pain from a failing liver and kidneys and unable to get her breath, she succumbed to death only after the last of our immediate family visited her on that day. It was as if she had waited until she had seen her husband, children, grandchildren, and son-in-laws before she was ready to go. Ten minutes after the last visitor, she breathed her last. Oddly enough, the grandfather clock at my parents' home stopped in the exact time of her death. My father has refused to rewind it. After 60 years of marriage, my father has been so lost. For the first year, she appeared to him frequently with a smile on her face and one time told him, I love you deeply and just want to make sure you are okay. She still appears to him just not as frequently as the first year. Recently, my sister and father had found a picture she had painted and had a frame to give me for my birthday. My dad saw my mother the morning they gave me the gift and said she was holding a shopping bag with a wooden frame sticking out from it with a huge smile on her face. He said they communicated without talking and he knew she was happy and proud I was getting the picture. I've seen my mother in dreams, but only one stands out as a possible contact with her. In my dream, I was looking through the picture window of my parents' home and saw her sitting in her chair with my father standing over her, talking and smiling as if he was catching up on recent events. I went inside the house and she looked at me and smiled. I remember how peaceful she looked and so healthy. I remember saying, Mama, how can this be? I saw you in the casket at the funeral home. She just smiled at me and said, Well, sometimes these things just happened. I replied, Well, I don't care how it happened. I'm glad to have you back. I've missed you. With that, I woke up. One other time, after an extremely frustrating day, I was walking in a corridor and thought I'd heard her call my name. She said, Susie. I actually said out loud, Mama? And she was not even there. My sister says she has dreamed of her, but never actually have seen her. My son slept in my mom's bed about six months after her passing and said sometimes in the night, he felt her sit down on the side of the bed. He knew it was her because he could smell her perfume. My nephew recalled a dream he had the first Thanksgiving holiday after her passing. He said that in his dream, he walked out of his upstairs bedroom and she was in the hallway. He said, let's go get some turkey, Granny. He said she replied, now Mark, you know I can't go downstairs with you this year, but you know I am here. 
my family feels that she is around us all the time. I know she is with my father the most, because he is terminally ill and misses her so terribly. I feel comforted knowing she is waiting for his time to cross over. My mother is a current janitor working at Rockford College, and one of the buildings she is assigned to cleans happens to be the Burpee building. There, she and some of the other ladies that work with her have lunch in that specific building every work night. A while back, she told us that during her lunch break, she saw what was a female figure walk past the room they were in. She said she wore a blue dress had blonde hair. The room has a mirror that faced the only door of the small area. She said, and I quote, I glanced at the mirror, a habit of doing when you're in that room a lot, and saw this thin, transparent figure walk past the door. I thought it was one of the other girls that was walking by, but it wasn't until I realized that no one that night was wearing a blue dress or had dyed their hair blonde. I walked out to see if it was a trespasser, but saw no one in the hall. I called security and asked them if they allowed any blonde, blue dressed girl on the property. They denied doing so, confirming my suspicions that it was possibly a ghost. This is just one of the stories that she has told us during the last two years of her encounters with the burpee ghosts. This just happened to me just recently, on February 8th, 2008, when I took a ghost tour of the Tuing Cemetery in Brisbane, Australia. First of all, I would like to keep this to myself anonymous. Secondly, what I saw is true, for I did some research to see if anyone else experienced what I saw that night, and, as it turns out, a few people over the years saw it too. It was cold and partly windy that night when I turned up at the ghost of the Tuing Boneyard, Brisbane's oldest and biggest graveyard. There's a lot of strange stories connected to this boneyard, like a vampire. There's only two boneyards in the world that got Fair Dinkham vampires, Highgate to London, and Tuing in Brisbane. The Bleeding Grave and Walking Statue. Yes, a wandering statue. Anyway, the tour barely began as our hostess was introducing herself when I saw something standing amongst the trees. It was solid and black. It was standing there watching us. I saw it, but I thought I was seeing things. Excitement that might have sparked off my imagination. But as I walked past the spot, there was nothing there to resemble that figure. But yet it was real, as you and I wasn't until a few feet ahead, I heard a weird clang sound right next to me, as if someone was banging in a pot or whatever. I thought it was the signpost rattling, but there was no signpost anywhere. Now that was freaking weird. I thought, as I hurried on, looking behind me. Most of the night I felt we were being followed by something, as I was Till and Charlie best place to be on a ghost tour at the end of the line. Things started to get a bit stranger, like the cold wind I felt touching me if there was no wind blowing. The same thing happened again two nights later, when I felt something touching my neck in my own home, or seeing things at the corner of my eyes. When I turn around, there will be nothing there. I thought I was ready for the madhouse at one point. I know that I saw something, so I researched it, and as it turned out, others saw that same black figure at the same spot where I saw him or her, whatever the heck it was, and heard the same clanging sound I heard, so I didn't imagine it at all. I hope I didn't. That's my story. I've got other great spine-chilling tales, which I'll put up ASAP. But this was the first experience I had in years. 
except for the ghost of my dog who came back for a few nights to bark goodbye to us. My name is Tina, I'm 33, and I have a story I would like to share with you and your readers. I've been experiencing strange things for many years now, but I've only been sharing them for just a few people who don't believe always have the need to find something wrong with the ones who do. My mom was one of those people. She would roll her eyes and say I was crazy or I had been drinking. The day she became a believer was one of the most beautiful moments we've ever shared. This is our story. My mom had surgery in her foot and was using a walker to get around. I was at her house helping her with her laundry and such, and had laid my son down in the bedroom down the hall for his nap. Mom was kicked back in the recliner and decided she would also take a nap. All my chores were done for the time. Everybody in the house was sleeping, so I went out to get into the pool. I turned on the baby monitor at the room where my son was sleeping and brought the other piece outside with me. My mom lives out in the country. No neighbors close enough for monitor to pick up any other signals from a phone or another baby monitor. It was so quiet in my mom's house, I could hear the tick-tock ticking of the clock in the room where the monitor was. All of a sudden, I heard a woman's voice so clear and loud. It sounded like she was speaking into the monitor. It sounded like peep, as in P-E-E-P. -E -E I'm not sure what that means. Maybe it was just gibberish. That's what I heard. At this point, I start to run to the door to see if my mom is still in the chair in the living room. I got to the door, snatched it open, and there was my mom, still reclined back in the chair with a really strange look on her face. I guess I had a strange look on my face too. Because she said, what? What's the matter? Who's here? Who are you talking to? I just looked at her and couldn't say anything. She asked again who I was talking to, and I said nobody. Why? She said that she heard a woman talking, and she thought she was dreaming. She opened her eyes, and the woman was still talking, so she knew she wasn't dreaming. Having to always have an explanation for things, she then assumed I was on the phone, but looked around and saw the phone and my cell phone were on the kitchen counter. That was when I came in the door, and she knew it wasn't me. I said, I heard that too? Yes, she said, with a very strange look on her face. So I went down to the hall to the room where my son was still sleeping, and looked around. Nothing out of the ordinary nothing out of place. I came back down the hall and told my mom he was fine, still sleeping, hadn't moved an inch. She was a little freaked out, but she started asking me questions about my great-grandmother, who often visits me in the places that I go. I never met my great-grandmother in person, but I've had many run-ins with her spirit. My mom didn't want to believe that grandma visits her too. But after that day, she started to believe, not only in ghosts and spirits, but in me too. Thanks, Grandma Daisy. This is a true murder story that happened around the early 1900s in the Woods and Maureen Circle, Mapleville, Rhode Island. This story is a more true and detailed story of the one before that my great-grandmother told me about. Catherine was a mill owner's daughter. She was a very pretty tall blonde. She was engaged to a local farmer, Robert. Catherine, though, had one problem. A man, who some say had mental issues, was stalking Catherine. His name was David. David would send Catherine letters of how much he loved her and how they could have babies together. These letters disturbed Catherine. He would watch her through the window and follow her wherever she went. One day, Catherine confronted him and told him never to talk to her again. David thought this was like a game, 
so he proceeded to send disturbing letters and watch her at all times. As a few days went by, he gave up. With this, he had a plan. If he couldn't love her, no one else could. So one day, while Catherine was going to the woods to get water for her family, David followed. First, he stopped at Catherine's fiancé's farm. Robert was working on the farm as usual, and David came in from behind and stabbed him in the back with a pitchfork. Then he went off to find Catherine. Catherine was sitting next to a pond under a hemlock tree. David pulled out his knife and stabbed her through the neck. She screamed in pain as David ripped open her body. As she died, David messed with her dying body. Afterwards, he took her organs out, cut off her breasts, and nailed her heart to a tree, covered in blood. David went home and took a nap. He was supposedly awoken by the sound of dripping. He looked around his room, and it was covered in blood. In the middle of the room, Catherine stood there cursing at him. David had gone insane. He wrote his last letter to the police, telling them what he did, where her body was, and all that happened. He drowned himself the next day in a river. His body sprawled out on a rock, broken. Catherine and Robert were buried in a now abandoned cemetery, and David's body was thrown into a pit. During a biopsy, they found a heart in David's stomach. Some people think he swallowed her heart, while others think Catherine put it there. Still, rumors persist that late at night in the cemetery, you could see the couple holding hands as if nothing ever happened. I believe I had a true experience with a shadow person. This is my story. It was maybe 11-ish at night. My boyfriend and myself were watching a movie. The lights were dim in the house. The house is more than a hundred years old. From where I was seated, I could see the dining area, which was dark, and the kitchen doorway, which had a dimmed overhead light on, and the light was spilling into the dining room. I noticed a distinct shadow movement in the light from the kitchen like someone or something walked past the light. I turned my head fully towards the doorway now and saw a solid black elongated ovalish shape towards the top of the doorway and it quickly slipped into the kitchen. My immediate reaction was not of fear, but sort of like, huh, okay, what the heck was that? I wasn't alarmed. I continued watching the movie thinking of explanations for what I just saw. Now let me tell you, there are three dogs in the home as well as the two of us. My boyfriend's two dogs were asleep on the floor by our feet, and my dog was by my side on the couch. He's small. He was acting a bit odd, nervous now, perhaps he sensed it in me. Thirty minutes later, he got down and headed towards the kitchen. He had just got his head in the door and promptly stopped. I couldn't see his head and shoulders, just his back end. I saw his neck raise like he was looking up, and then it happened. It took my breath and gave me chills. He started wagging his tail, slow at first, like he was unsure, and then the momentum slowly gained. He never got to a full-on happy to see you whack. Then he abruptly stopped and came back to my side. He would not enter the kitchen. And in case you think maybe he was looking out a window, no, the window was too high up to see anything. My name is Guy and I would like to share my experience at Lambertville High School. I've been there numerous times. I live about 25 minutes away in Pennsylvania. My friends and I are ghost hunters, 
and Lambertville is a favorite spot of ours. The first time I visited the school was about two years ago, in 2005 and 2006, and I've been curious about it ever since then. I've had many comments about history of this amazing site. I've been through some of the school, not all of it though, because the building is in poor shape. The first time we went, we didn't encounter anything out of the ordinary. Back then, we had no equipment except our eyes and ears and flashlights. We really didn't venture inside until the second trip, but that was during the day and also uneventful. The third trip back to the school was a shocker that still gives me chills to this day. We went on a summer night, around midnight, or maybe a little later than that, and not a smart thing to do. But we didn't know any better. We parked the car out in front of the steps, leading up to the school. We were to go in shifts up and into the school. Two go and two stay in the car, to watch for cops. We were there for five minutes, before two of my friends came sprinting to the car screaming, Drive! Drive! Me and my friend, who stayed in the car, were wondering what was literally scaring them to insanity. What they told us, was pretty crazy at first. They said that while they were walking up the steps to the school, they heard the sounds of little children, little girls, giggling and laughing. At first I didn't believe it and wanted to go back to experience this for myself. I'm the kind of person that has to see to believe, but it's the hope of that proof that draws me back to the school. Anyway, that incident was about two years ago. And between my friends, it has been just a story with no proof. No proof. Until now. Last week, May 2008, me and my friends met up again, thanks to school being finished, and decided to go back. We went that night around 10 to 10.30 and stayed there for a good hour and ventured inside. Though we heard no laughing, I'm still a believer. I believe my friend's story and everyone else's stories of little children laughing because I caught it on tape. I recently purchased some equipment to help capture paranormal activity, and the most valuable tool I had that night was my recorder. It's amazingly lucky that I caught anything at all, because I only recorded audio for about 7 minutes of our hour-long investigation, and all but about a minute of the audio has voices on it that were not ours. I also caught the voice of maybe a teacher or student saying, does he seem okay? In a two minute long conversation with what I believe is a female and a male that answers a question that I ask. I've showed this tape to my family and friends and they all hear talking as well and the laughter seems to freak everyone out. I wanted to make sure that what I was hearing was, well, what I was hearing. When I heard the laughing on the tape, I thought, my god, they weren't joking or trying to scare us. They really did hear something that night, something that I would like to share with your website if that is alright with you. I just want to know that there is something other than this life. And that is what draws me to the paranormal. Thank you for your time, and thank you for reading this. If you have any comments or questions, Please feel free to ask. I'd love to share these clips with you guys and your viewers. This is in reference to your listing for the Hearthstone Inn, Colorado Springs, Colorado. This place has much more than a little girl. As a housekeeper there in 1999, I was able to experience almost all of the hauntings. In the south building, third floor, the little girl would appear regularly, as well as the man in brown in the main bedroom, also in the southwest corner of the floor. He was harmless, and would usually disappear as soon as spotted. On the third floor, I've never felt alone, would often hear the little girl in running and laughing. Two of the four bedrooms on the first floor share a bedroom. I learned to prop the door open while cleaning 
or I would be locked in. The first time I was locked in, I rattled the door and was screaming for the other housekeeper. I was nearly hysterical when she let me out after about five minutes. Also in the south building, first floor, there was a bedroom at the end of the hall that used to be under the stairway. The back stairway of this building, when it was a hotel, led outside. Many of our guests reported having the dreams of the woman in this room. I would feel her, but never see her. I would have trouble with the lights and an unwelcoming presence. On one occasion, the owner, David Oxhandler, spent the night in the room on having a very vivid dream of this woman and dismissing it as a dream. He was too shaken to go back to sleep. When he stepped outside to have a cigarette, he turned around, feeling he was not alone, and actually saw her, dressed as just in the dream, floating where the stairs would have been. Rumors she was the victim of a lover's quarrel and was shot on the back stairs. The last one I knew of was in the north building, second floor. One room next to the stairs facing east was never pleasant to be in. The light was very temperamental flickering and choosing when to be on or off. I would feel a presence on the floor, but really tried to ignore it until one day. I was standing near the stairs with several heavy bundles of laundry to take downstairs when I felt a pressure on the right side small of my back. Just a little shove, and I nearly went head first down the stairs, and not of my own volition. Last I hear the Oxlanders were doing haunted history tours of their hotel. Shortly after, it has been sold to another local organization. Very much worth adding some info to your site. And thanks for the space. My wife and I had several experiences in our apartment over the last three years we have lived here. It began with hearing noises and creaks in the building early on, and slowly evolved to seeing shadows in the middle of the night in our bedroom. We both have had experiences where we thought to have seen a little boy in blue pajamas looking at things in our bedroom. Three major events have occurred, which I'll describe in detail. Event 1, Summer of 2006. My brother was staying over because he is a minor, and our mother was going out of town. We had woken up late to eat breakfast, and were playing a game of cards. As we are brothers and there is a significant age gap, we sometimes argue. I was being a little bit of a jerk, picking on a card selection he had made, when our kitchen trash can started to rock back and forth. We were the only people present in the apartment, and we were about 10 yards from the trash can. I investigated the trash can further to find that it was nearly empty and there was nothing that could have moved, so we went to the park. Event 2, Winter of 2007 My wife and I were growing fascinated with the television show, Ghost Hunters. We had spent an entire day watching episodes from the second season DVD. Being cocky and joking with my wife over her growing discomfort with the mood the show was setting, I began joking about talking on the ghost of the apartment, saying such things as, if anyone is here, Come here and get me, or you can't touch me, you're just a ghost, I don't believe in you. Later that night, at 4am, I woke up quite distressed and felt that the apartment was shaking from a significant earthquake. I was sure that it was the big one and rushed to jump out of bed and pull my wife to safety in a doorway. She was in a state of shock as I lifted her out of bed and was scared of an earthquake also. When we finally got to the doorway and calmed down, I explained to her that I thought there was an earthquake, but couldn't feel it anymore. She couldn't either. I began to grow very nauseous and leaned on her for support. I told her I wasn't feeling right, and I blacked out. As I was blacked out, I heard sounds of people talking very quickly. At first I thought it was my wife, and I tried to tell her to slow down. I felt the sensation of running very quickly while I was hearing the rapid dialogue. I was growing angry 
when suddenly I awoke lying on the floor with my wife over me. She told me she thought I was having a seizure or something because all of my muscles had lightened and I was screaming and moaning in a sense of fear. She said that I had also grown pale. All throughout that night, I felt the bed continue to shake. Event 3 Soon after event 2, I was angered by experience I had felt earlier in event 2, where I had awoken to what I thought to be an earthquake, and experienced what I thought to be a form of being possessed. I researched how to hold a seance to converse with spirits present within the room, and invited friends over to help with the conversation. I didn't describe the experience I had felt earlier, so that it would not affect my friends' experiences that night. In the middle of the seance, one of my friends began to grow woozy and sway forward when he suddenly stopped it. He said that he couldn't go on and felt like someone was talking quickly to him and he had felt the sensation of running, identical to my experience earlier. I shared with him my experience and we decided not to continue. Also, this night, my friend's car got a flat tire while parked in my apartment and only needed to be refilled with air as there was no puncture to cause the flat, as if someone deflated it. Also, another friend was called by his girlfriend within minutes of us ending the seance because she felt something had happened and was worried. He had only told her he was going to see me and not anything about what we were doing that night. The friend with the flat also received a phone call from his aunt about an hour after whom he speaks with rarely because she had similar concerns as my friend's girlfriend. How's that for women's intuition? Ever since that last event, nothing else has occurred. This is a personal experience that to this day has left me shaken. There is something wrong with this apartment complex. My experience centered on the apartment we are in but from other residents, I heard other tales that made me really not want to live there, and as soon as I could get out, my husband and I certainly did. Pontreal Apartments located in South Lyon. There is a huge tree right directly in front of it. Apparitions have been seen in the little hallway between bathroom and bedroom. The panel in the hallway leading up to the crawl space had moved on its own. Personal experience was actually in the bathtub and the only one home when it happened. I'm all of five foot and that ceiling is a good eight feet. There was no way for me to get up there. We figured that the only way to move that panel was to be up in the crawl space. Each crawl space is self-contained. EVPs have gotten into that apartment of a young woman with an accent saying, can't stay too long, and sleep. Both still have. If you leave the apartment door open while taking a shower, you get this feeling that you are being watched. Then look out. You see the retreating figure of what looks to be a young woman. I'd had this happen and thought I'd left my apartment door open and it was a neighbor. And upon investigation, found my door deadbolt was locked. Numerous pictures of orbs and odd shadows have been captured in this apartment. All still have. Late at night, you can also hear someone walking past the apartment, and when you go to look, there is no one on the walkway, and considering where the apartment is, there is no way for someone to get down it quick enough without hearing the sounds of running feet. Have had an experience of having the front door hit several times while I was to people, and no one was there. Stories were also told to me of the laundry room in the same building is also a place of odd occurrences, feelings of being watched and hearing a young woman's voice have felt the being watched part, but considering that the old furnace system is right there in the laundry room, I dismissed it. A lot of my family and husband's family refused to spend the night there just cause the place gave them the creeps, and this was prior to some of these events happening. I've tried to find out if there have been any deaths or murders, or anything on that ground, and I came up with nothing. All I know is that the place was just, there was something wrong with it, 
and I wish I had never moved into it. The EVPs were caught when that building had few residents. I still have them, just have others listen to them from time to time, to prove I wasn't crazy with what I heard. The pictures are numerous, and some still make the hair on my arm stand up because of the experiences with them. One night in October 2008, my friends Scott, Denny, and Steve and I decided we wanted to go ghost hunting. Scott was the only one who had experience with anything, and he had seen things and had things happen to him and other people in his past groups. We started off by going to Peace Church Cemetery and where the murderer Billy Cook is buried. We were equipped with a video camera, me, a digital camera, a digital voice recorder, a heavy duty flashlight, Scott, and two smaller flashlights with the other two people. We walked around for a little bit as Scott instructed us to let our senses take hold of us and guide us as they please. If we got an impulse to do something, do it. We all had weird feelings but eventually realized we weren't going to find anything here. We left, deciding to go somewhere that Scott had experienced before, the Waco Cemetery. Once we got there, we said our opening prayer and made our way out into the cemetery. Eventually, we split into two groups, me and Steve in one, Scott and Denny in the other. Steve told me to get a couple of specific things on video. He thought he had seen something he said was best described as a specter, with a head that shaped into a point in a cloaked black body. We walked around for a bit longer, and he told me he had seen it again. We walked towards the area he saw it, and didn't see anything. We met back up with Denny and Scott on the other side of the cemetery and Scott started talking about the things that had happened to him here. He had been asking questions and talking in general, trying to pick up some EVP. He started talking about what he called the prankster that had slapped him in the face and possibly put scratches down his friend's back. We made our way back to the center of the cemetery where there were no graves, just a patch of grass. We stood around and Steve told the other two about the specter he had seen and where he had seen it. Around that time, Scott said lights out. He took a couple of pictures, and the rest was silent. Then, we turned our lights back on for a few seconds before Scott repeated his order of lights out. This part gets a little blurry. I can't remember if it was before or after we turned the lights back on. But Scott is a big guy, wide and tall. He fell backwards onto Steve, who would have fallen on me had I not moved in time. He had fallen hard. He laid there and just looked confused, and his face was red. His glasses have flown off of impact of the fall. He asked where his glasses were. Then he asked, did I fall? We tried to explain what happened from each of our perspectives quickly, as we were pretty freaked out, since this was our first experience. He had asked a couple more times as the rest of us came to the conclusion that he felt too hard to have just fallen from a loss of balance. I, for one, think he was pushed by some force. Anyway, we got him up to his feet. He looked around and said, we're leaving. Scott was shaken. And that was all we needed to hear. As we walked back to our cars to say a closing prayer, Scott started coughing, which progressed into dry heaving. We had eight hardies before we went to the first place, so we knew that he had something to throw up. We stopped to wait for him, and after he felt better, we proceeded to walk to a space between the cars to say the prayer. Scott began, Our Father which art in heaven, it was interrupted by more dry heaving. Steve said, Scott, are you okay? He nodded and said, I'll be thy, and cut off to some dry heaves some more. This time, it was so bad 
that he lost his glasses and was down on his knees coughing up something that wasn't there. He looked up, straight at me, and gave the most evil glare I've ever seen. I immediately recoiled in fear, of tears forming in my eyes. I asked Scott, Scott, are you there? He got over this fit eventually, as Steve said. How by thy what? Finish the prayer, Scott. You have to finish it. Scott straightened up a little and hoarsely started to finish. Hallowed be thy name. Again, the same occurrence had just happened, and he just kept coughing and dry heaving. At this point, Scott has regained his composure enough to finish, and says, For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As we each followed with a thankful amen, he said, Now let's get the heck out of here. I was ahead of him in parking, so I started the car and drove out of the cemetery as fast as possible. We stopped into a church parking lot up the road. Scott got out of his car, and we started talking about what just happened. He claimed to have no recollection of falling or anything after that. That's the story of what happened in southwest Missouri on a late October night. May you form your own conclusions, and I hope you enjoy. I've felt the presence of ghosts at some places I've been or lived at. I've never had experience of seeing a ghost, but I can walk into a place and tell if there's a ghost there. I know if it's a male, female, or child. I've seen dark shadows, but not all have been black. Some are gray, like the color of a rat. One night, a very good friend of mine came over and we started watching a movie and eating pizza. I saw the dark outline of a male child peeking around the corner of the kitchen. I told my friend Don, who was very religious, and at first she didn't believe me. I kept seeing the outline of a head and shoulders peeking around the corner. Then... About five minutes or so later, we started hearing a scratching noise. I told Don that's the ghost. She said it was just a mouse. Then, I heard a loaf of bread fall on the floor. The bread is kept on the counter far back next to the microwave. I got up to investigate. The bread was lying on the floor, but had no holes in it from a mouse. I put the bread back and went back into the living room. Don got up to get a glass of soda, and when she went into the kitchen, she yelled. She said the loaf of bread moved across the counter and dropped on the floor at her feet. She started praying. Every time she stopped praying, you could hear scratching noises. She kept praying, and the scratching continued. Then it got quiet. We finished the movie, and as we are talking, we noticed the lid on the pizza box, which was propped up, started to slip down. Instead of just falling down, it closed. This was very slowly. Dawn said she had enough and went home. She took the pizza and box home with her. She called me later that night and said that the ghost followed her home because her bread was constantly sliding off the counter and she actually saw the pizza lid open when it was closed in the box. She said she threw the bread and pizza box off her balcony and prayed really hard. She didn't have any more problems, and our bread stayed on our counters after that. I was at the age of 12 to 13 when my grandmother bought me a rocking chair out of what she said was a yard sale. She claimed that they were very glad to get rid of it, and she never thought to ask why. She brought it home and sat it in my room with my dolls on it. It was an antique, so I was leery about anyone sitting in it. I never experienced any weird activities in it, but my brother at the age of nine years was sitting in the living room where he could see it and claimed to have seen it rock three times. It scared him to the point where he just ran outside to my grandmother 
crying and screaming. I was confused, and my grandmother told me to keep it closed and keep my door shut. Later, my aunt said she went into my room to get something, and she also seen it move. I was getting mad, thinking that there was something wrong with my chair and hid it in my closet. The last person that had seen it move was my little cousin, due to us moving to another location. She agreed to keep it in her room, where she did not stay at the time, but went in and out of there when needed. She was doing her hair in a dresser mirror, when she got a glimpse of the rocker moving. Then, to her surprise and fright, a little girl appeared. She said she was very beautiful, in an older clothing. She screamed and ran from the room. It took her some time to calm down to tell what happened, and there I was, ready to get rid of it also. The one thing I did find out about the chair before giving it away was that it hated men. Due to my family's curiosity, my great uncle was determined to see it and experience it sliding away from him across the room. He was nevertheless very scared and left quickly. I'm glad I gave it away and didn't think twice, but never had it do anything in front of me. I didn't experience this myself. It happened to my mother a couple months ago, and she told me about it after it happened. What happened was, a couple months ago, my mom was prepping for a party in our kitchen at about 9.30pm. Me and my brother, who were about 11 at the time, we were both at the house at the time. I was upstairs, and he was in the living room. My mom told me that she was washing dishes, and that she looked up at the window in front of her, and she saw someone walk by the hallway behind her. She immediately thought that it was me, because of how tall the person was. She called out my name, and told me to do something for her. After a couple of minutes, she came to look for my brother to ask where I had went. He looked at her like she was crazy and told her that I hadn't come downstairs for about an hour. She called me down noticeably scared because she thought someone was in the house, but we couldn't find anyone. This happened more than once to my mother, but more noticeable. She was washing clothes and had to walk through the kitchen and saw someone poke their head out from behind the counter. She of course thought that it was either me or my brother, but when she checked, she found no one. She called me immediately and told me what had happened, and now we believe that a ghost is in the house, but it doesn't show itself regularly. Two other things that have happened since then. One happened a couple months after that. Me and my brother had a friend over, and he had gone to the bathroom on the second story of the house. No one was up there at the time, but when he came down, he said that he had seen two red eyes down the hall near my parents' bedroom. He immediately ran downstairs, and we told him about my mother's experiences. The other things that happen more frequently now is that our dog starts to growl at something in the hallway. She sleeps in our parents' room, and sometimes she will get up and walk around the room, and then... She will stop in the doorway and growl at something in the hallway. But when we turn on the light, there will be nothing there. It has been a couple of months since anything worth reporting has happened. But we believe that it is a friendly ghost and nothing harmful will come of it. Even though I'm terrified of this kind of stuff, Reading stories and watching things on TV about it is very interesting to me. I have a story to share. It's still very fresh to me, even though it's happened many years ago that it has taken place. My husband and kids laugh at me when I tell them my story just because of some of the things that went on. They find it more humorously amusing than seriously true. This story took place when I was about five or six years old in a house we lived at in Oregon, Ohio. I really don't even know where to begin. The house was a two-story home that wasn't huge, 
but sure wasn't small. I had two brothers, and they shared a bedroom with me, having my own bedroom right next to theirs. In their closet was this blue plastic hanging shoe rack that was left when we moved in. It was completely empty, except for a few bouncy balls and a metal jack in some of the pockets. Every day we would check these pockets because whenever we would empty them, there was always more the next day. I never thought anything weird about that. It was cool finding things in there. My room had a door that led to the closet. I never heard anything scary in my room. But one night, my grandparents spent the night. They came from Florida and were visiting us before moving on to other relatives. In the middle of the night, everyone ran into the room because my grandpa woke up screaming. He said the cat had crawled onto the mesh part of the box spring and scared him. Everyone went back to bed, and nothing was thought of it. Months went by, and summer was here. My brothers and I used to all lay in the hallway upstairs outside our rooms, in front of a box fan my dad would put up, because it was so hot. Sometime in the middle of the night, my younger brother Mike woke up, I guess to sleep in my room, and began screaming. He said my older brother's Jake's face was on the wall scaring him. Jake had been laying in the hallway the entire time with me and Mike. Still, everyone shrugged it off like the other things that happened and figured he was sleepwalking. I've heard things throughout the night on and off after the last incident, but the last and scariest part of the house that happened to me, and I'm not sure how much time in between this happened is one night when I was sleeping with my cat. It was sometime in the middle of the night, and for some reason I woke up. My cat also woke up. My cat was tucked under my arm at my side, and all of a sudden, it opened its eyes wide and hissed with its hair standing up on its back. Then it darted out of my room. I didn't understand why the cat acted like this, and seconds later, at the end of my bed was this figure. It was definitely human, but was all white and misty. It had no features or limbs. The only feature I remember is seeing an O-like shaped mouth. It was just standing there, but then looked like it was moving slowly closer. I kicked my feet at it, and nothing happened. I just kicked right through it. I was scared to death and ran into my parents' room and slept there the rest of the night. I thought I heard sounds coming from the drawers in my dad's dresser the rest of the night, but never heard anything or seen anything since. My husband, like I said, finds this humorous, so last year, he bought some ball and jacks and placed them on my pillow and laughed. I would love to find out if anyone living in that house after or before me ever had any experiences like that. I always wondered why that thing would want to scare us like that. My grandfather was a member of Washington Country Golf Club in Washington County, Pennsylvania. The golf club sits on top of a hill and used to be a very old farmhouse that dates back to the 1800s. He told me stories of him along with a group of friends who spent the night at the clubhouse. Members were allowed to stay there if they wished. It was said the old farmer who lived in the house lost all of his money and the farm went under. After this all happened, the farmer then decided to end it all. My grandfather said that during the late hours of night, you can hear footsteps walking back and forth upstairs. They went upstairs, and no one was to be found. Even in the ballroom, the lights would be seen turning off and on by themselves, as doors were being opened and closed as well. I myself have been in the clubhouse, which is very old, with wooden stairs and floors. I have even seen the bar going across the staircase, where it said the farmer had done the deed. I've heard this story from other members of the club. Whether this is true for sure or not, I don't know exactly. Another story I've heard 
takes place in Peters Township in Washington County. I've been told by an old football coach whose family lived in the town all their life, dating back to the 1700s, I believe. He tells the story of an old haunted railroad tunnel close to Hidden Valley Road in the area. It's said that many years ago, when the railroad was a busy place, a man was hooking up two boxcars. The boxcars then rolled together, hitting the man in between the two hookups. The man was cut in half from the two boxcars, and many people say that they have walked the tunnel holding hands across the tunnel very late in the night. They said they have seen a man walking at the other end of the tunnel with an old oil lamp in his hand, swinging back and forth. They even say the train can be heard off in the distance, but no train even came. The story has been known as Boxcar Willie. I've heard this story from many different people in the past. I've seen the tunnel myself one night with two of my friends. We held hands going across the front of the tunnel. We all then saw a very small light at the end of the tunnel. Never went to check it out, but something was there. We all saw this light. It may have been something off in the distance, but I believe it was Boxcar Willie. We all felt something very weird that night. That's why I get the feeling something was out there. A lot has been happening lately. Comfortable and uncomfortable things. Some of these happenings just leave me curious and confused as to why all of this is happening. I've been experiencing things to the point where I've broken down and I shall tell you how and why right now. One day, I was sitting in front of the door to my brother's room, just casually sitting there, listening to music as I waited on my brother to come back. When he finally came, just as I turned my head towards him to say something, I was kept completely shut and frightened over what I had just seen. I let out a small scream, which left my brother worried and motivated him to ask me why I had let out a sudden reaction. I explained it all to him about how I saw a solid figure of a man that stood right behind him. Now, I really didn't believe in the paranormal, and to see something like this just shook me. I did and still do believe that spirits are real, but my view on seeing them had totally changed around after this incident. I am religious and I pray more often than I used to back then, which has helped me a lot because I feel more protected and safe, but it doesn't end there. When I found out that my brother was experiencing the same things as me, we told our mother and she sat us down to explain it all. We found out that she had similar things happening to her in the past too, and I had also learned that when my mother was trying to get pregnant with her first child, me, that she was targeted by black magic and had been attacked by a shadow person. That gives me a feeling that something, or someone, the spirits, may have gotten through some closed doors. I'm not a professional or anything, but it's something I assume may have happened. Anyway, we've had our house checked out by different mediums, and they all said the same things. They told us that something was in this house. But the thing is that I feel like there's more than one spirit in this house. One I sense as good and the other I sense as bad, but not demonically bad. I can feel it in my gut. Most times, out of nowhere, I will occasionally see a black mist pass by the corner of my eyes, but I end up dismissing them as my imagination. The way these spirits contact me are through my dreams, most of the times, rather than in my awake hours, although I've seen the solid figure of a man twice in the same hallway I had an encounter with the first solid figure that appeared behind my brother. At night, I feel cold touches, especially on the side of my head, and the feelings of pins and needles stuck into my hands. Very recently, it was as if I was completely drained of my energy, and no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't think straight. Hours later, 
I was totally fine and slept well, but this isn't the only time that something like that has happened. One night, I was sleeping and I felt this voice speak into my ear. It was vividly clear enough to make me understand the words being said, and the voice was soft, yet in a little harsh tone. It said something like, you think you're clever, don't you? I'm stronger than you, girl. Try me. That's when I woke up. My heart was racing so fast to examine if one of my siblings played a harmless yet frightening prank on me. But when I realized there was no way for my siblings to do that to me, I froze in shock. My bed was against a wall, then, and since my door is a bit broken and the floorboards haven't been fitted back in properly, if you open the door, it would create a loud sound that would make anyone jolt. I'm a light sleeper, by the way, so there was no way that anyone could have pulled it off. Plus, I don't sleep against the wall. I always sleep away from the wall, so I would have known and felt something get onto my bed and lay beside me. It's just confusing me, all of this. I found myself crying one day because of it. I don't know what to do. I've decided to keep myself devoted to God and to follow the light as I know that's the only thing that assures me safety. I'm sorry for posting such a long story, but I would like to know your opinions and advice on what I should do or about what's happening to me. Thanks. Number 2 My name is April. I'm 21 and have a story to tell you about the experience I had with the infamous Ouija board. You have heard stories of Zozo the demon, right? Well, he is real, and I have read stories on him, but didn't actually think it was true until it happened to me. Three months ago, I had moved in with my sister, and I had brought a couple friends over to hang out that evening. We were all smoking a cigarette when I came up with the brilliant idea to play the Ouija board and ask otherworldly spirits questions about the afterlife and questions about the future. Now, I have played the board by myself for many years, with little to no negative spirits speaking with me, but this evening was in fact different. We sat at the table and put our hands on the cursor and moved it clockwise around the board as we said Ouija out loud three times. My friends weren't avid believers in the paranormal or using the board from rumors they had heard. I asked, is there anyone there? The cursor moved slowly to yes. Who are we speaking with? The cursor repeatedly went from Z to O and continued to do so after the question was asked. What do you want? It quickly spelled out her. Who is her? I asked. It spelled out my friend's name, and I was freaked. What do you want with her? It spelled out, I want her. Very quickly, the cursor returned to moving from the Z to the O, yet again, and I was getting annoyed with this because it wouldn't tell me why it wanted my friend. It just spelled out, I want her, repeatedly. My friend, the one that Demon wanted, stupidly called him a pussy, and the board spelled out, death. That's when things got bad. I got angry and told her not to provoke him because he was capable of bad things, and I sure as hell didn't want anything happening to my friends. The other friend just sat there freaked out not speaking the entire time as we continued to ask it questions, which I don't recall. The cursor began feeling hot under my fingers, and I asked my friends if they felt it too. They said they did. I asked it another question, but its answer didn't make any sense it spelled out. The word it spelled out was mama over and over and would not move to any other letters, so I cussed at him because I was getting annoyed. The one friend took his hand off the cursor and refused to play anymore, and the atmosphere immediately changed. I could feel Zozo in the room now, and the air was heavy, and I began to get scared. All of a sudden, I didn't feel like myself. I felt if something was inside me. 
I felt the most intense hatred I've ever felt before. I began to laugh hysterically and then cry like I had no control over my emotions. My mood then turned to hatred again and I turned to look at my friend, the one the demon wanted, with the most evil smile. I felt it inside. It wasn't me smiling. It was the demon. We all stopped playing the board after that, but the heavy feeling in the air and its presence remained. It took a bit before everything felt normal again that night, and I felt like myself, but when it did, I was certainly relieved. I feared for my friend's safety that night, but fortunately, none of them experienced anything after leaving. My advice, do not mess with the Ouija board. Evil Presence in the Flat Since moving out of the flat, when I was going through my divorce, I've made a point of not going back in there unless it was really necessary. When we had tenants renting the place, I had no need really, but the tenants left and my mom decided to move in there. Suddenly, I had to go there quite often. The atmosphere in the place was always thick to me. It was like the air was harder to breathe. On one specific night in April 2015, my mom sent me a message and told me strange things were going on in the flat. Not one to leave my mom alone when she was far less open than I was. I ran to the flat. She was sitting in the lounge when I came in and she asked me to step into her room and tell me if I smelled anything. As I took the one step into her room and came to the closet on my left, bed to my right, there was the very distinct smell of cigarette smoke hanging in the air. I walked towards the bed and the smell decreased towards the closet and the smell was stronger. No one in the yard smokes so the chances that it could have been carried in from outside are zero. The closet is also not close to any windows so the fact that the smoke was centralized to that spot was enough to get my hair standing on end. I went back to my mom and asked her if this was all she had been experiencing. She said no. The whole week, she could feel someone take hold of her ankles as she lay in bed. Until one night, where not only did something take hold of her legs, it pulled her halfway out until she got panicked and started kicking. By then, her legs were completely off of the bed. She swore to me for a second it felt like she had kicked a solid human being, but no one was there to be seen, although she clearly smelled the smoke. The weekend, I had Tim and Eileen over and explained the story to them. Tim went into the flat alone, leaving us by the pool, and after about five minutes, he came out. He said that the person in the flat was a man, middle-aged. He gave features to this man that had my mom and I looking at each other. For my South African compatriots, the man looked like a thinner version of Eugene Terror Blanche. I asked him if he could see the man's right arm, and Tim told me that the man made an effort of staying in silhouette. I went into Adam's room and fetched my mom's wedding album. I found a picture of my paternal grandfather and showed it to Tim. Tim nodded. The man in the flat was my mom's father, Johnny. Johnny had lost his right arm in a car accident. Considering he had been instrumental in the abuse I suffered in the flat, not to mention that he was responsible for the death of my gran when she was 32 years old. My mom was five at the time. Neither my mom nor I were very happy about the fact that he was in her home. My mom told me to take every picture of him out of the album. She took the pictures, gave them to Tim, and told him to burn them. After he had destroyed every picture, Tim told us what he needed to cleanse the flat, and he went in alone. He was busy for close to two hours. By then, it was late afternoon. As night came around, my mom went into the flat. For some odd reason, the main switch of the electricity was off. Strange. She switched the power on and went to her bedroom. My son, T, came into the flat 
and told her he smelled smoke. Since they are both asthmatics, very bad timing. My mom ran out of her room and saw the box that she had set down on the stove catch fire. Yes, not the smartest move putting flammable materials on a stove. Curious though, my mom never cooks in the flat, so the stove mains are always switched off on the circuit. Yet, every plate on the stove was glowing red, turned up to full heat, and the box and its contents were on fire. Mom yelled and grabbed T, rushing to get out. Tim rushed in, grabbed the box, dropped it in the sink, and doused the flames. Outside, both my mom and my son were having full-on asthma attacks. When Eileen and I were able to get my mom and my son calmed down and breathing, we speculated as to why the stove would have been turned on when it is never used. Tim stated very simply, You burn my pictures, I will burn you. A sick parting gift from a bad old soul. This is a story that my mother told me and my sister. Back in the 40s, my dad accepted a job in Atlanta, Georgia, and my parents moved from Chicago, Illinois to Atlanta. For several weeks, they stayed at the Biltmore Hotel in Atlanta while looking for a home. One night, my mother, who was eight months pregnant at the time, was alone in the room by herself because my dad was on a business trip. She said that she woke up at about 3.35 in the morning and saw a man standing beside the bed and looking at her. The man was well dressed in a suit and smiling at her, but she knew immediately it was a ghost, because although she could see him plainly, he was transparent. She could see through him. When she was growing up, the woman who had raised her told her if she ever saw a ghost, say the Lord's Prayer, and it would go away. She pulled the sheet over her head and said the Lord's Prayer. But when she looked again, he was still there. She would close her eyes and open them again, but he did not go away. She fell asleep with the sheets pulled over her head, and the next day she found out at the front desk that a man had died in that room. At that exact time, she saw the ghost. She described the man she saw to the clerk to ask if she knew him. She felt like the ghost meant her no harm and was there to make himself known and protect her. Her and her sister lived in an old house in Champaign, Illinois, and they both told me that they encountered ghosts several times in that home. And one time, they both woke up and saw one standing in their room. So far, I've never seen a ghost, but I'm convinced that they do exist. I've worked as a registered nurse at Henry Meal Hospital for many years. There are so many reportings there that I'm not sure I can list them all, but here are a few. The TCU, Transitional Care Unit, is probably the most haunted unit. It serves patients who are not acutely ill, but are also not quite well enough to return home, so consequently. A lot of our elderly patients have spent a great deal of time there, including one that never quite made it home and died on the unit. There have been reports of a walker moving by itself down the hall at night. One room in particular, don't know the numbers I didn't work there regularly, has a reputation for the call light repeatedly going off at night when it is empty of patients. So much so that the engineering has refused to come fix the bell when the nurses played to have it silenced. I only worked there one night and had a heavy fire door slowly swing open in front of me and another nurse as if someone was going into the room. No windows or doors were open as they were bolted shut and the door is extremely heavy. The other nurse, terrified, screamed at me, close the door, close the door. That same night, I had a female patient who had been in her room for a few months and said she felt like she was going batty and that she was so thankful for her TV. Shortly after it went to static 
and I couldn't turn it off with the remote, nor by pushing the power on and off button on the set itself, and finally had to get a chair to flat out pull out the cord from the outlet that was situated near the ceiling. One night, one of the nurses was working a very late shift at night, and she went to go grab a mop after she spilled her drink all over the lobby floor. She went down to the storage area, where she knew nobody was there at the time. As she opened the door to the storage closet, in the darkness, she swore she saw what looked to be the face of an elderly woman from the other side of the room, and two glowing eyes, barely lit. It was all just bright enough to be seen with a naked eye. She immediately turned on the light and ran all the way back. She refused to go down there the rest of her time working there and even change careers. It was that devastating to her. On the medical surgical unit too, there are ghosts up and down the whole hallway. The end opposite the nurse's station is especially bad. Rooms 148, 146, and 142 are the worst. Oftentimes, patients who are dying are put in these rooms, and shortly before they do die, patients often report seeing a little blonde girl in their room at night. They either ask the nurses to get her out, or at the very least, ask who she is. I had an aide one night open up a utility locker at the same end and saw the girl. She was crouched behind a walker, scared, looking up at her. Sometimes machines won't work in those rooms, even if you trade them in several times from the supply department with different ones. They suddenly will start working again. Myself and another nurse witnessed shadow people at the same time walk past the nurse's station window while the computers and lights dim simultaneously. He saw the same night, one channel person standing in a doorway, just staring at him. He looked up and asked yes, thinking it was a nurse aide willing to ask him a question, only to realize it wasn't an aide. Aides have seen patients that weren't there earlier in the evening, suddenly lying in a bed, and thinking it was a new admission, brought the vital science machine back in to take their vitals, only to have the patient gone and the bed still made. Med Surge 1 is next to Med Surge 2, and though it isn't as bad as 2, I've had a patient complain that she felt little kids poking at her and pulling her gown all evening. Med Surge 1 was a patriotic unit for one year when the hospital was first built was shut down as it wasn't financially sustainable. The elevators near the cafeteria that lead down to the morgue are just plain creepy at night. I've known people that have had them slam open and shut closed several times before finally shutting and going down to the morgue. I personally would have had them open for me almost 100% of the time if I was pushing a gurney and didn't have a free hand to hit the button saying thanks to stay on whatever's good side. Besides, it is kind of nice, except for the creepy part. These are only a few of the stories off the top of my head. I myself have only worked on a few of the units, so I'm sure there are many more. I made a dark joke one day to one of the old time doctors that the hospital was built in an old Indian burial ground, as it has so much activity there and he responded that indeed it is. Who knows if he is right, but all of Santa Clarita has had Indian tribes situated throughout the valley for thousands of years. In fact, we were one of the main trading hubs, if not the main trading hub, from tribes spanning down into Mexico, all the way up to Canada. I can't validate the Indian burial ground part, but the stories are related to you here. I either experienced myself or spoke with the Asian person firsthand who had just experienced something themselves, except for TCU. But there again, I used firsthand accounts.
I grew up in the great state of Utah. As many know, this state has a rich glorified history of Native Americans who have lived on the North American soil for generations. I'm going to tell you about my experiences with a ghostly apparition, a series of unusual chants I heard while camping at the famous Uneta National Forest, and even a ghost dog. The climate of Utah is more diverse than you would think. We have areas of lush vegetation, forests, and other greener parts of the state in the north, and in the south, we have dry barren deserts. This first story is about what my grandfather witnessed when he was driving late at night on the road. This was in St. George, Utah. My grandfather was always a very straight-laced person, never drank never smoked, always got enough sleep, and had a good head on his shoulders. The reason why I'm mentioning this is to explain what he saw that night. He was driving late at night, where there were barely any cars on the road. In fact, it seemed like he was the only one driving on this road. It was pitch black, and the only visibility he had was from his headlights that shine across the road. He had been driving on the same road for about 15 minutes, a road that was completely isolated in the middle of nowhere. Out of nowhere, he saw what looked to be a Native American man standing in the middle of the road from the distance. He slowed down immediately after he saw this, fearing he would hit the man. As he got closer, the Native American man disappeared. Now, he knew it wasn't his imagination. The man looked real to him, at least from afar. His mind wasn't playing tricks on him, and he swore to this day he wasn't tired. He knew what he saw. My grandfather was so floored by the whole event, he had to pause for a second and pull off to the side of the road. Where he stopped was where he saw the man. There was absolutely nothing, and no one there. No homes in the area, just desert, and a long winding road at night. There was no way he could explain it. This was also in the 1960s, and St. George was way smaller than it is now. A population around 5,000. My grandpa is still alive, in his 90s and he hasn't given up on the authenticity of his story. He swears he saw a real ghost, and I'm convinced he will take his story to his grave. As for my experience, my family went camping in the Unita National Forest, where we set up a tent deep in the woods. I remember it was a fantastic time, just me, my dad, and my brother. We heard nothing but the sounds of nature, and were truly enjoying our time alone from civilization. It was getting later in the night, and so we set up a campfire. It might have been around 11 p.m. at night, when my brother, my dad, and I all heard what sounded like a ghostly chant, almost sounding like a group of Native Americans. It sounded almost as if the chants were as low as gorillas chanting to us, which was unusual, because gorillas definitely don't live in Utah, and I couldn't think of an animal that could make such a deep voice. And not only that, but multiple voices chanting at once. What made it so eerie was that it wasn't frantic. The chants had a peacefulness to it. But of course, we were all freaked out. It was definitely not a comforting chant, but it wasn't boisterous. So anyway, my dad told me and my brother to get into the tent to sleep at night because my dad was genuinely concerned that maybe there were dangerous people out there trying to scare us. The chance only lasted for about a minute and it eventually went dead silent and we never heard it again. I think my dad must have waited outside the tent with campfire for an hour or two just to make sure everything was okay. He eventually went back into the tent himself. However, 
that night of bizarre events were far from being over. As we were sleeping, my dad said that he was awakened by the sound of rustling leaves. He woke up and noticed from the inside of his tent a shadow on the other side, as in when you are in a tent and you see someone or something shadow move by. He immediately jumped out of the tent to investigate, but there was nobody there. He thought nothing of it, and then went back to bed. On the third night after camping, we went to bed as usual, and this time, I experienced the same occurrence. Instead of it being a shadow of what my dad thought was a person, it seemed to be of a creature. My guess was, a dog because the shadow shape looked to be of that. It could have been a bear, because the shadow was small from seeing it move from inside of the tent. I immediately woke my dad up, and he went out, and again, nothing. Not sure what to make of all these events, but I'm certain there's more than meets the eye. I had a strange thing happen to me once when I was in the Philippines visiting family. The home I stayed in was part of a group of three homes around a central courtyard and a shared restroom and shower facility with the other two houses. My family showed me around the place the day I arrived and then told me to be careful when going outside at night because there was a ghost that haunted the area. My reaction, of course, was yeah right, because I just knew they were messing with me. My third night there, I wasn't feeling well and needed to go to the restroom a lot more than usual. Don't drink the water in the Philippines, by the way. So I ended up going out to the restroom facility late at night. The restroom facility was on the far side of the courtyard from the house I was staying in and around the side of one of the other houses. And it was very dark because the lights were out in all of the houses and the nearest street light was pretty far away. I was on my way back from the restroom and just as I walked into the courtyard, what felt like a force grabbed me from behind. It was such an odd feeling, like a major resistance pushing me back, almost like going against gravity. To clarify, I don't mean literally, it was just an overwhelming pressure. But I could feel the energy around me so strongly, it's hard to explain exactly. I ended up turning around and going in the opposite direction to an empty field that bordered the courtyard because something was almost pulling me in that direction like there were hands on my body. I say something because it felt like a force grabbing me on my arms. This force seemed to disappear when I got closer to the field. I shifted my body around, and all of a sudden, I saw this solid black human shape from a few feet away, not moving, just a black mass silhouette that I could identify as a human, if that makes sense. I took off running towards the home and looking over my shoulder again, and the black shadow was gone. I burst into the home, and apparently I screamed. I don't remember even doing it, but I'm not surprised and I'm not ashamed because people were coming out of their bedrooms to see what was going on. I told everyone what happened and they all took it in stride. One cousin even said, oh yeah, that happens. I was really freaked out and didn't sleep the rest of that night and I didn't go out at night alone the rest of the time I was there. I did some reading and asked some questions since then, and the answer I got most often was that it was an evil spirit. From what I've read and been told, these are paranormal entities that are angry, evil, and seek to harm people. Sometimes they used to be human, but others were never human. When I ask what they were if they weren't human, I hear the word demon tossed around quite often. Regardless, there are many stories similar to mine where a black shadow or human shape has grabbed a person, and I just wanted to tell you about my experience. 
maybe someone else has had this kind of experience as well. I grew up in a hip stone roof farmhouse that used to belong to my grandparents. We lived in a German American neighborhood and many farmhouses had a quaint old country sensibility with the main living space a flight of stairs up from the entrance. Like many older homes, ours was large in size, but broken up into small rooms. One such room was my grandmother's old pantry, just off the kitchen. My parents had turned half of it into a small home office, with a desk for the telephone, back in the day of one telephone per household, next to a window that looked out into our backyard. When I was very small, I used to enjoy looking out of our windows at night, making wishes on stars, watching sparkling waves of snow fall through the glow of our yard light, waiting for my dad to come in from his evening milking chores in the barn, occasionally finding surprises, like the summer evening that a huge green luna moth came to rest on the window of the door. This small, close telephone room frightened me. I enjoyed the backyard evening view, so I'd bravely venture into the room, crawl up into the chair next to the window, and look outside. One evening, I had a desire to look out the telephone room window. As usual, I was somewhat apprehensive about entering the little room, but my curiosity overcame my anxiety. I took a deep breath and prepared to step over the threshold the warm light of the kitchen into the darkness. As I did, I looked into the window, and there I saw, staring right back at me, the wizened face of an old man hovering in midair. He was partially bald and had a long handlebar mustache, and he had a furious, even hateful expression. I remember screaming in terror and running outside into the arms of my perplexed mother crying that a scary old man was floating outside. I remember my mother wondering if I'd seen a frightening program on television and had let my imagination run away with me. I was understandably afraid to venture into that room for a while. The fear and the memory of that night faded away. To the extent that I remembered my experience at all, I tended to explain it in terms of a vivid imagination and I never had another experience like that in that room. Many years later when I was a teen, I was sitting at the dinner table with my parents as they were reminiscing about their childhoods, their earliest memories. My father said that one of his earliest memories was of his father's original home, a small wooden home that once stood a short distance away from our farmhouse. He said that he remembered his grandfather dying and being laid out in the parlor of that little home, as was a common occurrence in that rural neighborhood, even in the 20s. What do you remember about your grandfather? My mother asked. He was an old man, mean and strict. We kids were afraid of him. He didn't have a lot of hair, but he did have one of those old-fashioned handlebar mustaches, Dad replied. I felt the hair rise in the back of my neck, as I suddenly remembered that vision of my early childhood. My name is Lena, and I'm from Malta. I was looking at your site because I have a ghost story I wanted to share with you. About eight years ago, I was living with my ex-boyfriend, who had recently changed the house at the time. The home was about 50 years old, and as we were fast asleep, Maybe it was between half past two and three in the morning. I began to slightly wake up because although I was not fully awake in my head, I was hearing some noises like I had a metal bucket in my yard, which was near the bedroom, like someone was dragging it. Then the wardrobe doors began like someone was shutting and opening them. The wardrobe was by the wall on the side where I was sleeping. I want to remind you that by then, I was still not fully awake, and then I could hear near my ear like people talking. Remember, I was half awake until all of a sudden, I was fully awake, and at the end of the bed, 
I saw two figures of two men, and although it was dark in the room, I saw them clearly. When I saw this, I was in awe, and I rose on my ankles, and these two figures, as I already told you, were of two men. One was young, and the other was older, and they were wearing white robes, and on their heads they had these white turbans, and they had no feet. They half turned and looked at me, and then they went forward like in a slow motion, and began to fade, until they vanished through the wall. I was not frightened at all. I swear that I was fully awake when I saw them, and in the morning, I told my ex-boyfriend who did not see nothing, because only me they had woken up, and he didn't believe me, but I know for sure that it happened. To this day, I don't know who they were. Excuse me for my poor English. Throughout the years, I've had many experiences with things I've never been able to explain. I'll share some of them here. This is the first one I have a memory of. When I was very small, about five years old, we lived with my grandmother while our house was being built. I always felt warm and protected in that home. I never was afraid. Even though my room was at the top of very narrow stairs and was under the eaves of the attic, I never feared anything in that room. One night, there was a terrible thunderstorm, and I remember dreaming that there was a fire under my parents' bed. I woke up screaming and ran into their room. I kept telling my father that there was a fire under the bed. They did their best to explain that it was only a nightmare, and that there was no fire. My father even got out of bed, pulled up the covers, looked under the bed, and promised that there was no fire. I eventually fell back to sleep in the bed with them. An hour or so later, I had the dream again, but the fire was bigger. I started screaming again and woke my parents. This time, however, there was the distinct smell of burning wiring, and indeed, the floorboards under the bed had started to smolder. Luckily for all of us, my father was able to shut off the electricity and stop the fire before it truly started. The only damage was replacing some wiring and a few floorboards. From that point on though, my parents always listened to me when I had an unusual dream or saw something out of the ordinary. This though, was the scariest thing my parents witnessed when I just turned five years old. We always had the attic stairs open. Apparently, I'd sneaked into our attic for multiple days. And when my parents would catch me playing in the attic, they would ask me why I kept going up there. I would tell them that the old man in the attic was lonely and he wanted a friend. So I continued to talk to him to keep him company. This clearly startled my parents. And after the fire incident and the dreams that I had, they wanted to get to the bottom of this. They continuously asked me, where is this man? So I would point at the corner in the attic and say he's staring at you. He's very mad you ignored him. It was at this point we had a priest come bless the home because it really seemed like a massive negative energy was in the home. I even remember getting a witch psychic to come and investigate, to talk to whoever the man was and get an idea. So we did get a spirit session, and she talked with the spirit. The psychic said she felt a man named Jim was burned to death in this home. With what I said about having dreams of the home burning, it was a man in his early 60s. So we got a spirit box, and the psychic asked if Jim was there. He confirmed and said fire truck four or five times, then smoke, and I was smoked. The psychic then asked the spirit if it died a bad death, and the spirit box said, Are you kidding? She asked again. He said, Yes. You can't make this stuff up. If you ever played with a spirit box before, you know that the spirits communicate with their energy to create statements through radio frequencies and whatnot. What we were able to discern 
was that there was probably a fire in this home and that this old man was caught in it. We don't know much aside from that. This whole experience was spooky. This was back in 2009. I've been a fan of your website for years. I love to read the new and upcoming stories that have been published to your page, as well as the old ones. I used to not really believe in ghosts, like many, until I began encountering them myself. My first experience was when I was right out of high school, and I was working at a bed and breakfast. I sent in that story when it happened. I've since graduated from college and am now teaching in a quaint town called Wool Market in Mississippi. The school has been registered as being the oldest in Mississippi, as well as one of the oldest in the United States. In the 1800s, the community was the center of the wool trade, hence the name Wool Market. Eventually, a school was built in 1910 by the people of the community to help educate their children. It still stands and currently has about 300 students post Hurricane Katrina. Well, 300 students we can actually see. We are not sure how many attend after hours. The faculty and staff just know it is more than one. This is my second year teaching and I absolutely love it. The faculty are close, and some of us even stay after school on Wednesdays to do lesson plans together. I was told upon being hired that it isn't the safest place to be after hours, but I didn't realize what they even meant until I started staying late to do lessons. The teacher I worked with started telling me stories of when she used to have a classroom in the main building. She said she used to come real early in the morning to get things set up in her room before the children came, and she would hear children laughing and giggling in the hallway, but she was the only one at school. She said the intercom would come on in her class, and she would hear little children whispering through the system, but when she walked up to the office, it was locked. When I was hired on, the lead teacher told me she never sits at the school alone for the same reasons. Well, doing the lessons at school was just a lot easier for me than dragging all the books home and doing them, so my teacher friend and I began doing them together to make the time go quicker. Usually when everyone had left for the day and we had settled into our seats for a good while, is when we began hearing strange noises. The door to the main building would open and shut by itself and we knew no one was there. We would hear little children giggling and running down the hall. The intercom would come on in different classrooms down the hall, and we could hear a voice that was not familiar. We began hearing what sounded like adult voices telling students to be quiet in the hallway. Last, but not least, desks would be heard moving and being arranged in different rooms including the one I taught in. I would walk in, and my desk would be rearranged from the day before. When we would leave the school at night, sometimes after dark, we would see lights flicker on and off in the main building. Soon, things began missing. My lesson plans that I would have placed on my desk to be turned in the following morning would show up in a strange place I know I did not put them or never be found. Then, when I began taking my printed copy home, my lesson plans on the computer screen would go in a sort of landscape mode if you will, and would print out where the words would go off the page. There was no way to unlandscape the screen for them to print out correctly. My principal thought it was a joke and told me to fix it, when I showed her that it wasn't setting on the computer that was causing it. She realized I wasn't kidding. When I started talking to the students and telling them how much I enjoyed them being there, my computer screen formatted my lessons back to its original setting, and I never had that problem again. But, as for the giggling, desk moving, and the door slamming, it continues. In fact, while I was teaching last week, 
I think that one of the students from the past wanted to sit in on my lesson. The door was shut, and it just opened completely by itself, and shut by itself, and a piece of paper flew out on an empty desk up front. The students seemed to feel a chill in the air, and then it was gone. The door opened again, by itself, and closed by itself. My first graders call him Casper, and don't really mind if he pays another visit. My principal says she has encountered similar occurrences in the school, as she too refuses to stay at the school alone. She claims the police officer at night refuses to go by the north wing of the school or my classroom, and several others are located, because he sees strange things. Many teachers feel that there are students who died while they were attending World Market. Others feel that they are students who attended the school when it was an agricultural school in the 1800s. Whoever they are, they make themselves known to many who attend the school now. We are not afraid of them, but the thought that they exist is kind of creepy. After renting a house in Longview, Washington, my grandmother informed me that their very close friends owned the house before I was born, and that they went there quite often. On occasion, while watching TV in the living room, I would see a man in a brown suit walking down the hallway out of the corner of my eye. When I looked directly that way, he would disappear. On my 12th birthday, my sister-in-law had got me a black balloon with a tombstone on front of it with the saying, R.I.P. Youth. About a week later, I had just finished barbecuing some steaks and was sitting down to watch the Seahawks play a Monday night football game. With no wind to propel it, the balloon came around the corner from the kitchen into the living room. It stopped halfway into the living room and went back into the hallway towards the bedroom that the man in a brown seemed to be heading to. Halfway down the hall, it stopped, reversed direction, and came back into the living room, where I attacked it with a steak knife. After draining all the helium from it, I threw it away. Our daughter would not sleep in the bedroom that the man appeared to be heading to, saying she felt his presence and was frightened. We changed bedrooms with her, but I had no feeling of his presence there myself. I saw this apparition on numerous occasions, but never felt any dread associated with it. When I described the estimated height and attire of this apparition to my grandmother, she said it sounded like their friend George. I never saw his wife, and according to my grandmother, they were childless. When I was about 13 or 14 years old, I witnessed something that I will never forget to this day. Every night before I went to bed, my dad always left the bathroom light on so that he wouldn't trip or stumble on anything trying to get to the bathroom in the middle of the night. I knew that the bathroom light was on before I closed my eyes. Usually, if my dad forgot to turn it on, I would do it myself. The light from the bathroom always shined directly into my room, and I would have my door cracked open so that the light would not be directly in my face. I'm not sure what time it was when I woke up, but all I know is that every light in the house is off, including the bathroom, and my door was open all the way. I was lying on my side, looking towards the door, and that's when I saw a black figure standing in the door frame. It looked like it was leaning on the side of the door frame just looking at me. I could not see the face or what kind of clothes it had on. It was tall and slender. It did look like it was wearing a hat as well. It did not move one inch. The house was dark, but this figure was even darker than the room. I could see the shape of the shoulders and the neck, and I knew it was tall because the top of the head was close to the top of the doorway. I was scared, and at first, I wanted to get up and turn the light on, 
The light switch was next to the figure standing in the doorway. So I thought I'd see if maybe it was my dad or my brother playing a joke on me and call out their name. But there was no answer. I knew that it could have been them. Because my dad and my brother are not walking around the house in the dark. They are pretty jumpy when it comes to haunted houses and going into dark rooms. Instantly, I had the uncomfortable and frightened feeling inside of me. And I laid down in my bed and threw the covers over my head. I began to pray to myself like my mom had taught me. I waited about 10 minutes, then took the blankets off my head. It was gone. I jumped out of bed and ran to turn the light on. Then I looked down the hallway and in the bathroom. I turned on the bathroom light before I went back to my bedroom. The next morning, I asked my dad if he was standing in the doorway last night, and he said no. I also asked my brother if he was there, and he said no. I'm not sure what it was or what it wanted that night, but to this day, I have problems sleeping with all the lights off or going into the dark room to turn a light on. I have many stories from my childhood encounters with the supernatural, which I might share at a later date, but for now, I would like to tell you of my current home and the spirit which resides in it. The home used to belong to an older couple, who as I've been told by neighbors, were pretty much forgotten about by their own grown-up children. They had both passed away of old age, and of course, the home and almost all of their belongings went up for sale. My husband purchased the home and we moved in. Since the birth of our children, now six and four, the kids and I have come to find out that there was another person living in the home as well. It started when I was pregnant with my son. I would awake at night to find my daughter sitting up in bed playing with a toy that I knew she didn't have in her crib when I laid her down for the night. I assume my husband was giving her these toys off the floor when he would get home from working second shift. I asked him about it, and he assured me he was not even walking into her room, let alone giving her toys in the middle of the night. I started to watch her during her naps, just to see if she had found a way to climb out of her crib and back in again. I never once saw her climb out, or into it, for that matter. When my son was born, we moved him into the room with our daughter. It's only a two-bedroom home. As my son grew older, we heard very little from our resident ghost. One night, I had just gone to bed and was just about to drift off when I saw someone dart down the hall to my children's room. I got up and peeked in, but there was no one there and all was quiet, so I went back to bed. I laid back down under the covers and closed my eyes, and right next to my ear, I hear an older woman's voice rather loudly say, I can't breathe. For some reason, I thought of my son in that moment. Well, I jumped to my feet and ran to the kids' room. My son was breathing, but it was very struggled. I called my neighbor to come sit with my daughter and call my husband at work while en route to the emergency room. It turns out that my son had allergies to eggs which I had never realized, and I had made omelets that evening for dinner. Since then, the visits to my kids are almost nightly. They love to hear me tell stories about the ghost we have come to call Granny Ghost. When they go to bed at night, they say their prayers and thought prayers they ask for Granny goes to watch over them and keep them safe always. I must admit, I hope she stays around too. My son may not be here today if it wasn't for her. She's welcome to stay with us as long as she likes. That is my story. Thank you for taking the time to read it. I would like to submit the following based on personal experience since we, or myself, have lived in these homes. 
Homer, Massachusetts. This home was owned by my husband since its construction in 1927. Deceased family members often made their presence known by pushing us, whispering, talking out loud, and showing themselves in partial form. Bagpipe music was heard in the basement of the home. My husband's deceased grandfather. Tiny shadows dancing on a bedroom ceiling were witnessed. A dark shape flying through the basement on one occasion was seen by my husband. And in Oxford, Massachusetts, I own this home with my late ex-husband. He loved the house so much that he swore he would never sell it during his lifetime. Soon after his death in 2001, his voice had been heard by a neighbor calling out to her in a happy greeting. A fleeting glimpse of him had been seen through the kitchen and living room windows. The house was sold at an auction in 2002. No word on whether or not his spirit has been seen since. Dudley, Massachusetts. Built in 1839, this home has been the scene of many hauntings, witnessed by both the former owner of the home and myself, as I had rented the house in 1983 for six months. A baby who had died in an unused upstairs bedroom could often be heard crying. The baby would pull blankets off of a bed in another upstairs room. The creaking sounds of a rocking chair could be heard from the dead baby's bedroom. The images of four men could be seen in the basement. Voices were often heard from the basement. A white image was once seen, streaking from the kitchen into the bathroom wall, which was formerly a pantry. Many cold spots were felt even in the hottest summer months. Some people who entered the home usually felt a feeling of uneasiness, like they shouldn't be there. Footsteps were often heard, the sound of a dragging foot. I later learned this was the ghost of a former owner who had suffered a leg injury during the Civil War. The home was sold in the summer of 1983 to owners who claim they've never experienced any hauntings but the house mysteriously went up for sale months after they had purchased it. Springfield, Massachusetts My husband lived in this opulent home as a child in the 1960s. The entire family witnessed the spirits of a soldier who had lived in the home before dying during the war. Fatal wounds could be seen on his body when he thought nobody was looking at him, but if someone caught sight of him, and gave him their attention. The bloody wounds would disappear. Other sightings included a former groundskeeper, a small bright dancing light that may have been the spirit of a dead infant, and the ominous form of an elderly woman who would glare at living family members. A room on the unused third floor of the home that held the remains of a wooden bed, and iron rings into the post of the bed, possibly keeping a hidden family member who had been insane or mentally disturbed. My husband's family members described disturbing feelings if they entered this room, as if a satanic spirit dwelled there. After my husband's family moved from the home, the home burned to the ground. A chain-link fence was constructed around the vacant house lot, and nothing was rebuilt in its place as of 2002. I actually just remembered a story. I guess I blocked it out because it scared me, and it was so long ago, and I've added a couple of legends from around here. When I was in middle school, I would stay with my friend a lot. She was all into ghosts, witchcraft, and all that. She lived in the country, way, way out. One night she told me a story about an old house up in the mountains that a family used to live there. And one day, their children, boy and girl, were left unattended. The girl had an apple and a sharp knife so she could cut it. They began running around and the little girl flipped over the couch. And well, you can come to the conclusion it wasn't good. She fell on a knife and bled to death on the couch. My friend told me the couch was up there still, and what she had experienced on trips up there. Well, being that it was so late there, there was no way I was walking up a dirt road 
on a mountain up to a haunted house. So the next day we started walking up there. We passed an old barn that was just spooky. You know how you can just look at a house or structure and get a bad feeling from it? So we continued up to the house, but we never made it in. As soon as the house came into view, I saw something in the upstairs window. I just brushed it off though, because I never experienced anything. We got up to the porch and could hear children laughing, and as soon as you got to the door the laughter stopped, and a little girl's voice said mommy. After that, I took the hint and took off running, leaving my friend behind. Well, it also had been raining earlier that day, so needless to say, the road was money, but you can bet I was running so fast that I slid on my side most of the way back down the road. So even though I'm interested in hauntings and historical sites, I will never go again unless I'm with a group. Out of that experience, all I got was a muddy side and sore leg, and scared half to death. I guess the little girl was wondering if it was her mother returning home, since she never saw her mother again after the accident. Another time I was at my cousin's sleepover birthday party, but she had in their basement apartment. So being like she is, she had a Ouija board. I know that Ouija boards are really only games. But this is what happened. I wouldn't play with it. Surprised? I think not. Anyway, I was sitting on the couch watching a few others play with it. There was a remote on the counter on the other side of the room. And all of a sudden, it was like someone had just pushed it off the counter in a range because it went flying all the way across the room. No one was near it at all. So later, and we we're all trying to get sleep. We had about three portable heaters because we were in the basement. Even with the heaters on full blast and all of us girls in the room, the more people, more body heat, warmer room. The room was ice cold. So needless to say, I didn't get any sleep because it was too cold for comfort. There are only a couple of haunted places around here. There's a tunnel to nowhere. When the construction workers were working on it, it collapsed and killed many. If you go at night and you have the nerve to go into the tunnel, pitch black, you can't even see your hand in front of you. As you go deeper into the tunnel, if you have a flashlight, count on it going out. And also count on your breathing getting harder too. As you go further, sure there are explanations, but this is the story behind it that makes you want to believe it's something else. Then, there's Helen's Bridge. I'm not sure of the true story behind Helen, but all the ones that I've heard can be summed up like this. Something happened to Helen's baby. She jumped off the unfinished bridge to her sad ending. If you venture onto the bridge, which is closed to the public now, you have to walk quite a way. If you walk towards the edge of the bridge and say, Helen, I got your baby, she appears and tries to harm you if you're dumb enough to stick around. Another thing I experienced really did give me the creeps. Me and a bunch of friends were just out for a ride. They told me about the cemetery that is haunted. If you go through it at night, your car supposedly turns around and cuts off. Me being the chicken I am, I said forget that. Well, they tricked me. They took me into the cemetery another way. As soon as I realized it was a cemetery, I started freaking out and put the car into reverse before I ventured further into the cemetery. Even though I put the car in reverse, when I pushed on the gas, I wouldn't move. It had been put into neutral. So I tried again, stepped on the gas, went forward been put into drive. Well then, I tried once more and it went right back into neutral. No one was pushing the gear shift. None of them even know how to drive a stick. So finally, and luckily, because by this time I was pretty freaked, it stayed in reverse and I went home and stayed shook up about it for most of the night. 
Even though I didn't see anything, something was trying to force me to enter. My name is Joe, and this is my most recent encounter. At least I feel it is an encounter. I'm 33, have a very open mind to these such things, and do try to look at both sides of the story before I go telling my family. I also consider myself to be on the sensitive side of those feelings, as in being watched, here standing up, those types of feelings. It was about two years ago. My ex-girlfriend and I just rented a new place in Malden, Massachusetts. It was very nice and not too old looking. Two floors and a done over attic with two bedrooms up there. There was a very nicely done master bedroom directly under one of the rooms. That room had a storage space not finished. The creepy event started on the night that our new furniture was delivered. I was meeting the delivery guys. I received the new goods and proceeded to start putting together the dining room table and was alone that night. Suddenly, and I do stress suddenly, I got this eerie feeling I was being watched. A feeling that was full of dread and despair. It was ridiculously unnerving. I did have the radio on, so it wasn't dead silent, but that didn't matter. I tried to shake it off by singing, just so I could get my mind off that feeling. Trying to comfort myself by saying that, it's just because you're in a different place. You haven't got comfortable in your new surroundings yet. It wasn't working. Those feelings were getting stronger. Now mind you, I'm putting this table together in the living room, and that feeling was coming from behind me, from on the stairs. It's as if someone sits on the stairs and pokes their head through the dowels, sort of like they're in jail. As hard as it was, that feeling wasn't going away. So what did I do? I got up off my knees, looked at my watch, and repeatedly told myself, it's getting late. I said that's enough for tonight. Trying to kid myself, and left pretty quickly. I didn't say anything to my girlfriend about this since I just thought it was me. So I'm a night owl, and I love watching the TV late into the night. My girlfriend is dead asleep and is next to me in bed. It's around 1.30 a.m. when I start hearing a banging. Not banging like a pounding, but a banging, like stomping noises. These sounds were coming from my daughter's room above us, and she was staying at her grandmother's house that night. I mute the TV and cock my head to focus my hearing, and then it stops. I quickly dismiss it and then unmute the TV. No sooner I do that, that stomping comes back again. Now I'm getting a little nervous, because in the other room up there is her son. He's five and fell asleep hours ago. I shut the TV off, put a pillow over my head, and go to sleep, all the while wondering what the heck that was. But it did stop, and nothing else happened that night. Now mind you, this was only a couple span of days, one weeknight, and oh by the way, we had a mini chihuahua. I was going in the basement to do laundry and the basement wasn't finished, but it was still nice and had small box windows at about the outside grass level, and the dog was following me. At about the time I got to the third step down, I noticed he was still at the threshold of the entranceway refusing to come down. I called, and I said, come on. He whined and fled back upstairs. I started to do the laundry, and it starts again. Hairs on my neck stand straight up. Goosebumps start appearing on my arms, and the feeling of not being alone floods my body. My fight or flight alarms are going off, and my nerves are starting to get shaky at best. It's not like it felt like a presence was right behind me. It was more towards the other side of the room, as if something was just hanging around. Being curious, I finished putting the laundry in the washing machine and started to go upstairs. I then start getting a sense of relief. Now this could be my own mind playing tricks on me. But as I got to the top step, I felt it again. But this time, 
It was like it was watching me from the bottom step, just looking up at me as I left. When I got through the door, I felt fine, and nothing really else happened the rest of the night. Up until now, this whole experience was a little unsettling, and nothing major. One night, however, at about 2 or so in the morning, I was playing a computer game. My ex was asleep once again. The computer room was small, about 6 by 6 feet, and it had a doorway, but no door. The computer faces the back wall, so when you sit by the computer, your back is to the very short hallway and stairs. So if you turn around, you can see both very easily. Anyway, I'm playing and feeling comfortable when all of a sudden, the stairs creak. I thought it was just the stairs being stairs, making settling noises and the like, and then again I hear one more creak. Now, the daughter, and she was home this time, was known for trying to sneak down the stairs at night and watch TV. This second time I thought it was her and I turned around, but no one was there. You hear one creak, you can easily dismiss it, but two? That's when the nervous thoughts start to creep in. Suddenly, they stop. No more creaks as they started to relax and continue to play. All of a sudden, the room, even though small, had an open air about it. So if you sit at the computer, you could just feel that there was no door and hence open. I felt as if there was someone standing in the doorway and making me feel closed in, casually standing there and watching me. I could feel eyes upon me. I didn't dare myself to turn around. So I look in the moment, nothing. The thing was, it must have gotten closer because very quickly, the hair stood up again. I started getting chills and I felt a cold and tingling sensation. I then felt as if there was a slight pressure on my right shoulder, as if a hand was being placed on it, very subtle and slight coldness. It felt very much like someone was behind me and looking over my shoulder. This freaked me out so much that I shut the game down very quickly and went to bed, like a five-year-old who's afraid of thunderstorms. The next day, I decided it was time to say something to my girlfriend. I told her what happened, and she looked at me like I had ten heads, but still had the look of belief and disbelief. I asked her if she's ever felt any of these feelings that I've had, and her response was no. We went outside to have a cigarette, and the landlord, Dave, pulls into the driveway. We give him a cheery hi, and she blurts it out. Joe thinks we have ghosts. I gave her a look of disgust and he starts in, laughs a little, jokes with me, and says, So we do, huh? I tell him about what's been happening to me, and I asked if he's ever felt anything. His response is no. This house is Dave's first rental property, and only the second to live in here, as opposed to the original owners. I asked him if he knows anything that has happened in this home even the age of it, and he said I don't know. He did say it was kind of dated, but he never specified the exact age of this place. Well, to say the least, I never got to find out any more about what it was, because we broke up, and to this day, I'm still convinced that something is in here. Several years ago, I was planning on moving from the USA to Australia to be with my partner, Craig. My partner and I would talk for hours on the web. What else can you do when you're 9,000 miles apart? My daughter, Catherine, who was seven at the time, would often get in on it too. Her and Greg developed a very loving father-daughter relationship, even though he is her stepdad. One day, no different than any other, Greg and I were chatting. He wanted to talk to Catherine. I yelled for her. She was in another room, and I couldn't see the monitor. She came running and stopped dead inside the doorway, 
she could not see the monitor and started wigging out, demanding that Greg shut his bedroom door, which was clearly visible behind him. She wouldn't move from where she was. We tried to coax her, but she wasn't having any of it. Greg got up and closed the bedroom door. Catherine ran into my lap and buried her face into my shoulder, away from the monitor. She wouldn't even look at the monitor. I asked her what was wrong, and she said, He's mean, and I don't want to see him. Completely caught off guard, I asked her who was mean. She answered, the mean guy in the doorway. I asked her to describe him. She said he was tall, had red hair, blue eyes, and wore a dressy shirt. Deeper voice than Greg's. Oh, and by the way, Greg's voice is already pretty deep enough as it is. I tried to get more information out of her. That was all she had, or what she wanted to tell me anyway. I relayed what she had told me to Greg, and he just didn't get it. Catherine left my lap as fast as she had flown into it, yelled goodbye Greg from all the room. I wondered if she had seen something. I had episodes like that when I was her age, and they've continued. I asked Greg if she had described anyone he might know. He looked shocked for a second, and then asked me to wait. He went into the bedroom, and came out a few minutes later with a pick in his hand. He looked at me, held up the pick, and said, Wonder if this is who she saw. I asked who it was, and he said it was his grandfather Bill, who passed away in 92. It was 2007. Now get this, the pick was exactly the description Catherine had given. He was tall, red haired, blue eyed, had a dressy shirt in the pick. I asked Craig how he talked, and he said that Bill was old school Aussie. His voice was deeper than most, and with the accent, it was even harder for Greg to understand him. I excused myself and went and told Catherine who we thought it was. As soon as I said the name Bill, she smiled. She said, I thought that was his name. That was the only thing I could almost understand. She seemed more at ease after learning it was his name. Greg, on the other hand, didn't know what to make of it. Apparently, her and Bill made peace and became friends. When I was leaving for Australia, she told me that she didn't need Bill anymore and wanted him to come over and watch over me and Greg till she got there. Gotta love kids. Fast forward a few years. Since my arrival here in Oz, I've heard a man's voice. Sometimes I can understand him. Other times, it's too deep and garbled for me to get. I ask him to repeat slower, and it gets him a little pissy. He has never told me his name, but I know it is Bill. I have that feeling. But lately, over the last year or so, I've been hearing a lot more voices. It's like being in a crowd where everyone is talking at once. I ask someone to step forward and talk only to me, but it just stays garbled. This is a weekly thing. It has gotten to the point where, when it starts, I simply say, if you're all going to talk to me at once, then I won't be able to understand any of it. What I was wondering is if anyone else has ever heard this, and if so, what did they do? Might this be more family members who saw that Bill was able to talk to us and want to try themselves? Or might it be something bad? Sometimes, not very often, I get a bad feeling when they start talking. Bill is still with me. I asked him, but he's given me nothing. I lived in Chicago up until I was 18 and had graduated high school. My grandfather lived in the house, 
and we lived on the first floor in the third flat apartment building we owned next door. We had the basement that was connected to the first floor apartment as well. The basement had three main rooms. The front room that led outside held a half bath, a washer, dryer, and two storage closets. This is where we kept our bikes and skates and stuff. The center room had four storage closets, the water heater, and the furnace. This was the room that held all my dad's and grandpa's tools. The back room that led to our upstairs apartment was where we had the deep freezer, old clothes, camping gears, old toys, etc. The center room was awful. Just looking at it, you felt like you were being stared down. Something was sending very angry energy out from that room. If you were in that room, it was just overwhelming and overpowering. It felt as if something was going to grab you and actually hurt you. None of us were hurt, but it always felt like it could happen at any time. My sister believed it to be female. I believed it to be male. This makes me think that it could have been a demon and was just a parent female to her and male to me. The stairs from the basement led to my brother's room. The stairs and the door were extremely creepy. We always kept it locked and bolted, but that didn't do much. It always seemed like someone was going to come bursting through the doors at any time. In the bedroom I shared with my sister, we have both seen strange things. I've seen a man a few times. He would start at the head of my bed, which happened to be by the door to the bedroom, and walk towards my closet. My closet and my parents' closet shared a wall. From there, he would kind of nod his head and then disappear. I could tell he was wearing overalls, work boots, and had gloves in his back pocket. He was tall, about six feet, dark hair, dark eyes. I could see all of this, but I could also see the other side of my room through him. He was kind of a misty gray color. I saw him first when I was five, then again when I was eight, and the last time when I was 14. When I was 12, I felt a pulling on my blanket. At this time, we didn't have any pets that would roam loose and there was no way for them to get out or even reach my blanket. I feel my blanket being pulled. I kind of grumble and try to pull it back up, but I can't. So I look at the foot of my bed and there was a boy sitting there grinning at me, gripping my blanket. I tell him, you let go. I'm not scared of you. Go away. And he disappears. I pull my blanket back up and go to sleep. Then we just had weird things happen. Bread would slide across the counter. Things would be moved from one end of the bar to the other. Things would go missing for a few days. These types of things not only happen in our apartment, but in the upper two levels that we rented out. I was in Arizona a few years back. I was at the Snorn Desert Museum outside of Tucson. It is more like a zoo than a museum. It was summer, very few people there, and a pretty warm morning. I was in the very back of the property all by myself, taking photos of the native cactus. I was completely alone and enjoying the beautiful outdoors. I suddenly felt a terrible sense of dread behind me. I turned and looked, and there was an elderly Native American man standing there. He was dressed in all black, long sleeved black shirt in the middle of the summer. His hair was snow white, and his face was wrinkled. When we made eye contact, I felt like someone tweaked my soul. I started to walk fast. I wanted to get back to the front of the zoo and be where people were, 
I was really moving, and every time I looked back, the man was about six feet behind me. He never seemed to increase his pace, but kept up with me no matter how fast I walked. He casually started straight ahead and kept walking. I made it up to the front and walked into the gift shop. He stayed with me the whole time. I decided to get the heck out of there. I hurried to the parking lot. All I wanted was to get into the car and get away. He was still behind me. When I reached my car, a coyote was standing by the trunk. I made eye contact with that animal. I can't describe it. It sounds nuts, but that coyote gestured towards the exit with his head. Of course, he didn't speak to me, nor did I hear a voice, but I just knew that the coyote would watch over me while I drove away. As I was about to get into the car, I turned back to look, and the coyote and the man were gone. I never went back. Every time I think of this, I feel as if I escaped something terrible. It's so strange, but it's like the coyote knew me, and I knew him. Thoughts, anyone? I don't take drugs, wasn't drinking, or overheated. I swear this happened. I know it sounds unbelievable, but it did. This happened in the summer. And at the time, my horse was living on an old farm not far from the sea. The farm was from 1925, with the original stables and barn. Anyway, on this day, it was only me and my horse there, and I had him standing outside while I was tacking up, since the weather was nice. Where he stood, he had the back entrance to the stables on the right side, and straight in front was the door to the barn. You had to go through the barn to get out. Everything was fine at first. Then, I got this feeling like I was being watched from inside the stable. I looked inside, thinking that maybe one of the other girls who had their horses there had come. But it was empty. I shrugged it off and continued grooming. Then, I noticed my horse had his attention towards the stables. I walked up to the door and looked inside, but again, there was no one. I got my saddle and stuff and started tacking up, and then my horse suddenly tensed up. He stood completely still, his ears forward, and all his attention on the entrance to the barn. I looked over, thinking it was a cat or something. But what I saw made the hairs of my neck stand up. In the barn stood a tractor. Behind this, I could see a dark figure. It didn't really look like a man. It was more, I don't know, liquid sort of. It stood on the one side of the tractor, partly hidden. And I could swear that it was staring back at us. It moved backward towards the back of the tractor and just vanished. Well... I hurried up with my Sadie, grabbed my helmet, and though I really didn't want to, I walked my horse towards the barn. Let me tell you, it was no easy task getting him to go inside, and when I got him inside, he refused to go anywhere near the tractor and almost ran out the other side, pulling me alongside with him. I'm having some problems with the spirit in my fiance's house again. For the past few months, the house has been dormant, and so we didn't worry much about what was going on in the home. We had one of my fiance's friends move in, and things were fairly calm and peaceful. Her friend, though, began to never stay at the house, and due to some issues, emotions got rather heated between the three of us. Two days ago, her friend moved back after a fight, and activity has escalated in the home since then. Yesterday, I got an overwhelming sense of fear and dread while at the house, and I had an overwhelming headache come over myself. I began packing up my things, 
and told my fiance to pack her things because we needed to stay a few days at my house. He became overwhelmingly tired and had a headache, much like mine, and passed out. When she woke up, she wasn't herself, but quickly came back out of it. Then, I went to the bathroom, and when I looked into the mirrors from the corner of my eye, I saw something I couldn't explain. The thing was, though, it looked inhuman and comprised of only bones, I think, and it seemed to be wanting out of the mirror. I ran back, and my fiancé was packing and taking her time out, humming to the tune of old music box that used to be in her friend's room. She started to have a play fight with me, and threw a shirt at me, then casually kicked the door shut. The next thing I know, she screams, and I kick the door open. She said I'd been standing in the mirror after I'd left the room. She seemed fine at the moment, and so I just watched over her as she kept packing. She began stalling again, though, and I told her we needed to get going or we'd be late for dinner. She then told me that she didn't want to. She liked the house and wanted to stay there. I began to hear voices as well, other than hers in the house, and got drowsy but kept my head about me. She finally was packed and I got her to go outside for a brief moment to see if being out of the house would snap her out of the trance. She got rather defensive and ran off and ran under a doorway where there was a crucifix standing above the doorway. When she ran through it, she collapsed and then woke up again, perfectly fine and not remembering about the past 45 minutes except for bits and pieces like she had been dreaming. I've been having concerns that she may be channeling spirits by accident in her sleep and such, and this incident definitely confirms my suspicions. I'm psychologically drained from the mental strength it took the two of us to get out of the home. We're going back to the house in about four or five days and figure it should be fine. Whatever this entity is, it fed strongly off the negative emotions that had built up in this house. I know at the strength it was yesterday, it would be much hard for me to face it and cleanse the house on my own, so we're leaving the house to settle and calm back down. By then, I feel this entity will have lost most of its power and it would be the best time to cleanse the home and seal any portals that may have been opened in the home. I'm still a little bit apprehensive though, and if anyone could offer up some help, it would greatly be appreciated. If my fiance is the target of any danger, I can pull through any fight normally and keep her safe. But I've been so drained, and I don't know if I can handle the cleansing of the home by myself. If anyone could please help, either physically or through even psychological support, it would greatly be appreciated. Hey there, I live in Akron, Ohio. About a year ago, I moved into my ex's house since it was nice, and well, we were in love. I lived there for about six months before she broke it off and decided to live in Ireland. I've been heartbroken for a long time, but I do remember some extra stuff that happened in that home. It's on Spicer Street in Akron, Ohio. About a month after I moved in, the first thing I noticed was waking up with her and every single clock in the house, including the computer clock, wristwatches, etc., would be turned around 40 minutes ahead than what they were supposed to be. This only happened once, and after I arrived at class, she called me to explain how each clock had changed overnight later. She told me that the previous tenants believed the house was haunted and refused to move back in. They were both girls, I was told. We began to notice other things too, such as their stuff would get moved if we left the kitchen, the television would turn on and off, lights would turn on and off if we left the home, fan would move and not move, TV would turn channels with the remote being on the TV 
and certain spots in the house would be unusually cold. She was scared at times, but I typically wasn't. I just thought of it as having a little kid in the home. I wasn't really worried, and I was confident that I'd be able to protect her from that kind of stuff. If you read some of my earlier posts, I see specs a lot, and I guess it gives me some sort of confidence, even if I don't understand them. My thoughts were confirmed, I believe, when I was sitting in the living room with her and thought I spotted a blonde-haired boy's face under her table. It looked a lot like a German kid, but naturally, I blinked, and it was gone. There were two spots in the house that seemed really weird. The basement was odd, but not too odd, since students in the past used this place for studying. The oddest part in her house was her bedroom closet. I would step at the door and not go in. She refused to even sleep close to it. I was the one who slept closest to it while she slept between me and the wall. I didn't really see anything from it, but it did feel really weird, and it didn't feel like the kid. It was something else. Also, that closet was connected to the attic which neither of us ventured into. After I saw the kid, I felt some sort of attachment to it. I remember she used to complain that sometimes my eyes would go completely black in the house. I'd usually counter it with me complaining about staring at me, as she slept as if I woke up around 5 in the morning. But we wouldn't argue about it. It was just weird. When we broke up, or rather, when she broke up with me, I'll admit it, her way messages often wrote how she was scared and didn't want to hear any noises. So I guess the activity in the home increased when I left. Again, not sure why. So, I want to find out more about the home, but I don't know where to start. I've been lurking on here for about two years now, and well, I decided to finally post about my experiences with ghosts. Really only one ghost. It happened to be here in my house for a number of years throughout the 70s. The house had been built in 1970 on an old lot where an old man had lived on a shack and had died. Now. The spirit that had stayed on the property was one of a child, though. Maybe the old man had a kid and it died. Who knows? Anyway, all sorts of stuff that one would imagine a child would do happened. You know, things would get lost, stuff would move from one place to another, vases and sculptures would be on their place on tables, and when the family would come back, the sad items would be in pieces, smashed against the wall about three or four feet away. Sometimes, of course, you couldn't get into the house because the screen door would be locked and nobody was in the house at the time. Just imagine the door with the simple hook going into the circle slot. Now, over the years, I've tried to get that hook to slip over into the lock, you know, to see if it could happen by accident. It could never be an accident. If one wants to lock that screen door, you intentionally do it. Feelings of being watched and feeling the weight of someone or something next to you in the bed. My grandma would tell me that I would go off in the house in my walker circa 1981 or 82 and I would travel all the way from the kitchen to the living room to the hallway. Now, when one enters the hallway, even in the daytime, if all the doors to the room are shut, it is pitch black. She claimed that I would be in the hallway for a couple of minutes, and that I would come shooting out from the hallway as if my walker was pushed or shoved by something, all the way back to the kitchen and crash into the wall. Now, it would take me a couple of minutes to get all the way to the hallway since I was a toddler, yet it wouldn't even take me a minute to come crashing into the wall of the kitchen. Now, 
I remember seeing some sort of whitish gray ball floating when I was laying down on the rug one day. This must have been 1982 or 83. I can still see that image in my brain to this day. My grandmother noticed me getting up and looking under the dining room table and I started to shout, get out, or in my way of talking back then, get you out. My grandma started yelling, what's wrong? What's the matter? I kept on shouting and punching and kicking at nothing all the way towards the front doorway. And when I got to the door, I kept kicking the door and then I stopped. By this time, my grandmother, who was rather slow due to weight, had gone to the hallway that led to the front door and was asking me what was wrong. She told me that I had said that I didn't want it here and I told it to get out. I think I had some sort of hold over it as I was the only child born in the house. My uncle who was only 12 at the time had been born in an older house. I think the spirit was attracted by the fresh new life that was now in the home, much like the spirits in poltergeist were attracted to the little girl. You know, they wanted some sort of that life force. I think that was the case with this. I got rid of it before it got too powerful, much later on. What do you think? I've lived in this house for the past 27 years. Nothing out of the ordinary has happened since those early years. I've always been sensitive to spirits being present. For as long as I can remember, there has always been someone there in the corner of my room at night, or creaking in the walls. My house was built during the Great Depression. My mom, grandfather, and great-grandfather who built the house have all lived here. I remember one night, I was five or six, I think, and it was summer. I was in my backyard, it was pretty late, and I looked in the bushes and saw a face. Being the curious little kid that I was, I nudged a little closer. The face was weird looking, almost unhuman, and was a weird tint of green and almost transparent. As I drew closer, it just popped out of the bushes. I screamed and ran to the front porch where my mom, dad, and brother were. I never told anyone about that face. Eventually, that incident was drawn out of my head. I hadn't thought about it, and with other things going on, frankly, I just didn't care. Until one day, my second grade class was on a field trip to the historical society. One of the exhibits was of a small bedroom in the 1850s time. I was in the attic kind of bedroom with the ceiling slanted and I went towards the bed. And for a few seconds, this person was lying on the bed. She looked up at me and then she was gone. I was so frightened, I just ran out of the room and hid downstairs till my teacher and the rest of the class came down. There would be sightings every now and then, mostly in the basement. I would hear someone hiding behind the water heater and bookshelves and would eventually just refuse to go down there. When my mom asked me about this, I told her there was someone down there. She refused to believe this and I just stopped trying to convince her. The only time I can say that a spirit just scared the crap out of me was when I was in the fifth grade. I was in the park with my dad and was visiting the memorial. While my dad was doing something, I don't remember what. I went off to one of the stones farther away. I leaned up next to the stone and was reading the description on it. And while I did so, a man came up to me. He looked very frightened. He bent down next to me and asked me something. I think about the weather and he looked like he wanted to cry or something. I don't know. He kind of looked like, like when you're dying to ask someone something, but you don't know how to ask them. That's what his face looked like. I remember asking him if he was okay, and he just burst into tears. He said something like I had to help him. I was the only one who could help him. He looked so frantic and desperate that he was scary looking. I didn't know what else to do, so I just ran towards my dad shaking from head to foot. Looking back, I wish I could have helped him. I just didn't know how. I know there are some skeptics out there who go around saying it's all in your mind and it's playing tricks on you or one of my mother's personal favorites 
it's just your imagination. But if we let that take over our better judgment, no one is going to help these lost souls. And somebody has to. You just have to be willing to believe. Hi, my name is Christine, and I was a student at Heidelberg College, which is located in Tiffin, Ohio, and far from any other places of civilization. As a freshman and sophomore, I lived in France Hall. France Hall is, and has always been, an all-girls dorm. Another fun fact about Heidelberg College is that it was one of the first colleges to allow women to attend. As a new resident of France Hall, I was told about our most famous ghost, Ellen. There were a few odd experiences, for example. The normal cold spots in the dungeon, aka the basement or laundry room, noises and whatnot. During my sophomore year, I pledged into one of the oldest societies on campus. It was during my pledging process that I learned about the story of Ellen. Shortly after the Hesperian Society split into two new societies in 1913, a Glossian Society and the Palantheon, also known as Hughes and Phils. Ellen wanted to go through the pledging process. FYI, women had to place bids or asking permission to join a Greek organization. If the group does not believe a woman will benefit from the society, she can be rejected. Ellen was rushing Phi and would wear their colors every day before the bidding day. Sadly, Ellen was not invited into the Philampian Society. Greatly upset by this, she went into the attic, wrote and carved fire die on the walls and rafters. Near the doorway, she hung herself. Today, the door to the attic is locked. I've tried to get in. Normally, Ellen just likes to play around. She has finally locked me out of my room when I was in the shower a few times, turned on the TV at all hours of the night during exam week, and my favorite, turned the radio to a different station. I've also been in the catacombs, under Founders Hall, and visited the haunted meat room. It wasn't spooky or anything, but I can understand why a lot of the halls are blocked off now. Easy to get lost, and the hooks that used to hang on the meat room are no longer there. Brown Hall is now haunted by a young man who killed himself on the railroad tracks right behind the campus a few years ago. He likes to goof off on the girls' floor of that dorm and watch over some of the students who were close to him before he died. He also likes to play around in the bathroom. Interesting. My boyfriend, we'll call him Steve, works at his family's farm that's been around for 124 years. So basically, it's been in the family for five generations. There have been a lot of changes, which is expected when you have a piece of property that's so old, but there are buildings that remain the same. These buildings, along with a creek that runs right by the property, I believe are not haunted, but replay things that happened long ago. Steve has seen these images and explained them to me. For instance, the milk house is an old building that still stands, but is now used as a workshop. At the right moment, you can watch Steve's great-grandfather working in the building. He passed away many years ago. Also, in the old part of the barn, he's seen helping hands or workers from the past walking around. They never even seem to notice that Steve is even there. These encounters seem pleasant, and if you knew they were past relatives, I can understand why you might be glad to see them. But the experience I had was not pleasant, and I was definitely not glad to see it. Back in the 1920s, one of Steve's relatives had a two-year-old girl. This poor little girl wandered away from the house, fell into the creek by the garden, and drowned. She wasn't discovered until the next morning. Her body had floated downstream. This story is important because it plays a part in my encounter. About a year ago, I decided to take the rowboat out into the creek. I have a little girl, two years old at the time, whom I left in the care of Steve since we didn't have a life jacket for her. This was my first time in the boat and I was excited about seeing Mother Nature, since the landscape was beautiful around the area. I must have been on the water for only 15 minutes before I heard a loud splash close to the bank. I looked to my right, but didn't see anything, not even ripples in the water, indicating that something had fallen in. This made me extremely curious, 
so I decided to row the boat closer to the bank. Now, the bank is about a foot above the water level, and the water is roughly about three feet deep. Before I could even grab a hold of the oars I saw, what I thought was my daughter, since she was small and had brown hair, splashing around the water and swinging her arms desperately back and forth as if trying to hold on to something. What I didn't realize at the time was that there was absolutely no sound of the splashing. Being deathly scared for my daughter's life, I didn't think about it. I jumped into the water and began swimming desperately towards the bank. I can't even begin to explain how I felt. All I can say is that I was more determined than ever to reach her. I remember stopping once my feet could touch the bottom and searching for her, and to my horror, I didn't see her anywhere. The creek was a brown color, and so I couldn't see the bottom. I was diving down and grabbing anything I could find to see if it was her. I was seriously hysterical at this point in time. I kept saying, no, no God, please no, and shouting my daughter's name. Now, Steve, along with my daughter, heard me splashing into the water and then heard me calling to my daughter. He could see the empty boat a little ways down the creek and started running to find out what was wrong. Also, Steve's grandmother was in the kitchen, which is located just behind the bush of the bank where I was at, and heard me as well. She too got up and headed towards me to investigate. I remember hearing her asking me what was wrong, so that I just kept repeating that my daughter was in the water and asking where she was. I believe I was on the verge of fainting until I saw Steve holding my daughter on the bank. Then confusion kicked in. I was so thrilled to see my daughter, but at the same time, dumbfounded about it. He helped me onto the bank, and I held my daughter like there was no tomorrow. While I was doing that, Steve's grandmother was explaining to him what she heard and saw. I had them both confused as well. I told them what I saw, and Steve slid into the water and began to look around, but said he didn't see or feel anything. His grandmother was silent while this was going on, but then spoke up with this grief-stricken look on her face. She said, oh my, it must have been Harriet. Both Steve and his grandmother hung their heads, but I was still clueless since I had never heard the story before. That's when she explained to me what happened all those years ago. Slowly, it all started to make sense. Why I hadn't seen the ripples in the water? Why I didn't hear the splashing? Why in seconds it took me to get to her and she had vanished? Since that day, I've never gone near that park of the bank and I make sure my children do the same. I have a son as well. It's horrifying what I'd seen and went through and I pray that no one has to go through that. My brother's story, I'll keep short. My brother David is a semi-truck driver. He runs his rounds all week long and comes home for the weekends. As some of you may know, there are times when you're driving long into the night. On one particular night, David was driving down a road, heading back towards the interstate with a buddy of his in his truck. He was making good time, wasn't tired yet, and decided to wait and stop at the next rest area down the interstate. I believe he said it was between 10 and 11 p.m. when they saw her. His buddy saw her first and started screaming, as David would say, like a little girl. When David turned to look at his buddy, his attention went immediately to the passenger side window. There, a woman had somehow clasped onto the outside of the door and was staring at him through the window. He described her as pale white, shoulder length blonde hair, and dark eyes. He said she kind of glowed, but claimed the full moon could have made her look that way. The woman was only there for a couple of seconds before she disappeared. David's buddy said he had enough fun for one night and crawled into the back of the semi and onto one of the bunks. A few weeks later, during daylight hours, my brother found himself on that same road and stopped at a local truck stop to eat. There were other truck drivers there and out of the blue he asked, I know you're all going to think I'm crazy, but have any of you seen a woman on the side of your truck? Late at night, while you're driving down this road? This is a story they told him. About 10 years ago, a woman was standing on the side of the road. She was alone and having car trouble late at night. She spotted a semi down the road, heading in her direction. In an attempt to wave him down, she walked down to the middle of the road and started waving her arms. Apparently, the truck driver was so exhausted that he didn't even see her. 
or so people think. He ran over her and didn't stop, just kept going. To this day, no one has been pressed with charges for the crime. Now they say that any semi that drives down that road at night could be a suspect to the woman. My name is Jody. I'm 20 years old from Australia and have been reading the stories on your site for years. I just thought what the heck, I'll get into one of my own. This isn't that much of a scary story, it just freaked me out a bit. This happened back when I was 17. I was dating this guy, we will call him Steve. One night, me, Steve and my sister and one of his mates all went out on a double date. It was about 11 when we ended back at Steve's house. Me and my sister decided to bunk down there for the night as I was too tired to drive home. I was the first to turn in as I had work the next day and the boys and my sister decided to stay out in the back patio for a while. I was in Steve's room and I must have dozed off when all of a sudden I woke up but I couldn't even open my eyes. I tried to open my mouth but I couldn't. At this point I was literally crapping myself. I didn't know what to do so I started to panic. Then, all of a sudden, I started feeling really sick, then had a mental picture of a man in the doorway. I may have just had a bad dream, but I am almost certain that it was real. I told my sister what had happened on the way home, and she told me that she had the same eerie feeling the second that she walked into the house. Thanks for reading. My name is Virginia East, and I am now 20 years old and live in Freedom, Indiana. I grew up on the south side of Indianapolis. I mostly lived with my grandmother throughout the first five years of my life, but I always lived not too far away from her. My grandmother's house was originally built as a saloon. I don't know what year it was built in, but my guess would have to say close to or about the mid 1900s. I'll start off by telling the story as to why I think her house was haunted. One night, while the house was still a saloon, Two men had gotten into an argument upstairs over a woman. The outcome of the argument was one man was murdered. We strongly believe that his spirit had never left that house and that his murderer was a redhead. I'll get to as why I think that later. My first personal experience happened when I was about 9 years old. My younger cousin and I were going into the basement to finish a project that we were painting. As we got halfway down the stairs, we both saw something that appeared to be a man back about 50 years ago by the way he was dressed. We stood still and back up about two stairs and watched to see if it was a burglar or if it was actually a ghost. The next thing we saw was a noose hanging from one of the beams in the ceiling and a chair underneath it. The man stepped onto the chair and put the noose around his neck. When he kicked the chair out from underneath him, he disappeared into thin air. My grandmother had several experiences in this house. She had a little dog that she loved to play with, with rubber bouncy balls. She was walking past the basement door one day to go into the kitchen and she heard something being dropped down the basement stairs. She opened the door to find a little boy bouncing a little blue rubber ball down the stairs. The young boy looked back at her and disappeared. She went to the bottom of the stairs to retrieve the ball and put it in the cabinet. The next day, she heard something else being dropped down the stairs, but this time, it was a more solid sound. She looked in the cabinet and noticed that the blue ball was gone. Not thinking much of it, since she had several young small grandchildren, she opened the door again to find the same little boy, but only this time, bouncing a marble down the stairs. My grandfather had passed away in his home sometime in 1997. He died in his and my grandmother's bedroom. When my grandma came home from the hospital, she had went upstairs one night to go to sleep. She had always slept on the right side of the bed, if you look at it from the foot of the bed. She had rolled her head over to the side that my grandfather would sleep on, and she saw an indentation on the pillow. It was an indent of a head, as if someone was lying next to her, but there was no one there. The man that had been killed in the fight when the house was still a saloon, us grandchildren started calling him Turk. I don't know why but it just seemed to fit. But this is why I believe that the murderer was a redhead. When my mother and aunt were teenagers, they would always sneak into the bathroom to smoke. On several occasions, 
They couldn't even get the bathroom door open. My mother and aunt are both redheads. On several occasions also, when one of them would go to the bathroom, they would get locked in, and there was not a lock on the outside of the door. One incident, when two of my older female cousins and my older brother went up to the attic to get something for our grandma, something strange happened. As they were all making their way down the stairs, my brother was the last in line. My brother is a redhead. He was the only true redhead out of the three of them. As he was coming down the stairs, he felt something grab him from his wrist, forbidding him to go any further down the stairs. My cousin that was in front of him turned back to see what was going on, and all she saw was my brother leading in midair with his right arm being held by something that wasn't there. My cousin tried to pull him free, but to no avail. Finally, he was released, and they never went into the attic again. After my grandmother passed away in 1999, the house went up for sale. Well, it had three different buyers, and they all just left it. So, in late 2001, the city decided to tear it down. The house is no longer there, but two of my older cousins and my aunt live right across from the street from where the house used to be. We believe that Turk may have traveled over to their house. The reason being was because after Grandma's house was torn down, we started hearing heavy footsteps walking across the hall upstairs and up and down the stairs late at night, and no one goes upstairs. At this point, the upstairs was still blocked off. Thank you for letting me share my experiences, and I hope you really enjoyed this. If I have any more experiences that might show up in the future, I'll let you know so you can all get a taste of Turk again, the paranormal entity that haunted my grandma. The Fireplace This is the first paranormal experience that I ever had. It took place at my grandma's house, and I was seven years old. My grandma lived in a suburb of Melbourne called St. Kilda and lived on Crema Street. Many of the houses in St. Kilda were built in the late 1800s to the early 1900s, and many were mansions. My grandma's house was a single story, red bricked, two bedroom home that was very modest in comparison to some of the mansions that were built on Crema Street. It was built on a large block of land, and I remember the front and back being overgrown with trees. Sadly, many of these houses have now been torn down to make room for newly built houses and apartment buildings. My grandma's home had two bedrooms at the front of the house, and then a long dark hallway which led to the lounge and kitchen area. The laundry and bathroom facilities were located outside, which was not unusual for houses built in this era. The main bedroom, which was my grandma's, had a huge fireplace in it. No central heating back in the day when the houses were built. The house was always cold, mainly due to the fact that it was surrounded by trees. It was a great cool house to be in during the hot summer, but it would get extremely cold in the winter time. There was a gas heater at the front of the house, which would warm up the lounge and kitchen area, but bedrooms would always stay cold. As my grandma was getting old and suffered from bad asthma, my dad used to worry a lot in the winter that she would get too cold in the winter time at night in her bedroom. My grandma absolutely refused to use the fireplace as she was scared of having an accident and being burnt or setting the house on fire. Many times when we visit her, I can remember my dad constantly offering to light a small fire in the fireplace, telling my grandma that he would extinguish it before we left just so she could have a bit of warmth in her room at night. But she flatly refused and would be very adamant that she did not want to ever use the fireplace. I remember it was a Saturday night and my dad and I had stayed for dinner. I was sitting on the floor in front of the TV and I was watching the Muppet show. I must have fallen asleep and my dad took me to my grandma's room and put me in her bed. He left the door open and switched on a lamp next to the bed. I remember walking up and realizing that I was in my grandma's room, and I was all alone. I hated being alone in her house, and I was really afraid of the long dark hallway and would never venture to the front of the house without someone being with me. I threw back the bed covers and contemplated whether I should call out for my dad to come and get me 
or if I should make the bolt down the dark hallway to the safety of my dad and grandma. I put my feet on the floor, deciding I would run down the hallway, and something flickering caught my attention out of the corner of my eye. Standing by the fireplace was a transparent figure of a lady. She was standing side on and seemed to be gazing sadly into the fireplace. She was wearing a nightgown that was long at the back, but the front of the gown seemed much shorter and ragged looking. I screamed like a banshee and tore out of the room down the hallway where my dad met me halfway. Through terrified tears, I told him that there was a lady in a funny nighty in my grandma's room. He went to have a look while my grandma hugged me. She told me not to be afraid and the lady would never hurt me. My dad assumed that I must have had a bad dream, although I insisted it was real. Every time we visited my grandma after this, I would never look into her bedroom. For freer, I would see this lady once again. A few years later, my grandma moved as the house was getting too much for her to maintain on her own and she moved into a smaller flat. While packing and cleaning up, my dad made a joke that at least we would not have to clean out the fireplace as it had never been used and it brought back the memory of the night I saw the lady in the strange nighty. I asked my grandma if she remembered and she said of course she did. She then went on to tell me that she had seen this lady on many occasions over the years and had grown used to seeing her. She believed that she was a past resident of the house that had probably fallen into the fireplace and had burnt herself to death. Hence why her nightgown was shorter and ragged at the front as it was burnt. My grandma had not mentioned this to me before as she did not want me to be any more scared than I was when I visited her. This is why she never used the fireplace as she felt this lady answered and appeared as a warning that accidents can happen and obviously my grandma took her warning very seriously. My grandma has since passed away, but I will never forget that night I saw this apparition of the lady with the funny nighty. A head in the fireplace. I've lived in the same house all my life. I'm 16 in a few weeks. I'm not an expert on these sorts of things, like you guys seem to be after reading some of your stories, so bear with me, as I'm not very knowledgeable on the subjects of ghosts and demons and those things of that nature. My house is pretty old, about 80 years old, my mom says. My grams believes in this sort of thing, but the rest of my family is pretty skeptical, so we will rarely discuss it. The first thing I remember happening to me is when I was about six. I had chicken pox and I couldn't sleep because they were so itchy and my mom let me stay up late. It was about midnight and I was watching Jurassic Park. I was alone, but my mom was in the next room if I needed her. We have this big old fashioned fireplace, but we rarely light it and it wasn't lit on this night. There was a funny bit in the movie and I giggled and I heard a laugh, really quietly, but pretty gruff like a man's. I turned around and saw a man's head in the fireplace. It disappeared quickly, but I was convinced of it. I wasn't frightened at all and just carried on watching the film. See, I have no idea how that had even materialized. I know there was an old lady who previously lived there. She was a librarian. She knew my mom, and my mom had lived on the street all her life. The lady moved out and went to live with her relatives. That was about 25 years ago, so I'm assuming she's not alive, and she was very old when she left. So I'm thinking she might have had a husband, and I guess if I were to explain the fireplace incident, it might have been her husband in the fireplace. 
I know this is a short story, but there were other events that occurred that I will explain in a different post. So does anybody know what happened or can explain anything about the man in the fireplace? I'm still at a loss for words. I don't know what to say about that. As I said, I'm new to this whole experience and I don't know much about paranormal activity. Thank you though. About 15 years ago, the guy living in my current house died. After about 12 years, we moved in. People say he died from a heart attack, but others say his wife killed him. But I ended up getting the room he died in. Every night, I could hear beating in the chimney in the room and it would slowly move its way up right above my bed. A week later, I had my friend Megan spend the night to see if we could hear it too. Well, she did. Then I had my sister stay in there to see if she could hear it. About a week later, it was my birthday, and we slept out in the tent. We could hear someone screaming, so we went out to check it out. We didn't see anything outside, so we went inside. We could hear footsteps up the stairs, but we didn't see anybody. But then the door to my room opened. We went in there, and we saw a shadow going into the chimney. We were wondering why he would go into the chimney, and people say that his wife killed him and stuffed him in the chimney itself. Every other night, I can hear the doorbell ring, but no one is there. So I'd go up to my bed, then I could hear the door shut, and hear the footsteps go up the stairs and into my room, but this time, I didn't see anybody. I've heard rumors that there's a chimney ghost, but also that the body may still be there. Then again, I've never seen a body in the chimney, so I really doubt there would be a body stuffed in the chimney still after all this time. This is pretty creepy, and all the occurrences in the chimney a couple of years ago. I used to have to take the bus every day to get to work. One morning in the late summer, I was riding to work on the bus traveling down Woodward in Detroit, and I saw a man dressed entirely in a Union soldier's uniform, walking down the street. At first glimpse, I didn't even think anything of it, but if I looked around to see if anyone else had noticed, and no one did, I looked towards the window again, and the guy was gone. I really don't know if it was a ghost or not, but I know he looked very real and very out of place. Me, it just seemed too hot to be wearing that uniform with the musket, cap and everything. It all looked so very authentic. He was an African American, looked old like in his 70s, and the uniform wasn't even clean, like you would see in a reenactment. It was dingy. I would say this happened in late August, at around 10.30 a.m. Hello everybody. I am only 13, almost 14, but I think I've experienced paranormal phenomena. The first time was when I was about 10. I'd gotten a keyboard for Christmas, and it was set up with a stool in my room. I had just gone to bed and just happened to look at the keyboard and a black cat weaved its way through its legs. Naturally, I went screaming to my parents and they reassured me it was nothing. Another time I awoke to a huge face floating in front of me. Now it may have just been my imagination, but I just don't think so. On another occasion, I was in the shower and someone made a noise like they were trying to say scary in a drawn out voice. I am the only one in the house that believes it's haunted. Sometimes when my sister goes by to my room to get to the bathroom, she snaps at me before she enters the bathroom. Well, one time I swear I heard someone snap at me. But when I turned around, no one was there. 
I checked the bathroom, and my sister wasn't there. My parents were in the living room, and my sister and hers. That one happened about a month ago. All the time I feel like someone is watching me, or is in the room with me, whenever I am alone in a room, in my house, even in my own room, sometimes when I go to bed. I even make my parents look in my closet. I have told my mother and my sister about it, and they don't seem to think anything is wrong, and I'm just paranoid. But am I really paranoid, or am I experiencing something? I know I may be 13, but that doesn't excuse all the things that go on. I just want to be credible to people. Our house was built in 1959. To my knowledge, nothing ever bad happened here. The first time we noted anything was in the mid-1970s. We moved here in 1970. Both my husband and I awoke in the night and saw the figure of a man walk across the room at the foot of our bed and disappear. My husband jumped up and turned the light on and then ran throughout the house looking for the intruder. No one was found. Over the years, we have heard noises coming from the bedroom areas, doors closing when they are all open. Our neighbor has seen the lights on in the middle of the night when we are asleep. A few months ago, I was standing at the bathroom sink mid-morning and saw a man walk by. I thought it was my husband. And when I walked out to see where he went, he wasn't even there. I went back down the hall, and he was still in the master bathroom, and had not walked down the hall. One day we were all sitting at the table, and the four of us observed a can of coke move across the table, and stop before it fell off the edge. In the basement on the carpet, a spot just became wet. Even though I was the only person down there this week, I scrubbed it up, and so far, it has remained dry. We hear the sound of our doggy door being opened and closed, even though the dog is asleep in front of us. There is far too many incidents to mention. But interestingly enough, our dog never acts like she hears any of these unnatural sounds, even though she barks at humans or dogs, etc. outside. I don't actually live with ghosts, but at my uncle's farm they have a cabin. It's going up for sale pretty soon. There is a ghost in the cabin. The funny thing is, is that they just built it, and no one has died in it or anything. My cousin said that the ghost is a girl that follows him everywhere. When my other cousin, my little brother and I were watching a show in one of the rooms, then we heard footsteps walking across the floor upstairs. We tried to ignore it. Then in the middle of the movie, the movie screen went fuzzy. We all stared at the television shot. Then my cousin screamed, and my brother and I screamed after her. We ran out of the cabin. We got to the house in five seconds. Apparently everyone heard us screaming, and we told them what happened, and they told us that the power probably flashed or something, but I still don't believe that. Please let me know what was going on here. Am I just freaking out, or did the whole entire family freak out? I want to tell you of an experience I had a little over a year ago. I was living in a house on Bassmaster Street in Youngston, Ohio. I knew the house was haunted by a woman who was subdued by her husband some years before. I was a baby when she passed away. I think my room used to be her room. I never felt comfortable sleeping there, so I often slept on the couch in the living room. One night I woke up and felt like I could hardly breathe. I felt like there was a tremendous weight on me, and I couldn't move or speak, except for open my eyes. 
I opened my eyes and saw a huge black hooded figure at the end of the couch, kinda leaning over like it was looking at me. Mind you, I couldn't see his eyes. Thank God, I instantly slammed my eyes shut and kept trying to scream, but I couldn't. Every time I opened my eyes, he was closer, till he was right over me. I took a deep breath in and started screaming. I woke my sons up. Needless to say, it got up and turned on every light in the house. I think it was death. I don't know why he came to me. Not long after my grandmother passed away, lived right next door to me. I have more stories about the apartment if you want to know. I also have a picture I believe is Teresa. That's who was haunting my house. Thank you for your time, and thank you for your website. I was staying at my auntie's home in Tasmania, where I learned very quickly the horrors of its past. Her home was built in the 1900s, when convicts first landed, their home still has the remains of a moat, servants' headquarters, and the hospital, which it became. I went down with my grandparents. They had warned me of the presence in the home. My grandfather had seen a young girl in a long white nightgown, holding a candle, enter the spare room as she vanished before his eyes. The very first night we arrived, the fun began. I was sleeping in my cousin's room when I woke to something calling to me. As I opened my eyes, I saw two white fairies floating above me as the light from the moon hit the room. They vanished. From that night on, as I slept, I could feel something touching my head. Around four days later as we all slept, smoke filled the rooms. The strange thing was, our door was open, but nothing entered. The next morning we awoke to find all of the display plates, which were kept in a locked cupboard left lying on the floor, in perfect order. Two nights later there was this huge storm, and as the dogs had puppies, they had got loose and were running in the yard. My auntie was awoken by a frozen touch on her cheek and there was a man that stood over her and pointed out the window. Once she left the room, he vanished. A few days later, I got sick and was in the computer room with my cousin as I wasn't allowed outside. As I stared at a doll, I swear it blanked at me. I got out of there so fast. Later on that day, I went to go to the toilet. With this house, there is one large huge room which contains the laundry, bathroom, and the toilet. As I entered the room, the bathroom door wasn't quite shut, and I saw a man standing in there. I ran out of the room, and when my grandmother asked who was in the shower, as my cousins were in the room, my uncle and grandfather were out in the back, back in the shed. My grandma and auntie were in the lounge room. After a few days feeling well, I went back outside to play when I was confronted by the man in the shower. I later found out that his name was Shane, and he had once owned the home. He was found shot. Also while playing outside hidden behind huge overgreen trees, was once appeared to be a gravesite. As I headed for the house, I saw the most gruesome sight of a man from the window under the house. Thankfully after that day I was heading home. They've since seen a little girl who skips around the house, and they've heard the sounds of screams of pain in the rooms. I didn't hear anything like that. They did move out after that, though. When I was seven years old, 
My family purchased a house in the outskirts of Los Angeles. I remember my father bragging to most anyone he knew that he got the house for a steal. I guess it didn't really matter that a stiff wind could probably knock the house on its side. It was that run down. It was a two level house with the main rooms being on the first floor, three bedrooms on the second floor, and a small fruit cellar below. When we first arrived at the house, I noticed a mailbox with a small stick on letters that spelled out H-O-R-T-O-N. That was the first thing my father intended to change. He pulled on some stick on letters out of his pocket and proceeded to spell out our last name. I promise you. My father tried everything from industrial strength glue to eventually nails. Our letters would just never stay up. At some point he must have just given up and we left it as is. As my father was valiantly trying to get those darn letters to stick, my brother and I charged ahead into the house to do some exploring. There are two things that stick out in my head from that initial visit. I noticed in the upstairs of the bedrooms, a dartboard hanging on the wall with a single dart placed in the bullseye. I don't know why, but for some reason, this really disturbed me. Maybe because the entire rest of the house was completely empty. I'm not really sure. And then secondly, I noticed that most of the doors had those old-fashioned skeleton keyholes. I was instantly reminded of the old fairy tales where the wife had tried everything, including peering into a keyhole, much like this one, to get a look into that forbidden room. I bent down placed my eye to the keyhole and looked into one of the bedrooms. I think I was curious to know if you could easily see anything by looking into one of those things. And guess what? You can. I remember seeing something, tall and black, scurry across the floor, something that almost resembled a large dog. My father probably surmised that it was probably some type of animal or quite possibly a shadow. In any case, I was relieved to find out that this was to be my parents' room. Almost immediately, my father began renovating plans. The entire back end of the house was to be added onto, including a new kitchen and dining room on the main level, two new bedrooms on the upper level, and the basement extended below. As the workmen were digging up the ground in the backyard, they uncovered many strange things, including an antique thimble set, childhood toys, coins, an axe handle, photographs, and almost an entire deck of old made playing cards. As my sister and I sat around thumbing through these new treasures, I happened to glance up just in time to see my eldest sister falling head first into the pit that was to be our new basement. To this day, my sister who is now 40, swears she was pushed violently from behind. In any event, the result from the injury was a broken leg and a few cuts and bruises. We were all warned to be more careful around the construction site. A few days after this incident, I had a chunk of plaster thrown at my head. It could have been one of my sisters or my brother playing a trick, but they were all in their teens at the time, and I don't think they would find it funny to throw a piece of plaster at their little sister's head. Strange things were occurring inside the house as well. I constantly felt as though I was being watched, and was often plagued by feelings of absolute horror. I might be in a room playing or watching the television, when an overpowering feeling to flee the room would hit. Believe me when I say, I did just that. My sisters were constantly at each other's throats over missing items. And sometimes, those items would appear right in bizarre spots. Some were never even seen again. Lights and appliances would turn on by themselves. Footsteps could be heard in the middle of the night. Items would come crashing down in uncoupled rooms. 
A strange buzzing sound, almost like an electrical charge, seemed to emanate throughout the entire home, and the list goes on. We also had a problem with fires. My mother was awoken in the middle of the night by the smell of smoke, and upon investigation, she found that someone had closed the cover on her toaster oven and hit the start button with nothing being inside. This is an old 70s style oven where you actually had to press a release button to turn the power off. Otherwise, it would have just kept on going. By the time my mother reached the scene, the entire toaster was up in flames, practically burned to a crisp. That was the first of seven fires that occurred in that house. As a child, I detested peanut butter. Even the smell of it would send my stomach churning. My brother found it amusing to consume a sandwich and then hold me down and breathe on me. Ugh, gross. Anyhow, I was sitting in the living room watching the Saturday morning carton marathon when my brother walked in fresh from eating a PB&J sandwich. I knew what was coming and I wasn't in the mood for his games. A constant pounding sound that had kept me awake for half the night, and I was cranky from the lack of sleep. We began to tussle, but were abruptly interrupted from out of nowhere. An insult from a pair of shoes fell on the floor between us. We just stood there and stared at each other for a few seconds, our hands still on each other's shoulders. This insult was actually seemed as though it fell straight out of the ceiling. As we were trying to figure out the origin of the peculiar item, we were startled by a loud knock at the front door from our vantage point. We could both see the front door from where we were standing. There stood an old lady with whitish hair, wearing a black shawl. Something about her eyes struck me as odd. They were so dark, it almost appeared as though someone had stuck two large black buttons in her eyes. As my brother approached the door, she vanished almost instantaneously, like she had never been there at all. It's not as though she simply turned and walked away. She disappeared into thin air. One minute she was there, and the next she was gone. I would be lying if I said we opened the front door to take a look around. But we did peer out the window checking for any signs of where she may have went. We saw nothing on the front yard, nor the driveway. My brother was convinced that we had just seen a witch. When we returned to the living room, a mysterious insole from the shoe was also missing. It's also interesting to note that a fenced in gate surrounded our entire property for someone to gain access to the grounds they would need to be electronically buzzed in. This still puzzles me to this day. My brother, being the inventive boy that he was, liked to build forts. They were mostly constructed of yardsticks and blankets, or whatever else he could get his hands on. When my mother saw us playing in there one day, she forbade it, as she feared I could suffocate myself. Even though I was seven at the time, I was very small for my age. I reluctantly agreed and scampered off to play in my bedroom. I was playing with some dolls when a little boy walked in. Now I don't know who or what this little boy was, but to me, he looked like a real person. I honestly thought that he was a friend of my brother's. Although he did seem a little bit young to be chumming around with my bro, I remember him asking me if I wanted to play. Being lonely and not having many friends. I quickly agreed and was happy to have a new playmate. He suggested playing in the fort. Now I knew I wasn't supposed to do that, but I was just so happy to have a new friend that I agreed and made a mental note to be extra careful while inside the fort. Almost as soon as we were inside the fort, the little boy told me that he had to go, but that I should wait there for him to come back in a little while. I have no idea how long I waited, but sometime later, I heard my entire family frantically calling my name, obviously searching for me. 
To this day, I have no idea why I didn't answer. Maybe I was afraid of being caught. I don't know. The blanket that was served as the door was yanked up, and I saw my mother's anxious face peering inside. Eventually, I explained the entire story to my parents, although they believed me. The identity of that boy remains unknown, and I never saw him ever again. There were only five other families that lived in our street, and we knew all of the neighborhood children. It wasn't any of them. I kick myself now for not even asking the boy what his name was. That might have helped some. I've heard many stories on this and other sites, but I've never heard of anyone interacting with the ghosts as I've just mentioned. Weird, huh? Thinking back on that little boy, the only thing that struck me as being a little bit weird is the way he moved. It was slow, yet fast, and his movements were jerky, if that makes any sense. Also for a young boy, his voice was very mature and sounded very much like the voice of my father. I know it sounds truly bizarre, but I swear it happened. And even though it's been 20 years since this event took place, I still remember it as though it was yesterday. We stayed in that house for a total of five years, and as the years passed, strange things continued to happen. My entire family suffered in one way or another from the haunting. My eldest sister suffered the most, but for the time being, I'll stick to my own stories. For Christmas one year, my aunt had given me a hideous green and orange stuffed clown whose nose would glow red and play a musical melody. At first glance, I hated this thing and quickly stuffed it in some dark recess in my closet. Sometime in the middle of the night I had awoken, desperately needing to use the restroom. The idea of walking through a darkened hallway at 3am was not a desirable prospect, but by this point, it was an absolute necessity. I made my way down the stairs and was just about to round the corner into the living room when I heard it. Soft jewelry box music was coming in the general direction of the living room. Peeking my way around the corner, I saw the stuffed Christmas clown propped up in the middle of the couch, its nose glowing in the darkness. I high-tilled it back upstairs wetting myself in the process, and jumped in my bed, shaking like a leaf. It scared me half to death. Nothing scared me more in that house than the spirit who I dubbed, the old man. I saw him many times both inside the house, and also in the fields behind our house, just kind of standing there, staring intently up at the house. He always wore a brown business type suit and a top hat. I've always had nightmares about him over the years. Most of them would entail me being in a room with my back to the doorway. Instinctively, my back would tense. I would spin around, and he would pounce, charging at me full speed from the other end of the room, sometimes carrying an axe, or sometimes not. One thing that sticks out in these dreams is that he somehow was more vivid and colorful than the rest of his surroundings. He always seems to stand out, if you know what I mean. I always felt that he was standing right behind me on the staircase, ready to give me a good push. Indeed, I did fall down those stairs many, many times, no matter how careful I was. But luckily, I was never seriously injured. I know this sounds crazy, and heck, the whole story sounds crazy, but I think he used to like to hang out in my walk-in closet and hiss so loudly that it almost sounded like a rattlesnake. I think he got a kick out of scaring me as he liked to turn the lights out on me. When you walked down into the basement, there was only one switch for the entire area situated to the left of the door as you were heading downstairs. Now, I hated to go down there for anything, but it was a must on this day because our fridge had burned out once again and dying apparitions were a big problem in this house. Seeing as the only other working fridge was in the basement, my mother asked me to go down there to get some necessary items for dinner that evening. I ran down the steps to the refrigerator, grabbed whatever it was I was supposed to get, 
and bam, the lights went out. I started screaming and ran for the stairs, absolutely certain that he was hot on my trails. As I was finally reaching for the door, I heard it, and I swear I will never forget this, laughter, but not just any laughter. This laughter literally chilled me to the bone. It was somehow evil and mocking as if to say, I missed you this time, but next time, you may not be so lucky. Needless to say, I was spooked. I'm not sure who it was who was laughing, but I do know that the laughter was male, and only my mother and I were at home at the time. At some point a shadow also began to show up on our living room wall. My sister and I were watching a movie one night when I first saw it, and there was no mistaking it. This shadow was definitely of a person, and somehow darker and more opaque than what a regular shadow should be. We moved everything around that room, shaking our hands in front of it, trying to figure out its origin or what it might be causing it, to no avail. That shadow appeared in the same spot every night until we moved from that home, sometimes disappearing for a few hours, only to reappear sometime later. I think the guys also like to mess around with the phone lines. Many times when you would pick up the phone, all you could hear was the static, there might be a couple of voices in the background, although you could never make out exactly what they were saying. On one occasion, I picked up the phone only to hear ear-shattering static, before I had enough time to put the receiver back on its cradle. I heard a man say hello, in a slightly, okay, very mocking manner, and then that same god dang laughter. That really scared me. Other people, including my grandmother, reported calling our home, and a strange man would answer. A second later, the phone would start to ring normally, and one of us would eventually answer. This to say, this unnerved me to no end. Once, and only once, I was upstairs in my bedroom listening to the stereo with a girlfriend of mine on one of those perfect, sunny Southern California afternoons. We were kind of goofing off singing along when a man's voice started to come through the radio. Believe me when I say, this was no radio broadcast. The language was foul and violent, much too obscene to be repeated here. My friend and I just stared at each other, becoming more frightened by the minute. When I finally couldn't take it anymore, I reached over and pulled the plug thinking that would put an end to the disturbing episode. To my complete astonishment, the radio just kept on playing. Okay, playtime is over. Time to head to my friend's house. I really don't know how to explain this, but somehow we learned to live with these things as a family. I got used to being afraid, expecting things to go missing. I barely glanced if a door slammed on its own or a light mysteriously came on. I expected to hear my name being called out in the middle of the night, and so on. Was I still scared? Um, yeah, deathly terrified might be a better term, but somehow, I managed to live with it. Maybe these ghosts or spirits or whatever you wanted to call them, sensed that, and decided to turn it up a notch. Now, I'm not really sure what happened next, because my father-in-law is now deceased and refused to talk about this with anyone other than my mother. And she too refuses to discuss this. All I know is that my two sisters, my brother and my mother and I, traveled to Arizona for four days to visit my grandmother, leaving my father in the house by himself. Something obviously happened, which really spooked my father. One night, I eavesdropped on one of the conversations that my dad was having with my mother, and all I could really make out was something about borrowed time, all of the windows opening at once, and an old man. The very next day, my father decided that we were moving as soon as possible and was putting the house up for sale. With that being said, the entire family decided to go out for dinner and celebrate. Upon returning home, Something caught my eye that was sort of strange. A single light was burning in my parents' bedroom, 
Now, if you know my father, you would know that he was a complete stickler about leaving the lights on. The number one rule in my house was to shut the lights off as soon as you left the room. A light burning in my parents' bedrooms of all places was quite odd. As soon as our father unlocked the front door, our two dogs went rushing out. I thought I was going to have a heart attack at 12 years of age. On further inspection, it seemed as though the dogs had literally tried to chew their way out of the front door, given the huge bite and scratch marks all over the front door. As soon as my father flicked on the lights, I gasped. It's kind of hard to describe what I saw. The entire house was in disarray. The living room couch was standing on its side. Lamps were broken, mirrors shattered, drawers yanked out of the kitchen cabinets, silver was strewn all over the floor. My father was convinced that someone had broken into the home. We were told to remain outside the house while my brother and mother walked to a neighbor's house to call the police. This was before cell phones. The police arrived somewhere between a half hour to an hour later. An actual police report is documented concerning these reports. The police checked the doors and windows for signs of an intruder, dusted for prints, talked to our neighbors, and checked the house thoroughly for anyone who might be still lurking around. Their investigation turned up nothing. My father ordered us all upstairs to pack up some belongings. We weren't staying. As I was heading into my bedroom, I happened to glance into my parents' room and noticed that the lamp sitting on my father's nightstand was starting to burn, wallpaper behind it. I don't know if this was just my nerves or what, but it honestly looked as though there was a pattern of a burn that was turning into a face. The face of none other than the old man who had been haunting me for years. As I was standing there looking at it, my mother came up behind me and gasped. I think she saw the same thing as I did. When I arrived at my grandmother's house later on in that evening, I heard my mom and dad discussing my grandmother with some of the things that had just happened. If I had known these things while living there, there is no way I would have gotten even one night of sleep there. Not that I did anyways. It's now been over 20 years since I've lived in that home, yet it still continues to haunt me. Considering the fact that we lived in the house for just over 5 years, numerous other events took place that I haven't included, but it's hard to fit the 5 years of living into a single submission. The house is still standing, and I occasionally drive by just for kicks. The house has been almost completely renovated from the outside, and often when I drive by, I see the for sale sign perched up on the front lawn. It seems as though no one stays in the house for too long. It's interesting to note that I've never again experienced anything ghostly or otherworldly since leaving that home. That remains my one and only true experience with the other side. I am a restaurant manager in a small town in Georgia, Milledgeville. Now I have to mention that the building this restaurant is in was brand new when we opened. About seven months after we opened the doors the first time to the public, it all started. At that time, I was promoted into management and took over second shift. The employees and me started to see a shadow figure walking in the back of the home, always by the ice machine in dry storage room. One day I was carrying a glass rack to the dish room when the swinging door that separates the dining room from the back of the home opened and stayed open until I walked through the door and put the rack down by itself. This is a swinging door that we just push open with our foot to walk through. It swipes right back except for that time. As I walked through the door I looked and saw no one by the door that could have opened it for me. At that time, all I had was one server who was taking an order in the dining room at the time, one cook that was on the grill line cooking an order, and me. No dishwasher yet. Things have been progressing over the last three years. When I walked out of my office one night after closing, the dish cart started rolling from the swinging door to the dining room, right in front of me. I was the only one left in the building. Now things are starting to happen in the front of the house. 
I now am running shifts during the day, from 5.30 in the morning to 3 or 4 p.m. depending. Glass racks are coming out of their slots by themselves. One time a rack came completely out of its slot and fell on the floor, with only one server there, and she was nowhere near it. She got scared when she saw that. We always see a shadow figure walk around in the dining room now, also on the grill line, and then back to the dry storage room. All the employees had some kind of something happen that neither one of us can explain, but don't get a bad feeling when anything happens, and we just named the shadow figure George. We also talked to George a lot. When asked to please stop moving things, it stops, if only for that day. We all sure would like to know what's going on here, and how did George come into a brand new building to stay? Nothing too scary, I know. They are not all scary. I think ghosts are just people like us. This is an account of a shadow person. I was sat in the dark in a security lodge which is mostly made of windows. About 3 a.m., I turned and noticed the shadow of what I thought was a man, looking into the lodge window from the outside. When I looked at the shadow, it turned slowly and walked to the side, which would have put the person making the shadow move into the open road, surprised that there would be anyone there at this hour. I looked out of the window and saw nobody. I looked around the lodge, but nobody was around. It began to strike me as strange. I did the usual thing of checking to see if it could have been an anomaly caused by automobile lights, etc. But there were no automobiles around or any other light source's probable cause. There was something about the shadow that just struck me as odd. The shadow was the presence. It did not seem to cast by another presence. I could not think of anything that would attract such a being, so I just put it down to experience. However, a while later I was on a website where a woman with knowledge of a shadow person was explaining that they enjoy hanging around illness and death. A work colleague at the time had his wife seriously ill with some illness, like Alzheimer's or something, and he would bring her to work as she could not be left alone. We work alone. So there is no problem with bringing a wife like that. Around the time I saw the shadow person, his wife died at home. Had the shadow person got into the habit of visiting the lodge to watch events there? I'm not sure. I have been seeing and feeling things since I was 17 months old. My mother was raised to believe in the paranormal, and so was I. My first encounter happened when I was 17 months old. My great-grandfather had just passed away. I don't remember seeing him or talking to him, but I do remember the smell of his cologne. My mom told me this when I got older. She said that she just put me down for bed, and a few minutes later she heard me talking. Oh, she came back to check on me and I told her it was Papa, and that was that. I never saw him again until we moved into the house we are living in now. My second encounter happened a few months after my great-grandmother passed. This was when I was 12. When I was little, she had given me a jewelry box. I was little, and I had put the baby powder in it. Well, a few weeks after she had passed, I was vacuuming my room, and nothing was near that jewelry box, and it just fell off my drawer. It even fell off when I was in the living room watching TV with my dad. The last time it fell, I was at my nanny's, and my mom had the door shut, so no one was in there. When it fell, my mother got up and cleaned it out, and put it in her room, and well, that was the last time it did anything. My great-grandmother was telling me to clean it. Now my papa was beautiful to me, because I knew him for 11 years, and he was my everything. Unfortunately, I was 13 when he had passed away. That night in the hotel room by the hospital after he had passed, we were getting ready for bed. My mom was crawling in the bed with me. When my step-grandmother said, Shell, is that you standing there? My mother replied, No, Mama. I'm in the bed. Well, my grandmother told us what she saw. There was an angle where my mother had stood. My mother couldn't see it, but I could barely. 
I know it was him telling us that everything would be okay. My papa always messed with me, so I wasn't really surprised if he did that after death. One night I was in my nanny's living room at 11 o'clock, waiting for CJ to get home. My nanny was in bed, and I was watching TV. Well, there's a desk close to my nanny's room. That's where my papa used to do bills there when he was alive. I remember before I sat down that the chair was pushed in. A few minutes later, I heard a cracking noise, and I looked over, and the chair was out of place. Of course, I was scared, and it made me forget that it was pushed in. I told Nanny, and she said it was probably her papa. The last time I was at her house before she moved, I just got out of the shower. I was drying my hair, and I heard a name. I don't remember if it was Randy or Rodney. But I asked my granny, and she told me that it was probably someone he knew, so I left it at that. I had used this old phone because mine was dying. Well, we took it home before CJ and her boyfriend Joe could pawn it. This was before a few months before my nanny moved out from up there. CJ and Joe were stealing stuff and pawning it. Well, we had the phone, and one night out of the blue it started ringing, and it said Dad. My mom answered and nobody was there. Well, the funny thing is, it was dead and shut off. Well, the next time it rang, I was at home, and this time it said Joe, and I answered. Of course, nobody was there. We took the battery out, and my nanny moved, and now no one knows what has happened to Joe or CJ. My dad's father just passed away recently, and I was very close to him. I did everything with him when I was little. I'm even named after his daughter who passed away when she was three. I was like his daughter, and the one chance he got to know what it felt like to have a little girl again. He passed away December 8th. I was 16, and I miss him dearly. When I was little, they had lived in a trailer. I knew his daughter was there because I could feel her, even though I never saw her. When they moved to that house that is on the hill above the trailer, I could feel something that wasn't good. I still feel it when I go over there. I don't feel Diana, his little girl, or even my papa. The week my papa passed away, my mom asked me to vacuum his room. Well, I started the vacuum, and you know that feeling you get when you know you're not alone, and it feels like someone is going to hurt you. Well, that's how it felt, and I started the panic. I hurried and looked down just for a moment, and then I looked up, and my mom scared the living crap out of me. I left the room and let her finish. To this day, I never go back there, or even go to the bathroom there, because I never want to feel that feeling ever again. I know I am very blessed to have had the chance with them all, and to know that they are watching over me, and protecting me, because sometimes, when I'm alone or scared, I can smell their perfume or feel their presences, and I know that I'm not alone, or that I shouldn't be afraid anymore, because they're always going to be with me. I just emailed you a ghost story about my boyfriend's death, and the orbs related to it. If you haven't read it yet, basically I saw orbs of my boyfriend hovering around me every night after midnight. I have no idea why this even happens at this time, but anyway, we'll continue my story. My friend stayed in her music throughout the night, and did not feel welcome to stay in his room. She is familiar with ghosts, and I have not been well since his death. I have grieved so hard I became a threat to myself to the point in which I was thinking of doing the unthinkable. I am just now coming to grips with the situation with my boyfriend. Well, maybe I hold him here, if you know what I mean. I want him to pass through and find some peace so he can go to the light, but I'm not sure what I should do to help. I am so distraught over this. He has visited me and also four people I know by dream. He even visited my five-year-old to tell him he loved him, and that he had to go to heaven now, and his nephew had a dream with some of our memories in it. He told him to take my wife, meaning me, and said God bless you at the end. My friend dreamt of him where he walked through, and said sorry, I don't know why I'm here, 
and my uncle had a dream with my boyfriend urging him to remind me to let him go so I could move on. But it is really tough when someone has become a huge part of your life and has played a major role in it for so long. And to have that person vanish before your eyes and be gone is just unconscionable to me. We used to have long talks about mortality, about how one of us couldn't last if one of us were to depart. And it just kills me to know that we can't have just one more conversation or that we won't be able to live to see my son grow up, get married, and be successful. I swore I was going to marry this man. I did have a dream where someone I believed to be him was trying to walk me through a mist. It's kind of hard to explain, but the dream was foggy and his face was partially obscured by the mist or fog. But the outline of his body was the same as my boyfriend's and I couldn't make out his hair. He reached out his hand to me without saying a word, and when I did, I awoke, and just like that, he was gone again. I must admit I have been on meds, but still, I felt like it was him. The coroner said that what he did to himself was accidental, but he just took it too far. Maybe he just didn't understand his own limits and did something to himself without thinking. But it's the way that he took care of himself that was too suspicious to be accidental. He told his family that day right before he did it that he was going to do it and that was final. They didn't come to check on him and I was gone from the house to come home and found him the way that he was, lifeless and just gone. After his death, I would scream for him in that room. It was just so horrific. Please. If anyone can help guide me through this, it would be so helpful to me, as I've been so distraught, and I feel like his soul is so lost. I talked to a psychic medium. She said he came and rubbed my hair at night, and he said to stop the tears and he could come through, but she said he didn't want me to live my life stagnant. I have many lessons to learn, and other things to figure out with the entire loss. We were complete soulmates. But I believe in an afterlife, and I believe that we will reunite one day and live many more lives together, as crazy as it sounds. Hence his death I have now turned to a monk for guidance. I am currently studying Hindu philosophy. My boyfriend believed in God. I've been living in this house for close to three years. For the first six months, nothing happened. One night. My hubby and I were laying on a spare mattress in the living room watching a movie. This was around 11.50 at night. We started hearing these heavy footsteps in the home. We have two doors leading into the living room. One of the sliding doors was right beside us, and the other one is approximately 5 meters away from us. We heard footsteps in the hallway outside the door furthest from us. At first we thought it was my older brother who was also living with us. But he has this routine where he goes to bed at 10 p.m. And it's the same night every night and he doesn't change his routine. Weird, I know. We looked at each other thinking, is that Mika walking around in the hall this time of night? We sat there listening to the footsteps that next walked into the kitchen, which has a door that leads into the living room where we were closest to. The footsteps came closer and closer until they stopped just outside the sliding door. We waited. We listened. We were expecting my brother to open the door and have a whinge that our TV sound volume was on far too loud, even though it wasn't, but he's like that you know. We waited, and then my hubby pushed the sliding door and opened it, and we found nothing. The other door on the far side of the kitchen was also closed, which leads into the hall that the footsteps originated from. We were a bit spooked because we both heard the steps. And laying on the mattress on the floor could sure as heck feel the vibration in the floor from those footsteps. We decided to search the home, minus my brother's bedroom, and we found nothing. An old man lives next door, and I was starting to imagine that perhaps he passed away and wandered over to our home. We saw him a few days later alive and well. That threw that notion out the window. The next morning we asked Miko if he were up last night, and he says no. We told him what we heard, and all he could do was shrug and insist that he was in bed and didn't even come out. 
I believed him simply because there was no way he could have walked away without us noticing when hubby opened the door, and the footsteps never left. He just stopped outside the door, but nothing was there. One thing that does happen though, is that birds are always hitting our front window. This has happened so many times that I lost count. I'm not sure if this is significant, and whether it's a common occurrence with houses with weird things happening inside. Another thing that we notice on a few occasions is phantom smells. Sometimes they are really, really pretty, but other times it is foul. They rarely last more than 10 minutes. For a while, things were back to normal, but my brother said one day, I don't know who is always walking past my window or what they want. I asked him who, and he says some kid. He believes it was a girl, probably no older than 8 or 9. He walks past his window and heads towards the backyard, and he never sees her walk back. This has happened about 4 times that he can recall. I told him, why don't you go out there and check it out? He always has some excuse of he was busy, plays online games, and says he was in the middle of something. Okay, let's continue. About 9 months after hearing the footsteps, we heard them again. We were in the bedroom this time, and it sounded like coming from the laundry and kitchen area. Again we investigated, checked all the locks and the doors, but everything was secure and fine. I asked my hubby if he believed that the house was haunted. He said that it was a very real possibility. Not too long ago, I was taking a bath around 11pm, and I heard a really loud thump just outside my bathroom window. I got out of the tub and wrapped the towel around me and met my hubby in the hallway. He thought I might have fallen, and I told him that it seemed to come from the outside window. We switched on the backyard light that had an outdoor seating area, but the place was clear. We didn't go outside, but we could tell nothing was on the floor that could have made that sound. We went into my son's room to look out the window where the garage and the rest of the yard is but couldn't see much, save for a few feet from the house because the outdoor lights aren't strong enough and the trees are too dark and cast many dark shadows. We just put it down to maybe the neighbor was outside doing something, though it was dark, and if that were the case, wouldn't have the light been on? But recently, I got a real shock of my life. About three months ago, they put the house on the market, and around this time, I went into my son's room about 7 p.m. to wake him to get him ready for school. It was still quite dark, though the sun was starting to come up and you could see enough. I pulled his bedroom curtain open and saw what looked like a girl child in the yard looking directly at the window. That's when she just stood there watching and then she turned her body and made her way towards the back of the garage. She kept looking my way for a few seconds before looking away and disappearing behind the garage. I didn't know what to think to be honest. What would she be doing out there at that time in the morning, wearing inappropriate clothing for that time of morning? I'm not even sure if she was solid or not. I was just thinking, who are you and why are you in my yard? I think she wore a light blue dress. It could have been white. I didn't have too much light. It almost seemed like she had a bit of a glow. I could even tell that she seemed to have long blonde hair. By now my brother and my hubby had left for work, and I was alone in the home with my son, and there was no way I was going to go into the yard to investigate. What if she wasn't a little girl? Can a little girl create such heavy footsteps? She is always spotted outside, yet the footsteps are inside. Or is that something else inside? Is she trying to warn me? I've seen shadows here and there, and many things have been breaking down recently. Since the home was put on the market, our little portable oven broke down, our microwave is breaking down, my washing machine isn't working well anymore, and it won't do the final spin cycle. The hot water mysteriously stopped working as well, and the landlord came by to fix it, and says he doesn't even see anything really wrong with it. The hot water started working again. The toilet was blocked up with the root of a tree, but why now? The kitchen faucet broke and fell off. Our video player stopped working. It chewed up a tape and had to throw it out. Birds continue occasionally flying into our front window, always that same window, 
happen on the day of the house auction too. And it's not just these, but also illnesses. My son was choking on food the other day and needed an ambulance since living here. My hubby has needed two surgeries, one being spinal, and he's always been strong. And then he spent a year out of work with a bad back. He developed diabetes while living here, though a test a year ago said he was fine. I also developed problems. Pikey locked in ovarian syndrome, an umbilical hernia, requiring surgery in near future, and high blood pressure that recently got even higher, ankle swelling that can't really be explained, chest infections that occur frequently, and a few others. Before living here, we were fit and healthy, and it's like being here is making us sick, and it could be a coincidence, but you can't help to think about these things. I've read that there is a house somewhere in Europe, I think, and that people that move in there die of a heart attack within two weeks of living there. I don't know if it was in Switzerland, but the thing is, even those had no history of being ill. They say the house is cursed. And who knows if this is why we are getting these issues. We are moving out in a couple of weeks, and we are counting the days. I feel more like a 7 year old these days than a 36 year old. And all these changes have happened in the past 3 years of living here anyway. But this is my story. As a teen I lived in a nice newer home on Vulcan Road in Perkin, Indiana. My parents and I were the second family to live in it. When we went to just view the house to see if my parents wanted to live there, I found myself afraid to go inside. I was only 12 years old at the time and had no idea what I was afraid of. I had encounters with things I couldn't explain before, but they never scared me like this house did. My parents talked me into going inside. I wasn't happy and actually I cried, but went in anyway. It had three bedrooms and a large basement in a yard. My dad and mom decided it was perfect for us and started with the purchase plans. Inside the house in the back bedroom, which faced the woods behind and on the side of the house, Julie was only part of the whole place that made me feel very uneasy. I made mom promise that I would be put in there to sleep and she agreed that I would get the larger of the two bedrooms in the front end of the house. The problems didn't start right away for me anyways. My parents took the room that I refused. My dad was away a lot for work, and so my mom got the first experience. She kept them a secret from me till my last day of school. That year we had gotten new bedroom suits, and I was put in that room. Not for long enough. Not many 17 year olds sleep with their moms, but after waking to see a woman sitting on the side of my bed one night, and disappearing before reaching the foot of my bed while walking away, I slept with her every night afterwards. She was a dark figure with no real features to me, but I could tell it was female. I also seen dark shadowy figures dancing in the basement. Everyone heard the heavy footsteps upstairs while we were all downstairs, scratching in the attic. We moved back to Kentucky when I graduated in 86, but even though the house had its issues, it was the only place I'd ever called home. I went back and visited the next owners years later, and they had all the same experience as we had. The only difference was a young couple had tried to live there, and when they had a new baby, the ghost got a little violent and knocked things from the walls. The young family moved for fear the baby would be harmed. Behind the house through the woods is a cemetery, 11 or 12 graves, all dated from the 1500s to 1800s. I used to hang out there to sneak and smoke cigarettes. I can't help but wonder if it was someone from there. I hope to someday get the time to go visit whoever lives there, 21 years later. There's a story on here about a house in Mudlick Howell in Hardy, Kentucky, known to those who live there or remembered by those who lived in the Sharondale, Kentucky area. The story states that the white house on the right is haunted. Correction, this house was owned by a lady by the name of Gracie. He lived in that house when I was a child, and never once was any report of anything unusual. She and her sister lived there for many years, after she became quite old. These stories might have happened since her death. Across from her home in the old stomping grounds, 
there were many stories of the ghosts of American Indians. It is reported that glimpses of these Indians can even be seen during the day. This was known as an Indian burial ground. I can verify this because I was one of the children who actually saw what appeared to be an Indian. The Indian seen was wearing what appeared to be hides and carrying a spear, or something that might have been a spear. I was not the only child who saw this during the day it happened. There were many of us there playing ball during recess from the grade school, and we all saw it. But there are many other hauntings in this area, and none of them mentioned here, such as the graveyard that was up on the mountain across Highway 119. This graveyard had been in disrepair even back in the 1950s. I used to play in that area as a kid, and know that there have been unusual happenings since even before that time. The train trestle that used to cross Old Highway 119 from the upper part of Sharondale Coal Camp to the side where the coal was loaded into the train car. That trestle was the one place for dares as a child. There were a few children who were injured there taking those dares. To this day, nobody knows what the real story is about the old trestle. The trestle is now gone, but the stories remain. There was also a house that was used for storage along those tracks. Part of the house was used for storage things for repair to the homes of the coal miners in the upper and lower coal mine camp homes. That particular home was rented to a couple with one child. The mother often came across the road to another home, completely frightened by things that happened in the home. She stated that the light bulbs were burst, even when there was no reasonable means of explaining it. Many stories of hauntings in the home still abound. Note, the homes are now gone. The highway programs that took the area for a larger highway. Miners whose lives were taken in coal mining accidents still roam that area. A woman who was killed by a big cat up on the mountain, whose shrill screams can still be heard during both day and night. Different areas in the mountain where soldiers were killed. Mines that were closed are also rumored to be haunted. The same area is known to have different stories of men who were killed by reveners back in the early 1900s. Men killed by reveners, some whose bodies were found, and others who just went missing. I have an experience to share with all of you. When my grandfather died, we went to my grandmother's house to check on her. She had a clock that when my great-great-grandmother died, it stopped ticking then. When my grandpa died, it started again. It had not ticked for a long, long time, for about over a hundred years. My grandpa had always wanted to hear it too. Maybe it was him that did it, or just a coincidence. My gym basement at my school. When I went to the bathroom in gym class, my friend came too. It used to be a locker room for a high school. We were about halfway down the stairs when the lights started flickering on and off. Then the water at the sinks turned on, and the stall door slammed. Then we turned to run up the stairs, and in the corner, we saw a boy that you could see through, and he had a hunter green shirt with black dress pants. We screamed and ran up the stairs where most of our class was there, and no one believed us, but we knew what we saw. Me and my other friend we went down there and had to use the bathroom, and she was scared to go by herself, so I ended up going down there with her. We were standing at the bottom of the stairs, noticing how freezing it was, and it was so cold. Oh, she went over to the first stall, then she started to open it, then I screamed, and then she said what? I said turn around, and that's when she did. What we both saw was a girl wearing a dress with bright red eyes, with a black outline of some sort. He had a possessed smile. That's when she said leave. The way she looked into our eyes when we saw her was straight evil. And my friend and I had nothing to say. One time I went with another one of my friends down to that basement. And when we were there, we saw something strange and unwanted. We were standing at the very end of the stairs. And we were walking into the bathrooms. And at that very moment, we saw a strange looking girl just standing there. And she was just staring at us. Now, keep in mind this used to be an old school that was at least 90 to 95 years old. Oh, me and my friend just stood there for a moment and stared at her. Then we suddenly saw her eyes were plain black. It was so scary. 
Then me and my friend slowly, and I mean slowly, walked away. But as we were going up the stairs, we noticed that she was following us. We looked back. I mean we wanted to, but at the same time we did it. And there she was. It was truly freaky. This was so freaky that she was right behind us, reaching for us, and wanting to touch us. So we ran. We thought no one would believe this horrible, frightening incident, but luckily quite a few people did, and that's why many people didn't like to go into the basement anymore. One summer, my three children, my sister and all and I were traveling to my hometown in South Carolina. We live in New York. Oh, it is a pretty long way to go. It was foggy that morning, and my car had been experiencing trouble. We broke down near Pennsylvania and found ourselves sitting on the side of the road, maybe about eight hours from home. A police officer pulled up behind my car. My youngest was two months old. He was screaming very loudly. But when he saw this policeman, he started smiling and laughing. Dressed in an older style police uniform, it looked to be a style from the 70s. He had the most beautiful face and voice. He walked around my car and then laid his hands on my car. My car started to back up. Then he just disappeared. I can't explain it. I looked up from the dash. Seconds after I saw him standing in front of the car and then he was gone. No policeman car, no police car, nothing, no one. We didn't even see him leave. As a matter of fact, we didn't even see him pull up. I thank God for that angel in disguise. We made it home safely. I grew up in a house that was always open to everyone and warm, but it did have its secrets. When I was very young, and the house was empty. I would hear my name being called, and I would run from room to room, thinking someone was home. My brother said this also happened to him on Saturday mornings, when everyone was asleep and he watched cartoons. One night as a 12 year old, I was sleeping in the upstairs hall while my room was being finished. I was sleeping with my face to the wall, and softly my shoulder was being pushed. Thinking someone in my family was wanting something, I turned around to face the room. There in front of me was a small couple, a man in a suit and a 1930s hat, and a sweet looking woman with a pillbox like hat. I think they liked what they saw because they looked at each other, then smiled, and then turned around to go down the stairs. I never saw them again. Many years later in a conversation with my mother, she told me the small house with the low ceilings and low working areas was built for a couple in 1939, and before they could move in, they died in a fatal car accident. I guess they were just checking up on their home. Well, my boyfriend is a non-believer, but he says he wants to believe. Oh, back before we started dating. We would find things to do where he might see something and come around. I was very picky about these places because I am a firm believer and also I scare easily. Oh, I didn't want to get myself into a situation that I would have a hard time with. As a result, I choose places that I've been to many times and was comfortable with. We had been to a few and I'd heard something or whatever, but generally I have attributed this to my imagination because I was worked up, but one experience stands out. We were on the USS Constellation, known for hauntings, but I had taken him there more as a glimpse of my own past. As a native Baltimorean, or Baltimoreon, as my father likes to say, in a lover of history, I practically grew up on it. I was completely relaxed as I usually am there, and Rob and I were standing on the Orlop dock, looking over the rail. It's my favorite place on the ship. Don't ask me why. My least favorites are outside the Champlain's corners and in the infirmary. Given the history of the ship, the Orlop really shouldn't be my faith, but it is. Oh, we have been standing there in silence for a few minutes, just kind of taking it in. It was a cold day, 
and we went there right after work so there was hardly anyone else on the vessel. And so after a few moments of quiet, I say, put it out. What he replies. Well, he knew what he did. He put his hand around my waist, hopping the curve of my hip, as we weren't dating at this time. And in fact, I believe we're both seeing other people when this happened. I thought this was pretty dang inappropriate. I turned to tell him so. He was standing too far away for me to have done that. He didn't move as I was standing directly next to him and would have noticed. What? He said again, a little more forcefully, looking rather concerned for my sanity. Nothing, I said. I didn't want to think about it and ruin one of my favorite childhood retreats. After we were off the ship, I told him what had happened. He still really wasn't convinced, since I'm the one who experienced something. Not him, but he did admit that the ghost has good taste. That's sweet, I think. I just want to say that I love your website, and couldn't help but to share my story with you. A few years ago, my great-grandfather was very ill and in a nursing home. My family and I live far away from him, and we only made a trip up to see him around Christmas and his birthday. One day when I was 15, and my brother was only about two, we were sitting in my living room watching TV, when all of a sudden my little brother started crying. I asked him what was wrong, and he said he wanted to go see Papa. I thought it was weird because he had only met Papa a few times. My mom came in the room and told him that Papa was very far away but that we would go see him soon. My brother started crying harder and was screaming, I want to see Papa now. My mom held her in her lap and kept telling him not to worry that Papa was fine and we would go see him soon. When he started to calm down the phone rang, it was my aunt. He told us that Papa just passed away. My whole family was creeped out by this experience and none of us have really talked about it since. My little brother does not even remember it. This took place in 1993, and I have two separate stories, same place and year. When I was about 16, I was living with some friends in Cleveland, Texas. I was attending school there with my best friend Mary, and living with her and her family. We had a couple friends that we went to school with. Uh, one girl was very strange, shall we say. We will call her Claire, and there was the other friend named Barbie. We lived almost at the end of a long, narrow, dead and dirt road. There was only about six houses on the road, and we were surrounded by woods. We lived in the next to last house on the street, and Claire lived in the house that marked the dead end road, and her family rarely came out in the daytime. They were more night creatures, if you will, and they had about six stray cats just hanging around the house. Mary and I decided to stay the night with Claire one night, and in the nighttime when it all got very weird, Claire was talking about witches and witchcraft and sorts, when suddenly I saw right behind Claire that there was a witch's head just hanging from the ceiling. I mean, it was staring right at me with big bulging red eyes, and it seemed real. When I told Claire, Claire was right on the ceiling, she looked, and there was nothing. And to this day, I have no idea if I was hallucinating or if I really saw something evil. Our family had an experience several years back in our old house. I tried to submit the story a few years back, but I don't think it ever was posted. I am the last one to say I believe in ghosts, and normally when people tell me they saw a ghost, I listen, but figure they are full of it. Well this time I am glad that my entire family heard it. I don't care if anybody else believes me because at least we know it happened. It happened several years ago, maybe a good 28 years ago. I was around 7, if not younger. At the time, I was sleeping in my parents' room with my dad, and my mom went to lay down with my brother since he had the flu. The way our house was is that we have three bedrooms and two doors that we kept closed that closed off of the back of the house. 
to the living room and kitchen. We had all just started to fall asleep when we were woken up by a really loud thump. Then the sound of something heavy, running and ripping up the carpet. It reminded me of our old cat that used to run down the hall and her claws would get stuck in the carpet. But this was much, much louder. The noise came and went very fast. My dad had jumped up and got his gun and went outside thinking it was someone running on our roof. But there was nothing. He came back and asked us all if we heard it. And we did. To this day, we have no idea what it was. And it never happened again. My brother and I talk about it to this day. And we get chills thinking about it. I'm sure it is something that could be explained. But what? It was too loud for any house noise. Our plumbing we never had issues with. Like I said, I'm glad our entire family heard it. So that way, they know I'm not making something up. I've never had another experience like that again. And now I'm interested in the idea of hauntings. But I normally am more on the factual and fantasy side. But that has made me think that just maybe there is something to all the supernatural. One thing I know about my story, I know it is real. I have read other stories on the site and think a lot of them are fabricated. And I am sure of reading mine. People think I am making it up. Or my entire family is making it up. But we know it happened. My stories were told to me. The first was told by my dad. My dad was an 18-wheeled truck driver. The stories he told seemed far-fetched, but I swear to God he's telling the truth. One night driving a long stretch of highway, he came upon a beautiful dog. The dog barked, but he knew he had hit the dog. He got out of the cab of the truck with his flashlight, who gave the dog a proper burial. When he looked up and down the ravines, and what he found was not a dog, but a family with the dog. They had crashed down the ravine two hours earlier. The family survived, but the dog didn't. The next story was told by my brother, and now sister-in-law, then girlfriend. In 1995, my brother came to Texas, then Georgia, to be with our dad. At that time, he was very ill. My sister-in-law, then girlfriend, was in Georgia. Our dad passed away late at night. My brother decided to wait till morning to call my sister because she had to be working early the next morning. My sister-in-law called crying instead. She was scared and shaking. Then she said that about 2 a.m. she got up to get a drink in the kitchen, walked into the living room, and that's when she saw dad sitting on the couch. Then she said hi to him, then continued into the kitchen, and then realized that he was supposed to be in Texas, not knowing he had passed yet. That's when she walked back into the living room, where he was sitting, telling her he needs to tell her something. And she screamed no, and runs back into the bedroom, then slams the door, locks it, and calls her best friend cousin who was a cop to come to the house. And no one is there. When my brother tells her our dad had passed, that is when she freaks out more. I just wish I knew what he wanted to tell her. Oh well. This actually began here in Lazuka, the capital of Zambia, back in 1983 when I was a young girl of five. For some reason, I always woke at 3 a.m. on the dot whilst living at our home at the time and found myself walking down the hallway. We had security lights in the garden, therefore shadows would play off trees, bushes, and windows onto the interior walls of the house, like a Russian puppet show. With a security guard present each night, I would think the shadowy shape of a man appearing or disappearing suddenly was simply that, our guard doing the rounds. It wasn't until one final night, after my usual check of the houses, I was walking back to my room when I just felt something behind me. Wish I had it, because the shadowy figure of a man was right behind me, away from the walls and lights, but very distinctive. I was scared, but to be honest, looking back now, cannot even remember feeling evil, just curiosity. 
A few months after, I started experiencing visions and dreams. I would start having a dream of a little funny white man standing in my doorway, looking at me with a mean little grin on his face. Then, he would walk off in the direction of my brother's room, whereby I once woke up to hear my brother screaming for my mom, saying there was something in his room. This experience happened only once, but the dreams of this little man continued. When we moved to the UK in 1986, my final experience occurred with this man. I heard my name being called from downstairs when I reached the top of the stairs from my bedroom, looking down into the pitch black and feeling utter malevolence directed at me. I couldn't see anything, but it was the same sensation I feel when dreaming of the white man. Let's just say at the age of 11, I had the good sense not to investigate. After that, I stopped experiencing a little white man, but I feel I became susceptible to other things from then on. Our house in the UK is set on what was once the Beanoka State Farm. It's said that a mass grave of 1800s cholera victims lies within the vicinity of our estate, which could explain the experience, and not just for me. Our cat would get spooked, and my mother was terrified one night. Our cat would suddenly sit up and stare at the corner of the room, or the doorway, or an armchair, and suddenly start to growl and raise his hackle. Then he would move his head as though watching something walk through the room. It frightened me one night when he sat up from my lap and dug his claws into my thighs. The growling reached a crescendo as though he was going into battle with another Tom. I got so spooked I left the room and went upstairs. My cat had left by the cat flap into the night. He wouldn't come back until the morning. What really spooked me the most was, this also happened during the day one February morning. I can handle the nighttime frights because of the sense of normality when the sun rises. When you are invaded during the day, all your security is shattered. My brother and I both experienced what is now learned a sleep paralysis event at exactly the same time, one night. Both of us also witnessed just before, a sudden flash of brilliant blue. For two people of differing sexes to experience exactly the same time makes it disturbing and we still discuss it today. My other experience of sleep paralysis was when I was fully awake. Lying on my tummy reading a book on my bed. I suddenly had the overwhelming terror swamp me from my feet upwards, and I couldn't move. Then, at the foot of my bed, I could feel as though someone was taking a step onto the mattress between both feet. When I could finally move, I turned around to see an indentation of a foot where the sensation was. Thank you for taking your time to read my experiences, for that is all I can call them. I did have one other experience, but it's too terrifying to write down, and causes me fear, even to this day. When I was six or seven months pregnant with my son Anthony, I had a terrifying nightmare. I believe this nightmare was a portal to the afterlife, that what I saw was in fact a ghost trying to communicate with me. Every night I would sleep with the bedroom door half open and also had the hallway light on just because of the weird and bizarre events that would occur in this old home. I'd always thought I'd hear laughter during the day, sounds of doors opening and closing, and other little things that made me convince my house was haunted. One evening, I swore I saw a small dark shadow figure float into the kitchen from my bedroom. It happened so fast, I didn't have much time to process it. My nightmare was very similar to this experience. 
I was convinced that I woke up in my bed before. At least at the time I thought I was conscious. I was glued to my bed, couldn't move at all, virtually paralyzed. I started hearing strange noises, like a gargling coming from the hallway outside of my room. I remember struggling to open and close my eyes. All of a sudden, I was able to focus my eyes and move my head where I could see that the door was open. I saw this little girl standing in my doorway. She was a black shadow from five feet away from my bed. She approached closer to me, all while I was still paralyzed and couldn't move. The black shadow whispered, don't be scared, I'll be home soon. That's when I woke up, sweating and screaming. Even after realizing it was a nightmare, I could still feel the presence of the shadow in that house. The same girl from my nightmare. I thought it was a bit ridiculous, because I knew at that point, my mind had just conjured this up in my head, even with all the previous signs of ghostly activity. What's even weirder, a few days after I received a call from my sister, she was very emotional because she announced to me that she was having a child. The reason why my sister was so emotional was because she had tried for years and years to have children, and she was never able to. Her doctor even told her that she was never going to be able to produce a child. I bet you the shadow from my nightmare came back as her living child. I was never able to find out the history of this house or who lived there, but I can bet you that the little girl used to, and she told me that she was coming back to life. I've noticed that you don't have any ghosts listed for the University of Calgary residences in Calgary, Alberta. I had a strange experience in the residence tower called Randall Hall. I'll give you some brief information. There are two identical towers plus some apartment-style residences that were built in the late 1960s when the university was founded. They are both seven stories tall, with a central communal lounge and three hallways radiating out like spokes. Each hallway has 11 rooms and a bathroom. Originally, they were built as a female dorm and a male dorm. I spent three years of my university living in Randall Hall, the room that I shared with my roommate was in the co-ed hallway of the 6th floor of Randall. This kind of applies because we shared all facilities with guys. Toilet stalls, urinals, sinks, and showers were all communal. Think Allie McBeal. And we often had guys hang out in our room. Let's just say that there were quite a few of us engineers on that floor. I started the year living in room 661. One night, I awoke frequently, and I could have sworn that there was someone in my room, sitting in the chair in my roommate's desk. I passed it off as being asleep, but the next day I did ask my roommate, were there any people in our room last night? All she said was yeah, I thought that one of the guys had come in during the night. Weird. Anyway, a little later in the year, I moved into room 557 on the same side of the hallway, two doors down. We started noticing that in the common room, which was a large open area in the center of the spokes, one of the elevators would often come up to our floor on its own accord, open, close, then go back down to the main floor. Sometimes we would stay on our floor with the door open for almost an hour before going back down. My real experience came during reading break. I guess your guys equivalent to spring break, only we have ours in early to mid-February and most people leave because the skiing's awesome in the Rockies, only a few hours away. In our hallway, the only people not gone was me, my roommate the girls across the hall, and the girl at the end of the hall, on our side by the fire escape. 
the start of my real story, I'll give you guys a little explanation about how our room was laid out. If you walk into the door from the hallway, there is a closet on each side that extends about two feet into the room that goes all the way to each wall, no doors in the closet. The room is approximately square. My roommate's bed was against the left wall, with her desk against the window, directly across the door, and the chair between her headboard and the desk. My bed was against the window, with the headboard against the right wall, with my desk along the right wall. I awoke one night because I swore that the door to our room had opened and that one of the guys from the guy's wing had come in. He had gone on a date that night and was a close friend. I looked over at my roommate's bed and it looked like this guy was whispering something to her. I found it kind of creepy though that instead of crouching by her bed like a normal person would do, he was standing with his legs straight, bent at the waist, with his face about two inches from hers. Now, I got kind of pissed off because it was the middle of the night and this guy had come in to tell Lauren about his date. I wanted to see what time it was, so I sat up in bed so I could see her on my desk to my alarm clock, which was on a dresser in the closet. It was 2.30ish in the morning. So I turned my head to yell or whisper strongly at this guy. Then I realized it wasn't who I thought it was. This is the creepy part. He stayed bent over my roommate in the same position, but slowly turned his head to look at me. While he was turning his head, this grin spread across his face. One could interpret this grin as malevolent. I sure did at the time. Then he slowly stood straight up and took a few steps backward towards the closet, folded his arms across his chest, and looked at me with the same scary grin on his face. It was strange because really, he had no facial features, nothing of a face that I could see except for this grin that I could more sense than see. Well, that was enough for me. Like any 20 going on 6 year old, I dove beneath the covers of my bed and stayed there all night. This was very hard to do since the heating is very efficient in those buildings and most of the rooms are usually hot enough to be in shorts and tanks in. Anyway, I didn't sleep again that night. After a week or so, thinking about this experience, having insomnia, and sleeping with the light on, I have second thoughts on what was going on there. I think that yes, he was intentionally trying to scare someone, but only out of a sense of fun because he knew he could. I think he had my roommates in his target sites, and he had his face by my roommates, waiting for her to wake up with this ghost face two inches from hers. Well. You could wake my roommate up with a cherry bomb when she's sleeping, never mind waking to a ghostly presence like so many of us do. Instead I woke up and his grin was more of a, finally, someone's awake that I can scare grin. So that was it, other than the knocking, which is actually quite funny. It was about two days after my experience when all three of our rooms got simultaneous knocks at 5.30 in the morning. My roommate got up to answer the door and scared the crap out of both her and the girl directly across from her by opening the door at the exact same time. Also, the girl at the end of the hall had her head out of the door asking if someone had knocked. There was no one in the hall and no way someone could have left without us hearing. The door into the central common room was on a mnemonic hinge and made a whining noise when you opened it. The door to the fire escape at the other end makes a crap load of noise which echoes through the floors. The door to the bathroom also has a mnemonic hinge and bangs when it closes. Anyway, 
to close this outrageously long story out. I worked for housekeeping during the summer because the residents are rented out like hotel rooms. I didn't go back home in the summer. I was talking with the cleaner from the sixth floor while doing laundry one day. She related that she has had experiences with this guy over the last few years. She was cleaning a room after move out and had the door propped open with the garbage can. A guy poked his head around the door, looked her in the eye, kicked the garbage out from in front of the door, and slammed it. There was no one there when she went to look. There are rumors that a guy got really stressed out during exams in the 80s and threw himself off the roof into the parking lot. I've not substantiated these claims, so who knows. I do know that the roofs are now off limits to students, whereas they weren't in the past. The cleaner says that he is quite shy and has only seen during summer, Christmas, on reading breaks, never when the residences are filled with people. This isn't the first time I've told someone this. Normally, people don't believe me because I'm only 14, but I swear that everything I'm about to say is the honest truth. My first experience happened six years ago. My friend was sleeping over at mine. We couldn't sleep, so we were just talking in the dark. Well, it wasn't that dark because I had the curtains open. I remember it being a few minutes past midnight. I also remember thinking my friend had stood up because there was a shadow on the wall opposite us, but she was still lying down, but she too had seen the shadow. It had no features and was only head and shoulders. It was where my light switch was. We both looked outside to see if anyone was there, nothing. So we started to really freak out and closed the curtains as quick as possible. And when we reopened them a few seconds later, it was gone. I have no explanation for this. I definitely wasn't dreaming and neither of us had imagined it. Later on that year, I was alone in the house watching a video. I stopped the video to get something to eat downstairs. When I came back, the video had been took out from my video player and was on my bed. My next experience happened maybe about five or four years ago. I was on the computer and I was the only one in the house as my brother was out and my mom and dad were out working. I didn't have any music on at the time and the TV wasn't on either. Basically, things were silent. I heard this voice coming from downstairs calling my name. It was definitely a woman's voice maybe in her late 20s. I wasn't sure at this time. I really started to freak out. It lasted for around five minutes and then it stopped. The next couple of times I heard it really scared me. The last time I heard it, I was home alone again. The TV was on mute and I was on the computer again. The voice came from right next to me. It shouted my name into my ear. It shocked me so badly that I actually screamed so loud that the people next door heard me. Since then, I haven't heard it, but recently, I've been hearing music playing in and outside of my house. Also recently, things keep happening in my room, like I keep feeling cold spots, and a lot of the time, I feel like I'm not the only one in the room. It's really scary. Plus, my TV has been on mute or changed channels when I'm nowhere near the remote. It scares me a lot. It shook me up so bad that I hate being alone in the house. This occurred roughly 20 years ago when I was 19 or 20 and I was sleeping over at my boyfriend's apartment in Spring Valley, California. My boyfriend left for work by 4 a.m. 
and I was alone in the apartment. This one morning after he left, I awoke on my back to a heaviness in the room. It was still dark, but becoming dawn. I looked to my right, and standing next to me by the bed was this tall black shrouded shadow entity. I was terrified. I could feel its presence surrounding me. Then it spoke. I was lying there wide-eyed and in shock. I am not still sure how I heard it. Was it audible or just in my head? The voice was deep and gruff and asked, what are you doing here? I am familiar with some experiences with the paranormal, just never had it been so terrifying. I closed my eyes and began the Lord's Prayer. By the last words, deliver me from evil, amen. The room had cleared. I felt the change immediately, and when I reopened my eyes, all was normal again. I told my boyfriend later that day, and he thought it was his deceased grandfather being curious. My boyfriend's grandma was recently staying with him, and she would tell him stories of the grandfather visiting her. Possible, I guess, but I still wonder what the black shrouded entity was, and what its intentions were. For many years. I had a great cat named Kitty. Kitty didn't like many people. She mainly only liked me. She always slept up against my legs at night, on the outside of the covers. She loved to be close to me. After she died, I was absolutely miserable. I missed her so much. After a few days, I started getting a glimpse of her walking around the house out of the corner of my eye. I didn't say anything to anyone for a while. One day, my aunt said that she didn't realize that we had gotten another cat after Kitty had died. I told her that we didn't have any other cats, or any other pets for that matter. She was absolutely convinced that she had seen a cat walk across the doorway in our living room. One night, just as I was going to sleep, I felt Kitty jump up onto the bed and cuddle up against me. I could feel her pressing up against my legs. I tried my best to convince myself that it was just my imagination, but my husband felt her jump onto the bed also. Over the years, she has gradually stopped coming around us so much. She still shows up whenever I am upset or sick. I guess she just likes to comfort me just like she did when she was alive. Hello. I grew up in an old apartment building in the Fordham Hill section of the Bronx. When I was about 14 years old, I was speaking on the telephone to my best friend, who lived upstairs on the fifth floor of the building. My apartment was on the second floor. My friend said that she was going to go down to my apartment in a few minutes. As soon as I hung up the telephone, there was a knock on the door. I wondered how my friend could have possibly made it down three flights of stairs so quickly as we hung up the phone that second. I went to the door and looked out of the people to see if it was her. There, at the door, stood a tall young looking man wearing a ruffled white shirt, a thick black belt, black pants, and black boots that went almost to his knees. Hanging from the side of his belt was a sword or a saber. As I stared at him, it appeared as though he was looking right at me with piercing blue eyes, even though the door was between us. I then noticed that I could see the number on the apartment door across from mine through his shirt. I quickly ran from the door, realizing what I had seen, thoroughly frightened, and called my friend, asking her to hurry and come down as I was alone in the house. I will never forget it for as long as I live. I did some research 
and learned that there was revolutionary battles on in a mug for damn hill. I came to the conclusion that the ghost was a revolutionary war soldier, probably British from the clothing. I only wish I could learn more. Nothing occurred for the rest of the time that I lived in that apartment. Thanks for having a great site where people can share their experiences. Like a lot of people, I've had friends and family members pass away. One of my best friends was John, who died from pancreatic cancer while still in his early 30s. Many years later, I started a habit while praying. I asked God to help me always remember my friends and family who have passed away, who influenced me, and who are a big part of my life. Then I think of their names and say them silently in prayer. About a year ago, our friend and family priest passed away, and I attended the funeral mass. As I was kneeling in the pews, I felt someone beside me. I looked to my right, and there, plain as day, was John. He was there for only two, maybe three seconds, and then disappeared. I shook my head and looked again, but he was gone. I hadn't thought about John at all that day, and I may never know why he decided to show himself. I know that God puts people into your life for a reason, and I know that even after they are gone, they are always with you. I love you, brother. Thanks for the visit. Hey Phantoms, thank you so much for joining me on this epic 23 hour journey. I really hope you enjoyed the video, and if you got to the end of the video, please write November or December in the comment section below. That way I know that you're watching, you're engaged, you like these long videos, and you want to see more of them. So I've been debating about whether or not put rain in my videos. Um, sometimes I've been doing that like every once in a while, but I don't know how you guys feel about that. Um, that's really the only issue I have is trying to figure out what you, what you guys want exactly. So leave a like, comment, share, and subscribe. Love you guys.